so if you can see uh, module one module one is more of python uh, it's basics how what are the data types what is the flow control what are the functions how do you handle simple files then there are uh, there is numpy pandas matplotlib and scikit-learn so uh, the last two uh, rows uh, don't get bogged down by the terminology. These are basically packages that, that Python has. Um, and NumPy is basically, uh, NumPy pandas are basically packages to, you know, have your data set in a particular structure. Matplotlib is more of a visualization uh, package. Scikit-learn is your most important uh, data science package, uh, which can be called in a layman's terms and it is used for you know all the machine learning algorithms so uh, in module 2 you will understand what is what is machine learning what is the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning what are decision algorithms what are decision trees uh, classification algorithms clustering algorithms what is cross validation and then we have a conclusion with the project and then we will just touch base on deep learning and nlp just to give a flavor of it Okay, so um, I'll not go into detail because uh, this will sound more of jargons right now. Uh, but this is how you know, your material will look like. And okay, so it starts from today, the timing. Okay. So machine learning is a type of artificial intelligence that provides computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Now put, to put into perspective, just uh, imagine a baby. How does a baby know, uh, come to know everything when he or she grows up? Okay, you are not spoon feeding him everything, right? You're you're telling me or uh, telling him, you know, okay, this is this is uh, the uh, this is a red color, this is orange, this is green. But it's not practically possible for you to feed everything, every information to the baby. Okay, so baby learns on itself. According to the experience, if he, he or she learns to walk, he or she learns to, you know, talk. You can feed him with some, you know, corrections, right? But uh, you cannot feed him with everything that is available in the world. So it will learn it by itself. The same thing, uh, same logic applies to machine learning, okay? Machine learning is something which the machine is learning by experiences. It, you know, you cannot hard code it, okay? Sunil so Pathak is AI, uh, asking what is AI. Okay, now if I, uh, it's a good question. So AI is a very broader set and machine learning is a subset. So AI, for example, if you call, uh, call in, for example, Visual Basic, I mean VBA codes, if you ask in Excel that you know, you're doing automation, okay, even Excel is a form of AI, okay? If you're doing automation, if you're doing anything that eases your task with your phone, uh, or even robotics is AI, okay? But robotics, everything, for example, a very typical engineering college project is, you know, how to feed in the, a car to run on a white line, right? Or follow a white line. So <clears throat> that is AI, that is not machine learning. You have already told the car to understand, uh, to uh, follow the white line. It is hard coded. If you give it a green color, line it will not understand what to do right so it is not thinking of it thinking on its own you have hard coded something and you have told the car to follow this line so that is ai okay something which is automating uh, the process okay but machine learning is a subset of ai so machine learning as i told you that uh, the machine is learning from previous data albeit previous uh, i mean previous experiences which is stored in the form of data okay so are we clear on this? Can you just ping me a yes? Uh, if anyone has a question, you can. Okay, Sunil Pathak is not uh, clear with this. Uh, okay. Let us understand uh, again. So machine learning is a field of study wherein the machine is understanding from data and uses that data, you are using some algorithms to predict the future. Okay, so as uh, as I told you the baby example, I think that is a very simple example you can put uh, the whole thing into. So you cannot code everything. For example, if you have to identify a chair, okay, you can say the chair has four legs, the chair, 
the four legs are of these dimensions. It has a seat that is uh, placed on these four legs. It has a backrest. Okay, so you understand that as a chair. What if the chair has six legs? Your code will not be able to tell you that it has six legs, right? But if you have employed machine learning, it understands a chair is something a person used to, to say it. It is learning from all the data. In the previous data, there might be some instances where there's a six-legged chair, and therefore it understands that even if a six-legged chair comes, it is a chair. It is not something alien to me, right? So something like that. You cannot hard code everything in this world. Uh, that is why you need machine learning to understand that something similar is also exist. Okay, so Neil, is that clear now? Okay, uh, he's uh, happy with the answer. Okay, uh, so let's move on. So as I told you, the baby example, uh, humans learn from experience. So does the machine uh, when in the machine learning field. Okay, machine learns from data. I told you uh, earlier also. So a traditional program is something which has input data and output data. Machine learning is has a data which it trains itself on. I mean, it learns, it trains itself on, and then there's a output which is a program. Now, if you use this program, this output as something you can use for a different input. Okay. So it will be a lot clearer when we go into actual machine learning, but just understand the essence of it. You are using the machine to understand from the input data, whatever you have. In future, whatever data will come, you will feed that data into the program you have got, and then the program will give you an output. Okay. So for example, we'll see the examples that is uh, uh, that are there. So spam filtering. Okay. This is very uh, interesting example of machine learning and also NLP. So Gmail, how does Gmail understand uh, whether this email is a ghost should go into a spam box or in an inbox? You have, have you ever coded that? Have you ever sent uh, a mail uh, to spam? Yes, you have done it. So what you have done is uh, you have identified some mails that you may have seen that it is not, uh, you know, it, is, it does not relate anything to me. So if you have uh, sent that to spam box, so what the Google engine is doing it is understanding that, okay, if I see a mail coming from this center, uh, sender, uh, which has some words typically like you have won a big prize, congr congratulations, or give me your account number, some things like these, if anything like these comes into your mailbox, okay, I will put that into spam because I know that the user doesn't like it and also it is relating so many users. So, for example, there are a billion users of Gmail, right? So billion users are feeding in uh, the data to the G, uh, Google engine that these are the mails which are faulty. I mean, uh, these are spam. Okay. So anything, any mail which uses words like, you know, winning a prize, uh, immediately give your account number, will transfer this much money, uh, this much of money. So these are all spams. So Google has understood that, that uh, if I find a mail, which has such kind of numbers or such kind of, you know, immediate attention uh, kind of things. So I'll classify it as a spam. Okay. So um, moving on to the next uh, stock price prediction. This is kind of a time series analysis. Everyone is interested in investment. So, but what if I can predict the future and say that this stock is going up or going to go down? I, I can make huge amounts of money, right? Okay. So, it is not actually 100% possible for you to predict what will be, otherwise then everyone will be a millionaire, right? And then there will be actually no uh, arbitrage in the market. But uh, that is uh, not the case. Uh, I mean, your machine learning can so much uh, go to a certain extent, but of course after that there are, there are limitations. But having said that, there is a certain extent to which you can predict your stock prices and, you know, uh, many of the banks are using currently using algorithmic trading, like Goldman Sachs and all. Uh, so they are using uh, algorithmic trading so that the machine will automatically, uh, you know, make investments, pull out money according to the stock prices, and you know, maximize the profit. Any questions till now? Okay, and you uh, is okay with uh, progress till now? 
So, um, okay, Netflix, a very common example of Netflix. How does Netflix know which movie you're going to watch? Um, so, how, for example, if you have watched Spider-Man movie or Iron Man movie, it will probably know that, okay, this guy is, uh, I think, a, Mar um, a Marvel fan. So, let me give him more Marvel movies, okay? If you have watched Superman, Batman, then uh, Netflix will know, okay, this guy is more of into action, and this guy is seeing a lot of movies from DC. Okay, uh, let me give him something which he relates to. Okay, so um, then if you if you have seen uh, action movies, okay, then it will know that this guy is, well, I think, is interested in action movies. Let's recommend this movie to him. It's kind of similar how Amazon works. Uh, so Amazon do, does a similar kind of a recommendation system engine, which, uh, you know, uh, if you have bought this product, they suggest you products which you can put in the basket with your product, uh, which you were interested in initially. For example, uh, so let's see. For example, if you are buying um, a water bottle, uh, or let's say if you are buying a hot water bottle, a flask, okay? So it can suggest you, uh, you can buy this tea because you can put the tea in your flask. So it's just a crude example, uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, you never know Amazon will be doing that uh, on a serious basis. Uh, face recognition, face recognition. Uh, so for example, your iPhone uh, has an amazing face recognition uh, system. Uh, as I've heard, I don't actually own one, but uh, people have said that the iPhone 8 or I think iPhone 10 X uh, has amazing face recognition. And it can even distinguish amongst twins, uh, when even a mother will, I mean, can mistake. So, how does it do that? So every uh, Apple um, server won't have every face ready in his database, right? It is not kind of a database. Uh, for example, if I see this face, whether this face has been mapped to this user, it is not like that. Okay, it is actually recognizing on the spot. So, for example, if you're even wearing a, a hat, it will understand this, that this uh, face uh, belongs to uh, this user. So, uh, it will open it for you. So, a very, you know, so this is done by convolution neural networks, uh, which will, is not in, under the scope of this uh, study. But uh, having said that, you can always, uh, when we introduce deep learning, uh, you can always go through in depth and understand how convolution neural networks work. But it's very interesting, actually. I mean... Uh, CNNs have, you know, improved so much that they are even beating human, um, uh, even having a better accuracy than what humans can do. Uh, that's interesting, right? Uh, voice to text again um, is kind of your uh, Google Translator or even your uh, whatever you're saying. For example, Alexia um, um, and all. So uh, there are n number of examples where the machine learning is used. Okay. The voice to text, it will understand the vibrations of the receiver and understand that this this uh, letter that this person has spoken is mapped to this text. Okay, so n number of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, examples. Legal board. So if a, so imagine how difficult it is for a lawyer to you know go through so much of you know books and so much of data. How how about if I have a law board? And it can, you know, I feed in that this is my problem. It, it can suggest me, okay, this is your solution. Or these are the laws that cover, these are the penalty codes that cover it. So, uh, customer service, uh, you know, uh, uh, how do these uh, service providers are understanding the customer voice and, you know, uh, suggesting methods so that uh, if this customer is really angry, I get back to him and they're actually understanding by the voice, by the sentiments uh, the customer is speaking, and they are recommending that this customer is angry, he may churn out from our service, let's give him a particular discount offer he may be interested in. Okay. Healthcare, uh, uh, to our cardiologist, uh, um, I think it was Andrew, right? So, I think uh, healthcare has really benefited from uh, uh, machine learning, especially deep learning. I mean, uh, people are saying that, uh, you know, cancers, especially tumors, brain cancers are being 
you know, predicted way in advance uh, than what it is humanly possible for even the best of the doctors to um, predict uh, heart heart rhythms are even being predicted that if this if how this ECG looks like you know even if it is good uh, this might not be that good uh, two years down the line according to his different different lipid profiles sugar profiles I mean I'm not an expert in that field but that's how it works um, the, so autonomous cars uh, I think everyone has heard about Uber Google test driving their autonomous cars so autonomous cars really are dependent on deep learning algorithms to you know guide themselves to you know destination without you know uh, having incidents on the road. So it is a huge, huge uh, application of. I think it is the benchmark right now what people are trying to achieve. Okay, I'll pause here for about two minutes. Uh, um, any questions on this? So basically we want to say uh, machine learning means we have some previous data we will feed to machine and for the next output we will give okay this is my input give me the output is it correct exactly to put into perspective that is well said Sunil so you have a data for example uh, I think stock prediction is very easy to understand in this sense how do you predict the stock okay so you have your data right now okay you don't have your data in the future if you would have data in the future then there is no need to predict okay? you have your data right now you're training your machine that if your data somewhat looks like this to be very crude if your data somewhat looks like this please predict the price in the future okay so your input will be in the future whenever there's an input you have the input ready for example let's say um, there are a lot of algorithms which are relating the news to stock stock prices okay so for example if Donald Trump uh, says that uh, X and X statement what will be the stock uh, what will be my price of uh, Dow chemicals uh, stock price of Dow chemicals uh, let's say uh, two days down the line so there are algorithms which are predicting stock prices in the future so something which you have not seen if you have already seen a certain instance then you know what your price will be you don't need a machine to tell you a machine is there uh, to tell you a particular instance which you have not seen in your history but you want to know it okay got it Sunil? yeah so uh, we mean we have n number of data as of now uh -huh. and tomorrow next data is coming input is coming for which we don't know output so that is only prediction that can be wrong or right yeah yeah prediction can be wrong or so right that's that's correct so Okay, so it means that is also related with probability somewhere. Exactly. I think you are hitting the nail on the head. There is a probability of everything, and you cannot be 100% sure that this, uh, your whatever output you are uh, giving, is uh, you know 100% correct. No one can be sure of that. Okay. So uh, there's a problem. Uh, everything has a probability associated with uh, a particular output, and you can know what is the accuracy of your model. Uh, on your training data but yeah again that is something which is a, a probable scenario that how, what is the confidence uh, typically you call it a, uh, as a confidence interval in statistics that this is you are 95 confident 95 percent confident that this data will is correct I mean this output is correct it means uh, assuming we have n data and we are using any model uh, I mean libraries then it will also say me how much accuracy is this or will it not say anything just it will give output whether that can be wrong or right no no so and question is if that is wrong who is going to fix that uh, no no so uh, I think uh, what we are trying to say is uh, that you have n data points you have trained your model and you know a training accuracy we'll come to that so when when we do cross validation right we'll come to that you'll understand it better how what is the essence of cross validation what is you know test data you'll understand that uh, I think your questions will be clear by then 
And also two things you use, uh, one algorithm means there is no fixed algorithm yeah, there is no be used in all cases. No, no, no. There's, so if there's, uh, there would be a fixed algorithm, then this won't be a so big a study for research, right? People don't know which is the best algorithm to fit in. There are many iterations, many uh, uh, go-arounds. There are so many algorithms which are being developed as we speak. And uh, there's no particular uh, best algorithm uh, to fit in for every case. As I told you, this is not something which is a hard-coded problem. You have to, you know, have statistics knowledge. You have to understand the model principles behind it. And every model has a different assumption. So you have to go in. Uh, so when we talk about machine learning, we'll talk about all these things. Don't worry. We'll uh, address all okay. of them. Okay. Uh, okay, that's great. Only one more question, basically. Yeah. So you gave around eight or nine examples. Only in the mental science, you gave that deep learning solves this one. Huh. Why not in all others? So what does this deep learning mean? And how is it that example was different from others? Okay. So uh, uh, why in I healthcare? I, I think in healthcare, in voice to text, in image, uh, face recognition, even in stock prediction, I mean, deep learning can be used anywhere. But uh, oh, okay. why, why healthcare? I told it specifically because healthcare has, uh, you know, uh, had significant advantages after using deep learning. So we'll come to uh, why deep learning is you know better in terms of traditional machine learning models, how it uh, does, uh, your, I mean, improves your accuracy. Uh, we'll come to that again. Okay, nice. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, there's a, a quick question. Uh, isn't the training or the uh, learning of the machine, is, is it continuous or like, to do it only one time and uh, then based on that training it does the system because the data changes daily right yeah so that's a very good question krishna i think uh, so uh, there's uh, so for example when you are developer when you are a developer of a model you have some understanding of the data uh, your model is not continuously updated it's not a continuous process but having said that uh, you need to have uh, some time frames where your model needs to be updated with your latest data, but it is not a continuous process. It is a discrete process, and it is you know dependent on the developer or the you know whatever the costs of updating the model are. So it will be dependent on many things, but it is not a continuous process. Thank you. Okay, Vasant is asking, what are the substitutes for Python for machine learning? Uh, substitutes, I would say Python is being uh, widely used because it has almost all the li libraries. Uh, since it, in, it is an open source, we'll come to see why uh, Python is very advantageous for machine learning. Uh, R is also being widely used for machine learning, but uh, deep learning, NLP, the advanced uh, machine learning problems are being solved by Python only as of now. But then again, there there is Google, which has in introduced TensorFlow for deep learning. There's NVIDIA, there's Microsoft. So everyone has a different R data architecture. But uh, Python, if you know Python, I think you can, you know, have, uh, you, you, you can train your hands on any of these architectures. Okay. Uh, I'll just take so, one more question. Sorry. Uh, uh, so if we learn this, how, how difficult is it to switch from Python to R? Like, R, R is pretty easy. R is a statistical software. It is not a programming language. Python is a programming language. R is comparatively easier than uh, to understand than Python. So if you know Python, I think uh, you will be good to go with R also. But having said that, uh, R also has a different syntax compared to Python. But I think for machine learning enthusiast, I think Python makes more sense. Okay, I'll just take a one minute break uh, and I'll just uh, start again. Okay, one minute break.
Okay, can everyone hear me? Okay. So we'll continue. Uh, any more questions? Okay. So, uh, uh, as I told you, uh, why Python is uh, widely used as a uh, machine learning tool? Okay, Sunil, uh, I think uh, you do you have a question? Okay. Um, so Python uh, is uh, an open source. What do you mean by open source? Is that uh, anyone can contribute for example uh, if you think that you have developed a package or you have developed an algorithm of yourself you need to put in uh, your request uh, and python can approve it uh, if they see that if it is valuable they can put it uh, on their so for example let's say scikit learn okay or let's say logistic regression python developer uh, uh, i mean a particular person didn't develop or the python team didn't develop logistic regression they can there may be a person x from each one of you it can be anyone who had developed logistic regression according to his statistical uh, knowledge and then approach uh, your you know uh, the python team that i have developed uh, such a such package uh, can you just see this and put this on your web uh, i mean put this in your program uh, so that's why it has a lot of contributions from, you know, the computer science community and that's why it has the most number of packages and that's why it is being widely used. Same as uh, R, okay, uh, so R is again uh, an open source tool which uh, anyone and everyone can contribute but of course there are checks so that the quality is maintained and uh, there are no bugs uh, that, uh, that creep into it. So um, it's very easy to use Python, a very intuitive language. Uh, just to uh, put that into perspective, for example, in Java, if you need to print simple hello world statement, there are three, four lines of code. In Python, you just need to print hello world. That, that's how simple it is. Okay. Uh, so as I told you, uh, these are the libraries that um, Python has. And uh, so uh, we'll not go into depth right now. Uh, but uh, as I to told you, these are the packages. Pandas and NumPy are used for data uh, structure. Uh, Scikit-learn is uh, for your machine learning. Matlab lib is a visualiz visualization. It is uh, the top 10 amongst uh, most used languages in the world, loved by data scientists. Uh, okay. So uh, I don't uh, think we, sh uh, we need to even reiterate this. All of you know how important it is uh, just to you know, have that in value, have that in numbers. Uh, so there's a projection that the market will go by, uh, go to 5.05 billion by 2020. Uh, big data, <laughs> big data is uh, something which your machine can't handle, okay? Or your servers can ha can't handle. That, that can be according to the volume. I mean, if, you, if you're having 8 GB machine, uh, I mean 8 GB RAM, you cannot handle a 1 terabyte data set, right? Uh, uh, similarly, if you have uh, um, uh, if you have a lot of high velocity that your data is coming, okay, so for example, uh, uh, Amazon, yeah, if I count the number of Try to start to count the number of clicks the Amazon website is having every uh, day. That is huge data in terms of volume and also velocity because every second there are number of clicks that are observed. So uh, that's how and variety. Variety is basically uh, it can be in form of images, it can be in form of text, it can be in form of videos. So your data, for example, uh, your uh, autonomous cars. Okay, so every second it is reading frames from videos or it is taking uh, pictures so every and then it is taking sound sensors it is taking motion sensors so there are multiple uh, types of it is not feeding in an excel sheet right a car doesn't uh, autonomous cars are is not feeding data in from an excel sheet this it is having data in all forms and bits so that's what 
uh, your variety of data means. So big data is uh, another um, big area uh, of uh, you know machine learning. So uh, after this uh, course, uh, we uh, expect that everyone should be equipped with uh, Python as a pet programming language. He or she should be uh, should understand what's much machine learning. Uh, probably uh, start applying that to real world problems. And of course, you know when we are going through, we'll discuss all of the possible machine learning algorithms uh, that are there right now. Uh, Cross validation to tune the accuracy of the model. Okay, so since uh, one of you had a very, a was very eager with this question, how your train and test is happening, let me uh, uh, give you a very simple, uh, I mean, explanation of what happens. So, <clears throat> as you said, so for example, if you have hundred data points in your, let's assume that you have an Excel sheet of hundred rows and uh, five six columns. Okay, um, you have this data. You need to train the train a model on this data, and you need to use this model to predict in the future. Okay, makes sense. Now, you also need to understand how good your model is. Okay, so for example, if a model is uh, uh, you have trained a model of 100 data points, you feed in the same 100 data points to the model. It doesn't make sense because your model has already seen these data points. It has it knows. Okay, so. I am again saying machine learning is not something uh, which is a extraction information as extraction of a database. Okay, it is something which has to do that your machine has never seen in uh, in, in his experience. Okay, in its experience. So, for example, if you have trained on 100 data points and you feed in 100 data points and you see the prediction and compare it with the actual value, you will obviously get a very low error because the machine has already seen the experience, seen these data points in its experience. However, if you do this thing, you take 80 data points, you keep 20 days, 20 data points for testing. Okay, so 80 data points will be classified under the training of the data, training the model. 20 will be used for the testing of the model. Okay, so uh, you have you train your model on 80 data points, and then you test your model on 20 data points. On the other 20 data points, so that accuracy you'll understand. Okay, this model has didn't see these 20 data points earlier. Right now, after the prediction, I compare the prediction with the actuals and see what is the average error on these 20 data points. You'll get a fairly good understanding of you know uh, how your model will perform in the future. So. Um, I'll not again reiterate or and spend much time on this right now because we have a particular module on that uh, but uh, yeah just to you know satisfy the curiosity uh, I mentioned this um, okay the last uh, week uh, we'll have go in little depth on deep learning and natural language processing to give you a taste of what it is uh, but uh, uh, in-depth analysis of each of these will not be done in this course okay so uh, I'll Skip this uh, history of Python. Uh, so uh, this is how it came up to uh, speed. Uh, okay. So I don't think I need to, you know, spend much time on this. Uh, these are basic definitions. Compiler versus interpreter is uh, a compiler is something which you know converts the language into a language that the machine understands. Interpret it does it directly on the fly. So I need not spend much time into this. Python is an interpreter. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, um, so everyone has uh, installed uh, Anaconda. Uh, Anaconda. Can you please open your Jupyter notebooks? You know uh, how to open the Jupyter notebook. Okay. So there are two ways uh, you can use. So just type in Anaconda uh, on your screen. There will be an Anaconda Navigator, which is a desktop app. You can click on that. I'm not clicking because it takes a little bit of time, um, uh, but uh, you guys need to do this. So, uh, or if uh, you don't find Anaconda Navigator, just type Jupyter here, and there will be a notebook app. Okay.
can I, uh, can everybody open it uh, please ping me i'm not getting a picture of what is happening okay and you has replied yes should the yes that's great krishna yes Sunil, yes. Thank you so much. So after you open a Jupiter, uh, open your Jupiter notebook. Uh, there, probably there, uh, there will be a black screen which appears like this, or like a command shell, and then it will open your local host on your web browser. Okay. So what you need to do is. Uh, Go here, click on new, let me see this, and click on Python default. Okay, and uh, so You'll see something probably like this. I mean, it will be blank in your case, uh, but some kind of uh, interface like this. Okay, Andrew has uh, reached there. That's great, Andrew. Okay, Sunil. Um, so, Neil, which one you are using? Are you going through the Anaconda Navigator or your Jupyter Notebook directly? Anaconda Navigator. Okay. So, in your Anaconda Navigator, uh, if you click on your Anaconda Navigator, then there will be... Uh, Okay, uh, typically Anaconda Navigator will have Jupyter Notebook. Uh, if you don't have, then you probably need to uh, install that again because Anaconda will have Jupyter. It will have Spider, it will have... Uh, okay, so Neil has it. If you don't find, just search it here, Jupyter. Probably you can get it uh, directly. <coughs> Uh, hello, uh, this is Sharad here. I'm not able to find. I am on the Anaconda. Okay. And uh, where to find that Jupyter Notebook? I also started that Jupyter Notebook, but it is the black screen I see. I yeah, don't yeah, see yeah. any other thing. I don't Correct. know. Correct. Okay. So th you, probably you are seeing this uh, if you see my screen, right? It is saying one time token authentication, something like that. Is still there. Okay, so just uh, wait for some time. It will automatically open on your web browser. Okay, and then what exactly I need to do there? Okay, so if you go there, you see this, mm -hmm. and then click on Python default. Okay. If you click on this, uh, you'll get something like this. Uh, probably a blank one, but you'll get something mm -hmm. like this. Okay. Uh, Sunil, I am sharing my screen. Okay, so you are on this page, right? Uh, where it says Jupiter untitled to last checkpoint, right? Sunil? Yes, correct. Yes. Okay, then perfect. perfect. Okay, so I think everyone is on the same page. Okay. So don't do anything right now. Uh, uh, so I... Uh, uh, okay, now let's... Uh, just type this, str is equal to hello.
and just print str. And then just press control enter both together. So everyone sees hello on their screen. Uh, this only the green highlighted one should appear. Uh, Andrew, did, did you no. uh, just just need to do this? Print str hello. str is equal to inverted commas hello, and then. No, you need not print your parenthesis. Uh, I mean, you did not give parenthesis there. Uh, print uh, this should be a space and I can see this, right? I'm just running this. Yeah, it's telling me I should have parentheses around the string command. Uh, which Python you are using? Which uh, edition? Uh, th Python, Python 3. Okay, I think Python 3 has made that uh, session. Okay, no issues, just put that out. Yeah, it works now with the parentheses. Okay, okay. So in my case, basically what tabs uh, you can see, say plus, these tabs I'm not getting. And also control, interface not working. It's not doing anything in my browser. Okay, uh, well, uh, so I sh it should happen like this. I mean, uh, uh, that's how it works. I mean, it should open up on the browser. So probably we'll get back to you after the session uh, because uh, uh, I think other people have already um, started that. Just follow uh, me on the screen. You can uh, try on your notepad, uh, you know, uh, uh, red try on your notepad and after this session we can look at it okay so okay, okay. so what is a variable uh, variable is uh, something which stores a particular value right so like we like str equal to hello so the hello is your data and str is your variable right so you're storing the uh, the data of hello in a variable called str okay so um, labeling the data, okay, uh, uh, reserve memory location to store values. You assign values to the variable. So equal to is your assignment of operator, okay. It is not equal to equal to. I mean, uh, there's a distinction between when you want to compare if A equal to 1 and A equal to 1 is something different, okay. We'll get back to, uh, get to that later. But uh, this is just a, you know, run through of what is a variable. So there are uh, so many data types in Python. String, string, it means if you want to feed in words. Integer, if it is an integer. Float, if it is a decimal value, okay? Okay, now uh, we'll do this. Uh, okay, now, <coughs> so for example, you did this, right? Print str, it showed the complete word hello, right? Now, for example, as a user, okay, let me open this. As a user, if I want to see only the first letter, okay, now uh, Python uh, enables you to access, you know, um, each of the letters of a string, okay? So if you want to take H, if you want to take E, if you take the L, O, each gives you power to e access each of the you know, uh, letters of the word. So, okay, now this is very important to understand or, you know, hear me out properly. Python always starts its indices with zero, okay? It doesn't start with one. Uh, H is zero, okay? The indice means what is the address of H, okay? So H is zero, E is one, L is two, the again, second L is three, and O is four, okay? So if you want, if you want to go and see what is uh, on the, if you want to get the value of 
oh just follow my screen okay so it says o is at the fourth it is not it is a five letter word but zero one two three four okay now if you want to see uh, uh, let's say the second word that is e then you have to put in one sorry one okay so it will give you e okay are you guys getting it this is very important python yeah. starts its indices from zero and not from one okay so just do each of these i'll do it with uh, do it with you just follow me and uh, check your results okay now this is very interesting so 2 is to 5 it means it will start from 0 1 2 it should start from 2 then 3 then 4 okay now this is very important python whatever it is there after the semi uh, after the colon it doesn't include that okay so it is actually 2 3 4 5 is not included okay so it will display Sec, uh, the third letter the fourth letter and the fifth letter in actual but in python it shows it shows it says second third and fourth okay in dices because it is starting from zero so again i'll mark it h is 0 e is 1 l is 2 l is 3 and o is 4 in python okay so if you want to access l l o you have to write to 2 to 5 5 is not included then 2 3 4 do you get it okay now let's see this str2 what it should give it should give l l o i from 2 it's almost the same thing right here i've specified the end which is actually the end here i've not specified the end but it this means i'm taking this to the end okay from starting from 2 i'm taking it to the end so llo is again the same output we are getting here okay i'll do it a little fast because we have a lot to cover uh, but uh, just stop me if you have any doubt okay so okay now see this str into 2 it means you want you cannot multiply a string right it doesn't make sense to multiply a string into 2 but what python does is it is a very user friendly uh, approach so if you want to concatenate two strings one after the other i mean the same string just have str into two it will add two strings okay It's the same thing as uh, str plus str It's the same thing as str plus str okay and if i even put str it will again it will give three things okay so it's the same thing as str into 3 okay str minus 1 uh, now this is uh, very interesting if you want to see here so what it gives is this is the minus whenever you have a minus let us understand this whenever you have a minus it is saying from the end so from the end it is taking the first letter from the end it is taking the first letter that is o if i take the uh two from the end it is taking the second last letter okay uh okay now these last two is very important uh, concentrate on this i'll write uh together okay so what it is saying see minus interpret each of the numbers uh, as it is each of the signs as it is so what i told minus is from the end 3 means from the end we are taking the third so 0 one uh, sorry first second uh, whenever we are trying from the end there is no zero when we are starting from the uh, forward direction there is zero from end it is there is no zero okay 
so you are taking minus 3 means you are starting from minus 1 minus 2 follow my cursor minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 and colon colon means the same thing here colon means we are taking it to the end so from minus 3 it means minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 we are taking it from the end l l o so we should get l l o any questions here Any questions here? I repeat, can you give me a yes or no? Good for now, Vasan. Thank you so much. Sunil, okay. Thank you so much. So I presume everyone is clear till now. Again, if you see the last one. So <coughs> trace this number again. So minus means what I told from the end. So three, the no, sorry, one from the end, two from the end, three from the end. Okay. So we are taking from from the starting two minus three. And I said whenever this sort of thing is there, two to five, we didn't include the five, right? So again, from zero to this, we'll not include this. So we'll take H E. Okay. So these are the basic uh, techniques where you can, you know, uh, slice your text, okay? From a colon, so whenever there's colon, you're starting from the end or starting from the starting. And if there's colon at the end, then you're starting from the uh, end, okay? So just very easy to understand. Uh, you'll just get it uh, used to it when you practice, but uh, just uh, understand whenever. So this colon means there you are starting from the start. Okay, then minus is till the third letter from the end. Okay, so I'll not spend much time in this. I hope everyone is clear on this. Okay, and as I told, if you add anything on a string, it will just get appended to it. So if you, I showed str plus str, it was hello plus hello, it means hello, hello. And uh, str plus exclamation, it means hello, three exclamation. I'll just show you this quickly. Okay. Remember one thing, whenever you are inputting characters, for example, if I want to write hello, one, two, three. I will not write one, two, three. Okay. Python will understand this as numbers. If I want this as characters, I will put it in, in commas. Okay. So hello, one, two, three. Okay. Remember this, that is the most important. Whenever you want characters, that should be in uh, inverted commas. If you want numbers, it will give me an error, right? If you see this, it will give me an error. Okay. Okay, now integers. Uh, I'll not spend too much time into this uh, because string is, uh, I mean, whatever we learned in uh, in string is a more advanced version. Integers is much simpler. So if you have, uh, this is an integer, 16, print A, 16. Okay. Um, do you want me to do these addition, subtraction, division, multiplication? I mean, it's just uh, a very simple. Uh, okay, let me do this. A into four. Okay, Shadat says uh, it need not be done. I'll just show you the modulus. Okay, so print A was 16, A into 16, A into uh, four is 64. And a modulus four is zero. Modulus means the remainder. Okay. Okay. Uh, now see this. Uh, for example, uh, okay. Now forget this. For example, I put my name and then I put a year. Okay. Now there's two uh, two ways you can print this. Okay. Uh, so 
uh, print name year this is a simpler thing name comma year okay so it will print shubodeep 2018 you can also do this by saying print percent s percent s and then so you have told that the uh, let me read this statement out we have told python to print two strings person s means string person s means strings with a space and those string address will be in this variables person name and year so if i run this again it will give me again show the 2018 okay we are clear on this right i'm not uh, uh, i'll just do a simple modification to make you understand one thing if your year is 2018 i cannot put string here okay i need to put it as a integer so integers are in person d if yes it is a string it is in person s if it is a float it is in person f okay all good to go give me a yes if you have uh, if you don't have any questions i mean uh, are we good to go okay and you thank you so much person thank you so much okay so i uh, same thing uh, i'll not repeat this again uh, okay print division and now this is interesting print to these are the all the, uh, uh, these all are the same um, operators nothing different from uh, you know integers uh, this is again the same thing which we did except for the variable we are declaring the operation here only okay now if you want to put it in two decimal places i'll just show you the code for that Okay, concentrate on this. I have put year as 2008. Of course, it cannot be point, but just uh, on the lip, don't go into the little sense. Uh, 2018.567. Okay, this is a three-digit uh, decimal. Uh, I want to have just the two decimal points after 2018. So I write percent point two f. Let me show you. Uh, okay, uh, so 2018.57. Right, just taking only. it will round it off obviously and it will take only two decimals if i want five decimals so 56700 okay so i think everyone is good with this nothing to worry about here okay so these are the keywords uh, we will go into each of them later uh, uh, this is just to get give you some taste of it we will not go into details right now okay so uh, these are statements a collection of statement makes a program these are very generic uh, examples assignment statement is something where we are assigning values print statement conditional statement will go into uh, it, looping statements will go uh, and see and okay so operators arithmetic operators operators comparison operators logical operators bitwise operators uh, bitwise operators and assignment operators are not Uh, uh, not assignment operators. The bitwise operators are not uh, used much because we don't operate on, uh, you know, bit. Uh, we don't carry out bitwise operations much uh, because, as I told you, Python is an interpreter. It can easily understand your language and then have it uh, change on the fly. Uh, assign, but it does have the capacity. Assignment operators. So uh, this is an equal to. Uh, okay, uh, let me show you an example of bitwise of x. Plus two, x is five. Okay, so I'm using this assignment operator. So what it means is, okay, I'll just uh,
So this means is the same as so x plus equal to two is equal to x is equal to x plus two is the same uh, uh, sentence. So Python gives you this to shorten your code. That's it. Uh, normally, this kind of operators are used in loops. Okay, when you want to increment uh, each number. Okay. Uh, special operators, identity operators, and membership operators. Uh, we'll get to that later. Okay, now let's see a list. Okay. So a uh, list is basically uh, something uh, what you call an array uh, in typical. Uh, computer language array is a sequence of words or sequence of uh, sorry a sequence of data types okay now in C uh, int array could not hold a string character okay but Python is very intelligent it can even hold different data types in a particular uh, variable so for example here I have defined a is a list okay so you can define list by this or you can uh, define list by this. There are two types where you can define list. Okay, so either of them works. And then this is your assignment. So you are giving a the first uh, uh, first uh, value is one, and the next value is p. Okay, and then you can even put a float value. Okay, so if you print this, I'll remove all these things. Okay, we don't know, uh, not need it. So see. It doesn't give me an error. It is, uh, you know, uh, it can uh, take multiple types of data types in. Uh, you can put uh, in your list. Okay. So, yeah. Any questions till now? Give me a yes if you are good to go. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So structure of a list uh, uh, the same indexing as we spoke uh, when we are doing of uh, in string. So your first index is uh, address by zero. The next, okay. Any sorting keywords person? Um, can you be a little uh, clear on that sorting as in sorting keywords? And you know, uh, want to ask how to list uh, how to sort the list? Okay. Yeah, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. Okay, so uh, zero, one, two, three, the same type uh, where we uh, how we discussed uh, the index uh, in term, in the hello world uh, um, example. Okay. Okay, so creating a list, we have seen accessing a list. I think uh, it's pretty easy. Looping over a list. Okay, looping over as in how we can traverse inside a list. Okay. Now let's see that. This is how you define a list, or this. This is how you assign the numbers. Uh, this is your looping. Okay, so uh, if you know C um, or C plus plus, you must remember that you know defining a for loop was a huge task. You need a counter variable. You need the array. Uh, you need to you know increment. But Python is very very intelligent. So you, you see this for i in a print i. If you dis if you just write this statement for i in a, I mean it will under i you even not need not define it. Okay, so you just write for i in a print i. Python will automatically understand that okay a is a list. This user is asking me to iterate over a, okay, and go through a. So for i in a print i. So if I see this, uh, okay. Uh, Let me put these as comments here now, so that I'm going to get confused. See, it's very intelligent. I need not didn't, didn't even tell that I have to increment i by one or i is zero. I just wrote for i in a print i. Okay, so it is going through a and it is printing a. Okay, so it is very very intelligent and. Modifying list, modifying. Uh, I can uh, so, for example, if I want the second, uh, so I have already written here. Uh, for example, if I want the second element, 
so second element means 0 1 2 the third so this 3 should become 4 I want 4 to be assigned at the a2 value okay so if I do this sorry okay and if I put this as uh, uh, this, so you see okay wait okay I need to write that in a different uh, uh, different line because uh, this is already processing this one two three four and it will print that and this is a later uh, value assignment but you guys get this right if I uh, write it here okay one two four four five okay one two four four five because I made three which is at the second uh, index according to Python is four so when I iterate over this one two four four five okay now uh, searching is endless uh, so searching is equally easy okay now uh, Yes, uh, we can change the value uh, to a string because uh, as I said, uh, the list uh, can take any value. It can take an integer at an index. It can take a float. It can uh, take a string. So we can change any value to that uh, string. I mean to the list. Okay. Now just uh, to see uh, we what we were doing is uh, uh, searching a list. If So just to show this, I'll uh, do. Yeah, thank you, Krishna. So uh, I know there's five in it. Okay, so I'll just search five in the list. It says true. Okay, so if five in A, uh, print true, else else print false. Okay. Now a very important thing in Python when you're dealing with loops is this indentation. Indentation is how your code is structured. Okay. Now, whenever you are uh, running a loop or an if else statement, this if is your if okay then there's a colon and then there's a indentation of four spaces or you can press a tab okay then there's an else and then you can press a tab okay so how this is how indentation works why is this important let me see uh, let me show you for example if you want to write a nested if statement i mean if in inside an if okay for example, if you write want to write an if here, let's say if uh, str equal to hello, see then this if statement will start from here. Okay, so this is how your so normally C and other languages have brackets. Okay, so you you put a bra bracket. So outside bracket, inside bracket, it will understand the nested ifs. But in Python, you need not put any brackets. You just have to put the adequate space. So this if, this is a bigger if, it go, it will go inside it. It will print it. Then it will check another if. Then it will go inside it and then print. OK. So this is how it works. Any questions right now, till now? OK. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, Vasan is asking whether this colon is part of syntax of all loops. 
uh, yes, Vasan, that is uh, important because Python needs to understand from where the uh, uh, you know loop or the if statement starts. Okay, so this colon um, you're referring to is important here. Okay. Is it for all or only for if? No, it is for all. Even if when you start starting for for or while loops, uh, you need to put that. Okay, so um, okay, now coming to the sorting a list. Now it is very uh, surprisingly easy. Uh, let me where did my I can go? Okay, so um, sorting in uh, Python is very easy. You just need to put uh, so for example a equal to one to b, and then okay, this is uh, put all these in columns. Okay, so this uh, particular syntax error, I think. So, um, okay, the error was that it doesn't understand print a dot sort directly in a line. So just uh, separate those lines, and it will uh, store the sorted array uh, or sorry sorted list inside the same array. Okay, same same list. So a is kind of a is equal to a dot sort. Okay, and so that's why um, it was giving an error. Uh, so yeah, it's very easy actually. Just you need to put the list dot sort and it will sort the list for you. Vasan, does this answer? I think uh, someone had a question on sorting, right? How to sort this? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, for sorting in descending order, you just need to put a parameter in, uh, in that function. I'll just tell you the parameter. I'll just type it here. So this they basically there are two ways you can do this. Um, either you use sort and then reverse it. Okay. So I'll just uh,
ओके थैंक यू सो मच I'll just uh, wait for one minute. Uh, if anyone has any questions on this, you can ask me. Is there any help available for the function or anything? Yeah, that is that. Also, you can use. So that's why uh, I told. Uh, so uh, if you put e dot sort as okay. So wasn't uh, normally we uh, all the keywords and all uh, they are available online. So I think uh, Stack Overflow is an is a wonderful place where you can get all the answers for your queries. Uh, and you know uh, have it ready so normally we use every data scientist uses uh, stack overflow and then there's geeks for geeks which uh, helps you with all the queries uh, but there's no specific manual uh, that is there for python keywords as such but uh, in the content where we saw in our slides we already have a collection of keywords like we uh, where you can see but uh, of course that is uh, uh, not uh, so because uh, um, this comes to the point where that python is an open source right so everyone is contributing almost every uh, other day so you cannot update your manual so or you cannot send updates uh, to your manual so frequently so that's why it is available everything is available online so there are multiple ways to uh, doing it so for example i I did it like this. This is this is what came to my mind right now, and then there's a sort reverse. Uh, so uh, this is also can work. Uh, so there are multiple um, keywords. So uh, you'll get to know every time every time you program, you uh, search on Google and you get your doubts. Uh, yeah, so that's how you learn. I mean, it's not something which you can learn uh, right now. All the keywords, but it comes with practice. Okay, uh, so sum and averaging is very easy. Sum of all items in a list is uh, uh, is very uh, I mean, uh, it's very very easy. I'll just show you the code if I have this. I just need to put sum of a. I mean, if your a is the list, then you just put sum of a, and then average is just you need to uh, divide it uh, divide it by the length of a. Now, uh, just uh, one thing you need to see. So, for example, we have A is one, two, three, four. Okay. Print length. Okay. So um, there's no confusion at all about the length. Okay. There's no zero index, one index. Length is length. So if there are four elements, you need to, uh, uh, you know, the length will return four. So um, just need to put sum of a divided by length of a, right? So that will just give you the average. Let's try this. Uh, sorry, I just received a ping. I didn't couldn't read. Uh, Can you please send send me back? Okay, I missed a ping. I think uh, I'm not getting the response again. Anyways, so um, let's continue. Any questions till uh, now? Right now? Send me a yes if you are good to go. 
ओके ओके समवन हैड रिटन दैन दैट देयर इज एन हेल्प कमांड इन पाइथन आई थिंक यस दैट यू आर करेक्ट देयर इज अ हेल्प कमांड बट अगेन व्हाट आई एम ट्राइंग टू से इज many times you don't know what you are searching and it is always better to google it and go into stack overflow or you know top search results uh, so uh, for example i used to go into the help uh, uh, in python but it doesn't actually help me much huh? so that's why uh, i think google is a much better uh, destination to have your queries uh, of about keywords and because uh, you know uh, platforms like stack overflow are uh, addressing problems like us problems like uh, for people like us which who are you know uh, trying to write codes and uh, you know struggling with keywords uh, because every day there is not something new so help will not un, uh, help you much in that sense because you sometimes you don't know uh, yeah exactly um, and you is right all because google is applying ml to your query Uh, perfect answer. So that's why. They, so that is part of an information retrieval, uh, and how you efficient your query, um, you know, gets. Uh, so that's why uh, I think it's better to go into Google and just type your query, and you get better results there. That's why I suggest uh, people to go into help there and not uh, go into Python. Okay. Uh, so I have one question. Uh, uh, basically, um, very similar to lists, but it's. Uh, it's kind of uh, doesn't have uh, it is always unique values it doesn't have duplicate values right so um, i think it's uh, let's go back to the jupyter uh, notebook here so sets uh, i think it's very similar um, to lists so you have those same um, in just uh, in case of uh, list you are using set uh, you are uh, you can introduce one two any in, in integer any character okay uh, now this is very important where you are doing set differences now where do we use set okay so for example your data may, might have repeated duplicate values right how uh, it's very difficult for you to you know go into your data find the duplicate values i mean it's not uh, impossible obviously but it takes a lot of a lot of lines of code you know to remove the duplicate values and duplicate values really don't help much uh, in analysis right um, um, because uh, when you are trying to you know uh, have um, gbs of data it, it's really a waste of time you know having to go and code your duplicate values so uh, that's why python has set so set will remove all the duplicates so for example if you have 1 2 3 4 4 5 if you do a set then it will do 1 2 3 4 5 okay it will remove that uh, two uh, two fours and replace it with one okay now uh, what is set difference so basically if you do x difference y it means x is there you're just taking out the elements of y which are present in x okay so let, let's see this so i already have the output here so x difference y it means uh, in postcard radio telegram you are taking out radio and television radio is gone television was originally not there even so whatever remains is postcard and telegram okay similarly y difference x means from y you are taking out uh, postcard radio and telegram but postcard and radio telegram Uh, sorry, postcard and telegram didn't uh, was not there even at, the, at uh, your place. So uh, whatever is remaining is just television. Okay, union is just a mathematical uh, expression uh, where you just you know join, uh, not join. I mean um, add your uh, set and of course uh, again it will not take repeated values. It will only keep uh, single instances. Okay, I think it's uh, pretty much. Uh, clear uh, okay so um, i'm not going in details into each of the commands because it's pretty much the same um, uh, and you just need to, for example if you want to do an union you just need to pay for union you do need to difference if you need to intersection you just need to do 
intersection okay so uh, the subtraction is already already told difference add remove is uh, just add and remove the keywords and I create the set is similar to your uh, creating a list print maximum and minimum value uh, in set is just the max offset and min offset and length of set is again length of set so I think uh, it's pretty much the same okay um, okay now next is uh, dictionaries now uh, dictionaries is very um, okay. dictionaries are very interesting to handle and they operate in a little bit okay uh, I'll just pause here any questions uh, till now yeah one question is there any key value space and available like map in Java yeah so dictionary uh, that's exactly where we are going right now dictionaries are the key value uh, uh, mapping uh, which is used in map reduce uh, yeah so uh, yeah so thank you so much um, so uh, whatever you were referring in map uh, so it is uh, used as key value pairs in dictionary so uh, for example as we told list has its own index from 0 1 2 3 4 5 uh, but dictionary has uh, key and value so key is for example eggs and the value is this so milk cheese so uh, uh, so naturally you get the essence that whenever you're declaring a dictionary you need to declare both both the key and the value you cannot just keep the values because dictionary will not automatically have indices in place okay so this is needed uh, so for example uh, when you are uh, doing a lot of uh, data crunching I think I mean um, for example if you are doing uh, text classification right so your doc 1 will be a certain vector of words doc 2 document 2 will be a certain vector of words so you cannot keep index indices there okay you need some particular tangible reference to your um, values that's where uh, the dictionary fears in okay so it's a very powerful tool uh, and pretty much used uh, uh, widely uh, but having said that people uh, all most of the people still prefer to use list because dictionary use a lot needs a lot of manual uh, you know uh, key keys and you need to have an uh, index dictionary so that's why uh, I mean dictionary is very powerful but it is used in very certain uh, instances Yes, uh, dictionary can be a key list. Uh, so, for example, eggs can have a certain uh, list associated with milk can have a certain list associated with. That's a very good question. Egg, uh, dictionary can have even list of lists can be there. Okay, so a certain list, for example, in indice zero, uh, can, there can be eggs, milk, cheese, yogurt, butter, more cheese. Okay, index one, there can be uh, certain other instances. So there are lists of lists also there lists in a dictionary key is also there so there are multiple uh, you know uh, uh, data structures that can be uh, used in python that's that that's what makes python very uh, you know powerful very good question okay uh, so creating a dictionary i'll uh, since it's a little different i'll uh, uh, run through it uh, Yeah, I have it right here. Okay, yeah. So as I told you, you can de declare dict uh, with uh, this command. Dict one is equal to uh, dict uh, brackets, or uh, you can introduce uh, uh, curly braces. Keep in mind these. This should have curly braces. Okay. So this is your key, and this is your value. Okay, and then this is your key, and this is your value. Okay. So uh, okay, now you cannot do a dict one plus dict two because it doesn't make sense. Uh, 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 Python doesn't, uh, uh, you know, understand what you're trying to do by addition. So uh, it, uh, so there's a different way to concatenate uh, two dictionaries. I'll just write down the code here.
so you can keep your original dick one and then update can uh, everyone hear me okay and you can hear sunil can hear Basan, I think there's a problem at your end because I receive yes from almost everyone. Okay. Okay, Basan, now it's good. Thank you so much, Basan. So, uh, this is how you update your dictionary. So, um, now if I print... Okay, this some error. Okay, uh, one important thing is if you try to update a dictionary which has a common key, then it will give you an error. Okay, so but, but because it doesn't know what to do with that key. Uh, okay, I don't know why it's giving an error. Okay, this is there. But I think it should work. Uh, I think it will keep the key for, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. So it is updating dick two in dick one. So dick one will have a new value. So B will be from dick two. Okay, it will uh, override the value of six. Does everyone get this? Okay, great. Uh, that's good then. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, we have done the exercise looping. Uh, looping is uh, okay. So uh, that's a good question. How it is sorted? I'll write the code on the um, on your screen right now. It is always sorted on keys. Okay. So you cannot uh, sort on uh, values. I'll. Uh, it's a, it's a, a good amount of code that. Uh, Needs to be written. I'll just write it. Okay, can you see this? Okay, now let me show you one thing. It is sorting on keys, okay? 
However, you can also sort in values. This is normal use. Uh, if you do, if you uh, take the values and keep it sorted dot i to values. Okay. You want me to do that? Uh, this is Krishna. Uh, my question was on the first this thing, right? So it is basically we putting a. Visit the function lambda. Um, for now, I think we are good with this. Okay, uh, I'll not spend much uh, in tuples. Okay since tuples uh, is not very important particularly because of the fact that tuples cannot be easily modified okay uh, it's exactly the same as lists okay but uh, it's immutable okay so if you define a list you cannot edit it you cannot write uh, you cannot add anything you cannot remove anything uh, so uh, that's why tuples are not very so these are all trick questions changing a tuple doesn't happen Deleting doesn't happen. Test, of course, you can do iterate, you can do. Okay. Converting a list to tuple is a very simple task. You just need to put the name of the tuple inside the list command. Okay. And it changes to a list. So, normally, uh, uh, what happens is uh, uh, why this mentioned when you pull out, uh, uh, you know, um, data from databases, they are in forms of, in form of tuples. So, that's why you may need to change them into a list first and then uh, do, but generally people don't use it particularly because of the fact that I stated they are not easily changed. We have, I think we have already covered this, uh, what uh, if expression and the statement, else and the statement. Uh, okay, so if you want to do an else if, then you have to do, do it elif, not, uh, okay, and uh, so, um, okay, you want to try out the exercise, one of the exercise. Uh, give me a yes if you want uh, me to do or you want yourself to do. I mean, uh, okay, so you want to do it right now? Okay, so let's give it a try. Uh, okay, you don't want to do it right now. Uh, Sunil so doesn't want to do it. Okay, so okay now uh, for loop. Uh, I think okay now let me just introduce with the function called range okay now uh, when you put range I'll just show you uh, how what we are meaning here Okay, uh, guys, can you hear me? Okay, so range is basically uh, whatever uh, number you put, uh, it will just create an array from 0 to the n minus 1 number. Okay, so whatever number you have put, you will just get uh, number. So this is very useful in, uh, you know, uh, loops because, uh, for example, if you want to iterate over uh, six times you can just put a range and use this. I'll just take a one minute break and I'll come back and enjoy.
Okay, guys, I'm back. Uh, so, any questions till now? Uh, are we good till now? Any question on Python or machine learning uh, that that has crept in? Okay. Uh, Andrew, uh, I am using Python 2.7. Probably it has been updated for your version. Uh, what exactly is the answer you're getting? Uh, so I get range open parenthesis zero comma six close parenthesis. Uh, Andrew, I can't hear you. Probably you are speaking on mute. Is it? Uh, can you hear me now? I seem to be unmuted at my end. Can you hear me? I am unmuted at my end. Hello. Okay. Uh, can you can you I'm hear me? Not able to hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, anyways, I don't know why I'm not able to hear Andrew. Uh, so it, it changes uh, for different versions of, um, you know, uh, Python. So if you are using, I think, Python 3 and above, uh, that might have changed. Uh, so but that's not that's not a problem. You just need to know that the range is a function which, uh, you know, introduces you to... Okay, uh, let's. Okay, so, uh, Break. break function is something that you want to go out of a loop in case a certain condition exists. Um, so <clears throat> break is not a function which is widely used in machine learning because the loops and all uh, already are inbuilt inside the packages. Okay, uh, so um, it's not something that uh, you'll use much. But uh, having said that, uh, it, it's good to know. So whenever this condition uh, arises, you just break out of the loop. Okay. So as per your request, we are not doing the sizes. Um, okay. Uh, now let's define a function. Um, function is something um, that is a user-defined uh, function. So for example, addition is a function. Subtraction is a function. Uh, it is already predefined in Python, but uh, there are certain functions which you may be interested in having, having it at your own end. And this can be anything. So it can be a concatenation, it can be a sorting, it can be a multiple, um, I mean, uh, you know, search, sort, and addition, or average. It can be anything. So it's something which makes your task easier. So for example, if you want to do uh, something with again and again, Okay, then uh, it makes sense to create a function with that. So probably in terms of machine learning, let me give you an example. It is called a pipeline. Uh, so machine learning pipeline is something, for example, when you are taking a data, okay, you are um, cleaning it, uh, you are making it more structured, uh, 
than what it is right now then you are you know, let's say you are removing the missing values uh, um, many of the machine learning models cannot handle missing values okay which will give in, give you an error so um, yeah so many of the uh, machine learning models may, may not uh, be able to handle the missing value so it will give you an error so you need to impute it impute it means uh, what is the most uh, you know sensible way to estimate the missing value given some parameters okay? so um, then you need to form some models then you need to form find uh, then you need to do cross validation and then so it's a whole pipeline okay so you may need to run this uh, pipeline on a lot of uh, data sets okay there may be 10 15 data sets so every time you cannot code it so that's why your function comes in okay so you make code which um, uh, has this whole pipeline function in, in place and then you just re keep on using it uh, again and again so that it's more uh, you know make it make you makes your code more you know, user friendly and it's better for everyone to understand so uh, it's basically there are uh, certain uh, a certain structure uh, which uh, a function uses so there's a definition there's a function name and then there are arguments okay and then there's a state set of statements or whatever you want to do and then there's a return value return means if you for example if you want the function to return uh, for example if you're summing up the arguments um, if you want the addition value to be returned then you just do return of that value otherwise a function in itself will not return anything so uh, for example this function is uh, you, how you're defining is a hello world Inside it, it is uh, doesn't have any arguments right now. It's just printing hello world. Okay, so you can call in the function any every time you call in the function uh, uh, hello world, it will you know print uh, hello world. Okay, so you call in a function like this. Okay, so um, uh, the function name and then the brackets. So function uh, hello world uh, with the name. So for example print hello and then there's a name the name will be fed in from here so for example uh, hello world Shri it will print hello Shri hello world and care it will print hello and can hello world Anand it will print hello Anand are we good, good with this give me a yes if you are okay thank you Andrew Okay, uh, so um, you can, uh, as we um, saw that we can have multiple arguments. Uh, so for example, uh, the hello world uh, is a greeting and a name. So, I mean, uh, you can have your hello world and then there are two arguments. These two arguments will be printed. Okay, so you can even, you know, uh, have the arguments being specified with the value here and of course uh, you can have the arguments directly here so i think we get this right so yeah if we uh, develop a square root function all the square root function is already there in python but it's just you know uh, to mm, give you a more uh, i mean just to give you a perspective of how to use the function so a is the argument uh, that value is a uh, to the power 0.5 and then you are just returning if you don't return this red well then uh, after either you print it here or you return it otherwise you will not get anything uh, any return value from your function okay so whatever you do print square root 4 so it will return 2 and it will print 2 here print square root 9 it will return 3 and print 3 here okay so you get this in right? So variable length arguments is, uh, for example, if you want uh, 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 argument which is a uh, variable, for example, here you are summing up and then you are filling in the argument. So my sum you are uh, having it zero. So for i and a, it means um, uh, a is kind of a list. So you are summing up, you kind of uh, adding up all the values in a and then you are returning, right? So if you sum uh, sum up this, then it's a four, and then sum of four five is nine, and so on. So if you uh, remember when we did a sum in list, okay, when we are we were doing calculating the sum in a list, 
it's exactly the same thing right it is just summing up uh, the val values in a list and uh, it is adding them okay so um, again uh, for example if you are uh, uh, this is the list uh, and then you want to change this list this is an argument you want to append uh, one number here and then you print the appended uh, uh, data okay so i mean appended list so you can do all sorts of things here okay so lambda functions lambda function is a uh, very um, it is a very important uh, you know powerful tool in python uh, they are anonymous they don't have a particular name Partic uh, particularly they are used in loops where you calculate you you have the function ready on the fly okay so for example lambda ab is just just understand this as a function name and two arguments and then what is the function doing okay so you just uh, uh, so this is the lambda and this is what you are assigning to your uh, as a return value okay so print sum 3 4 and then you get the uh, value 7 and then print 2 5 7 do you need uh, do you want me to show this in uh, code i mean any of this uh, definition of function or we are are we good with this Okay. Wasn't wants to uh, wants me to show that uh, in this thing. You see this person? It's doing nothing. So let's see. Uh, um, we did this right. I did this. Okay, so I think it has uh, overwritten the function name. That's okay. So So this is your output, right? 11, okay? Now, um, if you give by any chance three arguments here, it will give you an error, right? Because you all, always said that you want um, the two functions and two, two arguments and you need to operate. So if you want to have three arguments, you can just here a plus b into c, okay, and then you give i. So you can do this. Was it, yeah, is this clear, was it? Uh, give me a yes, uh, if it is clear. Okay, Vasil, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, uh, you want to do any of the um, following exercise? Uh, you want to try it later? So many of the, uh, uh, for example, reversing a string. Okay, uh, just a sec. Sorry. So uh, many of the functions, for example, reversing a string. Yeah. <laughs> 
I know, Andrew. Thank you so much. Huh? Okay, uh, so um, many of the functions, uh, for example, reversing a string, right? So you might be thinking that uh, if I want to reverse a string, uh, I want to, you know, iterate through the array, take the first element, put it at the last. This is typically how C, uh, we used to code in C, if anyone has done that. Uh, so uh, you want to take the first element, put it in the last, you want to first check the length of the array, then, you know, uh, take a loop which starts from the first and then uh, assign to a new array which takes the last element to the first, something like that, right? So, uh, but in Python there are predefined functions. So for example, what we did with the sum function right now, right? So we have actually overwritten the sum function, what it was in Python. So. Mm -hmm. What happens is uh, for every time you know you uh, do this, the, there are many short hand functions which will, which in the background have the code, uh, but you don't want, don't have to write the code. You just want to put the keyword, right? So uh, reverse a string. I think there's a pretty much single word uh, uh, command to reverse the string. You don't have to even do anything, right? So uh, basically. That's why it makes Python very, very uh, powerful. Maximum of three numbers, of course, there's, there's no problem in that. So, okay. So I think uh, we will come to a close today. Uh, for tomorrow, we'll see each of the packages. What are these? So for example, what is matplot, matplotlib? Matplotlib is basically a, a package used for visualization and graphs. Uh, NumPy is, uh, is array where we want to keep all the data and so a num, a numpy is very powerful in the sense that it can it can have two dimensional three dimensional and even multi dimensional uh, data structures pandas is used as a data frame uh, so for example all the excel sheets that you uh, want to you know execute your model on the every time the data is stored in uh, uh, data frames. That's how um, all the majority of the models, except deep learning models, are, are stored the information uh, or data in pandas. Scikit-learn is the package which uh, you know has all the algorithms. Okay, so we'll get to that uh, eventually, and uh, I think tomorrow we'll see each of these. So, any questions till now? Uh, any questions on machine learning per se, if you want to ask any details of uh, what we did, uh, what we, so I think uh, today we, uh, machine learning was, uh, I mean, not introduced much. We just had a few examples, uh, but uh, yeah, as we go on, any exception handling in Python? Uh, Vasan, what do you mean by exception handling? Uh, Vasant, uh, I don't know why I'm not able to hear you guys. Uh, there's some problem. No, I, I, I don't think I can hear you. Uh, just a sec. Uh, uh, can you speak now? Yeah, I can I can hear you, Vasan. Yeah, Vasan, I can hear you. Okay. So exception handling like display good message like whenever there is an error with the some functions. Like the uh, I'm afraid there's a uh, your voice is breaking. Can you uh, can you send me a chat? Uh, can you oh. send me a chat?
okay uh, i need you guys to send uh, okay uh person i got your message uh, it says display user understandable message when there is an error in the program okay uh, that's a good question hasan um, and just uh, let me open this so for example uh, this thing type error right normally the last line in your error message will give you some uh, hint about what you are doing now there are certain cases where it is difficult to understand your uh, this type error message okay but what comes to your rescue is your google if you just copy paste this particular error in google directly okay without any edits 99% of the times you'll get what error you have been you are doing see because this is very easy right this is a single line program and we know what we are doing there are very less little chances of you know having a different uh, i mean uh, not understanding uh, what the error is but when you are dealing with big deep learning models and all sometimes it's very difficult to understand because there's a lot of matrix multiplication and all Uh, so it sometimes it's very difficult to understand so what is the best uh, way is that you copy that error uh, in hey uh, sunil i use 2.7 um uh, so okay i'll start uh, i'll try to upgrade that um but since all my source code is uh, written in 2.7 it'll uh, be a little difficult but uh, kurish if you can share me your problem uh pertaining to this because see uh, again i'll reiterate 2.7 and 3 might have some diff- just little difference in uh, syntax changes uh okay i got it sunil uh, but uh, the thing is all the source code that i have here yeah, is more in uh, 2.7 okay i'll try to upgrade that um, by next week probably will do that uh, but for this week let's keep it in 2.7 right now and thing is that uh, uh only thing is that it will um be different a little bit of syntax and a little bit of updates here and there uh but in essence uh i think type error uh, are you sure doesn't wasn't type error doesn't come in your uh case is it so it doesn't come with 3.x if you could just drop me your answer on your chat box Okay, yeah. So did I answer your question then? Okay. Okay, then we'll close for today. Uh, I just want. Um, can you drop off your WhatsApp uh, number so that it's easier for us to communicate? Um, on the chat box um, so that you know we have further communications on that as per even uh, shridhar's chat uh, shridhar's uh, message on the top uh, could you please drop your whatsapp uh, numbers thank you so much sharab it was wonderful um, having the session and even um, you know expand our scope even more Yeah. Who is speaking? Uh, thank you, Basant. Thank you, Charak, for giving your numbers. And Basant, we will uh, get a call from Sridhar uh, maybe after uh, half an hour, within half an hour. So, Andrew, do you have 
uh, WhatsApp. Uh, do you use WhatsApp on your phone? Andrew has dropped. Mm, I still have, see six people online. Yeah. Person is uh, replying to message. Uh, okay. Yeah. Hello. Hello. So, Krishna Kumar, can I give you a number? Because uh, in WhatsApp group, uh, it will be a very easy collaboration. Any idea you want to share, you want to ask something. So, it helps a lot. So that's why we are asking for the number. So you can create a WhatsApp group. And uh, if, uh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Sunil. And Subodhi wants to communicate something, he can communicate. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Who's speaking? Yeah, it's Sunil. Yeah, so. Sunil. Just I want to talk about the tomorrow's session basically. Mm -hmm. So I am expecting there will be more examples uh, for machine learning because uh, in second that uh, means many examples are not required. But if yeah, you yeah. will come with many examples uh, with those uh, as yeah, we are yeah. going to use. The first weekend uh, belongs to Python because many people don't know Python and we want to make them uh, you can say acquainted with the Python syntax, what are the main functions. And we are not teaching full Python here. We are teaching Python that is required for from the perspective of uh, machine learning. So first weekend will uh, will be covering Python. And from second weekend, the machine learning uh, will start in real terms. OK, so you mean tomorrow for those three, we will just import them and use a uh, few functions. Am I right? I mean, scikit-learn and uh, other numpy. We will import them and we will uh, try to use some functions. Yeah. So because uh, um, if you are uh, not acquainted with scikit-learn and matplotlib, uh, later it will be a little difficult uh, for you to, you know, have visualizations and plots. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah so that uh, for that only, I'm asking uh, to come more data examples because that is the main thing where people are stuck. To understanding the data from data to model something and then using these libraries. Yeah, yeah. So when we are going for modeling, right? So each of the models will have codes associated with it. And we'll go into depth uh, to each of the codes of what it means and all. Um, so uh, yeah, don't worry about that. We'll uh, definitely have uh, proper examples for in machine learning uh, cases. And also, I'll tell you the theory behind every model. Um, see, programming is one aspect, but then again, uh, the theory is very important uh, because I think you were asking, right, if there's one particular solution to uh, all the problems. Uh, so that's where your theory in, comes into picture of how efficient your model you can fit uh, based on your theoretical knowledge about the model. Yeah, definitely that will be great. And uh, one more question. Why are we using Jupyter? Can we use a spider or some other Python interpreter where we can get the drop down? As for example, I'm using a spider. As like Visual Studio, once I type a dot, it will show sorted, add something, whatever, available for so Yeah. So, or a list or. So actually, um, see, normally, uh, people um, use Jupyter because, you know, their visualizations and all, they come into a particular uh, view. And you don't have to, you know, switch views for the visualization path. The spider, I uh, personally, I also use, use spider also and also Jupyter. But then um, I think that should not be something which is stopping you from, uh, uh, from learning. Okay, okay. I mean, particular. That is not related with machine learning somewhere. No, no, no. No, no. That is just an editor, and we have to execute, write and execute. Yes, it's more of an ID, uh, and uh, so it's a user interface. There's, there's a lot of things. PyCharm is there, uh, Spider is there, Jupyter is there. Uh, normal even Py Python ID ID is there, which is very um, basic. Uh, but uh, uh, so have you said that? So it doesn't interfere in any with your this thing, machine learning. Okay, that's good. 
And so, uh, one more thing. Can you suggest some uh, good machine learning book? This will not be very advanced where we can't understand, but uh, medium level which we can follow along with you. Okay. So, uh, uh, I have a very, I know a very good book called in, 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 uh, Introduction to Statistical Learning. But the only problem, it is in R. Okay. But uh, it is, uh, I mean, for Python, I think uh, we, I need to consult with Ashok and uh, let you know what, I mean, what book we can suggest. Yeah, not for the Python machine learning I was asking because there I am a statistician. Don't worry, we'll cover that. We'll, uh, that's why we yeah. are here, right? So, uh, yeah, there are many books, but books are quite lengthy. It will take around three months to, to cover the book. So, uh, we can uh, we will refer you some very good books at the end of the program. But uh, okay. please stick to the program till we are into training. Because if you start reading the book, then uh, there will be scope will be very wide. And, uh, okay. and uh, yeah, so in data science, uh, because this training is, uh, is is a hands on training with Python. And suppose if we go behind any um, big uh, algorithm, so there will be a separate book on that algorithm only. So the the, the size of the data no, size is no, no, okay. yeah. 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 I, I don't want that too. Yeah. So uh, uh, one more thing, which is so. I, I did the Andrew NG course that is very, very mathematical only. So is that really math those mathematics required in real life or yeah, so I think these libraries and data it's good. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's a very good question. So for for the people who are data scientists to the core and they have nothing to do with the IT. Suppose they don't okay. they have nothing to do with the uh, R or Python, they are only working on statistical model or the uh, algorithm, they are enhancing the algorithm or writing new algorithm like scikit-learn likewise. So you need that uh, knowledge for sure. But in the IT scenario, you need to know where to use what and it comes with the experience. Because if you want to uh, uh, study the mathematical part of the data science, it requires at least three years. I'm saying at least three years that to that is also if you are a full time learner. Okay. So the so so mathematical are, part is huge. But okay. uh, if you want to implement uh, in, in a commercial world, you have to uh, know which, which algorithm is meant for what. And over the period, you will better understand what to use where. And Subodhi will also give you a lot of downloads. Which algorithm stands for what? What are the pros and cons of using in different scenarios? So after this training, your data IQ will be very good. You will be able to understand in real world problems. Suppose if you see uh, the, uh, elections, you will quickly understand. Okay, we need to apply this. Uh, we, if we do the exit poll or we do the, uh, you can say any survey, what uh, technique I should apply? So that data IQ uh, you will be getting after this program only. Yeah, that's the I'm also looking for. At least yeah. from the looking on the data, I can decide which yeah. library, which algorithm I have to use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's great. Thanks a lot. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, so everyone. I think Andrew dropped uh, a bit early. So I have uh, text, uh, mailed him to share his WhatsApp number if he uses. So we will be setting the WhatsApp uh, group after tomorrow's uh, session. And in the day, in the week time, if you have any thought to share or anything like that, you can put that on. And in the in the next session, Subhuti will take up take up all those things. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you yeah, so thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a weekend. Good weekend. Um, uh, Ashok. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Subhuti here. Uh, so yeah. should I keep the records of the WhatsApp number or uh, I mean no, what? I have taken it. Oh, you have taken it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Ashok. Good night. Good night, everyone.
Okay. So we stopped around uh, this point yesterday. So we'll continue from here. So what is a file? A file is some information or data which stays in the computer storage devices. It can be any form. It can be music. It can be text files. It can be video files. So any file, images, everything is a file. So uh, text files are simple text uh, and binary files contain binary data which is only readable by uh, the computer. Okay, uh, I think just a sec. Can you see now? Okay. Okay, let's continue. So, uh, what are the uh, so I just read out these two uh, this slide. Uh, so we'll continue from here. So, what is file handling? Um, we you create a file, okay? So mm, you create a file, you open a file, you read from a file, you write to a file, you close the file. So basically, these are the five operations you usually do in a file. Okay. Now, opening, uh, reading, writing, and closing. Uh, the you can while reading, you can read the entire file, or you can read your particular lines which you want. Um, writing, you can write many things. You can write number. You can write a string. You can write line by line. And uh, eventually you can close the file. So these are the basic steps uh, you can do. So let's uh, start with a simple program here. Uh, so if you guys can open your Jupyter notebook. So just write uh, some two, three lines of code here. So I'll just explain you the code. So open is a Python command. Okay, so open this file. This is the name of the file and you are this W means whether you want to write it or if you put it as R then you want to read it. So writing means you can edit the file. Okay, and reading means you just need to read the file. Okay, so for example when you open the file so and when you're opening the file as a Python object it is storing in my file. Okay. So mcal.txt is uh, the file name. I'll just tell you, uh, don't execute the statement right now. I'll tell you how, how what to do. And uh, then you store it in this my file object. <clears throat> you, you do a my file dot write <clears throat> where you write this text. This backslash n is basically you want to change the line. Okay. And then my file dot write second line is again you write this and you change the line. Okay. So first of all, just do this import OS and OS dot get W uh, get CW D. What it means is OS is basically a function which is used for, you know, getting to know the working di directory on which you are working. OK, <clears throat> so for example, you have. Uh, just import this and run this command. So get CWD means it's get current working directory. OK. So just, uh, you know, uh, execute this. Has everyone done? Uh, let me know with a yes on the chat box. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sunil. Uh, so uh, I did. Uh, can you see this line? I mean, it will be different uh, for uh, you guys. Um, so this is where your uh, current working directory is set. Okay. So this is where you, whatever uh, Python will be accessing, the files should be stored in this particular working directory. Okay. Now just go to this uh, documents. I mean, whatever file it is mentioned, just go there. And create a notepad. So, for example, I'll go to my documents. Okay. And I just create a file called mcal.txt.
Is that done? Just create it. Uh, you need not, you know, um, enter anything. Just create it as a text document and just minimize this. Okay, thank you. Okay, now just execute this statement. Okay, make sure whatever letters you have written, uh, you write the same letters here. Don't make it uh, make anything capital or small, other than what it is there. Just execute this. Is that done? Is it done? Give me a yes. Okay, so I presume everyone has done this. So uh, for next, you execute uh, write this line of code, my file dot write, and you just first uh, write this, and then uh, my file dot write second line, and then you uh, so these uh, here you have done all your writing operations. Okay, now you do a reading operation. Reading means you just need to read the file. Okay. So while you open the file, okay, this is the text file. You're giving it the R. Um, R is the text uh, like what we ex uh, what we had here is W. It's for write. It R is for read. Okay, so you just put the R here, and then for line in my file for each line. So Python is very intelligent and very powerful. So it will understand that whenever we are going through the file. Okay, so for line, it will understand that uh, line is one of the parts of that my file. So my file is a text file, and line is going through each of the lines in my file. Okay, so if you want to say, let's say, if you want to access each of the words, okay, what to do then? For example, I'll just show you here. Okay, first line is is very Okay, so you see here, you get uh, first line is very important. So I just run a line. For uh, so example, your cursor uh, when your um, Python program is starting, so your cursor will be on your first line. So first line is very important. It will print it, and then it will move on to the second line. Second line, it will print it. Now, for example, you want to access the important this word, okay, or you want to access very. So what you will do, you'll just do. For word in line, okay, print word. Okay, so uh, I'm not executing this because it will again give the same uh, and redundant uh, printing. So just uh, to give you the essence, so Python will understand my file is made of made up of uh, n number of lines. So whenever I start a loop, it will execute. It will go through each of the lines, and then word is uh, a, a line is a, a particular line is a combination of number of words. So for uh, when I do this, so every word will 
iterate i mean word will iterate through through every word of the line okay so you get this uh, any doubts here okay that's good okay so um So we did this, uh, reading, writing, closing, I mean close is just a function so you need not do, uh, I mean you need not write anything on this. So we have done this, uh, okay, now we have completed this. So these are the uh, exercises, I'll just uh, uh, go through it once. Write a program to write six lines in a text called hello.txt, so hello.txt hello is a, a file. So, uh, I mean, you just need to, what you need to do is, for line in my file, just keep a counter, okay? So, for example, you start, start with i equal to 1, for line in my file, and then I don't need this. So, print line, okay? And then you just need six lines, right? So, after this, what you do is, i is equal to i plus 1 okay so every time you read a line the i line i counter is incremented and then if you remember we did a break function so if i equal to equal to 6 right so you have already uh, so 6 will be there so 7 if i is equal to equal to 7 then you just want to break the loop okay we have already printed six lines one two three four five six and then after six when yeah uh, so what you can do is you can either you can keep this at six okay or you can uh, have this at seven and print the line inside the loop okay so what you can do is you can if i equal to equal to seven break else print line okay so uh, it's a simple use of the break statement that we discussed yesterday we normally don't use it but uh, I mean uh, in such cases it, it's a very uh, important or powerful tool to you know uh, have this in Python okay so we'll continue from here write a program to count the lines in a file again very easy you just need to uh, run through the loop keep increment i uh, keep incrementing i and then come out of the loop after the loop finishes and then just print i right so any doubts still here or sh uh, should i show okay so uh, i think this is uh, intuitive uh, i didn't print first Line, three lines, last two lines. So these are very easy. Write a program to find total number of words in a file. So I, I already told you. Uh, so for example, if you want to access each word, so you do first access each line and then you access each, each word. So you have a counter similarly as you had in this. So you increment with every word you're accessing and then print the final uh, value of that word, uh, final value of that uh, uh, counter. Okay, so uh, this is a homework, but uh, just to tell you, uh, write a program to find the longest word in a file. You can, it's a very easy thing. Uh, I've already told you that how to access the word. Now, what you just need to do is, whenever you're access of accessing a word, just put it, uh, put the length function in that, like we did yesterday, okay? Length of any list, length of any string. So just put the length function in the word. Okay, and uh, you just uh, keep keep storing that into an array, into a list. Okay, and then print it, uh, uh, print the maximum of the list. Okay, so so whatever uh, is the maximum. So there is a function called argmax in Python. Just note down this. Uh, I'll not do this because it's in a homework. 
but uh, just note down this arg max, max means so for example uh, in your list there are 10 values okay the fifth value is the max okay so if you do max it will tell you the value if you do arg dot max it will tell you the that the max value is present at the fifth uh, uh, at the fifth position okay so arg max is uh, just uh, note this down you can use this in your homework okay write a program to copy the content of one file to another this is again very easy so i'll not go into all these uh, okay now uh, these uh, i've already told you okay import os os is the um, so example for example uh, i've told you about matplotlib package you know about the numpy package now os is another package it's uh, it is you know used to calc you know know the directory on which you're working or you want to change directory people who have you uh, worked on linux uh, they might be familiar with this uh, normally windows uh, doesn't have this because I mean, windows itself has a user interface but for linux users who are, who are in shell scripting this is very important and this this is uh, what they use regularly so os is basically that uh, uh, system which is able to you know access all these things so make make did mkdir is means you are creating a new directory okay uh, change directory means you are changing a directory from one directory to other uh, get cw we have already seen this is the which directory you are currently working in rm directory is you are removing the whole directory for example if you are remain removing the whole folder then you uh, you can rename obviously uh, if you want to rename the file uh, you can rename the file and then uh, removing the file it means you're just removing that file and not the directory okay so i'll not uh, go into all uh, the uh, details of it because so for example if i run this it will just create a folder called new folder 4 in my already existing documents why it is because we are doing a mkdir means make directory so it is creating a new directory on your uh, particular path okay so for example if i run this you see there's a new folder for okay okay now Uh, so I, I had already created this that's why it's not uh, allowing me to create again uh, if I just write it as new folder 5 okay so I'll have new folder 5 here got it. okay so any um, questions till now any doubts Okay. Now let's get into the real business. Uh, okay. <clears throat> now I have I already told you yesterday that Python has certain packages which makes your life easier. Uh, so these packages have inbuilt functions okay so you need not uh, code each of your functions uh, every time for example in excel for example you need to do a lot of things in uh, you you know you get uh, select your data and then you go to the uh, your charts and then select a chart then you have to put your labels i mean uh, it's pretty easy there also but uh, i mean it's kind of a user interface that is driven there here you don't have a user interface right you uh, you need to code everything but having said that these libraries make your life easier and they have uh, codes which enable you to plot your uh, so plotting is very important because when you're plotting a date plotting your data if you're doing your machine learning you need to know how your data looks like you know how what is the distribution of the data how is the data uh, you know what is the correlation of this 
variable with that variable and you so you need to know the those uh, things when you are uh, you know uh, doing your machine learning so that is it is very important for you to know this package okay so there are certain different plots which you can plot you can do a pie chart you can do a stack bar you can do a histogram you can even do a 3d plot uh, you can do a sinusoidal i mean sinusoidal is just a function so it's a line graph basically okay so yeah uh, this you, if you go here okay on this uh, screenshots you'll get uh, what all possible graphs you can you know uh, make out of uh, matplotlib Okay, now let's see our first chart here. Okay. Uh, now, uh, just uh, keep this. Uh, this is the very. This is a very important statement. Import matplotlib dot pyplot as plt. Okay. Now, what it means is. So, uh, let me tell you. So, for example, Python has a lot of libraries, right? Uh, it doesn't. It has, for example, if there are 100 libraries in Python, okay, 80 of them are come with Anaconda as default, okay. 20 of them may you have to, you know, uh, install from your uh, websites, okay. So, for example, uh, Microsoft had developed an algorithm that is called Light Gradient Boosting. So, you need, um, you may need to, you know, go to your Microsoft website or GitHub. Uh, and you want to install that uh, algorithm package in your Python, but 80 of 80% 80 of the packages come with Anaconda as a, a default. <clears throat> now, with these 80%, I mean, amongst this 80%, only 20% are already, I mean, uh, already called. For example, sum or uh, averaging or max min. We didn't have to call any package for that, right? We were just doing sum of a or max of a. But functions like these, which are, you know, uh, a little heavy in size, it doesn't, uh, I mean, some user may not need matplotlib uh, to be installed, okay? I mean, to be called in as a function in his task. He may be doing something else. So uh, that's, that's why to keep it light, it doesn't give you, uh, doesn't have that package already called in in the program but you as a user have to call in as per your need so that is the function called import so import matplotlib this is the library name and this is the pipe plot so this library may have uh, n number of functions okay you need not require all the functions right now so this this command gives you the ability to select this particular function from this library and as PLT means, you want to name this as PLT. So PLT is something which is user defined. Okay. For example, if I want to even write plot, uh, okay, or plots, I mean, I need not uh, worry because this is something which uh, the user is inputting. Okay. But you cannot miss do a mistake here because these are the packages which are present in the Python uh, dictionary. Okay. So you cannot mess up with the names of this. Okay. Now, X is what is this? I we study we discussed. This is a list. Y is a list. Okay. Just plt plt. We have called in this function as plt. So plt dot plot. You want to plot X and Y, and then you want to show. Okay. Just execute these statements in your uh, notebook and uh, see how the output looks like. Is it done?
Okay, so that's great. Uh, I've got this from Shadad and Sunny. So, so you see, this is a very uh, normal plot with nothing labeled. I mean, you cannot have such a plot and show it to your boss, right? So, uh, I mean, there's no labels and access. So, you need to purify it a little bit. For example, this is how you, you know, give labels to your uh, graphs. So, for example, just uh, run this code. Y1 is again a list. You are storing these values. So now you are seeing two plots, two lines in a single plot, right? So your x is there, and then you are plotting x uh, versus y and x versus y1. Okay, so you are using a single plot. So plt dot plot x y and the labeled is first line because you need you want uh, the Py, you want python to understand which is this line so you have to mark it so this can be anything right first line or let's say this is the revenue okay uh, this is the profit okay so you want to give a color code so blue red and then legend uh, legend is, I mean, basically you have labeled it, but you're calling that, okay, here. So legend function means you're calling the legend part. Then you're labeling it with x-axis and y-axis, okay? So this is x-axis and y-axis. So for example, x-axis is anything, like for example, um, years in the... Uh, or let's say market penetration okay y axis your uh, so you have two things right revenue and profit so you can have it as dollars okay so and your title is your let's say sales okay so you just uh, you can see here how uh, this looks like, okay, and how you can change the look of your uh, plots. Is this clear? Give me a yes so that we can move on. Okay. Now, um, so this is simple line line graph, okay, line plot. What if I need a stack bar chart, okay? So here, you know, uh, so the x is the data, y is the data, y1 is the data. So you need a plot dot bar. So here you are just doing plot, plt dot plot, and now you're doing a plt dot bar, okay? That's the difference. So that's how you are telling Python that I know I need a bar chart uh, right now, not plot. Okay. And then uh, again, you have uh, you are labeling as first bar and second bar, and plt dot bar or plt dot bar, and then uh, you are labeling as it as x axis and y axis. Then you are giving it a title. Then you are calling in the legend. Okay. So legend. Whenever you are doing this, you have to call in the legend. Otherwise, I mean, whenever you're doing a label, then you have to call it a, call it the legend. Call the legend out. Otherwise, it will not show. And then plt dot show. Okay. So uh, whenever you are doing all these, right, plt dot show, it is actually, uh, you know, updating its memory. Okay. So for example, yes, it, earlier it was plot plt dot plot. Now it is plt dot bar, and then it is plt dot x label y label. So if I uh, I've up I've updated the X label. It was earlier. It was the market penetration. Now it is X axis. So these are updated whenever you are write, written, writing down this. Okay. So if you execute that, you will get something like this. Okay. Uh, so Sunil, uh, color of bars have been selected. You uh, you just need to have the same thing. For example, plt dot plot. If you put color as a is the same thing uh, color is equal to whatever you want okay you can put yellow and then you can put color equal to blue okay 
So colors normally um, Python gives you default. So for example, if, even if I don't specify the color here, uh, it will not give me an error. It, it is so intelligent that it will know that these are two parameters, two different axes. Okay, so I need to give two different colors. It may not be blue and red. For example, if I do see, so see, so there's a blue and orange. Okay, now if you want, if you put some other um, data also, it may put green. Okay, so uh, this default assignment. So every axis uh, it is called. So there's a default assignment, but if you want to specify it, then uh, you can specify that. Okay. Now, uh, this is a pie chart. Now, this is very important. So how can you plot numbers on a pie chart? So what it is doing is, it is um, basically it is plotting and it knows that two is, so these are numbers, right? So Python knows that two is twice of one. So whatever blue size is there, okay? And orange is twice of that. Three is thrice of blue. 4 is 4 times of blue and 5 is 5 times of blue, okay? So that is how it is uh, doing a pl uh, plotting, okay? But if you do in percentages, it will... So it's again the same, right? It's almost percentages uh, if, uh, if you add it. Uh, so, you know, for example, 9, 12, 14, 15. So this is 5 by 15, 4 by 15, 3 by 15, 2 by 15, and 1 by 15. Mm -hmm. So pie chart will always plot in percentages. That's how pie chart works, okay? And, uh, yeah. Now this is your uh, bar charts uh, or histogram. Okay, so bar charts we have seen stack bar charts here, and now this is uh, an histogram. Histograms, so histograms, you know how it works, right? So uh, these are the ages, and then these are bins you have created. So bins means what is the bucket you are looking at. So zero to ten means what are the ages between zero to ten. And, excluding 10 okay then the bucket 10 to 20 means what are the how many number in these i mean how what is the number of people having ages between 10 to 21 including 10 excluding 20 similarly 20 to 30 including 20 excluding 30 and these this is the frequency histogram will always plot you the frequency okay so this is mean three number of people are between 10 to 20 20 to 30 there are one there's one and so on okay and uh, so plot import uh, this is the common thing so this is the data part you have to specify the bins and then you do a plot dot hist you have ages in your x-axis my bins on your y-axis and this width is basically the width of your uh, histogram okay so you can put it as one also and just you know merge it but you don't want that, so just keep it point nine or point eight, whatever you want to do. Okay. This is basically the space between uh, your how much coverage you want to keep between. So if I keep it very little, so if I keep it point five, then it will be very narrow. Okay. So I think we are pretty clear till this point of time, right? Okay, moving on. And now, okay, now let's get back to the slides once. So, I've already done this, uh, we have completed all these things. Okay, now um, some of you may have, have a question that how do you know the legends in Pi, which is uh, what? So uh, labels is my label. So you have to put it manually. Um, my labels, this is a list. Okay, so this list you have to feed in here. So whatever you want to put and that will show here. Okay, so A, B, C, D, E. Okay. Histograms you have seen. Okay, now comes a very interesting subject called NumPy. 
so numpy uh, okay now yesterday uh, we already saw that there is something called list in python okay so list is basically an array a unidimensional array of numbers it can be a unidimensional array of strings even uh, mixed data types are even possible but that doesn't help if, uh, with everything right there are many cases where you may need a matrix you may you, you may need uh, let's say three dimensional array okay so you when you come with uh, i mean when you start your data exploration and you know doing projects you start to understand that why two dimensional and three dimensional arrays are required so for example each row in databases if you have dealt with databases each row each index might have three different information types okay so there is a particular hierarchy involved with that and um, so a normal join may not be helpful every time right you need um, you may need a three dimensional so for example if you're talking about stocks okay so uh, let's say one dimension is what is the company's what are the, so you can see that how this stock is competing with the other companies at this present point of time then there can be a different uh, dimension where you are seeing how this stock is performing over previous times with other companies so there can be many dimensions i mean it is difficult to ingest that at this particular point of time but when you when we discuss more about data uh, we'll uh, give you an idea how three dimensional data and more dimensional data look like okay so this is very powerful uh, i mean um, it's uh, again it's kind of similar to matplotlib uh, in terms that it is coming with the anaconda distribution you need not go and install it from the web uh, it's an open source and it's for linear algebra for your transformation and random number capabilities so uh, so when you are doing uh, when you are doing machine learning on python you are running packages right so when you are running the packages you're not going into the deeper sense of math mathematics that is going behind it but someone has created those packages right which we are using for our own uh, you know for our benefits right so when this guy has prepared the you know uh, packages he or she has done a lot of mathematics behind that so that engine has a lot of maths in it so this guy has used numpy okay so you may not be using it on your end but the guy who has built those packages has a use numpy so that's why it is important for us to learn about it okay now uh, let's go back to our notebook okay so import numpy as np the same thing that we mm, did um, again uh, numpy is the name of the package from python and np is something which, which you want to save as a user okay so your first array array a is np dot array one two three four five this is a unidimensional array uh, kind of a list okay and then there's a bidimensional array also so np dot array one two three four five six so one two so if you know in terms of matrix so this is kind of a three cross two matrix one two so first row has one two two on in the second column third, three four is in the second row three third in three in the first column fourth in the second column and so on now since it's a bi-dimensional array you need two indices to address each number right so zero one means zero eighth row and the first column or the second column in terms of uh, actual uh, so zero means zero row these two numbers and then you are accessing the first one it means second in terms of python you are accessing two if you print it then you get two okay okay now there's something called size size means what is the net number of elements in those that array okay so for example if it's a three cross two matrix then you have six elements in that it's a four cross three matrix then we have 12 elements in that 
and then uh, you can see the shape uh, command which gives you the shape of the matrix so three cross two is the shape okay so three rows and two columns are we clear at this point give me a yes on the chat box okay so neil has sent me a yes krishna and sharad uh, how about you okay uh, i just noticed yesterday uh, i was going through my recordings so at some point of time i was not able to hear you guys uh, uh, someone I, I don't know who had a question at that point of time but i just couldn't hear you uh, so i'm very sorry for that but uh, so if you have any questions uh, unmute yourself and you can you know talk or if you want me to unmute you just ping me uh, and i'll unmute you and then we can talk okay so just uh, keep that in mind i may not sometimes hear you uh, because of some i don't know which uh, some issue okay now uh, <clears throat> so again uh, we are doing okay uh, one more thing i just wanted to let you guys know so i don't know whether you have already figured that out so for example when you are uh, writing a code you need your code to be very clean right so for example why have created such different sections right you see every section is in a different code it's easier to you know understand so if you need to add another section in your code just go here click this it inserts a cell below okay now you may need to keep give a heading to that so just go here and do a markdown markdown you can just uh, write your heading for example learning okay and then you can add the cell here and you can go and do a code or you can if you do a code here then it will just give you an error okay so just uh, yeah, this is something which I just wanted to tell you. And if you want to remove the cell, and just remove, you can remove it from here. Okay. So it just gives you a clean code, and you know, so that you can understand. Okay. So where will we? Um, okay. Yeah. Now. Um, so np dot link space is linear spacing okay so you want to break one two five in ten uh, equal buckets so one two three four five six seven eight nine ten okay so there are nine buckets in between so you want to break them and uh, that's how it has printed this thing okay okay so i think we are pretty good on this uh, just uh, so if you print your array then it will print the whole array if you want to access the first element you do zero same as list what we did yesterday zero to three then it is uh, zero one two excluding three okay then now let's go on to the 2d numpy array we have already seen that uh, so for example if you have a two-dimensional array then you want to print that and then you want to so now just see this if you do a print add a zero a zero okay so python knows that you are uh, this is a two dimensional array now if you just give one index it will print the first row okay so one two will be printed if you give one two three it will uh, print uh, one and two okay but it will print the whole row it is not un, uh, sorry it is not understanding that you want which uh, number of these you want because you have not mentioned here so if you want to access two i've already told you right as uh, so if you want to access two you want to keep one here okay that what we saw in our anaconda notebook i have done this uh, nothing special here okay uh, now 
there is one uh, problem with num numpy right whenever you are declaring uh, declaring an uh, um, an array for example in list what what we used to do we had a very simple code right uh, for example let me write it i just put this here this is what we were uh, you know um, declaring the list with so it can, a list can be variable it can have multiple inputs it can one have in one input you don't need to specify your uh, this thing right you need, need not specify anything any value in this you just need to declare that but numpy has this problem when you're declaring it on a, an array you need to specify the size of that array okay it's not a variable uh, thing that you can put so np dot zeros is just declaring an array with zeros all zeros with this size okay three comma four three rows four columns once you can also replace that as once so why these functionalities are given why is ones and uh, zeros this is basically uh, again when you are doing machine learning it has a lot of matrix multiplication involved okay matrix multiplication uh, needs you know needs to define a lot of zeros and ones if you want to you know do uh, your matrix operations if you know the identity matrices and the one mat mat i mean matrix of ones so basically it um, you know helps a lot there that's why these functionalities have been given uh, as default in python uh np dot arrange uh, i think we it's kind of similar to the range function that we saw on in list yesterday okay uh, so for example 1 2 3 4 5 it, it is starting from 1 to and ending till and going till 5 okay linear spacing we have seen okay so we have already discussed this now D shape okay now this is very important so for example you have a unidimensional array okay so for example you have one two three four five six it's a linear array uh, you want to make it um, you want to make it in form of a matrix so just uh, array a dot reshape three comma two so you are reshaping this in uh, two three cross two so three rows and two columns okay and then you're printing this so one two three four five six is a linear thing, and then one two three four five six. Any questions till now? Okay. Uh, so we'll continue. Now. Revel is just the opposite of uh, shape. Okay, so you have shaped your array to some particular dimension. Now you just need to flatten it. Okay, so one, two, three, four. If you revel it, it will just give you a single a linear array. Okay, I hope you have uh, understood how this filling starts. So it will always fill by um, rows. Okay, I mean it will start with row one and then fill up, fill up the uh, thing by column and then second row then fill up by the column okay so like uh, and you can even change that okay uh, whether you want to fill that by row or fill by column that is also uh, op option there I'll show you later uh, but that there's an option there so but uh, devil is basically you want to flatten the array and make it linear dimensional so operations I mean is the same kind of uh, operations that we saw of our list sum min max okay and then okay now this is very important for example if you're doing a sum uh, the axis is basically whether you want to sum it over rows or if you want to sum it over columns okay so for example if you are if you have a three cross two matrix it means three rows and two columns and you sum it over columns so it will give you three values okay so first row will have an addition of the first row first column and the first row second column similarly the second row will have an addition of the second row 
first column and second row second column uh, are you guys understanding this okay let me do this uh, Sure, I'll, I'll show this. Just uh, whenever you you know do uh, your programming, just keep a check on the uh, you know brackets. Which one has a curly bracket? Which one has a double bracket? It gets sometimes it gets confusing, so it gets yeah easy with practice. So you have seen uh, you have seen one one one. So this is a three cross four matrix. Okay, now let's see this. A dot sum. Okay. Will uh, go to the um, so axis dot zero. Okay, axis dot zero. It means so. What it has done is it is summing over the rows. Okay, so we had four columns. It will retain the four columns. Okay, one, two, three, four. But it is summing over over the rows. So one, two, three. One two three, one two three, one two three. Okay. For if you change this to one, what do you expect to get? Can I uh, just um, see the answers on your chat box? That's right. Four, four, four. So it has summed up over this, this, and this. Okay. So this is how it works. Square root of array, and so each of the elements will be square um, square rooted. Array plus array. Each of the elements to this particular uh, this, uh, uh, will be added. Uh, you need to have the same shape. Array into array. It's a matrix multiplication. And array into two is doubling up the arrays of that uh, numbers of that array. Okay, I'll just take a one minute break here and come back. Uh, if you have any questions, just think over it. I'll just come back in one minute. Okay, I'm back. Uh, so, any questions now? Till now? Okay.
So you have already seen this. This is the same what we learned in uh, list uh, accessing the first element from the last. Uh, array 1 1 is basically if you have a unit uh, multi two dimensional array then you want the second element uh, from row and second element from column. So this is just subsetting if you want x uh, uh, what are the values which are greater than 3 and then whichever positions they are you just want to do minus 1 there. Yeah. So, uh, so for example if you want have and this, uh, so for example, you have this. This is a two-dimensional array. Okay, so you, if you access the first element here, then you want, you will get one, two. If you access zero to two, then you'll get one, two, and then three, four. Okay, and then uh, if you and want to access the last element from, I mean the first element from the last, uh, so it means the last element. So it will get five, six, and then if you want to access your second element of the row and second element of the column then you'll get four second row element of the row and second element of the columns four here and then you want to take those positions where array is greater than three and then there in those positions you want to replace with minus one and so you'll get one two three four was greater than three five is greater than three six is greater than three and then hence we have minus one any uh, questions here? Okay. So this is your homework. Uh, I think uh, well, it's easy to do this, not a problem. Uh, in case you have any doubts, we can uh, discuss next time. Okay, now let's go ahead. Pandas. Pandas, it's a funny name, uh, but uh, equally powerful. Pandas is basically uh, what you see in Excel. Okay, uh, a much more advanced version of that. Could you please download and share so that we'll be on the same page? Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, read the file and okay, you want me to download that? Um, okay, that will, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'll ask uh, after this session, I'll uh, let uh, Ashok know and we'll uh, send you the file. Uh, uh, so basically mm, the objective behind this was also that uh, you can also start looking into Google and how, you know, uh, uh, your Yahoo Finance uh, looks like and because stock prices is very interesting but having said that uh, if you require we can uh, I mean it's not something you, we want to compare or test you uh, just uh, for you to you know go go through the site and you download but we can send you the data let me talk with Ashok and I'll send you okay uh, so pandas it's basically uh, as I told you that it's kind of data, uh, a data frame and in Excel so let me tell you upfront here, pandas is very impor important and every uh, algorithm that we'll be doing uh, in machine learning will be dealing with pandas, okay? And uh, it's basically a advanced version of Excel, but uh, in somewhat it is, uh, it is a more powerful tool than Excel. A data frame is a two-dimensional array, okay? So how is it different from NumPy? let me show you here okay so numpy has a particular indexing that is followed okay so if you see on the left your axis 0 has 0 1 2 uh, is axis 1 is 0 1 2 and then uh, but however if you see pandas pandas you need not you know specify any index it's kind of an excel sheet so you have rows and uh, you have names on your rows and you have you know uh, descriptions on your columns and then there's the data so index and columns okay now there can be even hierarchical hierarchical indexes okay so for example one index can have three indices inside and so on so uh, let me show you how 
your pandas data structure is made and let's see here so import pandas as pd so i think it's pretty similar to what we have been doing for numpy format.lib so just import pandas as pd uh, we'll uh, let's go to the notebook and let's do this Okay, so DF is your data frame and data, I mean, this is the name of the data frame that you will be storing. PD dot data frame. Okay, so you're telling Python that whatever we write here inside the brackets, I want that to be in a data frame format, which is of this PD function. Okay. Now you can also do one thing. Uh, uh, so for example, if you don't want to mention a name of your own just import pandas here and then you can also write pandas here okay so it's up to you but everyone prefers that you know all the packages that are being imported have uh, some kind of an abbreviation so that it's much easier to write everywhere okay so pd dot data frame and then you specify all these values so you start with a double bracket and then you specify one two three then you start with another bracket then you specify four five six okay now see this you have to specify the indices okay otherwise python doesn't if you don't specify the indices that is even that is okay because it that's uh, then in that case python with, will assign default indices of numerals in integers what we say in numpy but uh, if you do you can if you want to do you can so we have declared the number then we do index okay so we have a uh, then we'll write p okay now see here you need to also specify the column so you are creating a data structure now don't think like whenever you are you know uh, going to uh, start with data uh, so for example if you have a 2 gb data which has 1000 rows you want to you have to specify each of the columns or you are specifying each of the indices if it is a let's say uh, a 10 lakh row data you need not specify indices every time right so normally what happens when you are trying to import an excel sheet or a csv file the excel sheet will have some headers or for example even uh, when you're downloading a date from a database right so every row every database has an index on the row and uh, naming on the column so uh, when you are importing that into python it will be imported in that same format okay you need not always uh, define everything but this is how you define if you're go going to define at all so um, and then uh, you have uh, columns okay columns you can specify whatever you want you want uh, let's say columns call one then call two and then call three okay uh, one thing that uh, you have to keep in mind yeah yeah Sunil has a question is there a way to directly import data from a database into pandas it is obviously there has to be a way otherwise it is very difficult for anyone to specify each of the data numbers so for example a very simple thing a simple way is to you know so for example when you are uh, uh, importing a data from let's say your data working directory right so i have uh, let's let, let you let us uh, show you the working so for example these are the you know uh, csv files in my working directory i just need to write here pd dot read csv okay i'll show you that code and then just mention that file name and it will be imported into uh, pandas uh, directly as an as what it was in excel this line of code whatever i'm showing you is just to have give you the knowledge that how you can 
you know define a data frame but in your day-to-day -day work uh, you need not define a data frame always i mean you don't have to do you just connect it to the uh, database or you know my source file it will easily understand what uh, you know you're trying to do okay so uh, so then if you print it this is what it will show you okay now let's see okay now you have uh, this particular um, uh, what's say a way where you can access the integers or uh, I mean the characters or integers or numbers or whatever uh, there are in each of the addresses so obviously you can see here uh, to access two you just need a and call two right or you need the index zero and call one I mean the index one yeah. so uh, data frames uh, will give you two options to access any of the address so for example if you want to access via indices then you have to use df.ilock 00 if you want to access through you know uh, names then you have to just give df.log a uh, whatever name you want to put and then call one uh, okay so just uh, let me uh, show this in your in, in our notebook So for example, I want to, uh, you know, You just need to keep in mind what is capital and what is small. So Python is uh, case sensitive in terms of functions. So just uh, keep in mind whatever you know, want to access. You see here, if I put this, okay, it doesn't work, okay. Um, you need to put this command df dot ilog. So, for example, when we were accessing numpy, okay, so we we were just trying to input the index of uh, the you know particular location what we were thinking, but I just wanted to show you in data frames it doesn't work, okay. So you always need to put this. If you are trying to access through uh, this thing, uh, I mean through names, or if you want to access it through uh, indices, then you want to put ilog, and vice versa. Don't doesn't work. So if you put ilog here, this will give you an error. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Now, for example, if you want to see a particular row okay you just need want to see I uh, the a row then you just put it like this you'll see all the uh, um, columns in that particular row if you want to see a particular column then you just put it like this okay so this column is there and whatever if you put if you put I mean if you keep something blank in either side of the commas it means that you want to see each and every value of that okay so if i put the rows empty i want to see all the rows in this particular column okay now it is uh, 
working on it. Yeah, so I think uh, you need to put this also. Okay, so just put a colon here. So <clears throat> normally, um, so whenever you put this uh, on either side of the commas it means you want to see all and then you can do a subsetting right so for example you want to uh, have want to see multiple columns uh, or let's say you want to see just column one and three you can mention that here okay so you can do multiple iterations with this and then again uh, if you put it in terms of indices okay i log uh, you can put the numbers as we used for example if you want to see the first row and I think you have to insert on okay uh, you can put 0 to 2 and then execute this okay so it's up to you how you want to do it and that's why Python is very powerful in terms of these uh, data frames which give, give you a very high flexibility in accessing uh, each of the data points so I think we are pretty good with this uh, any questions till now okay so um, I think uh, we are pretty good with this uh, okay now the uh, one of the very important uh, functions uh, called df.resetindex is, uh, for example, there's an index which we created right now, right? There's A, B, C here, okay? But at some point of time down the line, I may think that I may not require these indices. I just required what Python has in default, okay? So this reset index, what it will do is, so uh, just note this down, huh? reset index and this level 0. This level 0 is again telling whether you want to reset the index of your rows of your rows, or if you keep it as level 1, then you want to reset the index at your columns. Drop is equal to true means whether you want to keep your original index, whatever you had assigned, you want to keep it as such or you want to uh, get rid of that. So if you keep drop is equal to true, it means that ABC will go away, okay? It will only have uh, the reset index, and this will be sequential. There'll, there'll be no uh, manipulation with that. It'll just be sequential 0, 1, 2. And if you drop it, then AB, AB what C, whatever you we had created there, it will not be existing, okay? And then, uh, uh, okay, so we have this. And if you keep drop is equal to false, then this index will be there in your uh, data frame as a part of the data, okay? Now, uh, for example, uh, for sometimes you want to rename your columns. Uh, so for example, in machine learning, there's something called feature engineering. So when you engineer, I mean, when you change your features, uh, you need to rename them sometimes. So uh, your this is what your new columns. So you just create a kind of. Uh, can anyone tell me what what is this? We discussed this yesterday. Can anyone tell me? Uh, give me an answer. What uh, th what data structure is this? Excellent, so uh, that's a dictionary. Um, so you have a key value pair and you have this uh, curly braces which gives you a hint. So you just, uh, what you're trying to do is whatever uh, this key is, 
is your original uh, data name and new column one is basically your uh, new name okay so you want to put column one uh, to your assign a new name you new column one to that column two you want to assign new column two to that and then henceforth so df3 is your new data frame df dot rename is your data frame uh, original data frame has to be renamed with the columns taking the values this columns is a parameter and this new columns is a feed to the parameter so new columns will be fed into this columns parameter and it will be re renamed to these okay so i think there's no confusion with this okay so this is very important here this is if you just click on uh, each of these you'll get how what is the header for example if you are reading a csv file you need to put pd.readcsv and if you are writing so pd.2csv just forget the uh, two part right now so pd.readcsv is basically you are reading a csv type of file format into your data frames uh, json is a json file format html and so on don't interchange any I mean, it is not interchangeable. You cannot have an SQL file uh, being read in CSV format. Uh, it will give you an error. So uh, just keep this in mind. Uh, so, I, so it will depend on your file type. If your file type is Excel file type, it will not go into CSV. Okay. So you need to convert your Excel first to CSV and then read in pandas. Okay. So. So, for example, if you want to read this file, uh, this is available on Google. Uh, PD dot read CSV. PD is the pandas data frame dot read CSV is a function, and it is storing in CSV DF. Okay. Uh, okay. CSV uh, DF dot set index. Uh, it is uh, so. What we are trying to do is. This is your data. Okay. And you are setting the index with the date. Okay, so as we told you that uh, you are, someone had a question whether we can download the data from a particular database. So, for example, this is your database. You have connected to this path. You are downloading the file on this. Now you see you. This is the data. So this is these are the column state, open, high, uh, low, and these are the rows. Okay, now. You want to set the index with the date. So what you do is you just set the index, set uh, underscore index with the date, and so your index becomes the date. Okay. So if you now want to access, you want to go with zero to five. So I guess if you do this, then it will just uh, print you, you know, uh, the first five uh, elements of the data. Okay. So I think this is pretty. We are pretty good with this. Uh, okay. Now we'll just go into a little bit uh, briefing about machine learning. Uh, till now, do we have any questions? Okay. So Neil has said uh, he is cool with this. Uh, Sharad, fine. Krishna Kumar, okay, he's fine. So, uh, we also have a module on statistics, but uh, since statistics is itself a long journey, we'll not incorporate that. And since we have already done, done a lot of maths and, you know, uh, data frames and all. So let's go into uh, the real business. What we will do in this course, so that uh, you don't, you know, you get a kind kind of a feel of where we would be heading to. Okay. Now, yeah. before going, uh, sorry, before yeah. going ahead, I have one question. Yeah. Yeah. So we have learned this uh, NumPy and other to find our gen. So what is the use of that uh, in our journey, basically? Exactly. Could we give us a simple example this year? Okay, okay. So uh, let's see as data frames. For example, um, 
you're trying to what you're trying to do in machine learning right you're trying to form a model so when you're forming a model so you're running that model on a big on a good amount of data set so for example a sample data set may have you know 10000 rows and you know uh, let's say on an average 10 20 columns okay now to make understand uh, the model that how the data is to be fed in okay how will you fed feed the data in into the model okay the model has to understand some structure right that's where the structured data machine learning comes into picture you need to feed in some structure of the data and you need some indices and you know addresses of the data so that you know mod your model can access those right if you don't keep a data structure and you feed into the model how will the model understand that okay this particular uh, row is about an user named Shubhodi. This particular row is about an user named Sunil. Okay, so for example, it has um, uh, let's say the user database of uh, how many people have uh, you know undertaken M4, MCALS, PML course, right? So and we want to predict what what is the you know interest of the people uh, uh, which who are coming from this particular background. So let's say. You have so many data of the customers who have, uh, you know, previously uh, come into this course. You train your data. So this da this data will be uh, trained by a model, and the model has to work on a particular data, and that data has to be structured in a such a way so that the model can access each of the elements. If you don't have addresses of elements in your data, it will be very confusing for you and the model to understand, right? So uh, when so we yeah. Sorry, please go ahead. No, no, uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so this is as like a storing of data in memory. I mean, still we have not learned the model, am I right? Yeah, yeah, you have not gone uh, into the model yet. You are just, uh, you know, giving you the a brief introduction of how Python works. See, uh, you may not be using uh, NumPy as calculations, but the packages that your models will, will be using, right, uh, that you'll be using for the models, those packages have inbuilt codes. So, for example, when we go, when we go into the model part, right, you'll start understanding why we have used, you know, uh, told you about data frames and, you know. Yeah, that's the, that's the basically I want to learn, basically. I like a math dot leave we learned for creating bar chart, whether this is required and if required, how when and how it will be required yeah yeah yeah. so that we will tell uh, but this first and foremost thing that i told you when we introduced the matplotlib right as a data scientist you need to see the data first uh, for example someone had asked me yesterday that whether there's a particular answer to all of the solutions and modeling right so there's no particular answer to uh, uh, any of the data sets that this model is the best so you have to see your data. There, every data has different assumptions. Every data has follows a different distribution. So first, you need to visualize the data, how your data looks like. From that, you start fitting your models. Okay. So when you are trying to visualize your mod, uh, data, that's where in your matplotlib comes into picture. Okay. So two things basically. Do we have an example uh, from which we can use matplotlib? Uh, do we have any example? Yeah, so yeah. which we can see okay this is the bar chart or pie chart we are getting and as we have visualized we can select okay this is the column or this is uh, i mean attribute which we need to care of correct correct yeah yeah we will have that uh, particular part everything uh, what you are asking will be covered in the modeling part because in the modeling only you will require those visualizations okay Okay. okay, that's uh, I'll wait for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, let's go into machine learning. Okay. Uh, now, machine learning is basically of two types. Okay. Regression and classification. Now let's understand each of these separately. Regression is wherein you are trying to predict a continuous variable. Okay. Okay, now how you what you are trying to predict is let me show you show this. For example, um, 
you want to see that what is the outlook with of the weather what is the temperature and whether it is windy or not okay and you want to predict whether you know you want to go to play or not so let's talk about supervision okay so you already have this data you already have this data this data has been supervised with by someone who i mean it can be from your past experiences but someone has supervised that when outlook is sunny when the temperature is 85 when when it is windy when it is not windy i will not go to play or someone doesn't go to play when it is uh, sunny when is the temperature is 80 and there it is windy i'll still not go into play so someone has done this supervision every particular row has a particular output assigned to it okay and how does this output look like this output is basically yes or no so it is uh, of two classes whether uh, i want to play or not don't play okay there's no third thing about it there's not no maybe okay so there's just two outputs okay so this is called a classification problem which falls under the supervised machine learning techniques supervised i am again telling you supervised is something which person has already assigned the value to the previous inputs okay so when you are learning from your experiences you know all these experiences have occurred in your past and based on the new parameters for example if someone tells you it is rainy the temperature is about let's say 40 degrees celsius it is windy and when this windy is true whether you will go into play or not so you have seen this rainy but you have not seen a 40 degrees temperature okay so you want want to predict that whether you want to go and play or not for example if someone asks you if it is rainy and the temperature is 70 and it is not windy it means windy is false whether you will go to play or not you simply have an answer here yes i will go to play because i already know from my past experience but the challenge will come when you will see a variable i mean you see a temperature which is not in your database or you see a outlook which is not in your database okay that's when the challenge comes of machine learning is this part clear this is a very um, new thing for everyone uh so i'll be very going very slow on this and uh you stop me whether you want to um discuss this more and want to know more okay so if there are no questions i'll just go one step ahead so we have understand we have understood that play is a binary outcome whether we can play yes or no now just go back to your previous slide what is a regression same thing okay okay <clears throat> and let's uh, go back to this uh, example okay i think we don't have that example here okay now okay i'll give you an example of my own for example um, if you had this problem outlook temperature uh, windy and you want to check how many children are coming out to play okay it's it's not just about a particular binary variable output uh, whether it is yes or no we want to check whether how many children how many people are coming out to play okay so it can be one it can be two it can be thousand it's a continuous uh, uh, output and it, since it's the number of children it is ranging from 0 to you know, infinite it can be uh, any number between that so that is a continuous variable and you want to predict a continuous output okay so that that particular type of problem falls into the regression problem okay supervised learning so we have discussed classification we have discussed regression i'll reiterate again supervised learning is a type of learning where your data has been pre marked by an expert or pre marked by a past experiences of whatever you have seen 
and a classification problems is a type of a supervision supervised learning problem where you want to predict an outcome which is of a binary or multi class okay you can also have a multi class i mean let's say yes um okay let's say movie ratings okay movie ratings are one imdb rating it says it can be okay uh, let's say about um, okay yeah imdb rating 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 okay it can be in points but uh, we'll discuss when we discuss statistics you actually do, uh, there are four types of variables nominal ordinal interval and ratio we'll go into that but for now we just understand that classification problems have a set number of fixed outcomes okay your outcomes can be of that range for example imdb rating can be somewhere between 1 to 10 okay i'm not talking about an average of movies that can be uh, different but for a single movie let's say we are uh, having imdb movie ratings from 1 to 10 and not going into points regression is a problem let's say price if you want to um calculate the price of a house so you have uh, x number of features you want to predict whether the price of the house is 24 lakhs or if it is um, i mean uh, whatever number you want to predict okay uh, the other same example can be whether this house falls into the high category of you know cost expensiveness uh, if it is in the medium category or in the low category so he has fixed three outcomes i think this is pretty clear now what is unsupervised learning unsupervised learning is a type of learning where there is no particular supervision to the data okay so for example where where we saw here that someone has told that there was play when this was the condition i mean there was no play when this was a condition and there was play when this was the condition someone has already told what if you don't have this column and you don't know what was the state okay uh, so for example and let's take a very simple example for example if you have plotted a lot of data on height and weight so for example you were sitting behind, um, sitting in a clinic and for 3 months you have noted all the people's height and weight keeping your eyes closed you never knew that whether there was it was a female or a male okay so just think supervision is that you have each of the guys names and their gender and you have their height and weight unsupervision means that you have noted the height and weight but your eyes were closed at that point of time so you don't know whether it was a male on uh, uh, or a female okay so what do you do with unsupervised learning certainly if someone gives you another height and weight you will not be able to predict whether it's a male or a female because in the first and only you never had that data that who is a male or female so how will you even tell that guy whether this height and weight belongs to a male or female so that's where the clustering part comes okay so we'll not discuss clustering right now because that will be dealt in much detail later but just to have a uh, idea clustering is grouping of similar things so for example if you have if you plot all the height and weight of the people that have visited the clinic for 3 months you'll see a separation okay so some people will have a height and weight to the upper side and then some people will have a uh, height and weight to the lower side okay so you probably could figure out that okay there are two groups forming in my data maybe the higher and uh, higher weight and height is male and the lower height and weight is female okay but that sup that inference or that insight is up to the user okay data will not tell you what is male and female that interpretation is from by the user okay we'll see how clustering helps in machine learning uh, but uh, for now it is uh, uh, let's keep it to that so i have already told you this uh, so just go by the definition if you are training your algorithm with observation which includes the outcome as a part of the input data it is called supervised learning so we have told this okay now in uh, machine learning there is always a universal truth or you could say 
the ideal function that is uh, predicting your uh, you know output okay so for example uh, god ha go if you i mean i mean uh, a, if you're an atheist you want to believe that but i mean if you believe in god you'll probably think that god knows everything about this universe right so there's a particular function which has been used uh, to calculate the heights of males and females or that's how god has made made us right so he'll know the proper function but we as humans uh, we don't have that function right we don't know what god has used to calculate the height and male height of males and females height and weight of males and females you can only learn by yourself from the data whatever you are seeing in this universe okay so g is a function which is your guess so your what is your aim in machine learning the main aim in machine learning is to get g as close as possible to f okay if you do a g equal i mean if you get your g equal to your f then you have solved your problem but obviously every time you cannot go or take your g to your f right there has to be some error because you are not god at first uh, the first uh, thing you should know that you are not god you don't know what function has been used in any of the cases not just height and weight of males and females so your aim is to go as close as possible and that's why we ha have this notion of having the least possible error okay so we'll go come to this later uh but this is how okay any questions till now okay krishna kumar thank you so much uh sunil sharad okay now let's see into regression okay uh i have already told told this y is a number and uh, g is uh, the function classification it is a suit of algorithm that specialize in machine learning where the outcomes a list of values okay the features of the data outcome of the data and then your hypothesis or, or the guess okay so i uh, tell me the answers of each of one okay we'll start one by one email is a spam or not spam what is it is it a, is it a regression or a classification send me on your chat box sunil so says regression krishna kumar says classification okay sunil so has corrected classification sharad classification perfect so email is a spam or not spam it means uh, we just have two outcomes it can be a spam it can be a not uh, i mean uh, it may not be a spam so there's no two ways uh, about it i mean the, there's no third way about it so just spam or not spam stock price of a company come uh, three months from today what is it regression or classification reg sharad says reg krishna says reg sunil okay so i think uh, you get this uh, right so house price is again a regression person is diabetic or not based on blood report uh, i mean what is diabetic or not based on blood report it's again a classification problem okay so unsupervised learning is a type of machine learning algorithm used to draw inferences from data sets consisting of input data data without their outcome as i told you you were supervising with your eyes closed so you don't know what uh, data it was so this is what clustering looks like so for example uh, when we told that you have plotted the uh, height and weight of males i mean of uh, persons uh, that have visited in the clinic for 3 months you'll probably get two groups okay one on the on the higher end of the uh, right top end and one on the left bottom end okay that all be there will always be some scatter i mean there will always be women who are you know fit, uh, ha having a greater height uh, i mean again 
there's some there's something for example if you're sitting in a clinic in asia and you're sitting in clinic in australia uh, your values will be different right so i mean uh, that's why clustering is not something which will tell you what it is you just have to figure out on your own uh, or it will just tell you what is the distinction between each of the i mean what is the distinction in the groups okay okay so um, supervised learning uh, is basically uh, they have uh, many models okay there are uh, linear models there are non linear models there are decision trees random forest many things are there right but um, if if you are a, uh, if you are someone who is beginning with machine learning there's something uh that has to do with linear regression okay so linear regression is very important for a beginner to understand properly i mean properly i mean to the best of its score to you know even go into advanced models why am i focusing on linear regression as one of the most important techniques it will not i'll tell you right now it will not solve 90% of your problems because linear regression is too simple a model to fit in your data okay Uh, but linear regression will um, why we start uh, or say it is the hello world of machine learning it is just because it is very important for you to understand the basics of machine learning and linear regression is the simplest way to understand it polynomial regression is uh, another form an advance of linear regression i will talk about regularization and lejeune lasso later okay so now let's go into uh, a bit of linear regression okay okay now let's say uh you have a x axis and you have a y axis okay now you have typical features of a house okay and you want to predict the price of that house okay so someone may have a $3000 $300000 price someone will have a $100000 price somewhere someone will be having something so let's say if you are just taking the size of the house so let's say if someone is at around 2000 square feet the price is 3000 $300000 uh, if someone is at uh, let's say 600 square feet then its price is $100000 and this someone is around 1200 square feet uh, it is around $190000 so now uh, just follow me very slowly here each of these squares okay what do you see is the data that is being plotted okay whatever data you have in your data set for example you may have data for 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 13 data points are there you are plotting it here okay so one here one here one here it's just a basic plot nothing fancy about this now your objective is to predict some house for example if there's some house whose size is somewhere around um, you know let's say uh, somewhere around here what will be the price of this house what is your best guess here okay you need to understand how is this line is made okay i cannot fit an orbit line right i just cannot fit a line i mean does it make sense to fit a line going through 
most of the points or I mean should I make a line which is closer to the maximum number of points so linear regression is basically your line is being constructed based on the root mean square error now what is a root mean square error it is basically that for example you have a line so for at, for example at this particular point you are putting the input as 1500 square feet and there would be a value on this line right you want to put this line in such a way that your errors errors is the distance between the actual data and your line so actual data and your line actual data and your line actual data and your line is minimized so whatever so for example this point drop a perpendicular from this line to your line here drop a perpendicular uh, not exactly a perpendicular you drop uh, drop this right drop a line from here so whatever uh, line uh, uh, whatever value it is at this point minus this point so this point is if you drop a line perpendicular to your x-axis here it will cross the line here so this particular point will have a value and this point has a value okay so what is the difference between this value and this value that value squared plus this value squared plus this value squared plus this value squared so so you're adding up all the differences of your 13 data points you're adding up and then you're minimizing that that minimal error whenever you are having is a line which is made here uh, I guess it is uh, I think it is not clear for everyone can you give me a yes or no on your chat box so that I understand uh, if I have to reiterate this again Sharad is uh, fine. Krishna is also fine. Sunil, so uh, do you need me to uh, uh, reiterate this again? Okay. So Sunil asked a very valid question. He says that the square root error, uh, he's clear with that. But without knowing the slope and why, how can I do this? And that's a very good question. So Sunil, uh, <clears throat> there's something called, uh, when, I, when I'm assuming that this is a linear e equation, right? So I'll have a slope of the line and then there will be an intercept of the line. So y is equal to mx plus c is the usual uh, linear form of a, uh, I mean linear form of the line what you need to do is you have this value at here you know this data you know uh, when you put y is equal to mx plus c and you put the x value you know m into x plus c okay that value is you are not knowing that okay so what you have your function as this value for example this value is 100,000 minus uh, and let's assume this is 500 so 100 minus 500 m plus c square that is your this distance similarly this distance is that minus 600 m plus c so you have so many points with just two constants I mean two unknowns m plus c when you try to minimize that whole function you are just having two constants I mean two variables or two unknowns when you minimize that you will get the value of m and c think like this right there will be one line which is going through the uh, not middle but which is having the least error
so need you are uh, you are asking something yeah yeah could you write this equation somewhere uh, so that we can see okay 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 i'll i'll write this yeah linear regression let's clear y equal to ax plus b Okay, so this is your uh, a x plus b. Okay, so this is your y pred, what you are trying to predict, and then there is y actual. Okay, right. Now I don't have the sigma uh, this thing, but I'll just uh, write it. I write it in words. Sum over all data y actual minus y pred square this is your function and you want to minimize this function does this clear your doubt Yeah, y actual we have and y predict we don't have. Yeah. We have x only for that. A and b are unknown. I know. So, uh, you know differentiation. So when you have a function. Yeah, I know. This is second order uh, uh, function, right? So when you are trying to differentiate this equation, so your c c's will cancel out because c is a constant. So you just have that slope to play with, and when you differentiate, okay, you have that slope that will come out here. So we'll go go into stochastic gradient descent uh, when we are trying to minimize this. Uh, we'll understand that uh, understand this function there better and how we minimize this. But just keep this in mind that when you, this is your function which we are trying to minimize, right? So there will be. Two. Uh, this is a second order differentiation. You need. You'll get one. Uh, so you can. Whenever your function is uh, there, you you when you need to find the minimum, you need to differentiate it and equal to equate it to zero. Okay. So you'll get one uh, value from there, and uh, uh, then you and you follow the stochastic stochastic gradient. So we'll go there and see how stochastic gradient works. But uh, for now, is it clear? Yeah, this is clear that there will be some image, imaginary line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For every x, whatever y we have given, we have to take the square root and we have tried to minimize that. Yeah, that's the difference between your actual and prediction. That difference is to be minimized. Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, let me show you uh, more, you know, visibly. Okay. What you can do this line, you can tilt this line. Okay, you can tilt this line uh, clockwise, anti-clockwise. You can, you know, make this line up or down. So you have two movements, right? So whenever you are trying to move this line clockwise or anti-clockwise, you are changing the slope. Whenever you are trying to move the line upwards or downwards, you are changing the intercept. So you basically have two ways to move this line, right? And using those two ways, you are trying to obtain the minimum distance between these points. Even if you don't understand it mathematically, just think it physically, right? I can move these line, move this line up or down, depending uh, and obtain a particular line so that I have the minimum distance from each of the points. Is this understood? So my question is why linear? Regression. I mean, in linear regression, there will be only a line. Why not? We are going for a curve. Okay, that's a good question. So that's what I'm. And why? Yeah, that thing. Okay. Why? I mean, that is the question. Why I select linear regression, but nothing else. Okay. Now, um, okay, Sunil, so that's a very good question. Uh, now, tell me one thing. Uh, if you guys are good in maths, mathematics, what is the best polynomial? Uh, order of equation that I can fit into this line. Any answers on that? Does anyone know? What is the best polynomial? The uh, 
degree which I can fit in a thirteen. Uh, uh, definitely not one or two. I think so. It will be more than two. Exactly. It's a twelve order polynomial. So if a twelve order polynomial I fit into the um, this uh, curve, I mean all the points will be fit, right? So ideally, that is the best polynomial, the best curve I can fit into this, uh, right? Correct. Uh, is it understanding? Uh, are you understanding? You can fit a twelve order polynomial which passes through all of these points, but yes, it is very important to know. that you are not trying to predict these points okay there can be a point for example if a point comes up here and you had for example if a point comes up here okay you had predicted so your uh, polynomial was going like this okay so your polynomial was going like this your point is here you will predicting here what is the error this is the error it's a huge error so there's something called overfitting and underfitting in statistics and machine learning will go into depth there but for now just understand whatever points there are in a in your data you need not fit them all because if you fit them all in future if you predict for a different data point it will give you huge error because just understand this right if you if you uh, it's like it is again machine learning is not hard coding right so if i say that i want to fit a polynomial that goes through each of these points and then then there is a particular uh, point which comes up here i completely failed in predicting that value and i am very far off okay so there's something called occam's razor in uh, statistics occam's razor it's a very uh, fancy word you know when you learn you can you know uh, tell your peers that occam's razor is a concept where you know you start with simple models to come to your question is linear regression uh, you know the first thing that we should come up with so i told you at the starting only linear regression may not solve 80% of your problems first of all we are starting with linear regression because it is the most simplest form of uh, machine learning and it will help us understand the concepts next linear regression is being used because i don't know which uh, equation for example when we were seeing that f of x and we were saying that f is being designed by god maybe f uh, i mean god has designed f as a linear problem okay for example uh, i mean if you have chemical engineering background or i mean if you have a chemistry background you must have known pv and rt equation right the ideal gas equation now what if there's a process okay just think of it like this what if you have you have a process where your volume is constant you have the same moles of gas are you guys aware of this equation pv and rt i mean uh, let me not elaborate that if you're not Are you guys aware? Uh, give me a yes or no. No. Okay, or not aware. So okay. Uh, okay. So uh, I mean, let's not go into this. So there will be, there may be processes which are actually inherently linear in nature, and if you start fitting a polynomial in that, you'll actually going to worsen up your um, prediction. So you, it's always ideally, it's always better to start with. simple linear models and then go further into complexity okay don't start with a very complex model ever because you never know what is the actual f that god has designed okay so why we are starting with linear regression is that i don't know that what is the actual process behind uh, how this data has been generated or how this data is being coming is coming it may be a linear form and if i start with non linear polynomials i will not never get a prediction the proper prediction okay so always start with a simple model and that's why we start with linear regression okay so okay okay now i will show you this uh, what is the gradient descent and you know
just first we'll read through this and then uh, you know let's understand this so gradient descent is used to find the minimum error by minimizing a cost function okay think of this as uh, for example if you have a bowl okay glass bowl or a steel bowl if you put a drop of water in uh, on your bowl where will the ball uh, water drop settle at the lowest point right so stochastic gradient or a gradient descent is exactly the similar al algorithm to a, a water drop trickling on a ball okay consider this water drop uh, i mean consider this uh, the ball as your uh, function okay the function's lowest point is at the bottom the water droplet is where you are right now you're trying to go down the gradient you're trying to go down the slope to go to the lowest point possible okay so now let's understand this did you get a sense of this i mean uh, uh, did, did, did my example makes any sense give me a yes or no okay sharad uh, says i didn't understand okay uh if i can open paint and uh, show you So consider this as a this is your cost function. This is where you are. Okay. So this ball will always settle here because this is the lowest point of the cost function. This is the minimum. okay you're all you're trying to reach your minimum what i told when i was linear uh, giving you the linear equation plot i'm trying to reduce the root mean square error okay what uh, what i uh, wrote in the notepad minimum of sum over the whole data actual minus prediction so this is your cost function you want to go into the minimum of this okay so consider this cost function as this bowl you want to go to the minimum of this is it un, uh, is it better right now did you understand little bit even so that i can build on this okay sharad he has understood krishna and uh, sunil so sure. basically what do you mean by cost function the sum of all the square mean error exactly you are getting yeah. it uh in a sum of all the um, squared mean error okay i mean mean is okay. after you sum of so squared mean of the squared error okay root mean squared error okay. r m a c root mean squared error first you take a square then you sum up then you take the mean and then you take the root this is your cost function okay now can you can anyone tell why we are taking uh, the square and then summing up why not that taking it doing it directly because whether that is negative or positive it will be positive always awesome 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 so for example yeah exactly krishna also also answered this correctly so for example if there's a point here and if there's a point here this will always negate okay so um, whenever i have uh, points up and above so i'll always get um, negative and i'll always get zero error i mean close to zero error. i don't want that i want the real distance between the line and the point to uh, go minimum and not by having minimum so for example if a point is here okay imagine every point is uh, i mean every point is positive and then there's a negative point here okay 
So all the positive added and one negative added will become zero. So I'll get the best line, but that is not true. Okay. So although we, this is an outlier, will not take into consideration, but just uh, to make uh, to give you a sense of that, that how positives and negatives should not cancel out. Okay. So this is how uh, your gradient descent works. So to avoid negative values, we square the distance. To calculate the error, we can take the average of all the squares and then take the square root of it. This is also called the root mean square error. Okay. Now, this we have already only uh, uh, talk, uh, talked about, you know, uh, single uh, variable. For example, you can have multiple x's, okay, and you can have uh, one outcome. So uh, these are the coefficients. So when you are doing multiple coefficients, okay, c1, c2, cn, you don't know each of these variables, right? Do you understand that? You don't know each of the variables. So when you are achieving the stochastic, when you are doing the stochastic gradient, okay, now I think it is becoming a little maths heavy. So uh, we'll continue this uh, in the next class so that you know you take you know, get some time to absorb this uh, equation. Uh, but uh, let's keep it till here. Uh, I'll go into polynomial regression and overfitting. I can, yeah, okay. Just see this. What I was talking about. So, for example, this is your data, okay? This is underfitting. I mean, your actual data goes like this, but you have just fit a linear uh, model on this. Huh? This is not uh, even close to what your actual data looks like. This is overfitting. You have fit all the values present, right? Now, if you get a prediction here, you'll get huge error, okay? Because you cannot overfit all the components here. Okay. This is all so called overfitting. Okay. You have fit your uh, data completely. What will a, be a good estimate is a smooth curve going from here to here. A smooth curve going from here to here. Do you guys understand? Since, uh, I mean, why the graph in the third world fitting, that is not correct. There is it's going up, but there is no any point. Yeah, so uh, the thing is, see, uh, it is not, um, I mean, it is not a mathematical equation that has been made. It's just to show you uh, what, uh, I mean, it, it even has a break here. So it's not uh, to... Um, show you something is just how overfitting works okay so don't go by uh, that it, it is showing that how you have even uh, fit your uh, point so hard that you know so for example from this point to this how many ways you can go from this point to this there are infinite ways right you can go like this 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 so there are in an infinite number of ways you can go from this point to this point right so if you overfit it, so this graph can look like anything, right? That's why it is trying to show that your predictions can become very bad if you try to overfit anything. So what it should be an ideal graph, ideal. So if you say that what is the God's function here, the God's function will be like this, smooth curve along this. Okay, yeah, so you were asking something. Yeah, because uh, I did a few classes of N2 NG. Huh. And it was defining overfitting means we are touching every point. Yeah, so we have touching. We are so yeah. that in So in both the cases, second and third, we are touching all the points. Then so why third is overfitting? No, no, this is also overfitting. It is trying to say how your how different overfitting types you can have. Okay, so this is not a smooth curve. That's what I'm saying. You are, if you touch okay. all you now see uh, one thing that is. Uh, wrong in your definition is overfitting is not touching every point okay overfitting so for example if by any chance all all points lie on this line right all points lie on this line and you fit a linear regression there 
okay so that is not overfitting that is what your actual models model looks like okay because mm -hmm. every every point will be on this line okay so your actual process looks like for example if i fit a smooth polynomial here a smooth polynomial it is the actual function of this process okay, okay. so you that, that's what i'm saying so when uh, if you see this is what you can summarize in machine learning there's a god's function and there's your function god's function can be anything it can be a polynomial it can be a linear regression it can be any function it can be an exponential function it can be a sinusoidal function you never know what god has created that process from you can best estimate that using your uh, uh, knowledge of machine learning okay now so what can be the, the two line definition of uh, overfitting and underfitting okay now overfitting and underfitting two line definition if you want to know is uh, based on bias variance trade off or let's say i'll tell you in terms of training and test data so uh, okay now let me introduce what is train and test data i think i told this yesterday also train data is something on which you train your model okay so for example if i go uh, on this so for example if this is your train data uh, the these blue points are your train data okay this is where you have uh, trained your model and then there is a test data on which your model has never seen uh, that uh, point for example if you get a blue point uh, for somewhere for example if you want to predict this number for 2.5 you don't have the actual data right so you want to predict if this is your function you will predict here if this is your function you will predict here if something like this is your function you will predict here so basically you want to understand what is the prediction when 2.5 comes when we have this data okay now if you want to say what is overfitting overfitting is when you have decreased your training loss to zero your training loss training loss means your root mean square error in terms of linear regression your root mean square error or if you have fit a polynomial what is the dis difference between the actual and prediction squared uh, for these data this is zero right you have you don't have any error in your training so your training loss is zero and underfitting is your is that your training loss is very high it it is cannot be infinite okay it cannot be to the other extreme but your training loss is the maximum okay so we are underfitted do you see so for example okay. if i if i fit a line here okay here the training loss is huge right my data is here okay. and i have predict a predict a line here i mean i made my i've uh, uh, prepared my g function here so this loss is huge so this is what is called underfitting and this is called overfitting so overfitting is when your training loss becomes zero absolutely zero okay now okay let me change yeah uh, now let me make uh, a training test uh, this thing you will understand this clearly now this is the loss okay and this is your let's say complexity of the model okay your training loss will always decrease with the complexity complexity means this is a linear uh, form and then this is a nth order polynomial so if i start with a linear form okay and increase the complexity my training loss can be zero i can fit a polynomial which goes through all the points this is your train loss there is a testing loss test loss or the actual loss you could say that loss can be like this so 
it is your loss first decreases and then it will increase okay and make the test loss separately so for example if your gods function of the order 5 okay and this is let's say 13 order polynomial and this is one order polynomial your test loss will be high here it will go to the lowest in 5 and then again increase to 13 so you have to reach this point so what you need to do with this uh, to achieve uh, this point you have to start from here and grow from here or you can start from here or go from here normally this this is the correct path start from here you start decreasing your test loss and then once it starts increasing you stop there this is your god's function got it yeah yeah i think so okay. it's clear so basically uh, what we are saying that we have to find a model for a problem so yeah. that we can predict. Is exactly. that the part? Is that the machine learning? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And so that model will be some mathematical equation. Yes. Okay. And I think so for that mathematical uh, equation, we have to minimize the cost. I mean, uh, R M S. Sorry, uh, then okay. So, in our, that first thing we have to find out the model. Yeah. Uh, second thing, that model will be some mathematical equation. Yeah. Of n order, and third thing, basically that model will have cost function or root mean square as minimum as it can be. Perfect. I think you have nailed it down. So every model has a cost function. We need to go, uh, I mean, we need to have that cost function minimum in terms of testing. Okay, see, again, cost function can be minimum to zero for training. What matters is that we need to be at the minimum point for test data. Test data, it means new data, something which we have not seen in, your, in, the, future, uh, in the past. Okay, so this is how what you need to do. You need to fit the model to a particular uh, data set so that your test loss is minimum and that model will be the best model to predict the future okay that's great so can we do this for the example which you shown that in particular size this is the particular value of that house yeah we can so taking uh, up this yeah. yeah taking that example uh, what we have to do we have to find some linear e e equation right now so that our cost function should be minimum and that is our main intention to find value of a x and x is given so a and b we have to find out perfect perfect yes we have to find out that okay so my question is that in all this whole story what is the use of that bar chart and pie chart and other things oh, okay okay so um for example how did you get an idea to fit a linear regression model because uh, I saw dots, dots on my 2D graph. How you how you saw you plotted right? Oh uh, okay. You plotted first. So you plotted. Yeah, it, I plotted. Yeah, I got it. You plotted a scatter plot, and then you saw that the dots are appearing, and then you see, okay, I think uh, a linear model will be a good fit here. Or if I see this function, um, I'll immediately. Yeah, it's a linear uh, function. Or... This is a non-linear function. This is a polynomial. So I think I need to do a seg I mean higher order. So in, so in which case we will go for pie chart or bar chart? Because this visualization always we can get some point based on some points, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So normally this you can do bar chart. I mean histograms, for example, are used for to calculate the distribution of the data, whether it's a normally distributed. So you'll get to understand. I mean, uh, don't um, try to understand everything today because it will get confusing. You'll eventually try to under get to understand why each of the um, charts are important. And it doesn't mean that we have taught you by part, uh, by chart that it will be required in machine learning. 
okay there's some things you need to know as general knowledge also right for example uh, if your boss wants to wants you to present some data you need to know if you are using python then how to plot a pie chart it may not be required for your model but uh, for uh, visualization you need to know okay 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 so we close today now uh, i think uh, we had a very rigorous session today uh, and we have even went ahead uh, of what we planned i think um, today was great so so sure. one thing can can we get your slides today so that we can go and yeah, do some yeah. exercises with yeah, you yeah yeah so i'll send even the videos will get today uh, or this video whatever we have recorded so you get everything today today or by early morning tomorrow i mean i'll uh, upload it okay. so, yeah that's fine okay yeah okay thank you so much everyone uh, let's me uh, catch up next week hey, anyone has any doubts uh, uh, here because we have uh, two minutes left anyone has any doubts on to ask okay so timing other than this course basically is that we go in plan so what machine uh, learning engineer does basically in their day to day job because someone told me that aesthetic is one part first you need to understand that then you have to code someone was telling me like, both are the same you can do easily so i study from the problem because also in my company there is one data scientist working on r and python someone using java for coding so how it happens to see so uh a machine learning engineer uh, can be of a very different forms okay so he or she can be using r uh, uh, r is a statistical tool he or she can be using python for very advanced predict predictive modeling so java is more of application programming for example if you want to develop an app or if you want to develop something uh, which is um, which is more of a application programming then java use used but for uh, machine learning like this prediction models uh, you need to use python and on typical, typical a um, uh, machine learning engineer will be you know using uh, python for to develop predictive modeling okay means up to prediction means we can also do data data science and uh, prediction both using the python data science and machine learning is uh, i mean it's it's they are very common so data science and machine learning they are not very different uh, you can call it under the same banner yeah because as a first year so yesterday as i was saying and you also told that you are very good in data science, data analytics so just i want to understand you what does this really mean ha huh. yes yeah, so uh, Yeah. We'll get to understand what. Uh, so, for example, we have uh, done modeling today a little bit. Now, when we go into much deeper sense, you try to uh, you get to understand what data science is and what we are trying to do. But uh, uh, the three uh, point statement that you summarized with, I think that is uh, a very good uh, definition of what data science and what we are trying to do in machine learning is. And uh, I think it is very two of them. Are, two of these things are very same similar. So you don't have a particular. broad line to distinguish that but uh, having said that we'll get into that um, eventually okay okay, okay let's wait okay thank you sunil thanks for your time okay thank you thanks to you okay thank you so much so get you on today bye bye yeah bye Okay, guys, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. So <clears throat> last time, uh, just a sec. I'm just doing the controls. I'll... Okay. So very good morning, uh, 
and we shall start with the week two session. Hey, good morning. Uh, and we shall start with hey, the week two uh, Hi, good morning. Yeah, I'll just put everyone on mute uh, uh, and we shall start with the session, okay? Okay. <clears throat> So uh, last time, uh, I think uh, uh, some of you uh, didn't attend the last uh, Sunday session. So we had uh, delved into a little bit of matplotlib uh, that is for, you know, the plots that we are using in Python. Then we have, uh, we had, uh, when uh, we had gone into the basics of pandas, which is basically the, uh, the data structures that are being fed to uh, the <clears throat> machine learning techniques in Python. So, uh, and then we also entered into what is regression, what is classification, what is supervised learning, what is unsupervised learning, what are the, uh, and then we also had seen some amount of linear regression. Now, since uh, many of you didn't attend the last uh, Sunday session, I'll give a recap of linear regression and also it will be beneficial for people who had attended because linear regression being the basics of machine learning, I think uh, uh, it needs to be crystal clear for everyone uh, because otherwise it will be very difficult for you to understand more complex models, okay? So we'll have a recap of linear regression today and also we'll uh, start with statistics, which is the basic building block of machine learning, okay? So <clears throat> let's start. Okay, so the basics. Uh, as remains same. Okay, so I just wanted to uh, let you know, guys, let you guys know that uh, just save the meeting, uh, you know, passwords and um, you know, the link so that uh, you don't miss out on uh, the content. Okay, so now as I told you what we will be doing uh, today and then we will also see uh, some amount of bridge and lasso. What what does this mean? Don't get bogged down by the uh, terminologies. Uh, it's again uh, it's again a model. Uh, so we'll see why bridge and lasso exist and what are decision trees. Okay. Okay. Now statistics. I'll not get, go into definition of statistics. It's a Wikipedia. Uh, I mean, it's a basic Google definition of statistics. Don't go into that. Every machine learning model that we will see or we are going to have in this world is based on st statistical learning, okay? So statistics is basically your knowledge about the data, okay? So you are collecting the data. There's some amount of science that goes into how you should collect the data. There's a, some amount of science how you should analyze the data. And then there's particularly there's some amount of science in how you want to predict your future okay so everything everything that uh, revolves around this science is called statistics okay so basically uh, i think these are very uh, basic uh, definitions that uh, i mean we can see here uh, but though these are very basics these still remain the most important uh, you know, terms that are being used in statistics and every model more or less revolves around all these things, okay? So let's, let's look at look at the mean. What is a mean? So mean is basically a mathematical average of the values that are existing in the data. For example, if you have so many numbers, there will be a particular mean, I mean the center of the data, okay? So for example, you just sum up or sum this all and then you divide by the number of items in the data set will not go into the calculation because uh, I think that's pretty much simple, pretty easy calculation that we have to do. Okay. <clears throat> what is a median? Median is basically if you arrange your data in an ascending order or let's say uh, however you want to, but it should be ordered, right? Uh, it could be descending or it could be ascending. So you have to arrange your data in a particular order, sorted array, okay? And then the middle value, okay? The middle value, uh, if it is an even number, uh, you get the middle value in points. So you take the greatest integer function, okay? And if it is a odd value, then you'll obviously get a particular uh, a particular uh, middle value. So it is always the middle value that we are taking in the data, okay? So um, I think again, a calculation of median is not uh, 
particularly uh, i mean it is not rocket science it's very easy so we'll not go into the calculation of this uh, what is mode mode is basically the number which is repeated the most often in <clears throat> the data for example if you have each of the numbers you map the numbers to its particular frequency so for example one exists one time two exists two times three exists three times four exists two times five exists one time what is the mode mode of the data is three because it exists three number of times so the frequency of uh, the number which has the highest frequency in the data okay now a question for you guys uh, okay now uh, before that uh, do you guys know anything about outliers give me a yes or no on your chat box what are outliers can i get a yes or no on the chat box okay sharad uh, has answered okay person has answered okay so um, uh, let me tell about outliers okay now um, let's take an example so uh, last time what we talked i think you guys remember about uh, you know the collection of data for example you are sitting um, we are sitting in a medical clinic in india okay and uh, you are collecting the heights and weights of uh, all the people that are visiting in your uh, clinic okay now you are in india suddenly an australian visits okay uh, you note the uh, note down its height and weight and then again uh, you have indian patients right and then suddenly an african visits okay so you know down the height and weight and again you have a flow of indian patients now when you plot those the whole data what you could have collected in uh, you know all over your you know 2 3 days or whatever uh, time frame you have uh, collected collected the data for you'll notice that two three points are i mean do not lie in the general framework of the data frame for example indians would be around let's say 5.5 to you know 6 uh, 61 okay some might be beyond that but generally that is the structure right and their weight is also very certain 55 would not 55 around 62 you know 75 80 or 85 but you would see some australian that has uh, you know come in in our uh, data frame Uh, come in your uh, data he might be 66 or 67 okay now for your data this australian is an outlier okay he doesn't represent or he doesn't come from the same population that you are trying to look in your data uh, or analyze in your data right that's a very basic definition this outlier since so i have already told you that there's an australian coming in so it's very easy to identify but there are some uh, many times that you would not know that who is this australian or in that matter of fact what data is an outlier right you could have data for many things it's just an example i gave how height and weight so you'll have outliers of many uh, types so you would not be able to identify which are the outliers so here comes the statistics okay so we'll define how you def- uh, uh, we'll go to that uh, how you define outliers now okay this is a little tough question uh but i'll be very happy if you could answer this i've explained you mean and median right now tell me which one of these parameters is more affected by outliers i mean will your mean change a lot with the help of outliers or the median will change with the help of outliers or let's say which is the parameter more robust to outliers i mean it does not change uh with outliers can you can i get answers on my chat screen okay uh, sharad has say, uh, said median will not change that's the correct answer and uh, that's great sharad so median is a statistical uh, what do you say, you could say parameter which is, which is robust to outliers this is a very important statistic question a basic question that uh, you know people would ask you uh, but this knowledge of a mean and median will help you uh, a long way i mean you do modeling right so median remember this a median is robust to outliers mean is not robust to outliers okay so just remember this and mode mode is good to know good to have but it's not very important most of the times so we'll not go deep into uh, the modes and all okay 
so we have already said i mean no need to calculate all these things these are very easy um, okay now standard deviation uh, so standard deviation is the spread of the data uh, obviously when you are collecting data you will not expect uh, everything to be same right then it defeats the sole purpose of collecting data so there will be variations right so when you are saying that there will be variations what is the uh, spread of the data what variation you are talking about okay uh, just a second just hold on yeah it is important to know what spread you are talking about right now the spread for example uh, it can be very high if your data is uh, for example um, um, if your data for example if you are uh, taking the population um, census or you are let's say you are collecting the height and weight all over India not in a single clinic but you are uh, collecting the height and weight all over India right so there will be a, a definite a huge amount of spread because north indian south indians will have different metabolisms different body structures is similar to east india and west, west india so every indian is will be different right so it, there will be huge uh, spread in the data so how do you measure the spread okay so this is what we call variance right variance is basically how your data is spread from the mean okay so for example this is your data okay this is your data you have a particular mean right and then when you have this mean you check what is how far is each of these data points from the mean so 1 minus mean square plus 2 minus mean square plus 2 minus mean square plus 3 minus mean square why we are taking square because uh, to you know not consider the sign i don't want to consider the sign if i consider the sign then it will be zero right because if it is e equally distributed i would say all the positives and then all the negatives cancel out but that is not what i want to tell you i want to tell you the spread of the data so that's why we are taking a square adding them up and then taking a mean of that and then we are taking the root of that so root means square okay similar you will come to this concept when we are doing linear regression what is root mean square but it is variance is uh, only till the square part then you go to standard deviation you take a root of that okay so again i will tell you how your data is far from the mean 1 minus mean plus, uh, square plus 2 minus mean square you add all the differences uh, the square of the differences then take a mean uh, so a number of items 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 9 items so uh, divide that sum by 9 whatever you get that is the variance and if you take the square root of that you take you get to a standard deviation okay so any questions till now uh, yes or no on the chat screen okay okay so i think we are good so uh, i already told you the standard deviation now okay i'll not answer this i need the answers from you guys for example if you have this data what happens to the mean and standard deviation when we add two add two as in just add two in the data not uh, two in each of the data elements just add two in the data Just tell me whether it increases or decreases. Both will change. Sure, that's great. So you can have an approximate uh, mean identification, right? So, for example, you are seeing that three are um, when you actually calculate mean will decrease. Sure, that's correct. Mean will decrease. Uh, what about the spread? Any answers about the spread? Okay, let's not get into that right now. Uh, let's answer this one. Uh, what happens to mean and standard deviation when we multiply by 2? Each of the elements are multiplied by 2. What happens to the mean? So, 
so for example if you have your mean will increase so mean will actually double up so if you multiply that uh, each of the data elements by 2 mean will actually double exactly yeah correct sorry so mean will increase by 2 what happen what happens to the standard deviation standard deviation will not change uh, okay one answer i got that so um, can you um, okay I, i'll not go into explanation for example if you go and change the mean okay so everything doubles up right now what i told about standard deviation standard deviation is the difference between this element and the mean okay so for example right now one let's assume the mean is 3.5 okay i, uh, I have to calculate let's calculate 9, 13, 16, 19, uh, 22, 24, uh, 26, 27, divided by 9. nine uh, mean is 3, okay? So the mean is 3. Now, if you multiply this, the whole data mean will be 6, okay? Now, so this will be 2, 4, 4, 6, 6, 6, okay? Uh, 8, 8, 10. Now, if you take the standard division, this will be 2 minus 6 square plus 2 minus 6 square plus 2 minus 6 square. Okay, you add up. You can take actually take two out of uh, two out of the proportion, right? So if you take two out uh, out, so it will be again one minus three square plus one minus uh, three square plus one minus. So two will come out. If you take it from the square inside the square, then four will come out. And then if you add them up, and then you take a root of it, then two will appear, right? So your standard deviation will actually increase by two. Did uh, uh, did everyone understand this, or I'll explain mathematically. Okay, Sharad has understood. That's great. So basically, everything remains same, but each of the brackets of those squares will have two inside the square. When you take it out of the square, it would be four, right? And then four will be common from each of the brackets, and then when you do a standard deviation, it will be under root of 4, that will be again 2, okay? So this is very important. And uh, divide by 2 is similar. If you divide by 2, it, the same thing happens. Now, this is very important. What happens to mean and standard deviation when we do the following transformation, okay? So if you do a transformation, uh, I mean, each of the data is multiplied by 3 and changed by 2. What will happen to the standard deviation and mean? Answers. Uh, both will increase. Uh, Sharad has uh, correctly answered, but how much? Increase by how much? Okay. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, uh, none of you uh, answered this correctly. When I increase, standard division will be three times. Uh, that's right, Sharad. But uh, okay. Now let me explain this. When you multiply this, each of these three we have already seen, right? If you multiply x by three, then your standard division and mean both change. It's the same thing as we did as uh, when we um, did uh, for the previous example, when we multiplied by two, two and three don't make any difference. So when you multiply uh, by three, as your mean and standard division will change. However, when you do a shift, okay, this is, a sh this is called a shift, okay? When you do a linear shift or you add or, divide, uh, or add or subtract two, everything every uh, element will change right so your mean will increase okay so every data is shifted by two so your mean will change however your standard deviation will not change because in standard deviation we are taking the difference right so this has also increased by two and the mean has also increased by uh, some portion okay but we, we we are taking the difference right so that's why it will mean is not 
uh, mean will change because of the shift but standard deviation since we are taking the difference always remember standard deviation is the difference between the elements right so if e one element shifts we are taking we are shifting all the elements right so all elements shift by plus two so the spread of the data doesn't change the, the data just gets shifted okay if all the units shift by plus two but your data as such remains constant so your spread will be same but your mean will change accordingly did did i uh, did is this clear and i was just talking about the plus 2 uh, three times both mean and standard deviation will change by three times okay so i think everyone is clear on this that's great so this is very important uh, this concept how your uh, linear shifts happen okay so just remember if you add and subtract standard deviation does not change however standard deviation will change if you multiply or divide your data okay <clears throat> Now, uh, each of the diagrams that you see here are called histograms. Okay, so basically, uh, what does this mean? Is this is the frequency? Frequency, as I've told, how many times a particular number occurs, right? But when you are plotting a histogram, you don't actually plot single numbers; you plot into buckets. Okay, so if you see here, sorry, if you see here, it's a bucket of 40 to 50. Okay. So whatever number falls between 40 to 50, 50 excluded because 50 will get into the next bucket. So 40 to 50, whatever number falls into that bucket, how many numbers actually fall into that bucket? Okay, so almost four, four numbers fall into that bucket. Similarly like this. So this is basically a histogram with a 10, uh, with a unit of bucket is 10, as 10. So uh, similarly, you can plot many histograms and the histograms can look uh, I mean, uh, can take any shape, right? So uh, this is also an histogram. But if the shape is like this, okay, this is called a normal distribution. Okay? Uh, it's also a, called a bell curve. It's called also called a Gaussian curve. Okay. Uh, for now, we'll call this as a normal distribution. What is the particular property of this normal distribution? This is the most important property of a normal distribution. Your mean, your median your mode is equal that's why it is called a symmetrical distribution okay so data is equally spread from the mean so for example if your mean is uh, let's say here it is 150 i think or 155 i guess 155 is your mean here mean is 155 if you arrange the data 155 is the middle value and if you you know have most number of 155 in this data so that's why its frequency is the highest it's uh, it is the middle value and it is the mean okay so any questions till now yes or no okay so i think it's clear to everyone that's great um, so as i told you if you're median the definition of median is this okay sunil has a question could you please go on that graph okay uh, yes i went here let me uh, tell me what is the question here sunil what is the question here Okay, I'll unmute you. Uh, yes, Anil, tell. I could, yeah, could you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so in this bell curve graph, basically. Yeah. Um, just I want to go. This first one is hundred, and then unit is five. What does this mean? There uh, is one element of five. Am I right? No, I didn't understand. Which one you're talking about? Uh, the okay. right? Okay. Uh, last one. Basically. The bell curve. Yellow right. one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. okay. So, so, you're talking about what this... Uh, on the first one. What no, this... No, no. I'll come later on bell graph. Okay. Yeah. Just I want to understand this uh, 
we chart a histogram basically. So on 100 to 110, frequency is 5 or there are 5 units, am I right? Yeah. So for example, uh, you have uh, 5 numbers like 104 or 105, 103, 102, something which falls between 100 and 110. Okay. Okay. Then no, just I'm thinking if I will average out of each all numbers, will it come 150 or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it will come. Definitely, it will come, right? It will come. I think 155. That is the center of the uh, bin you have to take. The center of the bin is uh, 140, 150, 160. So 155 is the center. So it will come. Definitely, it will come. It is a basically a weighted average. So, but uh, see, here you're not getting the exact numbers, right? These are bin, bins. You have to keep that in mind. You're not telling me whether it is 102, 103 or 104. I have created bins of 100, 100, 210 and I said that there are five numbers. But which are those five numbers? You don't know, right? It could be 18, 108, it could be 104, it could be 103. You don't know exactly which number you're talking about. So you cannot calculate the mean directly from here. I mean, just seeing this. But if you can see the mean is set, oh. so it is 155. But you cannot say that I am taking 100 five times, 100 uh, 10, uh, 10 times. Not, not that. It's not like that. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. No problem. Okay. So uh, I think we are good to go. So it, I think we have understood this already. Okay. Now, note this down. Very important. Normal distribution is the most important distribution in statistics. Why it is very important? Because everything that happens, uh, for example, in your nature, 80% of it will follow normal distribution. So basically, every nature will follow symmetry that is the concept so for example if you drop sand from your hand it will always go form a normal distribution i mean it will be in 3d but if you can picture that it will be a normal distribution it will always be a kind of a gaussian uh, bell curve okay if you take heights and heights of people it will be some people will be tall some people will be short but average it will be uh, symmetrical about uh, the mean if you take the marks of the student it is a uh, normal distribution. If you guys have uh, done and any time done, you know, performance ratings, every company almost follows normal distribution. Bell curve, uh, that is a bell curve. So top 5% people get, um, I mean, excellent, the medium, 95% um, people, I mean, 90% people get uh, the average rating and the below 5% people are average performance, below average performance. So everything in uh, nature will follow a normal distribution. Not everything, but don't, uh, I mean, don't jot down that everything, but most of the things follow normal distribution, okay? So, now that's why normal distribution is very important. And that's why we'll go into little depth in this, okay? So, for example, <clears throat> your normal distribution, uh, so this is your his smoothened out histogram. So, everything is a histogram. You just have smoothened it out with the curve to represent. Now, what we talked about standard deviation is the spread, right? So one spread from the mean and one spread from the mean towards the right. So one spread here and one spread here. Total, this area will cover 68% of the data points. This is a unique property of normal distribution. Every distribution will not follow this property, okay? so. Uh, uh, let's say a uniform distribution will not follow. I'll not go into other distributions right now, but just to make you understand, it is a unique property of normal distribution. One standard deviation will, from the left of the mean and to the right of the mean, will follow 68, fall, I mean, uh, uh, captured 68% of your data. Two standard deviation from your mean to the left and two to the right will capture 95%. Similarly, three standard deviation from the mean towards the left and towards the right will capture 99.7%. Okay, so it's very good if you can un uh, uh, remember these things because this will be very important. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, no harms if you even don't remember, but it is uh, good to have this. 
So, uh, for example, if I say 95% people, for example, let's say um, the average score in the match test was 8, uh, let's say 60. Okay. So, this average mean is 60. The spread or the standard deviation of the data of the marks of the students was let's say 2. Not 2, 2 is very like 5. Let's say 5. Okay. So, 60 minus 2 into 5, that is 50. And 60 plus 2 into 5, that is 70. Between 50 and 70, 95 percent of the students are there. So, for example, if it is uh, 40 students, then 38 students are inside this particular part. Okay. The rest one student is above 70 and the rest one student is uh, I mean rest two students one of them is above 70 and one of them is below 50. Okay. So this is the meaning of this. Similarly, 99.7% it means uh, literally in if you take in 40 that will be let's say 0.3% uh, of 40 that will be 0.3 oh, that is 1.2 not 0.1.2 yeah 1.2 uh, not oh, sorry not even 1.2 0.12 so 0.12 it doesn't exist right so that it means you have almost captured all students in this 99.7% Okay. Uh, any questions on this? I think you can ask me on this. Uh, this is a little uh, new to you guys. Any questions on this? Uh, leave me a chat on your chat box. Uh, I'll unmute you if required. Okay. So I think uh, Vasant, uh, are you clear on this? Clear. Okay. Great. Okay, now this is a very important concept. So, um, when we are talking about a curve, right? When we are talking about this curve, this curve will have an equation, right? So, I am not just blindly plotting a curve, okay? This curve will have an equation that is called the PDF or the probability density function. What it signifies is if you put a point, if you let's say put a point, let's say what we had in uh, I mean marks like let's say 65 okay so 65 if you put you will it will tell you uh, so uh, in a PDF understand this this is very important a probability density function uh, just go by this word okay so pro what is the probability density function it is basically the probabilities of the uh, you, let's say range of data what we are talking so for example, if you want to talk about what is the probability that in a class of 40 students, there will be, how, what is the probability of getting uh, a student, if I pick a random student from a class of 40 students, what will be the probability that his mass lies between 50 to 60 or let's say 50 to 70, that is 68%, right? 0.68 is the probability. What is the probability that if I pick a particular student out of a class of 40 students, what will be the probability that his marks are between, um, so it was, uh, so this was, sorry, this was uh, 60, so 2 into 5, 10, and 2 into 5, so 50 to 70, 95.95% uh, is the probability or 95% is the probability that if I pick a student from a class of 40 students, his marks will lie between 50 to 70. Okay. So this is how you define your probability. So now I've already told you that this is 95%. What if I want to check something between, let's say this was 60. So this is 65. Uh, this is 70. Yeah. How are you calculating this probability? Right. So Mansunin has a very valid question. That's what we are trying to tell you here that this particular equation has a this 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 particular 
graph has an equation related to it okay now that equation is very complex hmm? that equation is very complex and people don't want to remember that so it is something like e to the power x minus mu x minus mean basically divided by the standard deviation whole square so it's a very complex equation people don't want to remember that so what people have come up with is called a z table or a z score so this z score what it defines is i want to so your data will be um, i mean it can be anything right it, its mean can be 60 for example it can, its mean can be 120 if your total marks are of 200 uh, so it, it can, it, its mean can be anything, right? So what it, it defines is, I want to know what is the z-score if you are given a data. For example, how far your data point is away from your mean, how many times it is uh, away from your mean based on your standard deviation, okay? So for example, understand this very carefully, okay? For example, if I take this example, what we uh, took, right? So we had 60 here, we had 65 here, we had 70 here. Okay, so X is 70. For example, I want to take someone who, okay, now this Z score will tell you the point. Uh, for example, if I am taking this point, what is the probability of having someone who has scored this much marks, what is the probability of having someone less than him, okay? So just understand this very carefully, okay? So for example, this whole curve is 100%, okay? So there is 2.5% remaining here and 2.5% remaining here. So why could I tell it is 2.5, 2.5? Because normal distribution is symmetric. So 5% is remaining out of 100%. Equally distributed amongst this is 2.5, 2.5. Okay, so if I take this point, okay, let me take out my drawing tool. If I take, uh, sorry, if I take this point, okay, and I consider the whole area, this will be how much? 97.5%. Okay, because 95% plus 2.5%. Now, if I take a point from here, so I uh, tell that what is the probability of, so what is the probability of someone, this is X less than 70. What is the probability of a person scoring less than 70 in this particular test? So that is 97.5% is the probability. What is the probability of a person getting more than nine, more than 70 here? That is 2.5%. Okay, let me erase this rate. How can I erase this? Erase so, is this clear till now? I'll go into the Z-score uh, after this. Okay, I think it's clear. So, now your Z-score is basically all these areas are known when it is one standard deviation and two standard deviation. But there will be instances when you are 1.5 standard deviation or 2.5 or 2.6. Okay, so for example, let's take this example. So your x minus mu divided by sigma. Here when I had put 70 and this was 60 and this was 5. 70 minus 60 that is 10 divided by sigma that is 2 sorry the sigma was 5 so i got 2 okay so i got this one what about if i get 75 i want to understand what is the probability of a student getting 75 okay so 75 minus 60 sorry divided by 5 so that is how much so 75 minus 60 15 divided by 5 3 so 3 standard division okay so i'll get my point here so what is the probability of a person getting less than 75 in this test okay so this area now this has all come to exactly 3 3 we already know here what if this is 76 okay so this will be 3.2 okay so neil uh, has uh, 
told me to take an example and draw so uh, sunil uh, okay let's let's understand this okay uh, sunil uh, it's not clear to you okay no problem uh, we'll help you here so this is 60 this is let's say okay i mean it's very difficult to draw with a mouse uh, Okay. Okay. Let's understand from this. It's very difficult to draw with the mouse here. Okay. So just uh, bear with me on this. So this is seventy. Okay. Now your this is a distribution. Okay. So this these are all, all are distributions. So you need to understand the probability. So it, what so, for example, you are a class teacher, you have conducted this test and the some person, your principal comes and asks you, I want to understand uh, how your class has performed. Tell me the uh, percent number of students or what is the uh, percentage of students that have scored uh, below 76. What you will do, you will go and calculate from your data, right? Go into an Excel sheet, do a conditional formatting or do a filter okay and you um, uh, you know calculate the number of students uh, uh, that have scored below the 76 okay that's how that's how you tell your principal now if you're smart you'll not do that you know that your mean was this your class is um, almost normal distributed you, you quickly say him okay i i know this answer so you what you're asking you're asking up 76 right so 76 minus 60 divided by my standard you have already pre-calculated your standard deviation so uh, i you know that what he is asking someone who is who has scored less than a 3.2 standard deviations away from the mean so this point what is the number of students who have scored less than this point okay so these all are marks right these all are marks uh, so this is 60 this is 65 this is 70 this is 75 so you have scaled it right you have scaled it to a normal um, minus 1 minus 3 minus 2 you have scaled it how you have scaled it you have scaled it by this z score uh, wait you have scaled it with this z score right so you are very smart you tell that i know this point you are talking about someone who has scored less than 3.2 standard deviations from here so that answer i know Okay, now here, uh, one second, can you explain, uh, you did uh, subtracted 60 and then divided by 5, what, what is the reason you did uh, that number? So 76 you, is the mark. 76 is the mark. Choose, right? 60, Where is this fixed? 60 and, is the mean, okay, and standard deviation, so you want to, uh, you want to understand how yeah. many standard deviations away is your data point, okay? So mm -hmm. x minus mu, that is the difference, that is the gap, divided by standard deviation. How many standard deviations your uh, data point in consideration is away from the mean? So you already know uh, that uh, this standard deviation is 5? Yeah, you have calculated. So Why are you dividing by 5? So when you have uh, you know calculated the marks of the students, you have done a mean you have done a standard deviation so you know the standard deviation you have the marks of the students right so you know the standard deviation you know the mean now there's something that i want to i'm trying to say here for example when someone asks you about 70 right you know that 70 is two standard deviations away from the mean of uh, two standard deviations away from the mean but if someone asks you about 80 you don't know that answer because here you only know 68%, 95%, and 99.7%, right? So if someone asks about 60, 70, or 80, you can tell him about that. But if someone asks you about 85 or 76 or let's say 78, how will you tell the answer? Are you understanding this? This is a probability distribution. Any number can fall between uh, 0 to 100, right? So you know the answers for particular standard deviations, but what if someone asks for 77? You need to go into this graph. You need to see how much seven, how much far is 77 from the mean in terms of how many standard deviations 
So 77 minus 60 divided by 5, which you had calculated from the data, the mean also you had calculated from the data. So 17 my, uh, divided by 5, that is 3.4. It means the data point that your principal is asking is 3.4 standard deviations away from the mean. Now, there's something called a Z table. Okay. So you go into that Z table and you check that what is the percentage of the people who are below 3.4 standard deviations below in a normal distribution. This will be fixed every time it will be fixed. Whether you are talking about 1000, uh, whether you are talking about a uh, test conducted out of 1000 marks, whether you are talking about height, whether you are talking about um, you know, a number of accidents, everything will, everything which follows a normal distribution will follow the Z score table. Okay. What you're trying to do is you're trying to scale it or you're trying to make it unitless, right? So whether you're dealing with the data of height or you're dealing with data of marks or you're dealing with the data of number of accidents, it doesn't matter what your Z score is telling, just tell me how far is your data point from mean divided by the standard deviation. If you tell me this, I can go into the Z table and tell you what will be the percentage of people below that number. That number can be age, can be height, can be weight, can be marks, can be anything. This is a standard formula. Okay, so every normal distribution can be plotted with with the Z score and this Z score can be checked in our Z score table. Is this clear or should I repeat it again? Any particular questions? This is very important for you to understand. I'll unmute everyone here and uh, I mean everyone can ask their questions. I've unmuted everyone here. Hey, yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is, this is uh, one and important and basic concept basically which is not clear to me still. Okay. So could we take one example, numeric example, number you are giving, huh. exam result uh, number. So 1, 10, 20, 30, could you take this type of number, draw the graph, take, calculate the mean, SD, and uh, then after that we will calculate JD score. Okay, um, so I think uh, that will be because a... whatever example we have example we have taken that is one two two three three five five something, and we are drawing graph based on the marks of hundred one to hundred, and so that is not actually I mean I am not able to map everything. Okay, okay, I think it's a long exercise that you are asking me to do, and uh, I think people will uh, who have understood it, uh, they and uh, I mean they will like to go ahead, but. Clarify your uh, doubt. I will again reiterate. So, forget this one, two, three, four, five. You start from the uh, start from the starting. I'll take again because to complete uh, do all those exercises, it will take a lot of time to calculate mean, plot, and all. So, I'll just explain you and let's understand this. If it is not clear still, then we'll again see that in the end of the session. Okay. Uh, but okay. Otherwise, uh, so uh, one thing. If other persons are clear, then I'll take as a homework for today. No, no. I'll try to take uh, this example over the internet and I'll go. I, I, I'll, I'll uh, explain you uh, once more. I think it will benefit everyone. So just understand this. Forget one, two, three, four, five. That was an example. Mm, I'll again take this marks example because it will be easy for you to calculate or, or e easy for you to understand. Imagine you have conducted a maths test, okay, out of uh, let's say 100 marks. Okay, now you have 40 students in your class. You have conducted a maths test. There will be students who have scored any any marks, right? There will be someone who has scored 40, some 50, some 60, some 80, some 90, some 100. Okay, so this is how your data would be. So you have you are, you are you were the class teacher. You conducted this test. You had 40 students, and each of the 40 students, you have the marks for them. Okay. Till now, uh, till now, it is clear. Yeah, that's right. Ah. Now, you need to take. Uh, you need to understand that what is the mean of this uh, 40 students. You can calculate that. No problem. 
So yeah, that's yeah, that's fine. That's fine, right? You want to calculate what is the standard deviation of this? You you can calculate that. Correct. Correct. Oh. Yes. You know the mean. You know the standard deviation, and you know that marks of the student will always follow normal distribution, right? Yes. Correct. So you have all the three things. You have the mean. You have the standard deviation, and you know the distribution. Perfect. No problem at all. Now, suppose you are a teacher. You are concerned about how your class has performed. Okay, and you want to make a report to your principal saying that how, based on the marks of the student, your principal will give you compensation or your uh, bonus. Okay, so you are really concerned. Now you start analyzing your data. Okay, now. first analysis is that my mean of the 40 students is 60 out of 100 that is one then you see the spread of the data that is 5 i mean overall the standard deviation of my data is 5 out of 100 okay so it means if i go into the normal distribution again for example uh uh okay like this so Okay, now uh, just forget these numbers. Okay, forget these numbers. Minus three, minus two, minus one. Don't don't think these are the numbers. I'll just open my uh, drawing tool and mark this. So, what was the mean? Tell me, what was the mean? Sixty. Sixty. Okay, this is the mean. What is minus one standard deviation? You are. I know the standard deviation as five. So, what is minus one standard deviation? What is the marks here? Uh, Your standard um, deviation is five. Fifty nine to fifty nine. Yeah. Not yeah, fifty nine. This will be minus one. This is not minus one. This is minus one standard deviation. Minus one sigma. So sigma yeah. is five. So this is fifty five. This is if see. When I asked you if you had understand understood this, you understood this, right? This is standard deviation, one standard deviation. It is not minus one. It is minus one standard deviation. So sixty minus five. Oh, oh got, got, got it. Got yeah. It. So this, this, so this will be how much? Sixty-five. Uh, Perfect. This will be how much? Plus two sigma. Yeah, that will be seventy. Perfect. This will be how much? Ah, uh, twenty-five. Perfect. Okay, this will be how much? Fifty. This will be how much? Forty-five. Got it? Correct. Yeah, that's fine. Perfect. So this is understood. So you are the teacher. You have plotted this. Okay. Forget this. These numbers. Okay. Now. You have this distribution. You have the marks, right? Now you understand. You want to know. You know that there. Are, uh, this is a normal distribution. Now you want want to analyze. What you do is, you have this marks. You forget these numbers, right? Don't don't imagine that these numbers are there. You just have plotted these numbers. These are nothing. This is very easy, right? You you have created yeah. histograms. Forty five, fifty. You have taken the frequency and then smoothed out how we built like this. For example, uh, if you go here, uh, this is sixty. Uh, this is fifty-five, fifty, forty-five, and so you have uh, come. You have uh, you know constructed this graph, right, with the frequency of histograms. Yes. Right. Okay. Perfect. So you understood till this. Now, now how do you get this value from here? This you you have constructed on your own. Now you want to get this value. How you get this value? You get this value from this. So you want to understand how how much standard deviation is seventy five away from sixty. So seventy five minus sixty divided by five. So that is three. Right? Yeah, we have already calculated. Yes. No. So that's what I'm saying. Don't think like that. You first you have plotted these numbers. Then you have plotted the graph. Now you are calculating this. That I was trying to explain you because um, uh, that time I was trying to make you understand from that angle. Now just think, you have constructed this graph like this histogram. So you had put marks here for 
40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, right? Like this, we had put the numbers and then prepared the histogram and then plotted this histogram, right? No problem at that. Now, you want to understand that well, how many standard deviations is 75 away from 60? So 75 minus 60, I calculate as 3. Now, these you are three. calculating. Now, Similarly, yeah. this is your calculating. This is your calculating. This, this, this. So you get all these numbers, right? Right? Yeah. Perfect. Now I'll erase those numbers because I don't need them. I've already calculated what as I was requiring. Okay. Now, if someone comes and tells you what is the number of people who have scored less than 70, okay, what will be your answer? Less than 70 all. No. How can it be all? This was 60, 65, 70. What I've told, this is 70. 70 means two standard deviation. Matlab, like this. Okay, so this is 70, right? Yes. So, so no. 95% plus 2.5. 97.5% people have scored less than 70. Right? And uh, by this, uh, so this one question. This is 68%, 95%. So where we have got this data or is this something we need to remember that? So this is from the Z table. This is from the Z table. I'll, um, okay, I'll take this after this class. Uh, uh, I think people, other people will uh, want to go ahead. So I'll take this after this class. Okay. Just understand these calculations are from the Z table. Once you know these numbers, so you know this is normal distribution, you know these numbers, then this area is calculated from the Z table. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'll show you the set table later. Or if yes, people want, I can show it from the online Google right now. Do you want right now? Other people? Okay, person wants it. Okay. Everyone wants it. So I'll just... Uh, I don't know if we, uh, you guys can see, just a sec, I'll do a snip of it. Okay, I think, don't think it's visible for to you guys, uh, just a second. We can have a better one. Okay, uh, let's do one thing. I'll just uh, tell you what is what. So basically, okay, uh, let's do one thing. I'll take this after this class and probably add a slide on this uh, for tomorrow's class and we'll take this uh, tomorrow because if, I think you won't be able to see here. Okay, is that okay? I'll put that. Yes, that's fine. That's fine, right? So I'll go there. Okay. Okay, just uh, 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 let's have a two minutes break. Okay. Uh, I'll just have some water and then let's continue after that.
Okay, uh, let's start again. I just put everyone on mute again. Okay, so uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, make uh, some handwritten notes on this and then put it on the slide so that it's easy for me to explain and easy for you guys to understand. I'll probably do this, do that by, uh, by today, and so that we can have that slide ready by tomorrow. And I uh, understand this is a little difficult for uh, everyone to understand because it's uh, completely new. And also, when we learn, this is little, uh, we also struggled a little bit to understand what really we are trying to do here. Uh, don't worry, we'll get this through, and I'll uh, prepare a slide uh, with my handwritten notes and. Uh, mark it up so that you can you guys can understand how. so this is a general definition what is a vector uh, so vector is something which has a sense of magnitude and direction uh, this is very basic physics why, why we are trying to have this here this is uh, I mean uh, we'll get to that but just for now just understand uh, this is uh, if a vector lies like this and then this then the resultant vector is a uh, you know, square root of addition. I mean, square root of the additions of the squares of each. So I think no, not no need, no need to spend much time on this. This is the slope of the vector, tan theta. So this is general maths. No need to, you know, uh, understand too much here. Just understand what is a unit unit vector or a scaled vector. So anything which uh, is divided by its magnitude. So these uh, signs uh, means. Uh, uh, the magnitude of the vector so u is something uh, is a user scalar unit uh, which is you know has a direction not a scalar it's a vector uh, which has the direction of the v but has magnitude as one so why we uh, are trying to say uh, I mean why why we are trying to do this here is basically when you are trying to model so many things right so for example if you have multiple uh, variables in your model, some variables will have, for example, if you're trying to build a model, let's say, uh, based on the income and the age of the person, you want to predict whether he will buy a very high society building, I mean, how he'll buy a house in a high society building, or he'll buy somewhere in middle, middle medium society kind of thing or he'll buy a house in a in a normal very low standard society okay so you have classified uh, three uh, classes and you want to predict whether uh, what uh, class he wants he will uh, fall into for example you are inputting the age so age is let's say 
26, 27 or let's say it will go up to 50, 60 max. Income, if in, let's say if you're doing in US, it will range from all the way from $20,000 to let's say 1 lakh uh, dollars or a million dollars, anything can be, right? Or even um, multi-million dollars, that can be the range. So when you're trying to form a model, there's one quantity which is in thousands or lakhs or millions, right? And one quantity which is in tens. So your model will really get confused uh, with the scale of the income, right? It'll say, oh my God, this is such a huge number. I mean, a multi-million dollar and a million dollar itself is, I mean, some ex X or, uh, X or Y times, okay? Or for example, if someone is on $20,000 and if you're comparing with someone who is, uh, um, let's say $1 million, so it's a huge difference, right? But the age variation is very less. It can be 26 to 50 or max three times, 81 or 80, right? So your model will always think that price is very important or, or sorry, the income is very important and age is not important. However, that may not be the case, right? If someone uh, of, uh, you know, even of a very high income, let's say if he is in, 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 in on the verge of retirement, he'll not buy a house, let's say, on a very big society right now, right? Whereas so some person who is in the mid of 30s, he's just like in the middle of his career, he has a lot of money uh, that will be inflowing in the future, he can invest and take a probably a good home loan and buy in a very high class society, right? So age will make a difference. Mm. So the, that's where your scaling comes into picture, right? You don't want the model to get confused or, you know, influenced by numbers which are very big in magnitude compared to others which are small in magnitude, right? So this is where your min max scaling comes. So basically it's a very simple formula, whatever your data is, just subtract from your minimum and then divide it by the range, okay? So your maximum will be one and your minimum will be zero, okay? It's a very simple concept. No need to, you know, uh, think too much about it. I have explained you why we are doing this or why uh, we should do this. So this is a very simple uh, code. I'll not uh, waste too much time in writing the code is a very important uh, it's a very simple code uh, so this is a package so for example what we did uh, like import pandas at pd so right now we are doing it from sklearn.preprocessing import min max scalar this is the function name you're having a data frame okay now it's very important to know this that sklearn will have all the packages that are applicable on a data frame you cannot, you, most of the packages or the functions of sklearn or sklearn is the package name that we discussed uh, like numpies and uh, matplotlib uh, last time what we discussed. sklearn is again the package name which contains a lot of machine learning, um, uh, you know, functions and you know, packages. So uh, sklearn, most of the functions of sklearn are to be applied on data frames and nothing else. Okay, no lists, no dictionaries, no vectors, no numpies, only data frames. So whenever you are trying to apply this, just have, uh, you ha need to have a data frame, okay? So, um, so this is your data frame. This is your function. So you are storing the name of the function in a uh, variable and then you're just fitting that into this data frame and then you're just transforming this. So fit and transform is a necessary step you need to write every time. So once you fit and then you are transform. Every time it comes in couple, it comes in a couple, okay? So when you do a fit, you need to do a transform. And then you are transform. So one, wh what is the min minimum here? One is the minimum, right? So one minus one divided by the range. Range is five minus one, four, okay? So one minus one divided by four, zero. Two minus one divided by four, 0.25. 2 minus 1 divided by 4, 0.25. Similarly, all, all this. 5 minus uh, uh, 5 minus 1 divided by 4 is 1. Any doubts here? I think it's very easy. Uh, and uh, if you need me to write the code, but the, I mean, I think it's a very easy code. Uh, okay. So
So I think everyone is clear on this. So uh, right now we talked about min-max scaling, right? There can be another type of scaling called max absolute scaler. So what it does is divides all the values by the maximum absolute value. Uh, maximum becomes uh, one to minus one. Minimum value gets divided by the absolute value of max. So here you don't have negatives, for, but for example, if you would have a negative, you still take a absolute value, right? So you divide all the values divided by the abs maximum absolute value, okay? So for example, if this would have been minus five, you still would have taken five, and then one divided five, five, two divided by five, and so on. So this is again the same thing. You're importing this function, you're making a data frame, you are storing this function name in a new variable and then you are fitting it and then you are transforming it. Okay, no questions here right now, right? Everything clear? Everything clear for everyone? Okay, thank you. So let's proceed. Okay, so as I told you, uh, this is minus five. So you still divide it by plus five and then 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, but uh, this number is uh, minus one, right? So when you are dividing, it, you take the absolute value and you divide by the whole data by that number. Okay. Now, you can also do a binary uh, threshold, okay? So for example, you are taking this package, again importing the function, you are taking the data frame, you are storing the uh, function in a variable you're doing a fit and transform. What is important is the threshold function. Sorry, threshold parameter. Threshold means whatever comes beyond the threshold gets classified into one and whatever comes below the threshold comes becomes zero. Okay, Very intuitive, very easy to understand. So whatever comes below three is zero. Whatever comes above and equal, uh, above uh, three, it becomes um, this thing, uh, becomes one, okay? So no, uh, nothing, no problem in that. Okay, now, how is three calc? Uh, so uh, Sharad, uh, I think uh, if you uh, see this, less than equal to becomes zero. So whatever you put three, three is less than equal to, uh, yeah, so three is less than equal to zero and uh, three is less than equal to three. So it is equal to three. So it becomes zero. Okay. Uh, so this threshold is three, just an example. You can put threshold four also. So that is uh, the requirement of the user and uh, uh, not the requirement of the data. So it is just for you to understand or for you to make uh, sense of it. Okay. So for example, if you, uh, if you could say the same uh, example, what we talked about is the, about the income of the people. What you could say, you could take an average income of the uh, of people in US and then take that as a threshold. So whoever is above the threshold of the average income, he can be classified as rich and someone who is lesser than the uh, average person, he can be classified as middle class. So something like that. Okay, so that threshold and in interpretation lies with the user. Okay. So we understand this. Uh, okay, now this is very important. You have your data, you pre-process it. So whatever we did till now, like understanding the distribution, scaling it, this is all about pre-processing, falls under pre-processing, right? So you pre-process the data, you scale it so that your uh, variables don't get influenced too much by a single value then you fit the model, then you check your accuracy, then you re-feed that uh, accuracy thing to the pre-processing, and then this is like a cycle, it goes on, okay? And then you do a prediction, okay? So once your model is ready with this cycle, then finally go into prediction. Okay, so the vector that we talked about uh, in uh, the last uh, this thing is kind of uh, so each row is a vector okay so each row is a vector of features so feature one feature two feature three feature four each row is a vector of these features okay. 
just to make you understand and this is a statistical series you this is not this has nothing much to do with uh, you know understanding of the data frame but just remember what is a vector if someone asks you what is a vector each row is a vector okay now okay now let's enter into machine learning so i think sunil and sharad were there last time but since vasant was not there we'll just uh, reiterate to the definitions and uh, you know so that we uh, get a feel of it and then we'll go into linear regression uh, into a lot of depth today uh, so that it is crystal clear for everyone okay now let's start so machine learning i think uh, the definition uh, is very simple uh, is something which the computers are learning from the experience without being explicitly programmed so explicitly programmed as in uh, you don't want to tell the machine everything so for example if there is um, okay sunil has some question uh, yes sunil tell hello yes sunil yeah. so this definition i have seen so what machine learning is that uh, without explicitly program it will give you the answer but assuming the answer, if we have n numbers for which we have the data uh -huh. we have trained for that one and we are giving n plus 1 x data okay uh, for which we are expecting the answer uh -huh. so that answer can be wrong or right correct so what about the n plus 2 x are we again going to feed this n plus 1 x to the data training set or how it will go ahead okay that's an excellent question i think uh, sunil that's a very good question so uh, i think but uh, i think i answered this uh, in one of the uh, classes i don't know remember who asked this so your model update okay model update is something which you should do every day or every time you get a new data you have the prediction you up, update that into the model because that is something which your model has not seen whatever data so whenever you are doing machine learning right the the first and foremost thing for machine learning is get as much data as possible without thinking anything get as much data as possible okay so uh, i mean whenever you getting a new data that is more information to the model so as soon as you get a new data point just feed that into the model i mean feed that into the data add that into the data however when you are doing in actual real time databases it is very difficult for someone to continuously append data right so there's some pro there's some pro there needs to be a program that needs to be run every second to you know update so there's a lot of cost involved that okay so there is here comes the trade off there is a cost involved with a regular update and there is a uh, cost i mean and then there is a benefit of having more knowledge to the model right so you have to balance out you need to see how often you should refresh your database so that your model gets updated right you cannot do it every time because it's a very costly affair to update your database every time because your servers are usage is uh, you know uh, every uh, time you use your server it is being monitored it is you are paying a cost for that so your servers cannot be occupied every time but having said that whenever you get an opportunity to do that you should do that is that does that answer your question yeah that's fine thank you yeah sure no problem okay so i think we are clear on this uh, um, so i think this slide also we have seen uh, um, i mean we will not uh, go through much of this any doubt if you have on any of the examples you could stop me yeah seen spam filtering stock price prediction movies as a recommendation mobile check for deposit in fraud detection face recognition in deep learning uh, face recognition you can you know identify so what what your apple iphone iphone x i think has it has one of the best face recognition software it is using machine learning and ai for that facebook facebook when it tags uh, whenever 
you see you update a photo with of your friend it, it, it gets recommendation that if you want to tag that person it knows that this is the face of this guy so i think uh, a lot of uh, uh, face recognition um, software is available voice to text uh, whenever you uh, like your interpreters your translators all work on uh, this so i think we have all seen this uh, examples all earlier also okay now uh, here comes a very important part so i think people who have had attended this class last time they uh, might have a good uh, i understanding the idea of this but i'll still uh, briefly iterate this so supervised learning is type of learning where your data or your training data has already been marked by someone who has collected the data for example let's go back to the example of a height and weight right so whenever you're trying to take the data for height and weight each of the height and weight has been marked whether that is a male or a female or a male or a female okay so this all data has been marked okay so whenever you want to predict you get a new height and weight you want to predict whether it's a male or female right so your machine will understand from the past data of height and weight whether this guy is a male or a female okay so that is supervised learning now male and female we have already talked about right uh that is called a classification problem where the outcome is limited outcome is limited to certain classes and the classes don't have any uh let's say what you call what you can call is there's no hierarchy in the classes for example male and female no one will say male is greater than female or female is greater than male right so uh there is no particular hierarchy in your classes each of the classes for example um uh let's say you have a win or a loss okay yeah sunil so uh yeah this is a binary classification male and female that's what i i was saying that is a classification problem with the two outputs there can be a classification problem with three outputs then it falls under the multi class uh multi classification problem okay so this is a classification problem what is a regression problem a regression problem is where you are trying to predict a continuous output okay so for example if you are trying to predict the age of a person or his income or let's say uh, i mean uh, what will be the price of the house he would buy in future okay so is you are trying to predict uh, a continuous output a number and not a class So that is supervised learning. Now, unsupervised learning is something where your output is not not known in your training data. For example, to just have this understanding easy, I am again taking that height and weight example. For example, you have collected height and weight, but you forgot to mark who was a male, who was a female, right? Now you. So Neil uh, asks why we say continuous output and just not just a number. continuous output i mean uh, what i mean is a number so i mean uh, you're right it can be an integer it can be anything in a real number space right continuous why we are saying is that for example uh, you have your data uh, for example your data has uh, ages of people of 26 28 30 35 suddenly you want to predict for someone i mean your output uh, comes up as 31 right so for example uh, that's a good question sony uh, so i think i should i i i would love, love to explain this for example let's say uh, you are trying to do a problem where you want to predict uh, whether the person age is 26 30 or 35 these are three numbers right now there can be two interpretations of this you call these three numbers as classes okay class 26 class 30 and class 35 then it is not a continuous output you cannot predict someone of 31 age your model will always give 35 30 or 26 as an output because it is understanding that this is a uh, three class classification problem but why i say that is a continuous output continuous output means 
anything any number can be predicted between whatever the data has seen so for example if your data has seen someone from 26 to 50 it can predict someone of 40 or let's say it can predict someone of 70 even okay but a classification problem it can be for example a movie rating or let's say whatever uh, imdb ratings are there imdb ratings are not i mean ideally it should not be a number right they give averages 8.5 8.6 but ideally it is uh, not a number because a movie of 9 is not exactly one point lesser than uh, a movie of 8 right it is kind of what notion you create of that ratings right is let's not get into complexities of those uh, but just to make you understand uh, these numbers of movie ratings do not make actual sense right so your imdb rating 10 minus a movie imdb rating of 9 doesn't give you a movie imdb rating of 1 right so these numbers are actual representation so these are classes these are not continuous outputs okay so uh, just to make you understand that numbers need not be uh, uh, need not be continuous every time the numbers can be the notion okay so uh, based on that notion there is there is a insight that you get but that's why i said continuous means a whole range of numbers you can predict anything any decimal point anything in between those numbers okay is this clear to everyone okay okay so everyone is clear yeah, so uh, what I was discussing is unsupervised learning. Now, unsupervised, unsupervised learning is type of a learning wherein, uh, as you as you have, would have understood, that you forgot to mark your output. So you have collected the data, but but you forgot to mark who was male, who was female, right? So now you come to your boss. You said that uh, you know I have marked the height and weight, but uh, I'm sorry, I really forgot to mark who was male and female. So what will your boss do? Your boss will tell, okay, do whatever you have and do an analysis on that, okay? So what you'll do, you'll plot it, okay? So you plot the height on x-axis, weight on y-axis. There will be certain distribution what you'll see. Uh, for example, let's uh, get that graph plus string. Where is that graph? Yeah. So, for example, here are two groups. Here are four groups. But, uh, for example, you have plotted height and weight, and you just get two groups: one on the top right, one on the bottom left. Okay. You are very clever. You understand? Okay. I think your top right is male, and your bottom right is uh, sorry, bottom left is female. Because on an average, males will have a greater height and weight that are compared to their female counterparts, right? So, this is what is unsupervised learning. You didn't know the output, but you had an insight from the plot that you could get, right? You cl clustered it. You collected them, I mean, classified them into groups. These groups can be interpreted in a different way. If you would, in this, in this case, you know that this could be a male or female. But in many cases, you don't know what groups are there existing in your data. For example, uh, if you have, if you are sitting in a clinic all over the world, for example, you are sitting in a clinic where people from all over the world will come, then you are very, then you will get confused whether this top right corner is a male or is it an Australian or is it an African or whether the bottom left is a female or is it an Indian. So in that case, it is very difficult to take insights of these sorts because you really don't know what you're looking for, but you can due to your business knowledge or your understanding of the data you can come to insights okay so we'll look into that later just get back let's get back to what we are trying to do so uh, i think uh, this is a very um, general uh, example so you want to predict whether that um, if you know the outlook if you know the temperature, if you know whether it is windy or not, you want to predict whether children will come out to play or not. Okay. Uh, so 
based on the outlook you have a output and this output is of two classes no yes or no right so there's no third outcome first there's no possible third outcome okay now i think this is a very clear so we've already discussed this now this is very important okay <clears throat> listen to this very carefully you have your data right this data has been generated by some function so for example let's let us think like this when god made a man and a woman he might have something in his mind right some calculations he were doing he was doing that okay when i'm creating a male i should give him an average height or weight of this when i'm creating a female i would give her some features like this so god had some function in his mind or let's say some notion in his mind while while he was assigning height and weight to uh, male and female right as a person you don't know that right you can only get as close as possible to your god's function but you cannot estimate the exact function so what you are trying to do is you have a function which is the absolute truth there is no two way around it there is a function which is an absolute truth for example let us talk about stocks okay the stock prices many people say it is random for example an average layman like me i would say i don't know stocks will move like randomly i don't know where to invest but a person who has uh, you know spent 15 years in investment banking he knows a lot about how stocks are moving he has a lot of knowledge that based on uh, what donald trump says based on what a company uh, product i think these stocks will move somewhat like this but still he is not 100% certain things there is he doesn't know someone who has worked in investment banking for 30 years will know much more than a person who has worked in investment banking for 15 years so he he knows that oh this stocks will move also because of this because of market sentiments because of crude oil prices because of let's say what are the policies um, uh, that are there right what are the policies that import export policies that donald trump is introducing so he knows all these things but you he can be as good as his knowledge right he is not god so there is an inherent function that is determining the stock prices that is uh, calculating the stock prices but you me or yeah, I, uh, i mean people like us or people in general you know who are like not god we don't know that function right we don't know what is generating the stock prices what we can do is you have the data for stock prices you do your machine learning and statistics and get a function called g as close as possible to f f okay we cannot ever go into f there's a very uh, less probability that you'll go to f but certain uh, some certain cases you can go to f if you know the uh, f uh, if you know somehow Uh, how your data is being generated but 90% of the times you don't know how your gen data is generated so you trying to guess okay so any doubt still here i mean is this a uh, uh, corollary clear i mean whatever example i gave can i get a yes or no on my chat box and if anyone has question i can unmute okay clear everyone is clear that's great so so classification regression we have already seen is a list of values uh regression is a number okay supervised learning we have seen what is a guess we have all seen this i don't think this needs to be check email is spam or not we know it's a two class problem classification stock price is a regression house price is a regression person is diabetic or not is based on a classification okay so i am not going into that here unsupervised learning we have seen we don't know the outcome to try to break into groups 
and that's it okay now your supervised uh, learning can be of different types okay they can be linear regression they can be polynomial polynomial regression they can be regularization uh, regularization is basically concept it is not a model uh, it is more of a concept and then the uh, models called ridge and lasso based on your uh, this thing based on the regularization okay now let's see this okay <clears throat> Uh, now, suppose suppose you are given uh, the data of you know uh, your house, okay, house price versus the area it covers, okay. So let's say this is. Uh, some 300 uh, I mean whatever area it is and this is the 100 units and then you have prices of the houses okay now you collected data you have collected uh, you know did a lot of data collection now you have plotted okay so there are 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 data points you plot the data right now you see that okay this data i think is kind of a linear can i draw a straight line through this this looks good right a straight line through this now some you show this to your boss the boss is no no i think this the line which is good i think this is the better line you show it to your colleague he says no no i think this is the better line because it covers most of the data points so you get confused oh my god there are an infinite number of data lines that are possible through this data point right i mean what to do to come up with something called a linear regression model okay so essentially what it does is it will fit a line to your data okay your line will always be of the form of y is equal to a plus b x1 sorry b1 x1 b2 x2 so this will go on right b3 x3 and all so y is a function of some intercept and features okay so these are the features so x for example in this case what we are trying to do we are trying to predict the house area equal to some intercept plus some coefficient into the house price okay so what we are trying to do is we are to predict, trying to predict the area of the house based on the price of the house now this is your function but how do you know get to know this and this okay that's the, that is the task right if you know this and this then everything is over right so what you do is there is a concept called root mean square error i want to draw a line which is closest to all these points so this will be at um, I mean don't go by the drawing okay so uh, uh, so this will be always parallel to y-axis perpendicular to x-axis okay so these lines are parallel to y-axis and perpendicular to x-axis so what is the distance between this point and the line okay all these are parallel to y-axis and perpendicular to x-axis remember that I'm not able to draw that properly because I'm using a mouse, but uh, sorry. So this is not there, right? So till here. Okay. So 
you want to draw lines so that the sum of all these distances is reduced or the minimum okay so for example if all the points lie in the line you could simply draw a line like this and you say that the distance sum of this distance is zero but in this case there cannot be a single line that goes all through all these points right there there will be a line which has the lowest distance from this right and that is a line what we are trying to predict so i'll delete all these things what is your cost function a cost function is something very important in machine learning it is trying to find out the parameters like what we described here c and b is trying to find out those parameters based on some function so let me uh, mark these points as y actual okay that is the actual data and then y hat as the predicted data so whenever so y what is y hat y hat is c plus beta into the house price so this at this house price you put that into here beta times plus c beta and c remember you don't know right so this house price has a y hat predicted but you don't know c plus b so best you can say is y hat is equal to c plus beta into 100000 and then there is an actual here already what which is you have collected this is 100 so this is 100 minus brackets c plus beta into 100 100000 right you get the point i'll not draw all the zeros okay <clears throat> similarly this point will have actual and a predicted this will have actual and predicted so now y actual minus y hat square you remember why we did a square in deviation so there will be a positive errors and there will be negative errors some will lie below the line some will lie above the line right i don't want such a line which is kind of a you know cancels out uh, your positive and negative sign i want a line which is lowest from each of the points so i will add them this is sigma sign this is for addition add them all over the points and minimize this so this becomes my cost function for linear regression now i'll stop here does anyone have any doubts till now i'll unmute you guys anyone has any doubts here sunil is okay sharath and vasan this is very important if you have any doubts right now please let me know because this is very important Sharad Vasant, can you please uh, let me know whether you have any doubt? Can you drop a chat? Okay, Sharad is okay. Vasant, okay, Vasant is also good. So I think that is a very good thing. So this is what we are trying to minimize. Okay. okay so let's open your jupiter notebook and let's code this out okay let's open your notebooks okay 
import pandas as pd uh, as we remember pandas is a data frame i mean paint pandas is a package for the data frames why i told data frame data frames are a way that is a way that your data is to be input in all the models you need to have everything in data frames so that you can input that into the model okay so x is the predicted variables or the features and y is the prediction or the training or the supervised output okay from sklearn sklearn is the package import linear model more linear model is the model linear inside linear model there is something called linear regression okay so linear model dot linear regression i am storing into reg regr it is just because i want to have i mean in future use i want to have a simple name you know to mm, use so that's why i am storing that into uh, this variable regr dot fit xy okay so basically i fit my model so this command right this command will do all the calculations uh imagine how powerful your python is right you had to calculate this um you know the squared you had to add it up you had to differentiate uh, to get the minimum then you had to i mean that the whole process is being run by a single line regr dot fit xy inside this there are a lot of calculations that goes into but we don't need to look into that because we are not going to develop packages we are going to use them so this is what this line will do and then you are using the predict function on your data frame to predict the values and these are the predictions so you see here how your model has you know beautifully fitted so for example 0 1 so there's a difference of 1 1 3 there's a difference of 2 2 5 there's a difference of 3 3 4 there's a difference of 4 4 9 there's a difference of 5 5 11 there's a difference of 6 you predict for 6 7 8 6 it predicts a difference of 7 7 it predicts a difference of 8 8 it depends of uh, uh, predicts a difference of 9 that's how intelligent so now why this is perfectly fit because this was a linear model now if i put some weird numbers i don't follow the pattern let's say i do 8 or 9 or then let's say i write 200 okay now if i run, run this it takes a little time to run so this asterisk means it is running right Okay, by the time it completes the execution, I'll uh, just take a uh, three minutes break. Okay, I'll get back to you guys. Uh, meantime, we'll okay, just.
okay uh, so see now there's two things uh, okay guys uh, you can hear me right yes uh, it's yeah. giving error for me okay uh, regression dot pkxy okay uh, okay we'll see that uh, after the end of the session why it is giving error and just uh, go through the syntax once uh, if it is and we'll see the error later uh, now now i wanted to uh, uh, let you guys know or you know show you one thing so you see here your whole data is 0 1 2 3 4 5 and then there is y called 1 3 5 8 9 okay and then there is 1 200 and you see how your predictions have changed drastically now this is what is an effect of an outlier okay you know that for 0 it was 1 1 for 3 2 for 5 3 for 8 4 for 9 5 for 200 this is an outlier right is a uh, probably it could be a wrong data entry or it could be some weird observation which is not exactly possible hmm? you see how it has gone haywire in predicting 678 it's predicting 139 168 197 so that's why the data pre processing and you know taking out outliers is very important so To, for example uh, if uh, if you see here so for example if you see here when i draw a line like this this is good but what happens if there is a point somewhere here the model will also try when i draw a line like this 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 distance will be huge the model will try to reduce that distance so what will happen is it will start drawing a line from here maybe that distance was more than these total distances right so the line will shift and that's why the prediction goes wrong so removing outliers is very important and you know uh, sometimes this can define you know uh, the difference between a good model and a bad model okay so you get this essence right so everything uh, i think till now it has been very smooth right any doubts till now Sunil uh, says how to remove outliers. We'll come to that. There's a separate topic for that. Uh, we'll come to that. But uh, so Sharad says no. Okay, he doesn't have any doubt. So Sunil, so for example, uh, there's some. So when we discussed about distributions, right? So when we talked about normal distribution. and uh, we talked about the percentages so remember we were saying that this person is within 95% or the between 95 to 100% for example there's a class student uh, your um, students have you know uh, scored around 60 to 70 the same example this one student here who has scored zero okay the average the lowest marks beyond 0 is 40 for this one student who has absolutely scored 0 right so there could be two chances his paper was not corrected his uh, he was absent during the test or he never studied anything so he landed up in india having a zero but you don't want to you know uh, you know uh, you don't want to tell uh, yourself as a bad teacher just because one student has scored scored zero because for you that is an outlier that person did not study or he was absent or he did, his paper uh, did not come to me that's not my problem i mean i i as a teacher didn't go bad right it was some fault of the system 
so <clears throat> how did you decide he's an outlier so if someone is beyond very beyond the average right so very away from the average a lot of standard deviations away from the average then that guy is an outlier now remember when i discussed mean and median i said mean is robust sorry median is robust to outliers and mean is not so taking a page from that discussion right now what we are trying to say is a person who is very away from the median lot of uh, gap between the, let's understand this lot of gap between the median and that person a particular data then that guy is an outlier okay how exactly to define that how exactly to remove that we'll see that but for now just understand like this is it good are you comfortable okay so neil is good so i think we have progressed a lot of uh, things today that's great so we have seen this also okay now i think we have already uh, talked about you know what uh, cost function is and what is uh, okay now okay now just focus on what i draw here something to do with the gradient descent imagine you have a bowl okay you put a droplet here water droplet where will the water droplet go and settle it will travel like this and it will settle here right the minimum point okay take this corollary and understand this this is your function this is where you are right now what you are trying to do is you are trying to adjust your parameters your c and beta what we discussed in that y is equal to c plus bx you want to you want to if get to a point so that c plus bx the combination of that gets you to this point where your error is the minimum okay so this travel or you can point your point can be here also so this travel is called gradient descent okay so your function tries to achieve the minimum value and you are going to go into that direction so how you go you calculate the slope what is the slope the slope is this the tangent here right you go into the direction of the slope so whatever your slope says you go into the direction of that slope now now for example this slope is as saying it is like this how far it you need to go do i go 100 units at drop and go here again i'll i'll come here then again my slope will change I will, again i 100 units i'll go here and again i 100 units i'll go here i'll do like this right i'll never come here so there is something called a learning parameter okay we'll just register this in mind right now we'll try to understand each of these things as we go and progress but try to register this there is something called a learning parameter so you know that you need to go here but you take baby steps you don't jump so you go here okay then you again calculate the slope your slope still says here okay you take a baby step you go here then the slope has reduced the slope is say that you need to go some ve not very steeply now but somewhat uh, still you have to go left you take another baby st baby step now you say you again calculate the slope your slope says you have to go here you take a baby step right like this you reach your minimum of your cost function is this good tell me if you have any doubt and we can restart i mean re uh, i can re explain uh, the concept but this bowl and uh, droplet is the is a very famous example that is that is being used for gradient descent and uh, when it is very intuitive to understand so just drop me a message whether you have understood this concept or not
So gradient descent is basically a concept on how we are trying to reduce the error. Okay. Sharad uh, is good with this. Vasant and Sunil. Okay. So Vatsant has this question, uh, is this to calculate the minimum point? Yes, this is to calculate the minimum point. Sunil had this question, it, uh, it was very a good question. He says, how to do this? How do you calculate, how are you calculating the slope? So when you're differentiating, when you differentiate, you get the slope of the function, right? The first differential of a function is the slope of the function. So whatever sign that slope gives, according to that slope, According to that sign, you have to go in that direction. So whatever sign you go, according to that, whether you have to decrease or you have to increase that direction. And then the baby steps, the amount of steps you need to take, that is the you that the user tells. So for example, I would I can say my learning parameter to be 0 0.2. 0 0.2 unit sign. So normally a learning parameter will vary from 0 to 1. So if it was one, then it is huge. I'm taking huge steps. If it is uh, zero, I'm not moving at all. So somewhere between zero to one, I have to move so that I can reach my minimum. If it is too high, then I keep on bouncing here and there. If it is too low, then I take a lot of time to go to the minimum point. Is Does that answer to the uh, answer your question, Sunil? Uh, Sunil, uh, partially, okay. So, okay. So after, uh, probably we'll close the session in 10 minutes. After that, we can uh, have some questions on uh, what we um, need to understand here, okay? So, okay. Uh, now, the linear regression, what we had uh, talked about, the example I gave you was uh, uh, based on a single feature, right? But you can have multiple features. You can have, uh, for example, you're, you were predicting the house area based on the price of the house. You could have uh, the area of the house based on the location. You could have the area of the house based on uh, the number of rooms it is, has. So. There can be many features, right, to predict. And the more the number of features, the more information you're giving to the model and the more better will be your accuracies most of the times. This is not a single statement to understand. Again, it is very important to understand most of the times, more data means, more features means uh, a good model, okay? There can be certain, for example, if I input IMDb rating in a movie, and trying to use that knowledge to predict the area of the house. Will that make sense? Not, right? Does, it doesn't have any correlation or any sense in predicting the area of the house, right? So it's very important to, you know, <clears throat> have this concept of uh, features, whatever features you want to, you know, use for the model. Uh, but uh, that, uh, that is uh, under a different scope. Uh, we'll not see that particular. We'll go into a little uh, overview of feature selection, but not, we'll not go into depth of what features we need to you know, select for a particular model. But you could say that if a data has, if your predictor or your feature has some correlation, correlation, do you, do you guys understand what is correlation? Correlation is basically, um, let's say, how two things move, okay? So for example, if X increases, does Y also increase? Or does Y decrease? Or it doesn't have any effect, okay? So correlation basically lies between minus 1 to 1. So 1 correlation means 100%. So if y, X moves, Y also moves in that particular direction, okay? And uh, if X moves, then Y moves in that particular direction, but not that much. It can be 0.2 or 0.3, okay? So, and if it is minus, it means X increases, Y decreases. So that is the essence of correlation. So you need to understand that um, 
how your x and y is correlated but there's something called confounding it's a very important concept in statistics it's not there in the slide but listen me out on this it's a very interesting for example there's a study called um for example you have a ice cream setup on a beach okay and you are on a beach where you know the beach has a lot of sharks okay now there can be a study i went to the beach and i collect data on the ice cream sales and the shark attacks so when i do a uh, modeling i would say the number of sharks attack are dependent on the ice cream sales but does this make any sense does it make any sense right how can ice cream sales be related to the shark attacks what is the confounding thing in here is the number of people visiting so if your number of people visiting is more then your ice cream sales will be more and the number of people venturing into the sea will be more and hence the shark attacks right so the confounding you can have correlation your ice cream sales are increasing with the number of increasing of number of shark attacks that there is a correlation but there is no causation okay so there are two important things here to understand one is association and one is causation correlation will only give you association it cannot give you causation in fact nothing can give you causation you don't know what is the cause of anything right so maybe i am saying that number of people visiting is a no cause of your increasing sales of ice creams and increasing sales increasing shark attacks but what is the cause of people coming in it may be with the weather it may be that um, you know people have a lot of um, excess money okay sunil has question one is correlation related to association what is the other one it is causation causation doesn't have any parameter okay i cannot uh, quantify causation i cannot say that uh, this is the cause of this cause and effect there are okay causation is cause c okay i'll write it down causation is uh, i'll just write it down here okay causation c a u s a t a o n what is the cause so shark attacks cannot be the cause i mean in ice cream sales cannot be the cause of shark attacks right okay now uh, so we have understood this we have understood correlation a lot of things have happened today uh, we'll go a little further and then probably we can stop so that we don't overload you guys with information Okay. Uh, so we all know this. What are coefficients? What are so? For example, if you want to predict the per capita income, so you have year, and then you have GDP, and then on the basis of that, you are predicting per capita income. Okay. So, okay. So any model for which you want to. So in the model, what we did. Uh, in our notebook we printed uh, we got the output now if you want to print the intercept or the print the co coefficient this is how you do it reg r dot intercept and reg r dot coefficient will print the uh, intercept and the coefficient okay so so this is how your model will look like so for example if your year at gdp you are predicting your per capita income this is our inter intercept this is the intercept this is your x1 okay x1 is 81.768 and this is your x2 okay so scikit learn uh, we will not go into much of this uh, scikit learn is basically uh, you know uh, having all the repository of machine learning algorithms it is a So, so sklearn what we did right sklearn in our code this sklearn in code if this is all this is what we call as scikit-learn okay so lots of interest uh, internet resources and uh, so we showed you right how powerful it is just line of code will do so many things 
okay so create estimator uh, load data okay now i think we can stop here um, and address some of the questions because these things will take up to tomorrow so that you know, we have continuation and tomorrow then we'll see what are hyperparameters what are the linear regression hyperparameters what is the polynomial regression what are the examples some examples of the polynomial regression and then we see regularization what is regularization and we go into region lasso okay so i think we'll stop here today now i'll unmute you guys if you have any questions on today's session uh, we can address that so sunil had a question we can address this together uh, just a second and unmute you guys okay so i think the forum is open for questions uh, anyone wants to start Uh, basically, we have different attributes. As like, uh, if you take the house prices, number area size that is one, number of rooms, uh, kitchen size, number of bathrooms, there are many attributes. Correct. Which which is affecting your overall price. In mathematical terms, the attributes are x one, x two, x three, x four. Correct. So, so how we will decide? Which attributes we have to take care, and which attributes we can ignore. Okay. So, is there in Python or some other library which can let me know? Okay. So, uh, every model, every different model. So, for example, we have talked about linear regression, right? So, every model will have some or the other way to understand what uh, attributes to keep and what attributes to leave. For example, in linear regression. Let's get back to the equation we saw. I think so. Let us y equal to a x plus b. Uh, not this one. Okay. See this one. So what does does this mean exactly? Now, before this, just keep this in mind. What I talked about when about scaling, right? Whenever you are doing a feature selection, this process is called feature selection. Whatever you are asking, so whenever you are doing a feature selection and regression problem, keep in mind that your features should be scaled. Because uh, if you remember what I said, you don't want a feature which has a bigger unit to neglect, uh, ignore someone who has a smaller unit just because of the unit. it may have a lot of information but you are ignoring just because it is the unit is very high don't do that okay i'm giving an example here because this is the equation that i have right now but whenever you doing a linear regression always scale it properly you can use a min max scaler you can use a max app scaler any scaling but you need to do a scaling there okay now after imagine after scaling you have this output okay now what does this mean forget this intercept so these are the features so normally a unit increase in a year increases your per capita income by 81.7 and unit increase in gdp increases your G, uh, <coughs> per capita income by 7.3 now imagine if this would have been 0.73 it means a unit in gdp increase in gdp is increasing your per capita by 0.73 it means it has almost no effect okay so imagine if you would have been further low 0.073 it means it is negligible my per capita i am talking in thousands and this guy is just increasing with one unit it increases just 0.073 so i may as well neglect this this is not even adding anything in my model so on so when you have a linear regression so when we discuss ridge and lasso right so ridge and lasso is kind of a feature selection of linear regression we'll go into detail on that but for this particular example just keep in mind you see the coefficients and if the coefficients are too less or too low you can assume that 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 particular feature does not have much effect to the output. Okay, great. Okay. Um, okay, so assuming, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah, tell, tell. So assuming, ah, uh, based on this mathematical function, 
Mm-hmm. Everything we are deciding, and our, there is a Python library which is giving our coefficients whether we need this feature or not. Uh-huh. So, so what about uh, those uh, diagrams, bar chart, or we draw basically? So, what bar chart about what? I mean, so what? No, no. I mean, uh, okay. So means how it goes in a sequence. Basically, I'm thinking. It. If this is the problem, if for a particular year or size, you have to get the price. So one data we have got. Then what is the second step? Draw the model and see how it's distributed. Or just the second step is that to go and use the scikit library. Yes, okay. Killer. Okay, that's a good question. So whenever you get a data, first step is to data explore. Okay, explore the data. How does your data look like? how does your data uh, look like in a 2d plot now when you have thousands of features that is difficult for you or uh, for in 2d plot visualize right okay so yes. that's what that's when you do something called follow the occam's razor occam's razor is a statistical principle wherein every statistician starts with a simple model start with a linear regression see your accuracy move on to the next model if your accuracy is not so for example if you get something like 90% accuracy now move on to the next model see what is the accuracy if your accuracy is improving it means there is still scope to improve the model if your accuracy is decreasing then there then you have already fitted the best model okay so that's how you typically follow you know the modeling part now before that you have to process the data right so pre processing as i told you have to clean your data for example if there are missing values you have to remove those missing values if there are outliers you have to remove the outliers if there is scaling required to be done you have to do the scaling then if you have to do a feature selection feature selection can only be done one by the correlation analysis but for correlation analysis is not not always correct so you go into the model go into linear regression and see that whether this parameter this coefficient is large or small then you do a feature selection then you start on building different models that's how you progress typically and then so uh, displaying your output or you know creating graphs is not very important for a data scientist that visualization part is more of a diagnostic analysis you are dealing with the predictive analytics right so i don't want to see the visualization i want to don't want to see a bar chart or a histogram um, tell me how your output is distributed tell me the outliers tell me the null values remove them fit a model give me the accuracy get me the predictions that's how typically your machine learning journey should be okay but visualizations yeah. is an added advantage you can visualize so in feature selection also there is something called boruta plot where what we will see in tree space concept but uh, for that uh, i mean park your question till then we'll see that later and the visualization of how we can see like the feature is, will can also come yeah. okay so sure, sure it uh, uh, so uh, going on the same example where we used the first time machine learning x was 0 was 2 4 3 4 5 and y was 1 3 5 7 8 9 11 yeah so uh, there was constant difference we draw the linear regression line and we got the predicted value and which we were expecting then we try to modify one data by 200 as an outlier correct so can psychic uh, sql learn can tell me okay this is outlier i am no no no, that no. Or... It, unless and until you remove that from your data the sql learn cannot take tell you that 200 is a data bad data point how will it understand whether then it how Yeah. Okay. Then how will I decide which is the outlier yeah. because so, that is the data I don't know. That's what I told, na. When I talked about distributions, when I talked about you know how far the data lies from the mean of the data, that yeah. SQL learn is not taking care of. That your Python statistics that you have learned will take care of. SQL learn is for modeling. You have to understand that. Mat as Matplotlib was for visualization, SQL learn is for modeling. Matplotlib with Matplotlib will not do predictions for you. Similarly, SQL learn now will not do data cleansing for you. Data cleansing is another handled by, let's say, another package, or it it is handled by Python itself. SQL learn is a package for modeling. 
understand that so it okay. is something uh, that is modeling your data whatever you feed in it will understand that it will not it is not so clever that it will also tell you what is the output uh, what is the out sorry what is the outlier what you should neglect uh, so you have to uh, in um, you know give some inputs from your side as a statistician that okay these things are outliers i will not fit so xk learn if you feed in garbage it will give you garbage values like we saw in 200 right no, okay got it got it yeah okay. so it is not sk learn is for modeling it is not for uh, cleansing your data okay means you have to first fix the data and finally you have to give correct. sk learn correct. to model you can give the data correct correct, correct. and so about that uh, outlier i know how much distance it is or how much far it is from the actual mean value yeah. or standard deviation so we have to decide how far we have to consider for outlier no, there is this uh, certain uh, you know uh, there are certain thresholds normally statisticians work on so uh, something beyond a uh, three standard deviation or a four standard deviation will be considered outlier or in terms of median it is called interquartile region so we'll come to that don't jump Uh, so much we we'll come yeah, okay okay uh, how we can remove out because yeah i agree because i have to modify that example and i have to try to draw the yeah, linear yeah, regression sure. no problem so we we'll have to everything uh, deal with that not a problem okay no issues uh vasant and sharad any questions from your side no i'm good okay um uh, that's good so any feedback you have on the session you are you comfortable with the pace uh, are you comfortable with the concepts um, so any feedback you would have no yes sir. from my side it's really very great okay the more than effort that i am getting okay that's great sharad vasant yeah same uh, good from my side so yeah it's pretty good yeah concepts are explained well so good for me okay okay sure yeah it was good shobdeep but if if you take an example like take two files and if we do a like prediction right like you show an example like 200 entering 200 for next prediction so that was good uh uh-huh. so i have a question if you have means if i have two files like related uh, correlated data like uh, something uh, related mm-hmm. so how do i show that prediction means example prediction of by using those files uh, is there any example that i can try or i didn't get the uh, question so you're talking about two files as in two separate data sets yes yeah so you have two yeah, have... separate data sets okay now what you're trying to do is no i have to combine them and i have to show that this is the next prediction like you show on the One three five six seven and next prediction is two oh, hundred. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Like that. Uh, so I mean, is I, that possible using files? You you won't say that as two different data sets. You should say that mm-hmm. as a, um, you know, concatenation of data. I mean, you are adding some new data to the, um, yeah, uh, model. Yeah. Okay, so yes. that would be the correct explanation of it. And yes, that you can do. So. for example whatever le- we learned in um, the previous classes you know appending data in fo- so uh, right now what we did is a uh, basic example of linear regression as we go progress we'll do a hands on example where we have an absolute data and then we append that data and then go into the next prediction that we will do in a proper data set don't worry about that okay but uh, sure having said that uh, combining two data sets so basically this is a function called r bind r bind in data frame so what it does is combines two data frame for example you have a data frame of two features you have 10 values and then you have another data frame of same two features and a different th- three values you just need to do an r bind r bind of these two data frames so r bind df1 comma df2 it will combine the two data frames and then use this as a feed to your sql learn model okay 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 so okay. right now so, right now what i did i did it manually just to show you guys but yeah. 
when right. you are working on databases you have to code it right you cannot input it manually so that's where your uh, rbind function will come so whatever data frame you have you import that data frame and then combine that uh, using rbind yeah you were saying okay so we will be looking yeah. at the database connections and everything in future classes right? yeah 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 you get you get that oh, okay. okay so one more thing uh, in sql and basically we also provide one is training state another one is test state yeah so can you also provide that in sql so uh, i think uh, one thing you are uh, not clear about sql learn is a package for modeling okay so imagine that okay. it is solving an equation okay? it is not dealing with data it is not having anything to do with the data whatever you feed in you will get the output you feed a training set you'll get a training output you feed a test set you'll okay. get the prediction so when you are feeding for example in the data in the example where we saw x and y so for each x there was a y mapped okay so when i fed that it understood when i fit fit this uh, see the slides here when i fit it it is saying x comma y fit x comma y so it is understanding for each x this y is the output this x this y is the output this x this is y is the output so this is a training set this is a supervised training set okay. has, understood now when we are saying it predicting so it is just having the x values it doesn't have the y values that's why it is returning the y values right so this is the right. test set so it doesn't have the output it does just gives the output right predictions okay. okay it means we have to write some other python code from where it will take the output it will verify whether it's correct or not uh, yeah, yeah with the existing no 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 no. Uh, no, no 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 so can, knowing that what will the rmsc be i mean it has already fitted the best model right on the train set uh, based on the rmsc calculations now okay. to know cal know that rmsc you just have to you know like what we did for knowing the coefficients and uh, intercept just similarly you have to input the uh, you know rmsc uh, parameter and it will give you the rmsc of the model but it has already fit the best model there okay okay just one more request could you send this uh, pdf file today or slides slides uh, i will um, okay i'll check with ashok once uh, and see because i need to download the videos and then upload with the so downloading the videos it takes a lot of time it takes around 3 3 and a half hours so and for that yeah no not video this but this slides that is very helpful for us last okay. time we got and no that problem. is okay. that is very helpful okay no problem i'll 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 upload that no problem okay okay thanks lord okay thank you so yeah. much okay let's yeah. meet tomorrow yeah okay bye Okay thanks Updeep thanks yeah. have a good day yeah thank have you so much night. bye Perfect. Yeah. Now, uh, tell uh, you had some question, right? Uh, pertaining to the last session, we can discuss that first. Yes. Sir. So, in that linear regression, are there only these uh, three algorithm: uh, linear regression, last and reach, or are there any others? Okay. Okay. I I think uh, and, I should address this problem first. Uh, let me see. Uh, i'll just show you one thing first okay now you see uh, you see the screen so if you see here this is your linear regression then there is polynomial and regularization then logistic decision trees random forest bagging boosting forget bagging boosting knn 
knife ways svm okay k means and uh, rest of it is okay so these each of these are models okay these are different models so for example as i have told you that when uh, that god function we, we are not able to figure out right so uh, how to go to that god function we are trying different models to go to that god function now when i introduce linear regression linear regression is a single model okay now uh, for example you have uh, thing from the starting okay so this all mo these models are basically maths and statistics right so for example you made a model now i came up with this idea ki uh, i think uh, if i add the regularization part the accuracy will be better okay now there's someone some other person come comes and says that okay no i think uh, if i add this type of regularization mathematically he is a better guy in understanding mathematics so he says i think if you add this kind of regularization that will be much better so like this we had some tweaks in linear regression linear regression is basically where your function is equal to y into a y equal to a plus beta x plus beta 1 x 1 plus beta 2 x 2 plus beta 3 x 3 this is your linear regression now how to get to this b there are certain uh, ways okay so certain ways is you can deduce the rmsc or you can have rmsc and a regularization part so there are various ways where you can reduce the uh, rmsc but linear regression as such is a single model okay so for example we'll go into different models today and understand you know uh, what what other models what why do we have other models but uh, so for example there's something called elastic net okay i'll just show you uh, elastic net uh, regression okay now just see this show you the elastic regression see what we saw last time you if you see here ditch was when we had this and this okay lasso was when we had this and this but elastic net is something which combines all these together you have uh you have the regularization of a linear um, i think there's some disturbance in the line i'll just mute everyone okay so elastic net is something which combines the regularization of both okay so for example you have a ridge uh, and a lasso together combined in a uh, elastic net so now you won't say that elastic net is a third type of linear regression it is not the third type of linear your basic equation your basic equation of uh, let me open the pen i'll just write down your basic equation of y is equal to a plus beta 1 x1 plus dot 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 okay this always remain constant this is a linear regression model okay so whether i do a ridge whether do i do a lasso whether i do elastic net it doesn't bother i mean it doesn't bother this equation will always be rem remaining same this is a re regression problem okay i mean this is a linear regression thing now how to achieve this beta 1 there are certain techniques so for example i can re directly reduce the rmsc or if i can you know combine to a regularization part and reduce the rmsc that also can be done but your linear regression is this form okay so i'll just unmute now you can uh, ask whether it, i mean tell me if it is clear or not no so sure. this linear regression uh, equation that's very clear to me yeah yeah my just think actually three model now this is a fourth model i am learning one linear plane linear which is in sql uh -huh. also and uh, reach now this elastic net uh -huh. now i have four linear models so uh 
so are there any other legal model or not that is the first question okay no i saw so, uh, as far as the domains are concerned uh, you can have a single regularization double reg- uh, square regularization or a combined so these are the kind of three three models that can uh, be used to derive the linear regression model okay this is your answer to the first question now what's your next question okay so uh, on that day we saw that there was something uh, some x list was given y list was given uh-huh of uh, 0 1 2 3 and uh, 1 3 5 and 13 then we replaced 11 or 13 by 200 to show us uh, outlier correct so that is one part now we and i understand the outlier but while coming on this boston data set which has 13 fields yeah one field uh, when i was going some tutorial it was showing that crime rich crime that was very accumulated at a particular pace so they adjusted it using log methods basically okay. and after that uh, they went yeah they went to see how uh, other 13 are related okay before 13 he was showing that okay how you go and see which fields are not affecting much so we can re- remove that as like rejo sorry last so by default remove some fields Correct, correct. I remember. Correct, correct. So it was showing manually one by one step that uh, now you have to go price versus every field one by one. Yeah, see so whether that is affecting much or not. If not, we remove that. In that way, it was going one by one. Then finally selected four or five fields. But for one field uh, ratio, it it was accumulated. So it adjusted using the log methods. So and after that, it draw mean, median, everything. But Still, after that, I found that the square mean variation that was around 28, 29. So my question is, was this end to end, or is there anything to do? Because this is one of the example I want to understand end to end. Okay, I got it. So I think that's a good question uh, on how you know uh, you, you have an end to end problem. So th- that's what uh, what I would suggest is. First, let us go through the models. You just have a flavor of the models. When, then when the project will come now, we'll have everything end to end. And because linear regression is not the end state, right? You have not just fit the linear regression, it closes. What we will do when we have the project work in, I think, uh, the last but not the least uh, week, I mean, second last week, we have a project work where we have an end-to-end solution and where there will I will show you how you approach the problem because every uh, data set if I go end-to-end then there will be a lot of time occupied and will not be able to see all the models. So first let us understand each of the basics of the models and then when we do our project work we will see everything end-to-end how to approach how to remove the outliers how to you know see the data everything so I what I have told you right now is that you have a data set this is only the third way, right? So if I tell everything all together that you need to find the correlation and then you find uh, fit the model and then you do this cause validation, this, 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 everything will get confused. So I will touch everything, whatever you have told me. I have, it's good that you are doing your homework and you know coming up with very good questions. That is good. But uh, understand this thing because linear regression is not the end. Then there will be again this uh, end-to-end process is not complete then there will be another model then then we allow the model so once we get into all the models then we because what you're trying to say is that uh, you know you're manually seeing each of the variable and uh, its uh, effect on this thing so when i go to decision trees and random forest i'll explain you tomorrow random forest will go into that so there is something called a baruta plot and it will easily give you the importance of this you don't have to go because you don't have to go manually into that because when you have 100 features or 1000 features or 1 lakh features it is not practically possible for you to go manually and see each of the uh, relation right and then again each of the relation does not mean that the uh, in, so for example uh, there this is your response variable okay and then there is something called x1 as a feature and then there is something called x2 as a feature so now you see how x1 and y is related okay now you see that this relation is very good then you test how y and x2 is related you see this relation is very bad 
but and then you remove this but that is not the correct way because your model is y is equal to x1 plus x2 this you have designed you have designed a linear model there the actual function may be x1 plus x2 into x1 and that's why when you just put x1 x2 and you do not consider x1 it becomes irrelevant but when you combine this factor with x1 it becomes highly important that also happens so that's why i have not completed an end to end thing in terms of a linear model okay yeah got it we'll come to that when we do the yeah got it everything uh, according to sure thanks lot i will wait yeah yeah sure no problem okay anyone has any other question no okay then uh, we'll uh, start with today uh, today's session okay i'll put you guys on mute mute now so today what we will do is uh, uh, we are going going to have a key and revisit okay uh, and uh, also last time you was asking how to you know uh, achieve your um, uh, how to do your cross validation and achieve your hyperparameters and you achieve the best k out of k in that also uh, we'll see today okay so uh, let's uh, yeah yeah uh, sunil uh, we will do k neighbor today again okay uh, don't worry so uh, just our you know just to refresh the idea a little bit uh, what are the three prerequisites of ml basically a pattern should exist a data should have something behind going on behind it uh, it's not should it's not should it's not be a, should not be a random process i mean it should not be a completely random process if it is a completely random process then you cannot apply machine learning and find out the predictions if, or you or you could say your predictions will be very bad the mathematical model should be unknown if you already know the gods function you need not find the uh, you know you know need not uh, use machine learning to tune and there should be a lot of data sometimes the data part is left to constraint you uh, you will always not find a lot of data sometimes you have there are also techniques uh, you know how to you know add a lot a little more data or you know go how to go around uh, the cases where you don't have proper data okay so we'll see all that thing um, uh, eventually but uh, let's let's uh, start with the little bit of uh, revision of what we and so i i'll not uh, repeat all these things okay so let's start with uh, nearest neighbor classification okay i'll open a notepad okay i mean uh, so okay. okay now if you uh, go to this part where we see here okay okay i'll use this on this uh, so if you remember what we uh, did last time is you have certain uh, okay now let me open the notepad first so for example your data is the data for example is weight of the bird okay then a number of legs okay and then uh, let's say feathers whether it has feathers or not feathers almost every i think i think we don't need this feathers everyone has let's say does it have a sharp beak beak is uh, sharp or not okay sharp or not sharp something like that these you have features and then what you have to do is you have a lot of data let's say you have 100 data points or let's say 1000 data points you have collected you know 10000 data points for different words and now what you have what are you trying to do is you want to someone is going to tell you all these features weight legs uh, whether it has beak and all and it can be anything right so um, you want to predict whether that is a chicken that is a you know it's a duck whether it's a swan i mean i don't know the difference between these I, last of all let's say this is a chicken okay this is a duck this is a swan 
Um, let's say this is a black duck, a little different species of duck. Okay, I'm just uh, terming it here. And let's say this is a uh, uh, a baby chicken. Okay. So now you are given the data. You need to find out what is the uh, you know uh, let's say what is the uh, type of bird that your test uh, is okay now a very important uh, measure uh, i mean now let's say when you're trying to calculate the distance you, uh, you have to define a measure that you want to keep uh, you know as a distance measure for example if I want to measure how far is Mumbai from Pune, I would say that there's 500 kilometers or sorry, 150 kilometers it is. It is around 150 kilometers. So you need to have a distance measure. So similarly, if I say how far is Delhi from Bombay, it is around 1400 kilometers. Okay. So there's a distance. So if I say, are Pune people more similar to Mumbai or Delhi people more similar to Mumbai? Okay. So based on the distance, you could say, I think uh, Pune is more similar to Mumbai. Uh, if you just consider, because a lot of Marathi people live in Mumbai, they travel to Pune. So, if I, at a particular snapshot, if I say how how poor people are, how Pune people are similar to Mumbai, so I would say a lot of Mumbai people would have would be in Pune. So, I would say because the distance is less, there's high chance of people flocking to Pune than to uh, Delhi. Okay. So based on this distance measure, I would say, I think Pune, since it is, you know, uh, geographically closer to Pune, I think Pune people are more similar to Mumbai people rather than uh, Delhi people. So this is some distance measure you um, know that it, it exists, okay? Now, there can be a distance measure also. For example, how many number of people, how many number of Marathis are there in uh, uh, let's say Bombay and the number of Marathis. Marathi is basically a kind of a regional language, a regional, uh, uh, you know, I mean, kind of how, what is the language that M Mumbai people speak. Okay. So if I say how, how, what are the number of Marathis in Mumbai? Does everyone understand this context? Because I mean, who, I, guys, I don't know the background. Uh, you have been living in US so many uh, I mean, from your birth or I don't know. So everyone understands this context, Manatis and all. Right? Okay, I think everyone understands. That's good. So if I say, uh, give me the number of Marathis or the percentage of Marathis in Mumbai. Okay, so you say the percentage of Marathis in Mumbai is let's say 95%. The percentage of Marathis in Pune is let's say 70% um, and the percentage of Marathis in Delhi is let's say 20%. Now, on the base of this, also, you can have a distance measure. Okay, so what is the distance between a Pune and uh, uh, Delhi in terms of uh, the Marathi uh, people distance? It's about let's say 95 percent minus 25 percent, so it's around 75 percent. Or if you put in in maths, that's it. That's it, like 0.75, and put it in numbers, it's 0.75. Similarly, what is the distance between uh, Mumbai and Pune in terms of number of uh, Marathi, so uh, we said it's 0 0.95 minus 0 0.7, so that is 0.25. So if I add two features, let's say distance uh, in kilometers and uh, the number number of um, let's say uh, Marathis as a as in percentages. These are the two features, and I want to say whether Mumbai is more similar to Pune or uh, uh, Delhi is similar to Mumbai. You get the essence, right? So what you try to do, you had features, you kind of, uh, I mean, formulated what is the distance between the features of each of these cities, and then you have say that since Mumbai is closer to Pune, or Pune is closer to Mumbai, Pune people are more similar to Mumbai other than Delhi. So you can have any number of features like this. Okay. Let's just hold on for one minute. Uh, just hold on for one minute. I'll just be back.
Okay, I'm back. Uh, you can hear me. You guys can hear me. Just give a Y or N. Okay, got it. So you get uh, basically get an essence of how your distance measure can uh, affect the decision, right? So it's all. It always doesn't have to be geographical. It can be in any terms. Now, let's say if you have something like this, if you have a binary outcome. So uh, let's say, um, is Mumbai metropolitan? Yes or no? And is uh, Pune metropolitan? Metropolitan is some uh, defined as uh, the number of people staying in a city. So if it is greater than some threshold, uh, let's say, I mean, I don't have any idea of how what is the threshold, but I think let's say, put it, let's put it as five crores. The so number of people uh, greater than five crores, it's a metropolitan. Uh, if it is less than five crores, then it is a non metropolitan okay now if i see say is mumbai a metropolitan yes it is a metropolitan pune is a metropolitan no it is not a metropolitan and is delhi a metropolitan yes it is a metropolitan and then what is the distance measure you just have yes or no right you don't have any number to calculate your uh, distance so what how we do this is basically we um, you know assign one if it is matching and zero if it is not matching so for example if you say that if it if your mumbai is a metropolitan yes and delhi is a metropolitan yes then the distance between this is basically zero because it is matching okay so we uh, we i mean if it is matching we say the distance uh, between, i mean i would say the similarity is one and the distance is zero right because it is matching and the same uh, concept goes if it is between Mumbai and Pune. So, for example, if Mumbai is, yeah, Mumbai is yes and Pune is no, then what is the distance between them? It is one. Okay. So, always it will be one or zero. It will not, uh, you know, be anything other than this. You got, get this, right? So, if it is similar, then the distance between them is zero. I mean, if it is same, that is the only, prob uh, only possibility you can have. If uh, Mumbai is a metropolitan and uh, Delhi is a metropolitan, it is yes, and the, that's why their distance will be zero. If both are not, uh, one is metropolitan and one is not metropolitan, then the distance between them is one. Now, you would say uh, when you are seeing the distance, it is in kilometers. When you are seeing the number of uh, Marathis, this is in percentages, right? And then you're saying yes or no in terms of uh, uh, one or zero how i mean these are different numbers distance is in kilometers number of this is in uh, is is a ratio and then this one or zero is binary how can you add these distances very valid question right how can you add this uh, uh, distances so in knn the first and foremost thing to do is make your data unitless if you don't do that your data unitless knn will not make sense okay if if for the only time you can go around this is that if you know that all your features have the same unit for example if at all everything is in length centimeters then it is okay to do that but if you have some length in centimeters some length in metered something in percentages something in yes or no you have to make your data unitless how we make your data unitless we have already seen that pre last class right you can do a, a max apps uh, scalar you can do a min max scalar you can do a thresholding you can do also do a scaling uh, using uh, um, you know the x minus i mean using the z formula that I'll tell you today. Okay, uh, so how to do your scaling using uh, Z formula? So you have to scale your data in uh, if you do a nearest neighbor calculation. Okay, that is the first and for every foremost thing you should remember when you do a nearest neighbor classification. Okay, I think this is clear to everyone. I'll delete all the drawing. Put this here. Now, after you calculate the distance this the distance now this is very important after you calculate your distance then comes a decision 
how many distances you should take into consideration should you take only the person who is nearest or should you take an accountability a, a greater number of people or a greater number of data into consideration and do a majority voting in terms of your fitting now always remember this get this into your mind always remember this whenever you are averaging out something in your model okay for example well, i mean because i am i am giving this example because it will help you to understand many models so always think like this whenever you are averaging out okay averaging out means you are not going particularly uh, on the basis of a single point you are averaging out you are seeing what other people also see into consideration right so whenever you are averaging out your decision or you are taking a major majority voting you are moving towards what can anyone tell you are moving towards what under fitting fitting or over fitting write down the answer sunil says over fitting any other questions sharad sir under fitting asant under krishna kumar under correct so uh, sunil yeah, it is not over fitting it is under fitting because you are considering as i told you you don't want your decision to get varied by each of the different points huh? you are not you should not be too much influenced by a single point that's what we learn right when we did overfitting we were kind of having a graph that is trying to fit every point this is overfitted right but when i am taking a graph which is kind of averaging out everything near its uh, near where, wherever it is going it's kind of a little more underfitted okay so just remember this when you are kind of taking a majority vote or taking out the average you are kind of underfitting moving towards underfitting okay not underfitting um bear that in mind okay you are moving towards underfitting and if you are trying to just be influenced by a single so for example if your data is like this and you put a knn with one nearest neighbor okay and you try to predict for let's say this part what will be the answer to this it will always take this into consideration and you know have this value if it is this it will always take this value if it is this it will always take so it will be very you know kind of trying to touch every point and not averaging out however in this case it is kind of uh, you know uh, taking an average and going on its own way a lot smoother okay there there's one thing i want to tell you guys i think that's not in this slide but uh, i think that's a little important uh we need to tell you guys so there are basically two approaches to you know model fitting one is the parametric approach okay parametric and the other is non non parametric what do you mean by parametric approach a parametric model is a model where you have defined the structure of the model so for in, in case for example in linear regression you already had the structure of the model ready right you had y is equal to alpha plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 okay you had kind of had the structure ready you just were trying to figuring out you, know, you were trying to figure out the values of these right so you already know that you are going to trying to fit a line but you just want to know which line in this the best one you guys can hear me right uh, there was a little disturbance i think okay 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 so i'll just repeat again i'll just repeat again so there is something called a parametric approach and there is something called a non parametric approach 
okay so parametric approach is wherein you have already decided the structure of the model okay what structure what you mean by structure of the model for example when you are having fitting or trying to fit a linear regression you already have y is equal to alpha plus beta 1 x 1 plus beta 2 x 2 so you know that you are going to fit a line you just don't know which line you is the best Do you guys understand that you have already know the structure of the equation in linear regression you just need to find out what the values of these are okay this is a called a parametric approach parametric approach where you know the structure of your model you just need to find the values of the coefficients however there's something called a non-parametric approach a non-parametric Okay, a non-parametric approach is basically where you don't have any equation. Okay, so in k nearest neighbor, what equation you have? Do you have any equation where you're putting your x and you're getting y? There is no particular equation, right? What your model is trying to do is try, trying to get your x's. Then there's uh, distance mesh calculation, and then it is taking a uh, voting or averaging out and then it is predicting for y okay so it's a process it's not an equation so understand it a non-parametric approach is kind of a process that the model is following in order to predict a parametric approach is basically an equation that the model is finding the values of is this clear or should i repeat again I think I'll uh, just uh, open the forum for a questions. Uh, I'll unmute you guys. Any questions you have on this? Okay, everyone is clear. Can I get an answer, yes or no, uh, so that I can proceed? Okay, so this is very uh, kind of important to know what is parametric and non-parametric. So you will always may not get the equations. A lot of models that we are going to learn right now is that you will not get equations out of it. Okay, this is a process. So when you kind of trying to predict there, the model will follow the process and then predict. It will not fit that x into uh, an equation and predict for y okay so understand this okay then i'll move on okay so you have understood this right let's go on so kind of nearest neighbor is what it is trying to do is it is taking our majority voting so it is in in case it is a, a categorical variable like we discussed last time if it is like yes no or a duck swan uh, hen chicken something like that what it will do it will take a majority vote so for example if k equal to 1 if i see for example if it is about colors here so it will find who is my nearest neighbor it is brown it will predict for brown but then it has overfitted it is only seeing or it is very you know short sighted it is just seeing brown but when you see if you tell okay now tell uh, give me the top three people or top three colors who are closest to you okay so it is okay these are one brown and two green so then i say okay then you you are doing a majority vote there basically okay so it will say yeah okay i understand now 
so my output should be green okay so it's kind of uh, you know makes sense to have a majority vote but then again it doesn't make sense to you know have lot of majority vote okay so for example if i tell now in this case it is good because it is kind of making a little more sense but uh, for example if i say k equal to uh, you know uh, let's say k equal to how many data points assume there are at least 30 data points here now if i say k equal to 30 or k equal to 29 what will happen you are always you are going to predict whichever data whichever color is more in your data set you try always predict that you get that if you say for example there are 29 data points i'm keeping k equal to odd so if it is uh, because always k should be odd uh, you know to make uh, sense out of your majority vote it can be uh, you know uh, it can be even if you want to you know take an average mathematical average where we are trying to predict a continuous variable okay but if it is a class that you that you gonna predict then it is always advisable to uh, have k equal to an odd number okay because so that you don't end up in a tie uh, when you're trying to predict a majority vote so i guess this is uh, pretty clear for you guys um, now now if k is equal to 29 as i said if k is equal to the number of data points that you have in your data set what will happen you'll always predict whichever data i mean whichever color was more uh, in your data set for example if you have greater number of browns in your data set you are always going to predict brown irrespective of what you uh, choose and that's not a very good prediction right so that's why uh, understanding k is pretty much uh, the most important thing of nearest neighbor okay now we have already seen this okay so a Voronoi diagram you don't have to be very you know uh, specific about this diagram just to make you a little more uh, understand uh, you know make make you understand a little more about how your nearest neighbor uh, is calculated so for example a Voronoi diagram based on the distances it particularly creates a boundary so basically this is the boundary any point which falls in this boundary will be predicted uh, a value of this any point which follow falls into this boundary it will be predicted a point of this because you have one nearest neighbor right so it will always be have uh, seeing one neighbor okay any point which falls here so for example if you want to predict what is the let's say i mean i don't know what they are predicting here but let's say you want to predict uh, whether it is a yes or no whether it's a high uh, whether it's a male or a female right so anyone who has a um, scaled you see what i told every time your Vorona, even the Vorona diagram says every time your dimension should be scaled okay so they they have kind of i think used a max app scaler you see everything is uh, i i mean some one point is one and just everything is one or they could have used a min max scaler also so uh, that's what so if you land up in a data set let's say someone his uh, scaled height is 0.2 and uh, scaled weight is let's say 0.4 so 0.2 and 0.4 you reach somewhere here then it then you see what is the uh, uh, what is the output for this data this data was your training data right this data you already have so this was a probably a male or a female whatever it is so we will always predict uh, that as a female so everything that comes into this boundary will be predicted the same class as of what this had okay you get these get, get this yes or no any questions okay i think clear it's uh, very easy so now uh, i think we can 
So KNN classifies are lazy learners. Keep this in mind. It's a very important uh, term. Lazy learners is basically, uh, you know, when you have a point wherein, uh, for example, the testing, I've already told you, since it's a parametric, a non-parametric approach, you don't have an equation ready. So it's kind of calculating all the distances. Whenever it sees a new point, it is calculating the distances, it is sorting, and then taking an averaging or majority voting, and then giving you an output. So it is a lazy learner because it always learns when the test data comes. It is not always ready with the uh, uh, equation or the structure. Okay, it always learns as as per the data comes. So this is not very. Uh, that's why it is not widely used. It is whenever your data is very slow. I mean, it's very big. It becomes very slow, and that's why people don't you know prefer to use this model. But again, it might give you very good accuracy. Uh, when you have uh, you, when you have you know really cluttered data and uh, they are in, in, I mean concentrated in one part and that's where in uh, KNN can you know uh, be very helpful. Uh, so classifying unknown records are relatively expensive. That's what it's very very slow. It calculates the distances. Distance calculation is difficult. I mean computationally expensive. Sorting is again computationally expensive, so it's a very you know it doesn't it's not very uh, scalable I would say. Now let's look at the code that we have for today. Okay, now as per as uh, as per is your request uh, today, I have you know kind of. Uh, shown you uh, how your uh, this thing uh, cross validation uh, will look like so uh, that's why uh, I put this today uh, so for example I'll start from the beginning just follow me here from sklearn dot neighbors import k neighbors classifier basically the sklearn dot neighbors is a uh, package like what we just have a revisit uh, on uh, where how we were doing last time. From sklearn dot metrics, uh, sklearn uh, dot data sets. sklearn directly has a linear model, so you didn't need not address anything inside it. But uh, knables classifier is some in, in a subset. So uh, from sklearn learn dot neighbors import knables classifier. From sklearn dot model selection import cross val score. Okay. Now I'll as we go, we'll understand this. So just uh, let's say you have this uh, estimator. So I what I, I'm using the iris data set. I'll show you how, what the iris data set is. First of all, load the iris data set. From SLM dot data sets import load iris. Import panda set pd. Do these steps. Write these steps if you are writing. And then just uh, do a print x here. So this data set is basically of, uh, I'll just, uh, you know, open this. the description so basically uh, there are some uh, dimensions of the leaves uh, uh, sorry the flowers 
and based on the sepal length and sepal width and the petal length and the petal width we are trying to classify whether it is an iris uh, i mean whether it is a setosa whether <coughs> it is versicolor and whether it is virginica so just uh, let's see what setosa and versicolor are setosa the setosa is kind of uh, this flower okay if you see virginica this this flower and a uh, versicolor oops this is not versicolor anyway anyways so uh, kind of you know based on the sepal i'll also tell you what is sepal definition so each of the parts of the calyx of a flower enclosing the petals and typically green and leaf like so it's kind of a um, characteristic of a flower and petal you guys know so based on the sepal and petal width and length i am kind of trying to predict with that whether that uh, uh, you know that flower is a setosa versicolor or a virginica okay uh, you guys understand this right so this is basically the iris data set so so uh, for example these are the dimensions uh, sepal length sepal width petal length petal width now remember all these are width, uh, are, are lengths and are in centimeters right so i need not do scaling as i told you uh, for this data set particularly now what i try to do i have uh, taken k neighbors classify is equal to n neighbors equal to 3 and estimator dot fit i am fitting the data in x and y and uh, x was what i did x is iris dot data and y is iris dot target okay so the same thing that we did in last class right uh, we took the x out of uh, that the data separately and y uh, separately and then we fit the model similarly here we fit the model and then we predict uh, so let's see what the prediction comes i'm just commenting out these lines so uh the classes have been labeled as 1 2 3 so versicolor virginica and uh, uh, that those uh, are 1 2 3 respectively so you fit the model and then if you try to predict what is the flower for 2 3 4 5 i mean if your petal uh, sepal length is 2 sepal width is 3 petal length is 4 petal width is 5 uh, the prediction is 2 it means it is versicolor okay so this is how it is it, it works now comes the interesting part how do you find the appropriate k okay so let's put all uh let's see how your you know uh, uh cross validation scores will vary with the different odd numbers now you can take this uh, to any you can use your sequence function and start with 1 uh, give your end point as uh, let's say 1000 or 1001 and increment those as 2 i'm keeping this short because otherwise the model will take a lot of time to execute okay i mean even this will take a little more time so i'll just keep uh, 
to 70 okay now this is a list that you're going to store your each of the cv scores cross validation scores okay now you start a loop as i think uh, last time someone told that how do we test the hyperparameters which is the best you start a loop for k in neighbors i mean for each of the numbers knn you say uh, you are saving the model into knn and this is k neighbors classifier n neighbors equal to k scores is equal to cross val score knn dot comma x comma y knn is the model that you have saved x is the data y is the date target cross validation how many cross validations how many folds you require if you remember what was key fold in last time so fold number of folds i require as 10 and scoring is the accuracy metric we'll come to this later so can anyone tell me how many elements of scores we'll get here write down the answer how many scores we'll get will we will it be a one score or will it be a 10 score will it be five scores how many scores will get here Okay, so Neil is asking me to repeat the cross validation. Uh, okay, uh, I'll do that. First, can we, can the others answers answer how many scores we'll get? If you don't know, just write don't know, but give me an answer at least. Okay, so I think we should. Uh, Vasan says, not sure, but it might be five. Okay, so I think we should uh, revisit the key fold uh, a little bit more. It's perfectly understood that uh, uh, you might uh, forget. But... Okay, now uh, K fold is basically cross validation. Now, do you remember? Do you guys remember what was cross validation? So cross validation uh, is basically that you are dividing your data sets into certain parts. You are using some parts to train your model, and then using the rest of the part to test the model. Okay. Now, there's one there's one concept that you could ha you have this data. Just divide this into 80-20 ratio, train your model on this, test on this, and let's get over with it. Okay? Why to do so many things for a single data? So I told you, right? I think uh, some guy, uh, some of you, I think uh, answered this question very well. That uh, how why you should not just see a particular. I think it was Krishna. I uh, as far as I remember, why you should not see just a single part because your data could be sorted. So, so in case of sorted, you would see certain data points and uh, maybe it is sorted based on the number of, uh, based on the number of, uh, I mean, based on a feature, on the based of ascending order of a feature. So you might see test all of your data on the highest value or the lowest value based on the previous value you've seen. Okay, so you don't want that, right? You want the model to see almost every part of your data. So, that's why you do a cross valid k fold cross validation. You use your train, and you first divide it, divide it into 80 20. Okay, you use your um, you know uh, training, uh, the uh, you use training to train your model on the 80 part and test on the 20 part. Then you change your parts. Okay, you still have the same ratio of 80 20, but you just shuffle. Okay, you use this part and that part and test on that part. Then you use this part, this part, test on this part. Similarly, so in a 5, k equal to 5, what will be the ratio of uh, uh, data splitting? It will be 80, 20, right? 4 out of 5 will be used in training and 1 out of 5 will be in testing. If it is k equal to 10, then basically you are using 90% for training and 10% in testing. So k minus 1 divided by k will be used for training and 1 divided by k will be used for testing. This is clear, right? So, when I do a k-fold cross-validation, there will be 
key number of scores. So this will, uh, I'll just uh, open this. This will throw up a score. This will throw up a score. This will throw up a score. This will throw up a score, and this will throw up a score. You take the average of it, and then display what is the average score for your particular model. So for example, now don't get confused in k of k n n and k of k uh, k fold cross variation. Don't get confused in that. Okay. So for example, for a particular k equal to one in k nearest number wala k, you are kind of trying to figure out what is the average score. Okay. Then for k equal to three, you are trying to figure out what is the average score. Then k equal to okay, let's say number of neighbors. Okay, n. Let's keep it as a n. Okay. Then n equal to five. You are saying what is the score, but your k is always five. Ah, huh? don't get confused. So for each of your n, this process is being followed. For n equal to one, let me delete this. N equal to one, you are following. Coming here, you are cross validating. And then you are throwing up a score, which is the representative score for n equal to one. Similarly, then you have n equal to three. You are running this process. You are coming out with an average score that is the representative score for n n equal to three. Like this, you have your array. Right? Now understood? Is this a good revision? Okay. So if you know this. Then let's try to figure out what we are trying to do. Now you see, I have told my neighbors can be one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, fifteen, seventeen, right? Since I am doing a majority voting, I need to have odd numbers. Okay. Now after you have n neighbors, you want to put CV scores as a list. Okay. We'll see why we want to put that as a list. For k in neighbors, for k in this array. Knn is the model where you are storing for this uh, storing this model for k equal to one first, and then you are calculating scores. This is a cross validation score for this model on this and x and y. You have k equal to ten folds, and then you are using accuracy matrix for two score. Now, can you tell me how many scores will this this have? Can I get an answer? How many scores will this have? Shara thinks it's just one. Uh, that's wrong. Other answers? Come on, guys, give me an answer. It can be wrong. Agustin thinks it's it's five. Sunil says it should be ten. Absolutely, great, Sunil. You are going to have ten scores. Why? I told you, right? The number of CVs, the number of folds you have in your data, that will be the number of scores you will get. Like here, you, I showed you, right? You get one, two, three, four, five, because k equal to five. If you have k equal to ten, then there will be another split, another split like this. You will have ten scores. Okay. So your scores, the score variable, the scores variable will have the score of this, the score of this, the score of this, the score of this, like this. It will have ten scores. Okay. Accuracy. Don't think of what is accuracy. I'll, I will discuss that later. But it will have. Okay. Vasan says, how do you assign CVS ten? As I told you, CV is something which we want to assign depending on the uh, uh, computational uh, power that our machine has. Okay, it can be five, it can be eight, it can be ten. We uh, we discussed that last time, right? It can be anything. It's depending on how much you want to you know divide the data because you see, if you have I have just used so many numbers, right? One to seventeen. You could have used one to thousand also, right? Now for each of this thousand, you are trying to take Ten iterations, okay. So it becomes very computationally expensive uh, to, you know, uh, do so many things. So it is. You can have five 
or you can have 10 it's up to the user uh, whatever he wants to i i can put it as 5 here okay that that's not a problem if i put it as 5 i'll have five scores but this is something which the user picks it's not anything dull it does not relate it is not related to the model don't get confused in modeling and validation validation is something to test your model now how to improve that validation you are using k fold cross validation you're not improving the model by using uh, valid uh, you're not you improving the model using cv okay you're just improving your validation process using cv the test to train ratio data will uh, change correct perfect krishna so as i told your test now it will be 90 percent training and 10 percent testing k minus 1 divided by k is used for training so if your k is 10 then 10 minus 1 divided by 10 9 9 by 10 that's 90 percent we can test with any number of folds yes you can test with any number of folds you can use but it is usually uh, preferred uh, you know uh, to take five um, usually but you can have any number of folds that is up to the user and Krishna yeah I was just uh, uh, sorry I got uh, deflected from the question so you're saying um, uh, the ratio will change yes absolutely the ratio will change it will be 90 percent for training k minus 1 divided by k that is 0.9 means 90 percent and k 1 by k is 1 by 10 that is 10 percent for uh, you know testing so overall Training plus testing should be your data. So this scores will have 10 scores. Now I need to, so cv.scores is basically the list uh, that you are storing for each of the number of neighbors. So for example, you are running a loop for k in neighbors. So the first loop is for k equal to 1. You validate it. You have 10 scores. You take the average, scores.mean. You take the average and then you append it to the list okay then for k equal to 3 you do the same thing append it to the list now k equal to 5 sorry n equal to 5 you do the same thing append it to the list now can someone tell me how many scores we will have here i want a right answer how many scores we will have just think 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 it through how many scores we will have in cv scores 9 is it one two three four five six seven eight nine perfect so number of neighbors you are using number of correct the number of entries in neighbors that's perfect so you have cv nine number of cv scores you see now now see how your model uh, behaves very interesting k equal to one you're overfitting don't use that k equal to three you are going better k equal to 3 you are going better k equal to 5 almost same k equal to 7 better much better i think it's it's still not the best k equal to 9 somewhat dips k equal to 11 great 98 percent k equal to 13 i mean i missed some numbers i guess so this is 13 uh, k equal to 15 it dips k equal to 17 it dips so whatever or which is the best your k equal to 13 is the best right so initially you, you were overfitting and then you fit the best and then you started underfitting you get this see how your uh, for, uh your uh, this thing is so you need not have so if you have thousand scores you need not you know see that manually you just need to have argmax argmax is a function it will return the value whichever it will return the uh, i mean you can just do max not even argmax uh, if you do the max then you will come to do come to know the score if you do know the argmax then you will come to know which address that max score is available and accordingly you can uh, uh, you know find out the score Okay, so uh, Sunil, I, I'll explain this, uh, how to find out the argmax. Uh, let's take a break uh, of like two, three minutes. Just go through this code again. Always do we need to select the max score? Yes, of course, you need to select the max score because you're trying to see for which k 
you are getting the maximum score okay so it always you're trying to find the maximum score because you have but how do we know which key is good that's how you know right you find out the score and then you see which address for example if i do an argmax here so 0 1 2 3 uh, okay so it's 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 what is the number? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 7. So 7th is the element, right? So again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 7th is the element. So if you do an argmax here, you'll get uh, 6 as the number. And accordingly, if you print neighbors bracket 6, So Neil, uh, X can be anything I understand. I mean, um, sorry, X, uh, your N uh, neighbors can be anything, but it's not that if you have, um, let's say, 1,000 points, you want to take 1,000 neighbors, right? So that's what I'm saying. You can run a loop from 1 to 1,000 and take an argmax of that. You, so you cannot have infinite K, right? That is not practically possible for you and the machine to, you know, find out the best K universally. You have to give the computer a range that find me the best K within this range. Don't ask the computer to find the universal K. It will not be able to find. There are certain limitations you have to understand that exist in computation, right? You cannot tell, you know, the computer can do, but it will take years to find out. If you want to put K one to one lakh or one million or whatever you want to do that. It doesn't make sense even to put so many neighbors, but your you have to give a valid range. Normally, uh, it is seen that a k equal to let let's say till 25 to 30 is good. After that, it's totally underfitting. Okay, so that's why machine learning is not just science; it's an art. You have to know certain experiences you have to get uh, to understand what is the average k that people use. Normally, K always varies between 5 to 10, uh, 11, something around 15, but not more than that. You cannot put a K of 20, 36 or, I mean, uh, not, not 36, K equal to 100 or K equal to 200. It will not make sense. You are very, you are badly underfitting the model. Okay. So, normally K is between 1 to 30 and based on that, it will, you will find the number of, uh, I mean, you will find, you can find the best out of that okay now let's take a break of three minutes uh, get this into the get this into your uh, I mean very get this very clear because the cross validation will be using a lot of number of times and it's just a single hyperparameter now there will be models where there are large number of hyperparameters so just get this thing into your heads very strong okay and so that uh, you know Later, when we have a large number of hyperparameters, it is easier for you guys to understand. Okay, let's meet in three minutes.
Okay, I'm back. So, any questions? Any doubts? I'll just put everyone on unmute. Um, any anyone wants to discuss anything? Uh, hey, could you go up and uh, show us what is X and Y? Uh, sorry, didn't get you what? Okay, I am on in 28, which is here. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, okay, I equal to iris dot data, and how we are getting this? Uh, where is this thing? Actually, I am not. Okay, this one. This one. Yes, basically. Load Irish. So load yeah, Irish. Five lines which will load, load Irish. That will give you error that there is no X and Y. No, X is equal to Irish dot data and Y uh, Y equal to Irish dot target. You have to put. Did you put that? Yeah. Yeah. So, no, these five lines were not there uh, no. on the screen at the uh, time. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I went through. Uh, so just uh, don't uh, run the code now. Just understand the code. Yeah. Because the code will anyways be given to you, but uh, yeah. So if, yeah. if you have any doubt on this, yeah, that's good that you have this. I I showed this uh, for a brief point of time. And that's why. Okay, no problem. So uh, timing. Could you repeat one one more second? What each cross validation score means after running means what does this mean basically a score? Okay. So. Scoring means accuracy. It means uh, when you're oh, accuracy. Okay, yeah. Correct. When you're testing it. So, for example, here we are doing a classification problem, right? So we are trying to uh, predict whether which flower it falls into. I mean, which 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 is the flower? It is a versicolor. It is it a centosa? It is a is it a uh, virginica? Three color flowers are there, right? So, for example, twenty percent. Uh, when you are trying to test here, if you see my screen, when you are trying to test here, so let's say there are 20 data points here, right? Out of 20, 18 you got correct and 2 you got wrong. So what's your accuracy? 90%. Right? Okay, we got it. Similarly, you got yes. it. Uh, again, you have 20, you got 15 of them right, 5 of them wrong. What's your accuracy? 75%. Here you got 17 right, 3 wrong. What's your case? 85%. So when you do an average, you're just taking the average of these percentages. Okay? Yeah, I got it. Thank you. No problem. I'll ask a question now. Uh, what was the scoring in uh, linear regression? Anyone can answer. What's the number of tests that we need to perform? No, no, no. What was the scoring? What were we trying to minimize? What was the scoring in linear regression? What were we trying to minimize? Uh, and find out the best parameters. RMSE, right? We talked so much about RMSE. RMSE, we were trying to minimize RMSE, right? What? Okay. If you see here on the top, what were we doing last time? What was this? RMSE, right? Root mean square. We were trying to minimize RMSE. Whichever RMSE we are getting the least, see, this is the RMSE for a particular set of. We didn't uh, do which one. I mean, we didn't do a K fold cross validation there, but uh, that's that was what our objective was, right? Using regularization, can we decrease the RMSE? Okay, so remember this. Write write this down again. Whenever you're doing a regression problem, whenever you are doing a regression problem, regression meaning you're trying to predict a continuous variable or a number 
in uh, in a very simple term you are trying to reduce your rmsc okay if you are trying to uh, predict for uh, a classification problem you are trying to mini uh, maximize the accuracy okay get this very clear because everything will rotate around this rmsc is a metric that is being used to minimize to be minimized for a continuous number problem accuracy is a metric that is used to be that is going to be used to maximize for a classification problem okay so when for example in k nearest neighbor here we are trying to predict what the flowers flowers are classes so we are using accuracy let's say if we were predicting income then the scoring would have been in case of accuracy would we would write rmsc and then each of these scores that we are seeing it will this not this will not be in percentages it will be in terms of rmscs okay get this thing very clear okay if this is clear are we ready to move on to the next model okay then let's go so we've all seen this now let's we'll do decision trees a little later let's see uh, what is logistic regression okay now let's see this i i'll put you guys on on mute and as i keep on asking the questions i want some answers okay uh now what were we trying to predict using a linear regression was it a classification or was it a regression 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 perfect a continuous number right so we were trying to predict the continuous number now what we did what we used uh, to predict for knn i mean what can we use to predict knn can we use regression can we use classification or we can use both classification that's what we used i am asking what we can use we can use not what we used can knn predict regression and classification both or just one of them single not sure okay i think only knn class no guys i just said that knn can be used for rmscs so what i meant is rmsc is for a regression part right when i i said that when yeah. you're kind trying to predict a continuous number when you're trying to predict a classification you take majority voting when you're trying to predict for uh, a con continuous number then you're taking the average i said that right all these things so i mean i think uh, let's draw a very uh, overview uh, tree structure and then i think it will be a little more clear to uh, you guys let's draw one picture here let's see first decision okay first decision box whether it is a regression problem or versus a classification problem what is a reg regression problem i want answers from you what is a regression problem when there is a continuous number 
continuous number we have to predict correct perfect this is a continuous number okay what is the classification problem when there is some okay. problem we have to classify in different yes. category basically correct we have to have to classify in different types okay so yes no or a number okay now this is your type of data or type of problem let's say not data type of problem the next decision is what model you want to fit okay so model if it is a regression problem till now whatever we have seen what models we can fit for linear uh, regression i mean what can our models we can fit for regression till now whatever we have seen a linear regression right a list a lasso regression right and a ridge regression right you guys get it yes correct and also we see saw knn today so knn knn can also be used for regression problem the next box is what is the scoring so what the scoring in case of a regression problem is always what give me answers what is the scoring in terms of a regression problem rms rms perfect perfect okay this is your scoring mechanism uh, scoring for rms so regression is over okay on the left side was regression now let's go to classification what is the type of models that we can fit for classification till now what we have seen knn perfect knn can linear regression be used yes or no can linear regression be used for classification yeah should be how do you say that hey okay. if we change the category number 1 to 3 4 and put on a regression side no it will not do that's what i'm saying you okay. see i think you should try to understand this first a classification problem is not a 1 2 3 4 i mean there is it doesn't uh, i can denote it as yes no good bad it, it can be true false maybe can't so anything can be it is not 1 2 3 4 regression problem is always for numbers continuous numbers which makes sense 1 2 3 4 means 4 is 4 times than 1 3 is 3 times than 1 4 is 2 times than 2 actual numbers if i replace male female to 1 and 2 does it mean female is twice of male not right there is nothing sure. you can represent it with anything it can be 1 2 3 it can be 100 200 300 anything but does that mean 100 these are actual numbers not not right yes or no cannot be actual numbers so you cannot fit a linear regression problem to a classification problem it's not just replacing the y with uh, 1 2 3 it has it has to make sense right so just get this clear to cannot fit a particular model which is being you which is like linear regression lasso ridge we cannot fit it to a directly changing the output to Uh, yes or no or one two and fit it right don't do don't confuse this this is very you need to be very clear on this knn yes knn can be used for classification and regression but that doesn't mean that a classification problem is being converted into a regression problem or vice versa if i find if i have a regression problem yes i can use uh, my neighbors see what their values is if it is a regression problem then i take an average if it is a classification problem then i take a majority voting okay but don't say that knn can be used for classification 
and it can be used of regression because if I change the class classes to one two, I can you know predict it. No class classes and regress uh, regression classes classification and regression are two completely different problems. A certain model can be used for both the problems, but those models processes are different. KNN's process is different for classification and regression. Okay, no confusion till now. If if it is okay, then we'll proceed. If it is not okay, I'll not proceed further because I, there will be a lot of models coming in now. I don't want to confuse you everything. So is this clear to everyone? I want a resounding yes here. Can, can you please uh, repeat one more time? Sorry. The whole thing? No, no, just this KNN uh, thing which you explained. Okay. So, okay. I'll ask you questions, you answer me so that it becomes very clear to you. Right now, what did we do using, we saw the code, right? In KNN, what did we do? What was the IRIS data set? The IRIS data set was basically your petal length, petal width, sepal length and sepal width, right? This was your data set. And using these numbers, you were trying to predict what, which flower it is. Got it? Correct. So which flower it means? There were three types of flowers. So what is this? This is a classification problem. Okay. So we saw that KNN can be used for a classification problem. Perfect. No problem at all. Yeah. Okay. No. Now I see. Uh, so one question, basically. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, Sunil, just let me complete okay. this. Otherwise, uh, uh, yeah, please. flow will please be. Yeah, let me complete this. So after you fit a KNN, now, can KNN be used for a regression problem? I say yes, it can be used for a regression problem. How it can be used? For example, here what we were seeing, what does KNN do? It finds out the distance, then sees who are the most closest to me, and then calculates an average. Uh, sorry, cal calculates the majority voting, and say five out of or three out of five are ducks, or three out of five is virginica. Okay, so I think my test will be Virginica. The same way, if my I am doing a regression problem, so each of the num each of the neighbors will have a different number. So 100, 150, 120, 125. I'll take the average of these five numbers and then get a result. So KNN can be used for regression and classification both. Does that clear a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Now, Sunil, you were asking something. Uh, I think so I got my answer. Uh, it means uh, if we use KNN in our previous example Boston data set, yeah, we will right. get the price direct. Uh, we will get right. the price directly. Yes. As you told, 100, 200, 200 we will get there. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So KNN can be used in the Boston data set. Prop. Perhaps you can do that as a homework. Use try to use KNN for a regression problem that is the Boston data set okay that can be your homework so this is okay now now forget all these things okay you have learned everything about modeling till now come to cross validation what were you doing in cross validation you are trying to calculate the best hyperparameter okay now hyperparameters are fed by the user so the model needs to take some decision based on something so that I can tell that this hyperparameter is the best. And that's why you were doing a cross validation to improve, I repeat, to improve the validation process. Okay. This has nothing to do with the model. You are trying to improve your validation process using cross validation. And thus, after that, you're telling that this is the best hyperparameter. Okay, so I think now it is clear. I want you guys to, you know, if you, you can uh, just make this decision box like I made, made it, make it on a rough and I, uh, I'll ask you guys tomorrow again some questions and I want uh, absolutely 100% uh, perfect answers tomorrow. How this box will look like, okay? So I, I may pick up 
uh, lasso and ask you what problem it solves. Okay, I may pick up KNN and I'll ask you what problem it solves. Okay, so just keep this ready tomorrow. I'll ask you questions on that. Okay, now let's go ahead. I'll keep the mute button, um, I mean, unmuted so that, you know, you can ask questions as an, as I think it's a little difficult, uh, you know, to write whatever you want to express. So I think I will, anything you want to ask, just ask on uh, and stop me and ask. Okay, don't wait to write. I think it's a little difficult. Just make sure that there's no background noise that comes so that it doesn't, you know, disturb the others. Okay. Now. What is logistic regression? Don't read all these things, okay? Don't go into what is entropy and all. Logistic regression is basically, now what we saw is linear regression was basically, you had a model y equal to a plus bx plus c, uh, b, b1 x1 plus b2 x2 plus something, something like that, okay? Y was a number. What if I want to have a linear model similarly but I want to predict a class. Okay, a valid question, right? I want to have a linear model with the parameters. I mean, I want to have a parametric approach. What if I want to predict a class? So, here comes logistic regression to your head. Logistic regression is basically a linear model, the same thing as a linear regression only thing it is trying to do is trying to predict a class and not a number. Logistic regression is ideally suited for predicting binary outcomes. Okay, binary outcome means one or two or false. Two or false, main female. But that's related I, to classification, right? No? Yeah, now classification can be multi class also. Okay, so you can have high, medium, low. Uh, you can have uh, 1 to 10 classes also. So classes can be any number of things as I explained. Okay. So logistic regression is more suited for binary outcomes, but that doesn't mean that it cannot predict the, a multi-class problem. Okay. Clear till now. Correct. Clear till yeah. now. Okay, okay. So, will the bank give a loan or not? Yes or no. Is the email spam or not? Yes or no. Is the transaction fraudulent? Yes or no. You like to my so you get this, right? You get, get the free. So, this last line is very important. If we code them the other way around, the coefficients will have the same magnitude but different signs, so it doesn't matter. So I could say, I mean, I give a data set to Sunil and say, uh, I want you to apply logistic regression. He says, okay, no problem. Uh, I want to, uh, the, what, is the, what is the outcome? I say, whether my credit, uh, you know, my transaction is fraudulent or not. So he says, okay, no problem. W whatever is fraudulent, I will say yes as one. And whatever is fraudulent, not fraudulent, also as zero. I'll give another uh, data set to Sharad and you know tell him the same problem. He says, okay, no problem. I'll tell you wh whatever fraudulent transaction. I mean, whatever is a not is not a fraudulent transaction. I'll say at one, and whatever is a fraudulent transaction, I'll say zero. Does that mean Sharad is wrong? No, right? He just coded in a different way. I mean, he just made yes as zero and no as one. Sunil said, I want to make yes as one, zero as no. It's perfectly all right, it, right? There's no particular thing, as I said, that there's no particular uh, order what we are looking for. It's just a uh, representation. So any representation can work. So we'll see how, uh, you know, how your science will change. Uh, we'll see that later. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, we have a six, 
we have 60 random customers from a city, we want to know what triggers them to buy a blood pressure machine. Buy equal to 1 means the person bought it and 0 means the person didn't buy it. Okay. You can as well as have 0 means the person bought it and 1 means the person didn't buy it. Okay. So it's up to you how, however you want to uh, code it. Age. We are trying, taking the age as a factor. We may feel age as a part to play it named and hence we will use it to examine since influence the buying decision. Now, linear regression, if I come to this, if I try to use linear regression, 0 or 1, is it a continuous value? No, right? I don't have values 0.5, I don't have values 0.2, I don't have values anything between 0.56666. There is no value for such things, right? So, even if I fit an equation, y equal to c0 plus c1 a, what will happen? We see here, you'll basically what you will have, there are certain ages below that people don't buy it and certain ages below, I mean above which people buy it. Now if you try to fit a linear regression, you see how the line comes? Does this line make any sense? No, right? Doesn't make any sense. No. It's a continuous line. You have there are just two possible outcomes. You have fit a line which goes from the middle. It's, it's absolutely crap, right? It doesn't make any sense. That's why I was saying you cannot use a linear regression to fight a classification problem. Now you understand why? Okay. Now, what if I can use uh, something like don't go into the function. See on the right. What if I can make this curve limited to 1 on the top and limited to 0 on the bottom and it can take some any value between 0 to 1. Okay. That is the y part. So based on x, our curve can take any value from 0 to 1, but it will be restricted up to 1 and, uh, you know, restricted to 0 at the bottom. So, as a mathematician, I would start thinking, okay, what are the functions that we can, you know, restrict that increases with x and goes to a maximum of 1 and decreases with x and goes to a minimum of 0. What can be a function that we can, you know, uh, try to make it. So mathematicians think a lot, right? So they came up with this sigmoid function. What it means is basically don't get too much confused why this function is used. This function, someone has done a lot of research, okay? Someone has done a lot of thinking on what can be a possible function which is continuous between 0 and 1, okay? And uh, it is restricted to 0, 1. So whatever, however high x becomes, it will still be 1. However low x becomes, so it will still be, uh, yeah. Just a second. It will still, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, depending on any value of x, it, it is restricted to between 0 and 1. Yeah, your question, please. Why are you calculating points, uh, point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3 for a 0, 1? Correct. Very good question. Whether the people buy it or not. Correct. Correct. Okay. correct. Very good question. I, uh, I, and I was expecting someone will should ask. And, and I, am, I feel glad someone has asked. So, what you essentially do in a classification problem is you set a threshold. Okay. Now, it may not be necessary that of, of you know, what, what we are trying to do is we are trying to find probabilities. So what is the probability of a person buying a blood blood pressure machine who has an age greater than 60? Okay. So this value between 0 and 1 is basically a probability. And we'll see how we get that. So it's basically a probability. Now, your probability will not always be between 0 and 1. It can take 0 0.5, 0 0.6, it can take 0.2, it can take 0.1, it can be anything, right? So what we are trying to model is a probability. Based on the probability, you, me, or cross-validation, or 
anyone who is an expert can tell what should be the threshold so anything greater than 0.2 should be yes and anything between point anything less than 0.2 should be no should it be like this or someone can say no i think anything greater than 0.4 is yes anything less than 0.4 is a no someone might say no no i think anything greater than 0.8 is is yes and anything less than 0.8 is no how do you find a solution to this here comes cross validation okay so we'll okay. go go yeah. into cross validation later uh, for logistic regression why how we i mean for uh, so after kna all the models that will be dealing with from now will for classification problem will give you probabilities okay it will not give you the actual yes or no so the default threshold that python has is 0.5 but that doesn't mean that 0.5 is the best threshold for every problem you need to cross validate to find that best threshold okay so we'll go into uh, sensitivity you go into specificity a lot of things are there in classification how to find the best threshold uh, we'll go that slowly Yes, yeah, sorry guys. I think there was a uh, disturbance in the connection. Can you guys hear me now? Okay. Just hold on for one minute, just a sec. Okay, uh, I'm connect reconnecting to a different modem. So just bear with me for a one minute. My my connection may go. Just bear with me for one minute. Yeah, I think we are back. Sorry for that. So uh, where were we? Uh, yeah. So what we were uh, doing is that. Uh, what i was studying is that uh, from now uh, all the models you may see are predicting probabilities and will not give you the exact result so depending on the cross validation depending on your expertise you have to find out the threshold okay we'll see how to find the threshold but that is uh, a problem of a later stage now let's try to understand more on the sigmoid function okay so i think uh, i already have uh, made you understand what this means so y equal to 1 divided by 1 plus e to the power minus c1 c not the c1x so this part This part was already there in your linear regression, right? We have changed, yeah. changed the structure of this so that y is between 0 to 1, nothing else. This part was already in there in linear regression. But now what we have done is we have changed the structure of the whole thing and then we have predicting y. So now, if that is the case, okay. Now, 
this is basically a background of what is logic function so logic function is basically now just forget whatever i have told you now uh, think of it as a simple math if anyone tells what is logic of x it is log of x upon 1 minus x okay what is sin x i mean it's kind of a maths formula w what is uh, sin square x plus cos square x is equal to 1 similarly what is the logit of x it is x log of x upon 1 minus x that is the function so logit is a function logit function of any parameter is basically log of p upon 1 minus p okay this is just a definition of logit function now remember everything now whatever i told so y equal to 1 divided by 1 plus e to the power minus c naught plus c1 x this is what I was seeing, okay, from the previous slides. I told you logit of p is equal to log of p upon minus p. If I apply logit of y, what will be logit of y? Logit of y will be log, log, log of y upon 1 minus y. So log of this upon 1 minus this. If you calculate that, logit of y is basically c0 plus c1x, right? So this is of the linear regression form. So what your model is basically, logistic regression model is basically, earlier you were having only y on the left hand side for a linear regression. X, the right side was the same. Now you have logit of y as a function of x. Any doubts till now? Yeah, I couldn't understand the last part uh, of log it. Okay. Log it. Uh, what was the model of the terms more. what was the model uh, used in uh, linear regression? Y equal to linear regression was y equal to a plus beta one is one. Yeah, B1. Correct. Okay, excellent. I am telling you that to keep y in bounds of 0 and 1, I need to somehow change y so that it becomes between 0 and 1. Okay? So, math, mathematical mathematicians have done a lot of research and said that if you take logit of y as a function of x, then your y will always be between 0 and 1. So, that's why instead of y i am just replacing logit of y so that my values become z between 0 and 1 i am restricting the values of y between 0 and 1 that's a function that i am introducing okay little better did you understand a little better i, I know it's a difficult concept to understand at first it's not very intuitive we also had some yeah. problems understanding why oh, mainly logit would be uh, used for restriction from 0 to 1 or some value. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yes? So yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Slowly, slowly you will get the hang of it, why, uh, why we are doing this. But I also agree that initially it is a little difficult to digest why we are suddenly doing this. And you could say why logic. So that's what logic is a function which is like S of the S form. And this S form is uh, you know uh, cannot be recreated by any other function uh, if you can find another function then that, that's great I mean you could as well you know do a research paper on that but uh, it uh, there doesn't ex there doesn't exist any right now that uh, which is also simple in, you know representation so Basically, this is the part where uh, you know the logistic regression comes into picture. Now, can can anyone say? Can we use logistic regression for uh, a regression problem per se? Yes, it's a yes. same continuous numbers. You're pretty. But uh, it's between only. But it's between only. Some points like correct. thresholds. Correct, correct. So it means you cannot use right. Regression problem is a continuous number which doesn't have any bounds. 
right? A regression problem should be a problem where I, as I increase x, my y should be increasing infinitely. If x is infinite and my relation between y and x is directly proportional, my y should also be infinite. It cannot be bounded. So a logistic regression cannot be used for a regression problem. Okay. Okay, now let's get into the uh, code part. Same data set iris based on the parameters of the petal and the sepal. I'm trying to predict which flower it is, right? Okay, so see from this, uh, from where the cursor begins, from sklearn.linear model import logistic regression. So sim, uh, this is calling of the function. EST is equal to logistic regression. We are storing the function here. EST.fit, you are fitting the function on X and Y. EST.score, what is score, I'll explain you and est dot coefficient est dot intercept okay so if i tell guys after this so basically get the coefficient i mean let's let's, let's keep this here okay now um here when did we did a scoring, this is basically calculating the training score because I've used X and Y both. Now, let's see if I do the same thing. Uh, okay, no problem. We'll do that later because I have not. Okay. So I think uh, we'll. Uh, uh, I have not introduced hyperparameters in logistic regression yet. So when I do introduce hyperparameters in logistic regression, we'll use, we'll see cross validation. But for now, you just remember this. I mean, just see this. EST is the score. So scoring is basically the training accuracy. I mean, X and Y you have predicted. You have used X to predict Y and you already had the real Ys and you're just trying to see the accuracy. Same as what we did here. Here we were seeing the accuracy here, but he, here you were seeing the cross validation accuracy. Here you are seeing just the accuracy. Okay. So whatever you have fitted, uh, you're trying to see whether how good. So 90, 96% times you are correct. Okay. And what is the coefficient and what is the intercept? So it's a linear regression problem. Um, Okay. So Okay, so we, yeah, tell me. So we stop that in my first zero here. Uh, so your voice, your voice is cracking. Just wait, your voice is cracking. Uh, just a second. Yeah, uh, see? No, I am not able to hear you. Your voice is cracking. Uh, can you write, write your question? Can you write your question?
yeah sigmoid was using 0 or 1 correct okay that's a good question uh, so how will it solve iris problem that's a very good question uh, sunil so now let's see how many flowers were there in uh, iris problem Can you write your answers uh, on the screen? Guys, can you hear me now? Yeah, you guys can hear me now? Okay, yeah, perfect. Yes, yeah, Sunil, ask your question now. So, that is my question. From the sigmoid or rigid function, we will able to, to predict 0 or 1. Means if that is below 5, 0.5, we'll say no. Above 0.5, it will be 1. But in iris, there is zero one two i mean three classes are there correct so that's uh, that's a very good question sunil so as i told you that uh, no. hello 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 Yeah, I'm sorry. I think there's some problem with the connection today. Anyways, uh, yeah, so that's a very good question, Sunil. So, I, as I told you that logistic regression can be used for two classes, for binary uh, classes, but I didn't say that it cannot be used for multiple classes. Okay, so when you're trying to predict, it's called a rest one versus all. So basically, when you're trying to predict a particular flower, you are keeping that as a single class and the other flowers, for example, if there are three flowers, okay, so when you are trying to predict for one flower, you are ignoring the two flowers. So, for example, this is yes and the other, any other flower is no, okay. So, understand that it is kind of doing a one versus rest problem, okay. So, in a binary, it was yes or no. But in uh, this thing, what you're trying to do, you are trying to predict a particular flower, let's say, or let's say if there is high, medium, low, you're trying to predict, when you're trying to predict high, then you're ignoring medium and low. Ignoring as in you're keeping them as uh, a different. Let's say high is yes, and medium low is being clubbed into no. Similarly, when you're predicting for medium, okay, but yeah. But you need to calculate high, low, medium first rate based on the data. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. So when you're calculating high, 
you're clubbing EDMM low for uh, as as in a different. So, for example, for a particular data, you're getting the high probability as 0.7. The rest is 0.3. So, what it what you'll say this is high. Then it will calculate for medium also. Medium probability, let's say it's 0.6 versus the other, which is 0.4. So medium is less than uh, high. And then, for example, in low, you're getting 0.8 versus uh, um, high and medium as 0.2. So ultimately, you get high as 0.7, medium as 0.6, low as 0.9. So you'll predict point low because low is the highest high probability these are not mutually additive uh, so you you saw a problem individually you first thought let's keep it keep it high and let's see what happens if i keep the others two in a single uh, this thing then you predicted for medium and then you predicted for low so for each data point you're trying to predict three different predictions and then you are getting the highest probably probability out of it so iris i just wanted to give you an example that uh, it can have be used for multi class but since um, uh, uh, sunil so asked the question right now uh, i explain but i was going to explain this a little later so the, when we go into decision trees uh, after that i was going to explain because that is a there's a difference between decision tree and logistic regression pertaining to this problem pertaining to this uh, classification uh, difference okay. just give me 2 minutes i'll be back uh, just give me 2 minutes yeah i'm back so let's say uh that's a so answering that sunil's question so let's let's see here you see okay uh, how many features does iris have remember how many features you had four four perfect and how many coefficients you have here 1 2 3 4 into 3 3 12 12 coefficients you have you see this 1 2 3 4 1 2 3 4 1 2 3 4 and then you have three coefficients as well so now you understand this what's your equation your equation basically becomes see this uh, it's very important here if you see your equation so the first y let's say the flower was i, I think it was a uh, virginica Virginica was the last. Anyways, Sentosa. It was Y Sentosa. Y Sentosa equal to beta one into uh, sorry x one into this plus x two into this plus x three into this and x four into this plus the C part 
the constant part is this right similarly for y virginica the x1 is this the x2 is this the x3 is this x4 is this and the coefficient is this similarly for the uh, versicolor x1 is this x2 is this x3 is this x4 is this i mean beta beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3 plus beta 4 x4 and the coefficient is this no so, no no but we have not given y0 y1 y2 means name we have not given anywhere no, no. this example so your y target when then you how? when you were seeing a y target okay so if you just uh, Yes, yeah. this is a list of all the flower, means three flowers in a random way, based yeah. on the x. Yeah, not random, based on the x. So you are, when you are trying to fit the model, your model very well understands. So it has automatically understood that zero is one flower, one is one flower, two is one flower. So basically, it is trying to predict. I mean, trying to find out what is the probability of having this flower zero okay so that that function is basically beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3 plus beta 4 x4 so it will calculate so it, what why which flower is zero basically that is my question so it is automatically done so what uh, for example your data had sentosa on the first uh, 10 then uh, virginica on the next 10 and sent uh, versicolor on the next 10 so automatically it uh, assigns zero to the first one, one to the first based on the data it receives. Okay. So if in, in your data, if your first okay. 10 rows is uh, Virginica, then it will assign zero to Virginica. If your first 10 rows is Sentosa, it will assign zero to Sentosa. So as and when the data comes, so Python is reading the data line by line, right? So it reads, reads the first line, it is uh, Virginica. He says, okay, Virginica let's assume let's code it this as zero okay then comes virginica okay we have i've already coded this as zero then comes virginica i've already coded it as zero then comes uh, suddenly comes sentosa oh uh, this uh, this is not virginica now i need to give a new code that is then it goes gives one okay like this it gives one to all the sentosa and then as soon as it sees versicolor it sees oh this is a new thing so i need to code it as two okay so like this it will so you see the data was in that order and that's why you are 0, 0, 0, then 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and then 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. That's how it is coded. Yeah, your question. I think you have some question. You, you have any questions, Sunil? No, sorry, I don't have. Okay. Okay. So everyone is clear? It might not be clear today. A uh, little, it's a little difficult to understand logistic regression. But is it, uh, let's say, seventy percent clear? A little bit clear. Okay. Yeah. We understood the concept. Okay. Okay. That's great. Sharad said it's not fully. Don't worry, we'll revisit this tomorrow again. Uh, uh, meanwhile, uh, what I'll do is introduce a little bit of decision trees concept. I'll not go into the actual depth of it, but since we uh, missed around two, three minutes due to the connection issues, we'll extend to 9.34 today. So we still have 15 minutes, uh, and uh, we'll see uh, a little bit of decision trees and so that uh, when you come you come tomorrow we can revisit decision trees and logistic regression uh, again okay so uh, in the beginning of the class today i had told you that uh, <coughs> sorry so i told you that uh, there are two approaches one is paramet parametric approach where you have a particular structure of the equation and the other is you have a non-parametric approach where you don't have any structure, you have a process. Okay. 
Now, decision tree is a very, very, very simple model to understand. It have it is like a human brain trying to take decisions. Okay, it's very simple model, very easy to understand. So just bear with me, and uh, we shall get this so very easily. Okay, now let's see. Okay, just make to make this as a little more interactive. In office or in your work life, how do you take decisions? For example, let's say if you uh, if you're your marketing manager and you want to take a decision whether to pro launch this, you have prepared a new product, and uh, or let's say you want to prepare a new product, you want you want to think whether you want to invest. Uh, 500 million dollars or let's say 200 million dollars or any number whether you want to invest in its uh, in its R&D or not how do you take a decision or let's say you are working in Excel today now okay. if you for example if you have a lot of data in Excel okay now you want to you go there everyone is aware of Excel filters how Excel filters work Yes or no? Okay, everyone is aware of okay Excel. I think um, everyone little bit knows. So basically, you want to see whether you want you want to launch this product or you want to make investments on this R&D or not. What do you do? You ask your subordinate, get me the data. How did we do last time uh, when we took a decision on like this? Maybe on a different product, but how? What were the steps that we followed? So your subordinate tells, "Oh, sir, what we did is we saw the previous data, and what we did last to last time, and based on some parameters, we took a decision." So he said, "Okay, bring me the file, bring me the launch product. I mean, bring me the post sales. Uh, I mean, post launch sales for the product that we launched." So he brings the brings you the file. You you see. First of all, you check. Uh, so for example, last time, or or let's say he brings you a lot of database, the whole database of your company of all the products in post launch, uh, which have been tracked post launch. So you, let's say you are going to launch a baby powder. First of all, what you see, you do a filter on baby powder. Whatever baby powders have been launched. Prior to this, uh, in your company, so let's say you get around six products on BP powder. Okay, now you want to see. This time I'm launching a product of let's say 200 rupees MRP. You do go to your Excel. You do a filter on what are the products between 150 to uh, let's say 250. You get Let's say three products. Then you see what was the size of uh, uh, what is the size of the, your product? Let's say it's 200 grams. Then you search based on uh, your uh, 200 grams. What are the products that was in your database that uh, was between the size of 150 grams to 250 grams? You get a single product. You pick that single product and see the scenario how it had performed and you think that this might be replicated for your product that is the closest you can get so how, what did you do you took a decision based on your previous x data based on some independent decisions made in an hierarchy first you saw what is the type of the product then you saw what is the price of the product then you saw what is the size of the product a particular hierarchy which 
at every step shortens your data because you are filtering on this on the on that basis it shortens the data set and ultimately you get a particular prediction or you get a particular data which you think it will be the best for your prediction so this is for how exactly decision trees work kind of a human into a human brain because humans cannot take a lot of decisions if you say give me uh, or let's say in a single step what, or tell me what is the post launch scenario of 200 grams baby powder which is being sold at 200 rupees you'll get confused right okay wait 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 let me process this slowly you want a powder first of all let's see what are the powders that have been launched in our company then what did you say price right price okay let's see what are the uh, price that we have launched between 150 to 350 and then what did you say size okay then see what is the size respectively so you have made a decision based on an hierarchy you didn't you didn't want to do it all together because you get confused that's how human brain acts don't take a lot of decisions together and then based on that keep on shortlisting or let's say how hr select uh, your candidates right how hr shortlists your candidates there are some companies might get you know for opening of two they might get a pool of let's say 5000 candidates applying for it how do you even shortlist that first shortlist how do you do let's i mean let's get rid of the candidates who don't uh, who don't have the skill set okay so first decision you make on a skill set yes it has then you come into the next round no it doesn't matter you just reject them okay then after the skill set then you see years of experience do they meet our criteria yes they do meet if they don't then you reject then after that experience then you see what is the previous salary withdrawn or what is the expected salary they want if it is too high then our highest benchmark you get rid of them if it is below the benchmark you take them into further competition and then you get let's say get down to a top 10 or top 15 candidates and then you do an interview that's how it happens similarly decision trees think of the same as the concept except for the fact now this is important except for the fact that you are trying to predict now okay so now you have you know divided your data based on some decisions now you want to predict so for example you know hr who has been doing this for let's say last 10 years you know this guy this some friend of yours which is your test data so your hr person has trained on let's say it has trained herself or himself for 10 years on a particular data now your friend comes to you which is a test data he says uh, hi Sharad, can you please refer me to this HR? Uh, I have I see an opening in your company. You know this HR, so what do you see? Oh, I know this girl, this guy or girl. What he'll do? He'll see first your skill set. Do you have the skill set? Okay, I think you have the skill set. What is the expected salary you are asking? I think uh, you are asking this much. Okay, uh, then it's below the threshold. Uh, then um, uh, you ask what is the years of experience? You say he says. Yeah, it's around um, five years, I think. And the uh, HR uh, knows that the requirement is uh, above three years. I think you can be selected. I mean, I, I am pretty 80% sure that you'll be selected, but it will depend on your final round. What did you do? You did your decisions on your test data based on the training set of the HR. I mean, you know the kind of model the HR follows. So on based on that, you predicted for your friend. Now, did you get this example? If you didn't get, then I'll go to a simpler example. Did you guys understand? Okay, Sunil, so uh, you got it. Uh, so, uh, Sharad Vasan, what about you? Anything? Did you understand this example? Okay, Basan got the point. Sharad got it. Great. That's 
exactly what I wanted for you guys to understand what decision tree is. And I think if you understand that, everything is very easy. For example, let's go to an example of what we learned uh, previously. Now, let's say you have your weather outlook, you have the temperature, you have the humidity, and then you want to predict whether children will come out to play or not. Okay? You start taking decisions. You see, you check what is the outlook, whether it is overcast, whether it is sunny. If it is overcast, then children definitely come out to play. If it is sunny, then you check what is the humidity, whether it is low, whether it is high. If it is high, then I'm pretty damn sure that no one comes out to play. If it is low, then I'm pretty damn sure that people come out to play. Got it? So, based on your past data, you have formed this decision. And now if any day we want to predict whether children will come out to play, what you need to check? You just need to check the outlook. You need to check this, whether it is sunny or not. And you want to check the humidity. And based on that, you can, anytime you can predict whether they will come out to play or not. Okay, does this make sense? Okay, so we'll not go into the codes today. I think it will be too much. But only thing, can anyone tell me what is the problem in this? I mean, I, I have not told you this and I, uh, I'll be super happy if you can tell this that, but then I'll not be sad if you don't, uh, if you can't answer this. What is the problem is in this? I mean, what is the essential, basic problem in this concept? Can anyone tell me? I'll just unmute you guys. I think you are unmuted. Uh, yeah, I think everyone can speak. Any guess? It's a difficult one, I understand. But any guess? You mean problem with the data or the no, problem? So not the data. Problem in the kind of decisions no. they have made. Decision. Okay, let me give an uh, let me help you here. Suppose you are managing a team of let's say five people. You give a particular same data set to five different people, and you want them to come up with insights. You'll be very surprised that five people might come with five different insights, or maybe. 10 different insights. Why is that so? I mean, you gave the same data, but then why do five people have five different insights? Why can't they have the same insight? You gave the same data. Hey, uh, they have different uh, perspectives. Uh, I was on mute, basically, so I was telling. So it seems problem is that the hierarchy, I mean, priority which we are setting. Perfect. As like over cast or sunny, first we have to take, then we Humidity, then Perfect. something else. Awesome. Perfect. And I think, uh, uh, was it Vasan uh, before Sunil? Uh, yeah, I was you know, on mute, so I was saying, but then I see you can't be checking on that anyway. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that reached my perspective, and uh, Vasan is saying the same. Perspective means for someone, humidity can be the first priority. Exactly. For someone, sunny can be the other exactly. priority. Exactly. Exactly. That is awesome. I think uh, that is. Uh, really appreciable that uh, you guys have tracked that. So, who told this model to check Outlook first? I mean, uh, for me, I think I don't care whether it is sunny or overcast. I'll first check humidity. Or for me, or for some other guy, it might be like 
um, I don't care whether it's humidity or not. He's in Calcutta. Every time it is humid, it doesn't really make sense for him to check the humidity or not. He just checks whether it's sunny or overcast. So that's basically the problem of decision tree. It uh, it takes decision based on a particular hierarchy on which it thinks. Thinks as in there's a scut particular metric to measure that how important is each of these variables so we'll go into that tomorrow but just think like this decision tree has a solution to this no? so someone who had built this he knew that this will be a problem right how to select this hierarchy the decision tree is does have the answer but it does not address it very effectively that's where the random forest model will come into picture. So tomorrow we will see decision tree in depth. We will see decision tree codes. We will see the little bit revised logistication and then we'll move on to random forest. Okay. Okay. It's great. Yeah. It's okay. great. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Let's catch up tomorrow again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night. Perfect. Yeah. Now, uh, tell uh, you had some question, right? Uh, pertaining to the last session, we can discuss that first. Yes. Sir. So, in that linear regression, are there only these uh, three algorithm: uh, linear regression, last and reach, or are there any others? Okay. Okay. I I think uh, and, I should address this problem first. Uh, let me see. Uh, I'll just show you one thing first. Okay, now you see uh, you see the screen. So if you see here, this is your linear regression. Then there is polynomial and regularization. Then logistic decision trees, random forest, bagging boosting. Forget bagging boosting. KNN, knife ways, SVM. Okay, K means, and uh, rest of it is okay. So these, each of these are models. Okay, these are different models. So, for example, as I have told you that when uh, that God function, we we are not able to figure out, right? So uh, how to go to that God function? We are trying different models to go to that God function. Now, when I introduce linear regression, linear regression is a single model. Okay. Now, uh, for example, you have a thing from the starting. Okay. So this all mo these models are basically maths and statistics, right? So, for example, you made a model. Now, I came up with this idea. Ki, uh, I think uh, if I add the regularization part, the accuracy will be better. Okay. Now, there's someone, some other person come comes and says that, okay. No, I think uh, if I add this type of regularization mathematically, he is a better guy in understanding mathematics. So he says, I think if you add this kind of regularization, that will be much better. So like this, we had some tweaks in linear regression. Linear regression is basically where your function is equal to y into a, y equal to a plus beta x plus beta 1 x 1 plus beta 2 x 2 plus beta 3 x 3. This is your linear regression. Now, how to get to this b, there are certain uh, ways okay so certain ways is you can reduce the rmsc or you can have rmsc and a regularization part so there are various ways where you can reduce the uh, rmsc but linear regression as such is a single model okay so for example we'll go into different models today and understand you know uh, what what other models what why do we have other models but uh, so, for example, there's something called elastic net. Okay, I'll just show you uh, elastic net uh, regression. Okay, 
Now just see this. show you the elastic motion see what we saw last time you if you see here bridge was when we had this and this okay lasso was when we had this and this but elastic net is something which combines all these together you have uh, they, uh, you have the regularization of a linear. Um, uh, I think there's some disturbance in the line. I'll just mute everyone. Okay. So elastic net is something which combines the regularization of both. Okay. So for example, you have a ridge uh, and a lasso together combined in a uh, elastic net. So now you won't say that elastic net is a third type of linear regression. It is not the third type of linear. Your basic equation, your basic equation of, uh, let me open the pen. I'll just write down your basic equation of y is equal to a plus beta 1 x1 plus dot 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 okay this always remain constant this is a linear regression model okay so whether i do a ridge whether do i do a lasso whether i do elastic net it doesn't bother i mean it doesn't bother this equation will always be remaining same this is a regression problem okay i mean this is a linear regression thing now how to achieve these beta one there are certain techniques so, for example, I can re directly reduce the RMSE or if I can, you know, combine to a regularization part and reduce the RMSE, that also can be done. But your linear regression is this form. Okay. So, I'll just unmute. Now, you can uh, ask whether you, I mean, tell me if it is clear or not. No, sure. This linear equation, uh, equation that's very clear to me. Yeah, yeah. My actually three models now. This same fourth model, I'm learning one linear plane linear, which is in SQL uh -huh. also and uh, reach now this elastic need. Uh -huh. Now I have four linear models. So, are there any other linear model or not? That is my first question. Okay, no, I so, saw uh, as far as the domains are concerned, uh, you can have a single regularization, double reg uh, square regularization, or a combined. So, these are the kind of three, three models that can uh, be used to derive the linear regression model. Okay. This is your answer to the first question. Now, what's your next question? Okay. So uh, on that day, we saw that there was something, uh, some X list was given, Y list was given, uh -huh. uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, and uh, 1, 3, 5, and 13. Then we replaced 11 or 13 by 200 to show us uh, outlier. Correct. So that is one part. Now we under, I understand the outlier. But we, while coming on this Boston data set, which has 13 fields. Yeah. One field, uh, when I was going some tutorial, it was showing that crime, rich, crime that was very accumulated at a particular pace. So they adjusted it using log methods, basically. Okay. And after that, uh, they went, yeah, they went to see how other 13 are related. Okay. Before 13, he was showing that, okay, how you go and see which fields are not affecting much so we can re remove that. As like, Rejo, sorry, last, so by default, remove some fields. Correct, correct. I remember. Correct, correct. So, it was showing manually one by one step that uh, now you have to go price versus every field one by one. Yeah, see so whether that is affecting much or not. If not, we remove that. In that way, it was going one by one. Then finally selected four or five fields. But for one field uh, ratio, it, it was accumulated. So it adjusted using the log methods. 
so and after that he draw mean meat and everything but still after that i found that the square mean variation that was around 28 29 so my question is was this end to end or is there any to to do because this is one of the example i want to understand end to end mm-hmm. okay i got it so i think that's a good question uh, on how you know uh, you, you have an end to end problem so th- that's what uh, what i would suggest is first let us go through the models you just have a flavor of the models when then when the project will come now will have everything end to end and because linear regression is not the end state right you have not just fit the linear regression it closes what we will do when we have the project work in i think uh, the last but not the least uh, week i mean second last week we have a project work where we have an end to end solution and where there will i will show you how you approach the problem because every Uh, data set if i go end to end then there will be a lot of time occupied and will not be able to see all the model so first let us understand each of the basics of the models and then when we do our project work we will see everything end to end how to approach how to remove the outliers how to you know see the data everything so i have what i have told you right now is that you have a data set this is only the third way right so if i tell everything all together that you need to find the correlation and then you find uh, fit the model and then you do this cause validation this 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 everything will get confused so i will touch everything whatever you have told me i have, it's good that you are doing your homework and you know coming up with very good questions that is good but uh, understand this thing because linear regression is not the end then there will be again this uh, end to end process is not complete then there will be another model then then we all other model so once we get into all the models then we because what you are trying to say is that uh, you know you are manually seeing each of the variable and uh, its uh, effect on this thing so when i go to decision trees and random forest i'll explain you tomorrow random forest will go into that so there is something called a baruta plot and it will easily give you the importance of this you don't have to go because you don't have to go manually into that because when you have 100 features or 1000 features or 1 lakh features it is not practically possible for you to go manually and see each of the uh, relation right and then again each of the relation does not mean that the uh, in, so for example uh, there this is your response variable okay and then there is something called x1 as a feature and then there is something called x2 as a feature so now you see how x1 and y is related okay now you see that this relation is very good then you test how y and x2 is related you see this relation is very bad but and then you remove this but that is not the correct way because your model is y is equal to x1 plus x2 this you have designed you have designed a linear model there the actual function may be x1 plus x2 into x1 and that's why when you just put x1 x2 and you do not consider x1 it becomes irrelevant but when you combine this factor with x1 it becomes highly important that also happens so that's why i have not completed an end to end thing in terms of a linear model okay yeah got it we'll th- come to that when we do that yeah i got it everything uh, according sure thanks a lot i will wait yeah yeah sure no problem okay anyone has any other question no okay then uh, we'll uh, start with today uh, today's session okay i'll put you guys on mute mute now so today what we will do is uh, uh we are going going to have a kn and v visit okay uh, and uh, also last time you was asking how to you know uh, achieve your um, uh, how to do your cross validation and achieve your hyperparameters and you achieve the best k out of the kn that also uh, we'll see today okay so uh, let's uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sunil, uh, we will do K neighbor today again. Okay, uh, don't worry. So uh, just our, you know, just to refresh the idea a little bit. Uh, what are the three prerequisites of ML? Basically, a pattern should exist. A data should have something behind, going on behind it. 
uh, it's not should it should not should it's not be a, should not be a random process i mean it should not be a completely random process if it is a completely random process then you cannot apply machine learning and find out the predictions it, or you or you could say your predictions will be very bad the mathematical model should be unknown if you already know the god's function you need not find the uh, you know you know need not uh, use machine learning to tune and there should be a lot of data sometimes the data part is left with constraint you uh, you will always not find a lot of data sometimes you have there are also techniques uh, you know how to you know add a lot a little more data or you know go how to go around uh, the cases where you don't have proper data okay so we'll see all that thing um, uh, eventually but uh, let's let's uh, start with the little bit of uh, revision of what we and so I, i'll not uh, repeat all these things okay so let's start with uh, nearest neighbor classification okay i'll open a notepad okay i mean uh, so okay. okay now if you uh, go to this part where we see here okay okay i'll use this on this pen uh, so if you remember what we uh, did last time is you have certain uh, okay now let me open the notepad first so for example your data is your data for example is weight of the bird okay then a number of legs okay and then uh, let's say feathers whether it has feathers or not feathers almost every i think i think we don't need this feathers everyone has let's say does it have a sharp beak beak is uh, sharp or not okay sharp or not sharp something like that these you have features and then what you have to do is you have a lot of data let's say you have 100 data points or let's say 1000 data points you have collected you know 10000 data points for different words and now what you have what are you trying to do is you want to someone is going to tell you all these features weight legs uh, whether it has beak and not and it can be anything right so um, you want to predict whether that is a chicken that is a you know it's a duck whether it's a swan i mean i don't know the difference between these uh, last one, let's say this is a chicken okay this is a duck this is a swan um, let's say this is a black duck a little different species of duck okay i'm just uh, terming it here and let's say this is a uh, uh, a baby chicken okay so now you are given the data you need to find out what is the uh, you know uh, let's say what is the uh, type of bird that your test uh, is okay now a very important uh, measure uh, i mean now let's say when you are trying to calculate the distance you, uh, you have to define a measure that you want to keep uh, you know as a distance measure for example if i want to measure how far is mumbai from pune i would say that is 500 km or sorry 150 km it is it is around 150 km this is only need to have a distance measure so similarly if i say how far is delhi from bombay it is around 1400 km okay so there is a distance so if i say are pune people more similar to mumbai or delhi people more similar to mumbai okay so based on the distance you could say i think uh, pune is more similar to mumbai uh, if you just consider because a lot of marathi people live in mumbai they travel to pune so if I, at a particular snapshot if i say how how people are how pune people are similar to mumbai so i would say a lot of mumbai people would have would be in pune so i would say because the distance is less there is high chance of people flocking to pune than to uh, delhi okay so based on this distance measure i would say i think pune since it is you know uh, 
geographically closer to Pune, I think Pune people are more similar to Mumbai people rather than uh, Delhi people. So this is some distance measure you um, know that it, it exists. Okay. Now there can be a distance measure also. For example, how many number of people, how many number of Marathis are there in uh, uh, let's say Bombay and the number of Marathis. Marathi is basically a kind of a regional language, a regional, uh, uh, you know, I mean, kind of how, what is the language that M Mumbai people speak. Okay. So if I say how, how, what are the number of Marathis in Mumbai? Does everyone understand this context? Because I mean, you who, uh, guys, I don't know the background. Uh, you have been living in US so many, uh, I mean, from your birth or I don't know. So everyone understands this context, Manatis and all. Right? Okay, I think everyone understands. That's good. So if I say, uh, give me the number of Marathis or the percentage of Marathis in Mumbai. Okay, so you say the percentage of Marathis in Mumbai is let's say 95%. The percentage of Marathis in Pune is let's say 70% um, and the percentage of Marathis in Delhi is let's say 20%. Now, on the base of this, also, you can have a distance measure. Okay, so what is the distance between a Pune and uh, uh, Delhi in terms of uh, the Marathi uh, people distance? It's around, let's say, 95 percent minus 25 percent, so it's around 75 percent. Or if you put in in maths, that's it. That's it, like 0.75, and put it in numbers, it's 0.75. Similarly, what is the distance between uh, Mumbai and Pune in terms of number of uh, Marathi, so uh, we said it's 0.95 minus 0.7, so that is 0.25. So if I add two features, let's say distance uh, in kilometers and uh, the number number of um, let's say uh, Marathis as a as in percentages. These are the two features and I want to say whether Mumbai is more similar to Pune or uh, uh, Delhi is similar to Mumbai. You get the essence, right? So what you try to do, you had features, you kind of, uh, I mean, formulated what is the distance between the features of each of these cities. And then you have say that since Mumbai is closer to Pune or Pune is closer to Mumbai, Pune people are more similar to Mumbai other than Delhi. So you can have any number of features like this. Okay. Let's yeah, just hold on for one minute. Uh, just hold on for one minute. I'll just be back. Okay, I'm back. You can hear me. You guys can hear me. Just give a Y or N. Okay, got it. So you get uh, basically get an essence of how your distance measure can uh, affect the decision, right? So it's all. It always doesn't have to be geographical. It can be in any terms. Now, let's say if you have something like this, if you have a binary outcome. So uh, let's say, um, is Mumbai metropolitan? Yes or no? And is uh, Pune metropolitan? Metropolitan is some uh, defined as uh, the number of people staying in a city. So if it is greater than some threshold, uh, let's say, I mean, I don't have any idea of how what is the threshold, but I think let's say put it, let's put it as five crores. The number of people uh, greater than five crores, it's a metropolitan. Uh, if it is less than five crores, then it is a non-metropolitan okay now if i see say is mumbai a metropolitan yes it is a metropolitan pune is a metropolitan no it is a, not a metropolitan and 
is delhi a metropolitan yes it is a metropolitan and then what is the distance measure you just have yes or no right you don't have any number to calculate your uh, distance so what how we do this is basically we um, you know assign one if it is matching and zero if it is not matching so for example if you say that if it if your mumbai is a metropolitan yes and delhi is a metropolitan yes then the distance between this is basically zero because it is matching okay so we uh, we i mean if it is matching we say the distance uh, between, i mean i would say the similarity is one and the distance is zero right because it is matching and the same uh, concept goes if it is between mumbai and pune so for example if mumbai is yes, mumbai is yes and pune is no then what is the distance between them it is one okay so always it will be one or zero it will not uh, you know be anything other than this you got get this right so if it is similar then the distance between them is zero i mean if it is same that is the only prob uh, only possibility you can have if uh, mumbai is a metropolitan and uh, delhi is a metropolitan it is yes and the, that's why their distance will be zero if both are not uh, one is metropolitan and one is not metropolitan then the distance between them is one now you would say uh, when you are saying the distance it is in kilometers when you are saying the number of uh, marathis this is in percentages right and then you are saying yes or no in terms of uh, uh, one or zero how i mean these are different numbers distance is in kilometers number of this is in uh, is is a ratio and then this one or zero is binary how can you add these distances very valid question right how can you add this uh, uh, distances so in knn the first and foremost thing to do is make your data unitless if you don't do that your data unitless knn will not make sense okay if if for the only time you can go around this is that if you know that all your features have the same unit for example if at all everything is in length centimeters then it is okay to do that but if you have some length in centimeters some length in meters something in percentages something in yes or no you have to make your data unitless how we make your data unitless we have already seen that pre last class right you can do a, a max apps uh, scaler you can do a min max scaler you can do a thresholding you can do also do a scaling uh, using uh, um, you know the x minus i mean using the z formula that i'll tell you today okay uh, so how to do your scaling using uh, z formula so you have to scale your data in uh, if you do a nearest neighbor calculation okay that is the first and for ev foremost thing you should remember when you do a nearest neighbor classification okay i think this is clear to everyone i will delete all the drawing put this here now after you calculate the distance this the distance now this is very important after you calculate your distance then comes a decision how many distances you should take into consideration should you take only the person who is nearest or should you take an accountability a, a greater number of people or a greater number of data into consideration and do a majority voting in terms of your fitting now always remember this get this into your mind always remember this whenever you are averaging out something in your model okay for example i mean because i am i am giving this example because it will help you to understand many models so always think like this whenever you are averaging out okay averaging out means you are not going particularly uh, on the basis of a single point you are averaging out you are seeing what other people also see into consideration right so whenever you are averaging out your decision or you are taking a major majority voting you are moving towards what can anyone tell you are moving towards what under fitting or over fitting 
write down the answer. Sunil says overfitting. Any other questions? Sharad says underfitting. Vasant under. Krishna Kumar. Under. Correct. So uh, Sunil, yeah, it is not overfitting. It is underfitting because you are considering as I told you. You don't want your decision to get varied by each of the different points. Huh? You are not. You should not be too much influenced by a single point. That's what we learn, right? When we did overfitting, we were kind of having a graph that is trying to fit every point. This is overfitted, right? But when I am taking a graph which is kind of averaging out everything near its uh, near where, wherever it is going, it's kind of a little more underfitted. Okay. So just remember this: when you are kind of taking a majority quote or taking out the average. You're kind of underfitting, moving towards underfitting. Okay, not underfitting. Um, bear that in mind. Okay, you're moving towards underfitting. And if you are trying to just be influenced by a single, so for example, if your data is like this, and you put a KNN with one nearest neighbor, okay, and you try to predict for let's say this part, what will be the answer to this? It'll always take this into consideration and you know have this value. If it is this, it will always take this value. If it is this, it will always take. So it will be very, you know, kind of trying to touch every point and not averaging out. However, in this case, it is kind of uh, you know uh, taking an average and going on its own way, a lot smoother. Okay. There, there's one thing I want to tell you guys. I think that's not in this slide, but uh, I think that's a little important. Uh, we need to tell you guys. So there are basically two approaches to you know model fitting. One is the parametric approach. Okay. Parametric. And the other is non. Non-parametric. What do you mean by parametric approach? A parametric model is a model where you have defined the structure of the model. So for in, in case, for example, in linear regression, you already had the structure of the model ready, right? You had y is equal to alpha plus beta one x one plus beta two x two. Okay, you had kind of had the structure ready. You just were trying to figuring out. You, know, you were trying to figure out the values of these, right? So you already know that you are going to trying to fit a line, but you just want to know which line is the best one. You guys can hear me, right? Uh, there was a little disturbance, I think. Okay. Okay, okay. So I'll just repeat again. I'll just repeat again. So there is something called a parametric approach, and there is something called a non-parametric approach. Okay. So parametric approach is wherein you have already decided the structure of the model. Okay. What Structure. What you mean by structure of the model? For example, when you are having fitting or trying to fit a linear regression, you already have y is equal to alpha plus beta one x one plus beta two x two. So you know that you are going to fit a line. You just don't know which line you is the best. You guys understand that? You have already know the structure of the equation in linear regression. You just need to find out what the values of these are. Okay, this is a called a parametric approach. Parametric approach, where you know the structure of your model. You just need to find the values of the coefficients. However, there's something called a non-parametric approach. A non-parametric 
okay a non parametric approach is basically where you don't have any equation okay so in k nearest neighbor what equation you have do you have any equation where you are putting your x and you are getting y there is no particular equation right what your model is trying to do is try, trying to get your axis then there is uh, distance measure calculation and then it is taking a uh, uh, voting or averaging out and then it is predicting for y okay so it's a process it's not an equation so understand it a non parametric approach is kind of a process that the model is following in order to predict a parametric approach is basically an equation that the model is finding the values of is this clear or should i repeat again I think I'll uh, just uh, open the forum for a questions. Uh, I'll unmute you guys. Any questions you have on this? Okay, everyone is clear. Can I get an answer, yes or no, uh, so that I can proceed? okay so this is very uh, kind of important to know what is parametric and non parametric so you will always may not get the equations a lot of models that we are going to learn right now is that you will not get equations out of it okay this is a process so when you kind of trying to predict there the model will follow the process and then predict it will not fit that x into uh, an equation and predict for y okay so understand this okay then i'll move on Okay. So you have understood this, right? Let's go on. So kind of nearest neighbor is what it is trying to do is it is taking a majority voting. So it is in in case it is a, a categorical variable like we discussed last time. If it is like yes, no, or a duck, swan. Uh, hen, chicken, something like that. What it'll do? It will take a majority vote. So, for example, if k equal to one, if I see, for example, if it is about colors here, so it will find who is my nearest neighbor. It is brown. It will predict for brown. But then it has overfitted. It is only seeing. It is very, you know, short sighted. It is just seeing brown. But when you see. If you tell, okay, now tell, uh, give me the top three people or top three colors who are closest to you. Okay, so it tells, okay, these are one brown and two green. So then I say, okay, then you you are doing a majority vote there basically. Okay, so it will say, yeah, okay, I understand now. So my output should be green. Okay, so it's kind of uh, you know makes sense to have a majority vote, but then again it doesn't make sense to you know. Have lot of majority vote. Okay, so for example, if I tell now in this case it is good because it is kind of making a little more sense. But uh, for example, if I say k equal to uh, you know uh, let's say k equal to how many data points? Assume there are at least 30 data points here. Now if I say k equal to 30 or k equal to 29, what will happen? You are always you are going to predict whichever data. Whichever color is more in your data set, you try always predict that. You get that? If you say, for example, there are 29 data points, I'm keeping k equal to odd. So if it is uh, because always k should be odd, uh, you know, to make uh, sense out of your majority vote, it can be, uh, you know, uh, it can be even if you want to, you know, take an average, mathematical average, where we are trying to predict a continuous variable. Okay. 
but if it is a, a class that you that you gonna predict then it is always advisable to uh, have k equal to an odd number okay because so that you don't end up in a tie uh, when you're trying to predict a majority vote so i guess this is uh, pretty clear for you guys um, now now if k is equal to 29 as i said if k is equal to the number of data points that you have in your data set what will happen you'll always predict whichever data i mean whichever color was more uh, in your data set for example if you had greater number of browns in your data set you are always going to predict brown irrespective of what you uh, choose and that's not a very good prediction right so that's why uh, understanding k is pretty much uh, the most important thing of nearest neighbor okay now we have already seen this okay so a voronoi diagram you don't have to be very you know uh, specific about this diagram just to make you a little more uh, understand uh, you know make make you understand a little more about how your nearest neighbor uh, is calculated so for example a voronoi diagram based on the distances it particularly creates a boundary so basically this is the boundary any point which falls in this boundary will be predicted uh, a value of this any point which follow falls into this boundary it will be a predicted a point of this because you have one nearest neighbor right so it will always be have uh, seeing one neighbor okay any point which falls here so for example if you want to predict what is the let's say i mean i don't know what they are predicting here but let's say you want to predict uh, whether it is a yes or no, whether it is a high, uh, whether it is a male or a female, right? So any anyone who has a um, scale, you see what I told. Every time your Vorona, even the Vorona diagram says, every time your dimension should be scaled. Okay, so they they have kind of I think used uh, max app scaler. You see everything is, uh, I I mean some one point is one and rest everything is one, or they could have used a min max scaler also. So uh, that's what. So if you land up in a data set, let's say someone his uh, scaled height is 0.2 and uh, scaled weight is let's say 0.4. So 0.2 and 0.4, you reach somewhere here. Then it, then you see what is the uh, uh, what is the output for this data. This data was your training data, right? This data you already have. So this was a probably a male or a female, whatever it is. So we'll always predict uh, that as a female. So everything that comes into this boundary will be predicted the same class as of what this had. Okay. You get these? Get, get this? Yes or no? Any questions? Okay, I think here it's uh, very easy. So now uh, I think we can. So KNN classifies are lazy learners. Keep this in mind. It's a very important uh, term. Lazy learners is basically, uh, you know, when you have a point wherein, uh, for example, the testing, I've already told you, since it's a parametric, a non-parametric approach, you don't have an equation ready. So it's kind of calculating all the distances. Whenever it sees a new point, it is calculating the distances, it is sorting, and then taking an averaging or majority voting, and then giving you an output. So it is a lazy learner because it always learns when the test data comes. It is not always ready with the uh, uh, equation or the structure okay it always learns as as per the data comes so this is not very uh, that's why it is not widely used it is whenever your data is very slow i mean it's very big it becomes very slow and that's why people don't you know prefer to use this model but again it might give you very good accuracy 
uh, when you have uh, you, when you have you know really cluttered data and uh, they are in, in, I mean concentrated in one part and that's where in uh, KNN can you know uh, be very helpful. Uh, so classifying unknown records are relatively expensive. That's what it's very very slow it calculates the distances. Distance calculation is difficult. I mean computationally expensive. Sorting is again computationally expensive. So it's a very you know it doesn't it's not very uh, scalable. I would say. Now let's look at the code that we have for today. Okay, now as per as uh, as per is your request, uh, today I have you know kind of uh, shown you uh, how your uh, this thing uh, cross validation uh, will look like. So uh, that's why uh, I put this today. Uh, so for example, I'll start from the beginning. Just follow me here. From scalearn scalearn dot neighbors import k neighbors classifier basically the sklearn dot neighbors is a uh, package like what we just have a revisit uh, on uh, how, where, how we were doing last time from sklearn dot metrics uh, sklearn uh, dot data sets sklearn directly has a linear model so you didn't need not address anything inside it but uh, k neighbors classifier is some in, in a subset so from sklearn learn dot neighbors import key neighbors classifier from sklearn dot model selection import cross val score okay now i'll uh, as we go we'll understand this so just uh, let's say you have this uh, estimator so i what i am using the iris data set i'll show you what the iris data set is First of all, load the iris data set. From sklearn.datasets import load iris. Import pandaset pd. Do these steps, write these steps if you are writing. And then just uh, do a print x here. So this data set is basically of, uh, I'll just, uh, you know, open this. Let me find the description. So basically, uh, there are some uh, dimensions of the leaves, uh, uh, sorry, the flowers, and based on the sepal length and sepal width and the petal length and the petal width we are trying to classify whether it is an iris uh, I mean whether it is a setosa whether <coughs> it is versicular and whether it is virginica so just uh, let's see what setosa and versicular are setosa the setosa is kind of uh, this flower okay if you see virginica This this flower and a versicolor. Oops, it's not versicolor. Anyways, so kind of you know based on the sepal, I'll also tell you what is sepal definition. So each of the parts of the calyx of a flower enclosing the petals and typically green and leaf-like. So it's kind of a um, characteristic of a flower 
and petal you guys know so based on the sepal and petal width and length i am kind of trying to predict with that whether that uh, uh, you know that flower is a setosa versicolor or a virginica okay uh, you guys understand this right so this is basically the iris data set so So, uh, for example, these are the dimensions: uh, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width. Now, remember, all these are uh, are lengths and are in centimeters, right? So, I need not do scaling, as I told you, uh, for this data set particularly. Now, what I've tried to do, I've uh, taken k neighbors, classify is equal to n neighbors equal to three, and estimator dot fit. I'm fitting the Data in X and Y. Uh, X was what I did. X is iris dot data and Y is iris dot target. Okay. So the same thing that we did in last class, right? Uh, we took the X out of uh, that the data separately and Y uh, separately, and then we fit the model. Similarly, here we fit the model, and then we predict. Uh, so let's see what the prediction comes. I'm just commenting out these lines. So uh, the classes have been labeled as one, two, three. So, particular virginica and uh, uh, that those uh, are one, two, three respectively. So, you fit the model, and then if you try to predict what is the flower for two, three, four, five. I mean, if your petal uh, sepal length is two, sepal width is three, petal length is four, petal width is five. Uh, the prediction is two. It means it is. Versicular. Okay, so this is how it is. It, it works. Now comes the interesting part. How do you find the appropriate k? Okay, so Let's put all uh, let's see how your you know uh, uh, cross validation scores will vary with the different odd numbers. Now you can take this uh, to any, you can use your sequence function and start with one, uh, give your endpoint as uh, let's say 1000 or 1001 and increment those as two. I'm keeping this short because otherwise the model will take a lot of time to execute. Okay. I mean, even this will time take a little more time. So I'll just keep uh, to 17. Okay. Now this is a list that you're going to store your each of the CV scores, cross validation scores. Okay. Now you start a loop, as I think uh, last time someone told that how do we test the hyperparameters, which is the best. You start a loop for k in neighbors, I mean, for each of the numbers, knn, you say uh, you are saving the model into knn, and this is k neighbors classifier, n neighbors equal to k, scores is equal to cross val score. Knn dot comma x comma y. Knn is the model that you have saved. X is the data. Y is the data target. Cross validation. How many cross validations? K, how many folds you require? If you remember what was k fold in last time, so fold number of folds I require as ten, and scoring is the accuracy metric. We'll come to this later. So can anyone tell me how many elements of scores we'll get here? Write down the answer. 
how many scores will get will we will it be a one score or will it be a 10 score will it be five scores how many scores will get here Okay, so Neil is asking me to repeat the cross validation. Uh, okay, uh, I'll do that. First, can we, can the others answers answer how many scores we'll get? If you don't know, just write don't know, but give me an answer at least. Okay, so I think we should. Uh, Vasan says you're not sure, but it might be five. Okay, so I think we should uh, uh, revisit the key fold uh, a little bit more. It's perfectly understood that uh, uh, you might uh, forget. But Okay, now uh, K fold is basically cross validation. Now, do you remember? Do you guys remember what was cross validation? So, cross validation uh, is basically that you are dividing your data sets into certain parts. You are using some parts to train your model and then using the rest of the part to test the model. Okay, now there's one, there's one concept that you could have, you have this data. Just divide this into 80 20 ratio, train your model on this, test on this, and let's get over with it. Okay? Why to do so many things for a single data? So, I told you, right? I think uh, some guy, uh, some of you, I think, um, answered this question very well that uh, how, why you should not just see a particular, I think it was Krishna, I, as far as I remember, why you should not see just a single part because your data could be sorted. So, so in case of sorted, you would see certain data points and uh, maybe it is sorted based on the number of, uh, based on the number of, uh, I mean, based on a feature, on the based of ascending order of a feature. So you might see test all of your data on the highest value or the lowest value based on the previous value you've seen. Okay, so you don't want that, right? You want the model to see almost every part of your data. So, that's why you do a cross valid k fold cross validation. You use your train, uh, you first divide it, divide it into 80 20. Okay, you use your, um, you know, uh, training. Uh, the, uh, you use training to train your model on the 80 part and test on the 20 part. Then you change your parts. Okay, you still have the same ratio of 80 20, but you just shuffle. Okay, you use this part and that part and test on that part. Then you use this part, this part, test on this part. Similarly, so in a 5, k equal to 5, what will be the ratio of uh, uh, data splitting? It will be 80, 20, right? 4 out of 5 will be used in training and 1 out of 5 will be in testing. If it is k equal to 10, then basically you are using 90% for training and 10% in testing. So k minus 1 divided by k will be used for training and 1 divided by k will be used for testing. This is clear, right? So, when I do a k-fold cross validation, there will be k number of scores. So, this will, uh, I'll just uh, open this. This will throw up a score, 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 and this will throw up a score. You take the average of it and then display what is the average score for your particular model. So, for example, now don't get confused in k of k nn and k of k uh, k fold cross validation. Don't get confused in that. Okay. So, for example, for a particular k equal to one in k nearest number wala k, you are kind of trying to figure out what is the average score. Okay. Then for k equal to three, you are trying to figure out what is the average score. Then k equal to, okay, let's say number of neighbors, okay, n, let's keep it as n, okay. Then n equal to 5, you are saying what is the score, but your k is always 5, huh? don't get confused. So, for each of 
your n this process is being followed for n equal to 1 let me delete this n equal to 1 you are following coming here you are cross validating and then you are throwing up a score which is the representative score for n equal to 1 similarly then you have n equal to 3 you are running this process you are coming out with an average score that is the representative score for n equal to 3 like this you have your array right now understood is this a good revision okay so if you know this then let's try to figure out what we are trying to do now you see i have told my neighbors can be 1 3 5 7 9 11 13 15 17 right since i am doing a majority voting i need to have odd numbers okay now after you have n neighbors you want to put cv scores as a list okay we'll see why we want to put that as a list for k in neighbors for k in this array knn is the model where you are storing for this uh, storing this model for k equal to 1 first and then you are calculating scores this is a cross validation score for this model on this and x and y you have k equal to 10 folds and then you are using accuracy metrics for two score now can you tell me how many scores will this this have Can I get an answer? How many scores will this have? Shara thinks it's just one. Uh, that's wrong. Other answers? Come on guys, give me an answer. It can be wrong. Avasan thinks it, it's five. Sunil should, uh, says it should be 10. Absolutely. Great, Sunil. You are going to have 10 scores. Why? I told you, right? The number of CVs, the number of folds you have in your data, that will be the number of scores you will get. Like here, you, I showed you, right? You get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 because k equal to 5. If you have k equal to 10, then there will be another split, another split like this. You will have 10 scores. Okay. So your scores, the score variable, the scores variable will have the score of this, the score of this, the score of this, the score of this, like this, it will have 10 scores, okay? Accuracy, don't think of what is accuracy, I'll, I will discuss that later. But it will have, okay, Vasan says, how do you assign CVS 10? As I told you, CV is something which we want to assign depending on the uh, uh, computational uh, power that our machine has. Okay, it can be five, it can be eight, it can be ten. We uh, we discussed that last time, right? It can be anything. It's depending on how much you want to, you know, divide the data. Because you see, if you have, I have just used so many numbers, right? One to seventeen. You could have used one to thousand also, right? Now for each of this thousand, you are trying to take 10 iterations okay so it becomes very computationally expensive uh, to you know uh, do so many things so it is you can have 5 or you can have 10 it's up to the user or uh, whatever he wants to I, I can put it as 5 here okay that, that's not a problem if I put it as 5 I'll have 5 scores but this is something which the user picks it's not anything dull it does not relate it is not related to the model don't get confused in modeling and validation validation is something to test your model now how to improve that validation you are using k for cross validation you're not improving the model by using uh, valid uh, you're not you improving the model using cv okay you're just improving your validation process using cv the test to train ratio data will uh, change correct perfect krishna so as I told, your test now it will be 90% training and 10% testing. K minus 1 divided by K is used for training. So if your K is 10, then 10 minus 1 divided by 10, 9, 9 by 10, that's 90%. We can test with any number of folds. 
yes you can test with any number of folds you can use but it is usually uh, preferred uh, you know uh, to take five um, usually but you can have any number of folds that is up to the user and krishna yeah i was just uh, uh, sorry i got uh, deflected from the question so you are saying um, uh, the ratio will change yes absolutely the ratio will change it will be 90% for training k minus 1 divided by k that is 0.9 means 90% and k 1 by k is 1 by 10 that is 10% for uh, you know testing so overall training plus testing should be your data so this course will have 10 scores now i need to so cv dot scores is basically the list uh, that you are storing for each of the number of neighbors. So, for example, you are running a loop for k in neighbors. So, the first loop is for k equal to 1. You validate it. You have 10 scores. You take the average, scores dot mean. You take the average and then you append it to the list. Okay. Then for k equal to 3, you do the same thing. Append it to the list. Now, k equal to 5 sorry n equal to 5 you do the same thing append it to the list now can someone tell me how many scores we will have here i want a right answer how many scores will have just think 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 it through how many scores we will have in cv scores nine is it one two three four five six seven eight nine perfect so number of neighbors you are using number of correct the number of entries in neighbors that's perfect so you have CV, nine number of CV scores. You see, now, now see how your model uh, behaves. Very interesting. K equal to one, you're overfitting. Don't use that. K equal to three, you're going better. K equal to three, you're going better. K equal to five, almost same. K equal to seven, better, much better. I think it's it's still not the best k equal to 9 somewhat dips k equal to 11 great 98 percent k equal to 13 i mean i missed some numbers i guess so this is 13 uh, k equal to 15 it dips k equal to 17 it dips so whatever or which is the best your k equal to 13 is the best right so initially you, you were overfitting and then you fit the best and then you started underfitting you get this see how your uh, for uh, your uh, this thing is so you need not have so if you have thousand scores you need not you know see that manually you just need to have argmax argmax is a function it will return the value whichever it will return the uh, i mean you can just do max not even argmax uh, if you do the max, then you will come to do come to know the score. If you do know the arg max, then you will come to know which address that max score is available, and accordingly you can uh, uh, you know find out the score. Okay, so uh, Sunil, I, I'll explain this uh, how to find out the arg max. Uh, let's take a break uh, of like two three minutes. Just go through this code again. Always do we need to select the max score? Yes, of course, you need to select the max score because you are trying to see for which k you are getting the maximum score. Okay. So it always you're trying to find the maximum score. Because you have, but how do we know which k is good? That's how you know, right? You find out the score and then you see which address, for example, if I do an argmax here, so 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, okay, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, what is the number? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 8, 6, 7, 8, 9, 7. So 7th is the element, right? So again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 7th is the element. So if you do an argmax here, you'll get uh, 6 as the number and accordingly if you print neighbors bracket 6 
Sunil, uh, X can be anything I understand. I mean, um, sorry, X, uh, your N here, neighbors can be anything, but it's not that if you have, um, let's say, 1,000 points, you want to take 1,000 neighbors, right? So that's what I'm saying. You can run a loop from 1 to 1,000 and take an arg max of that. You, so you cannot have infinite K, right? That is not practically possible for you and the machine to, you know, find out the best K universally. You have to give the computer a range that find me the best K within this range. Don't ask the computer to find the universal K. It will not be able to find. There are certain limitations you have to understand that exist in computation, right? You cannot tell, you know, the computer can do, but it will take years to find out. If you want to put K one to one lakh or one million or whatever you want to do that. It doesn't make sense even to put so many neighbors, but your you have to give a valid range. Normally, uh, it is seen that a k equal to let let's say till 25 to 30 is good. After that, it's totally underfitting. Okay, so that's why machine learning is not just science; it's an art. You have to know certain experiences you have to get uh, to understand what is the average k that people use. Normally, K always varies between 5 to 10, uh, 11, something around 15, but not more than that. You cannot put a K of 20, 36 or, I mean, uh, not, not 36, K equal to 100 or K equal to 200. It will not make sense. You are very, you are badly underfitting the model. Okay. So, normally K is between 1 to 30 and based on that, it will, you will find the number of, uh, I mean, you will find, you can find the best out of that okay now let's take a break of three minutes uh, get this into the get this into your uh, I mean very get this very clear because the cross validation will be using a lot of number of times and it's just a single hyperparameter now there will be models where there are large number of hyperparameters so just get this thing into your heads very strong okay and so that uh, you know Later, when we have a large number of hyperparameters, it is easier for you guys to understand. Okay, let's meet in three minutes.
Okay, I'm back. So, any questions? Any doubts? I'll just put everyone on unmute. And um, any anyone wants to discuss anything? Uh, hey, could you go up and show us what is X and Y? Uh, sorry, didn't get you what? Okay, I am on in twenty eight. Which is here, okay. Uh -huh. uh, okay, I equal to I this dot data, and how we are getting this? Uh, where is this thing actually? I am not okay. This one, this one, yes, basically load Irish. So, load Irish five lines, which will be load Irish that will give you error that there is no X and Y. No, x is equal to iris dot data and y y equal to iris dot target. You have to put. Did you put that? Yeah, yeah. No, these five lines are not there oh, no. on the screen at the uh, time. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I went through. Uh, so just don't uh, run the code now. Just understand the code yeah. because the code will anyways be given to you. But uh, yeah, so yeah. If, if you have any doubt on this, yeah, that's good. That you have just. I I showed this uh, for a brief. Point of time, and that's why. Okay, no problem. So, uh, timing. Could you repeat one one more second? What each cross validation score means after running means what does this mean basically a score? Okay. So, scoring means accuracy. It means uh, when you're oh, accuracy. Okay. Yeah. Correct. When you're testing it. So, for example, here we are doing a classification problem, right? So we are trying to t uh, predict whether which flower it falls into. I mean, which 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 is the flower? It is a versicolor. It is it a centosa? It is a is it a uh, virginica? Three color flowers are there. Right? So, for example, twenty percent. Uh, when you are trying to test here, if you see my screen, when you are trying to test here, so let's say there are twenty data points here, right? Out of 20, 18 you got correct, and two you got wrong. So what's your accuracy? 90 percent. Right? Okay, we got it. Similarly, you got yes. it. Uh, eight, again, you have 20. You got 15 of them right, five of them wrong. What's your accuracy? 75 percent. Here you got 17 right, three wrong. What's your accuracy? 85 percent. So when you do a average, you're just taking the average of these percentages. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. No problem. I'll ask a question now. Uh, what was the scoring in uh, linear regression? Anyone can answer. What's yeah, the number of tests that we need to perform? No, no, no. What was the scoring? What were we trying to minimize? What was the scoring in linear regression? What were we trying to minimize uh, and find out the best parameters? RMSE, right? We talked so much about RMSE. RMSE, we were trying to minimize RMSE, right? What? Okay. If you see here on the top, what were we doing last time? What was this? RMSE, right? Root means square. We were trying to minimize RMSE. Whichever RMSE we are getting the least, see? This is the RMSE for. A particular set of we didn't uh, do which one I mean we didn't do a k fold cross validation there but uh, that's that was what our objective was right using regularization can we decrease the RMSE okay so remember this write write this down again whenever you are doing a regression problem whenever you are doing a regression problem regression meaning you are trying to predict a continuous variable or a number 
in, uh, in a very simple term you are trying to reduce your rmsc okay if you are trying to uh, predict for uh, a classification problem you are trying to mini uh, maximize the accuracy okay get this very clear because everything will rotate around this rmsc is a metric that is being used to minimize to be minimized for a continuous number problem accuracy is a matrix that is used to be that is going to be used to maximize for a classification problem okay so when for example in k nearest neighbor here we are trying to predict what the flowers flowers are classes so we are using accuracy let's say if we were predicting income then the scoring would have been in case of accuracy would we would write rmsc and then each of these scores that we are seeing it will this not this will not be in percentages it will be in terms of rmscs okay get this thing very clear okay if this is clear are we ready to move on to the next model okay then let's go so we have all seen this now let's we'll do decision trees a little later let's see uh, what is logistic regression okay now let's see this i i'll put you guys on on mute and as i keep on asking the questions i want some answers okay uh now what were we trying to predict using a linear regression was it a classification or was it a regression 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 perfect a continuous number right so we were trying to predict a continuous number now what we did what we used uh, to predict for kn i mean what can we use to predict kn can we use regression can we use classification or we can use both classification that's what we used i am asking what we can use we can use not what we used can KNN predict regression and classification both, or just one of them single? Not sure. Okay. I think only KNN classification. No. Guys, I just said that KNN can be used for RMSCs. So what I meant is RMSC is for a regression part, right? when i i said that when yeah. you kind trying to predict a continuous number when you're trying to predict a classification you take majority voting when you're trying to predict for uh, uh, continuous number then you're taking the average i said that right all these things so i mean i think uh, let's draw a very uh, overview uh, tree structure and then i think it will be a little more clear to uh, you guys let's draw one picture here let's see first decision okay first decision box whether it is a regression problem or versus a classification problem what is a reg regression problem i want answers from you what is a regression problem when there is a 
continuous number we have to correct. predict. Correct, perfect. This is a continuous number. Okay. What is the classification problem? When there is some problem, we have to classify in different yes. category basically. Correct. We have to have to classify in different types. Okay. So yes, no, or a number. Okay. Now, this is your type of data or type of problem. Let's say not data, type of problem. The next decision is what model you want to fit. Okay, so model. If it is a regression problem, till now, whatever we have seen, what models we can fit for linear uh, regression? I mean, what can, models we can fit for regression till now, whatever we have seen? A linear regression, right? A lasso regression, right? And a ridge regression, right? You guys get it? Yes. Correct. And also we see saw KNN today. So KNN. KNN can also be used for a regression problem. The next box is what is the scoring? So what the scoring in case of a regression problem is always what? Give me answers. What is the scoring in terms of a regression problem? RMS, RMC. Perfect, perfect. Okay, this is your scoring mechanism, uh, scoring for RMSE. So regression is over. Okay, on the left side was regression. Now let's go to classification. What is the type of models that we can fit for classification till now? What we have seen? KNN. Perfect, KNN. Can linear regression be used? Yes or no? Can linear regression be used for classification? Yeah, should be. How do you say yeah. that? If we change the category number 1 to 3, 4 and put on a regression side. No, it will not do. That's what I'm saying. You okay. see, I think you should try to understand this first. A classification problem is not a one, two, three, four. I mean, there is, it doesn't, uh, I can denote it as yes, no, good, bad. It, it can be true, false, maybe can't. So anything can be. It is not one, two, three, four. Regression problem is always for numbers, continuous numbers, which makes sense. One, two, three, four means four is four times than one. Three is three times than one. Four is two times than two. Actual numbers. If I replace male, female to one and two, does it mean female is twice of male? Not right. There's nothing. Okay. You can represent it with anything. It can be one, two, three. It can be 100, 200, 300, anything. But does that mean these are actual numbers? Not, not right. Yes or no cannot be actual numbers. So you cannot fit a linear regression problem to a classification problem. It's not just replacing the Y with uh, one, two, three. It has, it has to make sense, right? So just get this clear. To cannot fit a particular model which is being you, which is like linear regression, lasso, ridge. You cannot fit it to a directly changing the output to a yes or no or one two and fit it, right? Don't do, don't confuse this. This is very, you need to be very clear on this. KNN, yes, KNN can be used for classification and regression. But that doesn't mean that a classification problem is being converted into a regression problem or vice versa. If I find, if I have a regression problem, yes, I can use uh, my neighbors, see what their values is. If it is a regression problem, then I take an average. If it is a classification problem, then I take a majority voting, okay? But don't say that KNN can be used for classification 
and it can be used of regression because if I change the class classes to one two, I can you know predict it. No class classes and regress uh, regression classes classification and regression are two completely different problems. A certain model can be used for both the problems, but those models processes are different. KNN's process is different for classification and regression. Okay, no confusion till now. If if it is okay, then we'll proceed. If it is not okay, I'll not proceed further because I, there will be a lot of models coming in now. I don't want to confuse you everything. So is this clear to everyone? I want a resounding yes here. Can, can you please uh, repeat one more time? Sorry. The whole thing? No, no, just this KNN uh, thing which you are explaining. Okay. So, wow. okay. I'll ask you questions, you answer me so that it becomes very clear to you. Right now, what did we do using, we saw the quote, right, in KNN. What did we do? What was the IRIS data set? The IRIS data set was basically your petal length, petal width, sepal length and sepal width, right? This was your data set. And using these numbers, you were trying to predict what, which flower it is. Got it? Correct. So which flower it means? There were three types of flowers. So what is this? This is a classification problem. Okay. So we saw that KNN can be used for a classification problem. Perfect. No problem at all. Yeah. Okay. No. Now I see. Uh, so one question basically. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, Sunil, just let me complete okay. this. Otherwise, uh, uh, yeah, please. The flow will please be. Ahead. Yeah, let me complete this. So after you fit a KNN, now, can KNN be used for a regression problem? I say yes, it can be used for a regression problem. How it can be used? For example, here what we were seeing, what does KNN do? It finds out the distance, then sees who are the most closest to me, and then calculates an average. Uh, sorry, cal calculates the majority voting, and say five out of or three out of five are ducks, or three out of five is virginica. Okay, so I think my test will be Virginica. The same way, if my I'm doing a regression problem, so each of the num each of the neighbors will have a different number. So 100, 150, 120, 125. I'll take the average of these five numbers and then get a result. So KNN can be used for regression and classification both. Does that clear a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Now, Sunil, you are asking something. Uh, I think so I got my answer. Uh, it means uh, if we use KNN in our previous example, Boston data set, yeah, we will right. get the price direct. Uh, we will get right. the price directly. Yes. As you told, 100, 200 credit will get there. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So KNN can be used in the Boston data set. Perhaps you can do that as a homework. Use try to use KNN for a regression problem that is the Boston data set okay that can be your homework so this is okay now now forget all these things okay you have learned everything about modeling till now come to cross validation what were you doing in cross validation you are trying to calculate the best hyperparameter okay now hyperparameters are fed by the user so the model needs to take some decision based on something so that I can tell that this hyperparameter is the best. And that's why you were doing a cross validation to improve, I repeat, to improve the validation process. Okay. This has nothing to do with the model. You are trying to improve your validation process using cross validation. And thus, after that, you're telling that this is the best hyperparameter. Okay, so I think now it is clear. I want you guys to, you know, if you, you can uh, just make this decision box like I made, made it, make it on a rough and I, uh, I'll ask you guys tomorrow again some questions and I want uh, absolutely 100% uh, perfect answers tomorrow. How this box will look like, okay? So I, I may pick up 
uh, lasso and ask you what problem it solves. Okay, I may pick up KNN and I'll ask you what problem it solves. Okay, so just keep this ready tomorrow. I'll ask you questions on that. Okay, now let's go ahead. I'll keep the mute button, uh, I mean, unmuted so that, you know, you can ask questions as an, as I think it's a little difficult, uh, you know, to write whatever you want to express. So I think I will, anything you want to ask, just ask on uh, and stop me and ask. Okay, don't wait to write. I think it's a little difficult. Just make sure that there's no background noise that comes so that it doesn't, you know, disturb the others. Okay. Now. What is logistic regression? Don't read all these things, okay? Don't go into what is entropy and all. Logistic regression is basically now what we saw is linear regression was basically you had a model y equal to a plus bx plus c uh, b b1 x1 plus b2 x2 plus something something like that, okay? Y was a number. What if I want to have a linear model similarly? but I want to predict a class. Okay, a valid question, right? I want to have a linear model with the parameters. I mean, I want to have a parametric approach. What if I want to predict a class? So here comes logistic regression to your head. Logistic regression is basically a linear model, the same thing as a linear regression only thing it is trying to do is trying to predict a class and not a number. Logistic regression is ideally suited for predicting binary outcomes. Okay, binary outcome means one or two or false. Two or false, main female. But that's related I, to classification, right? No? Yeah, so classification can be multi class also. Okay, so you can have high, medium, low. Uh, you can have uh, 1 to 10 classes also. So classes can be any number of things as I explained. Okay. So logistic regression is more suited for binary outcomes, but that doesn't mean that it cannot predict a, a multi-class problem. Okay. Clear till now. Correct. Clear till yeah. now. Okay, okay. So, will the bank give a loan or not? Yes or no. Is the email spam or not? Yes or no. Is the transaction fraudulent? Yes or no. Will I clear my? So you get the essence, right? You get, get the flavor. So, this last line is very important. If we code them the other way around, the coefficients will have the same magnitude but different signs, so it doesn't matter. So I could say, I mean, I give a data set to Sunil and say, uh, I want you to apply logistic regression. He says, okay, no problem. Uh, I want to, uh, the, what, are the, what is the outcome? And I say, whether my credit, uh, you know, my transaction is fraudulent or not. So he says, okay, no problem. Whatever is fraudulent, I'll say yes as one. And whatever it is fraudulent, not fraudulent, also as zero. I'll give another uh, data set to Sharad and you know tell him the same problem. He says, okay, no problem. I'll tell you wh whatever fraudulent transaction, I mean whatever is a not is not a fraudulent transaction, I'll say at one, and whatever is a fraud fraudulent transaction, I'll say zero. Does that mean Sharad is wrong? No, right? He just coded in a different way. I mean, he just made yes as zero and no as one. Sunil said, I want to make yes as one, zero as no. It's perfectly all right, it, right? There's no particular thing. As I said, that there's no particular uh, order what we are looking for. It's just a uh, representation. So any representation can work. So we'll see how, uh, you know, how your science will change. Uh, we'll see that later. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, we have a six, 
we have 60 random customers from a city we want to know what triggers them to buy a blood pressure machine buy equal to 1 means the person bought it and 0 means the person didn't buy it okay you can as well as have 0 means the person bought it and 1 means the person didn't buy it okay so it's up to you how however you want to uh, code it age we are trying taking the age as a factor we may feel age as a part to play it named and hence we will use it to examine its influence in the buying decision now linear regression if i come to this if i you try to use linear regression zero or one is it a continuous value no right i don't have values 0.5 i don't have values 0.2 i don't have values anything between 0.56666 there is no value for such things right so even if i fit a equation y equal to c0 plus c1 a what will happen we see here you basically what you will have there are certain ages below that people don't buy it and certain ages below i mean above which people buy it now if you try to fit a linear regression you see how the line comes does this line make any sense no right doesn't make any sense no it's a continuous line you have there are just two possible outcomes you have fit a line which goes from the middle it's, it's absolutely crap right it doesn't make any sense that's why i was saying you cannot use a linear regression to fight a classification problem now you understand why okay now what if i can use uh, something like don't go into the function see on the right what if i can make this curve limited to 1 on the top and limited to 0 on the bottom and it can take some any value between 0 to 1 okay that is the y part so based on x our curve can take any value from 0 to 1 but it will be restricted up to 1 and uh, you know restricted to 0 at the bottom so as a mathematician i would start thinking okay what are the functions that we can you know restrict that increases with x and goes to a maximum of 1 and decreases with x and goes to a minimum of 0 what can be a function that we can you know uh, try to make it so mathematicians think a lot right so they came up with this sigmoid function what it means is basically don't get too much confused why this function is used this function someone has done a lot of research okay someone has done a lot of thinking on what can be a possible function which is continuous between 0 and 1 okay and uh, it is restricted to 0 1 so whatever however high x becomes it will still be 1 however low x becomes it will still be uh, yeah just a second it's still yeah, just, yeah so yeah depending on any value of x it it is restricted to between 0 and 1 yeah your question please yeah, we are you calculating points uh, point 0.1 point 0.2 point 0.3 for a 0 1 correct very good question whether the people buy it or not Correct, correct, okay. correct. Very good question. Uh, I, and I was expecting someone will should ask, and, and I, am, I feel glad someone has asked. So, what you essentially do in a classification problem is you set a threshold. Okay. Now, it may not be necessary that of, of you know, what, what we are trying to do is we are trying to find probabilities. So, what is the probability of a person buying a blood blood pressure machine who has an age greater than 60 okay so this value between 0 and 1 is basically a probability and we'll see how we get that so it's basically a probability now your probability will not always be between 0 and 1 it can take 0 0.5 0 0.6 it can take 0 0.2 it can take 0 0.1 it can be anything right so what we are trying to model is a probability Based on the probability, you, me, or cross-validation, or 
anyone who is an expert can tell what should be the threshold so anything greater than 0.2 should be yes and anything between point anything less than 0.2 should be no should it be like this or someone can say no i think anything greater than 0.4 is yes anything less than 0.4 is a no someone might say no no i think anything greater than 0.8 is is yes and anything less than 0.8 is no how do you find a solution to this here comes cross validation okay so we'll okay. go go yeah. into cross validation later uh, for logistic regression why how we i mean for uh, so after kna all the models that will be dealing with from now will for classification problem will give you probabilities okay it will not give you the actual yes or no so the default threshold that python has is 0.5 but that doesn't mean that 0.5 is the best threshold for every problem you need to cross validate to find that best threshold okay so we'll go into uh, sensitivity you go into specificity a lot of things are there in classification how to find the best threshold uh, we'll go that slowly Yeah, sorry guys. I think there was a uh, disturbance in the connection. Can you guys hear me now? Okay. Just hold on for one minute, just to say. Okay, uh, I'm connect reconnecting to a different modem. So just bear with me for uh, one minute. My my connection may go. Just bear with me for one minute. Yeah, I think we are back. Sorry for that. So uh, where were we? Uh, yeah. So what we were uh, doing is that. Uh, what I was studying is that uh, from now, uh, all the models you may see are predicting probabilities and will not give you the exact result. So depending on the cross validation, depending on your expertise, you have to find out the threshold. Okay, we'll see how to find the threshold, but that is uh, a problem of a later stage. Now let's try to understand more on the sigmoid function. Okay. So I think uh, I already have uh, made you understand what this means. So y equal to one divided by one plus e to the power minus c1, c naught plus c1x. So this part, This part was already there in your linear regression, right? We have changed, changed the structure of this so that y is between 0 to 1, nothing else. This part was already in there in linear regression. But now what we have done is we have changed the structure of the whole thing and then we are predicting y. So now, if that is the case, okay. Now, 
this is basically a background of what is logic function so logic function is basically now just forget whatever i've told you now uh, think of it as a simple math if anyone tells what is logic of x it is log of x upon 1 minus x okay what is sin x i mean it's kind of a maths formula what is um, sin square x plus cos square x is equal to 1 similarly what is the logit of x it is x log of x upon 1 minus x that is the function so logit is a function logit function of any parameter is basically log of p upon 1 minus p okay this is just a definition of logit function now remember everything now whatever i told so y equal to 1 divided by 1 plus e to the power minus c naught plus c1x. This is what I was seeing, okay, from the previous slides. I told you logit of p is equal to log of p upon minus p. If I apply logit of y, what will be logit of y? Logit of y will be log, log, log of y upon 1 minus y. So log of this upon 1 minus this. If you calculate that, logit of y is basically c0 plus c1x, right? So this is of the linear regression form. So what your model is basically, logistic regression model is basically, earlier you were having only y on the left hand side for a linear regression, x, the right side was the same. Now you have logit of y as a function of x. Any doubts till now? Yeah, I couldn't understand the last part uh, of logit. Okay. Logit. Uh, what was the model of... The more. What was the model uh, used in uh, linear regression? Y equal to? Linear regression was Y equal to A plus beta 1 is equal to... Yeah, B1. Correct. Okay, excellent. I am telling you that to keep y in bounds of 0 and 1, I need to somehow change y so that it becomes between 0 and 1. Okay? So, math, mathematic, mathematicians have done a lot of research and said that if you take logit of y as a function of x, then your y will always be between 0 and 1. So, that's why instead of y i'm just replacing logit of y so that my values become z between 0 and 1 i'm restricting the values of y between 0 and 1 that's a function that i'm introducing okay little better did you understand a little better i, I know it's a difficult concept to understand at first it's not very intuitive we also had some yeah. problems understanding why oh, mainly logit would be uh, used for restriction from 0 to 1 or some value. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yes? So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. slowly, slowly you will get the hang of it, why, uh, why we are doing this. But I also agree that initially it is a little difficult to digest why we are suddenly doing this. And you could say why logic. So, that's what logic is a function which is like S of the S form. And this S form is uh, you know uh, cannot be recreated by any other function uh, if you can find another function then that, that's great i mean you could as well you know do a research paper on that but uh, it uh, that doesn't ex there doesn't exist any right now that uh, which is also simple in, you know representation so Basically, this is the part where, uh, you know, the logistic regression comes into picture. Now, can can anyone say, can we use logistic regression for uh, a regression problem per se? Yes, it's a yes. same continuous numbers. You're but continuous. Uh, it's between only, but it's between only some points like correct. thresholds correct correct so it means you cannot use right regression problem is a continuous number which doesn't have any bounds 
right? A regression problem should be a problem where I, as I increase x, my y should be increasing infinitely. If x is infinite and my relation between y and x is directly proportional, my y should also be infinite. It cannot be bounded. So a logistic regression cannot be used for a regression problem. Okay. Okay, now let's get into the uh, code part. Same data set iris based on the parameters of the petal and the sepal. I'm trying to predict which flower it is, right? Okay. So, so see from this, uh, from where the cursor begins, from sklearn.linear model import logistic regression. So sim, uh, there's calling of the function. EST is equal to logistic regression. We are storing the function here. EST dot fit. You are fitting the function on x and y. EST dot score. What is score? I'll explain you. And EST dot coefficient, EST dot intercept. Okay. So if I tell guys, after this, so basically get the coefficient. I mean, let's let's, let's keep this here. Okay. Now um, here. When did we did a scoring, this is basically calculating the training score because I've used X and Y both. Now, let's see if I do the same thing. Uh, okay, no problem. We'll do that later because I have not. Okay. So I think uh, we'll. Uh, uh, I have not introduced hyperparameters in logistic regression yet. So when I do introduce hyperparameters in logistic regression, we'll use, we'll see cross validation. But for now, you just remember this. I mean, just see this. EST is the score. So scoring is basically the training accuracy. I mean, X and Y you have predicted. You have used X to predict Y and you already had the real Ys and you're just trying to see the accuracy. Same as what we did here where we were seeing the accuracy here but he, here you were seeing the cross validation accuracy here you are seeing just the accuracy okay so whatever you have fitted uh, you're trying to see whether how good so 90 96 percent times you are correct okay and what is the coefficient and what is the intercept so it's a linear regression problem um, Okay. So Okay, so yeah, tell me. I have a question which So, we start that in my first here. Uh, so, your voice, your voice is cracking. Just wait, your voice is cracking. Uh, just a second. Yeah, uh, say. Okay. No, I am not able to hear you. Your voice is cracking. Uh, can you write your question? Can you write your question?
yeah sigmoid was using 0 or 1 correct okay that's a good question uh, so how will it solve virus problem that's a very good question uh, sunil so now let's see how many flowers were there in uh, iris problem Can you write your answers uh, on the screen? Guys, can you hear me now? Yeah, you guys can hear me now. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yes, Sunil, ask your question now. So, that is my question. From the sigmoid or rigid function, we will able to, to predict 0 or 1. Means if that is below 5, 0.5, we'll say no. Above 0.5, it will be 1. But in iris, there is zero one two i mean three classes are there correct so that's uh, that's a very good question sunil so as i told you that uh, no. hello 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 Yeah, I'm sorry. I think there's some problem with the connection today. Anyways, uh, yeah, so that's a very good question, Sunil. So, I, as I told you that logistic regression can be used for two classes, for binary uh, classes, but I didn't say that it cannot be used for multiple classes. Okay, so when you're trying to predict, it's called a rest one versus all. So basically, when you're trying to predict a particular flower, you are keeping that as a single class and the other flowers for example if there are three flowers okay so when you are trying to predict for one flower you are ignoring the two flowers so for example this is yes and the other any other flower is no okay so understand that it is kind of doing a one versus rest problem okay so in a binary it was yes or no but in uh, this thing, what you're trying to do, you are trying to predict a particular flower, let's say, or let's say if there is high, medium, low, you're trying to predict, when you're trying to predict high, then you're ignoring medium and low. Ignoring as in you're keeping them as uh, a different, let's say high is yes, and medium low is being clubbed into no. Similarly, when you're predicting for medium, okay, but yeah. But you need to calculate high, low, medium first, right? Based on the data. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. So when you're calculating high, 
you clubbing EDM and low for uh, as as in a different. So for example, for a particular data, you are getting the high probability as 0.7. The rest is 0.3. So what it what you will say? This is high. Then it will calculate for medium also. Medium probability, let's say, is 0.6 versus the other, which is 0.4. So medium is less than uh, high. And then, for example, in low, you are getting 0.8 versus uh, um, high and medium as 0.2. So ultimately, you get high as 0.7, medium as 0.6, low as 0.9. So you will predict point low because low is the highest high probability. These are not mutually additive. Uh, so you you saw a problem individually. You first thought let's keep it keep it high and let's see what happens if I keep the others two in a single uh, this thing. Then you predicted for medium and then you predicted for low. So for each data point, you are trying to predict three different predictions and then you are getting the highest probably probability out of it. So Iris, I just wanted to give you an example that uh, it can have be used for multi class. But since um, uh, uh, Sunil asked the question right now, uh, I explained, but I was going to explain this a little later. So the, when we go into decision trees uh, after that, I was going to explain because that is a there's a difference between decision tree and logistic regression pertaining to this problem, pertaining to this uh, classification uh, difference. Okay. Just give me two minutes. I'll be back. Uh, just give me two minutes. Yeah, I'm back. So let's say uh, that's a so answering that Sunil's question. So let's let's see here. You see, okay. Uh, how many features does Iris have? Remember how many features you had? Four. Four. Perfect. And how many coefficients you have here? One, two, three, four. four. Into three, three. Twelve. Twelve coefficients you have. You see this? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then you have three coefficients as well. So now you understand this. What's your equation? Your equation basically becomes see this uh, it's very important here. If you see your equation. So the first y let's say the flower was I, I think it was uh, virginica. Virginica was the last. Anyways, Sentosa. It was Y Sentosa. Y Sentosa equal to beta 1 into, uh, sorry, X1 into this plus X2 into this plus X3 into this and X4 into this plus the C part 
the constant part is this right similarly for y virginica the x1 is this the x2 is this the x3 is this x4 is this and the coefficient is this similarly for the uh, versicolor x1 is this x2 is this x3 is this x4 is this i mean beta beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3 plus beta 4 x4 and the coefficient is this no so, no no but we have not given y0 y1 y2 means name we have not given anywhere no no this example so your y target when you how? when you were seeing a y target okay so if you just uh, yes yeah, this is a list of all the flowers means three flowers in a random way based on the x yeah not random based on the x so you are when you are trying to fit the model your model very well understands so it has automatically understood that zero is one flower one is one flower two is one flower so basically it is trying to predict i mean trying to find out what is the probability of having this flower zero okay so that that function is basically beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3 plus beta 4 x4 so it will calculate so what it what why which flower is zero basically that is my question so it is automatically done so what uh, for example your data had santosa on the first uh, 10 then uh, virginica on the next 10 and sent uh, versicolor on the next 10 so automatically it uh, assigns zero to the first one one to the first based on the data it receives okay so if in in your data if your first 10 rows is uh, virginica then it will assign zero to virginica if your first 10 rows is sentosa it will assign zero to sentosa so as and when the data comes so python is reading the data line by line right so it reads reads the first line it is uh, virginica he says okay virginica let's assume let's code it this as zero okay then comes virginica okay we have i have already coded this as zero then comes virginica i have already coded it as zero then comes uh, suddenly comes sentosa oh uh, this uh, this is not virginica now i need to give a new code that is then it goes gives one okay like this it gives one to all the sentosa and then as soon as it sees versicolor it sees oh this is a new thing so i need to code it as two okay so like this it will so you see the data was in that order and that's why your 0 0 then 1 1 1 1 and then 2 2 2 2 that's how it is coded yeah your question i think you have some question yeah yeah you have any questions sunil sunil no sorry i don't have okay okay so everyone is clear it might not be clear today a uh, little it's a little difficult to understand logistic regression but is it uh, let's say 70% clear a little bit clear okay yeah. we understood the concept okay okay that's great Sharad said it's not fully. Don't worry, we'll revisit this tomorrow again. Uh, uh, meanwhile, uh, what I'll do is introduce a little bit of decision trees concept. I'll not go into the actual depth of it, but since we uh, missed around two three minutes due to the connection issues, we'll extend to 9:34 today. So we still have 15 minutes, uh, and uh, we'll see uh, a little bit of decision trees and. so that uh, when you come you come tomorrow we can revisit decision trees and logistic regression uh, again okay so uh, in the beginning of the class today i had told you that uh, <coughs> sorry so i told you that uh, there are two approaches one is parametric parametric approach where you have a particular structure of the equation and the other is you have a non parametric approach where you don't have any structure you have a process okay 
Now, decision tree is a very, very, very simple model to understand. It have it is like a human brain trying to take decisions. Okay, it's very simple model, very easy to understand. So just bear with me, and uh, we shall get this so very easily. Okay, now let's see. Okay, just make to make this as in, a little more interactive. In office or in your work life, how do you take decisions? So for example, let's say if you uh, if you're your marketing manager and you want to take a decision whether to pro launch this, you have prepared a new product, and uh, or let's say you want to prepare a new product, you want you want to think whether you want to invest. Uh, 500 million dollars or let's say 200 million dollars or any number whether you want to invest in its uh, in its R&D or not how do you take a decision or let's say you are working in Excel today now okay. if you for example if you have a lot of data in Excel okay now you want to you go there everyone is aware of Excel filters how Excel filters work Yes or no? Okay. Everyone is aware of okay Excel. I think um, everyone little bit knows. So basically, you want to see whether you want you want to launch this product or you want to make investments on this R and D or not. What do you do? You ask your subordinate, get me the data. How did we do last time uh, when we took a decision on like this? Maybe on a different product, but how? What were the steps that we followed? So your subordinate tells, "Oh, sir, what we did is we saw the previous data, and what we did last to last time, and based on some parameters, we took a decision." So he said, "Okay, bring me the file, bring me the launch product. I mean, bring me the post sales. Uh, I mean, post launch sales for the product that we launched." So he brings the brings you the file. You you see. First of all, you check. Uh, so for example, last time, or or let's say he brings you a lot of database, the whole database of your company of all the products in post launch, uh, which have been tracked post launch. So you, let's say you are going to launch a baby powder. First of all, what you see, you do a filter on baby powder. Whatever baby powders have been launched. Prior to this, uh, in your company, so let's say you get around six products on BP Powder. Okay, now you want to see. This time I'm launching a product of let's say 200 rupees MRP. You do go to your Excel. You do a filter on what are the products between 150 to uh, let's say 250. You get Let's say three products. Then you see what was the size of uh, uh, what is the size of the, your uh, product? Let's say it's 200 grams. Then you search based on uh, your uh, 200 grams. What are the products that was in your database that uh, was between the size of 150 grams to 250 grams? You get a single product. You pick that single product and see the scenario how it had performed and you think that this might be replicated for your product that is the closest you can get so how, what did you do you took a decision based on your previous x data based on some independent decisions made in an hierarchy first you saw what is the type of the product then you saw what is the price of the product then you saw what is the size of the product a particular hierarchy which 
at every step shortens your data because you are filtering on this on the on that basis it shortens the data set and ultimately you get a particular prediction or you get a particular data which you think it will be the best for your prediction so this is for how exactly decision trees work kind of a human into a human brain because humans cannot take a lot of decisions if you say give me uh, or let's say in a single step what, tell me what is the post launch scenario of 200 grams baby powder which is being sold at 200 rupees you'll get confused right okay wait 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 let me process this slowly you want a powder first of all let's see what are the powders that have been launched in our company then what did you say price right price okay let's see what are the uh, price that we have launched between 150 to 350 and then what did you say size okay then see what is the size respectively so you have made a decision based on an hierarchy you didn't you didn't want to do it all together because you get confused that's how human brain acts don't take a lot of decisions together and then based on that keep on shortlisting or let's say how hr select uh, your candidates right how hr shortlists your candidates there are some companies might get you know for opening of two they might get a pool of let's say 5000 candidates applying for it how do you even shortlist that first shortlist how do you do let's i mean let's get rid of the candidates who don't uh, who don't have the skill set okay so first decision you make on a skill set yes it has then you come into the next round no it does not you just reject them okay then after the skill set then you see years of experience do they meet our criteria yes they do meet if they don't then you reject then after that experience then you see what is the previous salary withdrawn or what is the expected salary they want if it is too high then our highest benchmark you get rid of them if it is below the benchmark you take them into further completion and then you get let's say get down to a top 10 or top 15 candidates and then you do an interview that's how it happens similarly decision trees think of the same as the concept except for the fact now this is important except for the fact that you are trying to predict now okay so now you have you know divided your data based on some decisions now you want to predict so for example you know hr who has been doing this for let's say last 10 years you know this guy this some friend of yours which is your test data so your hr person has trained on let's say it has trained herself or himself for 10 years on a particular data now your friend comes to you which is a test data he says uh, hi Sharad, can you please refer me to this hr uh, i have i see an opening in your company you know this hr so what do you see oh i know this girl this guy or girl what he'll do he'll see first your skill set do you have the skill set okay i think you have the skill set what is the expected salary you are asking? I think uh, you are asking this one. Okay. Uh, then it's below the threshold. Uh, then um, uh, you ask what is the years of experience? You say He says, yeah, it's around um, five years, I think. And the HR uh, knows that the requirement is uh, above three years. I think you can be selected. I mean, I, I am pretty 80% sure that you will be selected, but it will depend on your final round. What did you do? You did your decisions on your test data based on the training set of the HR. I mean, you know the kind of model the HR follows. So, on based on that, you predicted for your friend. Now, did you get this example? If you didn't get, then I'll go to a simpler example. Did you guys understand? Okay, Sunil, so uh, he got it. Uh, so, uh, Sharad Vasan, what about you? Anything? Did you understand this example? Okay, Vasan got the point. Sharad got it. Great. That's 
exactly what I wanted for you guys to understand what decision tree is. And I think if you understand that, everything is very easy. For example, let's go to an example of what we learned uh, previously. Now, let's say you have your weather outlook, you have the temperature, you have the humidity, and then you want to predict whether children will come out to play or not. Okay? You start taking decisions. You see, you check what is the outlook, whether it is overcast, whether it is sunny. If it is overcast, then children definitely come out to play. If it is sunny, then you check what is the humidity, whether it is low, whether it is high. If it is high, then I'm pretty damn sure that no one comes out to play. If it is low, then I'm pretty damn sure that people come out to play. Got it? So, based on your past data, you have formed this decision. And now if any day we want to predict whether children will come out to play, what you need to check? You just need to check the outlook. You need to check this, whether it is sunny or not. And you want to check the humidity. And based on that, you can anytime you can predict whether they will come out to play or not. Okay, does this make sense? Okay, so we'll not go into the codes today. I think it will be too much. But only thing, can anyone tell me what is the problem in this? I mean, I, I have not told you this and I, uh, I'll be super happy if you can tell this, That, but then I'll not be sad if you don't, uh, if you can't answer this. What is the problem is in this? I mean, what is the essence, well, basic problem in this concept? Can anyone tell me? I'll just unmute you guys. I think you are unmuted. Uh, yeah, I think everyone can speak. Any guess? It's a difficult one, I understand. But any guess? You mean problem with the data or the no, problem? Pro not the data. Problem in the kind of decisions no. they are made. Decision. Okay, let me give an uh, let me help you here. Suppose you are managing a team of let's say five people. You give a particular same data set to five different people, and you want them to come up with insights. You'll be very surprised that five people might come with five different insights, or maybe. 10 different insights. Why is that so? I mean, you gave the same data, but then why do five people have five different insights? Why can't they have the same insight? You gave the same data. Hey, uh, they have different uh, perspectives. Uh, I was on mute, basically, so I was telling. So it seems problem is that the hierarchy, I mean, priority which we are setting. Perfect. As like over cast or sunny, first we have to take, then we Perfect. Awesome. Perfect. And I think, uh, uh, was it Vasan uh, before Sunil? Uh, yeah, I was you know, on mute, so I was saying, but then I see you can't reacting on that. Anyway, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that is my perspective, and uh, Vasan is saying the same. Perspective means for someone, humidity can be the first priority. Exactly. For someone, sunny can be the other exactly. priority. Exactly. Exactly. That is awesome. I think uh, that is. Uh, really appreciable that uh, you guys have cracked that. So, who told this model to check Outlook first? I mean, uh, for me, I think I don't care whether it is sunny or overcast. I'll first check humidity. Or for me, or for some other guy, it might be like 
um, I don't care whether it's humidity or not. He's in Calcutta. Every time it is humid, it doesn't really make sense for him to check the humidity or not. He just checks whether it's sunny or overcast. So that's basically the problem of decision tree. It uh, it takes decision based on a particular hierarchy on which it thinks thinks as in there's a particular metric to measure that how important is each of these variables so we'll go into that tomorrow but just think like this decision tree has a solution to this no? so someone who had built this he knew that this will be a problem right how to select this hierarchy the decision tree is does have the answer but it does not address it very effectively that's where the random forest model will come into picture so tomorrow we will see decision tree in depth we will see decision tree codes we will see the little bit revised logistic location and then we'll move on to random forest Okay. Okay, it's great. Yeah, it's okay. great. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Let's catch up tomorrow again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Good night. Good night. I'll give the one or two liner definition. Then I give machine learns by itself. Correct. And that is a part of AI. So time being forget about the AI material. Just I know machine learning. So come on the first statement, machine learns by itself. Correct. So taking the example that is very familiar, Boston housing price basically. We have given some attributes, 506 which we have been provided. Based on that, we have to predict. Okay, correct, correct. So, so this is one time algorithm I have to give in. Based on that, I am getting some prediction. Correct. But if this year info I can give you, uh, give again, hmm. assuming that is 100 row again, then it will be 606 lines and machine will predict better. Is this a correct? Correct, correct. So more the information you give to the model, the more better it will predict. Okay. Okay. So machine... And, uh, yeah learning by itself as in you have told uh, a statistical model and the machine depending on the data it is learning itself right i'm not saying i'm not forcing him to understand see if your crime rate is this please do this are you feeding in if else statement how do you do in pro, um, traditional programming if this uh, yeah, no. password is matching then go to this if else if this so this is hard coding you're telling the machine what to do but in this, you have not told the machine what to do, right? You have not told that if my age is greater than 40, then predict, uh, uh, you know, a heart attack. Age less than 40, do not. Have you told this? No. But the machine has, you have just given a model. Machine in itself is trying to understand how to predict that. Okay. Got it. Means more and more data you will be giving, more and more better machine prediction will be. Correct. Correct. Just learning itself. Got it. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, uh, so uh, just to uh, give everyone a brief, uh, you know, a brief heads up on what. So I bought a uh, device so that you can, I can write on it and, you know, uh, so that you guys can see it properly. So um, sometimes, so there's a Shibodi user so that I have logged into my iPad. So in the meantime, whenever I need to write something, I'll give the control to that guy. I mean, to myself only, but to Shivoti, and uh, I, you can you'll see the iPad screen, and then I can I'll write it right on it. Okay. So uh, just to give you a heads up on how, uh, so that I I found it that it, I should uh, have something to write on, so that it's better to understand, you know, everything. Okay. So let me share my screen. Okay, and I'll mute you guys.
Okay. So, uh, okay, let's say, uh, I, I think I should uh, start with uh, the writing part only so that it's better you know, for you guys to understand. I'll just open the screen and Okay, uh, just give me some two minutes. I think it has got disconnected. Uh, so just give me two minutes. Okay, guys, can you see my screen now? Okay. Okay, so are, are we fine? Everything clear? You can see my iPad screen and you can see and you can hear my voice, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Sunny. Okay. So let's start. So Basically, what we were doing is that we were uh, discussing about decision trees. And uh, so I told you guys that there are two approaches. One is the parametric approach. Okay. So wherein we have a type of functions where we have a particular structure of the equation. Okay, now this is uh, called parametric approach. Uh, the other one is the non parametric approach, wherein we do not have any equation, but I'll just change the color. But we have a process. Okay. Now, 
what is the decision tree process so i think uh, today i can write it better so yesterday i told you uh, you have to be very you know you have to get this thing into your head that we are basically whenever we are doing machine learning we are basically dealing with a regression problem or a classification okay now if you see uh, you can see my screen guys okay so uh, so basically a regression problem or a classification problem now regression is predict a continuous variable continuous number classification is predict a class okay now when you understand this then it comes the second step comes is which model to fit okay now which model to fit is the decision that you have to take after you know that whether you have to predict a continuous number or you have to predict a class now regression has certain models that you can do i started with linear regression okay then we went on to lasso then we went on to ridge then we i just gave a brief introduction of elastic net okay no need to understand this i'm just giving an example so basically in in all these models what we are trying to do is we are predicting a continuous variable okay we also saw that knn can be used for regression now when we try to start, do for classification how many models we have learned till now we have just seen knn and we have just seen logistic regression now can linear regression be used for predicting a class no if i want a linear regression to predict a class or i want a linear model to predict a class then i have to go on to logistic regression okay so logistic regression we have seen we have seen knn now the other part that we want to see is decision trees now can decision trees be used for regression yes they can be used for uh, regression also okay now let's get into decision trees the first and foremost important point is it's a human like decision making process okay so why human like decision process we take decisions step by step okay now let's say i have a data frame wherein you have age income okay then you have let's say work x in years 
and then you want to predict the price range of the house that you are going to buy okay now let's say price range is uh, okay now let's say uh, someone has already given you the data in terms of high medium and low okay okay any problem i think uh, i just saw a chat box what happened okay so uh, basically you are trying to pre predict whether the price whether the price range of the uh, you know the house that you are going to buy uh, will be high let's say the high is greater than 200 thousand dollars okay uh, less than 200k uh, greater than 150k I don't know uh, what are the basic uh, prices in you know US I'm just uh, taking an example and then less than 150k dollars is low now when I build a decision tree on this let's say my tree says if my age is greater than 40 okay one way is the yes and the other way is the no now there are two things in this who told you that age has to be first why not income why not work x okay first question is this the other question is why 40 why not 50 or why not 60 okay so there are two things that we need to be clear here answer to the first question and answer to the second question is the same now when we were doing the regression what we were doing is regression objective function what was it can in, uh, people write down the answer uh, in the uh, in in the chat box? What was the reg regression objective function? Guys, can you write down the answer? Minimize the RMAC. Remember this, this is very important. Root mean square error. This is the objective function in linear regression and this this is the objective function that you have to use for all regression problems for all regression problems root mean square error is the objective function that have you have to use that you have to use okay keep this very clear don't get confused this because this is very important I, I, I explained you yesterday also root mean square error is the function objective function that you need to reduce for a regression problem okay what was root mean square error Sig, sigma of y actual minus y predicted whole square i equal to 1 to all the data points does everyone understand this function give me a yes or no or you need me to um, you know explain this a little bit more okay okay so this is 
the regression any regression problem any regression problem means any time when you are trying to predict when you are pre predicting a continuous variable this is the function that you have to keep in mind every time no go around on this okay now let's 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 first understand this so let's say i said in initially that age is greater than 40 then yes then no let's build the decision tree first then we'll try to explain further so if your age is greater than 40 then i check then i check uh, there is another decision that i need to take uh, what were the features that we used income okay so income greater than uh, let's say hundred thousand dollars yes then he is going to buy a high uh, high priced item okay high priced house if it is no then it, he is going to buy let's say a medium uh, if you know it, it, this will be low okay now another question that arises is why didn't we check work x okay why did i just say uh, i stop here i could have also you know had a kind of a decision tree like age a greater than 40 yes no and income greater than hundred thousand dollars yes no and then again i check work x greater than 10 yes no and then i finally predict okay this is high this is uh, this is medium let's see now you see these two decision trees are built on the same data but they have completely different meanings okay so how do we how does the decision tree understand which decision tree is the best so there's something called the entropy entropy is the loss function for a classification problem or you can also have a something called Gini index okay now what is Gini index what is loss function Gini index is basically sigma k equal to k to all capital K pmk into 1 minus pmk don't don't jump the gun here I'll uh, I'll make you understand here okay so this function you have to reduce now what is this function let's go back to the decision tree that we were seeing
okay now can anyone tell me okay now uh, i'll draw another uh, decision tree on the right Can anyone tell me which is a better decision tree here? Just a guess. I mean, I am not looking for the right answers here. Can anyone just tell me which decision tree is better, whether a cut on age greater than 60 and left one? Sunil, that's perfectly correct. Left one. Why do you say so? Can you give me an explanation, one liner explanation? No, that is uh, what so Sunil says that uh, the guy has more uh, time to work. That is your understanding. I'm talking about how the data has, uh, you know, figured out. Why did age is greater than 40 is uh, better than age greater than 60? Okay, I'll answer the question. So if you see here, Exactly, Vasan. Exactly, that's perfect. The left one has more distinct decision and that can be made easily. For example, here on this side, you see high is 0 0.8, medium is 0 0.1, low is 0 0.1. So the there is no confusion at all. 80% of my people are preferring high. 0.1% is medium, 0.1% is low. So I have a clear winner here. But if I say the right one, uh, sorry, uh, I mean, even in on the right side, I see there's a clear winner here. Okay, so medium is 0.7, high is 0.2, low is 0.1. But if I see the right one, none of the decisions are very clear. The here, the decision tree is confused. Uh, it is giving 50-50 uh, probability to both. Here also it is not very clear. It's just 60% and 40%. So my decision tree is not very confident, right? It says, I don't know, I probably can be 60 or 40. Okay, so uh, on the left tree, you cannot, Vasan is asking, you cannot have a proper decision on the left tree. I don't want to have a proper decision on medium and low. I want to have whether it is mid, high, medium or low. On the left side, I see high is 0.8, I give high. On the right side, I give medium as 0.7, I give medium. Okay, I mean, no, don't need to understand which is, you know, uh, how the other things are, uh, how the other categories are having the probabilities. I just need to find the maximum. And you, the question is, which maximum, which is more confident, confidently higher than the others? Just hold on for one minute. Just hold on for one minute. Yeah, sorry uh, for the disturbance. So on the left side, I just need to assign whether it is high or low or uh, high or medium or low. I don't need not. Um, so for on the right, on the, for example, on the right side, you're correct. On the right side, if I see this one, right, I see high as 0.6, medium as 0.4, low is 0. If I take the maximum from it, it I'll assign high here. And if I take the maximum of it, 
I cannot assign. I am confused. But your high is not very high compared to others, right? Get my point. It is not very distinct. Here high is. It is pretty confident that 80% is high, but here only 60% is high. Okay. So when so now for each of the classes here. Your K is for each of the classes. And this M is the number of divisions. Okay. So how many divisions you have? We have two. Okay. So in two means uh, for the left one, you have two. I mean two, um, two, let's say, uh, okay. One thing I forgot to tell you. In uh, decision trees, this is called a uh, node, and these are called branches. Okay, I mean, whatever you understand, right? Uh, a node, and the last ones, when the decision is over, it is called terminal nodes. Okay, so for example, for for my decision tree on the right, uh, on the left. I have exhausted all my decisions and I have arrived at, at a decision on my terminal nodes and each of the terminal nodes. Now, uh, let me get a new uh, color. Okay, so on this side, what do we see if I calculate this? High is 0.8 into 1 minus 0.8 plus 0.1 into 0.9 plus 0.1 into 0.9. This is for the left division. For this, it is 0.2 into 0.8 plus 0.7 into 0.3 plus 0.1 into 0.9. How I get this? P into 1 minus P. P into 1 minus P. So P into 1 minus P. P into 1 minus P. And I add them. So you get a particular value. Similarly, you do this. And you get a particular value. What do you think? Which will be higher? The right one or the left one? It's a mathematical question. I mean, uh, you may be wrong here, but uh, can you give me one answer? Which do you think will be higher? Left one will be higher. Okay. So the thing is. A into 1 minus A is the maximum at A equal to 0.5. Okay, so here the probabilities are closer to 0.5, whichever because more the larger number of probabilities are closer to 0.5. Okay. I understand this this will be zero okay but these will be very high okay so because so for example let's see uh, let's calculate a sample point two into point is point one six right and uh, this is point two one this is point zero nine okay this is point zero nine however point five into point five is 0.25 so 0.25 so it is always maximum when a equal to i mean these are equal okay so all it is always highest at this point so whenever it means whenever you have the probability distributions uh, closer to 0.5 i mean closer to the middle the sum will always be higher you you can check that uh, after you uh, you know the, in, in the class you can check that after the class uh, do your do the calculation itself yourself and uh, calculate 
and you will see that the right one is higher. So what does this mean in terms of values? It means the decision tree has to minimize the Gini index. Right? So whenever this Gini index, so for example, let's say I have a decision based on age and I get high as 1, rest all are 0, here I get low as 1, rest all are 0. What will be the Gini index of this problem? Okay, uh, same on both sides, Sharad, that's correct, but what will be the value? Zero, perfect, Sharad, absolutely, excellent. So it will be zero. Why it will be zero? I'll calculate, so I'll just uh, rewrite the formula here. Okay. So now I am calculating for the left hand side. So high for for this one. Okay. 1 into 1 minus. Sorry. Plus. same on the right side so it means and if you see intuitively you'll see that this is a very good decision right if i am age is greater than 40 i can 100 i am 100% confident that my uh, uh, he'll buy a high priced flight if my uh, high priced uh, house if my age is less than 40 i am 100% confident that he will buy a low priced uh, uh, apartment okay so now I'll just rewrite everything I know what is my Gini index I know what is my RMSE decision trees minimize Gini index regression problems minimize RMSE okay now second point by reducing RMSE we obtain beta not beta 1 beta 2 by reducing Gini index, we obtained what? What did we what did we obtain here? We obtained where we want to place our cut for example age greater than 40 okay so initially I told you that there were two problems right did I state that one was that how to figure out this should be 40 and the other one was how to figure out that age should come first so your decision tree will do an internal calculation okay it will see age income work x okay then it will see age what is the minimum value what is the maximum value what is the minimum value 
what is the maximum value what is the minimum value what is the maximum value in between this it will try to find out which is the best cut in this in, it will try to find out which is the best cut and in this it will try to find out which is the best cut how does it find out which is the best cut the one which gives us the highest drop in gini index so the cut which gives us the highest drop in gini we have see here we have already said the gini index uh, should be reduced right so it perfectly makes sense that i will take the cuts where my gini index is reduced or i obtain highest drop so for example initially let's say initially there were uh, um, let's say high was 0.4 medium was 0.2 and low was point uh, so this 3 sorry point 4 so i mean out of 100 data points 40 were high medium were 20 and low were uh, 40 okay so this was the initial distribution after you get a cut at age is greater than 40 so your high percentage so let's say you had uh, 40 data points here because all the high came this side and uh, all the low came this side okay so i think uh, just a sec low so this should be having some value uh, so you understand this right uh, that uh, total if there are 100 points on the right you will see some uh, some uh, points and on the i mean on the right you will see some points and on the left you will see some points total this should be 100 and since my high probability is 1 all the 40 points have come from high here and uh, accordingly you need to you know i just gave this as an hypothetical example uh, but when you are calculating from the data you need to understand that uh how the distribution has uh, would be so i see that my initial gini index was high now my gini index is zero so i have received a cut wherein i get a high, maximum drop of gini index from some let's say 0.16 it has become to zero so that's where i say that that cut which reduces the gini index i mean gets me the highest drop in gini index is the cut that we have to take okay and now i'll pause if there are any questions here do we have any questions i'll open uh, for okay if there are no questions then that's good uh, sonil has told me there is no question what about vasant uh, sharad okay great great uh, shubhdeep yeah 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 shubhdeep uh, so in any index whichever is oh, we should take whichever is maximum or uh, sorry i didn't get you uh, means uh, you're saying that it's highest to drop uh, in the decision right we should take the decision where there is a highest drop correct 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 so in the that means it should be minimum or it should be maximum like if you have age uh, age 
greater than age for uh, age greater than 40 correct so if i have uh, mid uh, high as 0.5 and low as means all like uh, 0.5 and 0.3 0.2 correct then they should select only highs so okay High. uh, no so one is this the cal- uh, one is the uh, threshold setting part where we are setting the threshold based on the gini index and what you are saying is the prediction part so what whatever so uh, every time it is not possible to you know um, uh, get the highest drop in gini index every time right it's not possible to your green got right. yeah uh, it, uh, it got unlocked so that's why yeah okay every time it is not possible to you know uh, uh, get the highest drop in gini index okay so there will be certain instances where your gini index is kind of you know uh, not the lowest just hold on i think there's some echo just hold on okay you guys can see me now right can you guys yeah, see we are able to see yes yeah. Oh, okay yeah perfect yeah so what are you saying yeah you answered that question okay okay right. okay then if uh, that is the case then <clears throat> we'll move on to some concept called bagging okay uh, uh shubhdeep i have one more question yeah, so yeah. why did you select only age uh means to okay okay uh, so i i selected a particular age uh just i mean per- particularly age just to explain so there so for, uh, here as i told you that uh, according to the gene index you are sequence will be selected and the uh, thresholds will be selected so for example age is selected then after that okay uh, i think you have got uh, got into picture a good point so uh, okay now um, let's see in decision trees it is called a greedy approach okay uh what do you mean by greedy approach the greedy approach is basically that so for example when i said that when i am trying to you know say that my age is greater than 40 and less than 40 i'm trying to see what will be the effect of this age in my gini index okay then i see that let's say my gini index here drop is 0.1 in case of income income let's say 100000 my gini index drop is 0.05 and your work x my uh, there's a particular threshold is a 10 and my gini index drop is 0.02 which one will you select for your first decision you will select age which one will you select for your second decision? You'll select income. Which one will you select for your third decision? You'll select work. So basically, your decision tree will be age, yes, no. Then there will be income. Here also there will be income based on some threshold. There will be yes, no. There will be yes, no. And then there will be 
work x here will be also be there will be work x similarly here will be work x and work x will have a threshold of 10 so yes no so this like uh, here you have all the terminal nodes as we said right so these are all terminal nodes so whenever you have a test data coming so a new test data will check his age then he'll check it will flow from here let's say it flows from here then it will you'll check his income let's say it flows from here then he will check his work x then it falls falls uh, flows from here and then finally you get a prediction let's say this is medium this is low this is medium this is low just i mean just i'm give, giving hypothetical uh, assignments don't un understand that as a, you know so i'm just giving arbit so you get that uh, predictions here so whenever a new test data comes it flows through this uh, accordingly it will test and flow uh, the flow will be checked and accordingly you'll get a uh, you'll get a particular prediction okay now why did i say it is a greedy approach because i only checked what is my genie index dropped individually what if if i say that in case for example what is your net gene index drop in this case so this will be 0 0.1 plus 0 0.05 plus 0 0.2 that is uh, sorry 0 0.02 right that is your net gene index drop now there can be a case wherein i say that if you take If you take income, I mean, you take Gini index drop of 0 0.05, income as first, and then you take work eggs, and then you check the age, my net Gini index drops. So, for example, here it is uh, 0.17, right? 0 0.1, from here, 0.17. But if you take this in this order, you may have a Gini index drop of 0 0.19. But since you were greedy, you didn't see the overall picture. You, are, you saw whichever is giving my greatest drop in the Gini index, I am dividing on the basis of that. So age is giving, okay, divide on age. Then income is giving, okay, give, divide on income. Then work X is giving, so I kind of sorted it and I then I took the decisions but one uh, but you may have some certain times that so because see the income decision that you will be taking is based on the divisions after the age maybe if you take your income decision first and then you take the work eggs and then you take the age your net drop in Gini index much is much higher than what it was here, but you didn't check this. So this is one of the disadvantage or disadvantages of uh, decision trees. It does not see the holistic picture. It sees at every step. It sees which is giving me the highest drop in Gini index. It is not seeing the overall picture. My overall picture at the end might be a, a, even a better one but decision tree cannot do that decision trees are follows a greedy approach okay so this is very important in terms of greedy approach okay so Vasan, is this clear now i think uh, you, what you were looking for i explained something uh, 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 different from that but is your uh, doubt clear uh, during the process Okay, perfect. Okay, let's take a break for about uh, four minutes and I'll be back. Okay.
<clears throat> okay, I'm back. So, so we are good till now. I'll just unmute you guys. Are we good till now? Everything clear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, looks good to me. Okay. 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 So this, uh, let's go through the slide once. Uh, what uh, we have mentioned here. Okay, so your first node basically is called a root node. Okay, so all are nodes, right? And uh, the last one are called terminal nodes, but spe specifically the first one is called a root node. These are inner nodes because we have not e yet reached our decisions. We are still in the process. And uh, we, uh, and the last one, the last one where your decision has terminated, uh, they are called the leaf nodes. Okay. Okay. So, node a tree is made up of row nodes. The top node is uh, in a tree. Uh, you can also call this one as a root node. I, I already told you. Child a node directly connected to another node when moving away from the root. So this is the child. This is the child of this node. Correct. So I mean you get the sense, right? Parent, uh, the converse notion of a child. Uh, I mean, if, if this is the child, this is the parent, right? So you get that. And leaf is a node with no children. Okay. So this particular guy doesn't have any children under it. So it is called a leaf. Okay. So I think we have already seen these uh, examples. No need to go in depth of that. Okay, so uh, can anyone tell me? Uh, okay, okay, I, I'll I'll not ask this question here. So if you try to see, yeah, uh, if you try to think that what we have been telling each other, that what we try to overfit, do if you think it, think very in a detailed way, don't you think that decision tree is kind of trying to overfit? I mean, what is it doing? It is trying to take decisions, then going down and down and down, and then it's trying to come to a decision. And it is, let's say, I can always have a tree, okay, based on some decision, wherein I only have one, one person or one data point in a node. For example, if I go, go here on the last leaf, leaf nodes, if I go to a leaf node, there can be a certain condition that I build so many decisions down the ground and I reach a particular point where everything is one. For example, I only have one data point and I know that whether it is a yes or no or whether it is a high or uh, medium. Okay. I go so low. I mean, I've overfitted the data. I have come to the point that I'm seeing just a single point like we are, we did in KNN, right? If I see a single just a single point, I am overfitting. Decision trees can also, you know, go, you know, very deep down and try to overfit. Okay. So as a user, I need to control that. Okay. I don't want overfitting, right? We have already discussed this. Overfitting is ba bad. So I need to control my overfitting. So what does overfitting in decision tree, how can it be controlled? So decision tree is a recursive algorithm and it will keep splitting the data until each node contains pure set. Pure sets means, so for example, what is a pure set is wherein your Gini index is zero or you have a particular uh, class in the high, in, in uh, uh, having one probability equal to one and the rest as zero or I mean, it's a pure set. Okay, it doesn't have any adulteration. It doesn't have a mixed probabilities. It just has a single probability. Okay, so that is a pure set. So decision tree can go on since my 
the since my um, aim was to you know get the minimum Gini index, I can always have, go to a Gini index of zero. Okay, that is something that we uh, don't want to have it. Okay, just a second. Okay, so we get this. Now, this means that decision tree will classify, always classify the training data perfectly with the accuracy of one. So as I told you, so if I try to, you know, fit the whole data, uh, my I'll go to a certain point where my accuracy is equal to one. Training accuracy, mind that, okay? Training accuracy, not the testing accuracy. And this doesn't work on new data as the tree has learned from the noise from the training set and it's not general enough, okay? So if you have tried your best to fit in uh, the tree, uh, you have overfitted it and then you have gone with a training accuracy of one, you, you get a new test and you will completely fail. It's kind of draw the analogy from what we did in regression. Okay, I'll just uh, open my iPad and you know draw uh, the analogy so that it's easy to understand. You guys can see. Okay, perfect. So in a regression problem, I told you that if I have my data points like this and I try to draw a graph like this, this is over fitting. Right? We remember this. Decision tree, if I have nodes like this, So this term same here. So these terminal nodes will, you know, overfit. Okay. So in linear regression, what I told, we kind of regularize user regularization, and you know have kind of something which is less variance and high bias. The same thing we will try to do if this is high variance then I will try to control the depth of the tree okay so it means what is my regularization here I will say I don't want so here my regularization was what was it it was uh, sigma of beta j is j equal to 1 to p. These are the coefficients of your linear regression. So this should be less than some, let's say, s threshold. Here, your it's more intuitive to understand. So if your variance is increasing here, this side is your bias, high bias. So you're kind of wanting to achieve a, a midpoint, correct? And so what do I need to uh, control? I need to control the depth. Okay. So I need, I so depth is controlled by the number of terminal nodes. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and here also we have that. So let's say my terminal nodes at my most overfitted 
model you have 12 terminal nodes okay i want to con i want to keep this at a cap i want to cap it i want to say that my terminal nodes should be less than 7 okay so that's how you control the depth of the tree okay okay now let's get back to my screen Okay, so size of a tree, the number of nodes. So if I increase, my accuracy will be one. But what is this accuracy? This is the training accuracy. And this is my testing accuracy. So at one point of time, my training will start keep on increasing, but my test will uh, reduce. We learned this when we were learning uh, overfitting and underfitting okay so i think this is very clear so pruning pruning is a technique in machine learning that reduces the size of decision trees now pruning reduces the complexity of the tree classifier how it pruning is basically the cutting the tree from the nodes okay but there can be two types of uh, pruning there can be pre pruning and then they can be post pruning what is pre pruning pre pruning means i beforehand i i whenever i am building a tree let's say first cut i get two nodes second cut i get four nodes third cut i get eight nodes and my threshold is let's say seven so i don't take the third cut okay so i do not go into the third cut. So my all my tree is only restricted to two cuts, first and second. Now, what is post pruning? Post pruning is you build the whole tree, let it go till the last point, and then cut from below. Okay. So it has gone to the last node. Now from the from below, you're trying to go up and see which particular uh, let's say decisions don't make sense. And why we are doing this? Because we are seeing that, you know, your decisions should be more holistic. I should not stop the tree from growing before I've seen everything. Okay. So I should not restrict the tree to second cut when I have not even seen the 10th cut. Let it go to the 10th cut and then I will cut from the below and see which is the most optimum case. Okay. Now, in, in the most optimum case, what you'll see, you already ask the tree to go to the lowest possible point. Okay. What you see is when you come back to the top, to the your, to your root node, you see how each of the cuts had affected the Gini index. So let's say from ninth to tenth cut, the Gini index was not that great a drop. You come up to the eighth cut you say i don't want my tree to do the ninth cut then you see what was the difference between the gini index between seventh and eight okay and then you see if it is good then i'll keep it if it is not very uh even effective then i'll also not keep the eight cut and so on okay so you come back from the bottom and you start to ignore those cuts which don't i mean not ignore you take out those cuts which don't make much sense okay so that's how what pruning means so let's understand uh, what each of these means what is the max step the max step is the maximum depth of the tree 
I've already told you. So what is the depth of the tree in case of three cuts? It is basically three. So I don't want the tree to go beyond three cuts. Okay. Minimum sample sleeve. It means the minimum number of samples required to be a leaf node. So can you can you get a correlation between this? Can you understand this? Max step is something which is controlling the number of cuts. What is the minimum sample sleeve doing? It is also controlling the number of cuts. How? So let's say when I keep on cutting, the number of data sets in a particular node keeps on decreasing, right? Okay. Uh, I'll ex first I'll explain these two and then I'll draw it on my iPad so that you guys understand better. So minimum sample sleeve is basically the minimum number of samples required to be a leaf node. Why I while I go down, okay, I keep on decreasing the number of data sets in a particular node, okay, and since I keep on decreasing them, I can reach to a point where there are one data, where there is one data point, okay. So I control that, I, and I say no, I don't want to go that to that point. I just want to keep it till let's say 20, let's say 30, let's say 35, something like that, okay. Max leaf nodes is three cannot exceed the specified number of leaf nodes. So everything in essence is controlling the depth, the number of cuts. Do you guys get this or should I, you know, draw it and show it to you? Do you guys understand this? Okay. So we learned that there are three things. One is the max. One is the max step. One is the minimum sample. Yeah, yeah, I'm sh sharing the other uh, screen, the iPad one. Okay, now, so your tree basically is like this. Okay, so max depth is controlling this. Now, as I told you, when you keep on going down the number of data points in each node can go up to one. I mean, wh what I just told, I'm trying to overfit so much that each of this node is pure. And when it can be absolutely pure, when you have just high one data point, and that is high, or let's say if it is medium, there's no, no probability. It's a sure shot event, okay? So you're going so down, that you are you know trying to overfit so what do you say i want to control this parameter i don't want my tree to go to such a point where it just sees one data point in a leaf node maybe it can be let's say if it was 20 here it will be restricted to 20 it will not go down lesser than 20 okay and maximum number of leaf nodes is in how many number of leaf nodes you have these are leaf nodes right how many number of leaf nodes you have if i rest if say for example 
at this depth there are 40 nodes I restrict them to let's say 10 and I end up here so every every parameter out of these three is essentially controlling the depth now do you get this Awesome. Okay then, let's move on. Now I have, uh, I have uh, told you guys that decision trees can be used for all the all the thing that I have told you right now is for classification high medium low high medium low. What what if you actually had the uh, let's say you had the actual prices one lakh twenty thousand dollars or let's say ten ten or uh, one million dollars whatever. What if you have the income right? So in income, if you have a continuous variable, then what you will be reducing the RMC. Okay. Now, basically, what you will do, you are going to go down in a tree, and as you go down, there will you will be reducing the number of data points in a node, and these nodes will have an average price. Okay. Now. Let, let's just understand this first and then I'll draw it and show you so that you understand it better. So before that, okay, let me draw it only. Uh, just let's go through the point here. Easy to visualize and understand the model. That's that's it because you're seeing the tree in, uh, in your, you're seeing the tree. That's why it's easier to comprehend why the decisions have been made and it is more easy to visualize. Uh, least pre-processing of the data needed so it is very versatile when we code it we'll come to know why it is very versatile and helps identify irrelevant features now this is something that I think uh, uh, Sunil had uh, uh, Sunil and me had a discussion right when we were doing linear regression and you were asking that how or was it Sunil or I don't remember who asked me but uh, there was at this point you had to say they were asking that how do you you know check out the features which are relevant and not uh, not relevant so decision trees are one of the methods or one of the algorithms which help us to you know gives the user the information that these are the features which are relevant and these are not and uh, this is this comes very handy when you fit a model okay why it why it can tell which feature is important and which feature is not because it is taking decisions on single features and based on the Gini index it can say which feature is important or not. They are very fast. Uh, disadvantage is, is that kind of tries to overflit. Uh, okay, uh, this is very good. The second point I'll draw that on my iPad and show you. Uh, the divisions are only perpendicular to the axis. It is not uh, curved. Okay, and algorithm is greedy. I've already told you this. Uh, you may not find the best possible tree. Okay, so I need to make you understand two things, right? The second point and the first point. Okay, so let's go on to the iPad. So in a 
decision tree classification problem. and decision tree uh, regression right two things we want to see in classification what we had I'll again reiterate this right what we have is Gini index minimize in regression, what we have is RMSC minimize. Okay. So you have your Gini index minimize and RMSC minimize on, on either of side. Here you have Here you have probability distributions. Here you have what do you have here? So, for example, I'll go to the same. Uh, let me take another pen. Suppose you are not now trying to predict the um, price in a continuous variable. So earlier you had high, medium, low. Now you have actual numbers, 100,000, 120,000 and so on. Okay. So now, for example, you um, age greater than 40, yes and no. So for example, initially you have 100 data points. Now here six, you have 60. And here you have 40 okay these are the number of data points okay not uh, now these 60 data points will have something called uh, I mean they'll these 60 data points will have a price associated with it so I take the average I take the average here as a prediction. These 40 data points will have an average. I take this average as the prediction. So whenever a new data point comes in, test data point, I check his age and then I accordingly let's say the new uh, is 45. So it will flow from here and I predict this whatever was the average of those 60 data points. Similarly if it is 35 I predict this. So I think this is very clear. The other thing that I wanted to explain you is if you see this on a graph for example you want to see income and you want to see age and let's say your data points are like this whenever you're doing a split you're doing it up as a perpendicular or age let's uh, Okay, so you're doing a cut which is perpendicular and then you again cut on income which is a perpendicular cut. Age, this is 40. So whatever is greater than 40, whatever is less than 40. Income, let's say you cut on 100,000. So whatever is above 100,000, whatever is. It. So you're doing perpendicular cuts. What if, if your data is kind of circular what then if you do this cut and this this cut does it you know make any sense here 
so decision trees are good for cuts which are separable linearly so if your data is something like this okay so it can be linearly separable or then uh, but if you data is completely circular uh, or let's say it's if in a three dimension you say it's a spherical then decision trees will fail because decision trees will always have cuts which are perpendicular to the axis okay okay so i think uh, this is pretty much clear now let's move on to a new topic called bagging what is bagging bagging is basically a process in which you are basically taking random samples from the data with replacement and fitting the model individually on each of the sets and then taking an average now let's see what i may mean here a process in which random samples from the data so let's say you have 1 to 100 data points you take any 40 data point you fit a tree this is tree 1 you take next any 40 next any 40 okay random this this is random okay random samples with replacement with replacement means you take out you fit a tree and then you put it back in your data right so like like this you will you can fit 10 trees or 20 trees or 30 trees whatever number you can fit right and then if it's a regression take an average if it's a classification take the voting okay so basically your model is something like this is the number of bags you want to take okay so this can be 10 20 30 can be anything right and based on that those many number of trees will be formed so you this contains this actually contains each of these effects is a tree so you take an ensemble ensemble is or is for example an average average of whatever those 10 trees are saying for example let's say i have t1 on my first set of data t2 on my first set of data t3 on my third set of data sorry this is second set of data so like this you have this will have an output 
this will have an output this will have an output okay like this there will be 10 outputs if you have 10, 10 trees what do you want to do suppose you want to predict the price okay so feed in your test data in this tree in this one this one the same test data and then there will be outputs here 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 and then you take an average okay so basically taking an average of 10 trees how does it help it is remember always bagging enables you to see different parts of the data without any biasness to any part. So tree 1 has seen a certain part of the data, tree 2 has seen a certain part of the data, tree 3 has seen certain part of the data. Since I am taking randomly, there can be cases where they are same, I mean somewhat is similar but they will not be fitting on the same data. So everyone is seeing some parts of the data. It's like you you have like the example I uh, gave you yesterday. You have some problem. You ask your subordinates to go take this file and come out with insights. So your 10 subordinates will come up with 10 insights. As a manager, what you have to do is you take an ensemble or an average or a majority vote of all the insights that and get to the best solution. That's what your manager uh, that's what you should do as a manager, right? So everyone has their different biasness. Everyone has their different opinion and as a manager you are taking an average of all those 10 people Okay, so this is what you uh, need to do here Okay, so I think this is pretty much clear, okay uh, Now I will continue with this uh, and state another concept called random forest. Now random forest is one of the I mean uh, big concepts and one of the best concepts which you know is as a machine learning data scientist or I mean as a data scientist your first trial in a model fitting is through random forest okay so your first approach is towards random forest and it is a very important tool it it takes care of all the advantages of a decision tree but foregoes all the disadvantages of a decision tree how okay now we say we told that my tree one or let's say whenever I am building a decision tree it's kind of doing a greedy approach Right, we told this right. We, it is doing a greedy approach. It is trying to overfit. And what else? It 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 doesn't. Uh, so greedy approach is basically it doesn't know that whether this tree is the optimum tree possible or not. Right? It is doing. It is just seeing quick wins. It is seeing whether this decision will go to the minimum Gini uh, index perfect let's go yeah doesn't work on circular data also that's correct sorry. so uh, let us write that but I didn't write that because uh, neither will random forest be able to work on that but still I think it's a good point that you bought doesn't work on 
circular data. So this is one of the major problems of your decision tree. So what does random forest do? Random forest is very clever. What it does is takes a decision tree, forms 500 trees. That's how for the forest comes. The forest is made up of a large number of trees. This is an example. It can be 500, it can be 1000, it can be 1500, it can be any number. Not 15,000, not does not go so much. So anything between 200 to let's say 3000 is a feasible number. Okay. It employs the concept of bagging. And then the last, but the, the most important concept is random selection of predictors. Now this is the this is the most important part of random forest. So we know decision tree. It fits 500 trees or large number of trees. It employs the concept of bagging, what we saw here. All the trees, look like, like these 500 trees are fit, are being fit on different data, different random selections of the data. And the most important part it fits on random selection of predictors. For example, if there are 10 predictors or features, let's say, it doesn't take all the predictions into all the trees. For example, T1, T3, like this, T500. Uh, Vasan, okay, uh, I, I'll come to that. Why do we have, Vasan is asking, why do we have 200 plus trees in our data set. I, I'll come to that. Uh, that's a good question. Um, so I'll come to that. Let, let me finish with this and uh, I think you'll get the answer here. So it is fitting on D1. It is fitting in D2. These all D1, D2 are the part of the same data, but there are random selections. So this, this is a concept of bagging. What we saw. But even in the D1, I am taking random selection of the features. So for example, 10 predictors, I take, let's say, any four from them. Even in T2, it, it is taking any four of them. May not be the same. Again, I'm saying random selection. It is not taking the first four or top four or five four. I mean, uh, last four. It's not taking like that is taking random selection of features and building the tree on it. So T1 will be based on D1, which is a random selection of uh, random selection of the data as well as the random selection of features. Similarly, D2 will be a random selection of data as well as random selection of features. So for example, let's say you have 100 data points you have 10 predictors. Okay, let's say you have gender, you have occupation, you have um, work X, something, something like that. So in the first, first chance, it may take these four, or it will take these four, or it will take these four. Okay, so it's like this. It takes random selections, okay? and fits the trees and then it does the same thing and then it does the same thing as the bagging it takes an average or a majority vote of whatever these trees have told okay so now let's see if you are a, a, a test data comes. This is your new test data. It goes here, it gets an output. It goes here, it gets an output. It goes here, it gets an output. 
so it goes here gets an output takes an average and gives the value okay now coming to your question vasant why do we need 500 trees no one is saying that you need 500 or 200 plus trees you can take any number of trees but what we are trying to do here is we are trying to increase the randomness in the selection and more randomness in the selection the more is the probability of you landing into the best solution so since we told that decision trees have a greedy approach and this one since decision trees have a greedy approach and you never know that your decision tree that has been fit, fit is the best one you're trying to see random selection of predictors so for example when you're taking age you're not taking work ex let's say you're taking just age and occupation or let's say what we had here uh, what was the other feature we had age and income right age income and work ex okay age income and work ex right so for let's say first you take age and income then you take age and work ex then you take income and work ex and you if you take these different subsets think like that if you take different subsets the probability of that the problem that you always take age first and then income and then work ex reduces right because at this point of time you are just seeing income and work ex the next point of time you just work seeing work ex and age the next point of time you are just seeing work ex and or age and income so like this there will be uh, three combinations possible 3c2 so uh, so more the number of features so the uh, what you call the thumb rule is to have in a particular selection for the a particular tree so the thumb rule is a number of predictors in a selection should be equal to the root of number of features so any at any point of time a t1 so let's say there are total 16 features in the data t1 will take any four t2 will take any uh, four t3 will take any four so this using this you will any no tree will be biased of using a particular sequence every tree is seeing different sets of Uh, features and every tree will have different set of understanding so for example if you go to your subordinate problem right so if you give everyone different set of data and different set of data to play with people will come up with better insights right you give let's say you give uh, x guy you just give him you just see the top 100 rows rows and you just work on you basically kind of doing a divide and conquer you are asking him don't look at the whole data don't get confused so much what you do since you are best at this do this you give the y guy you since you are be better at this you do this you give the z guy since you are better at this you do this part and then each of this they come to you and say see we have got this from our part and as a manager now you'll take an majority vote or you take an average out of all these decisions that's how random forest works okay so random forest the name itself concentrate on the name the name itself states random random means i want to create more randomness in the system so that i don't get biased forest means i need to do this by constructing a lot large number of trees so bagging using bagging and using num random selection of features 
okay so is this clear now i think uh, we have gone a lot of depth in random forest that's great that's great i think uh, everyone is clear with this so let's take a 5 minute break i'm really thirsty uh, let me take some water okay i'll be back in 5 minutes okay uh, i'm back so any doubts amazing okay so i think uh, we are good here let's go ahead so i think uh, you can do this as a homework so uh, i'll just show you the code for decision trees uh, i think it's a very simple code
So uh, from sklearn import pre est is equal to est is the variable you are storing and est dot fit. Okay. So you see criterion is a Gini index. Max depth I have not specified anything. Okay. So if you want to do you can easily write here depth is equal to code or anything. So minimum sample, minimum weight fraction, don't go by this. Uh, max step and minimum sample sleeve is good enough. Okay, or minimum sample split. So minimum sample split is how many samples you require to have in your node so that you can carry out on the next split. Okay, so I think these are the so what you can do is for your homework kind of try to replicate this code for different max depth okay so kind of replicate this code for different max depth and see how the scores you know uh, vary then what you do, you try to um, replicate the code same for different minimum sample split and see how the scores vary. You'll see how your overfit and underfit will vary. Do the same thing for the random forest. So random forest is also same. Just, uh, you know, you can take max. Yeah, see here, max features. Everything else is same. You What you need to do here is max depth one and the number of estimators. So this is the number of trees. Okay, so if I, this is right now 10, uh, 10 I just put a random number. Uh, you can put anything, 200, 300. So write down this as a homework. Uh, max features is auto. It's max features is uh, like what I said. How many features you are taking as a random selection from the number of features? Okay, and take start from 200 n estimators and go to uh, let's say thousand with steps of hundred. So 200, 300, 400, 500, and try to replicate the same code for each of those and see how what happens so this is your homework and if you guys um, can do that that's amazing and if you have doubts any doubts on that uh, we'll come back to it next week okay so are we pretty good on uh, bagging random forest and decision trees then i'll introduce another concept now Everyone okay? Okay. So uh, uh, people are not uh, comfortable with the code as, as as I said. So I'll send you the code. Okay. I'll send you this notebook. What you have to do is you have to replicate the same thing. The cross validation. This is the cross validation and for different for example you had neighbors here neighbors was the hyperparameter here the hyperparameter okay yes yeah, Sunil, i'm just uh, coming to your question just wait for one minute uh so here your hyperparameter is what i said here you keep max step as your hyperparameter so start your max step from two and go up to ten and see how your cross validation scores change Similarly, for random forest, change the number of estimators from 100 to 1000 with steps of 100 and see how your cross validation scores. Uh, let's, let's go off. Cross validation. Try to replicate this. 
try to replicate this for random forest and try to replicate this for decision trees don't worry if it doesn't happen no problem but just try okay so that it becomes clear because if you don't code it yourself it is going to be very difficult to understand so i can do my best to explain you the theory but the coding part i can show you the syntax but at the end you have to code otherwise it will not help so just try this part uh, and sunil your answer to your question whether there is a data set for decision tree any data set which is classification can be used for decision tree any data set which is regression it can be used for a decision tree so you can use boston data set use decision tree in in just in case of classifier you just need to write regressor or you can use the iris data set that we saw last time yesterday what we use for logistic regression you can use the same data set for decision tree classifier is that okay does that sound good okay basan uh, are you good with the code i'll send you this notebook so you can have uh, a look at it and i just want you to replicate these are the hyper parameters i want to pick one you uh, pick uh, i want you to pick just one max depth and see for different max depth how it changes similarly here i want to see for different number of estimators how your scores change okay so you just need to in place of neighbors you just need to have that array and you need to find out uh, the scores for each of those arrays okay so i think yeah, this you can do no problem so i'll move on to the last topic for today i'll go to my ipad Okay uh can you guys see my screen Okay We come to a topic called boosting so till now what we have seen we were having a parallel approach t1 was working independently t2 was working independently t3 was working independently t4 was only like this 500 trees were working independently on different data sets and different set of predictors correct now boosting is little difficult a uh, dif different uh let's take uh this color boosting what it says is t1 you see d1 okay you try your best whatever you have you want to try try your best on d1 then give me whatever you could not it 
T2 will get this is the whole D1 okay this is the whole data set not D1 sorry T2 will get whatever T1 failed to fit. So let's say T1 was classifying. T1 was doing a classification problem on D and it was classifying yes, yes or no. There were 100 data points. 95 of them was predicted correct. 5 of them were wrong. I mean the actual was yes or no and I just predicted the reverse. I predicted no for yes and yes for no. So five of them were wrong. So T2 will say make sure when you pass me the data. Okay, sorry. Uh, one thing I told you wrong. This is D1 only. Okay. So this is a sample, random sample, not the complete data set. Okay. So this is D1. So uh, T2 will say, I will take D2, but make sure that the part which D you failed, T1 failed to fit for D1, make sure this part comes to me. I already have D2, that is okay, but I want to make sure that these five, so these five, should come to me so that I can do a better job at least to fit five so t2 does a good job t2 says okay I'll fit these five but in this process it missed a different a different number of three I mean different data set so um, so for example he also got 100 so he did a perfect jo job on these five but he since he was too much concentrating on this, he forgot to fit these th a different set of data sets. Three number, three items it did not fit. So your T3 will say, don't worry, I will fit this three. I already have something on my plate, but I'll do my best to fit this three. So like this, the series will go on. So this is called a series learning. Each of the next three tries to fit what the previous one could not so each of the next three tries to fit what the previous one could not do okay so every time it is boosting the error that was left by the previous okay. okay so this is what is boosting rest everything remains same you fit a large number of trees this is also of the order of 200 plus to 3000 okay and uh, you see the different number of data sets i mean different uh, uh, sets of data like d1 d2 yes but you don't see different predictors i mean you can do that you can see different number of predictors but usually it doesn't happen you don't see different number of predictors you do see different number of data sets okay so with this we can uh, conclude today's theory okay and uh, 
uh, okay one more thing I want to tell you this is done so Vasan you say uh, asking you're trying to fit all the data as in you're fitting subsets of data so for example 100 rows are there you're taking 20 uh, let's say 40 here you're taking another 40 here but you're making sure these five come so you're basically taking 35 from here but you make sure that these five come to t2 then again three have been left so it takes another 37 a different set of 37 but it makes sure that three comes okay like this so you try to fit all the data i mean it's again the same thing as bagging right the different set random sets of d1 d2 d3 okay okay so i think uh today was good uh, in, in in terms of phase we have completed a lot of things so what i will do is you will code the random forest and uh, a decision tree with the different hyperparameters okay as i told you and then i will show you one of the boosting algo algorithms and we will see how this increases the accuracy much better than all the previous algorithms we have seen next class we will do naive ways so just let me give a brief uh, picture of naive ways what is a naive ways algorithm so there is something called bayesian theorem in probability conditional probability let me write the uh, this thing first. Okay, so. Naive base works on this. Probability of y given x. So probability of y equal to let's say high, the same example what we saw, given x equal to let's say x is age equal to a greater than 40 is equal to probability of age greater than 40 given y equal to high into probability of high what does this mean is this is basically uh, what you could say is something like uh, it's a base theorem uh, simplification so everything in statistics is based on probability okay so what we are trying to say here is the probability of your price income or sorry the probability of a person buying a house of high price given that his age is greater than 40 is equal to what is the probability of a person having age greater than 40 given he has bought a high priced house into the probability of a high priced house 
forget this forget this don't concentrate on that understand this okay let me write uh, uh, prepare a data set Yeah, forget income uh, forget okay, it has frozen Suppose you have a data set uh, of just these points, okay? Now, this is called the likelihood. So what is the likelihood of a person whose age is greater than 40 given he has bought a, high, a house of high price? So if you take the high price houses, how many are those? High prices, how, how houses are 45, 47, right? So what is the probability that a person's age is 40 given he has bought a high price house is 1, right? All the people who have a high price house, he in this case, are aged greater than 40. So this is 1. What is the probability of high in your data set? So high is 2 divided by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Right? So basically 1 into 2 by 5 that is 0. 0.4 is the probability So whenever you have a test data set coming in and his age is greater than 40, so the probability of him buying a high priced house is 0.4. So this is naive base, we will continue, continue in detail in the next class, meanwhile just read about these two things that I write. One is a conditional probabilities and one is the Bayes theorem. Read about these two things uh, when we meet in the next class and uh, so today we will conclude and let me get to my yeah so today we'll conclude here if you guys have any questions we can have a five minute question answer session i'll unmute you guys
yeah so forum is open for questions any questions you have so does this help uh, drawing uh, simultaneously and explaining does this help yeah assuming uh, that was great but i think so if that drawing can come over our slide as previously we were writing over the slides that will be great okay because okay. this is as like context switching if you are going through the slides now you are moving there but earlier i think so and writing or writing that was stuck. that was the issue okay 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 I so, so what i'll do is i'll uh, uh, put the slides in my ipad so that uh, with the slides we can see on the ipad itself and uh for the code we will come to my desk laptop okay so when we do a coding because coding we usually do it at the last uh so code yeah. keep it in the laptop and uh, the slides and the writing will do that in the ipad that's okay right okay so one more question you means that but my question on, on the question said which are the predictors which we can remove so for that first do we need need to use this decision tree to remove a few of them and then later on okay so let's uh, we will we'll see that in the next class we'll see what is baruta plot i will show you on the wasm dataset how you can apply baruta plot and get uh, find out the relevant features i'll show you that next class okay and that baruta plot we have to do manually or no no, no. automatically there is some algo Okay. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Don't worry. I'll tell you next class. I'll show you how you can apply Baruta plot and get that and get the answer. Okay. So, the, what are the means? Uh, what are we are going to cover in next uh, week? Next Other class. Other than this, naive bias. Next week will be naive bias. Then will there will be support vector machine. Then there will be um, unsupervised learning clustering. and then uh, probably we can take up uh, gradient boosting um uh yeah so i think to next by next uh, sessions next two sessions we will close all the models and then on um, the next to next session will be a project work where when in we will try to apply all the models and see which is the best Okay, and then our last third, means third one will be our project work, which we have to do by ourselves. No project work, uh, I will do with you guys. So I will show you the. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and what is this K mean? Uh, means that is the median. Oh, uh, sorry, I mean. Uh, sorry. Root square. I uh, mean value we are taking. There is one more algo I was going to yesterday. K means. Okay. Model. Yeah, we'll go to that. Uh, K means clustering. That is an unsupervised learning model. We will go to that when we do unsupervised learning. Don't worry. Let's we'll see that. Okay, that's great. Thanks, sweet. Okay, no problem. Thank you so much. Uh, take care. Have a very happy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Happy week ahead. Thanks. Thank you. okay great so what we will do today is uh, we have little uh, tough things coming up today so first uh, so i think krishna kumar was not there in the last uh, one last sunday and he joined i think he left early saturday so i think i'll just do a quick revision for him as well as you guys so that you know uh, because trees concept that we learned is very important and hence we will once again visit that and so therefore let's see what we did last time
Okay. So essentially what we did last time is that uh, we started with decision trees and decision trees are a very important component of machine learning precisely because of the fact that these uh, models are you know very intuitive to understand and very easy to implement so uh, uh, you uh, just a second I'll mute you guys so if any question is there you can uh, um, just give me a chat okay Uh, just say a yes if you guys can hear me properly on my on the chat box. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so essentially what we did is that we understood uh, that a linear regression is a kind of a parametric approach. What is a parametric approach is that uh, we have a definite form on, of an equation which we want to solve. And uh, in this, what we were doing, we were minimizing our RMSC and obtaining the betas. Okay. Now, in a non parametric approach, we do not have an equation, we have a process. Okay. So decision trees is basically a process where we are kind of uh, partitioning the variable space and finding the appropriate prediction within that space. So for example, if my data is two dimensional and let's say uh, class one or the yes uh, uh, is this, uh, these all variables are yes prediction and this are no so decision trees is basically kind of having partitions so for example let's say uh, you want to predict whether um, you want to uh, come back to india okay so let's say this is uh, 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 what can I say? This is the population. So people, uh, according to the population of India, people think if the population is too high, very high in their city, they want uh, in the city they want to come, they will have a no. And if the population is kind of moderate below the threshold in the city, they want to come is yes. And let's say here it's uh, crime rate okay so if the crime rate is very high above the threshold so let's say in percentage basis let's say 60 percent okay so above 60 percent if the crime rate is uh, let's say 60 percent is uh, kind of uh, i mean it's just a virtual number don't get into the details of it what is 60 percent crime rate but just a virtual number so if, let's say crime rate is greater than 60 percent people don't want so if anyone asks you what if the population if you are coming to you if you want to come back to Vadodara which is has a moderate population and a less or low crime rate okay will, will you come will the person come back or not okay so that prediction will be yes okay so basically it's partitioning the variable space into some different segments so that your decision becomes uh, more accurate for that particular space so you can see for this space i'm kind of predicting no and for this space i'm kind of predicting yes so i have partitioned my decision space into two parts okay but this is very easy because they were uh, clearly separable so for example these were the no's and these were the yeses so you see that uh, the data is actually separable by linear boundaries okay but there can be many cases wherein you know the data will not be linearly separable by partitions and that's where we 
you know um, uh, have to have better algorithms but it is very human like so uh, we can do both things uh, we can do a regression also and a classification also so where what we did here is a classification okay uh, but for example if you want to uh, do a regression what will be the uh, so you have to have these partitions and then as as granular as you can go okay and for this partition you will predict the mean okay so for example uh, let's say your data is uh, So for example, if this is your data, okay, now uh, can be anything, okay, I'm not explaining with the uh, actual variables. So if your X and Y is there, so if you want to predict for some value, let, let's say this is X is greater than 250 and Y is uh, greater than 100, okay. So if someone asks what is your prediction and say for example, you are predicting Z and Z is a continuous variable, okay. So uh, so, uh, if someone asks you what is the uh, value of Z when X is less than, let's say, 260 and Y is, let's say, 101, okay? So, you have made your partitions. You can be ma making more final partitions also. Let's say you can have this also, this part, let's say, I'll color this. You can have this part in your partition. So, you can take the mean of it, okay? So, you take the mean of it and that's your prediction. So I'll not go into too much details uh, because we have a lot to cover today. So uh, we saw that uh, regression can be linear regression, uh, can be lasso, which is again a, a specific form of linear regression, um, which includes regularization, okay. Can be ridge, uh, same. Regularization can be elastic net, which we have just seen but not discussed. Okay, can be KNN, KNN we discussed last time, can be decision trees. Classification can be KNN, can be logistic regression, can be decision trees, okay. And also we learn at the end of the class what is random forest also. So random forest can also be used here and it can be used here also. Okay, now uh, decision trees, what we had seen is that. Yeah, quick. Yeah. Hey, yeah, quick question. Go ahead. Um, Given, yeah, I think I asked that. Given the data, how to determine uh, which which of these um, model to apply? Correct. How to decide? Correct, correct. So, uh, uh, one, we have a project uh, next week, which we have an end-to-end -end vis uh, vision of how to proceed. Also, today, I have something to show you uh, in terms of how, you know, uh, your model selection. But I'll draw something uh, after we revise this. I'll draw something on how your charter should look like okay so uh, how you should proceed but uh, more, nevertheless we have a, a kind of a trial today and then when next week we do the uh, project it will be very easy for you guys to understand how you should proceed okay okay so um, it's a human like decision ma making process we take decisions step by step now, we saw that the problem in a decision tree is that uh, the hierarchy of the decisions, okay? For example, if I have age, income, and work X, and I want to predict the price range of, a pers uh, price range of uh, the house that the person is going to buy, okay? Now, the decision tree will do a partition based on, let's say, age, then let's, let's say, it will further down, further down take a decision on income and then a work experience, okay? Uh, so, but who told this guy to take the age first? Why didn't it take the income first, okay? Or why didn't it take the work ex first? So we saw that this is kind of a uh, uh, problematic situation for a, pers uh, for, a uh, for a person who is trying to model because we don't want to give specific uh, uh, importance to a particular variable. So I think uh, this is where decision trees fails and you have to remember that this is called a greedy approach. 
uh, it doesn't not ensure global optima may land up in local optima okay so a greedy approach why because it just sees at a particular um, at a particular node or a particular division what is the reduction in the entropy and last time we had a very uh, um, you know detailed discussion of entropy so entropy is basically the loss function for a classification problem uh, um, krishna kumar uh, this is for you specifically uh, uh, because i think you didn't attend the sunday's class so that's why it may be a little, little difficult for you to understand this but like we had rmc for regression problem we have entropy for classification problem so classification problems always uh, deal with probabilities okay so whenever you are classifying a particular um, in a space uh, whenever you are classifying yes or no or high or low you you will associate some probabilities to it okay you don't say directly high or low you say high is let, let's say its probability is 0.6 and low is 0.4 okay and those both should be equal to 1 so uh, what gini index says is basically here m denotes a particular node and k denotes the number of classes okay so what we have seen is in a particular node okay uh, let's say when I, whenever i am doing um, income greater than 10000 division so let's say my whenever i divide my uh, this this the problem what we are trying to do is price range okay so let's say high or low these these are the only two classes okay high is greater than $200000 the price of the house uh, medium is uh, medi let's not consider medium uh, uh, we have low here okay low is less than one uh, less than 200000 let's say it. okay so uh, at a particular node what is the entropy so at this point let's say your high and low distribution okay so uh, you have let's say you are ha having a filter of that you have already take only taken people whose age is greater than 40 you have landed up here okay in this node now in this node you want what is your entropy that you have uh, let's say your high is 0.6 your low is 0.4 so entropy is 0.6 into 0.4 okay now you want to say whether this next decision will make sense or not okay so what you'll do you'll see here let's say here your high becomes 0.8 and here become a low becomes 0.2 and here your low becomes 0.7 and high becomes 0.3 okay so what is your change of entropy your change of entropy is basically from 0.6 into 0.4 okay you have come down to 0.8 into 0.2 plus 0.7 into 0.3 okay so this change should be maximized okay this change should be maximized i mean you should end up in a um, uh, i mean your entropy should reduce okay so this this part okay this part should uh, go on so when will it be maximum when will the entropy be maximum when your high is when high is 0.5 and low is 0.5 at this point of time your entropy will be maximum as you go closer to one let's say this goes to one this will be zero this entropy will become low and as it approaches one one of them one of them approaches one then the entropy becomes zero so your objective is to as you go down the tree your entropy should go on reducing okay so uh, the, let, let's see the formula here where is the formula so here if one is one equal to one the other will be zero so in that case entropy will be zero okay so remember this always that whenever you are building a decision tree or a classification problem you are trying to go to an entropy zero 
whenever you are dealing with a regression problem, we are trying to go to an RMS equal to zero. Krishna, is this clear or do you want me to go into a little more detail? Because for others, I think I showed all the calculations and all. So for others, I think it will be pretty clear. Okay, Krishna, it's clear. That's awesome. Okay. Mm. Okay. Now. So we have discussed. Uh, so after this, what uh, we have seen that. Uh, okay, what was this regarding? Huh. So how do you do a prediction in decision trees? Okay. So for example, your decision tree is constructed such and then a new data set, a new test data comes in. And what you have to do is basically check its age. Okay. Uh, check what whether i mean whether it is higher or lower than the threshold then you go down then you check the income and then like this you kind of flow through your decision tree and then come to this prediction okay so this is how your test data will flow in a decision tree so as i said this doesn't have any equation it's kind of a process okay uh, okay we saw this okay now uh, in uh, in regression, uh, we saw that why did we go proceed with uh, Ridge and Lasso is that because we want to, to regularize the, uh, uh, the RMC. I don't want to overfit. I don't want to fit, uh, have a line which is trying to overfit. Okay. So here we had the concept of Ridge and Lasso. Okay. Here what we have is called pruning. Okay, so pruning is basically you don't want your tree to go on dividing and dividing and dividing unless and it uh, kind of goes to a single point. Okay, so what we discussed is we are kind of having the similar data set in a particular prediction. I don't want you to have so many partitions so that every point is you know falling into a single partition. So that is called overfitting in terms of trees. Okay, so as you as you can see if i go down my variance will increase and my bias will decrease okay sorry yeah bias will decrease and variance will increase whereas when you go up my variance will decrease and bias will increase so your optimum solution will be somewhere in the middle okay so uh, that's how you kind of uh, tune your model in decision trees okay so what are the uh, ways you can tune a model is uh, one is the max depth you are restricting your uh, depth of the tree to a certain number of nodes okay so let's say um, you want to keep or let's say not exactly nodes you want to restrict the number of cuts so this is one cut this is two second cut I mean uh, levels first level second level third level fourth level like this, this is called the depth. So how how deep you want to build your tree. OK, so this this is kind of, you know, restricting the depth of the tree. Then you have uh, or you can also use the minimum sample sleeve node. I mean, after certain points, so each of these nodes will keep on. Uh, so this is your full data. OK, then this will be some X. And this will be full data minus x like this your uh, each nodes each node will go on having lesser lesser number of data points so let's say this is x by 2 and x by 2 so each node will decrease so i don't want to go to a point where each node will contain one data point okay so i want to uh, restrict that uh, with the minimum samples leaf node i can restrict my node to have at least minimum samples of let's say 20 data points okay so after 20 data points i don't want any uh, the tree to go any deeper okay so uh, and the other one is the max number of leaf nodes okay the max number of leaf nodes is basically these are called leaves where, which do not have a child so as you see as you go down your number of leaf nodes will increase okay uh you want to restrict that so let's say you just want three leaf nodes okay so you just restrict till here 
I mean till here after that you will not go down okay so these are the ways you can you know prune your trees okay or let's regularize your trees okay now uh, we have seen that what is a de decision tree classification and what was the regression okay uh, I think this is clear Uh, okay, so uh, we have already seen that the partitions made by decision trees. Yeah, Krishna, uh, you have a question. I'll just unmute you. Just hold on. Yeah, Krishna, go ahead. Yeah, uh, if you go to the three points you told, right? Just go one step up. The three points you told. How to consider the decision trees? Like, yeah, yeah. No, no, the the minimum uh, yeah this one right so the second point you're telling minimum a sample leaf node right yeah then the third point you're telling maximum number of leaf node correct right huh. so it basically contradicts each other right no 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 so what we are trying to say is maximum number of leaf nodes i mean you want to restrict that to a point let's say i don't want three d c minimum samples as in minimum samples inside a leaf node okay samples yeah, that, that's great so so the minimum sample uh, uh, in a leaf node you are telling say 20 right correct so but if you you the, you'll get the number of nodes the maximum number of nodes is the deeper you go you get more nodes right correct so whatever hits first will be your uh, uh, will be your uh, this thing uh, will be the stop for your algorithm so for example you have restricted uh, to maximum number of leaf nodes you have restricted to let's say seven okay so you don't want more than seven leaf nodes at the base of your tree but okay. you have said that uh, i don't want minimum samples leaf node uh, to be less than 50 okay now let's say your 50 has already reached when your minimum leaf i mean the number of leaf nodes were four but you have kept this okay. at seven so your algorithm will stop at four only Oh, okay. Okay. So it, it basically takes this particular uh, 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 points into consideration, and like uh, sequentially, like it no, takes no. the maximum, no, it, then no. minimum sample, no, or no, not, it is something defined. Not sequentially. What it will do is you 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 keep you feed this into the algorithm. Okay. So you never know at what depth, what number of nodes will be there, or at, in a single node, how many samples will be there. You never know, right? So as a user, yeah. as a user, and there can be certain cases where your depth is not reaching. Okay. So for example, your depth is let's say 10. You are uh, good to go till 10 level. Okay. But at let's say the fifth cut, there's a single node which uh, has let's say only 10 samples. So oh, okay. your depth has not reached yet, but there is a, at a certain point, there is a node which is only having 10 samples. So your algorithm will stop at the fifth point. Fifth okay, point. It will not go to. So anyone, this is first, hey. uh, I mean, uh, whichever comes first, it will stop. Oh, okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. So uh, we have seen this uh, now. Uh, Okay, so what we were discussing is that uh, the uh, the challenge with the decision tree is that uh, the cuts will be only always made perpendicular to the axis. Okay, so if some if you have a completely circular data, okay, then whatever you do, I mean, you'll get a bad accuracy. So, so that's why where your exploration of your data um, comes handy, where you want to uh, see the data and uh, Feel, I mean, see which model will work the best. Okay. Now, after that, what we uh, discussed is bagging. A bagging is a process in which uh, now stand alone. If you consider decision trees, they are not very good in prediction. Okay, because there are high chances of overfitting. There are high chances of underfitting. Okay, so you cannot have a decision tree standing alone and fitting your data. So it is not very uh, accurate. Okay. So here comes uh, your saviors. So what do you do then? Then you started bagging. Bagging, uh, it's a separate process, okay? So 
now you have learned decision tree now bagging is a process you combine decision tree to a bagging and then you end up with a random forest model so what is bagging let's un let's understand so bagging is a process in which random samples from the data with replacement are taken up and model is uh, you fit a model on that individually on each of the sets and then take an average so um, let's say you have 100 data points you take you have told that you want to take random samples of let's say 20 points uh, with the replacement so and you want to take 1000 samples so each sample so basically what you do is like you have 100 data points you take 20 samples uh, not 20 samples I mean 20 data points okay okay now you you have taken let's say thousand samples like this if you do without replacement then what how many you can take only five you can take right 20 into 500 but since I have said with replacement since I have said with replacement I can take any number of samples because I am replacing the data so you have taken thousand samples each 20 will have a different tree Okay, so each sample will have will have a different tree and then each of the tree will have an output which will be averaged in case of regression voted in case of classification. Okay. So each tree, uh, thousand trees will have. So what? Why you're doing this? This is, uh, it's kind of a statistical concept where uh, you don't have to um, go into depth of what it is, but uh, just remember this. Whenever you average out. uncorrelated variables the variance decreases okay so uh, okay don't go into depth uh, uh, because uh, I mean it's a statistical concept or if you want I can show you uh, I mean derive this formula but it's a more hypo um, keep it uh, so okay I'll, I'll tell you only so X and when uh, let's say variance of X and variance of Y okay now if you take the sum it's variance of X and Y so this is variance of this is X squared this is Y squared Okay, if, if the mean equal to zero and all. So if uh, variance of x y, so this is variance of x plus variance of y plus two into covariance of x and y. Now if the if x and y is uncorrelated, right? So this will be zero. So basically variance of x and variance of y. So variance of x plus y will always be lesser than variance of x plus variance of y. Okay, so uh, just uh, I mean don't go into depth of this but just remember for example if you have two multiple variables which are uncorrelated uncorrelated means they are separate they are not associated in any terms okay so uh, whenever you add these uncorrelated items what will happen is you will end up in a result which is more uh, which is less variant okay less variance which has less variance Imagine a scenario where we discussed, right? So, for example, you have a particular file which you have given to, for example, if you are given to a particular subordinate, will he'll come up with some a single insight? Okay. Now you think he has looked so hard into uh, this file, 
he is biased to her towards his thinking okay so what do you do you kind of uh, give this file to 10 of the subordinates and ask them to look independently okay independently is that they are uncorrelated okay so, so they work separately you said that you give this file to 10 of your subordinates and ask them to look at independently okay so what they will do is they'll go in separate rooms uncorrelated and come up with a better insight which is less biased more i mean less biased uh, and uh, less bias in that uh, uh, let's say english sense i mean uh, in uh, mathematical or statistical sense is less variant okay so it's less variant in uh, their insights and they'll come up with a better insight so 20 people contributing to your uh, insights separately is much more valuable than a single uh, guy hitting his head on a particular file okay so that's why the concept uh, the similar concept uh, comes okay so um, this is where your bagging will improve your efficiency right because your thousand trees are uh, operating independently on the same data sorry on the different data points and having different uh, uh, values then you take an average or you do a uh, classification if you're doing doing a classification you take a vote okay so we have seen all these things. Uh, so uh, this, uh, the visual is also, I think, clear. Uh, okay. So bagging, uh, if you go to the right, uh, you see bagging enables you to see different parts of the data without any biasness to any part, okay? Now this is the same concept that carries forward to the random forest. So random forest, what it does is it, is, um, it takes all the advantages of a decision tree but uh, foregoes all the disadvantages so as i said that and uh, i why did the decision tree choose the first variable as the first variable or the second variable as the first variable there's a particular reasoning of the entropy but in case of random forest what it is doing it is following bagging and on top of that it is also doing random selection of prediction uh, predictors so let's say there are 10 features Every time it will take for the first data set, it will take first four features. For the next data set, it will take the next four features. Okay, so it is kind of you don't want every uh, subordinate to look at the. So, for example, the same example, you are giving parts of the data to different subordinates and different variables you are giving. So, for example, uh, your A subordinate will see only these variables your b subordinate c will see a completely different set of variables your c subordinate will see completely different set of variables so the chances of them cheating or correlating gets lesser right and that's why you come you come up with even a better uh, result than bagging what it used to be because bagging everyone was seeing the same variables okay so they might you know discuss uh, i mean cheat or correlate uh, within themselves saying oh you also seen this i have also seen this i think this is the uh, insight so they might come up with the same kind of insight but even if you give them different variables okay they don't have any scope of cheating okay it's kind of different question papers different uh, sequencing of questions papers and different questions also okay so there's no uh, probability of cheating or there's no probability of correlation in between the trees okay so when they come up with uh, to you you have all sets of different answers without any biasness so that's why uh, the random forest you know uh, excels so for example if your decision tree is let's say 30 percent accurate your random forest will may, may become 70 percent accurate that's how the difference comes so always remember in statistical knowledge okay whenever you're trying trying to average out your variance will reduce and that's why your model will become even better okay now just hold on for a couple of minutes i'll just be back
Okay, uh, can you hear me? Okay, uh, let's continue. So, uh, so we have already seen this uh, increases the randomness in the selection. That is very important. Uh, the thumb rule is that your number of predictors in a single selection is equal to the num root of number of features. So if you have 16 features, uh, the random forest will take four of them at a particular with a particular data set. Okay. Uh, so I think until this point, it is clear to everyone. I hope. Okay. Now. Uh, so basically we have seen decision tree, we have seen uh, bagging, then we saw decision tree plus bagging, that is the random forest. Okay, now next is basically boosting. Now, uh, till now what we have talked is, you know, how to average out, how to, you know, do your increase or increase your bias or reduce your variance in the model and, you know, increase the independence of uh, people seeing that but there's something called I mean then it may be uh, this something called boosting which says I agree with you that randomness is required but what about the fitting part I mean if everyone see, does not see and you're saying that uh, um, everyone will work independently then you might even not get a good uh, prediction right there's always some importance in uh, you know having discussions right so boosting is kind of a system which is very interesting same thing you have the all the concepts are random forest okay so you have number of trees let's say thousand you have different number of predictors but only difference is in random uh, yeah, you have different data that is also there okay um, but the only difference key difference is that your t1 t2 t3 t4 t till t500 in random forest they were kind of you know um, working independently here what it does is it says let me see if I have the drawing. Okay, I don't have the drawing here. So it says, hey, T1, you take the D1, you take P1 with it. I mean, D1 is the data and P1 is the predictor. Okay. You do whatever you can. Okay. You do whatever you can with this set. I will take D2 and P2 with me, but just pass me whatever you could not fit. I mean, let's say you give someone, give uh, A a data set. He says, sir, according to my business knowledge, I have, you know, worked on this data. I could do this much. I, uh, let's say this, your T1 is kind of a supply chain expert. He says, I have looked all the parameters regarding the supply chain. It's kind of how consultancies work. Okay. I don't know what is the manufacturing side of it. You please give to T2. So T1 says, I could not fit this part. T2 says, okay, no problem. I will take D2 with me, but also make, make sure that the part which you could not fit comes to me. Okay. So I will work on those. So T2 will try his best to work on these elements, but T2 will again fail on some part some different part y which he could not fit so this will y will go to t3 and similarly z will go to t4 and like this till the 500 trees are done you kind of hope that everyone with their own knowledge has kind of solved the problem okay so there is a little bit of 
collaboration in boosting okay so everyone is saying but there is no correlation okay keep keep in mind there is no correlation no one is discussing their problem he is saying that i could not fit this hence you do this okay so everyone with their own business knowledge or business expertise will kind uh, kind of you know fit the data okay so remember correlation is always dangerous whenever you are trying to reduce the uh, variance okay so there is no correlation this is not correlation everything is same okay everyone is working independently but now t1 is saying okay i could not do this i don't have this much of expertise i think you are a better guy who can solve this so it's kind of flowing flows like this so it's a kind of a series learning each of the next three tries to fit what the previous one could not do okay boosting the error that was left by the previous trick and hence the name boosting okay yes sunil uh, we have uh, bagging and boosting uh, with an example so today um, uh, we will see um, random forest with uh, cross validation and how the different max depth uh, different max depth uh, increases or decreases the r square for your project next week we have everything uh, coming from bagging and boosting okay so uh, we will see that okay now uh, okay now we are starting a different uh, okay now let's first start with as support vector machines and then we'll go on to uh, boosting a uh, naive ways because uh, a support vector machine is kind of a similar thing okay <clears throat> now okay let me first draw uh, what we have you know seen uh, as a so uh you are given a data first okay so you have the data you do you first do cleaning that is omit missing values okay scale or do a feature engineering okay we have seen uh, we'll see all these when we do our project okay so uh, how you know mm, this process is followed okay after you do this your next step is find the best model okay now here is what your expertise will lie in okay so how you see before that i forgot a step something called exploration now exploration is basically visualize how your data looks like after you see how your data looks like you will be able to see whether your 
it's a regression problem whether it's a classification problem okay if it's a regression problem start with a linear regression okay see the test rmc or cross validation score what we saw in the last class okay let's say it's around 70% okay next is to go for a regularized linear regression see the cross val score i'm not writing the test rmc because it's essentially the same thing let's say it is 75% okay so you are good till now now let's go to a non linear model like decision trees see the cross val score let's say it is 81% okay mind you it might be that decision tree reduces your um, score okay so um, it may become 65% also so but the a good approach is that you have to follow these steps uh, or it's not something written in concrete as you become more pro in model fitting you straight away start with random forest or you know uh, go with a better models uh, straight away but uh, like boosting and all directly but as a beginner you'll all, you should always follow this step it's more you know uh, good it's kind of hygienic approach to do okay ha huh. uh, one thing i forgot to hear it mention here is very important part is after you decide this right before the model fitting i think i've already mentioned this in the feature engineering but a uh, special mention has to be there about feature selection okay a feature selection is very important okay i mean uh, it's kind of can make your model a garbage or can make your model uh, uh, the best okay so feature selection is very important now how do you do a feature selection so when you do uh, if you do a linear regression a feature selection is always connected with the model okay it's not an independent uh, uh independent process okay it's always connected to the model so for example you start if you start with a linear regression okay then what you do is you see the coefficients of the variables okay we'll see this how this is important okay similarly uh, regularized linear regression if you do a uh, lasso then it will automatically remove uh, the uh unimportant if you do a ridge you still need to see the coefficient of the variables okay now here comes the very important interesting part that is your non linear model whenever you do a non linear model so feature selection
is very easy here. So in a decision tree, not specifically decision tree, I'll say uh, now I'll term decision tree and random forest in the tree based modeling. So random forest gives you a very, very powerful tool called the Baruta plot. Okay. The Baruta plot is a very powerful tool to find the important features. Okay. We will see this today, how this will, uh, this can be done in Python. So it's a very important tool uh, to do a feature selection uh, using random forest algorithm. So it's the base of Baruta plot is a random forest algorithm. Okay. Now, after you do a random forest, you, uh, or you do a feature selection, and then you uh, implement a random forest, you again follow this step, cross well score. Next, you move on to boosting. So boosting is basically, you also see again a cross well score. Let's say it's equal to 89%. Now, why pro people generally start with random forest is basically of Baruta plot. Okay, Baruta plot is a very powerful feature to ex understand the variable, which uh, linear regression does not give. Uh, I'll also tell you the answer. Uh, if anyone has the answer ready, I think uh, that's good. But uh, why, why random forest is, you know, having a better power to find the features is basically it is considering the interactions. So in random forest, as we said, the T1, T2, T3, and it is doing P1 on D1, P2 and D2, P3 and D3. Okay. So it is kind of seeing every variable and it kind of right now, now knows that which variables are important. So when in P1, let's say it is considering the first four features, it knows that within that first, first four, four feature, which are the importance because of the Gini index. Now in let's say P20, again, these four features will be repeated. And obviously if you have thousand trees that are being built and you just have, let's say 10 features, then there are obviously chance there will be repetitions, right? So let's say in P20 again, in T20, these four features will be repeated. Okay. Again, it will see which ones are important according to the Gini index. So overall, it is getting a feel that out of thousand iterations, my age whenever age has come into the P1 or PI, whenever age I have taken age, age is always on the top. Okay. So age is always on the top. It means age is important irrespective of whatever I see, whichever data point I see or whichever set I see. So you see here it is taking interaction. So age might come here with a different set of variables. Age might come here with a different set of variables. Again, in P, let's say 100 age may come with a different set of variables. So it is saying that age in the presence of other variables is important or not. Okay. So it's kind of plots a box plot. If you guys know what is a box plot, otherwise a box plot is basically your, this is your median. This is your first quartile. And this is your third quartile. So what are quartiles is basically um, uh, if you, let's say, arrange your data in ascending or descending order. So uh, the first 25% is the first quartile, 50% is the median, 75% is the third quartile. Okay. So it kind of says, let's say uh, um, this is the importance and this is the age. Okay. So it says out of thousand trees, my important 
slide between 95% to 80% with a medium of let's say 85% means this is very important. Now another um, feature may be like this. My importance varied from uh, let's say 70% this is 65 million and 60% so income so income is kind of lesser than age it gets a second rank age gets the first rank but nevertheless it's important what random forest or a baruta plot is that does is it's it's very powerful it's very intelligent what it does is it creates a random noise as a variable on the fly so whenever you start a um, random forest algorithm okay it creates a random noise and sees what is the importance of this random noise so this is your benchmark okay this is a benchmark box plot whatever is greater than what is what let's say its importance is let's say 50 percent or let's say its importance is 40 percent in the graph in the data so whatever is greater than 40 percent i mean whatever is greater than the noise is important whatever's importance is less than the noise this is not important so let's say your work x was only 30 percent important it means work x is kind of a predictor which is even worse than a noise to the data so i don't need that why will i keep a variable which is you know worse than the noise uh, to predict okay so it will not keep that variable in the uh, system so it it will give kind of a unimportant tag we'll see uh, what it gives okay so Baruta plot is very important. So once you become a pro, uh, normally what you do is you straight away start with the Baruta plot, get the features, do a random forest. Why people normally do a random forest is basically it's very intuitive and it's very easy to explain your superiors but if accuracy is more important to you then go for a boosting okay so this is typically uh, how you should operate when you become a pro for now you should follow this the top one i'm sorry there's a lag i think uh, so just pardon me for that so uh, you do a linear regression then you do a like regularized linear regression then do go with a non-linear model okay go with a decision tree and then do a baruta plot uh, feature engineering and then go for a random forest okay so this is how typically you should um, start this is what we talk for reg uh, regression what about classification okay classification is kind of the similar thing so uh, you start with the logistic regression you don't have a regularized logistic regression so you then straight away go to a decision tree you go to a random forest feature selection And then you go to a it's kind of the same thing you are you do okay you can also have knn somewhere in between but people generally don't like knn as i told that it is kind of a lazy up learning approach and it uh, consumes a lot of computational power okay now this is clear right now what i had so 
uh, up all this is okay right so your tree all this is a kind of a tree approach okay this is kind of a linear uh, approach okay now classification okay i had uh, one thing to you know tell you so previously we were measuring accuracy okay so normally in classification you have something called a confusion matrix this is your actuals or uh, yeah sorry it's all the way around so you have actuals here you have predicted here suppose let's say you have 100 data points there are 90 yes 10 no okay in a data set this is called typically called an imbalanced class problem wherein yeses are much more than the nos okay it's typically called typically called an imbalanced class problem so for example out of 90 yes actuals 90 yes let's say uh okay now for let, let's say this is for yes so you have predicted yet 80 so 80 actuals so this is called true positive false positive true negative false negative so uh let's say this is actual yes and no and this is predicted yes and no okay now out of 90 actuals you have predicted 80 truly you can oh, sorry yeah, this is uh sorry okay so out of uh 90 actuals yes so this is the column for actuals yes so this 80 plus this should be 10 right so basically out of 90 actuals 80 you have predicted correctly and 10 you have predicted wrong so this is i think false positive and this is false negative yeah so you have basically uh uh just a second one thing i need to check okay no i, I think i was correct earlier okay. this is false okay so out of 90 yeses you have predicted 80 yes correctly and 10 wrong so these are called false negative i mean you have predict predicted negatively i mean in a wrong way you have predicted uh, 10 as negative but they are actually yes actually why positive okay so just to make this make your life simple i'll just mark this as positive and negative just these are two classes okay so this is this will make more sense so if your if your actuals are positive and you have predicted positive then it's a true positive you have done a good job hooray so out of 90 positives you have predicted 80s as correct but then it means the rest 10 you have corrected predicted wrong right so you have predicted negative for a positive similarly for actual negatives so actual negatives are 10 so this is 10 and this this was 90 so out of 10 negative okay let's say you have predicted 6 wrong as positive and 4 correct as negative is everyone understanding this table this is very important uh, should i redraw again i think it's too clumsy and uh, i'll redraw again it's
Okay. So uh, as I said that there are 90 yeses and 10 noes. Okay. So out of let's say 90 positive. Okay. You have let's say predicted 80 are correctly and 10 wrong. Similarly, out of 10 no's, you have predicted 4 wrong, 6 correctly. And now, what is the overall accuracy? Overall accuracy is TP plus TN divided by total. So, uh, total is 100, TP plus TN is 86. So, your overall, uh, your accuracy is 86%. Good, right? Overall accuracy is good, not bad. But if you see an interesting part, let's say I don't do anything, okay? I don't do anything. I mark everyone yes, okay? Even without the model, if I mark everyone yes, what will be my accuracy? It will be 90%. You did so much things. You did so much of trouble, you landed up with an accuracy of 86%. I presented this to my boss and my boss says, what is this? If I predict everyone yes, still I will be 90% times correct because 90% of the data is yes, right? So, accuracy is not a very good measure to, you know, predict your uh, or measure your classification accuracy, okay? It is, can be very misleading in especially in this case when you have a imbalance class problem. So what to do then? So people said let me divide this problem into two. Let's see how good I am predicting the positives and how good I am predicting the negative. So how good I am predicting the positives? I predicted out of 90 positive, I am predicting 80 positive. So this is, uh, this is around 90%. Okay. And how good am I predicting the negatives? Um, I am predicting the negatives 60% bet. Good. Okay. Which is good. Okay. Now, if I say I'm still at 90%, if I even replace yes to all, I'm still at 90%, but this, this does not make sense. Always you would see in a business problem, the classes which are, you know, less, uh, would I would say less populated in the data, you always need to predict this. So for example, credit risk or credit, credit default. How many people do you think default on the credit out of, let's say, if you have uh, a base of a lakh customers or a million customers, how many do you uh, think uh, default? Max to max, I think 100, okay? So you just have, uh, out of a million, you just have 100 people, you know, who may default because if it is too much default, then the bank will go bankrupt, right? So always the business need is to predict the class which is less populated in the data. So when you were just randomly giving yes to everyone, your accuracy was 90% in terms of the yes, but you are, you were zero, zero accurate in predicting the no. Here you are 60% accurate. Okay. Here you are 60% accurate. Now your objective is to increase this, but in classification, there, there is some, there's very, something called very, something very interesting is you can always have thresholds. Okay. So as I told, what is the threshold? Threshold is something, let's say, um, whenever I am running an algorithm, I'm getting predictions, let's say point in terms of probabilities, 0 0.7, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0.9, like this, I'm getting properties. I can always set my threshold so that this can be 100%. Okay. I go to the lowest and say if this is less than this, I go to the highest low, uh, highest probability in terms of no. And I keep that as a threshold and say below this, I'll always predict uh, less than um, this thing. I mean, I'll predict uh, low for that. You can always have a threshold and this is on the user, right? You, 
it's not even in the hands of the model so you can always manipulate uh, the threshold but the interesting part is if you try to manipulate this your this part will go haywire i mean the positive accuracy will go down drastically if you try to increase this you'll lose this if you try to increase this this you'll lose this okay so i think there's a lag sorry uh, so uh, that's why it, it may sound weird when i'm uh, when i'm saying and drawing anyways so there's always a fight between increasing your positive class and increasing your negative class accuracy the thing is that you need to have your better business understanding in which uh, you want to ask whether you need the negative classes most or the positive classes most um, but uh, yeah this is so mathematicians came up with an interesting formula this is called the harmonic mean of the positive and negative accuracies so if you have a number a and your number b so your harmonic mean is basically okay so 1 upon a plus 1 upon b or uh, 2 upon this so this is called the this is the harmonic mean formula why harmonic mean harmonic mean has a very interesting quantity i mean an interesting property harmonic mean of two numbers a and b will only increase when both increase so for example if you have arithmetic mean this is called the arithmetic mean so for example your b can be 0 and a can be 100% you still have a 50% accuracy but that is not the case of harmonic mean in a harmonic mean both should be high then only your accuracy so for example if you are uh let's say this is 100% so this is 100 and this is 0 so 1 upon 0 this is infinite so infinite or so something divided by infinite is 0 so it means if one is 100% and one is 0 you basing basically getting a zero accuracy but in an arithmetic you will get the 50% accuracy right so it uh, that's why whenever you do a classification problem you try to reduce this harmonic mean and if you opt sorry not reduce increase the harmonic mean and if you know that your harmonic mean has is the max that will be the best model possible okay so you have to maximize your harmonic mean in statistics this is called f score okay so this is called f score uh, so every classification problem you'll from now uh, we will try to see what is the f score of the problem okay and not the accuracy is this clear everyone is happy with the explanation anything more you want on this this is very important and a very interesting concept in classification so, so just a uh, question yeah uh, this harmonic mean it will be always maximum when i think a is equal to 50 b is equal to 50 right Yeah, yeah. Mathematical. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's so basically. So how basically, do you? No, not. I don't think. Uh, uh, if let's say if you are, it's hundred percent here. So let's say you are two upon one by hundred plus one by hundred. If both are hundred percent, then no, this will be hundred percent only. No. Both can be hundred percent, right? If your model is very good, uh, then. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, you are saying that individual consider. Okay, got it. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have to strike a balance. Okay, I got it. Yeah, understood now. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? So Neil, why you, are you so quiet today? You are not asking any questions. <laughs> yeah. I think he sorry for that. No, now I think I am not on mute. So basically, frankly speaking, I am not understanding most of these things. Um, not due to concept. Basically, I want to see data in action, uh -huh. end-to-end -end story, and for for that, I have to wait 
for last his project sets and i don't know why because uh, i have learned at least around 5 or 7 all goes to do this but still i am not confident enough to go a small problem into end no no that see that hands so the, that uh, basically is, yeah i agree so with you i agree means you are teaching well there is no doubt on that but from my side i am losing my interest okay i mean so after the support vector, vector matrix will come there will be one more two all will come mm-hmm. and after that means this is more theoretical is going on first two session it was very good because i was able to correlate my story with boston data mm-hmm. in another one i was able to irish data but after that um, it was just going random way okay it's just learning algorithm but still i am hoping that sometime it will be good for me so for that time i am waiting okay so that is the uh, reason i am not asking too many questions this i i know up once i'll get those points i have to go re- e- retreat this video once again because i am not correlating things uh, as for example this one for us uh, means i want is there some data in psychic to learn if that i want to play i want to see some diagrams how data scientists what they do how i have to proceed i'm so really sorry for that but this this is the region okay okay so sunil um, uh, i think um, see why uh, i'll just uh, move on to the uh, this part uh, let's just a sec okay so uh, see <clears throat> the hands on i already have in my uh, today no- uh, charter but see if you don't understand oh, the that's concept, great, okay. if you don't understand the okay. concepts like for example if you didn't understand this accuracy and this if you don't have your theoreticals good enough you will not be able to make sense of you may good you may understand this problem what i show you right now you may understand the problem here but if you don't understand this basic foundation it will be very difficult for you to go ahead when you are going for different data sets i may give you an example with boston data set that is already i have to leave uh, for my session right but if you don't understand so for example you will keep on tuning your model on the basis of accuracy and you will never achieve the best model so that's why the first part of data science is to understand the theory okay i'm not denying that um, hands on is uh, it uh, should not be done but if you don't see because these are the se- a set of codes if you go through my screen right now these are a set of codes okay so i will run the codes and you'll get a uh, display but what is happening behind it is very important for you to understand that and if you don't understand that you'll understand random forest but you'll not understand svm if you understand svm you'll not understand boosting this this so if you have any questions you should stop me there and ask me why you are be doing okay. this how will this help me because everything which i'm telling you will ultimately help you in the modeling part okay it's not that right now for example if i tell you boston i'll just run these codes i'll say you have to run this code you'll be happy okay oh, i've seen this code happening and i've seen but what is going in the background if you don't understand in future if someone tells you to you know tune this model i want better model then you'll not be able to do this because you don't understand the background of it so it's very every class or every uh, um, teacher whenever he teaches data science that uh, foundation of theory should be very strong okay then only you go to the modeling part because modeling is frankly writing codes uh, in python is not difficult at all it's not difficult i'm saying you you just search on google the, the uh, thing you are searching you'll just get the answers you want to you say, uh, search on google uh fitting random forest on python you'll get the answers straight away you just have to copy paste writing codes on python is not difficult at all but what is the difference between a person who is just coding and a person who is a data scientist the difference is with the uh, understanding in the theory part okay so if someone says this is my data and you fit a random forest he'll say why did you have fit a random forest and then you will not be able to answer it or let's say if you if you are giving the same question i said right? the same example i told right if you are giving given an unbalanced class problem and you go and predict something which is 90% accuracy you will be happy but it didn't, didn't make any sense because you have predicted the majority class so this is it so i am not saying don't 
weight don't do hands on hands on is equally important but i think 80% of it is important of the theory okay so ask me questions if you didn't understand me ask me why uh, we are having this okay so okay so then now let's uh, move on to the theory uh, hands on part okay so uh, we had seen this so for example uh, if you see this part where we are having so i i am doing on my on the boston data set okay so in boston data set it's a regression problem so we had already seen uh, i'll just open the boston data set uh, You guys can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. yeah so just see uh, what it was just to have a revision so there were number uh, 500 instances 506 instances 13 uh, predictors and one was the target basically uh, you are trying to predict the price the price is not here so based uh, based on these features you are kind of trying to predict the price of the house okay now let's go back to the uh, code so what we are trying to do is we are trying to fit a random forest but before that we'll try to fit see which features are important okay now uh, let's see from sklearn.ensemble import random forest okay so you're importing the model then from boruta boruta is again a module you're importing the boruta pi okay now after that you are basically storing random forest regressor so n estimators means the number of trees you want to uh, fit the number of jobs is um, number of jobs you don't need to understand these are computationally uh, important and the max step like we said max what is the max step the max step of the tree okay so you have uh, storing this particular information in this uh, in, uh, module and then what you are doing is uh, you are creating a new object called the boruta selector which kind of uh, runs the boruta pi with the rfr model okay so this is the model which you want to um, fit okay so uh, if i change this depth uh, it will change here okay and the n estimators is auto it doesn't take n estimators of the random forest that you are told because it will do its own on its own you can also not specify this as auto uh, it can it will take the uh, uh, this thing from the random forms so sklearn dot data sets import lot load boston so you are importing the boston data set you are importing the pi plot uh, so in the boston you have the data and the target now you do a boruta selector dot fit xy and then you print the features and their ranking so let's see what it gives so this is the number of features that it has selected okay so is the number of features that it has selected and this is the rank of these features so let's see the features uh, uh, here so crime crime is our first feature the crime is important it's very important okay rank 1 next next is proportion of residential land zone for lots over 25 i mean whatever it means so so uh, residential land for uh, 25000 square feet and above the model says that these are not important okay so you understand this right so these are the features which get very good rank i mean and these are the important ones now uh normally 
you take um, uh, uh, take variables up to a rank three or four. Okay, so uh, the other ones you kind of okay. Let me run this and uh, I'll show you. Okay, now see how it is proceeding. So it uh, it is kind of it'll do iterations. Okay, the first iteration is uh, it has confirmed that there are zero important variables out of thirteen. Thirteen it has kept tentative. It has not rejected them. Okay, but it has got tentative. Then the first iteration it could not find. In the second iteration it could not find. Like this, if you proceed. slowly you see it has started confirming in the 13th iteration it has start it has confirmed that nine features are important one is uh, tentative and three it has rejected already so if you see these iterations it will within 23 it is when within 23 iterations it says that i have nine features that are confirmed tentative is zero it doesn't have any confusion and rejected four of them have been rejected these are the rankings of it so these are the rankings of the features so this the features that you have fed in is basically serially whatever the data had is like crime z in indus uh, kiosk so uh, just let's see uh, let's see the features first So these are the features, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and the price is the target. So it, it says that my crime is important, my ZN is not very important, my index is kind of rank two, uh, my uh, what is CHS? CHS is Charles River dummy variable. This is equal to one if track bounce river. So you understand this, right? So basically, it gives me the Feature selection. So, accordingly, what I do is, I okay. Now, let's see what this. Uh, uh, if you have this, So whatever has come down, those iterations. If you don't want to see, you can just remove this. Okay, and uh, 
is running it. You see, so your score is 43 point, uh, your uh, R square, R square is 4.43. So basically, I'll tell you what is R square. So it's kind of a metric. So 0.437, I mean 43.7% it's accurate. If you have all the features inside, okay, with a max depth of six. Now let's increase this max depth to 10. I'll not run all these things. See, I increased the depth to 10 and it has increased. It means when I restricted my uh, tree with a depth of 6, it didn't, it could not go further to predict it better. Now, let's say if I increase this, I remember this 48.5, okay. Now, if I increase this to 20, let's see what happens. See, it has now decreased. It means what happened is that we have tried too far. We have tried to go too far and had uh, to overfit. And that's why my cross validation score has reduced. Now, if I do the same thing, let's say 10 was here. It had 48.5. Now, let's see if I increase the number of trees. Let's say I want to increase the number of trees to 500. What happens? Let's see. This I am fitting on the whole data. I have not selected the features yet. Next, uh, next uh, we'll do that. We we'll select the features and then see how it improves. Are you guys getting this? Uh, yeah. So the, here I have a few questions. Yeah. Sure. Come. We are most welcome. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Sorry for that. Thank you. Yeah. So first question is that on which basis? It decided rank. Okay. I mean, uh, nine features are important, uh, and if we want to do means how, based on the root mean square error or see, means see. how it decided to see. Yeah. See, that's why I was focusing more on the theory part. So in theory, when I was drawing that box plot, so what happens is when you have large number of trees dealing with different sets of predictors okay so for example you took uh, let's say there are how many predictors here 13 predictors what is root of 13 it's around let's say 3 point something okay so let's say assume 3 in an integer form so random forest what it is doing is it is taking three predictors at a time and it is understanding that how good whenever i am cutting through the node how good is that let's say uh, let's pick up the crime rate okay the crime rate how good is that crime rate threshold i mean or the partition reducing my rmsc is it good is it bad it okay is moderate okay so based on that uh, partition my rmsc reduction or in classification i said gini index in a regression i said rmsc reduction how good that RMSC is being reduced. If it is good enough, then it means my uh, variable is important. And I see this variable with context to other variables. So let's say in the first uh, trial, I take a crying Z and Indus. In let's say after the 20th trial, I take crying age this. In, in my 30th, uh, 30th trial, I take crying rate tax. So with respect to all variables, it is seen that how crime is important. So that's where the interaction part comes. Okay. So your sum of the variable 
may be important independently some of the variable may be important because in the presence of other variable okay so when you consider let's say um uh, let's say let's say okay let's say crime with respect to the average number of uh, rooms per dwelling do you think crime and rm will have any uh, or number of rooms have any interaction no right it will not have any interaction with the number of rooms but if you see crime with the uh, with the um, interaction with the age age is proportion of owner occupied units built prior to 1940 okay so if your large proportion of owners are already staying there with the 1940 they have old houses they probably would not be wanting to leave their houses right so when crime uh, as a variable comes with in a, with an interaction with the age you may have some different importance of crime vis-a-vis uh, when it is interacting with the number of rooms okay so this is how your large number of trees will understand the different variables on different data sets and see the reduction of rmc okay okay is not clear is it yeah ha no but uh, better no go on ask no uh, if it's not clear you tell me okay so assuming uh, means still i'm trying to figure it out how it has decided means which algo it has used means uh, as like it has dropped all the 12 predictors and used only one predictor with all the data no 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 or no. something else it has done what is random or relative to other it has no 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 what is random forest yes. doing do you remember this how, what we discussed with random forest what is random forest yes. what it is doing tell me yeah I, so it uh, in random forest basically out of 13 it has taken three or four whatever we have given correct so no we have not given those, have those not, it has taken we have, we have given uh, okay 13 variables so as you, so as you mean three uh, we can say correct you, by default whatever value it is huh. so it's taking three it's pick how much effect it has so whatever the errors it is coming it is going next level with other three randomly selected correct now how it should be now when it is taking let's say the first yeah. three, first three so how did a decision tree keep the age on the top you only answered last time right how it is defining age yeah. is on the top of the tree how it does It does, no, I don't have answer for that. It 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 does how it does on the based on the reduction of the Gini index. You remember that we created this partition age greater than forty, uh, and based on the reduction of the Gini index, it is saying that the age is more important. Similarly, based on the RMC in terms of random forest or in, sorry in terms of regression problems, based on the RMC, it's reduction. For example, crime. let's say greater than 40% it is uh, my prices are dro- dropping drastically and pr- crime uh, greater than sorry less than 40% my prices are high so my rmc in terms of uh, whenever i am trying to predict after this cut is improving or reducing then my crime is a very good important factor you understand this now Yes, got it. So, so what is? Is there some way, mm-hmm. as like one was equal to two, you given, so that we can select, we can see which predictors it has selected in the first iteration, which others in second iteration, and like that basically, so oh, that you can visualize. Indiv- or, individually, it not will not tell you which it is selecting. It will tell you at the end that I have selected these. Individually, it not say that okay. uh, which. uh but but i i need to check there may be a because normally the verbose uh, itself tells whatever the model is doing inside so i don't think there should be any other way uh, i mean i have to check i'll get back to you if uh, that also can be displayed uh, but uh, i need to check on that okay okay So, so uh, and other than that nine 
there are nine which are ranked one. Not 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 all. Nine. Are nine. It, no no no. Nine have been confirmed. Nine are important. Nine. Okay. Okay. So nine has been confirmed. Nine have been okay. confirmed that are good, better than a random noise. Today only I explain right. Random forest is inducing a variable which is a random noise, and whatever is above that random noise is cal consider important okay so nine have been classified important out of that five are ranked one it means they are very very important you have to consider them in the model okay okay and uh, suppose if i want to see which is on top uh, and i mean i want to rank all the predictors which are affecting can i rank those yeah it is already giving me the rank right if you see my screen uh where is it you see uh, i think uh, i have to run it again see the print baruta selected dot ranking it was giving a rank right 5 1 1 3 4 it gives the ranks of each of the video features i'll wait i'll i'll show you okay wait wait It's running. The algorithm is running. Yeah, you see the ranks. So the first feature is uh, ranked one. The fifth feature is ranked five. The second feature is a uh, third. Sorry, uh, I I told on the device. The first feature is ranked one. The second feature is ranked five. The third feature is ranked second. These are the ranks. So one means it is very important. You have to consider them in the in your model. Second means it is okay it sh you should consider three means uh if you have computationally uh, good power then you can consider but you have to check that whether these are noise or not after four or five you can you know ignore those variables now do you understand now is it helping now yeah now yeah yeah that me i was looking for now i can understand how i have to go remix how important is that gini index and uh, at exactly. box so whenever i'm owners. training the theory pay your most attention to that because i again i trade to everyone yes coding is not important coding is as an amateur also i can go on search in google and see okay i just everything is very intuitive in coding right you have to just copy paste it but if you don't understand the background behind it it will be very difficult for you to understand so for example all these questions right your uh, why this variable is being selected or how this ranking is coming i have already explained in my theory uh, uh, based on the gini index based on the rmc so stop me right there because see i am putting very much good effort in you know uh, explaining the theory because i i think theory is the most important that's why i am drawing i am explaining everything if you don't understand the theory then your coding part will be very difficult and the foundation will not be there and it will be very difficult and as as long as you i accept that you want to have an end to end picture of how your model should proceed that you will get but when you get that if you don't are not able to trace back whatever you have learned for all these weeks or whatever uh, you have understood during the theory part then it will be not worthwhile right to understand that end to end also so stop me whenever yes. i am explaining you any question you have all right regarding um, model regarding calculation if it is getting too numeric stop me say that okay it is get, uh, getting too mathematical can you explain it in a simpler way but understand it don't leave it that okay i'll do the coding part and uh, i may get away with this because if you don't understand this it will not be helpful okay so just uh, bear with me we'll do everything <clears throat> now uh, Yeah. Now, anyone else? Any? Ha anyone else has a question uh, regarding this formula? So we are not still done yet. So if you see n estimates meters, now just uh, I'll remove this part. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Now see, um, 
whenever you are having let's say uh, let's say let's run this you have you're running 500 trees and a depth of 10 okay what would what was the answer uh, what was the score uh, at 200 uh, 200 trees and 10 depth it was i think 48.5 right now we are doing for 510 depth let's see what is the score now i hope you guys understand this cross val score right we have done this a lot of times what is cross validation what is cv right everyone understands this Give me a yes or no on the chat box. I just got uh, an answer from uh, Vasan Krishna here. Yeah. Okay. What Sunil Sharad? Any confusion on cross validation and all? Okay. So see, it was 48.5. Now it has come to 48.7. It means as I increase the number of, I'm sorry, as I increase the number of trees to 500, it means it is improving the model, right? Now, let's say I increase from uh, 500 to, let's say I increase to 1000. Let's see what happens. Remember this number, 48.7, okay? And don't think that 0 0.1, 0 0.2 is not important, right? You know how uh, competitions, international competitions, they have, um, I mean, people competing in the, to the third decimal place. So, it's very important to you know even increase 0.1, 0 0.2% error in your model. So don't get uh, you know saddened by the fact that we're only dealing with 0.1. What if even if I get 45 or 45.1 or 45.7.2? This very makes a huge difference. Okay, it's running the model. So see, I have created thousand trees. It means. It will take a lot of time. It is preparing thousand keys. It is preparing thousand uh, random data sets. Doing all those things back end. That's why it is taking a lot of time. And what is this scoring? Yeah, uh, just forty-eight point four. What was it previously? Forty-eight point seven, right? Yeah, it was forty-eight point seven. Now it has decreased. It means Yes, Sunil, I'll answer that. Just a second. Let me complete this. 48.7 uh, was the earlier score. Now we have 48.4, right? So it has decreased. Okay. Now Sunil has a question. What is R square? So just park your question uh, on that. I'll answer that. Once I go back to my iPad, I'll explain you how, what is R square. Uh, just park your question there. Uh, now see. Now what I've done is I've selected only those features which are important and I'm now trying to fit a ran new random forest with 200 trees and max depth equal to 9. Let's see what is the score. This is Krishna, I have a quick question. Uh, See, the range is like 48, right? 48 percent, say, it's around 50 percent. That that means you're telling us 50 to 50, right? Which is not a good model, right? No, 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 no. Uh, second answer to your second question, it's not a good model. No, it is not a good, very good model because R squared couldn't go up to 100 percent. So we are just trying with random forest and I have not even done a great search to optimize the uh, parameters. I'm just showing you how your scores will change with, the, with respect to different parameters. Answer to your okay. second question, whether this random forest is a good enough model. No, it is not a good enough model. We'll see boosting on this and we'll see the score difference there. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Now see, when I selected those features here and I in, uh, implemented a new random forest, you see how my score has increased the state of event to 50.05. Now let's say if I increase this to 500, let's see 500.
you can ask me questions in between right when the model is running so that doesn't uh, occupy our normal time okay. i just uh, waiting for the answer which yeah, should yeah. be greater than 4847 something so oh yeah it's at least better sorry i didn't get that answer a uh, uh, question what what should be greater i didn't no know. no i i was just waiting that we have removed some features yeah so yeah. it should come more than whatever we have seen and it has come correct correct so now see i increased my number of trees to 500 but now it has started decreasing right so it was 50 in terms when it was 200 let's keep 300 so this is not the optimal way to do this we need to do a grid search run a for loop right for example for examples starting from 100 with an interval of 100 so 100 to 1000 start with an interval of 100 100 200 300 and see the scores there but since it takes a lot of time to run that i will um, you know consume our time so you guys can try that okay you just have to run a for loop so it is not doing very good when i am increasing the trees it was good doing better when i had uh, 200 trees But logically, it should not be better if we increase the estimator more and more. Sorry? Means uh, logically, we should put increase estimator as much as we can. No, 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 no not that. See, not like that. Uh, when I told you about bias, uh, okay, so what if, uh, uh, yeah, no, no, if you don't mind, can I know? Estimator means number of rows which we are taking in no, action. No. Am I right? No, no, no. Number of estimators mean number of trees you want to fit. Number of trees, oh, oh sorry. Number of trees we want to fit, okay. So, okay, one thing, one very important. So in, yeah, just, just a second. Let me continue. Okay. One important thing that yes. I have noted. So when I ran an estimator of 200, and I had uh, initially done it, my score was around 49% or 50%, right? Now it is around 48%. Why this is happening? Because uh, random forest will is operating on different sets of data. It may have occurred that at that point of data, at that point of time, it ha had some different set of data. That's why its accuracy was so bad, uh, good. But now it has a different set of data. That's why accuracy reduced. Okay, so that variation will always be there. Um, so don't get bogged down that uh, last time we had 209. This, uh, this time again 209. Why the score is being there? Because you understand random forest is picking random sets of data every time, right? So it may not be the same every time. Okay, so for example, if I run read on this, uh, it will be different again. Uh, okay, now let me do this max depth to 12. Let's see what happens here. Yeah, you were asking a question, uh, Sunil. Sorry. Yeah, so basically, number of estimated 200 means 200 random trees will be generated. Correct. Correct. Okay, and uh, depth we are saying 12. Correct. That's a max so, depth, not the depth. Uh, the max depth. Yeah, max depth. So on every starting level, there will be one node. On the first level, there will be two nodes because that is the binary tree. Correct, correct, correct. So maximum node which we can take 2 to the power 12 minus 1, this can be the maximum node. Correct, correct, correct. So one more thing, basically, uh, the columns which we have selected, so we have removed noises. So it should be better than always Point four eight four seven something isn't it? No. So what happens? Why it's coming down? In, in our first iteration, we got fifty percent, right? Fifty point zero five. I think this. See, uh, this has a different parameter. Okay, let me have a common parameter and let's see what happens. Let's say I keep this two hundred, and I keep this as nine. Yeah. 
I already showed you, right? That time it was high uh, when I selected these features. So right now the feature, the estimators are different inside, and that's why it's different. So see, points four seven one, and this is what did I keep? Two hundred and nine, right? So two hundred and nine. See, it's better, right? With the same estimators of mm -hmm. number of trees and that. So, so this is uh, Krishna. So you're telling every run you do, it takes different data sets, right? Correct, correct. Different subsets of the that data, means, not, not different data sets. Yeah, sub, yeah subset. No, different subset of data, right? So that means uh, I'm not going to get uh, uh, like a like a constant value, right? Correct, correct. There that, may be. That might have, have a problem, right, in the modeling. No. So let's say I run, run the data and I get like say 60%, right? Correct. The same, day, same thing, you run it again because of the different data, subset of data, it's going to give me like 37. So no, that's no, the no. big it, variation. No, no, it will not happen so much. So it can, six, from 60%, it may go up to 61 or it decreases to 59. It will not go to 37. Okay. It will never happen. It will just not go to 37. No, no. It will just have, go, let's say, plus minus 2 or 3% here and there. That too, not every time. But again, there is, okay. uh, there is a procedure. Uh, there's something called random state in computation where uh, no, sorry, set seed. Set seed is there. Uh, what it exactly does is it fixes the random state, what was operated in the okay. previous model. This next time we run the model, same random states will be generated. So that can also be done. But uh, uh, answering to your question, whether it will go from 60 to 37, it will never happen. No, never happen. Yeah. Oh. No, no, but the, the thing is, it is inconsistency, right? The inconsistency is there. That's what I'm so, uh, see, coming that, to. That's what I'm saying. See, uh, modeling, it is all about um, statistics and data, right? It's not about you getting the actual number. There will be certain variations, right? But the uh, yeah. uh, the real thing is that how good your accuracy is. So if it is, let's say 80% and it is going from 78 to 82, that is okay, not not different, not a problem. But if it is 40%, then you have, or 50%, then you have your uh, things to worry about, that your model is not good. But you don't have to worry about if it is 82 or 81%. What, right. I, what I was trying to show you here with the different decimal changes is that how different things are, um, affecting the model, okay? So for example, if you change the number of trees and, uh, you know, uh, let's say increase it to 20,000, okay? Your uh, score will drastically come down because it, you have drastically overfitted the model. So that's what I'm trying to- Yeah, yeah, that, that I understand. See, that that one I understand. That is your parameter change, right? So okay. we we- can take, consider that as a parameter change, but within the this thing because of the sub data, uh, sub uh, data right? Uh, yeah. That changes your value changes. The, the, my thing is two things, right? One is like okay, I have this model, I run it, I say I, for example, I get like fifty seven percent reach, right? Then I tell okay, let me run the other model. Say from random t, I go to say boost for example, right? Or I go to decision make decision tree, right? Uh, so when I run that, I say I get there, I get like say 60%. Then I tell, okay, 60% is good than 57. So I choose that. Correct. Right? That model. But this is because of the data set. There's a difference. So what you do is you... You know uh, what I'm saying, right? So, yeah, yeah, I understand that. So if you have that kind of doubt, so what you do is you done, yeah. run your model 10 times on the same data set and take an average of the score. You run it 10 times... Okay. Uh, your random forest, then take an average of the score and then compare. That is the best thing you can do right now. That because that randomness oh. part 
which is actually adding to a, adding value to your model has to be there right if you go, if it is everything is constant then i mean there is no random forest random and random forest right and but again to answer your question you can always set your seed and so set seed what it does is so when the computer is generating the random data sets subset data i mean subset of the data if you set the seed it will always generate the same subset of data then you'll get the exact same scores okay yeah you can do that it's but that is not so sure, Subodeep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Sunil. Uh, so uh, always we are getting around four seven or up to five zero max point five zero max yeah. we have got. Yeah, yeah. So is this the right answer? That is my question. Or mm -hmm. which is maximum we can get, or we have to do something else to get. How many models we have fit right now? So uh, around seven to eight. Seven to eight. I mean not. Uh, uh, so. Not not right now i mean i mean not uh, as a, a whole um, syllabus right now what i have done is you have seen only random forest right L yes you will go to boosting you will go to neural networks you will go to support vector machine you see how much you can go right it's not it's a never ending journey it's not that there's there's no particular right or wrong answer in modeling if your data set is not good however for example the first class i told you Stock prediction is a very noisy thing. You get the best of the best of the best models. You can't can't improve beyond a certain uh, point because it is random. The process itself is random. So if the process itself is random, then whatever model you create will not be going anywhere. But if relate this to my first class, there's a God's equation, right? I don't know whether God generated random forest to uh, use uh, random forest to generate this data. Clearly, it did, he did not because I'm just getting 50% R square. But he might have used SVM to generate this um, uh, process, right? In his own universe. So I might try SVM and I get a better. So that's why learning all the models is very important. That's how you you never know which model is going to get give you the best accuracy. You never know. You cannot tell. No one can tell if that if there's a single best model, then why will anyone learn 10, 15 models, right? So there's no single best model, single best answer to any question. You just have to try and see which score is the best that fits in. So right now we have just okay. done random forest and we have just done feature selection and see. So feature election, uh, selection, you see, it's adds around to two or three percent accuracy to your model, right? Now. There will be certain cases where feature selection may even add 10% accuracy. Okay, so because if the other variables are too noisy, then I mean it can happen that that feature, uh, uh, those features are very bad. So because see here it did not remove any feature. It said tentative, tentative. So out of 13, I selected nine. Although those four were not, I mean, uh, what did it say? I mean, was it confirmed or this what? I think it was, uh, yeah, four were unimportant, I think. I don't remember. So four were unimportant. So after uh, I get nine, I- Tentative or four? Tentative were four. I don't remember the what was the purpose. Uh, just a second. I can see. I think I removed that. Anyways, whatever it may be. So it didn't say that those four are completely noise. Okay, it says, okay. Uh, you may or may not consider that. I think that was the answer. So out of 13, I took out nine. So there can be, a, there is a chance that those four were a noise, but they were not, I mean, hugely bad for the model. That's why you didn't see so much increase of accuracy when you did a feature selection. So as you mean, instead of nine, if I have to take five or six, so can I get which five or six? Yeah, you have the ranking on the base of the ranking you take. You take all the rank ones okay. and you rank all take all. I mean, let's say you have one to take six. You take all the ranks one rank ones. They were, I think, four or five. And then you take a rank two. That's according to that you take. Because, because in our case, all the nine or ten predictors were ranked one only. No, 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 no. They were 
there were four or five rank ones not everyone there were two three four five were also there only i think four or five level rank ones i'll just run it again wait yeah that will be great One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, these all are nine ones. Okay, okay, okay. So these were two. No, no, no. no. So it's just uh, the first one that is one. What does it say that I am ranked one and you can't ignore me? Am I right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, five means lowest one. You can ignore me. Yeah, yeah. Priority wise, basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I am saying first. Second, third, fourth, fifth, six, seven, eight. Again, nine you can ignore. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Correct. So out of these, nine are ranked on top priority. Correct. That you can't ignore me. Correct. Correct. So out of these nine, if assuming I have to select only five predictors, top five predictors. Correct. Then uh, is there some algo which can let me know? Then your model cannot tell you. The model has already told you that these are the top five. uh i mean top 9 okay. uh if you remove them your model accuracy will reduce um so you cannot ignore them and if you have to ignore them then you have to ignore them then it's on your choice randomly you can select whichever five you can uh, whichever six you want okay w- w- one thing which i could not understand could you open that medium page which you were showing last tab uh there is data to describe where mean medium medium they have solved could you go down it will be there yeah yeah uh, this one count me yeah this one basically i was trying to understand but it was not describing in detail okay so basically these are the summary statistics um uh, just normally for example what are the number of counts of this variable so there are 506 instances so that's why we get a 506 instance what is the mean crime uh, across these 506 what is the standard deviation across these 506 what is the minimum what is the 25 percentile that is the first quartile that i explained today box plot remember box plot first quartile 25 percent then 50 percent is the median then 75 is the third quartile and then this is the maximum Okay, median is three point five nine. If others are not considered or comparative to other one, mean mean is three point five nine. How how can you have mean with respect to other ones? Mean is for a single variable, right? Mean is for crime. So crime, Correct. irrespective of anything else, I have a mean of three point five nine. Okay, fifty percent is median of crime. Seventy five percent is the third quartile of crime, like that. So normally, see these things. Will, this, these, the, yeah. these things. If Sorry, you, please. Wait. Yeah, yeah. You want to uh, ask us? On the same page, basically, he was describing that uh, crime. We need to regularize means taking log because we can't consider. Then after that, finally, he has selected only four or five attributes. Correct, correct. So, so those were not described in detail. I don't know why. Okay, okay. so what it is doing is so feature selections is kind of an art okay so there is no particular so he might have used a different algorithm to see user feature selection boosting will have a different algorithm now when i told feature engineering okay so feature engineering is something like what you told us transformation or scaling or something so for example if your data is too skewed for example your mean is 3.59 And your maximum is eighty-eight point nine. It's a huge difference, right? So normally, 
whenever this median mean uh, and even your median is 0.25 your mean is 3.59 it means your data is skewed right so it means uh, whenever your okay, data, good. data is skewed you might do a feature engineering so see we have uh, limited scope i cannot tell everything uh, uh, related to uh, modeling right so that's why i didn't touch this part because i felt this is something where, where uh, for example when you are experts in the model then you come back to all these things and you know try so you remember that diagram where we said you fit a model and there is a feedback loop to your feature engineering and then again you build the model so first we are going through the pipeline first we are have seen the models because after doing all these things let's say log transformation and all you might increase 2% but there might be a better model like boosting who which you can apply directly and increase 10% right so that's why that's that's why we need to understand the models first first let's go through the models see what the models offer see which models are for example we moved on from linear regression to boosting and uh, we said that how boosting now next class we'll see uh, boosting how you know boosting will help uh, improve this accuracy and you see you'll see a tremendous change might be i cannot guarantee but there's a high chance that the boosting will have a good impact now after boosting we'll see svm let's say so svm will have certain impact now after you have saturated all these things then you again come back and see what are the my features and how can i improve them there's a, this is the cycle typically because if i do feature engineering right now with you and i do a feature selection or selection is okay feature engineering if i spend too much time then you'll not get to know the models and if you don't know the models then you cannot never say that which is the best one so it's your call i mean if you want me to focus more of no no so we did now i realize you are correct and i was just checking myself so thanks a lot for correcting me we need yeah, yeah. to understand the model which you are describing yeah the see I'm sorry for myself no no uh, it, you should not be sorry it's a, it's your for your, your own benefit i'm saying because understanding the model is of critical importance uh, so svm right now right i think we are out of time today that's why we will not start it with svm today but understanding the model uh, is very important now okay apart from this since we don't have too much time uh, to start with a new topic any confusion uh, any doubts on the confusion matrix anyone has so uh, assuming uh, shubhadeep we don't have sbm for time being we can consider correct so we have learned five or six so for this boston data first we learned linear regression reach lasso and then this one we have seen correct so which one we have to use for this data other than sbm assuming we don't know that we don't have so and I, how i told you right uh, you have seen random forest do you, do does anyone remember how, what was the accuracy we were getting in linear regression uh, let me see if i have that i think so that was 0.28 0.28 is it uh, this was the, okay this was the 1.58 3.22 okay so i think uh, according to the standard deviation i have to calculate the r square anyways so we have to see how much we were getting in the data i think it would be around uh, 30% uh, so 30% now i did a random first yeah, I, got, I got 50% you see 20% increase then now we will do boosting on it and see how much we get let's say we can get 60% okay so till now it means your best model is boosting right if you get our 60% accuracy in boosting and normally what happens is boosting and neural networks will always give you better accuracies than random forest but it is usually a good practice to start with the simpler models and go to a more complex model that's what so is this a neural network that is part of machine learning or that is a part of deep learning deep learning is a part of machine learning only it's a different type of mathematics that is involved but it is part of machine learning we'll see that we'll see that no problem okay now any so, uh, so based on this um, yeah go ahead Sorry. yeah go ahead yeah so based on, based on this it seems if we have boston type of data yeah then we have to use one by one every model or how how can we decide okay which one is should 
means directly forest is better or in some case linear is better that's what i'm saying na when i when you are when you are just starting with data science always start with the simple model go with the go with the process what we have followed first do a linear regression okay. then do a age then a lasso then a decision tree then random forest and combined with feature selection and then random forest and then do a boosting always follow this once you get a hang of modeling you start with uh, the direct you go into boosting and all but for now keep that's why i'm drawing that so many times right what is the structure you have to follow always follow that always remember that first you need to clean your data then you need to explore your data then you need to fit all these models according to the classification or regression whatever you have understood correct okay okay yeah uh, so what if one uh, one else sorry for asking too many questions can we get a quick cheat means uh, a small cheat type of things where we should know what are the points we have to learn as for example cross other than this model uh, cross validation that one we need to remember uh, gini index we need to remember then there is in forest we are using one term so these are the terms quick we get a list of those terms uh this i mean it, uh, this is difficult to give you na because for you there will be some certain certain yeah. things which are important for oh, some okay like, yeah i know that that is that is our job to yeah, that, write it down somewhere but follow my lecture and ask questions on the go so that it's clear for you because i don't want to go into a project and then uh, you say what is cross validation because then everything will uh, restart again so follow my lectures thoroughly the theory that i'm explaining is very important i'm again explaining for everyone okay theory is the most important part ask questions now i'll not um, go too much into that um tell me if that confusion matrix is clear is that clear to everyone can i get a yes or no on my chat box okay uh, you mean that matrix which you have, you drawn yeah true positive right? true negative false positive false negative that part okay so everyone is clear with that okay now since we are uh, closing the, uh, today's session that question on r square what is r square so r square is basically rmsc divided by sorry 1 minus rmsc divided by the standard deviation now uh, i'll just quickly open my ipad uh, so that i can explain you very fast just bear with me Okay, I don't know. There's some problem with the. Uh, I don't know why it's not. Anyways, I'll just explain you. Um, I think I I got logged up. Okay, I got the problem. Just bear with me.
okay i don't know there's some problem anyways uh, i think I'll, I'll just explain here only so r square is basically um, 1 minus RMAC divided by the standard deviation of the data. Now, standard deviation is basically what it is, is kind of your deviation from the mean of the data, right? If you remember the, the formula of standard deviation, it is sigma of each data point minus the mean whole square and then taking a square root. You all remember this, I hope, standard deviation, right? Now, standard deviation is basically a deviation from a naive estimate. If you say, if anyone comes to you and says, I have this data, give me a very naive estimation. What will be the best thing you can tell? You can tell, okay, take the mean. I don't know. I don't have any model in uh, right now. Just take the mean. No. So I'll take, okay, take, let's take the mean. Now let's calculate what is the error. That error is standard deviation. Now you have done so many, so much you have done, you know, you have broken your head, you have done so much things and now you say that your error of the model is RMSE, right? So RMSE is right now and standard deviation is the naive estimate. So basically how good you are on the basis of your standard deviation, how better you have fitted your model. So it is basically standard deviation minus RMAC divided by standard deviation. Okay, so uh, let's say, uh, okay, uh, let's say for example, your RMAC is very low. Okay, so if your RMAC is very low, what will be your accuracy? It will be 100%, right? So well, let's say if your RMAC is zero, it means your accuracy is 100%. So standard deviation minus zero divided by standard deviation into 100 is 100%. It means you have completely explained the deviation of the data. Your RMAC is zero. It means you have completely explained the standard deviation of the data. If your RMAC equal to standard deviation means you have already only predicted the mean. You have done nothing else than predicted the mean. So standard deviation minus standard deviation divided by standard deviation is zero. It means your accuracy is zero. I think uh, I'm not very clear uh, with this. Uh, just let me, just give me another chance if I can, you know, connect my iPad. Can you guys see my iPad screen? I don't know why, what has not, why it's not connecting. Yeah, okay, let's do it tomorrow, I think. We can do it tomorrow. Uh, I didn't, I, actually, I didn't want to leave it in the between. I think I joined the same network only. Okay, I think now it should work. Just hold on. Yeah, it works now. It was broadcasting somewhere else. Okay, so I'll just keep you for three, two, three minutes. Okay. So uh, basically, what we are saying is a very naive estimate is your mean. Okay. Now, if someone comes you, to you and say you don't have a model, you just want to have a prediction. What will be your prediction? Your prediction will be mean. And what will the error? So, for example, you have hundred data points. Everyone where you have predicted the mean. So what is the error in this data? 
so this will be x minus x bar 1 I mean the, this one and then this one so square plus this one this one like this you will keep on adding so basically the RMSE will be root of sigma xi minus x bar whole square i 1 to n right so RMSE in this case where you have just predicted the mean is the standard deviation right now he has done a lot of uh, modeling and all now you have predictions in case of x bar you have prediction like y hat y hat 1 y hat 2 y hat 3 so you have now these predictions what is the error now x minus y 1 whole square plus x minus y 1 whole square 2 so we now you have the new error so this is called the RMSC after modeling so your R square is equal to 1 minus RMSC this one divided by standard division so for example when you just fit the mean to your data and do nothing else this RMSC will become to standard deviation this will be 1 1 minus 1 equal to 0 it means your accuracy is 0 you have not done anything you just have fitted the mean which is equal to the standard deviation if you fit the mean and that it means you have contributed 0 to your modeling now you have done a lot of modeling and you have decreased your RMSC from the standard deviation till some point let's say point 2 of standard deviation this is your maximum error you can't get worse than this now you have reduced to point 2 of that error now this is 1 minus point 2 of standard deviation divided by standard deviation this is point 0.8 it means 80 percent so this r square is 80 percent okay so this is the r square basically 1 minus rmc divided by standard deviation this is the maximum error you can have in your data when you predict the mean and this is the error what you are predicting after modeling so 1 minus that ratio is equal to r square okay okay so let's close today and uh, um, so let's get back tomorrow okay good night everyone good night Okay, great. So, you guys can sh uh, see my screen, right? Okay, great. So, uh, what I've done is I've uh, in implemented the boosting algorithm on the Boston data set, and we'll see how it has, you know, improve the performance of the algorithm i mean prediction what we were trying to do yesterday okay so let's start so uh, these are the packages that i import um, so this is the same Boston data set uh, here what I do is I kind of you know take a subset of 0.9 I mean 90% I take for training and the rest 10% I take for testing okay so this is a simple uh, subsetting uh, procedure okay then what I do is uh, I take the parameters of the boosting 
so n estimators you know or n estimators is the number of trees that you want to build max step you also know minimum sample split you also know i mean how many uh, number of samples should be there in a node so as to go ahead with the splitting okay now this is called learning rate there's something very important called, uh, which is learning rate in boosting the learning rate as you know that boosting is a series uh, learning right so one tree will uh, falter and the next tree will try to improve on, on the previous tree and then uh, so you understand right so uh, uh, this is a series learning so learning rate is basically how fast you want to uh, reduce that error so uh, points so for example uh, if you guys know remember stochastic gradient descent uh, the, the example that I gave you on the first, second day or the third day when we started linear regression, the bowel example, the water droplet, and we were saying the water droplet will jump from one place to the other place to go to the minimum bottom point, right? So the bottom point is the uh, minimum most uh, point. So uh, if you remember, th there was a learning rate there also. We, would, we were saying that uh, depending on the direction so with the slope i was uh, able to find the direction and then with the learning rate i was able to give give it the number of steps you want to go so if it is too fast if you want to achieve your lowest value too fast you will never achieve because of the oscillating movement if you don't remember don't worry i'll uh, later when i switch to the ipad i'll show you what i was meaning here but learning rate is basically how fast you want to go to your minimum okay if it is too fast you will never achieve if it is slow uh, if it's too slow then also you'll never achieve okay so i'll show you just remind me this when i uh, go to my ipad so uh, loss is ls it doesn't this doesn't make much sense here so clf ensemble gradient boosting regressor this is the uh, this is the model what you are trying to so gradient boost is the uh, and the regressor so we're doing a regression problem so that's why i put uh, gradient boosting regressor Okay, now, so CLF dot fit, I fit on the training data and then we uh, uh, use the test data. So I, I fit the model on the training data, then use the test data to predict and see why, what it is vis-a-vis -vis the uh, actuals. So then I print the MSE, mean square error. Now, uh, so I've just used some plotting. So this, this part, this part, is basically I want to see how so this is called the stage predict okay so at every stage of parameters it is kind of giving you a curve that with increasing number of trees how your model will model strain error and test error will change okay so and this is the all the properties of the plot so nothing special here just the title how what we want to see so NP A range A range if you remember is uh, starting from the 0 to the, so for example, the N estimators is 500, right? So 0 to 49, not 0, 1 to 499, it will start. Plus 1, because I want 500 here. You remember Python always starts from, I think it was it is from 0. So 0, so that's why I have 1 here, and 499, that's why I have 1 here, okay? So it kind of travels from 0 to 499, plus 1 makes it travel from 1 to 500, okay? And this is the blue line, this is the red line. Um, uh, the location uh, where you want to put the legends it's on the upper right what should be the labeling of x and what should be the label label of y so if you run this ah, now uh, boosting also gives you a feature importance plot so yesterday when uh, uh, someone asked me i think sunil was asking that uh, uh, though we have uh, in baruta plot it will give you rank and uh, what if i want to see top five so in ra uh, random forest, I didn't. I said that it is not possible, right? Because it is giving you the ranks of it. And uh, if you want to uh, go by the ranks, uh, it will. It is. I mean, it. You cannot find top five from the ranks. But boosting will improve further and will give you the top five variables of the rank. So these are all just to plot that. Okay. Now see here uh, the interesting part. So. Your MSC is 6.6629. I'll show you what is it in terms of accuracy. If you remember the R square that we were talking about, you'll see that. But first, see this. 
so this is your training error the uh, blue one and the this is with the testing error so i have already always talked that uh, your, your with the increasing number of trees your training error will decrease right and your testing error will decrease but at a certain point of time it will start to increase we haven't reached that point yet here but uh, you see how your testing error and training error is behaving okay and this is your variable importance plot so you see how, which all variables are important according to their uh, this is so this is relative importance uh, so according to their importance they are being ranked here so if you want to take top five variables here you can take it from here okay now uh, yeah uh, so uh, thanks me uh, not a problem uh, so uh, that's why I, I always say go step by step you will get all what all of whatever you want to um, learn I'll tell you but just have a little patience um, so that you know we proceed step by step. So um, now see uh, the the formula that we learned yet yesterday. Uh, what was it? One minus standard deviation. Uh, sorry, uh, one minus RMAC. Uh, Vasan says how LSTAT uh, LSTAT. Okay, what was LSTAT? I need to check. Uh, I mean. Uh, I need to check what was LSAT. We, we'll uh, address your question, Vasan. Just, just wait. Uh, let me complete this. So, um, so if you see that uh, the formula that we we're trying to do is one minus the mean square error divided by the variance of the data. Now, see, you have achieved 88.19 percent accuracy, which was previously uh, what 50 percent max to max, and that too I have not even you know, optimized my algorithm, just a simple random uh, estimators and learning rate uh, and the minimum and max step randomly I've put, I have, you know, achieved 88.19. And if you even do a grid search or a if very, very good, try to tune the model, you would even go up to, I think, 92, 93%. So that's the power of boosting, uh, how it improves the algorithm from a simple random forest. Um, and it's not difficult to implement it's very easy so you see how your uh, accuracies um, have improved drastically now uh, so me everson had this question what is lstat uh, just a second i need to see what is lstat so uh, let me see percentage of lower status of the population so uh, i think this is this actually makes sense, right? If your population is uh, having a lower status, I mean, it means that neighborhood is not very expensive, right? That's why the prices of that neighborhood will be very low, right? So I think what it means is like, let's say if it is 30% uh, of the people are the lower status in that neighborhood, then of course that neighborhood is, is not very posh and that's why the prices of that the house will be uh, low or if the percentage of lower status of the population is less, then it means the neighborhood is very posh and, you know, uh, it will be very, uh, I mean, uh, it will be very posh. So does this answer your question? And uh, you see uh, the second variable, if we can see here, RM, RM is the second most important. Uh, RM is the second most important. So if you go to RM, uh, where is RM? Average number of rooms per dwelling, of course. So if your number of rooms is less, then obviously your price of the house will be lower. If the room number of rooms is high, then the price of the... So basically what your algorithms will tell you uh, regarding uh, these uh, variables is that what is the variation of this particular variable vis-a-vis -vis the price. So if your LSTAT when varying from low to high, is it really changing the price from low to high? And if it is yes, it means, yeah, it is a very important variable. Kind of, if there is a good amount of correlation. Okay. So uh, I think this uh, helps a lot, uh, I guess, uh, to understand the differences between uh, uh, the algorithms. Okay. So any questions now, I'll just, uh, everyone is unmuted, I think. Yeah, anyone can ask me any questions so that we can close this chapter of bagging and boosting and then move on. Yeah, this is Krishna here. Uh, can you go a little up? 
Yeah. So you had that 80% this thing, right? Right. 90% uh, uh, division, right? Yeah. That uh, after the graph, you had that this thing, right? Uh, the code. Uh, the still up. Even up. Uh, the I think this is the code only. Which? Oh, oh no! I think after the graph, you had uh, the numpy oh, okay, standard okay. deviation, oh, all that, right? Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, what is one minus six point six? What where is what is that value? Okay, 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 okay. So, what I did is I just manually calculate six point six is this one, this one. So, the mean square error. What we learned oh. is the okay. yes, yesterday I told you right one minus uh, mean square. So we are taking r square. R square okay. means squared of distances. So one minus MSE is the what your model has able to. Uh, after fitting, this is much. This is what is left, and your 55 is the uh, 55 point is the, this is basically B only. So B I calculate. I just put manually the uh, value. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so B is basically uh, the standard deviation, the variance, or the naive estimate as a mean. What is the uh, uh, average error when you put the mean? So on that basis, we learned right uh, last year, last class at the end. R square is equal to one minus MSE upon um, standard deviation. I mean variance. Now because we are talking about R square. Okay. So this is 88. No, no, because I, I, the number I didn't know the number. That's what I was. Thinking. Okay, okay, no problem. Sorry, uh, that's my fault actually. I should have. No, 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 that's okay. Okay. So, so uh, perfect. That's that's what I just wanted to. So you see how, how your R square has changed drastically, right? We were seeing somewhere around 0.48 and something. Now it is 0.88. So that's why. Uh, uh, that's why people who are, you know, uh, machine learning, who have been, who are doing machine learning, uh, so they start with boosting because they know that the other. So why it is important to learn uh, these linear regression, lasso, ridge, uh, random forest. So boosting is basically a combination of random forest and boosting as a process. Okay, so gradient boost is not an independent thing. So. If you don't understand random forest, then you'll not be able to understand boosting. So if I say just what, these are the number of trees, what are they doing? So if you don't understand random forest, you'll not appreciate what boosting does. Uh, uh, you know better than it. If you don't understand linear regression, you'll not understand how random forest. You know is you'll not appreciate how random forest is improving the model. So that's why it's very important for. But having said that, if your God's function is linear. Right. If your God's function is linear, and you fit a boosting, it will be worse than what a linear regression can fit. That's why when you never know what is the nature of the function that you are dealing with, it's always better to start with a simple model and then move on to it because you never know which is the actual function, and there is no particular answer to any. Part, uh, I mean, defined answer to any question that this is your model which you know will work the best. You just have to try and try and try and gain your experience. Okay, so are we comfortable with bagging and boosting so that we can move on to the next part? Yeah, I have one question. Last question, sorry. Yeah, sure. Uh, with the boosting, right? The the values which are not calculated from T1 goes to T2, right? Correct, correct. So let us say, and the uh, uh, the futures in each T1, T2, T3, all are different, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or it will be the same future. It will take all the same future, the no, same no. order, or it no, will no. take different uh, futures. No, no, different. So I, that's why I said, right? The random uh, boosting is a process that is being added to the random forest itself. So what was random forest doing? It was dealing with T one, T one, T two, P two, T three, P three. I mean, even different sets of data. But in uh, boosting, it is the same thing, just to ensure that. When your second data set is picked up, right? You make sure that the previous uh, data points, which were not classified or which had a very bad RMSE in terms of regression, they are taken by the T2, right? With a different oh. number, different predictors. It can be different predict. It should be different predictors, right? Otherwise, you every a tree fits tries to fit with the same predictor, they'll always fail in predicting that certain amount of uh, data, right? So that's why you have different predictors. <laughs> 
Yeah, in that case, what you're saying is, okay, this particular data set, which is not fitting for this particular future. So I'm going to try another set of future. That's correct. what you're- Correct, correct, correct. correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so any other questions? Anyone wants to ask? Uh, I mean, then we'll move because SVM is not related to any of this. So I, SVM will be a completely new, different model. So that's why I, I was asking. Okay, so then I'll move on. Uh, if everyone is okay, so I'll just. Uh, um, Just bear with me for two minutes. I think. Uh... Okay, uh, I think we are good here. Okay, so we start with a new topic called support vector machine. And uh, it's a di little difficult to understand this uh, topic and it has a lot of mathematics. Uh, but uh, I'll not go too deep into the mathematics part since uh, it's not, frankly, it's not required to go into so much depth. Uh, but you just need to understand how support vector machine works. Uh, in certain cases, it does prove to be a very good model. And that's why uh, you should not ignore this. Uh, because there are certain cases where you may find that your boosting is not, you know, performing very well, then you might have to go with the support vector machine. But that, there's a lot of advantages to this model as well as disadvantages. So we'll talk each of them. So, uh, so basically, it's kind of a, first we'll talk about a linear classifier, okay? So what it does is, it says, if my data is like 
it's somewhere here and the other classes is here okay why don't you have a boundary between these two mod uh, these two data sets okay so good enough right but i can say why this boundary uh, why not this one there are there are actually infinite boundaries that you can have here right so let me talk about a uh, first thing is like what is a hyperplane so you might have uh, uh, hear about this hyperplane concept a lot of uh, times when you go into support vector machines don't get confused too much in a two dimensional space a line is a hyperplane in a three dimensional space a plane is a hyperplane in a four dimensional space a three three dimensional uh, plane is a hyperplane so for after four dimensions you cannot after three dimensions you cannot visualize right so we'll not go into depth so whatever your uh, uh, let's say whatever your dimensions are so for, for example let's talk in terms of variables if there are three variables okay uh, equation of uh, this is called a two dimensional hyperplane why two dimensional because it in involves two variables so in a three variable space you can have a two dimensional hyperplane so for example if there are three variables x1 x2 and y you want to predict so a hyperplane that is con Conclusive uh, that is uh, having x1 and x2 in the equation. So let's say b0 plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 is equal to y. Okay, so this is your hyperplane. Okay, so I always remember in a three dimension, uh, whatever dimension variables you have, let, let's say if you have multiple variables x3, x4, so if you have four variables. Uh, I mean, including for y, if you have five variables, then a four-dimensional hyperplane is a boundary. Okay, so let's rub this. I, I how to okay. Yeah, I got it. So basically, uh, this is what you are trying to do: fit a boundary which linearly separates the boundary. Now, as I said, there can be infinite boundaries, right? Uh, one uh, one boundary can be let's see. This one boundary can be this. So which boundary should you choose, right? No one has told you which boundary you should choose. So what you do is you choose a boundary which is farthest from here and farthest from here. Okay. So you choose a boundary which is kind of separating the data best. I mean, so what if a line which is farthest from here and the same line should be farthest from here. But these are two opposing uh, directions right it means you want to fit a line which is kind of a middle space in between these two points right if you get that line that is your support so these are called support vectors why support vectors because they are kind of supporting the line from both the sides okay I don't know why I cannot choose a different pen. Anyways, so you get the point, right? So for example, if I uh, redraw, so this is the line, which is kind of max distance from this point and max distance from this point okay so 
have you understood this part first of all tell me I, i'm open to questions right now have you understood this part so why uh, why we are choosing these specific points is there any reason so right now because your data is linearly separable why i didn't choose this line because it is not separating the bound uh, two classes properly right it it is let's say if the left side of the boundary is black the right side of the boundary is white plus black okay so you kind of try to create a boundary so that the left side of uh, the line or the plane is one class and the right side of the plane or the line is one class do you understand you want to so that what you can say so uh, in equation terms let's say this part so if if the equation of this line or let's say equation of this plane is b0 plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 if you say my new test data comes and i find out the value on this if it is greater than 0 then i classify this as the positive class or let's say this is a positive class and this is a negative class if my new data i put this data in this equation and i found out that the uh, value is b0 plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 is less than 0 then i classify this as a negative okay so what i am trying to do is we are trying to classify the data set in terms of where it positions itself the point with the point is positioned with, uh, with respect to the line so if it is on the left side of the line let's say it is greater than 0 and if it is on right side of the line it is less than 0 okay does that answer your question oh yeah yeah kind of um, so what do you mean by max distance the line is max distance from that point what uh, what do you mean by that okay. so you are drawing this straight line uh, which you are showing right now correct um, so max distance will not be are you trying to optimize between these two points so if that i it okay, need okay, to okay. be max distance from this point as well as this point is that uh, what you mean okay so let's see if i uh, if i ask you to draw a line to separate these points i mean the left side and the right side the black points and the uh, uh, dotted points what would you uh, be doing you'll draw a line right yeah yeah but which line there can be infinite lines between those two points right there can be a line which is very let's say if i even draw a line like this it will still separate the blacks on the left and the whites on the right if i draw a line like this i can still separate the right points and this is much easy i mean this is even a little difficult to visualize let's say you have like this and you have something like let's say these how many lines you can fit in many lines you can fit right which separate infinite yeah. mm -hmm. finite lines so you need to have a mm -hmm. measure right which is the best line you want to uh, fit so what it does is it says okay tell me the closest point from let's say i want to fit a line between this tell me the points which are closest to this line so let's say these are the points which are closest to this line and i want to maximize this distance so that it kind of lies in the middle of these two points does that help okay yeah got it got it so you are trying kind of like uh, drawing a perpendicular uh, from that particular point correct uh, to this line so that way your line is uh, uh, defined okay correct correct okay. correct Make sense. Yeah. so it's kind of what we did in linear regression what we were doing we were having like these points right and then we draw a line so what we were doing we were doing that these uh, distance should be least right What, uh, this error should be least here what we are doing is that it should be maximum i mean it should be well separated here and well separated here i don't want this to be too close here or i don't want to be this to be close here everyone gets this this is the basic of svm
ओके यू नो व्हाई देन नॉट चेंज डू चेंज द लाइंस एनीवेज सो जस्ट सेक इट विल शो अप या सो बेसिकली दिस इज व्हाट आई वाज रेफरिंग टू लेट्स से योर ब्लैक पॉइंट्स आर पॉजिटिव एंड योर the white points are negative okay so this is how you want to separate the line separate the data okay so you see there can be infinite lines right but which is the best one so you kind of have a kind of line which is define the marginal of margin of a linear classifier as the width that the boundary could be increased by before hitting a data point so whatever i said that's written in english right whatever so kind of you want to have the highest possible margins of that line in the data set okay so why it is called maximum margin classifier so we are increasing this margins these are the margins we are trying to increase these margins to the maximum Uh, uh this is the simplest kind of svm called lsvm why uh, uh, why linear svm because it is we are fitting just a line we are not not doing anything we are just fitting li a line these are called the support vectors because these are the points on which uh, your point uh, i mean on your data lies now can anyone tell me what is the major disadvantage of this i mean uh, just to this point whatever we have done what is the major disadvantage so if there are any exception on the other side the the line will not take care right because right now your data is uh, you know what you are showing on the screen is pretty separated but there might be uh, anomaly right uh, <clears throat> some dotted point might be on this side and the other that, side that um, very good. that is one a very big disadvantage that everything is not linearly separable right right now you can you visualize that your data is linearly separable okay i can draw a line but many point of times you cannot have a data which is linearly separable right there will be mix and match of it both so that is very good that is a very good disadvantage i mean very uh, big disadvantage of uh, linear svm one more thing one more thing is a very big disadvantage of svm Okay, I'll take. Um, you see, yeah, yeah, sorry, it might be the point, the lowermost point, right? Say the upper side, upper portion cluster, the point is too high, and the lowermost is too near. Then you might have a different fit or something like that. Uh, something like not precisely that, but the problem is that uh, the model you see doesn't take care of all these points. I mean, it doesn't even bother those. it's only dependent on two points which you are trying to fit uh, the model from right so only the two support vectors are kind of determining the model what 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 about all these points right these are not even taken into consideration so why i want to fit a model which is just dependent on two points so this is a very big disadvantage of svm i mean uh, you it's it's like uh, i mean you have so much of data and then you are just using two points to fit your data so that's kind of uh, a big uh, thing that you don't want to have as a model right but similarly what plays in its favor is when you have two less data so svms perform very good so if you have two less data in boosting and random forest you you are taking uh, let's say subsets there you are taking that when you are doing you know, bagging and boosting you are taking subsets of data so if you have just 20 or 30 data points or 100 data points your your subsets will try will start repeating after a certain point of time right so that's why when you have uh, uh, two little data svms perform very good precisely because of this point because they don't want to look too much of data they just fit uh, Uh, using these two, but having said that, it doesn't mean that the uh, SVM will perform very bad in um, big in bigger forms of data. But uh, it is not very. I mean, it's very powerful. Sometimes it gives very good results, but sometimes it performs very badly. So, SVM is something like uh, it's 
it's kind of a, a hit and trial. You may end up with a good result, and you may end up with a bad result. But you remember in one uh, uh, one of the classes, I told if there is a circular data, your forests and decision trees and linear regression will fail. This is where your SVM will shine. So right now you don't understand because we have just fit a linear SVM. Now there can be multiple forms of this partition. So what you'll do? Let me go to one note and show you. So for example, if you are Let's say your data is circular, okay? So what SVM so SVM is uh, known for something called kernels, okay? So what are kernels basically? So like what what we just saw was a linear kernel, okay? So a linear kind of a line which is trying to separate. I could can have a circular kernel. I could have I can have uh, so circular is a uh, two dimensional. Uh, 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 I mean, let's say you have a circular partition. Okay, so you can have a um, polynomial kernel. Okay, so you can have any type of kernel you uh, you can imagine. So what it does is, in two dimensional, this thing is looking like that they are circular, but if you add another dimension in a 3D, it may be that the red points. So if I convert this into uh, two dimensional in, and in the, this is the z axis so it might happen that your red points are here and your blue points are here but in two dimension when you are just seeing x and y it is appearing that it is uh, on the same page and on the same circle but if you see the third axis it might happen that there is a particular partition that can be done um, and uh, uh, th this can be clearly separated so how do you add this dimension this is done by the use of kernels so something there is called something called a rbf kernel don't go into too much mathematics what is rbf kernel and all just understand this that this is kind of a transformation this is kind of a transformation you do to the data and add a kind of a different axis to the data so that the resultant data can be separated well do you understand this? I'll pause here. So in the three dimension, you get uh, two linear lines or again? Just... No, no, I, I'm just uh, a single linear line only single linear line. I'm just it's it's more of a plane, not a line in three dimension. It will be a plane. plane. So this this transformation of the data, right? to create a new axis or a new dimension is very powerful of SVM, okay? So this is why the SVMs, uh, sometimes they do not, you know, have uh, too much importance, but if you just see a circular data, right? Go ahead and do an SVM. Nothing will work here. No boosting, no neural network, no neural network might work, but um, uh, linear regression and forest uh, and trees will never work. That is for sure. So. That's where you. Uh, that's where the SVM part comes in, right? So that's why it's very important to understand every model and its advantages and disadvantages, right? And uh, okay. So now let's continue. So we have seen this. Okay. So. Okay, I'll just take your feedback and uh, try to understand. Do you uh, want to go into a deeper mathematics of this? Uh, I mean, because a lot of maths is involved and you don't need it. But what I'll do is, uh, I think I'll show you something that is a little un easy to understand. And okay, now. <clears throat> I'll go very slowly on this. Try, try to understand this properly. Suppose there are two classes, and this is positive, 
and this is negative okay now i have a line which is kind of b not sorry so i say whenever a point comes if it is less than 0 it falls here and if it is greater than 0 it falls here okay so these are the defined classes and this is kind of the equation that i am forming now your objective function your objective function is basically that so this is positive this is positive so our product will be positive but when it is negative this is also negative right that's what we saw here so when it is negative this is also negative when it is positive this is also positive so when i take the products of the two it is always positive right and then you are saying that it should be greater than n so what you are trying to say when you are training this model or so this is basically the distance of the point from the line okay so when you put let's say this is the equation of the line i will after i explain this i'll stop for questions i know this is a little difficult to understand but uh, it's good to know so whenever i put a point here i basically get the distance of that point from this line and i say that for all the training data for all the training points this distance should be greater than m so what is m so m is this part so this distance should be greater than m this distance should be greater than m because i said that m is the short shortest distance that the point uh, is uh, the support vector is from the line similarly this is also greater than m all the distances should be greater than m okay so this is your objective function you want to have a line oh sorry and this one is the objective function you want to have a line wherein this is plus one or minus one this will take care of the sign so forget the sign just concentrate on this part if you put a point on an equation that value will give the distance of that point from the line and it should always be greater than or equal to m you want to have such a line here so your function here is this now does everyone understand this part i'll pause here does, does everyone understand if it is not clear tell me uh, but you need to have this here because this is basics of sbm Okay, that's great. Uh, everyone is clear. Vasant, uh, is it clear for you, Krishna? Okay. Okay, uh, well, Vasant is asking, can you repeat what is M? Okay, fair question. So, M is uh, the distance between this particular point to the line. And we have said that m is the least i mean beyond m there should not be any point right so what we have said is we want to have a point here we want to have a point here and this should be m this should be m so there cannot be a point that should go below here so m is the least distance that a point can be closer to, uh, close to the line okay so let's say m by 2 cannot no point can be at a distance m by 2 from the line because this is i have chosen that the, this is the sh minimum distance that the point should have from the line that's why i'm saying uh, the margins the margins the line should have a proper good margin so this is the margin right so the line should have m here distance here and m distance here so all the points should be beyond those 
So that's why the distance between the point and the line should be greater than n. Okay, got it. But as we saw that uh, nature is not so kind to you that they will always give you a very clearly separated data set and you just draw a line here. Uh, listen, you just had a question I could not see. Can you just you know, speak on the microphone so that uh, I am able to un understand? I didn't see your question. Yeah. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, in f in future we may get the least point right again from the lane. Yeah, yeah, from yeah. From the perpendicular lane. Correct, correct. So again, that we need to change that m, right? Correct, uh, correct. Prop right. So if you take that point into training, then the line will change. If you take that point just as you uh, or for a testing purpose, for example, if you just want to predict for that point, that point will be predicted. But uh, I mean. Uh, for training purpose, if you add that line, you're correct. That support vector will change. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So, as we said that, um, yeah, I mean, it's not very likely that you will always have such kind of data that is linearly separable, right? You might have some points here, some points here. Okay. How do you deal with that? So, if you have such kind of uh, uh, points, then you'll not be able to have anything linear that can separate, right? You have to have some curves or not even possible sometimes unless you do that kernel approach. Okay, so uh, what do you do in that case is you allow the line to be a little relaxed. You say, don't worry, you try to fit this but have some leverage. Let let some points go out of place. So, for example, what I've right now said it is that your line is like this, and your points. Are, so, your minimum this is m, and your minimum this is m. So, what I've said is that each and every point should be greater than m. But what if some points are here, and what if some points are here? So you say to the line, don't worry, have some leverage, ha have some leeway here, not leverage, sorry, have some leeway here that even if you misclassify some points, it's okay for me. Even if you don't have perfectly fit all the points, it's okay. So what you do is you introduce something called as an error. So error is basically, so for example, you keep a check on the total misclassification you want to have in the data, okay? But for a for example, let's say let's say, take an example. Let's say m is five, okay? And I I take sigma of error it should be less than nine, okay? So in some cases, I can take ei as six. So it means what is this minus 25 right so you can take misclassify a point so for example if i am trying to classify this i can i mean not classify this i, I can say that even a blue point which is kind of 25 distance on the other side that can also be taken okay if a blue point here is positive a blue point here is a negative so it allowing the point, allowing the function to take this into consideration that, okay, let me explain again. You have this, you have this, your blue points are here, your red points are here, but there are some red points here and there are some blue points here. Okay. These are good these points are good no problem with them they are reds are on the red side that's why they are positive um, blue is on the blue side that's why on the positive but what about these points so these points are on the wrong side of the line so you tell no problem you can go i can have i can have this much of leverage 
total error over all the 10 i mean all the data sets can be let's say less, less than 10 so you say okay if that means so if your m is equal to 5 so 5 1 minus 10 so that is minus 45 so even a point which is on the wrong side of the line with a distance of 45 from the line can be taken into consideration okay so even I'll, let's say again i i find out let's say this is 20 and i found another point which is let's say 11 from not 11 uh, i already taken 10 let's say i just have 7 so 7 so m is 5 so 5 1 minus 7 minus 30 a point let's say here which is wrong side of the line a 30 distance from the wrong side of on the wrong side of the line can be taken into consideration so this is the leverage you want so total error should be less than a particular uh, uh, value this value is user fed this value is user fed okay so this de depends upon so it's the same thing again it's the same thing you want to hugely overfit you want to try to fit all the points or you say no problem i can have some error and not fit all the points okay so does everyone understand here um, it's okay if you don't understand this is a little difficult concept ask me questions if you have any Is there any real example like to understand this one? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'll uh, like I'll, like our blood pressure, blood pressure counts, and like that. So, a real example, as in um, you can use this model to fit a data, but it's, uh, it will not. I mean, I don't have the visualization right now. Maybe next class I can show you the visualization of how. It will not show you visualization dynamically. Let me see if I can find it on the internet if there's some visualization that is dynamic in nature. But most of the images are like what I have already shown you. So it's a little difficult to understand. I am, uh, agree, but just, just think over it a little more uh, what it is trying to do. Why are we introducing this error part? Why? What if I don't introduce the error part? What will happen? Just try to think over it. We'll come back to these maths, mathematical equations uh, uh, to, you know, uh, if we can re-understand really this. But okay, yeah, never, no problem. Nevertheless, no. uh, it's not necessary that you have to understand this to un understand the model. The model is basically what I've told. It's kind of a linear. It's kind of a, a partition between the positive or the negative class. Okay, and. Uh, uh, there can be multiple partitions as well okay so it's kind of a, a, what it is doing as a partition and so in um, in random forest we where we saw that the partitions are always perpendicular to the axis here the partitions can be anywhere right so partition can be like this it can be like this it can be like a plane so any any partition will work okay so that's how your svm works okay I will go back to this. Uh, I'll just let's take a break of let's say two three minutes. Uh, and if yeah. have... quick question, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the the error this thing right? You are uh, mentioning about the error like uh, positive uh, point coming into the negative area. That all is. that right? That so is. so how are you defining this positive or negative? Is it some kind of a future that you are telling? Okay, if it falls all. If this is the future, then it's positive. If this is the future, it is negative. No, 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 no. Positive and negative, I've said that there are two classes. For example, yes or no. I just denoted them as positive and negative. Oh, OK. Got it. Got it. OK. So we're just trying to separate two classes, positive on the other side and the negative on the other side. OK. 
सुनील नो क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम यू ओके ओके सो लेट्स टेक अ टू थ्री मिनट ब्रेक एंड विल कम बैक वी गुड Okay, uh, I'm back. <clears throat> so I'll not go into too much depth of all these. There's too much maths uh, involved. Um, so I've already explained you all these things. Uh, hard margin as the soft margin. This is the kernel that I was talking about, right? You can change. Uh, the dimension you can do a transformation. So Sunil, you are saying like, uh, how does transformation help uh, when we are, you know, trying to play with the data? So this is how a very good example of you know how the transformation is kind of uh, changing the way uh, you know you are classifying the data. So you see, the original input space is. Can always be mapped to some higher dimensional feature space where the training set is separable, right? So in your two-dimensional, your circular data is not 
you cannot separate right but when you take it to the another, another dimension add a, another dimension to it you can easily separate it separate it with a plane okay so too many things that are there for you know so let's see the properties if anyone wants to understand the maths uh, i'm open to it uh, i can explain you but uh, uh, i mean so okay let's take a quick vote do you need uh, do you want to understand the maths or should we take it uh, later uh, what do you want give me a feedback Okay, so I think majority of people are saying that uh, it's not needed. So then let's talk about. Okay, Vasan, is that helpful in future? No, I would not say that they are much helpful uh, because uh, one SVM is not widely, very widely used. You cannot in, uh, use that more. Uh, I mean, most of it, most of the data sets you will not use SVM. And the second thing is that whenever you are trying to implement the model. nothing of this is required you just have to understand which kernel to fit and what uh, what parameter to put so it's not necessary to understand the maths um, but uh, we'll see uh, we'll uh, see when we kind of uh, fit the model what is required so it's not required. just so let's focus on the properties so flexibility in choosing a similarity function sparseness of solution when dealing with large data sets so uh if your data set is too sparse right so it is it works very good ability to handle large feature spaces uh, this is one very important so in biology or in medical you might have a lot of parameters so for example there will be parameters about your blood pressure parameters about your heart parameters about your intestine your pancreas anything right so there can be 200 or 300 features but how do how many patients do you take for trial so for example if you're testing a cancer drug you'll have a lot of parameters that you are going to record but let's say how many patients do you have in the cancer trial let's say 1000 or 2000 so your n is to p we call it we call it as n to a when n by p so n is the number of data points and p is the number of features this tends to be one or even sometimes uh, even less than one when your number of features are much more than the data set so in that case right in that case we uh, svm i mean helps so so to answer every one of your question right that why you want to understand all the models so this is why you want, want to understand every model because every model works very good at certain point and very bad at a certain point so you need to know where it works good and where it works bad so for example i i fit a model on a medical data there were 180 data points that is too less right 180 n data points and i had let's say 50 or 60 features so it's a very bad n to p ratio in terms of data uh, analysis right i did a boosting i got 86% accuracy i did an svm i got 97% accuracy that's the difference but on a similar thing if i do kind of you know have a very huge data set of let's say 10000 n and let's say only i have 10 or 12 features then if i do an svm it will be very bad okay so you would need to understand where your which model is helpful where okay overfitting can be controlled by soft margin approach so what we are we have already discussed that you now try, when you introduce the error term you now tend to have a soft margin right so you can allow some points to be here or allow some points to be here okay so this is called a soft margin uh, a simple convex optimization which is kind of an okay and this is not require nice math property feature selection it also helps in feature selection we'll see that how it helps in feature selection so see bio informatics protein classification cancer classification right here in these cases you don't have too much of uh, data to deal with but you have a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, features. So that's why SVM works on these pretty good. Okay, so uh, anyways, it's not quite. So it's very sensitive to noise, as you said, that it determines uh, depends on just only two support vectors or two just two points. I move them here and there, and I'll end up in you know a completely different uh, model. Okay, so okay. I've seen just two classes, right? So when we have a multi-class problem, we always have this one versus rest approach. So for example, you want to classify, there are three classes, high, medium, low. So first you want to classify high and take this as a total set. Then you want to classify medium and take this as total set. I mean medium versus high and low. Low versus high and medium. High versus medium low. So one versus all rest approach. This is applicable to all the multi-class algorithms, right? Every multi-class algorithm, be it logistic regression, be it the random forest, be it the boosting, will always deal with this. Okay. So we'll not see text categorization much. We'll discuss this in NLP. Okay. Now let's get back to the uh, more uh, practical hands-on part. So any questions now? Okay. So I took the iris data set and uh, kind of did a train test split. Okay, so I took uh, the test size as 0.3 and I took a train test split. And here I do a classification. So you do an SVM.SVC. So it is the support vector classifier. If it is a regression regression problem, then you do a SVM dot SVR. That is a support vector regressor. Okay. You put the kernel. Kernel, uh, I'll just show you what are the kernels are available. So this is a linear kernel. Uh, this is an RBF kernel. See how your boundaries are curved now. This is a polymer polynomial degree three kernel. You see how your different kernels can classify your data better, right? So let me see if there are, there's a list here. So these are the see how uh, so this is the linear kernel, this is your polynomial kernel and this is your RBF kernel, how different kernels are helping you to classify the data. Do you see this? So this is this is how your you know SVMs are very powerful. Okay, it's not so normally there are two or three kernels on I mean three kernels that are very famous. There are a little more also. I think there's an exponential also. 
but uh, no need these are the three kernels that you can uh, you know use as a parameter so when you do a grid search you can have these kernels in your parameter and check which of the kernels are fitting the best okay so you the normal the rbf kernel is kind of the adding dimension to the model which we discussed like if you have a circular data go with the rbf model uh, if you have a curved data which you think a polynomial can hit uh, do go with the polynomial kernel so all the equations that we saw those are basically depending on the kernels so if you are linear kernel your equation will change uh, like uh, what we had as a b0 plus b1 plus x b1 x1 plus b2 x2 that's a linear kernel if you have a polynomial kernel then you have b0 plus b0 uh, b1 x1 plus b0 uh, sorry b1 x1 square plus b2 x2 square something like that okay and uh, this is the uh, speciality of you know uh, your svm so i have used the linear kernel c is the error total i remember that uh, what i put sigma of ei is less than c so c is the error that you want to put uh, available uh, i mean how much error you can take as an user so you do this and the same thing what we do uh, did okay now we'll go to this later so you see how your point this is point 98 when we did a logistic regression it was somewhere i, I think point 97 so it, it has improved just with a linear kernel if i do a rbf kernel let's see if it works here it's kind of same on the point 98 on let's see if it is a polynomial kernel can be done if it has little bit worsen right so depending on the kernels your performance is your performance get affected so let's say i want to have so this is So this is point nine seven seven eight. If I do a point three, it's not. This is changed, right? So you are right now. You are trying to induce less error. That's why you are trying to overfit, and that's why you your test. Um, this thing is there. So if you do a zero, let me see if it takes zero. You don't want any error in the training data. Has to be some value. See, it has reduced so so bad. This is point two four. So you have tried to overfit the data, and that's why your testing has become become worse. So guys, understand this. Does this does this make sense? So for SVM, you just need to understand three things: the kernel, and uh, is whether it's a classification, so SVC or an SVR. uh kernel which kernel is rbf linear and polynomial and c is the error that you want to if the if you don't want any error like if you want to have very less error then you will try to overfit and that's why that's where your testing will testing error will uh, sorry yeah testing accuracy will go down and uh, your if you want to have uh, uh two a less underfitting you want to increase the c2 as much as possible okay so any questions now sunil questions no but today session is really going very good okay it's okay for you okay great nice to hear that okay so uh the last uh, thing that i uh, want to show you here is uh, we have already done the decision tree uh, uh, but what i wanted to show here 
is uh, how to do a grid search. Okay, so grid search is a function itself in Python. So as you can see, this is the grid search CV. So what you need, you need a model which will do fitting. You need the parameters on which the uh, grid search will be done. You need a scoring uh, on which your, uh, uh, what say, let's say, uh, the scoring performance will be checked and you want a cross validation set. So these are the th uh, one, two, three, four parameters that you want, you need for a grid search. Okay, so uh, homework for you guys is to do a grid search on the boosting model on Boston and check for the depth and the learning rate and come up with the best one. Okay, so it's very easy. Let me explain this uh, function. Uh, By then, what is the use of this grid search? Okay, so grid search, as I've already told you, grid search is something for to obtain the best parameter of the model. So as you remember, we have all last time what we did is that we ran a loop to keep it simple for you guys. I just ran a loop and saw how for different parameters. I think which one we were doing. I don't remember the model. So I just ran a loop uh, and for different parameters we were testing the best model, right? So for example, if someone tells you which is the most optimum depth of the tree for my model in my boosting, how will you say? No, no, could you repeat once again? So if once, if uh, I think so. I think so. You did that uh, when you are describing that sigmoid function. Correct, correct. So in for loop, we are going one by one. Correct, correct, correct. So similarly, uh, for example, in the boosting, right now what we have done is we have just kept the n estimators to 500, the max depth as four, minimum sample split as two, and learning rate as uh, rate as 0.001. Now, who has told you to, you know, keep these parameters? No one, right? You just kept it with your own um, intuition or you just kept it randomly, right? So you don't want that. You want the model to come up with the best parameters possible, which is the best depth of the tree, which is the best number of trees that you want to keep, what is the minimum sample split, which is the best one, and what is the learning, best learning rate, rate right? So the great search, what yes. we what we'll do is it will try to find out the best model for you on the basis of these parameters and come up with the best model possible. Understand that? What do you mean by, uh, no, what do you mean by best model is out of this 8 or 10 algo which we learned? No, 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 not the 10 algos within the tree. I told you, na, hyperparameters are there. Okay. Depth of the tree, the number of trees. I got it. How do you de define the number of trees to be 500? Should it be 700? Should it be 200? Should it be 1000? How do you determine that? So, for example, if this, uh, you see uh, the graph here, you see after 100, the uh, test after 200, let's say the decrease is too slow, right? Now, let's say after 700, it starts increasing. So 700 is the optimum point for the number of trees. So how do you come with up with this? You cannot do every time plot and see, right? So that's where the grid search comes uh, into picture. Uh, it does kind of a search on all the parameters and tells you which is the best model that is possible for your best model that should be implemented. Not the okay. best algo. It's not saying whether logistic regression will come. I mean, logistic regression uh, or a, a SVM or a boosting. It says within boosting, what is the number of trees you should keep? Okay. Okay. That's yeah. That's it. We'll do a again exercise. Yeah, you do this exercise. Uh, I'll just explain you the uh, grid search algorithm. Uh, I mean, algorithm is nothing there. I uh, just explained you. Just uh, understand. It, it means, yeah. It means, Shubhadi, once you will go through grid search, we will able to see L estate on the top, then RM on the second, like this. 
no 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 you, you are not getting the point is uh, okay okay just just three uh, see here just see here my screen uh, so you just have a performance metric the performance metric is a score that you want to put uh, this is the model uh, which model you want to put so this is the split uh, this is the shuffle, uh, split as in you are taking some bit in the testing part and some bit of the training part so you have taken test size is 0.2 0.2 means 20 percent 20 percent of the data will be taken in uh, testing and 80 percent will be kept for training now just see here the model i've taken is a decision tree the parameters i've kept is as max depth and i'm checking the max depth from 1 to 11 okay now i, I want to see at what max depth the tree is the best one i mean gives the more best accuracy okay so i do a grid search grid search cv estimator is the regressor that the model i put param grid parameters is the depth which we have uh, put here scoring function is the score function that is the r square that we have put and cv sets is the cross validation set that we have put as a uh, testing okay then you do a grid dot fit and then you do a return grid dot best estimator so what it will say here you see parameter max depth is 3 for the optimal model okay so between 1 to 11 3 if you keep max depth as 3 you get the best accuracy yeah yeah so with now i got it basically for a particular model what are the parameters which will be the give us the optimal value perfect yes that's what you want for a particular model what should be the parameters that will give the best model yeah, that's the best. Okay. Okay, so uh, we'll close with SVM also. So any questions now? Out of any, whatever we have done from the starting, any questions? I have still uh, one question. Is out of the 13, how to remove five? By default, those are getting removed in uh, last show. But I want to see the, means out of rank one, there were 10 but i need top four or five so you have got it no yeah, on the previous graph you have got it no top five if you want to take yeah so uh, means yeah this graph was generated by fvm no this graph was generated by boosting this graph okay was... just uh, yeah just so once again boosting dot feature names yeah Okay, got it. Yeah, thanks. No, no. Uh, I mean, I didn't understand your question. You get I'll... top five, right? No, no. Yeah. Yeah, this is thing only I was looking. So I'll write a separate program for this only. Variable importance. Yeah, variable importance plot here it has come. Now, out of these five, let's say you want to take the LSTAT RM this age tax, okay? <laughs> You take this variables in the data set. That is the normal subsetting, right, of a data frame. From the data frame, you just take these columns and then refit the model. Yeah. Got it, right? Yeah, that that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, any other questions? Anyone else? Give me a yes or no. So, uh, oh, yeah. So, so are these only algos which we need to learn in regression and classification, no, no. or are there any which we can take care in future? There, there are many. There are many. So many as in uh, many modifications of these. But on the whole, so now next we'll do naive base. After naive base, I think uh, you have almost learned all the models except for the deep learning. And but there can be variations of these, okay. But overall, overall, if you would see, you have touched all the models possible. But of course, there will be variations. You can take an ensemble of SVM and boosting, you can take there's so many infinite possibilities are there. But that I'll tell you how to modify the other models later. But as a whole, these are the big models, uh, big picture of modeling. Uh, right now, next, we will do knife base. After that, I okay. think will be 
done and after that sometime we will go for clustering also yeah yeah so clustering also is there for today's uh, class but clustering is unsupervised learning this doesn't have anything related to yeah supervised learning. anyways is this clear to everyone so now next we'll move on to knife base okay Okay, uh, first we'll complete the knife base. Okay, so coming to the knife base algorithm this is a probability based modeling approach okay so we can do a spam classification medical diagnosis whether so uh, I mean anything will work. So uh, okay, now I told you guys to go through base theorem. Did, did anyone uh, go through the base theorem? Okay, so I think uh, I'll explain you guys here only. So what naive base is trying to do? You want to predict the probability of y. Let's see, you want to predict the probability of high, y being high given your x features. What is this given? Given means conditioned on these features. You have these features. You have a value for this. x equal to 5, x2 is equal to 2, xn is equal to let's say 10. Given that these values are there, what is the probability of y? to be high okay so this probability can be let's say 0.7 or anything that can be so we have we are always dealing with probabilities right so now naive base is always a classifier this is very important naive base cannot be used for a regression problem because it is dealing with probabilities okay so now let's see what is what is what here so probability of high phi equal to high given x1 x2 xn is equal to probability of x1 xn given y into probability of y divided by probability of x1 okay now what does this mean 
so you say the probability of y equal to high given my features x is equal to what is the probability of having these features given y equal to high then multiplying by the probability of high forget the denominator do you understand this notion So I am trying to say is probability. Okay, let me uh, change to one note and I'll explain you. Okay. So probability y equal to high given x one, x n. Suppose you have this data set, right? And you want to predict what is the probability of y equal to high when x one is equal to two and uh, x two equal to five. What you'll do is you'll see probability of x one equal to two, x two equal to five, given y equal to high. Into probability of y equal to high. Forget the denominator. Denominator we'll see later. So, can anyone answer me? What is the probability of x one equal to two and x two equal to five when y equal to high? can you answer me uh, on the microphone because it's difficult for me to switch screens you can have, we can have a discussion probably so that everyone understands so it will be 1/4 uh not exactly oh, uh, not exactly there are two high but of it to yeah 1/2 it should be correct. because there are two high excellent and two we high. want 2 and 5 correct correct excellent so You see your data. You see y is equal to high in two places, and y x is equal to two, and x x one is equal to two, and x two is equal to five occurs only in one place. So this will be one by two. Into what is the probability of y equal to high? Uh, one by two, two by four equal to one by two. Excellent. Excellent. So you get this. So denominator is basically. Probability of x one equal to two, x two equal to five, given y equal to high, into probability of y equal to high, plus probability of x one equal to two, x two equal to five, and given y is equal to low, into probability y equal to low. There's a lag, I think, on the screen, so just. Bear with me. So, what is the overall probability of having x one equal to two and x two equal to five? That is equal to probability of x one equal to two and x two equal to five given y equal to high 
into probability of y into equal to y plus the same thing given y equal to low into probability of y equal to low. Now can you tell me the denominator? What is this part? This is the same part, right, on the numerator as well, what we have seen. Correct? Yes. Correct? So this is 1 by 4. And what is this on the right? What is the answer on the right? You guys there? Yes, just should not take too much time, right? What is the what is the problem? I think it is also one by four. The other is given one by four. Okay. Do you see x one equal to two and x two equal to five and y equal to low on the left side of the table? Do you see anywhere that? Uh, yeah. Uh, on right side again, it will be one by four. No, no. What I'm saying is, what is the probability of x1 equal? Oh, I think it is zero. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Zero, right? Yeah, because yeah. you never mm -hmm. see probability of yeah, x2 because, and x2 equal to five as any occurrence when y equal to low. So this is zero. Oh, yeah. Zero. Mm, right, right. So what is one by four divided by one by four? That is one. Now, if you see all this calculation leaving aside, if you just see on the table, what if Given this data, what if someone asks you what is the probability of x1 equal to 2 and x2 equal to 5 and y equal to high? You'll never even think twice. It has only one occurrence and that time y was high. It means on the basis of the probabilities, on the basis of the data, you'll always say that this is 1, right? Because you only have one occurrence and that time y was high. Understand this? Guys, give me give me a yes or no so that I understand whether you are getting the. Okay, so how many data points are there? Four data points are there, right? How many times two and five had occurred simultaneously? Once. Once. Yeah. Once. And, okay. And what was the uh, y status at that point of time? Only high. Only high. Excellent. So it means from the data, you can always say that whenever x1 is 2 and x2 is 5, y will be high, right? I don't have any other option. Yes. Correct. So this is how your knife base will work. Now, knife base, uh, okay, now, knife base has a particular. So, so, so this one is. Uh, so this one is not clear. Why is not one by two? Why is one? Because there are two occurrences of high for y. Yeah. Out of these two, there is only one occurrence of two and five. Then why not one by two? Oh, what I'm trying to say no. is x one and x two. X one is two. X two is five. How many occurrences were there? I'm not saying what is the probability of y equal to high. I'm not asking you this. What am I asking you is probability of x1 equal to 2, x2 equal to 5, given y equal to high. What was this? What did you answer here? Your high was two times and this one occurred one time. But now what I'm trying to say is what is the probability of y equal to high given x1 equal to 2 and x2 equal to 5? How many occurrences of x1 equal to 2 and x2 equal to 5 you have? 
that will be yeah that will be one correct yeah, and then what was the probability of y in that case i mean how many occurrences of y equal to y you have in that case only for 2 and 5 there is only one correct that's what so it's a definite thing whenever you are okay, speaking okay. and five you are your y equal to y is 100% one correct correct awesome so this is very easy when you have four data points and you just have two features what if you have 1000 data points or let's say 1 lakh data points and you have 1000 features can you just look into the data and see all these things not no right it's not practically possible no. to see all these things and that too one thing you might have noticed i've told you 2 and 5 these are two classes okay now what what if i want to predict for 2.1 or 5.2 there's no particular cases in that case right so first let us understand how a class i mean how my base behaves when the features are categorical so when the features are categorical like how i stated here like assume that these were categories 2 5 3 5 4 6 and 7 2 i easily could find out the probabilities concerning that okay but what if there were numerics 2.1 2.2 and now i want to predict for 2.3 okay so that is a different approach that we have to follow we will not see that right now first let us understand how your when you have categorical features what your uh, naive base helps so a big assumption big assumption of naive base is probability of x1 equal to 2 and x2 equal to 5 is equal to probability of uh, given y equal to high is equal to probability of x1 equal uh, given high into probability of x2 equal to 5 given y equal to high so this is the assumption of independence you say that my x1 uh, okay now basic formula of uh, probability is x and probability of x and y is equal to probability of x into probability of y if x and y are independent do you know this yes yeah, we know okay so it means the assumption of naive base is probability of x1 com equal to 2 and comma x2 equal to 5 given probability y equal to high sorry given y equal to high is equal to probability of x1 equal to 2 given high into probability of x2 equal to 5 given y equal to high so this is the independence assumption why this helps because when you have 1000 features or let's say very high number of features it is not practically feasible for anyone to go into the table and look into the probabilities of individual occurrences right so if there is an assumption that this should follow that whenever i am doing a naive base all the features are assumed independent okay they are assumed independent and that's why we can multiply the probabilities of each of the features does this sound good is everyone comfortable with this yeah yeah yes yeah okay so uh, shubhdeep why do you want to see those values like sorry you have a uh, first row as 2 comma 5 correct so then why do you want to check the probability there it means you have only one high for two and five value okay okay no this was so an you example. have this was just an example one up and so uh, for example uh, so uh, if you have one more row and with uh, two and three x1 as two and x2 as suppose, three suppose and uh, y as high no suppose uh, you want to predict now so someone gives you two and three 
now you got to predict what will be my y will it be high and low you don't have 2 and 3 in your data right so what you will do you will say what is my probability of y equal to high given x1 is 2 x2 equal to 3 right so this will be probability of x1 equal to 2 given y equal to high and probability of x2 equal to okay not 2 and 3 let's say 2 and 6 okay uh okay let me write it in a different okay now you see i give you two points 2 and 6 okay and now i say i want a prediction what is the probability that y equal to high so what i do i write the same formula probability of x1 equal to 2 comma x2 equal to c 6 given y equal to high into p equal p in p of y equal to high divided by this the formula now i say that this is where in the assumption of manai base comes in so i said probability of x1 equal to 2 given y equal to high into probability of x2 equal to 6 given y equal to high okay into probability of y equal to high divided by probability of x1 equal to 2 into probability of x2 equal to 6 is this fine in both places i have Use the naive base assumption. Yes, yeah, we have used yes, yeah. Correct. Now, what is the probability? What is the probability of x yeah. equal to two given y equal to high? Now let's go back to I the. I think. Uh, yeah, I think it's two. Y equal to high is two occurrences. What is uh, so? This is one by two, right? Yes. Yeah. What is the probability of x two equal to six and y equal to high? X two equal to six, y equal to high is zero, right? So this is zero. Zero, yes, yeah. So on top, this is also zero. Divided, I'm just writing uh, the value so that you understand that uh, into probability of high is one by two divided by pro what is the probability of x one equal to two? What is the probability? One of by two. No. I'm not saying conditioned on y equal to high. I'm saying what is one by one by four. Awesome. So this is one by four. Similarly, what is the probability of x two equal to six? One by four. Correct. So this is essentially zero, but you understand all the numbers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So everyone is clear with this? Yes. Okay. Amazing. Yeah. Let's go back to the slides. So it's uh, telling you the same things again and again. Okay. So. Uh, okay. Leave these things. Okay, now we can uh, see. Uh, let's see this. Okay. For example, you had this data where you are seeing outlook, the temperature, the humidity, the windy uh, status, and whether they are going to come or to play or not. So let's say someone asks you, "What is the likelihood of children going to play?" Equal to yes. Okay. Given uh, let's say uh, these parameters, it is sunny, it is cool, it is high, it is uh, windy. Okay. Now let's find out. So we'll write 
slowly and will understand so probability of play equal to yes given sunny cool high true equal to probability of sunny given yes into probability of cool given yes okay i'm running out of space let me write it here on the top probability of sunny given yes to probability of cool given yes into probability of high given yes into probability of true given yes okay now see when your play is yes what is the probability of the outlook being sunny so these are the possible um, outlooks and these are the number of occurrences okay now what is the probability of understand this very slowly what is the probability of the outlook being sunny when people when children came out to play just see this row nothing else Two by nine, perfect. Two by nine. What is the probability of so? Uh, let's say just an example. What is the probability of this being overcast? Given yes, you already have the answer. Four by nine, three by nine. Okay. Similarly for no, what will be it? Three by five, zero by five, two by five. Understand? Yes. Okay. similarly what is the probability of temperature being cool given yes so given yes what is the probability the temperature is cool see this three by nine perfect three by nine what is the probability of humidity being high given yes by 9 perfect so now i think you guys know that the answer is here <laughs> so and it's already written there yeah so just put to into perspective these are the values 2 by 9 3 by 9 3 by oh, sorry okay this is also 3 by 9 3 by 9 and what is this 9 by 14 so what is if we go to this formula this is and then we also have the probability of play equal to yes remember these were the x given y and then there was a probability of y also right yeah yeah yes yeah. was there right only play So similarly, what is the probability of play equal to yes? Play equal to yes is nine divided by fourteen. Nine by fourteen, right? So this is the probability of point zero zero five three, and then likelihood of no is point zero zero two six. So what is the uh, answer then? What is the probability? Uh, I mean, whether you say. uh people will come out to play or not what will be your answer what will be the answer and the answer is already on the slide the prediction will know yeah plus uh, the math because... Yeah, because it's zero to each. Yeah, is higher than probability of yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Understood. 
I think this is very clear, right? We have gone through the example. So this is a new bias which uh, will you for binary classification? Uh, I think binary classification. I mean, yes or no? Is it? Yes. No, yeah. no. Multi class also. Zero or no. Or multi class also can be. Multi class. Okay. okay. So now we have seen how we can predict. a binary class give it the features are categorical why categorical because for example sunny was a categorical feature i mean temperature was a categoric overcast was a categorical feature overcast had just three values sunny uh what was it sunny uh, uh overcast sorry outlook out outlook was a categorical feature with sunny overcast and rainy just three possible values what if you have a continuous value okay so what if you have continuous values in the features does that mean i cannot uh, apply nice base no that is not the prop that is not the case what happens in that case is that you assume that each of the feature will follow a normal distribution for example uh, let's say i have the height And weight. Let's say height is twenty. Uh, sorry, two hundred centimeters. One eighty. One ninety. Two fifty. Two fifty is too high. Sorry. One sixty. One sixty-five. Similarly, weight is ninety-five. Ninety. Seventy-five. Sixty. Sixty-two. You want to predict whether it is a. male female female male female right so based on the height and weight you want to predict the so what you assume is you assume now you cannot have the occurrences of, these are continuous variables right so you don't have a categorical uh, feature so what you assume is that your height and weight will follow a normal distribution so height is following a normal distribution with a mean let's say what is the mean here let's say it is the mean is 170 cm and let's say the standard deviation is 10 so height will follow a normal distribution of mean calculated from here and a standard deviation again calculated from here and it will follow a normal distribution so if i have a normal distribution i have the mean now if a new number comes up let's say 179 can i calculate the probability of 179 from a normal distribution where the mean and standard deviation is given remember our first class the z values where means we were saying the marks of the student if the principal asks you what is the probability of this child being greater than 39 marks out of 40 remember that same thing what is the probability of this of a new person having a height 179 cm if your height distribution is a normal distribution with the mean this and standard deviation this so from the normal distribution you get a probability similarly weight will follow a normal distribution with a different mean and different standard deviation and you tell that the weight of this this same person is let's say 76 now what is the probability of um 76 uh, coming from a male and what is the probability of 179 cm coming from a male i mean sorry a yeah, male and then accordingly you get the probability that the person is a male and similarly from a female you get the probability now that the person is a female do you understand this or is i think this is not clear right yeah this is the same bell curve you described correct. in the first or second session correct correct, correct. okay so basically you do this now there are a lot of slides in this right 
so okay now I, I think we have already explained this so for example if your um, mean if this temperature is uh, uh, continuous variable your humidity is a continuous variable then what is the mean what is the standard deviation what is the mean what is the standard deviation rest is categorical so you calculate the mean you calculate the standard deviation this is the function of the normal distribution so you feed in your new variable this is the mean this is your standard deviation and uh, this is also your standard deviation from this equation you get the probability so if a variable is let's say uh, i want to uh, find out for 85 so it is 85 so 85 you feed into this equation the mean is there and accordingly the probabilities will come so what is the probability of temperature equal to 66 given yes you feed in this okay you calculate this and the same way you get the answer these we have already seen these came from the equation so this is 0 0.0340 and similarly if you do for humidity you will come to get something as 0 0.0221 and then you get the answer okay is it okay yeah okay great Night base is often a good choice if you don't have much training data. Okay, so I'll not go into so much of these things. These are not required. We have all seen this, right? For uh, sensitivity confusion matrix, we have discussed this sensitivity. Uh, yes. things. So, okay. So there's something called an ROC curve for a classification. So as we said that there's an F score, which is the harmonic mean of sensitivity and specificity. There's something called a ROC curve and the area under the curve, AUC. So this is called receiver operating characteristics. just the name nothing fancy about it just the sensitivity sensitivity versus one minus specificity is the curve plot there's something called an area of the curve right so an area of the curve will be equal to one if it is something like this right so if you just analyze your uh, just go home and analyze this AUC equal to one is the best possible scenario. And I'll ask this question next class. Why is AUC equal to one the best scenario? Otherwise, a AUC like this is 50%. It means it's kind of uh, your 50% good in fitting the model. Like your R square, you are 50%. Uh, if it is 0.5, it means you are around 50%. So AUC, if it is around 0.5, You'll say you'll uh, you'll around fifty percent good in fitting the model. Okay, so uh, and if you have AUC equal to one, then that is the best case scenario. Okay, so we have already discussed cross validation. We have done all these things. Okay. The task of test classification, this I will discuss later because this is a little difficult and since you just have got uh, night base ingested, I don't want you to you know, get you know, too much complexity of, of night base. So this we'll discuss when we do the natural language processing class. Okay. Now let's move on to clustering. Clustering is a very simple uh, algorithm and very loved algorithm it is very easy to implement okay so we'll see what is the uh, so how much time we have we have around 20 minutes okay so now any doubt still here because clustering is a different uh, chapter so any doubt still here 
so this name uh, what you have mentioned this is used for the uh, unsupervised learning mm-hmm. or can be used for both supervised and unsupervised no right base is for supervised learning that's supervised. right because probability of y equal to hi uh, given when we are doing on the right side probability of x given y equal to hi so you need to know what, when your y was hi right so you also always have to have a supervised uh, thing for naive base but naive base is only used for classification and not for a regression okay okay so, so uh, this uh, this naive base is uh, means uh, it looks similar to that decision tree means decision tree uh not exactly decision type model we work on one example not exactly it's not decision tree it works on the concept of probabilities but it's not decision tree decision okay. kind of you know taking partitions and all this is not the background behind decision tree is gini index that deals with probabilities but it is not uh, similar to naive base okay okay now okay so just uh, uh, sorry uh, just one last question yeah yeah sure no problem. again uh, i want to analyze that uh, boson set now again because now we have learned all the algorithms Okay. So again, um, I remember your steps which you uh, told you on that day. Correct. So first, I have the data sets, and uh, then now I can decide. Okay, these are the top four or five. How many I have to take? I can decide that. Correct. So that is one thing now I am able to do out of a team, which one I want to. Then I know cross validations. How many fold? I have to do that, mm-hmm. and uh, then what do I try with different model with their variables, I mean parameters, and see which one fits best, or is there some other way around? No, no, there's. I mean to say, uh, okay, my question, straight question is that this Boson said some my manager has given to me. Okay. Now I have to predict. something i have to say how much accuracy that will be the first question mm-hmm. the second question will be some visualization part so can give the ppt based on this one okay and why you have removed this one why you have not removed this one what can be the extra story that can come around okay so accuracy part i think we have at this all through these weeks what we have seen is that you move from model 1 to model 2 to model 3 okay based on your accuracy so whatever accuracy you you are getting if this is lesser than the accuracy here this is lesser than accuracy here right so this can be a linear regression this is can be a random forest this can be a boosting you are always start with a linear regression then go on to a random forest then go on to a boosting prior to do do a variable importance plot so variable importance plot is connected to these two methods linear regression is not very effective in giving you the variable importance because it just gives you coefficient so these when so once you get the important variables you feed back these important variables to the model and then get a better accuracy okay now once you have this model ready okay now we we just have the variables after after that then there is a step called cross validation and grid search which will give you the hyper parameters which is the max depth entries and all after you get the optimal hyper parameters
to kind of feedback this to your model and then you get the best accuracy correct now further to improve this you need to do a feature engineering which is not in the scope of our course okay but this is more of related to business knowledge feature engineering can also come with the transformations so you transform the data you do a feature engineering and this you feed back to your model you again do a cross validation and grid search and then you get the best accuracy so this is kind of the loop that you need to follow but since feature engineering is not in the scope of our course we will see which is the best model then after we select the model we see the parameters hyperparameters and after we see the hyperparameters we kind of tell the best accuracy possible now data science like r and python or uh, let's say python what we have done python is not related to visualization okay this is not a visualization tool the only thing you can see is the summary statistics or how your variables are moving okay what is so if your boss asks me ask you that give me insights uh, about uh, you know uh, let's say uh, what is the what is your insight that has come up so let's say yeah, you are um, on the same boston house data set so if you uh, if you work in a real estate company and your boss asks me what is the driving factor so you'll say that l stat is the driving factor now your boss may ask okay uh, tell me what tell me if i have to increase my price by 10 percent then uh, if i want, want my first people my customers to pay me 10 percent more than what it is paying which variable should i reduce okay which variable should i reduce to gain that 10 percent increase okay so this is called a scenario building scenario building is basically for example your l stat you see the correlation of l stat with the price okay if it is positive it means uh, i think it was uh, uh, opposite yeah it was negative correlation because l stat is the number of, yeah it's a negative yes. so if you decrease your l stat so let's say if you decrease if uh, if you say i uh, input l stat to 0.6 keeping all the other variables constant what will be the price uh, predicted then you say okay now let's say if i in decrease my l stat to 0.3 what will be the price that is your analyze that is your scenario generation that what if scenario what if i do this what will be the price change for other variables keeping constant okay then he says okay l stat i cannot do much more because that's the neighborhood what if i can crime rate i cannot control much so what if i can change the number of rooms so you'll say okay if you change the number of rooms from two to three the consumers are willing to pay this much increase of price so let's say if you have all the variables constant and do not change anything on the other variables just keep the price uh, from two to three uh, sorry the room number of rooms from uh, increase from two to three and then predict for the same data point then what will the price change okay so for example if you take the random data point where the number of rooms were two now in the same data point all the features you keep same features just the number of rooms you increase from two to three and then say okay my price has changed uh, with 10 percent now you come go back to your boss you say that see if i change one unit of rooms there i can expect a 10 percent increase of price so can we do a cost benefit analysis saying that what is the additional cost 
for us to make another room uh, in an apartment and I mean for future uh, houses and uh, my customers will be willing to pay me this much. So this is the insight, your insights or the things you can get out of your predictive model. But the visualization part is different. Visualization is more of uh, the diagnostics of what are the uh, variable, what is the variable mean, variance, deviation, uh, when you have to skew data, you need to transform that. So that's where your visualization comes into picture. So this is what uh, your data science will look like overall. Okay. Yeah, that's a great uh, story that uh, I was looking for. So basically two, three points you told me which are very new for me. So okay. insight uh, or you can say this, what was the term you used? If I decrease L state by something delta or increase delta, what will be the effect? Data building, insight generation. Uh, data building or yeah, business insight. Business, yeah. yeah. Uh, or scenario building basically. Scenario building, yeah. So, yeah. So if I have to increase delta in a particular field, then how will I proceed? I will just go in pendage, uh, pendage and for a particular column, I will add delta to every or is there some other way around to do this? No. If that is a very basic thing I can do, but is there a better way to do in Python? No, I mean, uh, you can change a column and increase by 10% to anything, right? That's, that's see, that those things you have to find out. Uh, what is the better way to, you know, handle or uh, handle your data or, you know, manipulate your data. There are many ways you can do a data frame subsetting. You can, uh, you know, manipulate the variables. There are many ways, but what is the most efficient way that you have to find out according to your, it will gain slowly with practice. Huh? Uh, it's not that today okay, only okay. You will understand, okay, this is also, this is how you should do everything, right? Slowly when you start coding and all, you'll start to understand how you can feed in new data, how your, uh, so feeding new data is very easy, right? We have already seen that if there's a new point, we just convert that into a data frame and feed that to our uh, model, right? So that, that's, that's, that's there. But uh, apart from that, um, there are m many ways where you can do a data manipulation. Okay, so okay. Uh, and for, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, for plotting your future, uh, I have to finish the math uh, plot. Sorry, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So because we just have seven or eight minutes. Maybe. So clustering is basically a unsupervised learning. Okay, so what is an unsupervised learning? We have already seen that when your Y is not there, okay? So uh, um, I don't have a response associated to every data point, right? So how does this help? So we have already seen clustering, I think a little bit, but uh, to be a little more detailed. So for example, if you are, if you have somewhat like a data points are, This is a scatter plot. Okay. Now you say this is the height and this is your weight. Now you say that I need to find out who are the males and females, but you forgot to annotate the data when you are collecting. So you do a clustering and you kind of come up with groups. Okay, so these groups, now you know that you are trying to find a male and a, sorry, this is female and kind of trying to find a male. But there are many cases where you don't know uh, what you are trying to, uh, I think there's a lag on the screen, we just will see the drawing in about some time.
हेलो 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 या वी कैन हियर यू नाउ दिस वुड बी या वी लॉस्ट यू या आई थिंक देयर इज अ प्रॉब्लम विद द कनेक्शन एनीवेज सो आई थिंक इवन माय आईपैड वर्ड डिस्कनेक्टेड गिव मी अ टू टू मिनट्स एंड दिस कनेक्ट Okay, by the time it connects, I'll just continue with what I was saying. So, uh, in unsupervised learning, you don't have uh, uh, the whys, and yeah, we'll just wrap up very fast. I think we can continue that clustering uh, next time. So, um, you don't have the whys in picture. You have the theta scatter plot of it, and you're trying to figure out that what will be the what will be the kind of groups that can be coming out of the data and see a proper segregation of the groups okay so this kind of uh, doesn't help very much because it's unsupervised learning the insights are up uh, you know left to the user or the um, modeler to understand uh, but the thing is that there are certain sometimes uh, there's no so for example it can also help in insight generation right so i'll give you an example how clustering will help you in insight generation but uh, it's not very handy it's it's uh, kind of uh, doesn't make much sense so it's basically the same algorithm or the same type where uh, wherein we saw the k nearest neighbors it is kind of uh, calculating the distance of each of the points and uh, it's kind of kind of assigning the same cluster to, to the points which are closer to my um, so what it does it's essentially i'll uh, tell about the algorithm first so what it does is just hold on let me try to connect my ipad if i can very fast okay so we are online let me share okay so uh, i'll do this very fast and we can continue on the next class what essentially it does is it kind of assigns so how do we start creating this cluster let's see we have the same data and the clusters are not there okay let's see we have the same data now what it does is you tell how many clusters you need okay so that is kind of a user input so you say that you need around three clusters okay so what it will do it will randomly assign three points randomly okay uh i'm sorry it does it out of the data points only so it doesn't go out of 
the data it will randomly assign three points okay random assignment so what it does is it calculates each of the points distance from this point and so for example is this point if this point is closer to this point it goes into this cluster this point is closer to this point it goes this cluster this point is goes to this point okay so like this the clusters assignment start now this group is assigned out with whatever points come inside they calculate a new centroid or a new mean and then this cluster will have a new mean and then again this cluster will have a new mean similarly this cluster will have a new mean and then again the same procedure is done and again a new cluster will be formed because now the distances are calculated from this point from this point from this point and similarly so new clusters a new center point is this so your clusters will be built around this you build around this so whichever point so for example if a new point is there if this point is closer to this mean it falls into this cluster if this closer to this mean it falls to this cluster okay or if it is closer to this it falls into this cluster so like this it keeps on reiterating the process right and it kind of uh, uh, goes like this so when will the algorithm stop when the t minus 1 i mean the previous center is equal to the tth center okay so what i told that every time the first first cluster uh, center assignment is random right so i have a random assignment next so after this assignment is done we have kind of the clusters next what will happen is this cluster will have a new center because new points came in and then again a cluster will be formed this cluster will have a new center because new points came in and it will have a new center similarly for this so next again new points came into this cluster i'll have a new center and again a cluster will be formed so this is an iterative process and it will stop when your previous one cluster and the tth cluster the cluster centers do not move at all okay so we'll continue this in next class just uh, and the distance measure is the same that are that is used in k nearest neighbors right what we learned is k nearest neighbors what was the distance x1 minus x2 whole square sorry x1 minus uh, so if this coordinate is 2 comma 5 and this coordinate is 3 comma 7 so basically 2 minus 3 whole square plus 5 minus 7 whole square so this is the distance measure uh, under root of this we'll continue this in next class but uh, if you have any questions for today you can ask me any questions no question from my side so the but uh, really today session was best okay thank you so much thank you okay so we close today for for today now then thank you so much for joining yeah okay good thank you see you yeah let's meet next week thank you Good night, everyone. Right. No, not from my side. Okay, so everything is cool. Um, we had so so Neil. Now you're comfortable with the business um, aspect of whatever we are doing. Uh, we had a healthy discussion last time, understanding how it can help mm -hmm. in the daily business. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so let me. tell you one of the projects that i did and how you know uh, uh, it it helped me in applying machine learning so we applied uh, i submitted my project uh, uh, from johnson johnson uh, to nascom ai game changer awards
so we, we made it to the final rounds but we were not selected in the final publication so they selected top 12 out of 200 ND entries for the final publication we could not make into the final publication but we were selected for the final round uh, so uh, let me tell you how you know machine learning helped me in uh, you know applying algorithms to actual business so um, if you guys are aware of the FMCG business, okay, so Johnson Johnson Baby has um, three three verticals, right? Health, health, uh, medical, uh, pharma, and consumer. Consumer is like the Johnson Baby and Avino, the Neutrogena. I think that is more, that is less common in the US. Uh, Johnson Johnson is more known for Janssen and the other components of the business in US, Tylenol and all. So. For in India, Listerine and uh, Johnson's Baby is the most famous uh, uh, consumer products uh, in India. So, uh, so what my project was basically, I had to find patterns in. Uh, so every consumer goods or anything which is dealing with a supply chain will have some inventory in it, right? So there will be a production, there will be some inventory, and then there will be sales. Okay. So your main objective of supply chain is to provide the right product at the right place to the right customer okay through the right means so that is the objective of supply chain so uh, for example if you want to see so the very important component in uh, a supply chain is your lead time what is lead time is basically that the you cannot like for example if you say that i want this product today i cannot provide you the product today because i have to make it right and there has to be some time that will be involved in making the product so i have to be ready with that product so how much time does it take me to produce that product for example that is called the lead time or how much time does it take uh, me to uh, take the product to you guys uh, that is the lead time okay so for example if you want a product today I have to prepare it say two months before okay I have to start preparing I have to take the raw materials I have to take um, into production and then I have to supply it to you reach to the nearest store uh, and I mean go to the nearest store near you so that you can easily have access to it so there's a lead time involved in it right so you cannot always have your make to order that's called make to order you, you cannot have like today you want the product and uh, tomorrow I deliver or sorry yes yesterday you told me I want the product and today I deliver okay so it, it cannot be like that so every supply chain will have some inventory right so the inventory is there in the nearest store in a store near you so that whenever you come you are we are ready with that uh, product uh, which was uh, you know produced let's say two three months ago and I have the inventory so inventory tends to be uh, a very important part of supply chain but inventory since you have inventory uh, it will be a cost associated right because you are uh, storing those products you are you know uh, kind of uh, you're taking up of space where you're storing the products so this particular inventory holding cost right so that is okay that is still okay but the problem is what if you had uh, forecasted that you will be needing this product you had just forecasted right you didn't tell me that uh, no one tells johnson johnson that i want a johnson baby powder next um, i mean um, three months down the line get it ready for me that doesn't work right it may happen in uh, a very you know low volume business like the airplanes okay airplane this airplanes are not uh, made on forecast basis they are made made to order or ships right no one you know builds ships every month it's based on the uh, requirement but it cannot be the same uh, in case of powders right you don't tell me or john you don't tell johnson johnson that i want a product three months down the line so you i forecasted that there will be thousand units that uh, is going to sell three months down the line so i produce thousand units but what if i land up in just selling 200 units it can be right i just forecasted and it could, could be wrong so the problem here is basically your inventory can go stale okay so you know your inventory uh, the stale inventory is basically the uh, a product which expired inside my inventory right it was i could not sell it and it crossed its shelf life and expired uh, so
so that that product i cannot obviously sell to customers so my project was basically to find patterns in inventory i mean all the variables which leads to the inventory and find patterns which lead to the most probable products that uh, lead tend to expire now when you are given a project what how do you proceed okay so for example i'll uh, i'll i'll guide you how i started okay so uh, my project name was you have to identify patterns using advanced machine learning techniques to reduce this expired part of your inventory okay this is your problem statement now first of all as a data scientist uh, or whenever you're doing an advanced machine learning problems algorithms come later lot later okay first of all is to get your data and any algorithm you apply if your data is garbage your output will be garbage make i mean take that to the bank it's guaranteed that if you have a garbage data any you ad apply advanced deep learning models your output will be garbage no model can save you so the first and foremost thing is to get the proper data now in for example right now what we have been doing is boston data it's always i mean uh, you know it's ready right uh, it's kind of the data is structured it's given in a table you already have a output you just need to train but it's not the same case in a real business right it's uh, more of you know it doesn't happen like that so the first problem is to you know get the data now after you get the data how do you get the data first of all what variables do you need to so there comes a business sense right so for example inventory what what all things can be uh, taken into consideration how much i am over forecasting or under forecasting okay so if i am over forecasting let's say i am putting more uh, producing more than what i am trying to sell it's it is a tendency to go into slog if my lead time is let's say much more than my shelf life i mean my product shelf life is 6 months and my lead time to reach the customer is 8 months it means i am always tending to uh, you know go into expiry but that obviously doesn't happen so you take a ratio okay you include both variables lead time and shelf life and the model will understand what is the ratio between these two that's where the interaction comes into part right what is the interaction between these two variables such that the interaction between these two will lead to the probability of expiry okay then you take into consideration consideration which market you are selling right what is the production site what is the now johnson johnson is widespread in a lot of countries right so it's present in asia it's present in us it's present in uh, brazil it's present in europe it's present in middle east everywhere all over the world right now there are certain uh, certain uh, the products which may be you know produced in us and uh, sold in asia pacific okay or there may be products which are produced in brazil sold in japan okay so now you understand the lead times associated right a product which is being produced in japan us and sold in japan will have at least 2 months of lead time from its production then its logistics and all so this lead time comes into a very big variable right right now okay then you have uh, the market you have the franchise which franchise you are selling so johnson bay is it a oil is it a powder so all these variables are get into uh, what what has been the past trends of uh, this particular uh, invoicing i mean what is the rate of invoicing how frequently it, this product has been invoiced how frequently it has been uh, bought by customers for example if my product my last invoicing for this product was let's say 7 months ago it means people are not buying this i am still forecasting and putting building on my inventory but people are not buying it so there comes uh, i mean uh, there is this problem associated so now i have all these variables now i clean my data i okay i form good variables out of it so that's called feature engineering so for example lead time by shelf life i keep it as a variable i don't keep it lead time and shelf life as a independent variables you can also keep that not a problem because your uh, algorithm will try to understand the interaction between these two variables but it's always better if you know something you already have i mean you have, if you have something or you already know that lead time is to shelf life ratio is important then you directly feed that in feed that variable right then you have uh, all the variables the forecasting accuracy and all i predict now if i run the algorithm first what we did is we find a find out the who, which are the 
most important variables. So, for example, forecasting accuracy came up to be the very, very big uh, uh, determining factor. If you are over forecasting more than 20%, you are tending to be more expired. I mean, tending to uh, that the inventory will expire more with a probability of greater than 0.7. Okay. If your forecasting accuracy is more than 40%, the probability of expiry is greater than 0.9. So these are very important business insights, right? So whenever, so for example, how how I got this? So uh, like we discussed, first we had the important variables. Now, yeah, last last time, like I said to Sunil, uh, for example, my model has prepared all the thing. The model has run. Now I feed in Johnson's baby oil. My forecasting accuracy is let's say let's say uh, 80 percent. Okay, what if my forecasting accuracy dips to 60 percent? I input 60 percent here. I keep all the variables same. Okay, I keep the lead time same, or I keep the shelf life same, I keep the market same, and then see what is the effect on uh, the probability. So I've just changed the um, what do you say uh, the forecasting accuracy, and I'm seeing what is the tendency of my product to go into expiry and I see that if I changed my forecasting accuracy from 80% to 60% I was actually telling uh, the error for earlier 20% and 40% so if I take uh, take into consideration the accuracy so 80% and 60% so if I change that my expiry of probability of expiry in the inventory will change let's say from 0.7 to 0.9 so this is a very important business insight so when my I tell this to my boss he says oh that's that's great uh, no, I'm not sharing any code. I'm just telling you in a uh, because I can't share the code. It's not uh, allowed. I mean, I, I'm just telling you a case study that my uh, company did. I cannot share the code here actually. But anyways, what I'm trying to give you the essence is how you know you improve the business or you you know you have effects in the business using machine learning. It's not just of prediction. I just don't want the expiry probabilities from you. I want how if I change the forecasting, for example, if I change the lead time, if I increase my lead time or if I decrease my lead time. So, for example, if a product is from source from US and Japan, its lead time is 60 days, probability of expiry is 0.8. What if I can produce that in Brazil or if I can produce that in Asia only and I'll drop my lead time to 30 days, what will be the probability of expiry? And that came up to be 0.4. Now, what you do is you take an expectation of, uh, uh, so the expected difference is like, let's say in earlier it was 0.8, now it is 0.4. So you are taking on an average historically how much you have been expiring over a year. Now if you change this probability, what is the expected dip, dip in the inventory? And then you see that if you save this much of cost, will it really make sense to produce the or shift the production capacity from US to uh, Asia. So these are the business insights that can be generated from, uh, you know, um, uh, your machine learning. So that's what uh, is very interesting. Okay, now let's start with today's uh, agenda. So last time I think we paused uh, after. Um, so uh, so uh, one second. So where is the machine learning coming to the picture? I understand this whole thing. Like there are uh, different patterns. Yeah. So, how did you so identify what is the specific? I mean, when you are giving the expiry, I mean, forecasting accuracy is changing from uh, eighty percent to sixty percent. Your model is giving me the probability of expiry, right? How did you do that? You didn't hmm. check it manually, right? Obviously, there there are you know lack of data points. You didn't check it manually. What is my probability here and there? So you did a model. Yeah, you fit a model. Now you're inputting. So you're um, uh, you talk your talk to your business you talk to your logistics they say uh, okay uh, shubhadi uh, let's let's say if i can produce this in asia i can drop my lead time to six uh, from 60 days to 30 days can you tell me what will be mean what will be the cost benefit in that sense so i'll tell okay wait uh, let me feed that into my model so i take johnson's baby product i, I will just let's say johnson's baby powder then i feed in the uh, lead time uh, earlier it was 60 days the model had trained on 60 days now I fit in 30 days. I want to predict what is for 30 days, and then the probability of expiry will be predicted, right? So that's where the machine learning comes in the picture, right? Uh, the patterns. So all these things, the important variables, 
the combinations of variables which lead to expiry what is the probability of expiry the quantification right the quantification of that probability is much very important anyone can tell me that um, you know uh, if i have a very huge lead time if i have a very low shelf life and if i have a very uh, you know uh, what else other factors also let's say for ha very very bad forecasting is i lead it is tending to be probable more probable to expire but that's not what my point right my point is how much i mean i need to quantify right uh, that how much i need to when i do a, uh, a debottlenecking of the business i need quantific numbers actual numbers what will be the change for example if your shelf life is too, too low and if your lead time even if you dip it from 30, 60 days to 30 days if your shelf life is lower than that then it will not make any sense you still be having a probability of expiry of 1 right so that's where your your uh, quantification becomes very important and uh, 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 what was the other thing i was saying i forgot something i wanted to add so uh, yeah. this is the um, kind of a regression learning right because no probability of see probability Thank you. whenever you are trying to uh, see the probability right so uh, probability is also always associated to classes right that's what we have learned right probability is from 0 to 1 it's always it's it's a restricted zone right it's it's not a regression problem a regression problem is an infinite zone of numbers but a probability is restricted zone of 0 to 1 right it's always classes so for example i say that probability of expiry greater than 0.2 i'll consider that it will expire if it is less than 0.2 i'll consider it as Uh, not expired so this is a classification problem i am telling you in terms of probabilities that's what we have learned right okay. regression problem is a continuous variable classification problem is classes but behind those classes we always have an associated probability hmm. okay okay any questions on this Uh, a quick question: How do you prep the data? See, the first statement you gave was uh, garbage data, garbage in, garbage out, right? Correct. But how do you prep the data? Is that uh, something which Johnson helped you guys, or like, uh, so, uh, or you use kind of tools? Correct. So uh, every company will have a database, right? So, for example, uh, Johnson's will the Asia. This is this was for Asia Pacific market, okay? i mean markets i mean where the sq is being sold so this asia pacific market will have all the data in its sap database right the ecc what we call the business warehouse uh, so it contains all the data there right so now you have in i mean large number of data points so first you need to understand what is the time frame you are you are going to take whether you should take last 3 years whether you should take last 10 years whether you should la take last 2 years first of all you have to decide the time frame now generally speaking if you are not doing a time series analysis okay for example here we are not dealing with a time series analysis time series analysis is basically a forecasting forecasting means depending on your historical trend i mean historical months of sales i am predicting the next month of sales this is a time series but this is what i did this is not a time series per se right it is more of a cross sectional data we will not get into too much depth what is cross sectional and what is time series but cross sectional is more of let's say it's a snapshot right it's a snapshot of, of every month so month of january may february so time frame was not a very big uh, concern for me because i wanted to find out patterns right so patterns can exist in any month so if i have at least 2 years that is sufficient but if you are doing a uh, forecasting exercise then it is very mandatory for you to have at least 3 years so that you can understand the seasonality the trend and the other components okay don't get too much confused in that what is time series just i was um, stating since you asked the question now first you decide the time frame of your uh, data collection then you move forward and uh, take the variables now now uh, for example um let's take uh, okay let's take uh, line efficiency okay uh, or uh, let's say an equipment efficiency uh, there's an equipment called a uh, uh, boiler its efficiency 
do you really think that the boiler efficiency is going to affect my expiry in inventory no right so that's where your business knowledge comes in you cannot uh, take all the data for present it there's a there's a lot and lot of like petabytes of data in johnson johnson warehouse right a uh, business warehouse so you need to understand which will be the components of variables that could likely be affecting your inventory right so that's where your business sense comes in then after you take all those variables right then let's say you have shortlist you have taken 20 variables now does really your 20 variables make sense what does your data tell that's where you do a feature importance like we saw last time right a feature importance plot and see which are the variables that are important out of these 20 let's say only let's say 7 or 8 come uh, as a uh, answer that these are the uh, variables that are important after that after that you uh, when you get that uh, number then you fit your model on those seven variables so you started with thousand variables you got your business sense into picture you got into shortlisting of 20 variables then you went on to uh, shortlist uh, seven variables however there are certain cases when you don't know absolutely nothing about the business right so even if you could take thousand variables your computational power will increase but your data i mean your model will still tell you out of those thousand variables these seven are important so my model is not constrained by the number of variables remember that my model can tell you any number of variables out of any number of variables which are whichever are important so but it's all depending on the computational power I have. I cannot feed in thousand variables in my 8 GB machine and uh, you know process and boosting algorithm. It will take. But if you have a server, you have a multi-core server which is you know having 32 GBs of RAM. Then I mean it doesn't matter. You can take thousand variables and do a feature important. Still, it will give you top those seven variables which I got after shortlisting 20. Yeah. See that. I understand, right? But say, let us say uh, you uh, you were saying like say one one year of data, for example, right? Let us say, Correct. but uh, we'll take the uh, future of the lead time, right? Yeah. So uh, let us say there was a big monsoon or hurricane, whatever it is, and there was a delay in the lead time or Correct. the transfer, right? So Correct. this one month of one year of data has that defect data. Correct. To put it as correct. Uh, but if you say uh, taken a five year data, you might not have that defect, right? Correct. So how did you basically figure out, OK, this is this might be a defective data or not? So uh, that's a very interesting question. That's a good question, actually, in fact. So that's where your data cleansing comes into picture. So you, whenever you're starting to fit a model, as we said that if there are outliers, right? So your hurricane cannot be over the whole year right maybe two three months it was there your lead times were very high your service levels had dropped that's where you keep that data part right you don't take that data that will skew your model right but in your five years of data that's correct you may not have that defect but there still will be disruptions and when you are operating in a such such a large uh, company there will be disruptions here and there right so whenever you see an outlier whenever you see a statistically uh, bad uh, data you will remove that you don't have to so for me i knew that whenever the disruption has occurred but for for example if you just a data scientist and you don't want to go into business and all and you don't want to do any research then just go and find the outliers and remove them right if the uh, data is too i mean if the, your data can be removed uh, from those outliers that can be you know separated from that you're good to go i mean your it cannot be that your hurricane was totally for the whole year then then your whole one year is an outlier compared so that you cannot handle that, that's that's when you need again need more years of data but that's a very unlikely situation where your hurricane would exist for a whole year and the whole year is becomes an outlier of the business for the business right but that's a, that's an unlikely scenario Yeah, but how do you find the outliers like okay so how how do we find more like a, i say see like a visual visually see the data and manually tell okay this uh, is a bad set of data or like do we have any kind of a process in place 
uh, in machine learning which basically tags the data as uh, outlined data yeah so um, uh, for example the first and, and the most basic uh, form of outlier is so you have a median you have your um, uh, first quartile your third quartile so whatever is beyond your 1.7 times your first quartile here and there uh, like so, okay let me draw this uh, uh, wait i'll just go into my ipad there are actually many ways uh, uh, to you know uh, just to say so this is where i think most of the people will be struggling right so that only i just wanted to raise this question yeah yeah, yeah. That, this is that's, that's, that's what i'm saying it's a very good question that uh, needs to be addressed and uh, maybe we can um, in the upcoming session we can have something on that where we can have a a uh, session on how to remove outliers so uh, basically uh, um this something called a box plot okay so now i am explaining you this visually but you may not uh, need to do this visually it r will or sorry your python will automatically handle so your data distribution okay so your data distribution can be anything you can can be normal it can be poisson so there are many uh, different uh, so this is exponential so uh, there can be many distributions so there is one first one thing that you uh, know the distribution first you know the distribution and that distribution is can be known from business knowledge or can be known visually but this is a tedious task right so what you do is basically you whenever we are trying to find a median right so let's say your numbers are sorted 1 to let's say 100 and your 50 is the median okay so your first quartile is the 1/4th region your third quartile is the 3rd 4th 3/4th region and so basically four parts it is divided first second uh, third Uh, sorry, I'll just divide it. First, second, third, and fourth. So, whenever you're sorting, so let's say one to twenty-five, twenty-five to fifty, fifty to seventy-five, and seventy-five to hundred. I'm just taking an explain. Uh, uh, just taking a uh, basic example. Now, this is this is called. I mean, this is you have just uh, arranged in ascending uh, order of sorting. Now. suppose there's your um, uh, data is being arranged like this now you have something let's say beyond this right if you have something beyond this so let's say you have just one point in uh, let's say point 1 here and the rest of the frequencies of your data lies here okay now if there is a single data point or a very uh, or a, a less frequent i hope you understand the frequency term so how the number of occurrences of that bucket so 120 1 to 25 how many it has occurred 2 to 25 to 250 how many it has occurred so suppose there is a data point which has just occurred once and it is very far off from your normal uh, uh, histograms i mean normal frequency Uh, data so this is an outlier for your data right for example in a normal distribution if you could see a normal distribution if i say that my norm it is normal distributed something beyond this point so uh, this is the normal distribution right this is the normal uh, pdf so i can see that something which be- lies beyond these let's say two sigma is a point which is kind of an outlier for me right it is not representing the whole population now this definition can be dependent on the user some user can say this can be three sigma some user can say it is four sigma some user can say even it is a six sigma you have you may have heard six sigma processes right so six sigma processes like an airline industry so the number of accidents uh, 
per uh, miles of uh, air travel right so that if you follow that there will be very very little uh, no, that will be a very very little number right so these uh, uh, industries operate in a six sigma so for them six sigma is not even outlier right six sigma is their normal uh, operation so this definition of sigma will depend on the business so for example for me i would say in a fmcg industry if something is beyond lying beyond the two sigma band i could say for example your lead time your lead time uh, was let's say 40 to 100 okay and this for, this is 40 to 100 is the two sigma band and if something is beyond 33 or something is beyond 120 then i would say 120 or 33 is an outlier for me however some other uh, very uh, very small fmcg who which has a very high variation he would say no uh, or maybe let's say uh, some fmcg which has a very low variation let's say uh, in a airline industry an airline industry would say if i had if i experience even one accident so for them for them it's let's a 0. 0.0003 accidents per year let's say okay so for for example if they even experience one accident in a year that will be kind of a outlier for them right so it depends on what uh, industry you're working on so so that, that's why data science is not independent of uh, business it is a kind of a addition uh, to your business so you have to know that which is the normal operating range of your uh, system and uh, what is your normal characteristics what is the distribution so normally our Python will automatically remove the outliers based on the assumption of a distribution, right? Or it can all do a very simple thing that it arranges by the median, and, and if if it sees that uh, it is uh, beyond some quartile, for example, uh, let me show you if I can. Here, uh, let me show you uh, outlier removal in Python. See, removing outliers using standard deviation in Python. That's what we did, right? We assumed a, um, a sigma of two. So that's exactly what I was telling about, right? So I assume that this minus two sigma and two sigma, I can have uh, the band anywhere where I want to specify, right? I can have a three sigma process. So uh, remove outliers using normal distribution and SD, right? So it will assume that it is following a normal distribution and remove, right? So this is the code where you can simply remove your outliers and uh, it, it will remove. So uh, let's see another thing. Detect and exclude outliers in Pandas data frame. Okay, uh, so you have a data frame. You define, you see here, you define three into uh, data standard deviations. This is the standard deviation of this. So whatever, if my data is beyond the th three standard deviation, I comes consider this as an outlier. So this minus is basically remove, remove them, okay? Uh, so uh, this one, right? So you basically get an essence, right? So it depends on, um, most of the times you assume a normal distribution, okay? Uh, but if you don't know, then uh, if you don't know the distribution, then you have to kind of plot it visually and you know see it. But even though it doesn't follow a normal distribution, just take the standard deviation, whatever falls beyond three sigma here and there, you could consider that as an outlier. Is that clear? Yeah, that was useful here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. So. <clears throat> Okay, any other questions from anyone else uh, so that we can start with today's uh, lecture? Okay. So, so one question, but there is something outside. Huh. So now you have all this tool, right? Sorry, uh, you have all these uh, tools of uh, say, uh, data, robot, Watson, all that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is learning all this will help in that or how it is going to play around okay and now yeah, yeah i got it uh, so so for example uh, um, let's see how we can answer this 
IBM Watson is a kind of a niche machine learning model that they have developed for their own. Now, let's say even if it becomes a reality that it can predict everything which they claim that they can do in let's say 20 years or 15 years from now, you still need machine learning engineers or data scientists to maintain it, right? Because every time that Whenever we have discussed modeling, right, we have already always said that it's never a static process, right? You, it's not that you build a model and forget it. It's, you have to keep on updating every time. Okay, there will be today as we speak. Go one month later, there will be a different new uh, model that has come on, come up in your machine learning uh, technique. For example, deep learning before 2011, there was nothing called deep learning. Right now. Your CD, uh, Apple CD, your Google, uh, what they, do they call Google Home or something? I don't know. Uh, your Amazon Alexa, all these are deep learning, text to, uh, sorry, uh, uh, voice to text processing. So everything is deep learning. Five years prior to this, no one had imagined that deep learning will uh, cover this. So who knows? I mean, uh, what will be the next big thing in machine learning? But you have to keep your pace with it. So there will not be a perfect model that is going to fit everything, right? So you have, as a data scientist, you have to know all the models. You have to keep on updating yourself that whatever model comes in your way, you have to learn it, you have to understand it, you have to tune it, you have to keep on thinking how we, in ways we can do a better way. Now, IBM Watson is kind of a uh, machine learning, let's say a very, uh, uh, I would say a very, complicated version of a or very let's say uh, I'm not getting that word a very complex okay let's put it I do I'm not getting that word right now so it's a very complicated model which has a lot of machine learning models and it tries to predict a lot of things right but it's not that IBM is going to send IBM Watson to solve your business problems if even if they have it they will let's say they are going to sell their service for millions of dollars, right? That's how they're going to operate. So for example, if it can detect cancer, it's it's it's, it's going to be very huge. They're going to charge huge money for that, right? So it's not that- No, if, sorry. If, yes, yeah. sir. They're, getting, they're, they're basically giving a, a service in their cloud, basically. It is not that costly, like million dollars, but they do give uh, in the cloud, yeah. No, Just no. wanted to let, Okay, uh, so I, I didn't, uh, I, I'm not aware of that. Uh, I mean, do they uh, allow you to use your, use the IBM Watson model as per se, not the uh, server? Uh, do you, do they allow the IBM Watson model to be used for your business? I don't know. I'm, I am not aware of that. Basically, they're exposing their APIs, so we can basically use their APIs out. Okay. So, see, uh, for example, uh, Google's TensorFlow. TensorFlow is a API, you know, to implement deep learning models, right? So are you sure that those models are already running in the background or you can build your model using an IBM Watson API? Uh, basically, I think uh, they have a, a few models which they've built, which we can use, like for the machine learning they can use, but you can also build your model. You can basically write your code in Python and basically put it into the other thing. Okay, okay. But however, um, I mean, if it, uh, let's say I'm not aware of that, uh, I, if uh, they are allowing you to access very uh, complex models, because I don't think uh, they will be patenting it. And you, every business cannot be using their own, for example, if they develop a cancer detection model, they will be patenting it. But I'm not sure. No, 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 no. They're not giving you the business model. They're not exposing the business model. They're exposing like, you know, for example, the linear regression, right? Yeah. So they have some GUI kind of a linear regression where you can use that. Correct. Right? So it's kind of similar to what we are doing, right? It's kind of similar to the yeah. packages, right? The packages are inbuilt, right? You're not doing anything to build your linear regression uh, from scratch. The linear regression per se exists as a package as an, uh, it's not an API, but it's exists as a package. But uh, you're not, you are using that package to implement in your data, right? So, okay, I'll, I'll just uh, read about IBM Watson and get okay. back to you sure. uh, and, and try to answer this. Uh, I mean, I'm not very sure of what uh, they do. Okay, got it. Yeah. 
but for example uh, in so there's something called nvidia is uh, uh, they have launched a new platform for deep learning tensorflow they, they have a kind of a, a google's tensorflow it's kind of a uh, api to you know implement your deep learning model so python as such uh, it's difficult to you know uh, implement deep learning models so google came up with this tensorflow which says that why don't you use our API which kind of structures your data in a very different way and then you can use a deep learning models more efficiently and more you know in a very better way and that's how Google but they'll not uh, uh, I mean they are not allowing they'll not allow you to see their model and use that as a uh, text-to-speech to implement in your business and so at uh, at any point of time you have to create your own model you could be using packages could be using uh, servers you could be using uh, APIs, but at the end you have to understand your own model which fits your own business for example the way the uh, the uh, Project that I did no one has uh, Used same kind of approach uh, or a similar approach for their so Walmart has a different uh, Approach to, to their inventory uh, uh, They call it inventory freshness uh, PNG has a different way so every company will have a different way anyways we'll cut uh, to that chase later I'll just read about that I'll, I'll get back to you guys okay so let's uh, start for today so last time we ended up in uh, something called clustering okay so I'll restart uh, from where we left yesterday uh, last uh, last time uh, so let's see so I would say plus we have till now done a lot of supervised learning right so what is supervised learning? Can someone answer? Can I get some answers? Yeah, where we tell the model um, the different patterns and we are guiding the guiding the algorithm. Uh, not very specific. Uh, I mean, you gave an answer, but it's not very specific. It's a very simple one word answer. I mean, one not one, one sentence answer. What is supervised learning? The data is supervised, or it is a, a fixed set of uh, data, it is not like a random data. Um, supervised learning if there, there is y has been given exactly that's the given a. Yeah, exactly Perfect that is the supervised learning. why is there i mean i uh, krishna i think you were meaning this only that it's not random and, and it is a it's a particular set of data i think you were meaning this but i think sunil is right on the spot why is there i have a y that every x element i mean every row has a y associated with it that's a supervised no other definitions I uh, want in supervised learning. Only one definition. Every row has a Y associated with it. That's it. Okay. Krishna, you may be meaning this, but your answer is not. Uh, I mean, I, I think I could understand that. But if you answer this to someone else, he may not get the point what you're saying. So random data and fixed data is different, right? Random data is like you're picking up random sets. Fixed data is like you're feeding the whole set of data that that's different supervised learning is basically that your every associated row of data every x i mean x1 x2 x3 so all the features whatever is there they have a y associated with it someone has gone through the pain of collecting the y for you that's very straightforward answer okay now so the other would be unsupervised learning. Now, can can you guys answer this? This will be very straightforward, right? What is unsupervised learning? If there is no Y. Correct. So someone forgot to mention the Y. Someone has collected data on X, X1, X2, X3. Someone has collected, but they forgot to mention the Y or forgot to collect the data Y. They forgot either or you don't have any Y associated with it. You don't know okay so this is a very important uh, don't forget this guys uh, this is very basic of uh, machine learning okay what is uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning okay 
So supervised learning, we have seen a lot of algorithms. Okay, give me all the names of algorithms we have uh, seen. I want all the regression algorithms. I don't want errors in this answer. All the regression algorithms, give me by name. First one was uh, linear regression, Perfect. then multilinear, multilinear regression, then. Awesome. Yeah. I want others to pitch in also. No, no, but uh, I just I'm classifying those are classification algorithms. Otherwise, there are nine alg algorithms we have covered. I want the regression algorithm. That's why the answer is not straightforward yeah. that what are the algorithms we have learned. I want the regression algorithms which can be used for regression. Polynomial, then uh, lasso. Correct. And then. Yeah, lasso. Reach. Correct. Then. Guys, what about decision trees? Random forest. Did didn't we do the boss causing? I, I I yeah we we do, but I think so that that were related with classification. Isn't oh. it? How can it be classification? What were we predicting in uh, Boston? We were predicting price, right? Price uh, yeah. is very Yeah, important. sorry. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Yes. Then uh, yeah. that was again K and then problem K nearest never problem. Yes, number was also regression. Then, very good. Yeah, yeah. regression. Then a deep for uh, then that was deep forest, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, someone said logistic regression. Logistic regression is uh, not a regression problem. It's a classification. So that is classification. Yeah. Classification problem. I guess because we are using you have to revise. If you don't revise, what you want? Uh, it'll you know, the feed will not be proper, right? I mean, uh, right now we are on the fifth week. We need to have ready answers on which is the which is a regression problem, which is a classification problem, right? You, I want everyone to be uh, like. Uh, having perfect answers on this. What is a regression problem? What is a classification problem? Which are the algorithms can be used for regression? Which are the algorithms which can be used for classification? There should not be any confusion on it. If you have confusions, ask me. But I don't want you to end this session, end this course and be confused with, with what is a regression problem, what is a classification problem. Think on your own. Can a decision tree be used for a classification? We discussed it in terms of probabilities. But then we also applied it on a Boston data set. What were we doing in a Boston data set? We were predicting the price, right? So if you're predicting the price, which is a continuous variable, this means decision tree can be used for a regression problem also. Random forest, similar thing. Whatever decision tree can be can, uh, can do, all the other algorithms which were tree-based can do the same thing. It's on. It's not that boosting, which is or random forest which is building multiple trees cannot do what decision trees. They were improvements, we, as we discussed, right? They were improvements of decision trees. So if a decision tree can do a random, uh, regression and a classification, why can't a random forest do, right? And there's nothing called deep forest. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, I agree. Sorry for that. Yeah, let it random forest. Mix up the models. Next, next class, I'll ask you, each one of you, other algorithm uh, and what it can do, okay? I want perfect answers on that. Because I don't want uh, you guys to have uh, end this course and you know be confused with what is a regression, what is a classification. Okay, again, uh, I'll ask particular uh, algorithms. Tell me whether it's a regression and classification. Um, can a lasso do a classification problem? Uh, yeah, I think it can do both. No. A lasso cannot do a no. classification problem. No. Okay. A lasso is a regression problem. See, okay. Yes. If you have guys are having confusion in this, uh, let me make it this very easy. Uh, okay. okay. Whichever models we have discussed probabilities, okay, those are classification. Did we discuss probabilities in lasso? No, right? We didn't discuss probabilities in lasso. We didn't discuss probabilities in regression. We did, didn't di linear regression. We didn't discuss probabilities in ridge. It means where whichever models we haven't discussed discuss probabilities, that model cannot deal with a classification problem. Okay. Wherever we have discussed probabilities like decision trees, random forest, boosting. Okay. Keep this. I'll make this simpler. Okay. Tree based algorithms 
keep it very in a different set okay your decision tree random forest gradient boost okay these are a different tree based approach so these uh, these can do a classification and a regression both okay now the other th things where we have like linear ridge lasso okay these can only do a regression problem okay classification is knn okay i'm not writing these because these are common okay so knn can do a classification knn can do a regression a logistic can do a classification but a logistic logistic cannot do okay i'm mentioning this specifically cannot do a regression problem okay then uh, what else did we learn uh, right or we have covered all right svm yeah svm can answer anyone answer about svm that's classification right SVM can actually do both. Okay, so I'll uh, I can pardon you that because we didn't discuss uh, uh, regression on that. But SVM can do a both. Okay, so kind of think like this: more advanced your models become, they more more become uh, more ambidextrous. Okay, I mean it can uh, do both. The more, let's say the older the models, linear regression, ridge lasso, these are very old models, right? Uh, and we also learned in the in the first so they could only handle one at, at a time so these could handle only ridge regression logistic can also only hand sorry handle uh, classification from knn things become more you know uh, simpler knn can handle both all these will handle both deep learning can handle both okay what about neural network yeah deep learning and neural network are the basically the same thing so deep learning can handle both okay but don't get confused on this okay if you have any questions ask me on this but don't uh, end this course and uh, not be able to you know decipher the fact that which models can solve what okay so uh, we have seen supervised learning okay now coming to unsupervised learning now unsupervised learning unfortunately doesn't have so many unfortunately or fortunately whatever you want to say uh, it doesn't have so many models okay it's kind of very simpler and the uh, main reason behind is it is because basically because if you don't have your why it is basically no 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 sense of analysis right what do you want to do with a data set which doesn't have any meaning of it but there are certain business cases where you cannot cannot have uh, everything i mean the customer will not tell you every time about its behavior right you have to understand traits from uh what do you know so for example let's say um so okay let's take this example uh when a customer is coming to your uh, store okay uh, let's say a walmart store so walmart has installed cameras okay so it is finding out patterns so for example how the customer's hands are moving how he is looking um in in the bottle how he is like checking the price what's his facial expressions on different brands so does he see a johnson johnson product with a frown or does he see a png product with a smile i mean all these things he it is kind of kind of um, trying to see from a camera or a video cam whatever the customer is not going going to tell the walmart store manager see i okay he can tell if he didn't like a product but he's not going to specifically tell everything about uh, every single product he has seen right so if he have he doesn't like a png product because it is high highly priced is not going to tell the walmart so oh, i didn't buy because it is high price i am buying this it may be a case but it's not always true right so sometimes you cannot avoid a supervised unsupervised learning problem it is going to exist in your data and you have to do something about it you just cannot throw it away right so that's where your unsupervised learning uh, picture comes in. and later when you see 
right now all the research is going on on supervised learning right supervised learning more most of it people have you know kind of uh, done a lot of research and kind of figured out what to do but unsupervised learning is still is an open book you know people are still struggling to you know what to do with unsupervised learning and all uh, so okay so uh, this is what we um, i wanted to say so unsupervised learning for right now uh, since we not deal with very high fi unsupervised learning models a uh, very simple model is called a clustering model okay now clustering is a very simple task very very simple task okay nothing uh, nothing doing here i have let's say i have uh, make it in black i have uh, data points i don't know anything about why uh, what is the why associated with each of the data points my manager has told me do some kind of an analysis so i kind of do an analysis okay say i say this is one group of customers and this is one group of customers let's say um, so let's say these are car buyers and people are saying price and power. okay so these are the customers who are willing to pay a higher price for higher power so i can term them as automobile enthusiasts okay people here they don't give too much uh, concern about uh, so they, they they want a lower price and they don't have any concern about a power, power right so they are on in the left lower bottom side so these can be termed as price conscious customers now what do you do after this this is something which you have decided right no one told you this now what do you do this what do you do is when you get a customer or somewhere from this group you present him cars which are let's say high power and if you get 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 some customer who is from this group you play give him price of cars of low price you show him cars of low price right so i don't know uh, the common cars in us so for example in india maruti is kind of a brand maruti suzuki is kind of a brand which has you know let's say establish itself as a car make manufacturer which is more of a price conscious people okay so they don't want to have lot lot of power they don't want to have they can have do it just with average features but price is more important or mileage is important but a person who is buying let's say a honda this guy he is more concerned about power or he is con more concerned about price uh, i mean i should get the right power for my price okay so that's is a very simple example uh, this doesn't make much business sense uh, as such but there are certain instances instances where you can identify so uh, for example a new customer he says i am buying i want to buy a car at let's say which is uh, 100000 dollars okay i mean i think it's very huge sorry 50000 dollars so you say okay i think this guy is kind of a power oriented guy so i'll show him let's say honda cars or whatever the person comes new person comes you ask him what is the price range you are looking he said i just want a, let's say a 15000 dollar car oh okay then it means you are not interested too much in power let me show you a maruti suzuki car okay. so this is how you kind of do deal this when business so now there can be multiple dimensions right right now i have just presented you two dimension price and power it can be price power color mileage uh, body structure uh, features x number of uh, things can be then for here it is very easy for you to say because there are only two dimensions when the dimension become 1000 or 
ten thousand, then it's very difficult for you guys for you to uh, you know understand. That's when the clustering comes into pictures. For example, in thousand dimensions, this is the group. Let's say there are many dimensions. So you ask this guy the price. You you cannot ask that guy thousand dimensions, right? So you got a guy. You ask the guy about his price, his power, and features performance, and you can approximately tell that this guy belongs to this group, and hence you can uh, market some particular uh, uh, brand you are uh, you want to uh, you think that the customer will buy. So how does this algorithm work? This algorithm is very simple. So this is the data that is there. Your date. Uh, your algorithm will will start with the first first step is initialize. random clusters okay initialize random clusters so i take a random point from my data let's say and also the number of clusters also the user has to tell now this is very irritating right oh, i am telling you everything i don't k is equal to 3 and k equal to uh, how many clusters i need that is also i am telling what you are going to do but bear with me let's understand this uh, algorithm and then we'll see how it helps so Initially, you have to tell the number of random clusters. Okay, so this is one plus. Uh, so you say three. So this algorithm is going to randomly assign. Okay, randomly assign cluster uh, cluster centers, not clusters, cluster centers. Okay. Now, after this is done, each point will be calculated a distance from the center. So, for example. Uh, all the points are calculated distance from here similarly all the points are calculated the distance from here sorry not this okay and similarly all the uh, numbers are calculated in distance from here okay now this point let's say i will have three distances i didn't mark the green one one green, blue one black one green each for the three clusters right now this this point is closer to this cluster so it will be grouped in this similarly let's say this point it has also it also has three distance so the least one is here it will be grouped here so kind of after one iteration your let's say one was a um, let's say the top one was a green cluster the bottom one was a black cluster and uh, the this one was a maroon uh, sorry blue cluster okay so it will have some data points this will have some data points this will have some data points okay all the data points the data points will not shift uh, i think i didn't make the diagram properly the data points will not shift they will just be grouped okay the data points will not shift and come inside the group so basically this boundary is made okay so this boundary is made and the data points are grouped now so what was the second step you find out the distances and group them in the clusters now after you do this the interesting part is the cluster centers will change the first assignment was random but after you got new products in i mean new products uh, uh, new points in this the cluster center will change the center is basically the mean of the so this if this x1 and x2 so every point will have a x1 x2 x1 x2 x1 x2 every point will have these values so basically take an average of this and take an average of this so the center cluster center will be the average of 
all in that cluster sum divided by the number of points in that cluster okay and similarly y is uh, the number of points in that cluster divided by so we get get this right so this is the cluster center so the cluster center will change now again you you do this uh, whatever you did on the top you kind of do this again so the distances will now be calculated from the new cluster center okay and this procedure is iterative okay so every time you do this so when will the algorithm stop the algorithm will be stop when your cluster centers now don't move so your all the data points have actually been classified in that cluster and now they don't move because the new cluster center which is coming and again it is calculating the distance and then again assigning the points and then again calculating the cal uh, cluster center this is again the same so it's not moving that's when the algorithm stops okay so do you guys understand now any any doubts you have but this is a costly operation right yeah it's quite costly it's uh, it's uh, you're correct it's very costly because every time you're trying to you know calculate the distances from each of the clusters and reassigning it it's a costly operation you could uh so neel uh, i saw that you um, you're not very clear on this uh, can you just uh, specify which part you are not clear so that i can yeah. revisit that so basically uh... yeah go ahead yeah so it seems uh, basically we are taking points uh, assuming we have x1 x2 x3 three points no, and not, we have not no, been given no, no, y no no not three points these are the dimensions these are not points. yeah dimension basically uh, i mean not points dimensions predicators yeah predictors yeah yeah predictors yeah, yeah. so these are predictors uh, so x1 x2 x3 and many row we have been given correct and we don't have any y correct correct so um, using k nearest neighbor problem and how we will decide these points which is that is my question So k, visually, we can see where, okay. These are the points. Where did k nearest neighbors? This is called clustering, right? Where did k nearest neighbors come? Yeah, no, no. So means okay. So forget about those. So uh, from where these points came? I have x1, x2, x3 predictors. Predictors. Okay. So means how we are drawing this point? this is your data set okay It's simple data set nothing uh, complex right a simple data set having yes. two predictors and 100 data points right okay 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 now i to tell you to plot these data points what will you do you will take the x1 here and x2 here and you will plot 100 data points right so your data points will come here right these are the 100 data points you have plot just plotted right yes any confusion till now no no it's okay okay now now ask me and now tell me what were you asking where will the points come what does it that mean what does that question mean yes means our algorithms will detect all the points No, I have not done any and algorithm we... till now. I have not done any algorithm till now. I I have just plotted the points, right? Nothing. Uh... Okay, so we have we have hundred points on this two uh, D. Correct, correct, correct. Perfect. Now, I want. I said I want to prepare three clusters on these hundred data points. Okay. Okay. So, I run a k means algorithm. so my algorithm what will do is first step let's go back to the first step 
initialize random cluster centers k equal to 3 i have told i have told that i want three cluster so initialize random three cluster uh, random three cluster centers so for example i take this point randomly okay this point and this point okay you getting it yeah correct awesome now no, I think I think so now I got this. We'll keep doing until our points are not moving. Correct. Perfect. I think Amazing. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of have a boundary like this, kind of have a boundary like this, and you kind of have a boundary like this. So these are the three centers. Is this clear? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Then. Now, can anyone tell me? Um, I mean, I, I would say this is a very um, tough question, but uh, can anyone answer this? I'll be very happy. What can be the objective function here? What will we trying to reduce? Every algorithm has an objective function, right? See, in decision in tree base, we saw Gini index. In regression, we saw RMC. What can be the objective function here? It's a tough one. The minimum distance between each points, right? Amazing, amazing. Within the, within the cluster, amazing. That's an amazing answer. So I'm trying to reduce the variance, or let's say within some of squares in this cluster. And the other thing that I'm trying to is, do is maximizing the distance between these the other any two clusters. So within the cluster, my variation should be minimum. And between the clusters, the variation should be maximum. I mean, the clusters should be well separated from each other, and within the cluster, should they should be more coagulated. Is this clear to everyone? I think that's an amazing answer uh, that uh, I think Krishna gave. Yeah. So is this clear to everyone? Yeah. It... Yeah. So now, if this is my answer, I mean, this is the objective function. And let's say I am trying to reduce the within sum of squares, right? So my within sum of squares will kind of reduce as we increase the number of clusters, right? So as I go on increasing the number of clusters, my clusters will become small. Let's say I want to have um, 10 clusters here, okay? So I pro this one, 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 like this if I take out 10 clusters. Your within sum of squares is obviously going to reduce, right? Because you are having uh, less number of points within the cluster. Okay. So, it, it, so can anyone tell? Uh, we, although we don't have a y here, but keeping an analogy from your previous lectures, what we are trying to do is it an overfitting we are trying to do or an underfitting we are trying to do when we have I bringing in more clusters. So overfitting. Oh, amazing, Sharad. Overfitting, yes. So as we go on uh, um, bringing in more clusters, I try to reduce my within sum of squares to the max least possible, but then I'm trying to overfit. Okay. So there's something very important called the elbow joint. So typically your cluster graphs will look like this okay so at a particular cluster point and let's say k equal to 5 this joint is there and then the dip will be very slow so after this you don't consider i mean you don't go after this you consider this point so your k is equal to 5 is your optimum number of clusters this is your wss and this plot can be uh, seen in your in python this, this code is uh, very easy and this plot can be seen okay so this is called the elbow joint and beyond your elbow joint you do not go, go and try to overfit your clusters is this clear can you uh, explain again one more time i missed it uh, which part uh, the within some of the elbow joint elbow this, okay elbow, elbow joint okay so uh, what i was trying to say is as you go on increasing your number of clusters, you are bound to decrease your 
within sum of squares, right? It will try, it will try to slowly merge. But Correct. how will you find the optimal number of clusters, right? So this is called an elbow join. But every typical cluster problem will have kind this kind of a, uh, a typical elbow joint that useful. This is a WSS within sum of squares. So let's say at k equal to five, the elbow joint comes. So you can take k to six also. Not a very diff or k equal to four is not advisable. So kind of where the dip is now, you know, very smooth. After which, so you can take this as an optimum, and say that k equal to 6 is the ideal number of clusters that my data should have. Okay. And I believe that there will be uh, algorithm, um, automatic algorithm to get this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, normally what you do, uh, this is a separate part. So k-means will be an algorithm where you specify the number of k and then you just, uh, I think, yeah, that's the number of initialization. So n init is a uh, function or, or a parameter where it says, so this random assignment, see when uh, this random first step where we saw that we initialize random cluster centers. So if your n init is equal to, where did I write n init? Yeah, so n init where uh, basically what we see is n init if equal to one, so what it'll do is just one time it will assign the random clusters and just start. Okay. But if it n it equal n in it equal to 10, then 10 times it will assign and then take a mean. So this is more smooth. You don't want just the computer to just assign first random randomly one time and then start the algorithm. So it, it normally it kept it's kept at 10. So you want the machine to initialize 10 times and then take an average of it. Okay. And uh, then you just have the ten is ten is sorry, 10 minutes is 10 iterations. No, 10, it not 10 iteration, 10 initialization. So, this first step okay. itself. Uh, so, so, basically, it tells first time I plot it, I do all that, this thing, get a, a number. Then, second time again, I try to find the uh, plot the center, do the same thing. Right? Uh, no, no, no. So, what it does is, so for example, you're assigning a random center in your first time. Initialize random cluster centers, right? So this is our n in it equal to one. So you just assign and then start your algorithm and start the assignment. But sometimes what happens is, so for example, uh, the interesting part is, let's say, uh, your actual clusters, okay? Your actual clusters are here, okay? Now, for example, your algorithm has assigned a cluster center here and a cluster center here, then you will end up kind of getting the same clusters, the actual cluster. But for example, if your cluster center is assigning somewhere here and another here, how will the clusters look like? The clusters will like look like this, which is not the actual one. So you don't want your algorithm to just go and assign randomly once and do start. You at least want the plus um, kind of 10 initialization, let's say 10 times it has assumed a random and then take basically take an average. Again, 10 times it has initialized and then you take an average so that the cluster centers. So the in the initial points will also determine your final clusters. And it's not just the number of clusters. Your initial point, if it is way too off from your original clusters, your or final cluster, what, what you will get is also way, will be way off from the actual clusters. Is that clear? Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so everyone is clear then? Okay, perfect. So, uh, although this is not in the scope of our course, but since we have um, done clustering, I will also try to, you know, what is the spelling of hierarchical? 
for pardon me the spelling i don't know. what is the spelling of higher hierarchical yeah i think i'm correct only yeah so hierarchical clustering is uh, it's it's again a form of clustering so this is called a k means clustering k why k k because of uh, your number of clusters means because you are always taking an average okay you are always taking an average so where did i show that yeah so here you are taking the mean right so that's why k from the clusters and means from the actual operations so hierarchical clustering is a different kind of a clustering algorithm wherein uh it's a little so something called a dendrogram okay so what you do is you start with all the data points let's say you have 100 data points you start with all the data points and slowly start moving grouping them from below so for example these are two very similar points so you kind of similar points in terms of distance okay euclidean distance euclidean distance is everyone clear about what is euclidean distance anyone has a doubt of what is euclidean distance does anyone know about what is euclidean distance okay so i'll just uh, show so for example your point 1 x1 is let's say so x1 are the features or the predictors okay so x1 is 5 and x2 is 2 uh, 10 and this point 2 x1 is uh, 7 and x2 is 8 so what is the euclidean distance between this this is 5 minus 7 whole square plus 10 minus 8 whole square and 100 this is the euclidean distance okay yeah so a very simple the coordinate geometry you kind of uh, uh, the type of distance you have okay now because no one asked me this question i am going to ask um what can be the distance measured between two classes i mean let's say i have a variable or i have a point 1 uh let's say uh classes are male high low and i have a female high high what is the distance between point 1 and point 2 any any arbit answers can i mean if you don't know this yeah. you don't know this there's, there's no uh uh i well, i mean there's no go around so any arbit answers can do it. but i just want to see how you can figure this out so i think uh, we cannot compare between two classes that's a good point you know so, but we can we, we can give some points for high low we will change this into point then we can see the dis- distance isn't it um uh, not exactly so neil because if i say high is 1 and low is let's say 2 and high is 1 this 2 minus 1 will not make any sense i mean a low and high distance is not 1 high minus 1 equal to sorry high plus 1 is not equal to low someone can say 5 and someone can say 10 then his distance will be different right from what you said this uh, you cannot uh, actually assign a number to that any other answers so uh, there is something called jacquard similarity noun na- name say, sounds complex but it's a very easy um, concept a intersection b divided by by a union b simple how many total possible uh, sets are, uh, sorry total possible um, uh, uh, let's say male female 1 2 high low these are the total possible com- uh, values that uh, each of these variables can take so four and what are the common common uh, so this is not common this is common this is not common so one so this is basically a 25% match oh sorry 
0.25 or a 25% match between a, a 0.1 and 0.2. Okay. Result get everything. Sorry. Yeah, I understand that formula that are similarity, but could not map with the problem which we have, we have given. No, no, this is just out of uh, context. Just uh, since we were talking about distance between two points, so we talked about numerical yeah. distance. I just wanted to give you a uh, kind of a thinking of what could be the a distance measure in a class. This is not actually uh, applicable, but in K-means clustering, you can have classes when you do a cluster. Okay, so. Uh, that point of point of time it may uh, be needed, but anyways, that's not very important. Let's get back to where, where we were. So, if these are very similar, they are grouped into one. Let's say these are very similar, they are grouped into one. These are very similar and they are grouped into one. And let's say these are these three are similar and they are grouped into one. Now, this will be a point here. This uh, did not get grouped. It's a point here. This is a point here. Uh, this is a point here. This is a point here. Uh, and this one did not, let's say, did not get grouped. Now, again, you start your problem like this. You may, you may see these are two very similar. These are grouped here. It did, this did not get grouped. Uh, this is did not get grouped with anyone. And these got grouped here. Okay. So based on the distances, it is getting grouped and you are trying. So what will be the final uh, route? There will be a single one. So depending on the clusters, you can. So this is kind of a tree, the same thing. So uh, uh, initial uh, below this, there will be, let's say, two or three, which got clubbed into one. Like this, it flows from the bottom. So the top one will be one and the bottom will be the number of data points and it gets clubbed based on the distances. So what is the advantage of it? The advantage is um, merely no one does hierarchical clustering. If someone talks about clustering, it's generally key means only. So not, don't bang your head too much on hierarchical clustering. It's just it's good to know. I mean, if someone, if you ever given it on uh, uh, machine learning, you might impress your um, interviewer if you say that someone is hierarchical clustering. Anyway. Okay. So is clustering clear then? Can we move on to our next topic? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's take a uh, five minutes break. Uh, let's get back to it. And uh, after um, the next topic, which is an uh, linear discriminant analysis, we'll uh, see, see the codes. Okay. So um, do, uh, don't worry. We also have the coding part today. Also. So it's not only theory today. Okay. Let's take a five minutes break. One minute, right? Uh, can you send this uh, sheet with on which you are drawing on your iPad? Yeah, yeah. So this is a OneNote um, uh, file. So if everyone has mm -hmm. an access to OneNote file, I can send that, or otherwise I can convert the P to PDF and send. Or the only yeah, just convert to PDF. Yeah, PDF and then send it. The only problem with PDF is that uh, so OneNote has this uh, weird uh, thing. That it has an infinite space of page. Right, so if I go on scrolling from right, to, uh, it can go infinite, and down it can go infinite. So when you convert to a PDF, it kind of looks very small. Okay, so okay, okay, okay. So send so, us both. Um, we'll try. Okay, okay, sure, sure. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, let's get back, uh, catch up after five minutes.
हेलो हेलो हे ओके Hey Shubhdeep. Hey Shubhdeep. Uh, this unsupervised learning is uh, like most likely it's a classification problem, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Because we are classifying. Yeah, yeah. Could say that. Okay. So. any other questions so that uh, or we can start with the next topic okay then okay now the next uh, model that we are looking is uh, linear discriminant analysis okay this is a classification problem not sorry problem uh, sorry model okay why because uh, we are dealing with probabilities okay now let's see <clears throat> we talked about the bayes theorem right why when we said probability of y equal to any class given x equal to the features equal to probability of x equal to the features y equal to k into probability of y equal to k divided by sigma of k equal to 1 to uh, capital k whichever the other number of classes so probability of x equal to x divided by k to k into probability of y this is the simple bayes theorem formula okay um probability of y belonging to a particular class given the features is equal to the probability of x equal to the features in that particular class into the probability of y equal to that class overall in a, in the data divided by sum of k equal to 1 to k the product of these two okay this we have seen in which model very very uh, minutely which model we saw can you guys tell last class which model we saw base theorem excellent naive base excellent sunil naive base so we saw this very clearly in that the so naive base what was the assumption where what was the clear assumption in naive base can anyone tell me what was the assumption in naive base okay so i'll tell the answer naive bayes the basic assumption was all the features are independent right when we multiplied those probabilities if you remember when we multiplied those probabilities we assumed that the probabilities were independent and there was no dependence on it which could be a wrong assumption but that is how your naive bayes comes now linear discriminant analysis doesn't take into consideration that assumption linear discriminant analysis says that it is too hard an assumption i don't want to assume all my variables are independent and that cannot be actual business scenario every time right 
there has to be some dependence on the variables. So linear discriminant analysis, these guys come came up with a different approach. They said, I have the same problem, but I'll approach it in a different way. So, okay, very good. So what's your thought? Okay, before we proceed anywhere, we have to understand the PDF function of a normal distribution. I think this I told that I will discuss later and I think the time is come, has come where we you know, really see the equation properly. So this norm, uh, the normal curve, which is so beautiful to see and you know, easy to draw. Okay, I'm sorry, one thing I... Yeah, I said so we, it's beautiful to draw and very easy, uh, easy to draw and everyone follows. This has a very weird and a complex equation. This is the equation actually. So this, this is the probability and this is the one by root of two pi. So this is a constant, uh, uh, sigma square k. So if you take it out of the bracket, this will be sigma k. Sigma k is a uh, standard deviation in that class. So k is that class which we are talking about. Forget k right for now. Just uh, understand the formula. Sigma square into e to the power minus 1 by 2 sigma square into x minus mu square. Uh, this is this whole thing is in the power of e. Don't go too much depth into the equation. It's, it's, it will not help much. But since uh, we are doing LDA, which uh, kind of assumes this equation. So what... What we are trying to do is, we are trying to e present this rest all we are good, we are good here. So we just say this is a pi k, pi k is just a symbolic representation, no uh, science behind it. This we are presenting in a form of equation. So basically what we are saying inside a class given y equal to k my x will follow a normal distribution and the probability associated will be an output of this equation any questions here any questions just till here nothing in the model just till here don't bother yourself too much from the equation the same knife base equation we are dealing with just this part, okay, the part that I am bordering with a black color, this part we are representing in a form of equation. I'll stop here. Any questions? Yeah, can you repeat that again, Shubhadi, that formula? Perfect. Probability now, of x equal to x. You want to understand the formula or just uh, see, uh, hear out, hear me out. understand the concept. So there's no concept here as per se in the formula. It's just a formula of this PDF, okay? So normal distribution PDF will follow this formula. Any point, for example, when you keep, you got the mean, you got the standard deviation. So whenever you have a normal distribution, for example, if you have your data like 20, 25, 70, 76, 150. So um, let's say what is the mean? The mean is let's say somewhere around 55. Okay. Then <clears throat> what is the standard deviation? Let's say it's five. Now I tell you what is the probability of I me seeing 27 in this data. Can you find out directly? You cannot find out directly, right? Because there's no 27 in the data. Even if it, I asked you 25, you still could not tell me the probability as such, right? This is a continuous distribution. So what you do, you go to your equation of normal, one upon root two pi sigma into e to the power minus half x minus mu by right. sigma whole square. You put in your mean here, you put in your standard deviation here, you put in x, which I want to find, and you give me the probability. Let's say it's 0 0.2. Okay. Simple as that. Okay. Okay. Cool. 
सुनील क्वेश्चंस क्लियर ओके सो इंस्टेड ऑफ दिस फॉर्मूला इंस्टेड ऑफ दिस एक्सप्रेशन आई प्रेजेंट दैट इन द फॉर्म ऑफ एन इक्वेशन नाउ सो दिस इज बेसिकली प्रोबेबिलिटी ऑफ एक probability of class k given x is equal to the formula which i just told into pi k is a factorial representation divided by so pi k i have written here only so no no here i have written the pi k here okay divided by the sum of that simple right i have just re replaced this part in a form of equation if you take log on both sides this will come no need to go into depth of that uh, what comes basically what we are trying to say is your decision boundary between two classes so let's say your this is high this is low your decision boundary will be the center of these two means so mu if this is mu1 this is mu2 mu and mu2 by 2 the center of this will be the decision boundary and that will be a linear decision boundary i know that it's not clear uh, so i again state so for example if you have a data like this your y equal to high is like this y equal to low is like this now what is your decision boundary that separates these two i mean what is the let's say so in for example in support vector machine we had a line that was separating this two so similarly what is the line that is separating this two so the line will be like this mu1 if to is the center of this mu2 is the center of this the center of these two centers is the the line will cross through this part okay so uh actually this is a little complex model to make you understand so can you ask me specific questions so that i can clear that uh, better instead of me being uh, i mean me being uh, uh, what do you call guessing that which part you don't understand can you just ask me questions on this yeah uh, the one you drew the line you found the point based on the center of uh, uh, from the center point right correct correct the middle right then how is this line represented what is the data for the line okay uh, good question so you understand this um, this equation so yeah this equation came from taking the log of these two equation now like for k let's say k equal to high here similarly k equal to low will come as an equation here now you equate those these two equations so when you equate means that probability of a per, of a point falling in high and low is equal it means that point should be lying on this right here the probability of this point falling in high is higher here the probability of for this point falling in low is higher beyond this line it means the probability of all those points which are kind of uh, having an equal probability to go on either side those points will be lying on that line no no but the points you are telling is is the cluster point that what right each cluster point right no no see this is an equation okay so now for example this is the x this is so x will uh, come from the data this so you have oh. calculate the mean this you have calculated from the data and this is a prior probability okay, okay. Let, let us understand each of the components of the mean then i think it will be clear so x will be coming from the data okay okay uh this is k sigma so so what is sigma k what is sigma k square is basically standard deviation of the data in kth class okay similarly what is mu k mean of the data in 
in the kth class okay so all these things will be calculated for example uh, okay let's take an example here so your data was like this let's say x1 and you just have a y let's take only one dimension it's easy for you to understand okay so now let's say you have one two three four five and another six data points okay now your high is your high high low 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 okay so x1 let's say 20 26 27 low let's say 40 45 70 okay now if you can understand this uh, now let me okay I wa I want you guys to calculate what is um, mu high actual numbers I want you can use a calculator what is mu high okay I'll assign names to each of the band this Krishna will answer uh, this Sharad will answer, Mu low Sunil will answer, and Sigma low Vasant will answer. What is uh, Mu high? Krishna? Yeah, one second. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. Mu is the mean. Mu is 23, 23.5 something. Okay, let's see. This is 53 plus uh, 73. 73 by 3 is around 24.5. So right? You want only the high? Yeah, only the high. So, this is high, right? So, 3. Oh, sorry, sorry. I missed one more. So, yeah, 20, 26, 27. Yeah. So, 53 plus uh, 2073 divided by 3, it's around 24.33, right? So this yeah. is 24.3. What is sigma high, Sharad? Okay, sigma high will take time. Uh, what is mu low? Mu is the mean. Sunil, mean of y equal to low. Okay, just tell me which data points you will consider, Sunil. I think it's 51.6. Uh, that's Vasant, right? Sigma low, right? Which one are you telling? Yes, yeah. No, no, mu low. Mu low. Mu low. Okay, mu low, let's see. 85 plus 70. 155 divided by 3 is around 51. Uh, yeah, 51.6. 51.6. Sunil, why didn't you answer? Uh, any doubt, Sunil? Are you finding this to understand? No, which I'm really sorry. I was out for three minutes. Oh, okay, okay. No problem. Okay. Uh, Vasant, Sigma Lo. Oh, no need to calculate. Just tell me the formula. Whatever it is, this is a one twenty one something. This is thirty six plus. Uh, this is how much? Nineteen, right? Nineteen is three eighty one. Is it something three point seven eight something for the height? Hundred eighty two. Yeah, so it could be something like that. 
so 2412 uh, plus yeah it could be something like that how much you said so sorry 3.7 something 3.7 uh, I'm not sure 4.33 whole square plus this is itself more than that then 26 this is something like 1.7 See, I'm making you do hands-on so that it's clear for everyone. I think it should be more than 3.7. How did you calculate? What 0.3? You knew high was 24.33, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so what is the difference between 20 and 24.33? That's how we calculate the right? standard deviation. 20 minus 24.33 whole square plus 26 minus 24.33 whole square plus 27 minus 24.33 whole square. And then take a uh, root, right? Hello. Hey, yeah, you're correct. Yeah, that's how we did. Maybe I missed some value. <laughs> Give me a second. Let me. Yeah, no problem. See, if one value is greater than four, it means the whole thing will be greater than four because we are adding positives, right? So that's why I was. I told you that 3.7 could not be the answer. <coughs> Anyways, you guys get the essence, right? So Neil, uh, since you are not there, uh, 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 did you understand this flow? Yeah. Problem? Yeah, no, basically I understand that PDF distribution which we took from the probability and use in that equation, that, that's clear. That's clear, no? okay. So what we are doing here, no. is we are trying to calculate the sigma k and mu k for each of the classes. So since it's uh, difficult to, you know, show you in the picture, I was taking a sample data set. So, I was just asking them okay. to calculate what is the mean, what is the sigma in high, and then what is the mean and in sigma, what in low. Okay. Okay. So for example, mu high is 24.33. Sigma high is something, let's say, I think it should be, let's see, 9, 16, 25, something around 5.5. Yeah, so it will be, okay. Uh, mu of low is... Uh, 51.6 as uh, I think Vasan said uh, correctly and then the standard deviation is I I don't know how much it is so anyways whatever it may be so three eight okay that's right something around 20 basically mean and the standard deviation we are calculating here yeah 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 now mu is mean can you guys right? actually calculate each of the values because I want you to find the value tell me the probability of um, x equal to 25 given uh, y equal to high. Can you guys do this for me right now? I think last time we did the same, but here. No, it's not the same, Sunil. Yeah. That's why I'm saying here we are putting in equation. We are not calculating this from the data. We are doing from the calculation. Okay, last year also we did the same, x equal to something, y equal to something. As there is no 25 for x, so it will be 0, isn't it? No, 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 Sunil, not, not like that. Okay. Uh, my base, you remember? Yeah, we should. Yeah, so we did a class. Yeah. When, we, when there were classes, like, these, when these were classes, yes, no, then Sunil is right. Right, when we just see that and calculate. But when these were continuous variables, do, do you remember we kind of fed in the same uh, thing in the probabilities in the PDF of the normal? Yeah. Okay. Guys, you need to revise the previous slides because 
if you don't revise it is uh, difficult uh, for you to for catch up see when you have a continuous variable you cannot do what you were just saying since 25 is not there i cannot say it is zero because it's a continuous variable when we have yes or no for example when it, we were doing right sunny equal to yes and sunny equal to no and then what was the play then we were saying what were the number of occurrence of yes divided by the total number of occurrences and we could say but in case of continuous variables even in the naive base i told you that we have to feed in in this equation but that time we didn't too much stress on this equation that's what i'm that's why i'm saying kindly do this otherwise it will always remain a confusion do this tell i, I have this data uh, set will exceed some 10 minutes today but let's be clear on this let's not be in, in a shadow of doubt okay let's do this if you have x1 your y is uh, let's say here high okay let's say let's keep this simple so that your means and all everything can come up easily 40 45 50 high high low 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 i am uh, making your uh, life simple i am saying mu high equal to 25 mu by sigma high equal to 5 okay and mu low equal to 45 sigma low equal to 5 okay now tell me what is the probability of x equal to 27 given y equal to high come on do this i want the answer real answer the equation that you have to use is this one i'll write it here properly so that you can take a reference of it 1 by root of 2 pi okay let me write it properly with 1 divided by root of 2 pi sigma k e to the power minus half x minus mu sigma k whole square use this equation use a calculator and tell me what is the probability of x equal to 27 given y equal to high so basically k equal to high so, so what is everything you have given just you have to put the value and we and we will get the value isn't whatever it may be you tell me the answer i am not uh, i will make sure that okay. everyone finds out the answer mu h uh, 25 correct and sigma is 7.07 okay you are calculated okay that's great but i just uh, mentioned it uh, just assume it to be 5 but that's okay if you have calculated that's okay you tell me what is the probability of x equal to 27 given y equal to high at least tell me what you have fed in the equation what all values right so here we have got this sigma so okay. 1 upon 2 pi sigma is 7.07 okay. and then x is our num 27 so this is not x 27 uh, i mean in that is into e, e to the power oh into okay yeah. so into e to the power minus half and then x is 27 perfect okay. minus mu is mu is 25 so that means 2 
Correct. Divide it by seven and then whole square. Correct. Perfect. So whatever that number. Whatever that. So if you standard deviation as five, it's around seventy percent. Perfect. Okay. That may be the. Uh, that's a uh, good. Uh, I think that will be the answer. I think. So now you get it, right? So when your value is not there, but if you have a continuous variable, you can still find out the probability of that number given a particular class. uh and calculate its probability now if you give uh, i if i tell you what is the probability equal to x probability for x equal to 50 given y equal to high that will be very less you can just check can you just uh, do that also x equal to 50 when y equal to high yeah it will be by looking at this number uh, it will be because uh after 30 it's uh, low always why low right perfect it yeah that that's the essence but can you give me a number so that uh, we have some reference to uh, talk about yeah so so mu and sigma uh, we have got so 50 minus 25 uh, sigma which is 7 um why right. Sunil are you getting it Yeah, I've got this. Just yes, I'm using calculator. Okay, perfect, perfect. So formula is e to the power minus one by two, right? Correct, correct, correct. So it is coming e to the power minus six point three. I don't have this scientific calculator, so probably. Okay, that's okay. Uh, can um, Krishna? I think he was having a calculator. Can you tell me the value? Uh, give me a second. Is it around uh, uh, 0.6 percentage or something like that? Six percentage or 0.6? Six percent. Anyway, it will be very low, or whatever it may be. I'll, uh, I'll probably check in uh, in my calculator, but it will be very low. So the essence why I was uh, asking you to do this is basically now you have ingrained in your mind that. it's not that when we we have continuous variable we cannot find out the probability the only first thing you have to do is assume a distribution so assume this distribution assume this as an equation of normal distribution and then proceed with the calculation of uh, your uh, what do you call the probability okay now since now you have done this it's okay now let's feed in uh, the proper equation okay now now let's say my uh, problem is uh, i get a data point let's say 70 okay now what is my probability of y equal to high and what is my probability of y equal to low or let's say what whatever we have calculated for 50 okay now probability of y equal to 50 um uh, so probability of y equal to high when 
x is equal to 50 is equal to probability of x equal to 50 given y equal to high into probability of y equal to high divided by the summation forget that what is this we have just calculated let's say uh, krishna is right so we have 0 0.066 percent okay and uh, what is probability of y equal to high uh, there's an external noise can uh, uh, you put yourself in mute i mean there was a, okay now it's gone anyways so what is probability y equal to high from this same data hello yeah yeah the probability is like uh, 50% right excellent yeah it's 50% so 0. 0.5 because high is 3 low is 3 so 3 by 6 okay so 0.5 is the probability and then you have the denominator. Now, when your probability of y equal to high is probability of y equal to low, okay, so these are called prior probabilities, okay. So we saw this in equation, right. So we got this equation after taking the log of the same thing and we saw that when the prior probability probabilities are equal okay here our prior probabilities are equal right probability of y equal to high is 0.5 probability y equal to low is 0.5 then your decision boundary is basically the average of this plus the average of this by 2 so what was the average of this 25 and what is the average of this 45 45 plus 25 divided by 2 this is 35 so whatever falls greater than 35 is low whatever falls less than 35 is high you get this so what was the decision boundary like we were speaking right uh, you that time you were asking what is this line so this line is equal to x equal to 35 right now right because your pi k is equal to 0.5 for both cases right probability y equal to high equal to probability of y equal to low, right? So this was equal to 0.5. Now, this got cancelled out and this condition came up. So what was the, so what is x? x is equal to 25 plus 45 divided by 2. So x equal to 35 is your decision boundary. So whatever falls below 35 is high, whatever falls above 35 is low. Is this clear to everyone? each and every one. I want, if any doubt is there, then I will not go ahead. If it is clear for everyone. Question is, sorry, uh, it is just one, one value, right? For a point, we have two values, right? That's why I'm a little confused. You have 35, right? Correct. Right. But when I'm going to plot, what does 35 mean? Okay. Right? So right now you have just a one dimension, right? So your decision, uh, boundary, your decision boundary is basically this. So x equal to 35, whatever falls beyond this is low and whatever falls beyond this is high. For example, if you have two dimensions, then your dimension will be like this. So whatever falls beyond this high and uh, let's say okay, something like that. Yeah? This is low. Right now you have only one dimension. Okay. Sunil, is this clear? Sunil? No, not almost. I want specific questions why it is not clear or why it is um, clear. I want specific questions because uh, I don't want uh, no, ask me question. No, uh, ask me the direct question or ask me anything you want, but get it clear. No, no, I, I, sorry for that. So, 
so I got all the probability high and low, and now I need to that thirty five. How did you calculate that thing? I couldn't understand. Oh, fair, fair enough. Uh, just park that question. Any other questions apart from this? How did thirty five come? No, out? after that, after that, I understand. Yeah, how why it will be low? What is the decision boundary? I understand. Excellent. Only thirty five. Thirty five. From where you get there? Oh, okay, perfect. Any other? I mean, apart from you, uh, Sharad Vasan. Any other question apart from Sunil's? Uh, no, because no. a lot of math calculations are going on, so it's yeah, yeah, just to concentrate very, on this. Going very slow on this. That's why I'm not. I'm going very slow on this. That's why. Yeah, yeah Sharad, you were saying something. No, I said okay. Yeah, for me, no other question. No other question. Vasant. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay, so just we need to address how x equal to 35 came up. Okay, so Sunil, this part you understood, right? This part. Yeah. This part you are comfortable. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because from there we derive the final equation. Yeah. Which okay. is very simple. Exactly. Taking log on both sides and you just find out the. So here, are, what are the components you see here on this equation? If I just zoom here, what are the components you see here? Okay. Uh... We need x, x, uh, then derivation mu. Correct. Yeah, and and then yeah, that's all. Only these two things we need. Standard deviation and x. X and yeah, what about standard pi? Standard deviation mu x. What about pi k? This all you don't okay. know. Pi. What is pi k? No. That's thing I don't know. Pi. See, if you have understood this, that's why I'm asking repeatedly. If if you understood this, no, no, I mean in the last equation from where we calculated um, 35 when y is high, that log pi k was not there. Uh, okay, no, that that's what I'm asking. Uh, first, you tell me, did you understand this top equation, this one? Are you clear on these comp components, each of the components, or you're not clear about pi k here? Only pi k that is not clear. That is not clear. Okay. All are... So it means you. I this one I told right. Probability of y equal to k is pi k. Oh okay. Okay. Now are you clear about probability of y equal to k? What is probability of y equal to k? Yeah, this thing you have assumed as a pi k. You have assumed, but what is that? You have you are clear now. Yeah, this part I have clear. Okay, perfect. So if you know pi k here, it means that means you have understood this equation, right? Yeah, now yeah, now I understand everything because pi k that term was not clear, but uh, that equation was clear to me. Okay. So that equation you have put put here pi k. After that you are taking the log, and finally you are calculating the, what is that sign amazing, you are given. Amazing, amazing, yeah. Now, yeah, okay. what I say is a uh, x point. A x point wherein my probability equal to y equal to high and probability y equal to low is equal. That means that is my decision boundary. That boundary beyond yeah, right? Our yeah, that's correct. A decision boundary which separates. Where did that go? Where is that diagram? Yeah. So here my probability of high equal to y equal to high is greater. My probability y equal to low is greater. But at this point, or at this point, or at this point, both are equal, right? Yes. Okay. So it means if this is the probability, and I equate this. Okay. Now let me take this equation and solve it for you. Can you see? Let's let's keep it high and low here.
this is the probability of y equal to high given x agree same thing i just replace k with high yes okay yes which is should be equal to agree this probability should be equal to so this is probability of y equal to high given x this is probability of y equal to low given x when will be this equal this will be equal on the decision boundary as we said here yes so it means the x that we get from here should be equal to the should be lying on the decision boundary simple maths yeah equating two equations finding whichever x uh, satisfies this equation it should be the decision boundary right yeah this is clear clear okay i have said that pi high and pi low are equal it means it this it cancels out pi high and pi low is equal pi high is yes 0.5 correct that means it cancels off if you solve this equation it will come x is equal to mu high plus mu low divided by 2 is this clear so there is an assumption inherent assumption behind that how this comes to here but solving this equation this will come or should i show the steps here no it's okay we'll do that okay so basic the assumption is sigma high equal to sigma low that is one assumption that you are taking here okay so this is called the shared covariance okay no need to go into that what is shared covariance but just assume the inherent assumption of lda is that the variance across the two classes is similar and that is not a very uh, weird assumption to keep in so for example here it was uh, something one was 5 one was 7 so you assume that if it is a normal distribution and if it is two classes the distribution or sorry the standard deviation would be kind of similar that is an inherent assumption that your linear discriminant analysis take into consideration okay so mu high what was it 45 mu low was 20 sorry it was the reverse 25 plus 45 divided by 2 45 correct yeah. yeah. okay yes i'm not very confident that you have understood i didn't I don't hear a very no, no no i understand definitely i'll because these are math math calculations we have to go take note pad and we have to go one by one okay. but it's clear everything it's clear no so this is yeah. this finishes our modeling part okay so we have completed lda okay so uh since we are almost running out of time so i will show you tomorrow what we'll do we'll show the codes for clustering and lda and then we have a project work tomorrow so uh, this uh, lda we are calculating to decide the boundary for this clustering uh see don't mix up two definitions clustering is different what i have explained okay. you clustering is different clustering is unsupervised learning right clustering has nothing to do with lda this is what i showed is um uh, okay maybe maybe there is a confusion here because i have never mentioned decision boundary earlier but right now i have mentioned a decision boundary here okay so if you remember svm svm support vector machines we were drawing a line maximum marginal classifier if you remember you were separating two classes yes okay so that was a decision boundary similarly in lda also we have a decision boundary 
So what is the particular value of x beyond which you would say that the class is hard changing? So right now we just have a one dimension. When you have multiple dimensions, then the curves will be, I mean, the picture will look different. Right now we just have a one dimension. So what is the objective here? What your objective is basically to calculate what is the probability of high given a new point, right? So this already you are getting, right? This prob probability you are just getting. But I just wanted to explain you how a decision boundary is built. Since LD is a good example to show you and SVM was a good example to show you, that's why I showed. Otherwise your objective is always what is the probability of y equal to high given a new x, x point, right? Correct. That you have already so tomorrow we are doing, Correct. So tomorrow we are doing a project work. Why didn't it decided for the last week? No, last week we have uh, uh, natural language processing and deep learning. Okay. Yeah. Because those we will not see the codes in detail. Those are more of theoretical and we'll see just, you know, wet our feet on that con those concepts. We'll not go into depth too much depth. That will be a separate course for deep learning. So deep learning will be a separate course that uh, we will launch. And uh, in that case, we will go in depth in deep learning. And deep learning is uh, really very, deep learning and NLP is very interesting. And if you want to continue learning more about modeling and how deep learning can, you know, um, uh, defeat all these models that we have learned, then uh, we can, you know, you can also go in for that course according to whatever your needs are. But deep learning is sure. NLP will be a different. Yeah, so two questions basically. Uh, one question regarding that project work. What are we going to do? Means you will give us a problem and we will come up with a solution or you will describe, you will take a problem and you will go one by one step to finish that. Yeah, I will take a problem and go one by one step to finish it. Oh, and and uh, regarding that deep learning, yeah, that's very means that is trending and that is required. Yeah, yeah. So, what are you going to let us know in deep learning? Means because as you told, you are not going to cover the modeling because and as I know, modeling that is the one of the important tasks. Without this, there is no use of deep learning. Correct, correct. So, only describing means neurons and how neurons are interacted and that is the step for the deep learning basically how human thinks so these are the theoretical part it will finish in 30 minutes only no it so modeling it could you not, give us the basics of modeling it will not simple example no it will not finish in 30 minutes deep learning theory is huge uh, there is matrix multiplication there are a lot of things so we'll see how much but see modeling will not be able to finish in one and a half hour or two hours deep learning is of different course okay so we'll wet our feet in that concept. So we'll understand how deep learning is improving these models. What is it actually doing? But we'll not go inside the code because neither it is possible to explain the code in two and a half hours or neither is it possible to even set up. Yeah. Deep learning will have a different setup also. You need to have a tensor flow. Uh, so that even setup is not, uh, can be done in two and a half hours. So, but we'll see how deep learning, you know, uh, yeah, so at least basically, Subhari, uh, basically in two and a half hour, whatever time you will give, I should be confident enough to understand the deep learning yeah. and how to model this basically. I'm not going in the modeling algorithms or anything. Uh -huh. So because machine learning, that was easy for us because we were familiar with the data supervised learning and uh, unsupervised learning, this type of things. But deep learning, that is very new, only basics. I don't think so. I'm not sure whether others know, know or not. But in case of me, just I know the basics. Neurons, these are the way it has been modeled. And But deep learning, that is very important to understand us so that we can decide whether we have to go in deep learning or not. Yeah, yeah. So that's why that's why I'm, I am going to give you that uh, picture of how deep learning, uh, let's say if you want to pursue deep learning, then how it will proceed and how, how what are the complexities in it and how it involve, improves the present models, how it functions differently, what is the setup, how it is different from the current setups of machine learning, 
how it can be used for supervised learning, how it can be used for unsupervised learning. That basic uh, introductions and basic this will I'll give you. But uh, deep yeah, I think that will be great. Yeah, deep learning. So definitely, yeah, uh, in two and a half hour, it can't be covered. I know this. Yeah, it will be a lot. It can be a session. Model, model. But um, since this was the objective of this course was to understand machine learning very thoroughly, right? So that is what we need to focus. That your machine learning is very clear, because if it is, see, that's what I'm saying. These equations and all, these are, you know, in deep learning, you start your deep learning with equations. You start with deep, your deep learning with stochastic gradient uh, and uh, you know gradient descent, uh, um, all back propagation, differentiation. A lot of maths is there. So uh, that's why your deep learning course itself to just in get to know the maths itself would take around two or three classes or even more than that, just to understand the maths because there's a lot of maths involved in different deep learning. But, uh, that's uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah. is the class over? I have to step out? Yeah, yeah sure, okay? sure, 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 no problem. The class is over actually. So tomorrow okay, we'll thank just, you. Uh, see the course for clustering and project. We'll start. Okay, sure, that would be great. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, Shubhadi, one more request. Yeah. Instead of uh, one day next week and one day next to next week, why not we are taking all both classes next to next week only, so that at least one weekend will be free for us. Okay. Sarad and uh, yeah, fine with we can ask Sarad to send it. Yeah, we can have the next week uh, off and then probably we can resume week after. That that also I can you know I, I because I just need to talk to Ashok uh, regarding the options. Uh, so, uh, because he has to take the final call, and I'll just uh, convey that all the participants are okay with that. Uh, and if he gives a nod, so I don't have any problem with that. Okay, that's it. Yeah, but that, that's a uh, but Sunil, uh, that's what I'm saying. Uh, if you want to pursue deep learning, um, that's great. And if you want to go in depth, so we will have a course for deep learning separately. But it's good to know deep learning, but it's not that you every problem is solved with deep learning. Don't get too much uh, excited what the external world sees, huh? Uh, because I have, I am doing this business uh, in a lot of things. So it's not that every problem will be solved by deep learning. And these machine learning is just waste, uh, whatever we have done. It's not that. Deep learning can solve particular problems which are, which cannot, machine learning cannot solve. But there are particular so, machine learning can solve, deep learning can some cannot solve, right? So it's not that deep learning, once you learn deep learning, all the machine learning goes waste. It's not like that. And deep learning, yeah. there are certain uh, problem states. For example, the project in pattern recognition I did, I did deep learning and gradient boosting. But gradient boosting performed better than deep learning in my case, right? So it's not that machine learning is a waste uh, and deep learning is all what we need right now. Okay, because you, with one of my friend, I was discussing. He told, if you want to go in machine learning side or new field you are choosing, why not directly going in deep no, learning? No, why are you? No, it's not struggling correct. with machine learning. Not correct. It's okay. Not, absolutely not correct. If you don't know machine learning, you'll never understand deep deep learning. First case. Oh, okay, that's great. Okay. Second case, it's not that deep learning is a solution to all of your problems, right? In case of deep learning, there are a lot of machine learning concepts or machine learning models that will come into picture in deep learning. That's what I'm saying. Deep learning is not something that uh, you have. So you know, when your data sets become very complex, right? it's not about just a single model. It, have, it has to have multiple models. I, I built a model which has, I built a solution which has 10 models in it, right? So 10 or someone can build a model with a solution which has 100 models in it. With different hyperparameters, so it's not that deep learning is uh, the straight thing. And see, if you don't know machine learning, you will never understand deep learning. That is for sure. That I can guarantee. But if you understand machine, okay. learning, it's much easier to understand deep learning. And if you understand, yeah. want to do deep learning, then it's not that machine learning is a waste. That's how I would put it. Okay. And, uh, okay, that's great. I think so. After two and a half hour, I'll decide whether I have to go in deep learning or not. But whether that interesting for me or not. Yeah. So deep learning, I will tell you. Um, if we have two minutes, I just tell you deep learning. It's very math intensive. It's difficult to implement. Okay. 
results are all very good obviously results are much very good uh, in certain cases especially for unstructured data if it is for structured data then machine learning models are much better but if it's unstructured like text image okay uh, uh, let's say uh, videos for these deep learning but real business problems like for example uh, johnson's database right it is more of structured data for that's why i need machine learning deep learning will not help and deep learning will need a lot of data points minimum let's say at uh, 1 lakh data points deep learning would need you if it's too less it's 100 or 200 data points deep learning will never help okay so okay. don't get uh, disheartened that uh, oh, will not learn deep learning and machine learning is just waste since deep learning is there it's not like that deep learning will perform terribly bad if you have too less data and your data is too structured then your boosting will will perform much better than deep learning so out of okay then. six projects yeah. that i'm doing i am just Im implementing deep learning in one of them that because it is of unstructured data other five i am doing machine learning so um, sure it means uh, in every class we have been talking about the theory math part and then programming part yeah so my question is there are two terms frequently used one uh, that is related with stats and another one is related with programming correct so means stats mathematician that is required very much there you can understand the data points everything correct. and another part that comes programming so as a programmer as for example i am a programmer correct so do i need to understand those data very well or not yeah of course you need to so date um, if i can say um, a data science if you want to go be a good data science okay so yeah if you consider data science as a venn diagram so one when one set will be data or let's say business the other set will be uh, programming and the other set will be statistics so the course i did right uh, the masters uh, i did in data science is comp is taken up by three in different institutes see how data science is important in these three different domains so uh, my technology part was handled by indian institute of technology kharagpur which is the best in engineering and computer science in india my management part the business part is being handled by indian institute of management calcutta and then my statistics part is handled by indian statistical institute so each of the three institutes taught us their different expertise so i don't it's not that indian institute of management sole provided me this masters it's not individual institutes uh, taught me and that's why your you know understanding each every part is equally important you cannot neglect any of them okay 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 then let's close for today let's meet tomorrow okay okay, okay sure thanks a lot okay thank you so much <laughs>
250 only two right 250 uh, so this is the average and when it is greater than yes greater than 35 then 100 400 sorry 100 400 500 plus uh, 60 560 plus uh, that's it right 560 so 560 divided by 3 it's around let's say 183 uh, right so this is how you do a regression problem so now if someone gives you what is the price at let's say age greater uh, age equal to 47 then you predict as 183 so your oh, exactly. actual value for 47 is uh, 47 is 60 however uh, it, it's kind of an outlier right it's kind of an outlier so your uh, prediction is 183 so now since you just have one variable that's why you have uh, uh, it, it's it's kind of uh, not very accurate so for any age let's say if you are inputting age as 56 also the prediction will be 183 since you have just have one variable okay okay yeah so if it is so a for n sorry and uh, this is your predicted so here age is 40 183 age is 30 uh, 125 age is 56 183 age is uh, 23 125 183 so now your error will be uh, your error will be 183 minus 100 whole square plus 123 125 minus 200 whole square plus 183 minus 400 whole square plus 125 minus 50 whole square plus 183 minus 60 whole square this will be your total error or sum of squares okay so that's how you deal with it clear yeah it's clear so after this we have got all the errors next yeah. what means finally we have to predict so we have already so assuming this is coming one. yeah it's coming x oh okay so you mean for age greater than 35 it will be 83 183 and that, is, that will be our answer yeah since you just have one variable and then this is a very very shallow tree right so okay. yeah so if you go on so, building the tree then this can be let's say after this you take a age greater than 40 and then do an average here and then again it can be age greater than 50 so as you go on building the trees I just just explaining how you know these things can be uh, used I mean this uh, decision tree can be used for irrigation so basically in that group you try to take the average of the whole thing okay yes is it clear or any questions you have yeah it, no no it's uh, it's clear okay amazing and uh, I have one more question basically so. yeah, yeah. Uh, regarding confidence versus accuracy we have predicted uh, based on the training set, but in test set we are getting some errors, false positive results, and other things. So confidence we calculated, and we can say okay, this much correct we will be. Is this a correct answer for this one? Okay, so it's a good point you have uh, caught in uh, confidence versus accuracy. So okay. I'll try to explain this in a different sense. So, confidence is like let's say if you are 95 confidence percent confidence that your accuracy it's let's say 50 percent. Okay, it means your if you even take a sample different sample from the same population. Ninety-five percent of times you will end up with an accuracy of fifty percent. Now, what is the population? A population is like let's say your uh, you have hundred data points, right? Of age versus price. You just have collected hundred data points, so that is a sample. Now, 
there can be 220000 30000 infinite data points that can exist right i mean for example uh, in one country you would have checked i can say that let's say total world's population total world's population there can be a this relation of e, uh, the price of the house and they are buying uh, at what age they are buying okay so infinite means practically not possible to collect everyone's data right so you just have collected for example you went to 200 or 200 houses and you got 100 data points that is a sample that you have collected right now how confident are you that this sample is the correct representation of the population that is the confidence interval or that is a confidence right so you are 95 percent confident that this sample that you have picked up is a representation of the population okay and this accuracy thus this accuracy that you have got 50 percent or 20 percent or 100 percent this accuracy is independent of confidence right this accuracy doesn't have to be have to be related with the confidence accuracy is an independent factor so accuracy will tell that how accurate you are on the model confidence will tell that if you get a new sample from the same population 95 percent times your accuracy will be 50 percent five percent of the times you can't say it can increase it can decrease basically your model that you have fitted the y is equal to fx on a sample data right you fit this model on a sample data now this gave you a 50 percent accuracy right now someone may challenge you that uh, why did you take these 100 people why didn't you take up 100 people from india or why didn't you take 100 people from afghanistan right so you would say that i don't uh, uh, i can't go to india and afghanistan and check what is the response so you say that i am 95 percent confident that this 550 percent accuracy is will be true for 95 percent times five percent and I, I can't say and how does this come this night this comes from the variance now let's not go into too depth of statistics but let's if you want to understand if it's just a normal distribution if you remember our class of uh, yeah. the first class this bell curve, bell curve uh, this covers 95 percent so you say that if you pick a sample from here or if you pick a sample from here or if you pick a sample from here or if you pick a sample from here all these are data points right so if you pick a sample from here 95 percent times based on the variance i can see my sample will give me 50 percent accuracy okay but if i pick up people from let's say india or let's say a people from uh, underdeveloped countries let's say whatever uh, 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 let's say afghanistan go for nepal nepal or afghanistan yeah. okay so that time my model may fail i i don't know okay but uh, india maybe uh, for example in villages this uh, model will fail because i didn't consider that sample so 95 percent times i am uh, uh, correct that 50 percent uh, my model will have at least 50 percent accuracy and this accuracy can be anything 100 percent it cannot be 100 percent obviously some it can be 90 percent it can be 20 percent it just says how confident you are in stating that accuracy so this confidence interval you might uh, see a lot of uh, times in let's say um, whenever you are uh, reading medical journals right so medical journals when they have a test for example does long lung cancer is the smoking cause lung, lung cancer so every time you will find a p value there if you ever see those journals you will always find a p value so they will state that p value is 0 0.001 so p value is just basically this so at in case of 95 percent this is uh, uh this is this is five percent so 0 0.05 p value is 0 0.05 so five percent times your it can fail and if a p value is less than 0 0.001 it means this is how much 99.9 percent .9%. so 99.9 percent .9 times you can be sure that lung cancer is caused by smoking okay now 
if you ever read a medical test or a medical uh, study you will always find this p value quoted in any statistical test okay is everyone clear yeah let clear okay okay so now i have a quiz for you guys a simple quiz uh, we'll uh, check how good you have understood uh, the concept let me open it very simple small quiz huh? just a second Oops, wait. I'll just stop the broadcast now. Okay, we can start. Okay, can you see the questions? Okay. Yep. What is machine learning? First question. Ability of computer to learn from data. highly efficient search algorithms ability of the computer to load and process data none of the above a a any other answers i'll let me mark you guys uh, here so uh, I, we can talk over because i'm seeing on my ipad you uh, you can uh, tell the answer so i'll mark you guys uh, let me draw also Anyways, it's not allowing me to draw here. I think. Okay, I think we will copy. Yeah. So, uh, Krishna, uh, Sunil, Sharad. So, any other answers? All. Are saying a yes okay which of the following are necessary conditions for applying machine learning a uh, pattern should exist the pattern is unknown there should be lots of data all of the above uh, a uh, d d d okay krishna you saying a uh, sunil and sharad d no yeah. d d for dog Yeah, yeah, I yeah. got it. Yeah. Delhi. Yeah. Okay. Krishna is A. You want to change, Krishna? Pattern is unknown. Uh, that is uh, uh, unsupervised learning, right? Yeah, I might change. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. D. Okay. Because I B B was the point, right? Okay. Okay. I'll also. Um, I think first question is correct for everyone. Second question. 
I will clear out the confusion. A pattern should exist. That is true, right? That's, if there, yeah. there's, it is completely random, you cannot apply machine learning. The pattern is unknown. The pattern is unknown means when we discussed that GX is a God's function, right? So we never knew that G, right? That's why we are fitting machine learning. It's not about unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning also has a pattern. Okay. In, and in supervised learning also we have a pattern. But the pattern is unknown in both cases, right? If we know the pattern, then we have the function, right? So we don't need to do anything else. So the pattern is unknown. That is one very important factor that you don't know the pattern. That's why you're fitting the model. Right? There should be lots of data, right? This is one of the necessary conditions. Anyway, which of the following is an example application of machine learning? Spam filter, voice recognition, all autonomous cars, all of the above. All of the so above. B and C comes in deep learning. And if you are considering deep learning, then D will be the answer. Correct. Supervised learning requires only the input features, only the outcome, both the input features and the outcome, all of the above. Supervised learning. Both input C. Uh, which one? Both the input feature and the outcome. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Unsupervised learning requires only the input features, only the outcome, both features and outcome, none of the above. Only yeah. the input features. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Which specific category of algorithms are better suited for predicting an outcome, which is a number, and Kate can take any value on the number line? Surprise, Regression, C. Regression. Excellent. Which specific category of algorithms are better suited for predicting an outcome, which is a list of values? That is uh, classification. Classification. Excellent. D. Which specific category of algorithms are better suited for predicting the price of a house in a subdivision? That will be the question again. Excellent. Uh, no, no, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Any question? Confusion? Uh, no. Price. Price is. Uh... But regression is part of the supervised learning, right? Yeah. So yeah. It should be A and C both, correct? Yeah, but. So, supervised learning uh, has regression and classification, right? So, I, I'm when I'm saying oh, okay. price, that's regression only, okay? Uh, which specific oh. category of algorithm are better suited for predicting the presence of cancerous tumors after processing the patient's scan? That will be classification. Okay, uh, any other answer? Classification. Excellent. Which specific category of algorithms were just suited for understanding the different segments among the online shoppers of a particular e-store? That will be clustering. Any other answers? Yeah. Yeah. Clustering. Different segments, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Great going. Which specific category of algorithms are better suited for predicting the stock price of a company after three months? Regression. Uh, regression. Okay. I think these are easy. Now, what does RMS stand for? Root mean uh, square. Root mean square. It will be somewhere square. Excellent. D. RMS is an example root. of dash in linear regression. Root. Optimization function. Uh, uh, nice. Wait, wait. Cost function is it yeah. A. Yeah. Or A, cost function it should be. Yeah, correct. So, uh, so exactly what it is, you have the cost function and then you're trying to optimize the cost function. So you can actually tell both, right? So RMSE is, uh, you're trying to, uh, I mean, differentiate and minimize. So optimize as in minimize here. Okay. So, but that's correct. You, uh, if there are two things that cost function is a better one to, uh, write down. Okay. So optimize as in you are kind of minimizing the cost function. Okay. Which of the following library in Python implements the machine learning algorithms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 right. NumPy. No, num machine learning. Machine learning, yeah, NumPy. SKLR. NumPy. SKLR is the data. Like SKLR. NumPy is for basically plotting. Under right. for creating metrics 
ethical learning for machine learning algorithms excellent so yeah so let me write here numpy is data handling okay so you can have your arrays or matrices okay then scikit learn is your uh, machine learning packages are remember every time we write import sklearn learn import decision tree from scikit learn so scikit learn is where all the packages of machine learning are there. pandas is the data frame it's in which we kind of store the uh, data matplotlib is a visualization okay what does the coefficients of a feature imply in linear uh, recognition okay significant that feature towards the outcome very small Only confusion is with B in significance of that feature towards the output. So that's what, right? If your uh, out coefficient is very very small, it means it is insignificant, right, towards the outcome. Right. Okay. And then D R. Yeah. And positive negative correlation, you understand, right? Positive and negative. If the coefficient is positive or negative, okay. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, any doubts? Uh, it's clear. Okay. Which Python library this can we? It will be D. Yeah, this is easy. Matplotlib. It will be. Uh -huh. Load data from it. Anyways, this is easy. My friend does. Uh, yeah. Scikit Learn is built using. Okay, we have not seen this. So I, I'll mark Scikit. Yeah. yeah. What are the key advantages of Scikit Learn? Easy to learn. Suppose common machine learning algorithms provides data processing capabilities. All of them. All the above. All of the above. Yeah. D. What is the score function? A numerical representation of how good the prediction is. Another name for our root mean square error, also known as the cost function. All of the. All the above. D. Correct. All the above. Yeah. So uh, I'll not agree with this. Also, no, uh, another name for root mean square error, um, because uh, there are many, many other. Uh, score functions also so but okay given the choice d is a better answer which of the following is not a hyperparameter of a linear regression in uh, scikit learn okay this is interesting hyperparameter yeah uh, this is interesting um, not hyperparameter okay data we have to do hyperparameter so hyperparameter is basically the number of trees uh, the depth of the trees like we discussed the intercept okay Not what right. is this copy and as for x so it intersection creates uh, different copies of features okay i'll i'll simplify the answer pruning when did we do pruning We did pruning decision tree. Yes, pruning and decision tree, right? So uh, pruning cannot uh -huh. be done in linear regression. So even if you don't know all the others, you can just easily answer this by saying that pruning. Oh, oh my God, pruning was for decision trees. I cannot do pruning in linear regression, right? So if it's not a hyperparameter, so it is an easy answer to give. Okay. What is the key difference between linear regression and polynomial regression? They are the same for me. Higher, higher order of features. That something polynomial. What is the main advantage of linear regression? Increasing B or C? B. Uh, we don't know what is in. I think so. A should be. If your answer yes would be, but I'm not sure. D can also be. Interpretability. Yeah. Interpretability yeah. means, for example, in decision tree, 
if if someone says um what is the uh, partial effect of a variable can you say that what is a you can say what are the important variables can you see say what is the partial effect of a variable you can't say right but no, no because there is only one yeah yeah in linear regression you have the coefficients so you can say that if i change unit of this my output will change by this number this unit so that interpretability is very uh, is a very big advantage of a linear regression model okay so no, i didn't get so what what you are saying that uh, and how uh, uh, the interpretability means that uh, so for example your boss asked me hmm. uh this is let's say price or let's say age and this is work x mm -hmm. so if a boss says you have an equation to tell your boss right you can show an equation did decision tree give you any equation no right it didn't tell you any equation it is always a process right so process, there's right. a process mm -hmm. then you can't tell your boss that this is my equation you feed in your data and this equation will give you an output or you cannot say mm -hmm. like for example one unit of change of x2 what will be the unit change in y right you can tell here right b1 will be the unit change uh, the p1 will be the change in y when i have a unit change of x2 okay but in decision tree if someone right. says then what is the change in work x you have to say okay wait first i have to do the prediction in both cases and then i can tell you the outcome right so that's where the difference lies linear regression is very easy to interpret and it has a very and it has an equation form so an equation form is always appreciated okay 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 when does linear regression starts failing see a large number of features large number of features yeah yeah what technique is used to increase the accuracy of linear regression rms switch why did we go for ridge and yeah, rms yeah yeah rms RMS, RMS, yeah. RMS, RMS is not a mm -hmm. technique, right? RMS is a RMS is a number. It's a score function. That's what we answered in the previous question. Then, P regularization then. Yeah, regularization, right? That's why we went to Ridge and Lasso because we thought that uh, uh, your uh, uh, linear regression may not do good. That's why I went to Ridge and Lasso, and that's why regularization is important to prevent overfitting. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Just uh, give me a two-minute uh, break. I'll just join in two minutes. Okay, so let's start with our project today. So uh, before we go into that, I um, I think Sunil started that I just have um, to clarify um, our understanding. Yeah, yeah. So for regression, we had the linear 
पॉलिनोमियल रिज लासो के एन एन रैंडम फॉरेस्ट डिसीजन ट्री एंड एस सी एम दीज आर ऑल दीनियर डिग्रेशन डोंट से लीनियर रेग्रेशन मॉडल रेग्रेशन ओके लेट मी draw this and uh, you can take a picture of this okay uh, so that or i can share you yeah. this so that uh, it, it yeah, if there is a cheat sheet of on this it will be great because yeah yeah mm-hmm. okay uh, i think cheat sheet uh, you can fa- found uh, find in in uh, google in like Okay, I, I I think I will have an image. Uh, not able to find it right now. So I think uh, yeah, this one. The whole image is not there. Uh, this is one of the cheat sheets. I'll try to find out the main image. Uh, meanwhile, do you want me to draw it, or uh, if I send it, that will be okay? Yeah, if you draw it, yeah, it will be uh, draw it. Uh, okay, it will explain us more here. So just draw it and then. Well, we have learned so much, and um, uh, little bit confused. Like uh, yesterday when you were asking, so probably it was more confusing. No, no problem. In the interviews, um, since you might have attended, or might be knowing. So what kind of questions um, it asks? Basically, they go through these concepts. They will give you some algorithm, and they will ask, "Okay, tell me, explain me about this algorithm, and tell me whether it can be used in regression versus classification." And uh, they will ask you to write some program. What what exactly? Okay. Or so, you are going to discuss later on. Then probably we can discuss later. But uh, okay, no, that's okay. That this is the right time. I can uh, tell you what. Uh, just a second, and. Open my iPad. So interviews. If I, I if I may say, if you have got understood the theory of each of the uh, models that we have done, if you have understood the theory, then you can clear any interview at this point of time. Okay. So the main ask in interviews is, what is the concept behind the theory? See, that's uh, that's when Sunil was uh, one day we had a discussion of. Uh, how uh, is theory really important and you know so that's why i have predominantly focused on the theory because that's what people appreciate and that's what people will like if you understand the theory properly right there is no one can challenge you just to say yeah no one can challenge you in that uh, uh, if you know the if you understand the theory well right see coding is is important i would agree but codes it are like is something like uh, right now anyone can write seeing the internet right but for example how to tune the hyperparameters why hyperparameter tuning is important these are things uh, that are uh, just let me connect my ipad once again okay so i'll draw this and uh, we'll have a proper understanding so 
So what are the algorithms that we have learned in unsupervised? Only um, one algorithm. And that is key mean. No. Clustering. Two. Key mean clustering. Two, we learned two. One is the K mean, the other one is the L something, right? I forgot the name. This is the K means. And then there was hierarchical. Hierarchy. But they are all, they are the same, right? Clustering only. These are the ways of uh, doing a clustering, but essentially they are same. They the pro this is the other process, but clustering is mainly the unsupervised uh, part that we have learned. Now, okay. machine learning will have regression, and then it will have classification. Now, regression, one is linear regression. Mm -hmm. One is uh, polynomial, polynomial regression. Linear regression improve accuracy. You go with the regularization, so ridge and lasso, but it's essentially still linear regression. Just oh, okay, okay, okay. Then we learned what else? So here, uh, I think KNN can be used for this. So uh, for, wait. So linear regression, this is the linear part. Okay, so all these are linear. What linear means? Your when you will be fitting your line, it will be a line. It will not be a curved thing. Okay. Line. Now, Correct. when Correct. you start with polynomial regression, let me write it. Below. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will be an equation. Now I st start with non-linear, okay? Mm -hmm. Non-linear regression. So non-linear regression will have polynomial. Okay. Key nearest neighbors. Decision trees. Random forest. Boosting SVM and what else it will learn? Nebash. Nebash will learn. regression, I think. Yeah, I think essentially these are the things we learn in <coughs> regression. Okay, so these are a part of the non linear regression. Okay. Is this clear now? Do we have any questions on this? Yeah, so uh, I have a question <clears throat> that for some of them, polynomial definitely we can draw an equation. Yeah. Um, for KNN, uh, you cannot have any. We uh, draw, yeah. Does not. So why it is called nonlinear uh, regression? Okay, okay. So <clears throat> when you have a linear regression, you are kind of fitting a line, right? Correct. Correct. When you have a polynomial regression, then you're kind of fitting yeah, okay. But since right. you don't know what will be the optimum order, there can be infinite possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's where mm -hmm. your three parts come in or KNN comes in. So KNN, what does it uh, do? It kinds of, these are the decision boundaries. So for example, if this is a decision boundary or a curve, what does KNN do? It, it separates the segments and if you remember the Voronoi diagram uh, uh, that we saw, uh, I can't really draw that. I think it was something like this. So these were the 
splits done by KNADS neighbors. So all that who are come here are average of this. All that here are here are average of this, average of this, average of this, average of. This. So this, do you see this is a linear uh, boundary? No, right? These have has many split. It's kind of no. a, kind of a curved boundary, right? right. So mm -hmm. that's why. When the boundary is curved, or we uh, we are trying, we are not trying to fit a line, but doing partition. That's that's part of a non-linear regression. Just understand this: you are not kind of fitting a linear relationship between x and y. X and y are not directly a relation, linear relationship. Here, it's not a linear relationship. We didn't fit a single line here. We are fitting, splitting, and all. So, kind, it's a go around. Yeah. You don't when you don't have these things. What you try to do? Use your data and try to split it and see. That's what KNN is doing. That's what decision trees are doing. That's what the random forest is doing. So all these are part of non-linear regression. So, but that you, what you mean is the because the boundary lines are not linear, so it falls into non-linear. Not exactly. Sorted. Not exactly boundary lines. Boundary lines here are linear actually, but. Uh, if you could say that the whole thing, so can you say, can you just, uh, uh, let's say this is y and this is x, can you say y is some a ax plus b? No, right? You cannot say here because no. here, mm -hmm. if you, y, if, yeah, here x, y is an average of all these x, here y is an average of all these x. So I can, I did not fit a line of sort of this, right? I did not fit a line. I it's it's kind of a different approach that I followed. Seeing the data, I am taking an average of the more uh, cl closer uh, data points and taking an average, hoping that my uh, that part is represented by that average. So whenever you're trying to fit a line, that's a linear regression. So Ridge and Lasso, if you remember, Ridge and Lasso had the same form of equation, right? We did not change the form. What we did is we had the score function. Correct. The score function had RMSC for linear regression, but then I introduced the regularization part, right? I did not change the form mm. of the equation. Okay. So Ditch and Lasso still lie as a linear re regression. Okay. But when we do go, go into non-linear regression, so for example, polynomial, KNN, decision trees, these are all trying to fit the data and partition the data space. Okay. So another uh, dumb question. Um, here you have written all this decision tree random forest into one line. Is there any specific region or just wrote yeah, it like that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because these are the different algorithm, right? Okay. SVM can be here. Uh, decision tree, random forest, and boosting. These are all tree based algorithms. Oh, okay. 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 So random forest is an improvement of decision tree. Boosting is an improvement of random forest. That's what. Oh, okay, same category. Okay, yeah, got it. Got it. Called tree So, so, um, so in case if we need to start, uh, then we'll start with the uh, decision tree. If we are getting the good accuracy, we don't have to jump to the next one, right? Something like that. So, okay, now what I would say is start with the linear regression with a ridge or a lasso. If it doesn't okay. go well, then start with mm -hmm. a random forest. And then go mm -hmm. with the boosting. This is for the regression part. This is mainly you should do a regularized linear regression as a first trial. Okay. Then you go to a random forest. Mm -hmm. Take out the uh, important features that we saw. Again, do a random forest and then go. I mean, after the, you have got the features, and then do your boosting. Normally, boosting will give very good accuracies. Boosting is kind of an end point of machine learning. So, there are uh, hyperparameter tuning uh, that, that we saw. So, hyperparameter tuned uh, boosting is very good. Sometimes, I mean, very often it beats deep learning in terms of structured data. Okay, so if you have a structured data of let's say 10,000 or 20,000 points, 
it doesn't really make sense to go for neural networks because neural networks are good for unstructured uh, data but for structured data it's always uh, better to go for boosting so um, uh, there's a algorithm called xg boost read about this okay if you uh, read about this and come back to me with the doubts on this xg boost if you don't understand so it's a very interesting algorithm it it uh, it wins many uh, kaggle com competitions people use this uh, widely the only problem is that it is not very interpretable that's why industries uh, uh, if your boss says that no i don't want to understand boosting it's not very interpretable he may uh, constrain you to random forest but um, boosting is uh, is a very good algorithm to do and uh, okay i'll i'll uh, next class i'll teach you something called ensembling that's not our part of the course but i'll teach you something very in interesting uh, ensembling and stacking these are two uh, methods how you can improve even more of your accuracy ensembling and stacking it's very interesting so in next class i'll teach you uh, just um, remind me that since it's not in our ppt so i'll, I'll i can tend to forget but uh, uh, remind me this so uh and also you can also try svm so xg boost and svm you can try so svm i told you right if there are circular data no algorithm can help you except svm so xg boost and svm is uh, a good combination of uh, algorithms okay so this is what where you finish regression now is there any confusion no i think uh, in this first uh, we'll explain the call um, yeah. Ask, yeah, ask any questions. You may not be. I don't think what is a dumb question or a good question. Yeah. Just ask because. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Two questions I have basically. Sure, sure. sure. A regularized linear regression means just one line. Yeah. First point you have written linear yeah. linear regression. I understand. Huh. The regularized means. Data if that is clustered one place we have to regularize it. No 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 no. Is it am I right now? Uh, or some features you have to drop? Yeah, some features you have to drop, right? So when we said we are uh, doing a regularization, we introduced ridge and lasso, right? So what was ridge doing? It was kind of constraining constraining the coefficients to not to be very high so that it does not overfit. Lasso, what it was doing? It was kind of dropping the unnecessary. Dro dropping them. yeah unnecessary correct so it is trying to prevent overfitting got it and one last question sure. hyperparameters just i want to understand once again okay hyperparameters are parameters which are inputted by the not inputted there's nothing called input uh, input by the uh, user uh, so for example knn knn do you remember 3 5 7 yeah. you know, the number of k was given by the user exactly so did anyone tell you to give 3 or did anyone tell you to to give 7 how were you deciding yeah i think so no someone one, has to give no so no no one will give you no who who has who will come and tell you that there are, you have to use 3 5 or 7 otherwise 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 you have to try by yourself means random number we have to take no not right. random number so what what did cross validation teach you what were you doing in cross validation okay in cross validation we were taking four, four. sorry sunil i lost you i didn't i was not able to hear you come again okay in the cross validation there was a number based on that we were breaking the whole training part and then training and testing and then after that we are going one by one okay so basically cross validation what you are trying to do is you are trying you are inputting 3 5 7 9 11 13 and try to see the yes. accuracies of each right and then according to the highest accuracy you are choosing uh, k KNN of, uh, uh, I mean, K of KNN, right? Correct. So hyperparameters are parameters which are not given by anyone. The user has to 
tweak those and use it to find the best model possible. So if you remember in Boost, no, no. You, we were doing number of trees, max depth, right? So, yeah, now I remember it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other okay. question? I'm very happy that no, you guys are asking uh, questions today. So, I mean, it, it will clear you, clear every concept that uh, you might have missed or, you, or, I mean, there's any confusion if it is left. Okay. So, one, one question. Uh, this yeah. is a little outside. Yeah, yeah. So, this is all the models we have or it is there are other models also? So, uh, I would not say that these are the complete list of models. There are splines. Uh, splines is a part of polynomial regression. So there can be variants of uh, this. So for example, if I have, would have taught you linear regression and never taught you Ridge and Lasso, I might have introduced the regularization concept, but I might not have taught you Ridge and Lasso. So I would say that models do exist like Ridge and Lasso, but it's the same form of linear regression. So there, there are variants of kind of the same. So for boosting, for example, boosting itself has three type of boosting, right? But they all come under the umbrella of boosting. Okay. So there's something called ADA boost. There's something called extreme gradient boost. Then there's called light gradient boost. Okay. So there are three, three or four types of uh, boost that are available, right? But uh, they come under the same concept of boosting. Okay. So that what you're saying is uh, they are all like subset of this. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. This is the main one, and maybe they're a subset inside this form. Correct. 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 Okay. Because I was looking at something, and they were talking about fuzzy logic, all that kind of things. So. Okay. That's what fuzzy I... logic is something different. It doesn't come much into machine learning, right? Fuzzy logic is kind of a simulation uh, algorithm, right? So machine learning uh, will have these concepts. But a fuzzy logic is a concept. It's not a model actually. And it is more kind of used in simulations where the patterns are known. Here you don't have patterns, right? So that's why you're trying to find out the pattern. But when your patterns are known, I think that is used for simulation. I'm not very uh, aware of the uh, fuzzy logic part, but uh, uh, it's not a model for sure. No. But the model will be using it somewhere, right? Yeah, That's what it I'm... may may be using it. Somewhere. Okay. Any more questions? So you mentioned that we start with the regularized linear regression. That means Ridge and Lasso. Um, and then after that, we should go to the uh, random forest and boosting. Um, and then uh, what about the KNN, uh, another thing, mm, those things when, when we should think to apply? Okay. A very good question, I would say. So... Um, Okay, now it, um, if you guys are clear on this, then I'll start on extending some of the uh, important concepts, uh, which I mean are important in modeling. So some, something called stacking. So for example, you have 10 features, okay? X1, X2, X3, X4, X5 extend sometimes what happens is that you have done a lot boosting neural networks everything possible you have done but you're still getting some let's say 75 percent accuracy so what you start to do is you start to engineer new features What does engineer new features means? Apart from the features you, you have, you try to build on new features. How do you, how do you build new features? One, one way would be 
take modifications let's say x3 and x5 you are there let's say can i take x3 by x5 or x3 into x5 or x3 into x5 square or x3 square into x5 right so you can start building okay. on features so for example last time when i last uh, class when we were discussing about lead time and shelf life okay so mm -hmm. if your lead time is greater than shelf life then your expiry probability will be always equal to 1 right that's that's how it uh, mm -hmm. will uh, i mean that's what i know from the business so this feature engineering can be done by uh, business knowledge right so if you understand that what could be the relation between these two so i understand if lt by shelf life so if, if i take lead time divided by shelf life and if it is i do this and then wherever it is less than 1 let's say it's 0.9 or uh, or let's say if it is greater than 1 whenever it's a 2 or 4 then i think i will 100% it will help my model to predict the expiry right but many times you don't know all these things so what you do is you generate new features now how to generate new features what if you don't know all these business knowledge right so what you do is you use simpler models to generate features so for example you have used knn you use knn on all these features that are given and whatever the prediction of knn is you add that as a feature you don't add that as, that as an output because you know knn output will not be very good okay so you add that as a feature so for example Mm. let's let's take this example of uh, that we have been continuing continuing work experience age and what was the third thing i always forget the third one anyways price okay um income well, yeah income so for example you have data on this um you kind of have all the data you have the, all the prices this is your training set now what you do you say that you have tried everything you are not not getting much beyond that so what you try to do is you build price by knn method we have this feature and kind of you use this set whatever set was given apply knn and do do a prediction on this and add this as a feature are you understanding you have the data okay so uh, knn you apply probably knn is in, introduced to add new features that predict the, and yeah, then oh, okay. add the prediction add is not a numerical add append append the prediction to the original data so it kind of gives your model a direction that the your model will know that knn is not the best model to do deal with but knn will give it at least some direction on the sense of what the data is telling okay so this is this process is called stacking now this stacking can be done with any model so for example you can do a price by knn then you can also add by price by decision tree then you can also do a price by boosting okay and then you apply a different model on all these things so it's always used in combination of so one of these uh, thing it's not used standalone is that the right assumption uh that's what I have come across, right? KNN is not very useful in uh, actual modeling, but KNN is very much used in feature generations. Feature generation. Okay. 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 This process is called stacking. Okay. Got. Got. Stacking is a fairly new concept, huh? So I think uh, uh, this is. Uh, you you might be very happy that you are almost 
latest you have the latest updates whatever is going in machine learning stacking is a very new concept so people you know do experiments with models so there's something called ensembling also that i told you ensembling i will not confuse you much so it is basically what happens you have a boosting model and you combine with an svm okay so you have multiple models and you combine the models into one so i'll not deal uh, go into depth of ensembling but stacking uh, since you asked that uh, stacking i introduced okay so okay now th since this is clear uh, we left with class i mean we didn't discuss classification uh, mm -hmm. okay. so classification okay tell me which one we did we started with logistic okay first we did, uh, started with knn knn can be logistic can yeah. can do a classification and logistic can do a classification can then uh, what else knife base decision tree yeah we'll do that a tree based dt random forest boosting okay what else i think svm can also do svm correct amazing what else last last night we learned lda right and uh, yeah i think so that's 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 it that's what we have uh, learned in um, classification so similar question so if we know that this is a classification problem then how should we start uh, which model uh, we should start with and then how to so start with logistic okay go to random forest and then boosting so boosting again okay, will similar thing yeah perform the best in uh, classification problems okay got it similar there we start with linear and then go to the random forest and boostings and here we start with logistic and then go to the random forest and boostings and these can be used and for then this feature generations uh nay base and kn and this can be generated for the feature generation right yeah 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 okay and what about the uh, svm support with svm also okay um, so svm i'm saying uh, uh, said right uh, it's not a bad um, algorithm it's not a weak algorithm it's a very good algorithm very powerful but uh, uh, you it may help you a lot uh, when boosting cannot help so svm uh, you have to always try svm always has to be tried once okay yeah this is uh, really good uh, <laughs> this is the Kind of questions uh, that we had because we have learned so many things. But where yeah, yeah, when no, to I apply, which one to start with? Yeah, understand. Mm -hmm. I understand. Okay. No yeah. Okay. 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 So, thank you. Yeah. No problem. No problem at all. Okay. One more thing I had in mind. Uh, I'm forgetting it. What I wanted to tell you. Hmm. So linked. Okay. Anyways, uh, we can. Just, anyways, I forgot what I wanted to tell you. Anyways, any questions? If uh, if not there, uh, then we can start with just an overview of the project. We'll not uh, do hands-on. So next class, what you can do is uh, do a. Ha Did you guys do that hands-on? What I told that uh, try try that Boston dataset with different hyperparameters of boosting. No, I so not, yeah, not not in detail, but uh, we went through few plotting and other things. Yeah, next class do that. Okay, boosting uh, with uh, cross validation, so that it's a hands-on for you, right? Uh, boosting with cross validation and finding the best number. of trees okay do this for next class anyways so any questions till now so 
So uh, regarding today, we were planning Shwadi, that we will go for a project to work. So yeah. what are we doing exactly in that? So we have a sample data, and uh, I'll show you what uh, uh, the what are the general steps that you should take and how you should proceed. So okay, yeah, okay, I'm waiting. Okay, so uh, if there are no questions, then can we move on to that? So this is kind of a uh, simple problem. Let me show you the data set. Anyways, uh, so I think what we can do is we can see it from here. So these are the lo different loan uh, IDs, uh, and uh, then you have the gender. Uh, then you have whether they are married. Then there are uh, seeing you are seeing the number of dependents. Then you are seeing the education. Then you are seeing whether he or she is self-employed. Then you are seeing the income of the applicant. Then you are seeing the co-applicants. So there are multiple applicants. Uh, you take as a, uh, I mean, if there are multiple in, uh, applicants in the loan, and then the what is the loan amount? Loan amount term. How many months he is taking for credit history? If it is he has defaulted, then zero. If it is not defaulted, then one. Property area, which property he belongs to. Gender, married, uh, prop, prop area. What is this property? I'm not sure about it. Uh, just a second. I'll open the data dictionary. Oh, why it's not opening? Yeah. So this is the uh, data that we have, and uh, let me see. It's not there here. Anyways, so not required. So basically, you want to predict. Uh, this is the X part where the, the predictors based on your ID, uh, based on your uh, these parameters. Uh, you are trying to predict. Let me open the uh, Y. So whether you whether this guy will default in the loan or not. Okay, so this is a typical data set. Okay. Now I'll tell you how to approach some of the methods that we didn't discuss. The modeling part will not discuss because modeling we have already done. So we'll not go into details of what model, why we applied this model, or what all models we applied. This is more of a sample. But you can whatever models we have discussed, you can go on and uh, check the other models also. So you basically this is the reading of the data, and this is the uh, reading of the Y data. Now, uh, 
first part is label encoder now if you remember that a gender for example gender is a categorical variable right so you have to yes, first uh, sorry i have one question so what what is your problem statement whether you will be defaulted or not yeah so where is the default means that's previous right. defaulters that i want to see it. this is your data right this these are the uh, previous default this is the data i think yeah this is the data right where say that based on these thing this is uh, your there uh, was some defaulter yeah just a second where is defaulter this is not this what you are sharing with her this is the training data correct yeah 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 Okay. And where is a target basically in this? Okay, so this is target. Okay. Friend file. That's why it was in a, a white train and it is now here. Okay. Okay, so we will get some new data, gender, married, everything, and we have to decide why. You have to decide whether he will default or not. Okay, so this is your training data. Yeah. Okay. okay. Got it. I'll remove this yeah, because otherwise it will uh, create a mess in my code. Okay. So first, first so, uh, uh, we have we have one one more question. I think me and Sunil were discussing. So when we start with any machine learning, and if we have suppose hundred data, then the training data will be will take the seventy eighty percent as the training data, and the rest twenty percent as the testing data, or it will be otherwise around. Okay. So see. Uh, depends on the business so for example if your business is saying that just give me the model i have a separate test data that i want to want to perform okay so you just give uh, your best model according to cross validation on your ex uh, training data and then ask your business to give the other set of the test data so if you don't have a test mm -hmm. data then do an 80 20 split 80% training and then 20% testing then. correct and do it selected randomly don't select it according to the sort okay Got it. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Now, first of all, is to understand the data features. Have you understood all these features? What do they mean? Except the prop area. Yeah. Prop area, property area. I think that's also clear, right? Uh, yeah, it's urban, right? So it should be fine. Oh, okay. I think I was. Uh, This one, okay. This one is after the encoding. Okay, okay. Yeah, then this is okay. Urban and semi-urban. Okay, this is fine. So, have you understood this? Now, and can anyone credit write? history? How come it can be one and zero? That means that person doesn't have the credit history. You're not, um, you're not measuring it. Um, also, you're measuring it like whether it has more than seven forty, whatever your, um, no, uh, um, what is your threshold value? Something first, like that, right? First time he's taking up a loan. Mm. Oh, okay. Oh, first time taking loan. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Or it can be a threshold value, right? Um, that okay. In the US, generally they have like okay, if you are less than six forty, that means they will not give you loan. Yeah, yeah. Like that that okay. can, that can also be because I I don't have the data dictionary right now. Uh, I thought that it was on that file, but it's not present. So uh, I'll just confirm on what is. There. I think yeah, it's, yeah, it's clear. I think yeah, it's pretty yeah. pretty straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. Quick thing. What is the uh, uh, column? I and J both are loan amount. What is? Can you expand J if you don't mind? This is a loan amount of the uh, term. This is the term, and this is the term. Oh. Okay, fine. Now, can I can I can you tell me one thing? Do you think loan ID is important or unimportant? What do you think? No, that's uh, not important. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. It's a primary key of the table. So whenever you are extracting data from the mm -hmm. database, there will be a primary key that will be associated. You guys know what is primary key? Yes, right. right. Yeah, yeah. So there will be a primary key associated to a um, uh, what do you call uh, a table? So a primary key will never give you any pattern because it is unique for every row and it doesn't have any pattern uh, to it. So it's randomly generated or it may be a sequence. But it doesn't have any sense. So loan ID is not generally not important. So first step is to label encode the uh, categorical variables. So for example, your married, your gender, your education, 
your uh, credit history and your property area these are all um, uh, these are all uh, categorical variables right so you first of all label encoded so your gender you label encode married you label encode property area you label encode label encode as in you convert that into a numeric okay so uh, this is dependent for example if you can see prop area is 2 1 it was earlier urban semi urban so a semi urban has been marked as 1 and urban has been marked as 2 okay so you just kind of encode it in different numerics okay now uh, married also uh, you see married it was uh, um, unmarried married yeah, yeah you just put it 0 1 yeah got it okay because python will not understand uh, yes no it has to understand numerics uh, but got it doesn't mean keep that in mind it doesn't mean that married uh, i mean unmarried minus married is one okay it's one minus zero it yeah you just have to yeah it's uh, uh it just have to uh, have a representation to feed that into yeah. the data okay yeah now so we need uh, two, uh, two questions so what is level encoder so where have you imported this one? So label encoder is, uh, uh, you can see this here, label encoder. So I think it is basically you give a numeric value to a, a unnumeric uh, a string uh, variable, that's it. Correct, correct. So you see it's kind of fitting, uh, no, not fitting, sorry, it is converting the, well, let's say these are the uh, your strings and it is kind of Fitting the or sorry, transforming the string to a numerical variable. Yeah, basically, I want to understand on which basis it will give one, two, three, four. Randomly, whatever it sees first, it will. I mean, it doesn't have any particular algorithm to this, so might be. Okay, okay, that's fine. One. Uh, yeah, it's more like a it, table basically. Look up table. Yeah, look up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Perfect. Perfect. And it doesn't matter also, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. So uh, you have uh, this is a very important step whenever you're dealing with categorical variables. Next is you have to plot each of the variables. So how your applicant income is distributed, co-applicant income is distributed, credit history is categorical. So credit history is let's say uh, you have uh, around 410 observations in uh, yes and uh, uh, credit history uh, around 70 or odd 80 odd observations in no so this is okay uh, uh, 1 is to 4 distribution is not very 25 percent here then 75 percent is there uh, not a very bad one sorry 20 and 80 percent is there it's not a bad uh, distribution now co-applicant income right these are very uh, skewed okay so you see all the applicant income is kind of more skewed towards the uh, less than 1 lakh or somewhere around 10,000 20,000 similarly for the applicant income loan amount is still kind of a, a little less skewed loan amount term is little skewed gender is okay Property area is amazing. It is almost equally distributed. Married is also okay, right? But applicant income and co-applicant income, these need to be, you know, a little bit of transformations need to be there. So I'll show you something called log transformation or um, let's say what I can call box box. So there are some transformations that are, you see, um, if if your if your log normal distribution is like this, after you take a box cost transformation, then it becomes more of normal. So whenever it is skewed, it becomes normal. Okay. So uh, this is kind of important. A box cox transformation you can easily uh, read it from here so whenever you have a skewed data you can always try to type in log transformation yeah, in python and do a log transformation okay 
so that your data is more of Gaussian, okay, and not uh, skewed. So, although I would say that it is not a necessary step uh, for beginners, but it is a good step to follow, okay. So, it might not be. So, I, I am not getting um, by looking into these graphs, a lot of these graphs look similar, right? Um, some of them are kind of a, uh, like a credit history and other things, those are um, kind of two different end, uh, zero versus one. Because these but are application income. These are categories. Yeah, that, that's fine. So I'm not worried about that. Yeah, so I'm worried about this applicant income, co-applicant income, loan amount, um, then a loan amount term. All of these are uh, like that, right? Because there's a one big graph and then all others are very small, small, right? Yeah, yeah. So what is the unique about the applicant income versus loan amount term where you are doing this log transformation of applicant income but not doing for this no, no, loan I'm, amount term? I'm saying for everyone. I'm saying for everyone. I'm just give, I was just giving an example on applicant income. But you have to do it for everyone. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And also, so for example, a person with two, 200,000, this, this guy is an outlier, right? So you have to remove the outlier. Mm -hmm. So you have to remove the outlier uh, because he is more than three standard deviations from your normal distribution right so for you can you have to remove these outliers but uh, that's what i'm saying your it is not a mandate to go for modeling you can do a mo modeling and then go to the required accuracy because there are more, lots lots of algorithms which you know can learn uh, to all these skewed patterns right if everything is normal you will never find a data which is presented you as a normal so for example, boosting, boosting will can take care of all these things uh, in in the modeling, right? So it's not a very important step, but it is a good practice. It's a hygienic practice to you know transform these data into a more suitable. Uh, so you can just read about box box transformation. So these are additional things that I'm telling you. Okay, so these are kind of how to improve better modeling techniques so just read about box box transformation how it does if it if you guys are not clear then we can discuss it next class okay but basically i would want you to read about it then what we do is we kind of a try with start with a decision tree classifier okay then we uh, what we do is we import uh, the accuracy score so here we kind of store our model then we use use the uh, numerical variables to so applicant income, co-applicant income, loan amount, loan amount term, credit history, and form start to form a model. Okay, then you see what is the cross validation score. So cross val score, same model, X train. You use the um, kind of uh, what do you call the um, uh, continuous variables and you add credit history credit history is also there so why we have not used the other variables any idea why what is the question again sorry why my my uh, why i have not used married or prop area um, can you tell me in my modeling approach Because that is only two values, right? We have only two values. That doesn't matter, right? It, uh, categorical variables can have only two values. That is that. Does that mean your categorical variables are useless? So why I have used is because the distribution is almost the same. So whether my property area is zero or one or two, my distribution of the data is quite similar. So I. Visually, I can see my prop area is not very important to my model. Can you, can you? But, uh, but, yeah, but your married is, uh, it's, uh, it's different, right? There yeah. is a big ratio. There, yeah, right? yeah, married is important. So that I, I will use later. I am just giving you an example of how you can take subsets of uh, variables and use it. But why? Would I neglect crop area? That's my question. No, no. See, crop area you are telling basically it is more or less similar, right? There is exactly. uh, what uh, 270, uh, uh, 190, uh, 
so this is around 140 i would say 210 yeah. and it's almost 150 so it's almost equally distributed yeah, yeah but still it makes sense right there is uh, there might be a uh, uh, value in it right there might be value. see it's not 100 matching right it's not 100 equally distributed correct right correct so what i'm trying to say is your visual importance right visual importance will come into picture later when you will see the importance of crop area will be very less when you will see that later okay so it's very important to visualize the data and by my experience i can tell you that this distribution is very very similar so for example you can see visually that it is uh, slightly different but, but from my experience i can already uh, already tell you that crop area is not very useful to this model so a difference of let's say 50 you know total distribution of let's say 500 so 10 percent distribution difference will not make much difference but it doesn't have to be that you neglect that crop area initially already right i'm just telling you by my experience what we can see from the data so if this is uh, kind of similar that means you can completely neglect that if it is almost similar let's say if it is 150 150 150 everywhere then you can neglect that variable straight away so from this property area it means we have only three areas right yeah it's only three years semi urban urban and rural i think so semi urban yeah, because yeah. more or less all actions for time being we are ignoring them yeah so see my modeling here uh, my basic um, objective is to give you all the possible combinations that you can use right because we have already seen how to take all the variables uh, initially and you know, when we were doing a decision classic uh, tree classifier what if if you want to select specific variables and want to do a decision tree classifier okay so that's what that's what my motive is and though these are not similar so you will not never find a very equal distribution data right you will not find 133% 33% 33% never it will happen but if you could see that the distribution is such <coughs> then you, then uh, there might be a uh, thinking possibility that okay if it is equally distributed then it might be not important okay so now what we do is we do a cross validation and apply that model on the specific uh, variables and see the score okay is this clear but i'm still uh, not uh, not 100% satisfied with the uh, uh, the data thing you talked about uh, regarding that uh, property okay 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 neglect that. no neglect that uh, um, don't don't consider that uh, if you uh, are not comfortable with that don't consider that you just feed in all the variables initially okay, okay. So, uh, it's uh, that's what i'm saying it's not a necessary step to do but anyways uh, what was your question that uh, is still uh, is struggling to um, uh, um, no, 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 because it's not about the uh, logic or anything, it's about the data, right? Yeah. Basically, what I'm saying is, say, for example, by my experience, there's a high possibility of rural having default more, right? Correct. If the rural area was more, that means this particular uh, data makes sense for me, right? Correct. But that, that's, that's what I'm saying. Uh, it's a very early stage to just do a distribution analysis it's not you're not kind of uh, neglecting this altogether you're not saying that proper area is you know it should not be taken it's just a visualization it's just an understanding how property area is distributed uh, along your data it's okay it's it's not i'm not saying you to neglect it prop completely i'm okay, just trying to make you visualize how the distribution would look like okay, okay? Now you see the, that your scores, it might also happen that uh, your uh, property area becomes very important. For example, if I take the yes, no conditional distributions on this, then it will might give you a very different picture. So let's say 
or take all the yes and take the distribution of property area and take all the no and take the distribution area in that case in yes i mean in uh, defaults you may see that uh, rural people are more prone to uh, i mean default in no it might be the urban people more prone to so i have not even taken the dis conditional distribution what i am trying to say is property area is kind of uniformly distributed so there is a high chance that this is not very important in your uh, data there is a chance but it might not be the case it i have not done the conditional uh, uh, distribution do you understand what i am trying to say now conditional distribution i got it yeah i got it yeah yeah okay so the, uh, then we have a score okay now what i do is sorry uh then i take uh just a second yeah i take the same uh, model and then i what i initially what i had was i had the decision tree classified according to the uh, a general uh, accuracy metrics now i want the entropy so you remember when we were discussing gini index and entropy so entropy is kind of similar what gini index would we describe right so we do the same thing and kind of uh, the same variables and you fit the model and you see that uh, the there's ac accuracy has improved do you, can you can anyone say why it has happened why your entropy has improved because the we just have in, uh, introduced the criterion right we have not done anything else can anyone answer okay so when we don't specify the criterion then they, it takes into consider consideration the accuracy but when we take the criterion as entropy it kind of takes into consideration the probabilities of distribution right what we discussed in gini index how your every cut is kind of helping you to understand the distribution and that way the uh, the sequence of the variables that are taken for the decision tree cuts changes do you are you following are you following this statement yeah uh sunil uh, sharad any uh, yes. did you follow this statement can you repeat it i yeah yeah okay no i didn't yeah so do you remember when we took the decision tree and you were we were cutting across the decision tree and uh, we remember we had to see the probability distributions on the left side there was a probability mm -hmm. distribution on the right side there was a probability distribution and then we were calculating right. the gini index and then we were calculating whether this cut was very important or cut, the cut was not important do you remember now mm -hmm. correct or no yeah no no, no. that's fine okay so if you remember that so in that case what we what it was doing it was deciding that the first variable will be decided when the gini index drops to the maximum i mean the uh, highest decrease in gini index it was deciding which variable to put at the top of the decision tree uh, cut remember age greater than 40 Correct. was the first variable then we had work ex then we had income how did we say that age was a first variable why didn't income go because we were saying that with the cut of the age i would see the maximum drop of gini index mm -hmm. and yeah i think now it makes sense yeah. yeah so now basically what you're saying is the applicate the first first run it took in the order of what we gave the second run it's taking based on the gini index that's what you're saying right correct 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 so in the first time it didn't take in the order it would take in a 
what whatever the criterion is uh, default i think the criterion uh, default criterion is accuracy so it was testing the accuracy but i i did i say that a class accuracy is not a good measure in terms of classification because we are doing a classification problem right yes or no and i said that accuracy is not the, not a very good measure to build your decision tree in a case of classification because there can be true positives true negatives do you remember that confusion matrix that we draw a do i i vaguely remember sorry <laughs> yeah so that see that's why i'm saying the theory part is very important so when we go guys go through all these things the, that's where that important picture comes in so why did criteria uh, changing to entropy change your accuracy by almost 2% i mean 2 of total um so it from 0.71 to 0.73 right so because your criterion now entropy does a better uh, decision tree builder than what your default criterion is which is accuracy okay is this clear yes yeah let's no, go ahead then okay yeah. now this is what you do for a min max scalar okay so for example uh, do you remember the min max scalar the min max scalar was uh, when we were dividing the number uh, by the range maximum min minus minimum Okay, I think we have to go back to the slides. Which week was it? I think. Yeah, if you can basically, sorry, if you can basically have it parallelly to show us, that will basically give us an idea. Sorry. Yeah. Too much. Okay. Okay. No problem. <laughs> But the problem is that we have to search where it was. Uh... Yeah. This one. Hey, Suvadi, so you can. yeah okay otherwise you can let us know that was very simple concept yeah yeah this this one is was min max scalar so what it was doing it was kind of scaling the data remember scaling the data yeah yeah we remember now yeah okay so you do a min max scalar how on which data you can do a min max scalar continuous variable right you cannot do uh, a min max scaling on a categorical variable so take all the uh, min max scalar on the this thing and uh, so if i do a credit history if i do it a uh, uh, min max scalar it will not change anything okay but uh, it will change for applicant income co applicant income loan amount loan amount term okay now you see how your score has changed are you following it yeah quick question you were telling about the logarithm tick uh, this thing right where did you use that one so for the co yeah yeah applicant yes. income and co applicant income yeah yeah you were trying to use the logarithm tick this thing right yeah, yeah. distribution so so i have not used it i was stating all the possibilities that you can do oh. yeah yeah okay i have not used it here i was just stating the possibilities that you can uh, so that 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 comes into a part of more advanced modeling right so when you do a more advanced modeling when you are uh, trying to you know go by inch and inch of that accuracy then you go go and or do all those things when you take a box cox transformation or a log transformation to make your data more normal okay no but i i, I was under the impression because after seeing the visualization to tell decide on what what you have to do with the data yeah it's yeah. not like that so see if if your data is like this it, it does not necessarily mean that you'll fit always fit a bad model there are uh, models which can go around this what i'm trying to give you here here is a taste of how you should proceed but since uh, we have done a lot and you guys are understanding that's why i gave you a flavor of what you can do also so for example you can take the same code and apply a box cross transformation and then do a decision tree classifier and see the difference of the results okay got it got it okay okay no okay okay now you do a k nearest neighbors and i have fixed the nearest neighbors equal to 5 
and uh, let's see what is the score see it is so poor it is 0.664 so that's why kenyan's neighbor is not a very good model uh, sorry this one is a 0.65 for the n equal to 5 and uh, 0.66 for uh, n equal to 10 so it it it, it does not um, you know help kenyan does not help, help uh, in prediction that much and a simple decision tree helped uh, i mean was better than a kenyan paper are you guys following yes 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 yeah go ahead okay. now see how if i change my nearest neighbors from 2 to 40 how my scores are varying so after this point it comes it's still not good yeah it's it becomes saturated it doesn't uh you know change much okay okay so now you see uh what i did is the first neighbors i am keeping the default and next one what i am doing is i am keeping the weights as distances okay now for example when we have were building a knn we didn't discuss this so what what we were doing in a knn model we were taking the distances from the uh, points and we were kind of uh, finding the closest neighbors and taking an average or the majority voting of those neighbors right correct yeah that's correct yes yeah. okay now there is something called a weights weights so you give more weightage so for example there are three three uh, points which are close uh, close to you but each point will have a weightage so the closest point will have the highest weightage the second point will have the second highest weightage and the third point will have the least weightage according to the distance so here when we have, when i have input weights equal to distance it means i am giving more weightage to the point which are closer to me or vis a vis the points which are farther to me so when i was i took k nearest neighbor equal to 5 and i had five data points i gave equal weightage and i took the majority vote of equal uh but when i have k n equal to 5 and i took the majority vote for the uh, uh according to the distance so i take the majority vote of the for example if some first one has voted yes okay a second one has also voted yes although the third point third third uh, fourth fifth had voted no i will take still take the yes as the answer because there are if there are much closer to me okay so that the algorithm will itself decide on its own whether to take i mean cancel the majority voting and take into consideration these people or i should go with the later ones also did you understand it sure 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 subodeep uh, you mean to say if i am the center and uh, there are three points at distance one means first nearest second nearest and third nearest correct this time we are seeing their distance actually how far point one is from me not as like what the three correct is it awesome yes so we are not just seeing top five points we are also considering their ranking and their distance actual distance okay yeah is it clear to everyone yeah yeah so this will yeah. make much more sense when you are doing a regression so when you are doing a regression and you take an average um if you keep your weights as distance then you do a weighted average okay so you give more weightage to the value of which is closer to you than to the value which is farther from you does this make sense now yeah so one question so if i have yeah so it might be possible after giving this weightage yeah my score can go down that can be case that can go so, yeah. but with 
yeah, that can we uh, timing we can assume. Yeah, yeah. So in this case, if it is going down, which one will be better for us? How can we say? Earlier we have seen 0.73, and here it comes around 65 or 70. But now weight is that is a very good thing we have included. See, so although slowly, our score is going down, if you're see if you're yeah, it's, it's kind of stop, trying, yeah. it will slowly converge yeah. because. If you have 40 data points, then your clo uh, closer data points will always give the more weightage, and slowly it will converge to what you are initially using, right? But if you see yeah. the initial ones, you see there's a huge difference. One is 0.63, one is 0.64. Then one is 0.68, the other is 0.64 again. Sometimes it is higher also, uh, like uh, this one. 0.59, this is 0.54. So when you have four nearest neighbors, and you take the weightage, weightage, then it is higher than what if you don't take the weightage. So you have to see your algorithm's performance. You cannot uh, judge it directly from. Okay. Process. Yeah. The other question I have: uh, the <coughs> the distance you are telling is the nearest. Uh, uh, you're giving more weightage to the nearest point, right? Yeah. Yeah. So suppose if I want to do the other way around, if I want to give uh, weightage to the farthest point. For no, no, you cannot do that because it doesn't make sense. Your nearest k nearest neighbors mean that you want to give weightage to the nearest, uh, nearest points. Okay. That's you're taking top three points nearest to you. Oh, okay. Okay. So there's no use case of telling okay the farthest point I'll give no, no, weightage no, or something. No, no. You can go in the package backend and change your rating function but that is not uh, a use case normally that no one can does that okay okay Ashuri, one question here so assuming i have solved this one but my manager asked the term um, how long it's the uh, long term is that is very important on the top priority for us no no i didn't understand if you manage so in, what? okay uh, okay so time being we have application income applico applicant loan term loan amount all these are of equal weightage for us okay means every from our side priority is one for every as for example in uh, do you remember that uh, decision tree temperature then no, no, humidity Sunil, then something else temperature problem. can be the first criteria for me you yeah wait wait you're talking about the the weighted distance and kenius neighbors you're saying that uh, in uh, basically in decision tree we the priority can be changed for you and another thing can be first priority for me okay as like humidity can be the first priority mm -hmm. but for you temperature can be the first priority so that's why random forest comes into picture now that's why it takes into consideration okay all uh, the priorities all the variables uh, and its top priorities okay no i didn't get your question so you're saying that uh, uh, my question my, my question is here basically uh, applicant income co-applicant income loan amount loan term mm -hmm. these are all equal weightage we have given Correct. And we have asked random for us to decide yourself. Yeah. What you do. So my question is here: assuming loan term, uh, which varies up to 240, but 200, if this is good for me, is that in the case or not? I want to understand. So I want to. You to cannot. Uh, extra weightage. Yeah. No, you cannot do. I mean. Try to. This is manipulating your data, right? If your data does not say. Yeah, I'm manipulating. Yeah, if your data does not say that this is of more higher priority, then you cannot, should not forcefully tell it to this to be for your first priority, right? That is not a good practice to do. Let your data tell, no? Uh, okay, I got, uh, I got my answer. It is in the, yeah, in that case, basically first I have to manipulate my data, then I have to feed the model. Yeah, exactly. If that is the case. Yeah. I, yeah, I got it. Okay, the third case is um, you change the algorithm. So there's something called a brute force algorithm. Uh, don't go by that. Mm -hmm. It will uh, is not much important. 
now let's see logistic regression how logistic regression you know, improves your accuracy you see how oh it oh my god 80% hmm. okay okay now i change the solver so logistic regression has different types of solvers we come to that i'll show you the hyperparameter what it so it doesn't didn't change, change much it's almost the same it was 0.806 and it is 0.08 so what we have changed is a solver i'll just tell you what a solver is okay now let's see after scaling how it improves okay so after scaling you see it doesn't uh, change that much can you say can you say why uh, knn changed with the uh, scaling uh, but logistic regression did not change in change with the scaling Okay, was it logistic regression? Which one did change uh, after scaling? Yeah. Uh, decision tree. Ha, huh? yeah. Decision tree changed after scaling, but logistic regression didn't change much after scaling. Why? Any answer? Can you give me the definition of scaling? You the morning only told just to. So mm, the min-max scalar we have, this is scaling only. Oh, the min-max scaling. Okay, okay. We uh, here we have done uh, just a second. Yeah, here, here also we have used the function scale. Scale, I think scale also does a uh, min max scale. I just let's just see. Let's see. I uh, know scale. I think does a uh, normal uh, scaling. We just let's see scale in Python. Yeah, uh, I got it. So. I'll just uh, just think of this as a min max scalar for right now, and just tell me how uh, do you think this min max scalar would help in um, decision tree and did not help in logistic uh, regression. The decision tree is the nearest point. Basically, you're basically finding the min and max within the cluster, right? But logistic, there's no kind of a cluster, right? No, no decision that... tree. Uh, min max of the cluster. I didn't get what you were saying. Decision tree is so, the algorithm which does does a division on different uh, parameters and yeah, it's a uh, okay. I, I'll tell the answer. So when decision tree is kind of uh, doing the classification or uh, doing the cutting across the different uh, variables, if the variables are not scaled. The variable which is high in magnitude will always be above than uh, the variable which is low in magnitude, because the variance in that will be much higher compared to the variance in the, the variables which are lower in magnitude. So, for example, if something is in centimeters and something is in kilometers, the kilometers will always be on a higher in a higher uh, spot in decision tree because there's a lot of variation. In kilometers, but centimeters will be here and there, right? So if you remember your standard deviation, how it your standard deviation changes? Remember from our first class, if you multiply all the way, uh, number by two, how your standard deviation changes? Yeah, this there's a change in the standard deviation, right? Correct. So when you're having a higher scale of uh, higher scale of variables. The variables which have higher magnitude will always be at the top. So decision tree gets confused since it says it thinks since it's a higher in magnitude, it is more important. But that may not not necessarily be the uh, condition. 
right the real condition could be reversed so that's why decision tree we need to scale the variables when we are using a decision tree but logistic regression doesn't have to be right the logistic regression can adjust the coefficient beta with respect to x so if your x is 100 times higher then your beta will be 100 times lower right it it will adjust the coefficient according to the x are you getting my point okay got it got it. so but, but the one thing you told in the uh, previous classes was the uh, the measure right the unit of measure should be the same right should convert it into the same measure yeah that's an ideal practice you should follow Mm -hmm. Right. In that case, uh, uh, if if the unit of measure is the same in no, no, no. this case, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not unit of measure. It's you should have all unitless. So when you're doing a scaling, mm -hmm. everything is yeah, unitless. Yeah. It's not unit of measure. So if it is in kilometers okay. and centimeters, you don't need to convert the centimeters to kilometer. You make everything unitless. And how you can make that unitless is you can do a min max scaling or you can do a scale. Now scale is very easy. Um, instead of min max scaling where you're doing an x minus min upon max minus min you just do a x minus mu divided by the standard deviation that is called scaling okay Shadad, uh, uh is this okay i'm not hearing you much no it's no it's uh, sorry no no it's okay yeah perfect Please let me know if it is if there's any uh, even speck of doubt, just let me know so that because see now you might have realized how your theory is related to all the modeling, right? So your theory comes first. Everything comes later. Your theory comes first. So everything that we are doing is related to what we learned in our first class. Even that's why I I, I would understand if you have, would have forgotten in the previous classes. So that's why it's very important to revise right now. So uh, I have a question. Um, so in the morning you mentioned that uh, first we need to start any model with the, uh, this is a classification problem, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So logistic regression, then move to the decision tree and other thing. But you started other way around. You started with decision tree and now going to the logistic regression. Yeah, yeah. so see, uh, th that's what I know. It's, this is someone else has given some of part of his code. Um, I have appended. So it's not the sequence that you should follow. What I told is, you can do a logistic regression and then go for a decision tree. If you do a decision tree and a go for a logistic regression, it will not make your model different. It's the sequence you should follow. Right now, I've just kept uh, differently in a different because these are different fragments that we have concatenated. So don't un understand the sequence of modeling. Whatever I've written in that iPad, always follow that. This is for a more of an illustration okay. purpose. And anyways, you have to see decision tree and logistic regression and random force and take the best of it, right? So anyways, you have to do. Okay. 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 So okay. But okay. If you, yeah, but if you get <clears throat> so kind of accuracy, what we are looking for is in the 90% range, right? So as soon as we started getting that, we'll say, okay, this is the best model, something like that, and then we'll drop the ball. It, it might not be key 90% is a benchmark. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it, it might be that even, so whatever I'm- 70% or whatever. What I'm telling you that uh, your transformations are required. So if you do a transformation, your accuracy might improve. A, a problem which has 65 accuracy percent accuracy in a linear regression. Did you do you remember the Boston data set? It was 50 percent in linear regression. Uh, Lasso it was around 48 or 50. Boosting it went up to 88 percent, and we did not do any data cleansing. Right. So it's not. There's no particular benchmark that a model you can. I mean, there are small, small things that you need to change to improve your model. But if you want to understand the best model, boosting has the highest probability to give you the best model. So always end your model with boosting. Okay. <coughs> okay. Oh. okay. So we have understood. So if, if you think boosting will give the best model, then why don't we directly go to boosting? Okay. <laughs> so what I, what I what I told you is you never know the God's function. If your God's function is linear, then your boosting will not give uh, your uh, best accuracy. Your linear regression is will give you best accuracy. Best accuracy. Yeah. So <clears throat> you remember first class I said something called Occam's razor. 
Occam's razor is a statistical, uh, I mean, theory or a concept. Every modeler should start with a simple model and then go on to. So, for example, you're boosting. Let's say if your God's function is linear and you do a boosting, you might end up in a very good training accuracy, very good training accuracy. Even a cross validation accuracy may be very good. But if another data point comes up, and you try to do a linear regression or sorry a boosting you'll go very uh, way off than what it was a linear regression for example let me give you an example <clears throat> when i when i I'm, I'm doing a forecasting project for my company right so for uh, more uh, normally uh, uh let's say a product historical sales it is very kind of a sinusoidal graph okay up down up down up down up down spikes okay not very smooth spikes now if i do a boosting on it it will try to fit everything the up ones down ones up ones down ones so my training will be very small my training will be almost accuracy or almost let's say 90 percent but the reality is those are noises okay so those are noises because someone is doing a promotion someone is doing pushing the sales what my actual uh, uh, forecast should be it should be kind of an average line that cuts across so when i forecast that an average line my um, uh, my error uh, my accuracy comes up to 70 percent in the future if i do the xz boost and try to forecast my accuracy drops to 30 percent realize but my training accuracy even my cross validation accuracy was very good so it's always better to you know start with the see if your cross validation is accuracy is good in boosting and it's worse in uh, linear regression then you actually can't do anything and go but, but but go by the boosting but you should always have all the models ready and you should always proceed in that sense don't ever think that i've learned neural networks so always every problem has to be solved by neural networks never is the case neural net networks will never work if it is your data is very small and structured if it is structured well then neural networks will never work better than boosting. So every model is important. That's why still now any course you enter in data science, they'll always start with linear regression. Any course, be it your course era, you start with the data camp, you start with anything, it will always start with linear regression and then go on to boosting. That's how everything proceeds. Okay, so I think uh, this is also okay. Instead of a scaling, uh, X minus mu by sigma. I did a min max scalar and check. So it's you, you see it's almost the same uh, And it doesn't uh, so logistic regression is not um, Helping I mean the scaling part is not helping much in the logistic regression. Okay So uh, one quick uh, So you hear the code right your written log dot logistic regression solver Newton See what that means yeah, Newton CG, I'll tell you what that solver means. I'll get back to you. I will, I'll show you rather on. So, um, yeah, so basically I've told you uh, how to uh, do the logistic regression, how to do a decision tree. Now your homework for next week, and I would check. I would see, would want you to fit a gradient boost on these features okay whatever i've used i'll send over the code and i would want you to fit a gradient boost on these features and let me know how uh, it comes because i would not want to do every uh, model for you then so now see uh, you are asking me something like uh, so here uh, krishna now you see when i add the prop area here can you see here so without the prop area, my uh, accuracy was 0 0.808. With the prop area, my accuracy is 0 0.806. So it has kind of decreased. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. It's not mandatory that this distribution is kind of doesn't give you the right picture. Uh, I mean, sorry, gives you the right picture but it gives you a fair bit of idea. And if you do a conditional distribution, then it will always give you the best idea. So if you do a conditional distribution, let's say on yes, 
you see the prop area distribution and in no you see the prop area distribution and then compare then it will make sense so what essentially your answer would be in rural area right in rural area people are buying or let's say taking loan very small amounts in urban area people might take loans in big amounts but not fail but uh, in rural area you have might have a tendency that you might have see that in rural area people are more prone to fail but they are also taking less loan amounts and that's why the company is also strict in their documentation and that's why the uh, default default is very low so when you know uh, that this uh, this kid is weak or when you for example you uh, you're a professor and you know that this kid is weak you going to pay extra attention to that kid so that to ensure uh, that uh, he doesn't fail if you see the uh, history of failures spoiled brats will be more prone to failure than poor uh, children poor children are more serious they know that they have lots of uh, thing to lose if they let, uh, they may not pay the loan that's why uh, they will pay and that's why the the rules are more stringent for them that if he comes from rural area uh, then your uh, you know his documentation should be very strong his his credit uh, limit should be sm smaller than people who has so if you compare uh, farmer loans and vijay malya <laughs> so vijay malya has committed a huge uh, um, this thing default compared to what farmers do right so it's it's kind of the data what it, it should tell you it's not what your hunch that's why we are learning machine learning right if everything your hunch can tell you or your experience can tell you then you don't need machine learning you can always tell that but it's where it is very important to understand uh, how machine learning will help to you know improve your uh, this thing does that answer does that satisfy you with the question i'm i'm I absolutely with you yeah. that it may not be the case every time right it's just not yeah, you cannot say that distribution will you know you see if you add married also then you're also your accuracy doesn't change much it's almost like the same my only concern is uh, uh, sometime in the business we know okay this particular future or the parameter has a uh, will, is is really important in the decision making right yeah. so and the machine learning tells that okay that is not the case that's where the conflict comes in yeah right so i have answer for that so when when i see the data for example uh, let's see the data once okay so for example if you take the rural area for people and uh, you know uh, let's say um just a second let's say you have a, another column uh, strictness of documentation okay you have not gathered the data but you have something called strict and documentation and on the scale of 10 you would see that for rural areas the strictness of documentation is 10 okay so that way you will understand that when people are rural, uh, coming from rural area the bank is kind of churning out a documentation which is much more strict than the people of urban that that's where your business insight comes in it's a combination of these two features that results in your default not just the sole features of property area right that's why your data collection becomes very important there is some confounding you remember that example when i gave you shark sales are depend sorry shark attacks are dependent on the ice cream sales it's kind of the same example you are saying that the rural area is more prone to default but there is a confounding strictness of documentation for which your data is you have not collected right and uh, the combination of these two things are actually leading to you know the default prediction but again i am not saying that adding that will not be of value we have to check you have to check every time you have to add all the variables it is always good to go in uh select all and then cut out from the rest than to start with the subset i would if you would ask me personally if i would start this uh, data on my own 
I would always take all the variables together and then do a feature selection and then go on to a difference. It might also come that addition of this may have may be important, but I have not seen that. So that's why it is always better to start with uh, all the features and not a subset. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Uh, what is your homework you ask gradient descent to use? What is the exact question which we have taken as homework? Oh, uh, homework. Homework will be apply the gradient boost model on this, this data. I mean this data, whatever we are seeing. I'll send you the data. I'll send you the okay. code. You just have to apply gradient boost. And Krishna, one more thing. Uh, so I knew this feature was not adding value. That's why I could back interpret this. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 So as a starter, you may not be able to tell this directly because you never knew this accuracy, right? So don't get me uh, wrong there that I, I always say that this distribution should be neglected. Always start with that and it's always better to see the conditional distribution. It might be that the conditional distribution is different. Okay. But since I knew this accuracy, I could interpret this uh, in a better way. So, so in the case of conditional distribution, if you want, we have to basically break down the data, then do the process or is, is no, there no. a way in Python to you basically can, you, break it? You can do it directly. You can do it directly. In Python itself? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And that will make much more sense than what this, what it does here. Okay. So um, it might be the case that you are true. You are correct. Okay. Uh, it, so uh, the conditional distribution will make much more sense than what it does on an overall. Yeah. Okay. So uh, any questions, Mos, uh, or otherwise we can will close today. Uh, Five minutes. Uh, not related. Sorry. Okay. Uh, not related to this project, but uh, in clustering related. Clustering. So suppose, yeah, clustering related project we have got. I uh, mean, in that case, we learned K mean basically, where all things are depending on the distance basically. Yeah. We selected some point and we got the distance, went to the average and created that. Yeah. So assuming we have got take documents text documents okay uh, yeah text documents uh, one can be related with your science one can be related with your history geography and other things so in that case first as i think so we need to model in such a way that we can get the distance am i right yeah so next if, class, how will we proceed next exactly class, we will have a detailed discussion on natural language processing and i will uh, once we do this, this question will be answered. So we are going to do the same thing that you told, how to classify documentation, I mean, uh, text docu documentation, and understand how words can be translated to numbers. It's a process called word embedding, where you translate the words. It's not that A is 1 and Z is 26. It's not that. It's a uh, mode of scientific. It's kind of creating vectors from words out of the documents, and we'll understand how we can do that and convert the words into numbers and it's NLP is very interesting. My kind of my uh, my research is in NLP. So I can provide you a lot of um, details about NLP. I can also tell you how to combine deep learning and NLP. So my research is in natural language processing. So how we can combine deep learning and NLP. So if you guys are interested in that, we can we will launch a course that combines deep learning and NLP into a six uh, week course. We, I have to discuss uh, discuss with Ashok. Uh, I mean, when we can start that, but that is very interesting, and you might be uh, very surprised in how natural language processing can, you know, uh, give you amazing insights which numbers can can't tell. So all the Amazon recommendations, Amazon reviews. Amazon is 
or Walmart. No, sorry, Amazon. Amazon has a website. Um, I mean, Amazon's website, Netflix. Netflix is dependent on text processing. Amazon reviews and recommendations are used for its uh, filter, uh, collaborative filtering. A lot of applications are there for natural language processing and deep learning. Natural language also uses uh, text, the visual, visual uh, image processing also is a natural thing. No, no, image, image processing is different. Uh, image processing is different. Text processing is different. Voice to text is different, and uh, deep learning is different. So no. deep learning is kind of a machine learning on all these things: videos, uh, uh, text, uh, your image. So deep learning has improved uh, the accuracies of these type of problems to, uh, I mean, to multifolds, and that's why all the CD or the Google Assistant and whatever Windows, uh, what does Windows call it? The, I think I have this. What is called Cortana? Cortana. Cortana. Could you repeat this? Could you repeat this statement once again? It means uh, natural language. Processing versus deep learning processing, so NLP versus uh, deep learning. Deep learning. Is, um, okay, how can I say? Uh, deep learning is a method. Okay, it's not a processing. It's a method. NLP is how to change the numbers in uh, sorry how to change text into numbers, and deep learning will apply the methods, machine learning methods on those numbers. Kind of, if you could say that. Okay. Oh, okay, it means if someone is saying that I know deep learning, it means he will be knowing first NLP. No, no, then he will be knowing the not necessary. Not necessary. Deep learning can also be applied on image processing. Deep learning can also be applied on Boston data set. Deep learning can also be applied on videos. So deep learning is a method. NLP is just a way of you know converting text to numbers or understanding text. Oh, okay. So I mean to say, in market, it's very high for deep learning, but it's not heard about this one NLP thing. What does this mean? NLP is not so much widely required. No, NLP is more research. Uh, right now, NLP is more in a research phase. People are trying best, better methods to, you know, uh, uh, better algorithms of NLP. But it, uh, no one has said that NLP is. Uh, you know, not uh, used so much in the market. It depends on my my friend who was in Walmart as a statistical analyst. His whole day he is doing natural language processing. Walmart's um, it's a multi million dollar project on NLP. So no one says NLP is not there in the market. It's up to what your business requires, right? Yes, and that thing we don't know. Sorry. So we are exploring. Okay. Uh, I need to say, as for example, to understand deep learning, machine learning basics, at least that is required. Of course, of course. In such a way, no deep. In no, such a way, I it, can tell that I don't know linear regression. I mean, he will not never ever be able to understand deep learning without machine learning. Exactly. So in such a way, is knowing NLP is required for deep learning or not? No, 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 not required. Uh, okay. So uh, okay, so Deep. Uh, other than that, uh, related to this project, I have one question. Yeah. Just you visualize all these things over this bar chart. Correct. So, uh, what about distribution? Do we need to uh, draw a line and show the distributions, or only this type of diagram that will be enough in real projects? No, see, visualize dependent on your taste, whatever you want. Python is not a tool for visualization. First of all. Python is not something which you want to create dashboards or you want to show. It can create histograms. It can create pie chart. A part, uh, sorry, pie chart. It can create you know bar chart. It can do some very basic Excel stuff, but it's not for visualization, creating beautiful slides or something. It's more of the for the model to, modeler to understand the data or to understand the distribution. It's not for you to present your manager. Okay. If you would want uh, to present something big uh, or create dashboards, so Python has to be connected to Tableau. Tableau is a visualization software. So Python is not meant for visualization. It's more of data analysis or data modeling. Okay, so it's not there to create beautiful graphs. But 
it will serve okay. you it can you know fit mat plot lib or then there is one more uh, i'm forgetting the package name uh just a second one package uh, p just a second Okay. I'll come back with the name. I I don't have uh, that name. What was it called? So this is this is the type of visualizations you can do: a violin plot, a box plot, a bar chart, a line chart, a stack column, scatter plot, bubble plot, pie chart, and then a heat map. Over here again. Yeah. So these are the basic. Uh, but they don't look so good right not very attractive but it helps you to understand the you know, how the data is there. but there's one uh, i'm forgetting the name pro uh Anyways, uh, yeah, bouquet, 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 bouquet is a document uh, uh, package that creates a little, yeah, interactive data visualization using bouquet. See, this will, you can go through this. Uh, it creates good graphs. Just a second. So this is even interactive, I guess. So. <laughs> So my my question is so we we basically figure out which model to use uh, all that right yeah. so once that is figured how is it being used with the application application as an end to end application yeah so so let us say in this case right in our example we have this low default all that right Correct. so this is a sample set we take it we we figure out okay this model is the best then we tell okay uh, we tested with the test data everything looks good so we have this package now right yeah so how is this going to be integrated with the business now okay so now you have this uh, it, it, if you don't want to give the user you don't have any user interface you can have this as a backend model okay so now for example uh, you have trained your model now so for example my friends in mastercard they were using such kind of a uh, model no not in mastercard in other yes bank yeah in yes bank yes bank is a indian bank i don't know if you do have it in us so yes bank so they had this model so now if any per person uh, it was not just these features there were many other features also it's not was restricted not just with these features so now let's say a new user comes you fill in this feature then it will the user will sorry the model will tell you whether this person is likely to default yes or no if the model says if it is he is likely to default then you either you don't give him the loan at all or you charge him higher interest rates okay so that's how your business uh, will use it or if you say that he is too likely to default then you never give him the more so it will save save you uh, the i mean uh, if if someone defaults right there's a huge loss to the bank right so either you take him take more uh, what you call the security and i forget the term which is used in uh, this thing kind of a more uh, anyway see so you ask that person to it also come, keep more it also comes uh, as like a, a risk analysis type of thing basically no, so this is, this generally is, paypal or this type of companies sure they are using There were different module, basically which exposes the REST API, where you have to give all this type of data based on that you can query your next questions. Uh, yeah, no. What, Am I right? What he's saying is, uh, now do you have this model? How will the business use it? So the business will use it. For example, I come to you. Uh, for example, you run a bank. I come to you. I Fill in all these things, and you see, my your model is telling me that I am a person who is uh, more prone to default in the loan. Okay, so you 
you have two three options you can increase my interest rates other thing other than that you can ask me to keep a more higher value so for example i have kept my house as a security to you or let's say i keep my car as a security for you you may ask me to keep up my house because you say that your car is not equivalent to the value that you are asking for the loan i i want more leverage so you ask me to keep uh, my house as a leverage so these things will help you so for example imagine if kingfisher uh, sorry if your state bank or your uh, state bank had would have been able to predict that vijay malna is going to default in let's say 2 3 years then i think state bank will be in a different position right now it has lost 9000 crores it's a big thing but these are more dynamic problems so vijay malna that time he was good right now he has lost all his companies and all so more and more complex models also involve the dimension of time right so how your time with yeah. your time the user is kind of behaving but yeah that 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 is what you're saying is once the model tells you tells the business okay this particular person is going to default you're taking a business decision right yeah that's fine but your model itself is to say 90% accurate right Yeah, yeah. There's no model with 100% accuracy, right? Correct. So you're telling 90% accurate. There's this 10% which is, which might be a good, good business which we are going to lose, or a bad business which we are going to keep. Correct, correct. So see that that thing that kind of, uh, uh, I mean that kind of contingencies will be there. At least you have reached 90%. Earlier you never know. Earlier you were giving blindly, right? You were not even doing anything. right now you have at least 90% sure that who and then that's why your confidence comes into picture right so if you're 90% sure that 95% times you will be uh, 90% accurate accurate then it's good you can at least take a chance on 10% right but otherwise uh, and of course your model will tell you if it is let's say 100% sure that this person is going to default it's likely that it will that it is uh, not that it is likely that he is correct but if your model let's say let's 60% sure that this person is going to default then you have some doubt he can be here or there then you have that element of doubt but if your model is telling that he is going to default 100% then there are chances that you uh, you were model is not wrong that much in certain no, case, no, but see that we are not doing in this case right this is yes or no right kind of answer no no it, it logistic regression will give you probabilities right it will just not give you yes oh, okay it will always give you every classification problem will give you probabilities that's why what we oh. discussed right every oh. yes or no is dependent on the threshold so your default threshold is 0.5 everything above 0.5 is yes everything below 0.5 is less but it can be your business decision if you are a risk taker then let's keep at 0.2 if you are a uh, more risk averse then you keep it at 0.8 right so accordingly you can adjust your threshold so and the other question is how do you use this in a, a data warehousing kind of in, environment like you are talking about tableaus right yeah so integrate it with, see there's two two options right one i get uh, like a transactional data which i feed to this particular uh, uh, package and it it's going to give me an answer yes or no or a percentage of yeah. default right mm-hmm. the other thing is how do i integrate this to a a, a data warehousing kind of solution where uh, i can make decision from there okay so python can has this uh, amazing uh, capacity to be connected to uh, back end it can for example i have connected in my uh in my um office my data warehouse is in sap hana okay so my python is connected to sap hana i get the transactional data flowing from there i give my uh predictions and then i visualize it in tableau so i have an end to end picture to it so so can i basically tell okay this is my predicted data yeah. right as a column and this is my actual data and what is the difference is that how you predict or uh no uh, so it depends on uh, for business to business so for example i what i try to show is uh, i mean uh, what i try to visualize is how will my expiry of slob be affected with time so with time how will be my 
a probability of expiry change from let's say one month to two months to three months that's what i show you could be oh, using okay. using in a different sense for example in banks you could be seeing uh, for example these things you could show that uh, these are the important variables if you can change for example your loan amount if you drop it to like what i discussed with sunil last time that if you change loan amount by x percentage can that person come back to the not default category and you can just disperse that amount so for example if someone is asking for 200000 and you say that this person is going to default by 0.7 probability and then you say okay uh, what does my model tell when he asks for $50000 then it's your model say okay he might default just by just point two then you are ready to disperse 20000 or 50000 okay okay Okay. Okay then. Let's close. Yeah, so, okay. uh, to this last uh, last one question, yeah, yeah. yeah. So in this, uh, um, it just came around 90 percent, uh, or sorry, 80 percent accuracy. So how much confidence um, can, can we tell you here? So we have to see uh, that confidence uh, function. We have to see how much confidence that is. But normally, all. Uh, algorithms operate on a 95% confidence interval but we have to see oh, okay. according to that uh, uh, what what is the default state okay well, definitely yeah that's uh, possibly means we were looking for this this thing end to end where we can understand everything sure no problem so thanks a lot yeah sure thank you so yeah, much so like next uh, week uh, let's i'll talk to no uh, what about uh, next Next week, uh, you are going to inform us by Friday. Uh, so, uh, I think we'll put up a discussion on the uh, WhatsApp only. You guys can tell that uh, if okay. uh, if you want the both the classes next to next week, so that we can close with NLP and deep learning on that on those classes. Okay. Yes, sure. That's great. Okay, great to have you guys. Uh, okay, it was a wonderful session. We just have two classes left, and if you guys would okay. uh, love to join. our nlp and deep learning also we can uh, have uh, we can ask a show so nlp and deep learning is very interesting it is going to be tough uh, let me tell you that it is going to be a little tough much tougher than what we have done but since now our basics are clear you guys can you know carry forward with nlp and deep learning also okay so why are you including nlp and deep learning all together and not deep learning course only because those are not real, means someone can go for only deep learning no 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 i i will we'll have do different courses only nlp and deep learning i'm just saying oh okay the next two classes oh. will introduce you to nlp and deep learning and then it's up to your choice if you want to pursue any of them in the next uh, course altogether but deep learning is very uh, very uh, interesting also so it's very good to you know uh, understand that okay Okay, that's great. Yeah, good night. Okay, good night. Enjoy. Bye. Bye. Shreya, so how will I record? Can I record the screen? Uh, I have started the record on Go to Meeting. Okay, so you will be recording, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Fine. Sure. Sure. Thank you so much. I don't know why there's a problem with my laptop. Uh, just an update there. Uh, it shouldn't have been. I mean, it's not a, allowing me to log in as MCAL uh, Global Presenter. That's interesting. Um. So you you have. Anyways, we'll we are able to see up. your screen. Okay. Perfect then. We'll carry out with the class then, and then after the class, uh, I'll call you, Shreya. All right, let's see what we can do to fix it. Sure. All right, go ahead guys. Okay. Okay, thanks Rizer. Okay, sure. Okay, so guys, how are you? Sorry for the uh, little technical difficulties. So, I think we we had a little bit of wastage of time, so we'll make up make it up for it. Uh So today's uh, agenda for the uh, class is uh, natural language processing. We'll give a brief introduction of what essence, what it essentially mean, means to, you know, how does 
NLP help in machine learning and why in, is NLP essential to learn? And um, tomorrow we will see the aspects of deep learning. So uh, this will be, uh, we'll just be wetting our feet in these concepts. So I will not go into too much of detail, uh, but um, if we, if you are interested uh, to know more, so we will be launching uh, separate uh, courses on these two topics. So uh, let us start with NLP for today. And uh, let me, you know, start with the basics. So what we have seen yet till now that we were dealing with something called a structured data. Right. So we were dealing always with an Excel file. So if someone was giving me an Excel file, I was, uh, you know, to some bit of uh, my uh, understanding, I was cleaning the data. I was, uh, you know, calculating the summary statistics, then I'm fitting a model, then doing cross validation and then finding the predictions. So that was what we I was doing till now. But everything involved will not be present to you in an Excel sheet, right? So there can be images, there can be photographs, uh, videos, there can be texts. So data is everywhere, right? So if you pick up a newspaper, right? You take a photo of it, the photo, the data of the newspaper is present in an image, okay? So it's not uh, available in an Excel sheet, right? Either you have, uh, you have someone who can, you know, uh, write down that in an Excel file and then you fit your model or you have to be smart enough to, you know, directly use that data uh, for your own um, uh, your, your own benefit. For example, uh, the autonomous cars. How do autonomous cars, uh, you know, self-drive, uh, self right? So they're not present with an Excel sheet that these are the possible cases and then you take a left or right. They, take the data in live uh, and you, they take it from the radars, the sensors, the images, and they process it online. So there's a host of data that is coming through different sources and different forms. So the essential thing that comes into picture is that your data will not be always in structured format. There will be multiple different types of uh, formats that uh, the data can flow in from. Okay, now, uh, so unstructured data essentially can be in the form of text, images, videos, okay? So let us uh, constrict our, you know, imagination to these three essential, um, you know, uh, equal categories where you can have your unstructured data. Images is a little bit easier to handle because if you know that all images would be made of pixels, right? So every image is a three-dimensional uh, data point of red, blue, green. So uh, an image, for example, will be represented by pixels. Or uh, so, for example, uh, the RBG, uh, you know, the range is between zero to two fifty-six. So an, uh, basically a three dimensional matrix of these numbers will be an image that is still structured right it's a little difficult to extract that it's not very simple to extract that but still it is numbers videos also has like frames right so videos can also be um, associated with numbers so basically frames of images is a video right but the difficult part part here comes is the text a text cannot be associated to a default number, right? What what number can you give to army? What can you uh, number can you give it to navy, right? If I say army is one, R is some, let's say uh, the letter, the number of the nth letter of the A to Z alphabets. So, but will that really make sense, right? It doesn't make sense. A is the first alphabet, Z is the uh, 26th al alphabet. There's no logic behind it, right? Someone has already given you, and it's there's no logic that Z is 26 times of A or Z is uh, Z minus A is 25. It's not that, right? So the difficult part in text analytics comes into the into picture is that you don't have associated numbers to the text. Okay, so. NLP, the first part is to associate numbers or how do we represent 
uh, text in form of vectors. So vectors, if you would, if uh, if uh, you remember that, like let's say your x and y was there, right? So let's say x was the income feature, y is the age, right? So an income corresponding to this age is a vector. Okay. So income was let's say twenty thousand. Age is let's say twenty six. Okay. And on the basis of that, you have a vector of uh, features. How would you represent a vector of let's say Indian Army? Uh, uh, so let's say you have a document of uh, a news news document, right? So let's say the uh, number of it the news article says that uh, the crime in india has um, you know increased by 26 percent uh, from last year uh, the police and the courts are trying to devise a method where you can you know decrease the number now how would you represent that information in form of uh, vectors right so the process that is that essentially does that is called word embeddings okay now what are word embeddings word embeddings is basically each word is associated a score okay so for example um let's say let's start with the first type of word in, in uh, embedding called the tfidf now before i start with tfidf i want to give you an essence of how we pre-process the analytics now let's let's try a document okay so let's say a document one has sentence i go to school at 7 a.m in the morning uh, my father drops me To the bus station okay there's another doc let's say clock two okay let's say in that uh, you have uh, my friend uh, mitesh is a uh, is an architect he designs amazing buildings okay now there are two documents here how will you represent these two documents into different uh features or let's say how will you represent this document as different uh, vector of words okay so let me take an example you you have google okay you enter a query here so let's say uh, you want to search about mcal so you write mcal uh, courses offered in python so for example you enter this query and google will have a host of documents right so there will be many documents in form of text images um, um, you know everything will have uh, all sorts of data google will be having right so how will it find these particular words from so many like if you have seen uh, whenever google searches and completes the search it will give you these many results found out of these many uh, uh, so one of 10 results displaying out of uh, whatever the number is so there are in i mean let's say infinite number of documents present in google's database how will it find these um, what do you call words and give you the most optimum uh, or the best search possible out of uh, the infinite uh, database it has so this process is called info sorry information 
retrieval okay okay any doubts still here um, i'm open to questions are you getting the essence of it what we are trying to see Basically, no, 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 not an issue. So basically, it seems we want to create a sentence which has some mm -hmm. meaning, which so has some meaning mathematically. So, for example, if I, this is this is an example of document. Now, um, I want to uh, I asked you, uh, let's say, what does Mitesh do? Okay, so what you'll do first, you'll search these words in document one, you'll get a negative. Then you'll search these uh, words in document two, you'll get a positive. Mitesh, what does Mitesh do? Is not a direct question, is not directly present. So you have to understand the context. So we'll slowly get there in how, you know, uh, your texts context can be interpreted and um, your answers can be derived. But to an essence, you are kind of trying to match where is Mitesh present, and according to that, you can answer the question, right? So you can, if you were Google, you could give me doc2 as a result, right? So if you have entered what does Mitesh do as a query, then you will give me doc2 as a uh, feedback to me. So I, I would be very happy because uh, I got the information from here. But imagine if there are in 100 documents containing Mitesh, uh, having the name of Mitesh, and every document is, you know, having different information. So, for example, this is one of the documents which says that Mitesh, and Mitesh is an architect. Then there will be another document which says Mitesh is six foot tall. There will be another document which says Mitesh is like, uh, uh, Mitesh uh, loves his family. He has two daughters, he has uh, one wife. So, I mean, there are hundreds of documents that can be from with the containing the word Mitesh. How do you define that? How do you say what does Mitesh do should return doc to instead of all those hundred docs? That is the art. That is the art of natural language processing. That is what you give intelligence to the words, you give intelligence to your query so that it returns the best documents possible from the uh, host of other documents. Okay, so is uh, do you i mean uh, i mean it's uh, understandable that these are things very uh, which are very new um, and it is completely different from what we have been doing for the last uh, uh, you know uh, last one month or so so it is a little different but essentially natural language processing is the uh, art of giving intelligence to words and how do you give that intelligence is using numbers and the process called word embeddings, which we will come to this. But are you getting this uh, concept of what we are trying to do here? Yeah, yes, sure. Okay. Okay, amazing. Okay, so now, um, before we go to the slides, so, the process of information retrieval is basically given some query you are giving out some documents which are closely related to the query okay so this is the process of information retrieval okay now how let's let's start with word embeddings What are the word embeddings? So let's take these documents, okay? So these documents. What I do is, I form something called a binary matrix. So let's say document one, first of all, you take all the documents and then you take all the words in the documents as features okay so for example i i will be one feature go will be one feature two will be one feature school will be one feature like this all the words including document one and document two so from i to let's say buildings okay so all these will be 
features okay now what is the vector of document one so it is constituting of these words right now so one 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 like this and all the words that are coming from the document two it uh, these are all zeros okay similarly document two will be zero 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 and one 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 now do you get this so your document one will be a vector of one comma one comma one like this two zero comma zero comma zero document two will be a vector of zero comma zero comma zero one comma one comma one okay so this is a vector of document and this is a vector of document now for example this is the most most simplest simplest representation of a uh, document word embedding okay simply whether that word is present or not if it is present in that document i signified that with a one if it is not present in that document i signify that, that with a zero very simple form of representation okay okay yeah so for example um for example let us give you the analogy where you were doing with your uh, what you were doing with your machine learning for example you had so many observations right so many rows 100 rows and then you had features like let's say income height weight and all these things right remember so what was percent one percent one what was the vector of this so income may be twenty thousand height may be six feet weight may be 70 kgs so person one's vector was twenty thousand comma six comma seventy comma blah 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 okay similarly p2 p2's uh, vector will be forty thousand comma let's say 5.5 feet 40 kgs like this so p2 person's vector is forty thousand comma 5.5 comma 40 kg right so instead of these numbers and instead of these features what we are doing is we are representing p1 as document one right and the features as the words and instead of these numbers we are just marking them whether they are presently zero or i mean whether they are present with the one or if they are not present with the zero does this representation uh, feel okay i mean do you think it's good or it's bad what are your views here Uh, any answers any uh, uh, feedback how do you think that is this binary representation helping you or is it like meaningful yeah it is good but whole row how do you think like uh, how do you mention that it's specify that it says one like whole row p1 whole vector p1 as one like if i no, no. no not not p1 just see the document one so what is document one it is a uh, let's say if i ask present... you for 15 p1 with uh, 55 kg then okay uh, so does it will return one for p1 in document okay okay uh, no 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 so what i was uh, telling you was an analogy here so P1, yeah, P2, yeah, like, okay. yeah, P1 and P2 is like, so for example, if you wanted to ask the, what is the weight of P2, right? You can say 40 kgs, right? Mm -hmm. But here you cannot say what is, uh, you can just say here that if the word school is present in document one, or is it present in document two, or is it present in both? Okay. Okay. okay so here it the it only marks whether it is present or absent the words are present in word 
uh, in the document or absent in the document. Okay, got it. Got it. Good. So there is no particular value that we have assigned. So, so for example, school is not 70 or school is not 60. We'll come to that slowly. But this is a basic, very basic representation, the binary representation, whether it is present or absent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, just just give me two minutes. I'll just drink some water. Just give me two minutes. Yeah, so I'm back. Anyways, uh, so uh, now did you understand the essence what we are trying to do here? Any questions? Yeah. Well, if your screen is not shared. Sorry? We can't see your screen now. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So uh, can we move on then? Yep. Okay. Amazing. So now we have what we have seen is how we can represent documents in terms of vectors right that we have seen so what we were doing we were just doing the binary vector whether it is present or absent now can uh, anyone tell me what is the disadvantage of having a binary vector i mean if i just tell you that this document has this word and the other document doesn't have this word how does this help you or have, keep you as a at a disadvantage of uh, let's say information retrieval if i want to let's say uh, considering that these are the two documents okay now i enter a query what does mitesh do which document will come up document two will come up because it will search uh, what what is not there anywhere the does does is also not there in any other document mitesh mitesh is there in this document uh, do do is also not there in any of the documents so mitesh will come up from this document so if i enter a query of what does mitesh do the computer will return me document two, which is good, right? For our all purposes for right now, it is good. But for example, if you have a document three, which is says Mitesh is very fond of chocolates. Let's say you have a document four, which says Mitesh has two uh, sorry two children and lives with his 
parents right now for example i again ask question what does mitesh do so what is not there in either of the documents okay does is also not there mitesh is there in document 2 document 3 and document 4 so my computer will now in 2 3 4 how will i understand what does mitesh do it has not answered me the question it has written me set of documents in which all the information about mitesh is there right it doesn't help me so the yes. disadvantage here is it is only giving me whether the word is present or not so whenever i ask a question it will only tell me the documents where this word is present it will not tell me any context okay so it is not telling me what mitesh does or what is his hobby or what who lives with him is nothing this not telling me anything so the next thing is called the tifidf matrix okay so let's come back to the same thing you have documents okay now all the words comprising of all the documents is called the corpus remember this term right all the words combined in from all the documents is called the corpus or uh, and so the words within that corpus is called the vocabulary okay so for example now what tf idf means is t means term f means frequency i means inverse d means document frequency so it goes one let's see for the first term what is term frequency so let's say my doc is um let's say sunil attended pml he loved the concepts he is going to apply them in his job okay let's say um okay apart from his job is essentially of a data scientist okay now um let's say i have another doc let's say sharad loves traveling his job is now carefully see these two documents right there are certain words which are common let's say data scientist job, job correct love traveling loves okay who is a data scientist these two both documents will come up which is correct one okay but it, uh, it is showing a message the organizer is experiencing technical difficulties 
Are the organizers rejoining the meeting with an in five minutes? Oh, I think uh, that's your network connectivity. I guess we are not getting any message. Oh, okay. Sorry, I think it's mine. Mine. Okay. Grand mm-hmm. fine. Sorry. No problem. Uh, but the organizer, I think, uh, is Sridhar. So maybe okay. Anyways, uh, let's see. I also didn't get any message. Anyways, so uh, what we essentially do is we have to understand what are the characteristic words of the document which represent the document well. Now, if I say data scientist data scientist is present in both documents right it is not a characteristic word of these documents so for example you you already know that um, both are data scientists so if you enter the uh, who is a data science both documents will, will come now if i ask you um, who loves his job Okay, so who loves his job? That is that is where you have to think that which are the characteristic words of the document. Now let me explain this in a better way. Um, okay, now how will I explain this? So for example, you run a query on Google. Okay, you write a query on Google. So query is basically what you write for a search, right? So let's say best movies of 2018. Now, if I see individually, if I see these terms individually, best movies of 2018. So there will be hundreds or thousands of documents containing the word best. There will be thousands of documents containing the word movies. There will be thousands of documents containing thousand one lakh documents containing the word off and there there will be many documents containing the number 2018 how do we combine so the combination will be and right so you want a document which contains all these words best movies of 2018 so this will be a combination of all these words so you have to find a document or you have to find a file which contains all these words right so this will be an and right so you should present all the words in the query should be present in the document now if you find all these documents how will you rank them right so there will be let's say hundreds of documents that will come out from this query how will you rank them how what, what will be the importance of each of the documents that's where the term frequency come so if best the word best is coming let's say 100 times here only two times here movies is coming let's say 20 times here only five times here so you will see that document one is more probable to be by more important document compared to document 100 because the occurrences of these words are much more in document one compared to document 100 i'll open to i'll be open to questions here because i know it is a little difficult thing to understand uh, i'm open to questions here are you getting the essence of it yeah i'm okay under sunil should the yeah, sequence make any sense or not I mean the same query I can write as like 2018 movies, like by best people. I have just changed the sequence, but meaning can be changed. Correct. Very good. That's a very good observation. So we have not come up to that word embedding where the sequence is also taken care of. Right now, what I'm first we started that a single word be what we will be present. Next, we are starting with multiple words should be present. Now we are seeing that the importance should be according to the number of occurrences of these words. You made an excellent so, observation that sequencing is not present here right now, right? So we'll come so, to that. So story. yeah, one more uh, thing basically. Assuming first document based has come ten times, movie yeah. five times. Okay. In the second document, 
best yeah. has come five times movie ten times correct so just i'm changing the best ten movie five next to be five and ten correct. so which correct. document will come first exactly so right now according to the logic both both documents will be of the similar importance because their score is 15 and here auto is also it is 15 so right now they will come with the same we haven't talked about how to you know differentiate these documents till now right now what we are doing we are just calculating term frequency okay so term frequency okay. is Best is five uh, movies ten. Uh, the next one is movie is five. Best is ten. Oh, sorry, I'm, I think I told the same thing. Movie is ten and best is five. Anyways, so and the score total for these two documents are fifteen. So for you right now, according to the term frequency logic, according to the term frequency logic, both the documents are of the same importance. Do you get this? Yes. Or are you not comfortable with it right now? No, this is simple concept. Just uh, we have created a matrix, and we are getting the count of the words present here. Correct, correct, excellent. That is that is what. So, for example, right now, how your matrix will look like? So, this will be doc one, doc two. Let's see uh, this one. So, all your words will be in. Let's zoom this in. So, so, but the binary matrix will help me here because in binary matrix we are not keeping any count. No, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That's why we are creating a new matrix. Okay. Now see. what we have done is we have created a new matrix of the documents doc1 and doc2 and now what we'll do instead of just telling me sunil is present as one i will now tell you how many times sunil is present but for here for this doc it is only present once right sunil has is only present so for example let's say uh, i write here sunil is going to apply them in his job sunil job is essentially of a data scientist so how many times sunil is present three times right how many times attended is present attended is present only one time okay pml present is one time similarly sharad sharad is present how many times in doc 1 he is present zero so all the things that are uh, of the document to coming from those document it is zero now similarly document 2 sunil is present zero attended is present attended uh, uh yeah attended is zero and sharad is present once scientist is present once i think uh, loves 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 is present twice okay so loves is present twice now your new matrix is according to the term frequencies it's not only just binary one or zero now it is giving you the number of times so if there would be another document let's say document 3 where uh, uh, let's say um, okay let's say uh, he loved uh, sunil attended pml he loved the concepts in pml sunil is going to apply them in his job so his job is essentially view of a data scientist he referred pml to his friend okay so now how many times pml has occurred pml has occurred three times right so let's say your pml term frequency is 3 now let's say ashok uh, sharad uh, okay sharad is uh, sharad has not talked about pml so let's say ashok the director of mcal he says um who is more impressed with pml right so if he writes that query who is more impressed with pml so the query will check pml in each of the documents and pml is three times here but pml four times in this talk so the 
the uh, document will tell sunil is or let's say your document one is more praiseworthy of pml compared to his document two so ashok will read that document and say that, okay sunil has more uh, benefited from the program uh, compared to Sharad, right just for an example here so this is how we are trying to refine so for example uh, if Sharad also had said at least once right still my document one will be more valuable to ashok compared to doc two now you can also ask me how do i know sunil has praised pml he he i can also say he won't refer pml to his friend sunil is uh, attended pml he didn't love pml right so the context yet we have not captured we have just captured the words and their importances the context here we have not captured is it okay till now Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should be. Okay. So uh, now, we all understand what are conjunctions or prepositions, right? So if I do this term frequency, it means the words which are more occurring in uh, the documents will be more important but a word like and if them they these words will be occurring most number of times in all the documents right if it is occurring across all the documents then that word is not important to me right because it is generic it becomes generic for example if PML, don't consider that we are, uh, I mean, just forget the thing that we are considering the con, we are not considering the context. If the context is not considered, if both would have said PML for three times, Sunil and Sharad, both would have sent PML for three times. And if Ashok wants to say, see who can, who refers PML more, then Ashok will not get the answer because PML is more generic. It has become more generic from uh, his from from the training pml is occurring in all the documents so for example all the participants if they have talked about pml okay so there are five participants everyone has talked about pml and their sentences have pml in it so pml becomes a generic word it doesn't give importance from about the candidate every candidate has spoken about pml i don't uh, i don't want that word which is more generic everyone everywhere it is present now for example ashok wants to see who has really applied that right so applied apply may be occurring in sunil's document twice but it may not be occurring in other four candidates right so apply becomes a more important word a word which is characteristic of a document but it is not present in other documents okay so how do we represent that in mathematically so term frequency okay divided by document frequency okay term frequency divided by document frequency a large number of term a high high number of term frequency is good but if it is present in all the documents then it should, it is not good so if i say this is the score of a word so a term frequency divided by the document frequency is the score of a word. Now, if the score of the word is high, that high that that word is important to me. If the score of the doc, uh, word is low, that word is not important to me. Okay. Now, so essentially, if my term frequency is very high, but my document frequency, so let's say your term. Uh, let me write it here. So, for example, your term frequency is high and your document frequency is low. It means uh, it means it is present. Uh, I think there is a little disturbance in the line. Can uh, everyone put yourself in the mute? I'm uh, hearing a lot of, lot of disturbances in between. Anyways, so term frequency is high 
and the document frequency is low it means that word is important to that document if the term frequency is high and the document frequency is also high it means it is a generic word it is not important to that specific document per se any questions till now so what about the case in which a particular word is coming hundred times in a document okay but only few few times in all other documents excellent so that word is very important for that document right so if a document understand this um uh, let's say um okay let's say uh, there are 100 documents about work okay so the recently the uh, football world cup come came to an end right so let's say 100 documents containing the world award world cup okay in google okay now for example if you want to see cristiano ronaldo's performance in world cup okay now maybe only two newspapers or two documents were talking about cristiano ronaldo right so the term frequency of cristiano ronaldo in those two documents is very high but it is very rare occurring in other documents right it means if you search cristiano ronaldo those two documents should come up in your search other documents will not come up because it doesn't have cristiano ronaldo so much it might have a sing simple mention or a simple uh, praise about his hat trick but those documents which have cristiano ronaldo more number of times are documents which are characteristically saying about cristiano ronaldo but if you enter world cup world cup every every document will uh, come 100 documents so world cup is not a generic it has become a generic word for all the documents right it is not an important it is not a characteristic word of all the documents do you understand this so if a just un, yeah, just sure. think Sorry, just think, think so. yeah just think like this yeah. if a word is more occurring in a single document but it is not occurring so much in the other uh, documents it means this word is really important to this document this document is really speaking about that person this document is really telling me about that concept whereas the other documents are not telling me about this concept and it is also not a generic word okay so you know what to, oh, sorry uh, but what about the case in which ronaldo achieving the first document ronaldo was playing from this country in world cup he okay. was doing good and he has scored this this is so here in the first document ronaldo has appeared only one time but i am Correct. using he pronoun Correct. for Correct. many Correct. times yeah yeah in the so other see. document in, in, yeah yeah sorry. tell 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 uh, in the other document ronaldo can come two or three times but there is no he so in the first document i am referred ronaldo many times compared to second document okay very good question that's a very good question so see uh, uh, what we are doing here is slowly progressing in how to give okay. intelligence to our words right so the, what i have said is we are right now at a point where we are discussing only about the term frequency slowly we will discuss about the uh, unimportant words then we will slowly go on to how to include context so here what okay. you see is uh, is something called context so he is actually a pronoun of the same person that we started with the sentence right so slowly when we go on to different procedures we apply these intelligence or we also incorporate these intelligence uh to our upcoming models but uh, right now we are just doing a simple a simple analysis right that's a good question so what we here is, uh, is uh, what we do here is called dependency parsing so a noun or a pronoun or a verb is actually dependency parsed uh so there's a tree so every noun pronoun a uh, verb adverb will have a root name to it so for example he will be dependency parts to ronaldo so then he will also be counted under ronaldo his will be dependency dependency parts to ronaldo that's why his will be counted under ronaldo 
so dependency parsing is another concept that we will come to it later not now okay but is this yes. concept concept clear we can't share a screen shows you yeah i i because i kept it uh, i think it automatic whenever it automatically logs right it goes away maybe i'll just start can you see now yes yeah okay okay so um, so we have understood this part right term frequency inverse document frequency so in another way if a particular word is coming in all the documents mm -hmm. we will keep tf idf for that means for every document there will be and sorry for every document for every word we are going to keep tf df correct okay. right? so now we have advanced here so here sunil was there um yeah, sharad and all everything was there so in initially what we were doing we were just keeping it binary then we started with term frequency then now we are keeping tf idf so the score of sunil in document 1 is no longer 1 or no longer term frequency it is now term frequency inverse document frequency so is this the same matrix which we have modified am i right yeah same matrix okay. which we are trying to slowly modify okay 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 now okay now let's introduce another concept called tokenization what is tokenization tokenization is nothing but you have a sentence i have a mm -hmm. ipad i enjoy taking classes so in python it is essentially a sentence but i need to create to find out term frequency inverse document frequency i need to access each of the words right so first what i have to do is tokenize so i will be a token have will be a token a will be a token ipad will be a token i is already a token enjoy will be a token taking will be a token okay so basically tokenizing each of the sentences so for example to calculate the term frequency inverse document frequency you need to have access to each of the words you want to recognize right then some, there's something called lemmatize so what is lemmatize is basically if the word is take took taking uh yeah so each of the words are derivatives of take only right these are not different words altogether right so uh, so basically if i have took i should not consider this as a different word this is essentially the same just the past tense but the same essence as take similarly taking is the same essence of take right so lemmatize means you always go to the root word okay so the root word is take okay then there is something called normalize what is normalize normalize is basically let's say you have usa and united states of america note kf idf matrix can tell you that these are the same right so python has an inbuilt normalization dictionary where every like some abbreviations possible abbreviations are mapped to um each of the full forms right so usa and united states of america is same 
similarly all other abbreviations are kind of mapped in all together in the corpus so that people whenever they run a query they don't have to mention a person writing usa and united states of america should get the same query or same message all together right so this is called normalization so can you this it as a synonym sorry can we think it as a synonym or only means abbreviation uh not not only abbreviation so for example usa or u dot s dot a is also mapped okay so it's not just abbreviations so let's say automobile and car is mapped plane and aeroplane or flight is also mapped okay so it's not just abbreviations it's kind of the general words that people kind of use uh, apart from the dictionary words okay means words having the same same meaning or similar meaning correct correct which they don't have any resemblance to it so because plane and flight will not have resemblance in terms of any logic right it's just same it's what people use as a vocabulary yeah. right so uh then there's something called uh okay so normalization lemmatization tokenization now there's something called stop words stop words are basically words like and or if um does therefore so these are the words that do not add any information to your query right kind of prepositions and kind of you know just uh, trying to fill up sentences so these words do not add any information per se to your um, query so these words you do not want in your uh, uh, term frequency adding inverse document frequency matrix right so stop words removal is very important right so whenever so this is kind of the so all these words are kind all these things are kind of the pre processing steps like we pre pre processed our data these are the pre processing steps for nlp you first you should re remove okay now should we remove the stop words first and then lemmatize or should we lemmatize and then remove the stop words or is it the same First, lemmatize and stop word should remove stop words. First, lemmatize and then remove stop words. Is it? Yep. Correct. Ah, uh, what is the reason? Ah, uh, if there is any other meaning, if these are there, if those words are there, like combining conjunction words. Correct. So basically, yeah, stop words are limited. I think there are 150 or or so words uh, that are present in the Python dictionary as stop words. So there may be certain cases of, you know, past tense, future tense, or some tense of uh, these words. Uh, then that can be um, there present. So first, it is always go essential to go to the root word and then remove stop words. So there is a pre-process thing steps. No, it, it's, it's and not it. clear, Subodhi. Subodhi, it's not, not clear which one which one first and why. Okay. So, so stop. Versus, yeah. So what I told is lemmatize, right? Lemmatize is, for example, um, mm, mm, let's say. Uh, Okay, let me see. What example can I give? So, for example, we can, yeah, we can. So, for example, some 
stop words is 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 there okay but your sentence contains r r is not here does r uh, give you in any information about uh, your query no right normally also when you enter the query do you even write the prepositions you don't write right so just write random words like pml effect uh, or sorry courses in pml okay or uh, so very few times you write full or good sentences what are the courses offered in pml online right very few times you enter the preposition so that's why this these things do not add any information to the query or the extraction process so for example if any sentence contains r first we go back to its root word is and then is will remove get removed by stop words but it's a little time then a stop words yeah 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 okay so let us get So I'm using these slides uh, because these are very intuitive. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So let's go back and I, uh, let's see what we have learned first. So information retrieval is finding a material, usually documents of an unstructured nature, nature, usually text that satisfies an information need from within large collections. Okay. So if there are only two, three documents, then you can just manually extract. But if there are a large amount of documents or collections, then you need to have an automated procedure to do that, right? Okay. So we have seen what is a document. Document can be web pages, email, books, news stories, scholarly papers, messages, PowerPoint, PDF, forum posting, patents, IM sessions, tweets, question answers, posting, X, anything, right? So when essentially you write a query, your Google is going through all of these things. And so, you, I mean, I just appreciate that search engine, which is doing so much and people don't realize what is it, what it is doing in the background. I mean, I also never, so there are many things that are very interesting in natural language processing, right? So understanding the context. Now, even if you understand the context, then there's something, there's something called sarcasm, right? So that, sarcasm context is very difficult to understand so we'll come to that uh, if you have time for I, in this session we'll see how how you understand context in uh, in uh, what do you call uh, uh, information retrieval on nlp okay so so your database can be of bank records balances names addresses social security numbers dates of birth etc but these mainly are structured data, right? So account numbers, balances, and is, these are all present in Excel files. They are in structured data. That's why it's very easy to compare fields with the well defined semantics. So, for example, if you anyone says to find out um, this particular account number's information, then it's very easy, right? You just have to write the account number and there will be just one listing out of it, right? A simple, very, a simple search. So, for example, if you are doing uh, finding the records with balance rate greater than 50,000, you can just run an SQL query and, you know, it's very easy to do that. The challenge will come. Let's say, okay, it's not mentioned here. So, uh, we'll slowly go to the challenge. So, what is IR? How do we do in IR? The indexing and retrieval of textual documents. Okay, so first we have to index, like what we have done is term frequency, inverse document frequency. We kind of index it and then we retrieve it. Okay, so the so first the concern is with retrieving relevant documents to a query. So as I've said, you cannot always run uh, give me thousand documents back with my query, right? You have to refine your search you have to give me the most important documents first and then the other documents so 
there should be a rank particular rank that's how google um, functions right so there are so many search results it gives you the best results um, uh, to you on the first rank then comes the second then comes the third right so you have to give me the better ones okay so we have uh, uh, so for example someone writes what, what is the killer app okay so there uh, there will be if you go by the word killer then there will be apps which are meant to kill uh, but the person who meant this uh, query is not meaning to find apps meant to kill right it is kind of searching the apps which are revolutionizing uh, i mean revolutionary in as in the sense right which is kind of really appreciate so this is where your understanding of the context is very important okay okay now let us get back to i think we have already told all these things too so basically your document corpus is there a lot of documents is there your ir system is the converting those documents to tf idf then do you have a query and then you have a rank documents you always remember this okay so what is relevant relevant documents contains the information that a person was looking for when they submitted the query this may include being on the proper subject being timely recent information should be there okay being authoritative from a trusted source satisfying the goals of the user and is our her intended use of the information right so this is meant by relevance what we have done is just address the first one being on the proper subject right so we are trying to give get the documents which are relevant to the subject okay now let this go so we will do a hands-on training uh since I, I do not have the laptop connection today tomorrow we will do some hands-on and i will show you how uh, your different uh, extracts can you know different queries can change the retrieval process okay okay so all these things i've already told you So see, car uh, people Republic of China versus China, right? So these are two essentially the same thing. Automobile versus car. Here's where the norm normalization comes into picture. Okay. Now there's something uh, called uh, retrieving the irrelevant document because of ambiguity. So Apple. Now if you search Apple, okay. So whether it will return the fruit or the company, that's 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 a very difficult problem or difficult challenge for the uh, uh, search engine, right? So you might search Apple, and uh, um, it gives you uh, the fruit, but you, what you meant was to see the Apple company, and vice versa also. So there, so these are the challenges basically which natural language processing tries to address using machine learning. So how will machine learning help you? Any idea? Based on context. <laughs> exactly. So that's a perfect answer. So right now what we have done is kind of index state, term frequency, I mean inverse document frequency. But the question that Sunil has had asked, right? how do we find the context that's where the machine learning part will come so bear with me we'll slowly come to that but uh, just understand and appreciate the challenges so if you for example enter java so java can be a programming language versus an island so which all which one to retrieve okay so an intelligent ir system will take into account the meaning of the words okay adapt to the user based on direct or indirect feedback take into account the importance of the page okay so and so on so let us go back to the uh, okay let us go back to the
so this is what i was meaning when term document indices indices incidence matrices this is basically the binary uh, binary uh, matrix if it is present it is one if it is absent it is zero okay can send anyone tell me what is the challenge here basically in 2d two dimensional matrix the okay. number of feature features or number of columns that will be sum of all the words in each document correct correct going right yeah so means logically it's tough to pass and uh, operate on that that is one of the challenge i have i can think yeah that is one challenge but uh, to explain it a bit further is that a lot of documents will not have a lot of words right so your matrices will be very sparse or let's say a lot of them will be filled up with zeros and that is a space constraint constraint right so if you have million of documents and each document has like thousands of words imagine the complexity of this matrix it will be huge and more than 70 percent of them will be zeros because many of the documents will not have many of the words so that's that's a space constraint and a space wastage so that is a very uh, you know big challenge for uh, ir okay so right now what we have um, okay inverted index we don't know, want to see this we have already uh, seen the different thing okay No need to go to the query optimization. Let's go to the pre processing. Okay, so tokenization, we have already seen what are the problems. So Hewlett Packard, if you tokenize, then Hewlett Packard will be two different words, but essentially it is the same word that is connected, right? So it is Hewlett Packard is a company. It is not two different words. State of the art, state of the art is combined word. It's not state of the art. It's not different uh, words. So here tokenization is always not helpful so it is very so see in information retrieval this is a big challenge right so uh, more you refine your query more you will be precise to a specific thing and you will lose generalization so in in context of machine learning you're kind of overfitting here right tokenization you're breaking the words so distinct that each of the words will lose its meaning right so you're losing generalization and you're trying to overfit san francisco san francisco is a kind of a particular state right it is not san and francisco different right it's kind of the same state it doesn't have a hyphen in between even so how will you understand that san francisco is should come together so this all comes from the machine learning part right so machine learning will help you to understand that san francisco will always come together according to the previous searches that people have done so for example imagine the first person searching san francisco google might have told him something some results of san and some results of francisco separately that guy got really frustrated got you know went down uh, the the pages and then it went uh, entered into let's say san francisco temperature right so google understood that san francisco was not meant to be san and francisco differently it is a combination of these two that has to be uh, given a result of right so it is learning every time you enter a query in google 
Google is learning that what every user is trying to mean using its machine learning, right? So this is where we combine NLP and machine learning, right? So everything you cannot be like solved with term frequency inverse document frequency or binary matrices. The context learning should be done from machine learning, right? And how we will do that, we will learn. We will give you an introduction of how we to do that, right? Okay. Numbers is also a challenge sometimes. Chinese, how do we write read Chinese? Chinese doesn't have white spaces. How will you tokenize it even, right? So any idea how you can tokenize it? First it translates translate to English, then it might. Uh, that, that can be an indirect way, but it's it's basically one of the logics will be can be like slowly what you do is you even tokenize the word to letters right so each word will now be a compre comparison i mean uh, a combination of letters now each you as you read the letters you add the letters to the previous letter for example there's a word called let's say stop okay so s to a stop right you first tokenize stop s then you ct then you add s uh, t to s then you have st then you have sto have stop so as soon as the word that makes sense so stop will be a is a valid word right so you can check that in your english vocabulary so as soon as the first word that makes sense uh, from the english vocabulary sense or let's say the chinese vocabulary sense you stop there. So you have to tokenize the word. So first you tokenize the sentence completely, then you tokenize the letters in that, and then you start combining the letters and stop or give white spaces as soon as the word makes sense. Does it make any sense here? Do you, do you understand? No, sure. Can you repeat that again? Okay. So see when we are tokenizing it we are what we are doing in english is based on white spaces we are separating the words and right right so if the sentence is i am going to school the tokenized yeah. thing will be i separately because there was a space between am and i then going going and am had a space then school so so essentially because of the white spaces i could tokenize the words right yeah Okay, but in Chinese there is no white space. How will you tokenize? So what you'll do? Let's say, let's let's just think of an analogy here. I am going to school is continuous, right? So what? Let me write it here. Uh, let me draw it here for you. So let's say, I am going to school is a single word okay how will you do this you tokenize this as single letters okay i a m g o i n c okay so what you do is you take the first letter does this make sense according to the english dictionary yes it does make sense you have your word then separate it then you start again a does it no. really make sense no. it makes sense right in english yeah. yeah so you get an error here so basically you have done a mismatch here you uh, i mean you you should have gone with am but you since a is there in english dictionary so you can't do anything further here so then you start with m so m does it make any sense it doesn't make any sense yeah. right then you start with mg does it make any sense no no it will not make any sense so m g o i n g nothing will make sense m will be replaced then you start with g g does it make sense no g o yes it makes sense so you'll stop here so there are many I'm things done. that you have sorry uh if it would be when we come for come to a it should yeah. check for a and m right a m yeah it should have but the logic, what I am just telling you right now, mm -hmm. will not able to support, right? So 
that's where you have to go to your machine learning you have oh. to see what is the comp does i and a come together even historically no right yeah i and a will not come together historically that's yeah. why a will be rejected there but right mm -hmm. now what i was telling depending on the words which when whenever it makes okay. sense you stop it will mm -hmm. stop here right? okay. okay so you have to give intelligence from machine learning that i and I am will come together and not i and a so that's where you yeah. can fill this okay 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 yeah thank you any questions sunil yeah uh, surely basically um it's clear means how we will search but still i'm not able to figure it out how to use the machine learning engine yeah yeah so uh, because you're not trying to figure out because we have not told you how to do that right i'm just giving you examples okay. yeah so okay. we we will use um, uh, machine learning uh, we'll just give you a taste here um, not go into depth in machine learning this uh, because this will be with machine learning so we'll just tell you how we can use it anyways <laughs> So I'm big with, uh, so we have already seen this other cases of no no white spaces anyways these are okay. Okay, this is something very important called case folding, right? MIT versus MIT will be different, but it should not be different, right? Fed versus Fed should not be different right so every letter should be converted to lowercase letters right so uh, that's so that it makes sense to your query to match them normalization we have seen what it does need to normalize terms in index text as well as query terms into same form right so example we want to match usa and usa they should be of the same class okay so window window and windows stop words as we have seen um examples are a in r a is is at b by for form so these are the words which do not make any sense i gave an example of r and is there but you see r is already there in so slowly people are developing this stop words dictionary right so but still the concept still remains that whenever you first you limitize and then you uh remove the stop words so lemmatize we have already seen what is lemmatize car cars 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 all will all fall in the car right destruction should be destroyed you should be using these lemmatization and stop words in our in our programming or those will be available already just to use so limitization will be automatically mm -hmm. done stop words will also be automatically done but stop words has a dictionary so you can also update your stop words according to the uh, let's say use use case right so yeah. you might think that for your particular aspect these are the words which are not important so you can update your stop words there right okay. these are the these are the these are the general stop words in uh, i mean in generic cases but you might be working with some uh, case where other things may be stop words right so you can you know yeah. update that manually okay. also i mean, not manually you can update so that dictionary be available automatically when we use it in programming yeah 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 okay so what is stemming stemming is uh, a little uh, let's say what do you call more naive approach to limitize so instead of you know having different let's say automate automation automatic will reduce to automat okay so it might not make sense but it is 
kind of taking out the root word out of uh, this the root word might might not make sense so stemming normally don't use it because when if you are doing a lemmatization that solves your purpose don't do a stemming but people sometimes there are use cases where you can do stemming but will not use that here okay so stemming is crude heuristic process that chops off the end of the word in the hope of achieving what principal lemmatization attempts to do with a lot of linguistic knowledge right so stemming is more naive approach than compared to lemmatization okay okay so we'll not go to potter stem algorithm this is basically potter stem algorithm of uh, lemmatization okay okay so this is all also done next we will go skip pointers how are we getting this uh, are you finding interest in this because see this is a very very interesting topic uh, natural language processing so much to do so much to think about so as i've said there are no one knows all the answers about natural language processing everything has to be you know thought about it so i will tomorrow i will uh, give you an example of my, uh, the natural language processing i did in my project and uh, so okay let me give you an introduction about it so my company has a lot of sqs right sqs means stock keeping units so uh, johnson johnson has a lot of sqs let's say in a particular only asia pacific region there will be a might be 8000 sqs right so 8000 sqs will have each of the sqs will have descriptions right so descriptions are like 20 grams nutrigena face cream okay or johnson's baby oil 60 grams or johnson's baby powder 20 grams right so what happens is in the erps are sap based right sap is a uh, main uh, transactional database that we have now there is a separate database where in europe that had um, sqs of asia pacific right but while entering those sqs people had not kept the same number so for example if a, if a material the same material has a number of let's say 1002 here in europe the same material may have a number different completely different like maybe 5067 how to match this you just have the number which is different you just have the material description now you consider each of the sqs as a different document you find out the characteristic words from tfidf matrix of each of the sqs considered to be a document you match these documents and you find out the best document rank according to this sq for example nutrigena baby face product 20 g i use this as my query my document list is the sqs in europe okay i try to match this with each of the documents and then i find out the most relevant document that uh, comes up and you getting it so a sq description in us asia will be in my query i need to find out the corresponding material number in europe so what i do i enter that query my search engine will essentially run through all, all the materials in europe match this query description with all the materials and give me the best possible match out of those list i did this and this is this has been so well, well appreciated that different departments are asking me to you know uh, apply this algorithm for their particular use case that is the power of natural language processing so many of the companies i mean uh, you after we learn this you just go into your respective companies and you you will have a different view of seeing words earlier you used to say okay words how, how will i um, you know use that data but now if you learn natural language processing you can extract so much of it from just the descriptions or just the words out out of your business so for example one of one other Which use cases would you, uh, on that particular uh, example which you gave so um what you uh, mentioned that 
each country have the different number, but they have the same description. So based on the description, you have matched those uh, SKUs. Correct. Right? Correct. Okay. So all the description will not be exactly same. If it is exactly same, then you can use an Excel based word by matching, right? It is yeah. it is not exactly same. There is some similarity. Some size may be same. Some words may be same, but it is not exactly same. For example, Europe may say Neutrogena baby face powder 20 gram. OK, my uh, oh, sorry, Asia Pacific may say baby powder 20 gram. OK, so Neutrogena is not there. So we have to match it and score it and see whether Neutrogena actually makes sense. So Neutrogena, whether it is a characteristic word of this particular document or is it so generic across all franchise that you don't need so for example if all the SQs are from neutrogena then i don't need neutrogena in my matching right even if neutrogena is not present it means that uh, i can match the rest of it right so that's where your term frequency inverse document frequency match will come up does it will include that ounces search means in us there is search with ounces Ounce. Uh, sorry, uh, I didn't get your question. What are you saying? No, that that will include like uh, twenty ounce powder, it's, baby powder. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in US, the dimensions of um, you know measurement may be different. In Asia, it may be in grams. So you also have to get, take care of all that. So every problem is different. Unlike machine learning, what we have learned from structured data, you will use these these algorithms and you get the best of it natural language processing is very different from it you have to see the data you have to understand it what will make sense you know tune your algorithm according to your requirement it is not something that is all present as such so you just on monday you go to your respective company see the text data and see what you can do out of it and you come back to me message me that if this is uh, there uh, can you tell me what how, how we can leverage this data so for example right now how people build chatbots chatbot is for example what we are trying to build is let's say i have so many reports right so many reports across different databases different um, matrices are there in the reports so for example it is very difficult for me to search uh, manually and go each of the databases and so I need a chatbot. I want to say that chatbot give me the UFR or let's say the forecasting accuracy report for 2017 it will give it will search on its own and tell me the uh, report so how will it search it will first convert my voice to text and then use that text to search the file names and give out the best possible match kind of how Google um, or Siri in Apple does, right? So it's how. Uh, it, I want yeah. The chatbot. The chatbot is basically um, pretty much we can use it either on the text, like we can type something and it will give me query, and as well as it will convert from voice to text, right? Both. Um, correct, 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 both correct. Things are it, chatbot, it right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, ultimately, in the background, it is using this machine learning uh, techniques and an algorithm to give me the result, correct? It is using natural language processing and machine learning both. It is oh. not just using. Uh, uh, so whenever there is text format, right? So all these processes, right? Uh, what we are trying to do, like um, TF idea, what I said initially is we are converting the words to numbers. Right. So first you have to convert the num words to numbers and then you can do your machine learning problem. So what we have learned today is how to convert words to numbers. One, one more question. Um, so sure. on how they were different between machine learning and then natural language processing or uh, I think that anytime there is a structured data machine learning. Um, uh, can be applied definitely and and uh, in most of the cases but the if there is unstructured data or the image or uh, some voice and other thing then probably uh, machine learning technique definitely cannot be applied then we need to go for um, this nlp and uh, these things correct yeah yeah okay
Okay. Sony, do you have any questions? So basically, I'm something which I can grab from and uh, related to NLP because I'm still sorry, I'm not getting on up. the map. Uh, okay, so also, also basically, I'm um, I'm not worrying with these things. What are the other problems basically? So okay, so I'm there that we have the metrics where NF. IDF we have calculated, but after that, how to correlate the machine learning, or means what next after that? I am there still because okay, these okay. are the problems. Uh, these are the problems I can go through the internet and I can figure it out. So I'm stuck there. I want to see some code. Still, I am struggling with what NLP is actually. Is that the uh, search? I means I have a string. I have to search some document or something else. If this is, then how will I proceed and use the machine learning? Okay, so for example, <clears throat> uh, we can take the example of four documents which you have created three for me, one for Sarad. So from that, we can write some theory and we can go step by step. Okay, so for example, right now you have created documents as a vector of matrices, right? Correct. Okay, so now imagine those documents as uh, the rows of your machine learning and those words as features okay right. now what you used to do in machine learning you used to form a model based on the features you would want to predict if these are the words what will be the result okay yeah. now let's say your different uh, let's say your document one let's say your document one two three there are five documents out of sports six documents out of entertainment four documents out of you know crime and let's say ten documents out of what else um, um, tv shows okay now each of these documents will have each of these classes now think of this as a clustering problem or a classification problem okay now so for example first six documents they have these words their tf idf values are there okay and you have the associated class as entertainment next six documents have the words tf idf is there you have the class as and um, let's say sports okay now someone gives you a document you convert that to a tf idf you know first what you do is form a model out of it so based on these tf idf values and these features you are trained a model that if my input comes like this i will yeah, output can find, the class yeah. Yeah, we can find the class. Yeah, classification problem. Now it will be correct. And based on that, yeah, based on that classification, we'll give the list of the documents. Exactly. That's what we. But, uh, what we. Uh, no, but in that classification problem, everything has been converted into number. But only one class we will get, isn't it? No, no, no. So, for example, that's what I'm saying. Five documents are of entertainment. Seven documents are of, uh, let's say, sports. Ten documents are of movies. Now you get another document. Now you have to classify that document whether it is sports, movies, or entertainment. So based okay. on the TF IDF score of the document, just think that document as a combination of features. Uh, sorry, of I think so I can't see your screen. Could you share and uh, we no, can no, discuss that? Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll okay. draw, it, draw it for you. Yeah. So basically, on that, uh, I understand that can be converted into classification problem. 
So left side we have the documents which are equal to one class, isn't it? Okay, now so let's see. Document one, document two, document hundred. This is your corpus, which are the features, and here you have TFIDF scores. And this you have the class. So let's say these are the sports, okay. movies, climb. Okay. Now someone tells you similar, right? right? These were the rows in your machine learning. These were the features, and these were the classes. Classes were much lesser than the rows, right? So if there were hundred uh, row items, line items. There were uh, let's say two or three classes what we are seeing. Similarly, there are hundred documents, and each of the documents are, you know, either sports, movies, or right. Now someone gives you an, a document, hundred one, which has the TF-IDF scores. You you have this model ready, okay? Okay. Use this model to predict. Which class your TFID score falls into? I mean, which class okay. it falls into? So, based on that, we will determine the class. Correct. And we have marked. So, for 101, we have marked, okay, this is the crime movie. Yeah, for example, uh, based on the TFID scores, it will tell whether it is crime. So, again, it for timing, it's, yeah, for timing, it's crime we have calculated. And we are yeah. marking in our uh, matrix. Correct. So now some someone is coming to search. Uh huh. Um, no, see, searching, some matching, is, yeah. searching is okay. So let, let's say you come up with a search. You come up with a query. Correct. Query is also a kind of a new document. It is not so much populated as a normal document, but it is kind of a document, right? So you feed this query into your model. The model will predict that based on these TFIDF scores, which is the document it is talking about, or which is the class it is talking about. Okay, no, sorry, I'm not getting it. So assuming um, we have four documents, uh, three for me, one for Saraji, we have given some Takes. Based on that, we can create this one. Now, one for version we have created, and we can say, okay, this is also for MCAL machine learning. So ah. that is a class machine learning. So if I am giving some query, so okay. what can I expect out of these five documents? One, two, or three documents can I expect? Am I right? So when you are giving a query, what you have to expect is the most relevant document should come up first followed by the next relevant followed by the next relevant okay so if you are talking about sunil vasan sharad all of them have learned pml and you search a query on pml just saying who uh, like just stating pml then all the documents will come up right so the computer is not wrong everyone has learned pml you have not given him any other information to tell what is statistics? Let's say if you want to say liked PML, right? So out of these three people, right. two people have liked. So based on that query, the document, uh, it, the query will be fed into the model. The model will tell you whether they have liked or not. So liked or not liked is a class there. Yes. Understand? So supervision has to be done. So for example, Sunil's comments. So for example, Amazon reviews, right? So Amazon reviews, how it you know how uh, Amazon will extract features from uh, your uh, reviews. So, for example, Sunil has commented on Amazon. He bought an iPad. He liked it. Okay, and he, he has given five stars. Similarly, uh, Sharad has gone uh, to Amazon. He bought the same product iPad. It is uh, slow. Heats up. So uh, your uh, uh, star rating for him is just two. Vasant has gone to uh, Amazon. He bought an iPad. He says 
it is better than surface window microsoft surface he has given three stars now being an apple company what i'll do is i'll go to the reviews convert all them all of them into tfidf matrix keep the ratings as the values okay keep the ratings as my output or the outcome y variable right and run an algorithm and then i will see which are the features that are important like we saw in our machine learning crime rate was important here also i will see light is more important heating up is important heating up is important because it is leading to a negative review better than surface surface is an important uh, word because there is comparison so you just have three reviews here but imagine people giving thousands of reviews you will get which are the words that are more important that are leading to higher rating so that's how you analyze your data right that's how your machine learning comes into picture so for example your rating will be the supervision your words will be the features and the users will be the rows so based on this you will you you will do everything that you were doing in machine learning you will find out the important variables it will give you an uh, essence of what are the uh, important words that are linking this to the rating how consumers are rating this to the uh, linking this is this to rating okay apart from that you will see if if you write a comment right i want to uh, or let's say if you just uh, enter another user and write a uh, review right like um those surface uh, windows sorry microsoft surface battery life is very bad and then you would see what is the relative rating of your uh, if you enter this that if your battery backup is better than surface then you'll see how better your rating will become and that's how you can work on your battery life to make it more better than surface so that's how people will analyze the national uh, the natural language processing data so natural language processing is a whole umbrella under which first you have to convert the words to numbers so what we have learned is just to convert the words to numbers after you can convert the words to numbers then you can apply your machine learning models right you cannot directly apply the machine learning models to words right yes yeah so i this is great so yeah i think this... i can understand now yeah correct yeah 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 so because features see features already the words had numbers so you ne never had to do anything but words don't have numbers in them so first you have to understand how to convert that into numbers so that is how your natural language processing part will come All right right then i mean your processing your text processing or text mining will come then you'll go on to machine learning models now machine learning models will give you a particular accuracy for unstructured data but for they are very good for structured data but for unstructured data you basically have to apply deep learning concepts to get the best out of it so that's when nlp and deep learning are combined deep learning is applied on nlp databases and then the best is extracted out of it that's why we learn nlp and deep learning together okay okay perfect So, uh, Shuji, Bob, if uh, someone is asking what each NLP, we need to describe in such a way that um, whatever the language we have, we have to correlate, and then we have to uh, retrieve the text based on some query. Is that the correct? No, no, no. Qu retrieving the text is not so. See, retrieving the document yeah. basically another way. Yeah. retrieving the document is information retrieval that is different uh, see like what i told about amazon reviews did they retrieve any document they didn't retrieve any document right they analyzed the documents right so natural language processing is the process of let's see what what google tells that will be better uh, to yeah. understand let's see what natural language processing definition does google tell
the application of computational techniques to the analysis and synthesis of natural language and speech what tfidf is synthesis. the analysis is the part of application of machine learning on it do you see okay. correct and uh, why a speech means voice recognition also comes in nlp yeah. or in deep learning no uh, voice to text is deep learning text to numbers okay. is nlp numbers to analysis is deep learning again okay okay see that's that's why so it's beautifully explained right analysis and synthesis unless you synthesize there's no analyze you see this word uh, cloud yes. okay now let's get back to our slides is there anything which we are going to cover in NLP today? Otherwise, I have a few questions related to machine learning. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's still still not over. We yeah. are. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now um, so just to uh, be knowledgeable about it, when we did a incidence matrix or the binary matrix, we used the jacquard coefficient to match. So, for example, what is jacquard coefficient? is basically a intersection b divided divided by a union b the number of words that match divided by the total number of words that is basically jacquard coefficient okay now jacquard coefficient we have seen that doesn't consider dumb frequency okay now we had seen the term document count matrices see we have seen the term document count bag of words is uh, okay term frequency is seen long frequency log frequency you don't need to wait this document frequency document frequency we continue then we have the idf and then we have the tf idf okay so don't go by the formulas so basically whenever we are scoring the query of the document it is kind of the TF IDF scores summation of all the words in that uh, document that match with the query. So if you see this, sigma of the terms, T is the term belonging to the query intersection document. All the terms that are present in the query, sorry, that are present, uh, all the terms of the query that are present in the document. So if your query is uh, cl online classes in PML, it will only score these words and find out the best possible uh, uh, document. Okay. Summation of the individual scores. Okay. So, this is how your TF IDF matrix will look like. So, for example, Anthony, Brutus, these are the words. Uh, so, they have just done a transpose we have talked about documents on the left side and uh, the features on the top they have done the documents on the top and the uh, words on the left right so this is how your feature ve vector will look like so every word is now converted to a number okay okay now if you guys remember now uh, if you guys remember clustering now 
uh, what were we doing in clustering? So a very important part is clustering of documents. For example, right now I told that these are the documents that belong to sports. These are the documents belong to crime. These are the documents belonging to entertainment, right? Now, for example, if you want to uh, cluster these documents, no one has told you you can also do that in NLP. So once you have converted the words to numbers, then it is very easy sailing for you to convert to use all the machine learning techniques that we have done. So now if you are doing machine learning also, then we can use the unsupervised learning. The only thing that we have to keep in mind is the distance measure that we have to select in clustering. If uh, do you guys remember what was the distance matrix we were selecting in clustering? Are you discussing about k-mean clustering? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, means we are giving the k and based on that we are randomly selected. Then we are getting the average until that mean that is coming is not constant. Correct, correct. That is algorithm. Uh, algorithm, you are correct. I'm asking what was the distance matrix? What was the x1 minus x2 whole square plus y1 minus y2 whole square? Remember that? Yes. Some root mean uh, root square. Mean square you mean. Yeah, root mean square. Yes. So uh, instead of that root mean square, we have to use the cosine similarity in this or the cosine distances. So I'll not go into depth of this. So when uh, if if you guys are interested into NLP, when we start that course, we'll go into depth of how, what is the cosine similarity on uh, what is how we can you cluster the documents based on k-means clustering. You can do a k-means clustering on the documents. You can do a hierarchical clustering on documents. Okay. See, if there are two concepts, just to give you an example, rich uh, is one feature, poor is one feature. Okay, let's say classes. So based on the angle, the closer the angle to the uh, class, that's where it gets clustered. Okay. Okay, so this is all mathematical, no, no need of this. Okay, I think uh, we can close NLP for today. Uh, you guys have any questions on uh, machine learning? We can discuss that. Sorry. Yeah, can you uh, send that iPad file? Um, yeah, this, this thing. Uh, yeah, the notes, right? Yeah, I will send you. I'll send you. Just post it into that same thing. And also, the last week, uh, the um, last last week lecture was also not posted. Yeah, the problem is, I think um, what happened is the video did not get converted. So oh. after the GoTeam meeting ends, right, the video should get converted. The video did not get converted in my machine. So, so um, sorry. For both days, Saturday, Sunday, both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so there was an update issue in my laptop. So today, after the today or by tomorrow, I will post both the lectures and uh, this week's lectures also, uh, as we have. Yes. Yeah. So can we see a uh, code uh, around this one? NLP some can. Or yeah, yeah. We can. Uh, I will show you, but uh, the machine learning code is not there. Uh, yeah, machine learning, uh, machine learning code is not there, but the document similarity, TF, IDA, word net limitizer, word limitizer, everything is there. Uh, my oh. laptop is not uh, opening. I mean, I'm not connected to my laptop today, so that's why I cannot show you. Tomorrow, I have yeah, we can see tomorrow. Mind, um, to show you the code. I have that code ready with me. Okay, okay, that's great. Yeah, so you had some question on machine learning. So I was going, what is this confusion matrix? Okay. One question. Another question, 
although we have covered basically confidence versus accuracy so accuracy that is clear but confidence i was not getting using any library so okay. that okay. is the second thing third thing is one was parametric machine learning another one is non parametric parametric i don't remember the correct name correct para yeah parametrization or para metric that was the parametric and non parametric process correct so this thing, uh, three things basically yeah. uh, it's not clear okay confusion matrix i think we spend a uh, half a class uh, explaining that i think uh, yeah i remember so, but oh yeah uh, okay so i think you have forgotten let me see if i have the notes there Mm. Okay, confidence and accuracy we have. Uh Okay. Anyways, I I think uh, have to search for on that. Okay. So confusion matrix. Okay, I'll explain it again. And uh, okay, let me ask any anyone. Does anyone remember the confusion matrix? does anyone remember doesn't ring a bell we discussed this right uh can you guys hear me yes sir yes we can hear you okay okay yeah so i'm asking uh, we discussed positive negative okay no problem but it's good that sunil you have got, got that uh, because confusion matrix is a very important concept and you don't want to um, leave machine learning without learning this Okay, let me draw a better table for better. so your model a confusion matrix is basically a way of checking the accuracy of your classification model okay like we have rmsc for a uh, linear regression or, or or the regression per se classification should also have a um, accuracy matrix right so confusion matrix is kind of a table that is being used to uh, check the accuracy of your classification model predicted positive so let's say out of 100 actual positive you could predict 90 correctly 10 wrong similarly out of actual negative 20 negative 
you could predict five correctly 15 wrong this is your confusion matrix so this is your actual truth how many of them actually were positive and how many of actually were negative predicted is 90 is positive out of 100 you could predict 90 positive uh, correctly 10 you predicted them as negative similarly for actual negatives you could predict five of them correctly 15 15 of them you predicted wrong so these are called true positives this is called false negative this is called false positive and this is called true negative make sense true positive means you have predicted positive false negative is you have falsely assigned that to a positive to a negative false positive means you have falsely assigned positive to a negative true negative means you are true you have truly assigned a negative to a negative so your overall accuracy is this how many you have correctly classified how many you have incorrectly classified uh, out of the total sorry how many of classified correctly out of the total does this make sense okay so just one thing uh, so this um, first row second column first in this row, we are second saying, column. Yeah, yeah actual positive means that should come in some category x assuming but we are not predicted in that category is that correct no, so for example, uh, okay. assume this as a binary classification, first of all. So binary classification, let's say you were predicting yes, no, or high, low. Correct. So out of 100 high, you have assigned 90 of them, you have assigned high, but 10 of them you have predicted as low. You have predicted as low, but those are high. Am I right? Correct. Yeah, correct. correct. Out correct. of 100 positives, correct. Yeah, I think so. I was asking the same thing. Okay. Okay, now so this makes, yeah. So this this is a confusion matrix, and what does it show? It, it, does it show the accuracy overall accuracy? Are correct. Now, okay, got it. can I also discuss that overall accuracy is not a good measure to keep? Can anyone remember why? I told you F score, geometric mean, all these things we have discussed, right? Someone even asked the question if it is 100%, 100%, what is the geometric mean? Sorry, harmonic mean, F score was harmonic mean. We have discussed this in very good detail, right? What was the problem in overall accuracy? Why we should not use overall accuracy? It's, uh, I think you, you mentioned that if it is a really 100% it is overfitting, something like that. No. Okay. Imagine you have a data set where 95 of them are positive and 5 of them are wrong. Sorry, negative. So out of 195 are positive and five are neg uh, negative. You're in your actual database. You predict all of them positive. What is your accuracy? 100%. No, your accuracy not not 100%, right? Negatives were there, you have predicted everything positive. Oh, so it is 0%, right? No, 95 were positive. Uh -huh. You have predicted 100 positives. What is the accuracy? 95. Exactly. 95% is your accuracy, overall accuracy, right? So TP is 95, TN is 0 divided by 100. So 95% is your overall accuracy, right? 
your screen here screen share was lost sorry sorry it automatically gets yeah so um, tp plus tn is 95 divided by 100 correct are you guys with me yes sir 95% will be like accuracy correct but you have predicted all negatives wrong you have 0% in negative imagine a database where you have to predict who are defaulting any in a credit card do you think out of 100 people 95 people will be defaulting no right five people will be defaulting and no 95 people will not be not, not be defaulting and you say your boss boss i have predicted 95 people will not be no, defaulting i have predicted them correctly i am zero at predicting who are defaulting your boss will say this is not utter nonsense how i don't want to predict people who are not defaulting i want to predict people who are defaulting right so this is where your imbalanced data will affect your accuracy if your data is imbalanced if it is too much one-sided one class is overly populated compared to the other class then you whatever you do if you predict all of them as positive still you will end up at a very good accuracy but is it the true picture no right it is not the true picture out of five negatives you could absolutely predict zero that is bad right you don't want to have an algorithm which predicts only one class right so that's why we introduce something called sensitivity and specificity specificity sensitivity and specificity out of the true positive and false negative i mean out of the actual positives how many could you correctly classify that is your sensitivity out of the actual negatives how could you how many you could classify as actual negatives is your specificity so for example the uh, example i was talking about so your true positive is 95 your false positive is uh so actual is actual is 95 this is zero actual negative is five you have zero you have five okay so predict So out of 100, out of actual positive, you have predicted positive 95. Sorry, uh, I think, uh, yeah, correct, right? Out of actual negative, uh, actual 95 positive, you have predicted for 95 positive. Excellent. Out of negative five, you have, you have also predicted five positive, right? That is totally wrong. So your overall accuracy will be still 95% because 95 plus zero divided by 100. But what will be your specificity? Okay, let me denote this for your better understanding. yeah what will be your specificity just see the formula and tell me this is the formula 95 yeah 95 first yes specificity tell me the specificity by 100. that will be 0.95 yeah 0 by 95 will be 0 right 0 so neil you have to see the formula yeah, sorry, right TN. yeah sorry tp i was looking for tn that is yeah yeah 
So specificity is zero, absolutely zero. What is your sensitivity? Ninety five percent. So one you are very good at, one you are absolutely bad. So you need a combination of these factors to give you a better score. So F score is the harmonic mean of sensitivity and specificity. What is the harmonic mean? What would be the answer of this? It cannot be determined, right? Because one cannot by... Determine. Yeah, uh, so this is kind of a infinite and this is kind of a zero. So F score will not be allowing you to go one. I mean, you be best at one thing and you can be zero at one thing. It doesn't allow. Let's say it is 0 0.01. What will the value for this approximately? So this is. It will be very, very close to zero. You can just calculate. It will be very close to zero. Uh, let's say um, you, if you want to check one by 100 is 0 0.01 plus one by this is 100. So one by 100 0 0.01 right so this will be 0 0.01 sorry 0 0.01 so 0 0.01 is your um, accuracy so even if one is 100 percent other is 0 0.01 percent your actual score f score will be 0 0.01 so you have to be very good at both only when both are 100 then you will be getting your 100 percent accuracy right so if someone asks you what is the best metrics to uh, you know measure your classification problem you should always say f score okay yeah, yeah that's great Sudip, you are really very good uh, no, no problem. This is a very basic issue. No problem. Okay. Um, other answer you uh, question you had plus um, confidence interval versus accuracy, right? Yes. Okay. So for what you wanted to check confidence interval, you said that I could not check the confidence interval. No, no that was confidence versus accuracy. So accuracy, I was doing one example there. It was saying, okay, 98% accuracy I got. Correct. But confidence I couldn't get. Okay, how much confidence uh, it was not giving me. Okay. So normally all the algorithms are designed to operate on a 95% confidence interval basis. So for example, uh -huh. all the uh, algorithms uh, are pre-designed uh, to operate on a 95% confidence interval basis. So whenever you have that object uh, of decision tree, or if that if you go into the depth of these parameters, you'll find a confidence interval. And if you don't find, then it is if that object doesn't find, then it, that object is not statistically dividing the data. It is dividing on the basis of probability, right? So it may happen that all the objects do not give a confidence interval. For example, a linear regression will definitely give you a confidence interval because it de depends on the mean and variance and it assumes a distribution of the parameters. But a decision tree will not have parameter itself, right? It's a non-parametric approach. So if it is a, like I said, if a pro model is a process, it is linear regression is a model of parameters. Y is equal to beta naught plus beta one X plus beta two X. But a decision tree is not parameterized, right? It does not have parameters like 
uh, beta 1, beta 2. It is a process. A particular test comes, it flows through the trees, and the output is given, right? So it's a process. So if you don't have parameters, it will not have the confidence intervals at associated with it okay so every model will not give you a confidence interval but on an app uh, but on the whole every model will uh, whichever is assuming a distribution of parameters will operate on a 95 percent confidence interval basis okay okay what was your third question uh, uh parametric versus non-parametric parametric and non-parametric i think i have already explained uh, just now parametric is the model which has Equa as an equation form can you tell me the equation of a linear regression yes you can tell me by the slopes and the signs you can tell me this is the equation of what is equal to beta naught plus beta 1 x plus beta 2 x 2 okay can you tell me the equation of a decision tree no no because it doesn't give no. an equation it is a process it is kind of random building forest. a tree random see. forest is also a process k nearest neighbors is also a process there is no particular equation associated with it okay so it doesn't have parameters okay perfect. thank you thanks a lot Suri. okay no problem at all so any other questions so what are basically uh, related tomorrow we are going to cover important topic deep learning so what are we going to cover tomorrow so tomorrow we will cover very basics of deep learning why uh, deep learning what are the advantages of deep learning over machine learning and what are the different uh, algorithms that you can see in deep learning so very basic oh. approach yeah with so, different at least different algorithms we will go not in depth but by name or with some definitions yeah just by name we will go not in depth uh, because each of the algorithms will take a different class so uh, the algorithm so just let, just uh, taking a feedback from you guys. Do you guys um, want to go into deep learning and NLP as a different course? I'm just asking you guys. So not in uh, NLP, but definitely I'll be interested in deep learning. Okay. Uh, what are, uh, what about other guys? Why? So why I don't know, but. No, no, no. Uh, I'm asking about yeah, other Vasant, Vasant. Yeah. Mm, I'm interested in NLP. Okay. But uh, NLP is dependent on uh, deep learning or both. So as are... I said, uh, I mean NLP you can learn independent of deep learning, but that will not be more. That will not be much useful for you because. Uh, NLP and to get the best out of NLP, you have to go into deep learning. Okay. Okay. So probably if you guys are interested, so if let's say that's that that was my particular objective for the question is that let's say for example you are interested in NLP, Sunil is interested in deep learning, and let's say some other guy is interested in both. So maybe i can talk to ashok and have an integrated course so that both the things are taught and so for example three classes we have nlp with deep learning i mean three classes first we have deep learning or normal machine learning things and then three other classes we have nlp and deep learning or if uh, you guys want we can have a thing have separate nlp and deep learning and then a separate deep learning that also we can have but that will i have to discuss for the show so uh, what about was uh, who answered sunil after that who answered i i could not recognize yeah, your who, who said, uh, yeah sharad uh, what about you uh, for the timing i would like a job concept so okay okay you know. okay okay great great that is also i think a good uh, option to do so for example uh, if you get more practice and get more hands on on machine learning first and then you can go on for deep learning that is also a good decision so um, let me talk to ashok so vasant you would like to just have nlp i don't want to go into deep learning much but maybe you if you go tomorrow if you see tomorrow and maybe your interest might change let's yeah, see right yeah you're right so, yeah i will decide tomorrow 
yeah but i think uh, deep learning is more important compared to nlp because nlp is still a more research uh, field people are still trying to get the best extract out of it uh, but deep learning is kind of little matured now and so now that you have learned machine learning properly deep learning will make more sense to get applied on the structured data and get the best out of it and then you so for example boosting and all whatever you have done deep learning is another is a step ahead of boosting in some cases i would not say in all cases but in some cases and if you combine nlp and deep learning i mean it's just a different world you can do wonders with it so anyways that that's uh, something we can discuss later a genuine question so nlp is more related to data right and is more um, related to data processing and then deep learning is the algorithm right yeah so for example what we saw in the definition of nlp today right now so what we saw is synthesis and analysis so synthesis is nlp's most complex area right so enough structured data you don't know don't need to synthesize the data much right so you have already have the data in a structured format you just need to get some cleaning and then you can apply your models but in nlp your structuring and synthesis is very important so once you have that ready then your algorithms can go but if your structuring and synthesis is wrong then god will not able to save the model right so i mean deep learning is very small in front of it so natural language processing a lot of things go into the synthesis part how to make your data more meaningful so for example how to extract the context out of uh, your so context extraction is called something called a word to vec there's a model which in, in employs deep learning and tries to synthesize natural language processing and get the context of the sentences right so deep learning is an essential part where deep learning is also used to synthesize natural language processing so it's very you know mingled it is not two separate entities it's mingled but natural language processing <coughs> as a whole is the synthesis of text data Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay then we'll close for today then. Um, I think tomorrow is the last class, so I'll definitely miss these hours we spent with the, each other learning and you know discussing so many things. Uh, looking forward to you know have more interactions. tomorrow will be the last class let's see uh, i think we'll end it on a good note okay yeah okay. that should be good thanks a lot sudeep thank you good night should do thank you so much yeah good night everyone bye good night good morning actually yeah bye sure
No, I don't have. Okay, Basan, you're good. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Then, uh, without any further delay, let's start with today's session. Uh, I will give me two minutes. I will share my iPad screen. Okay, you guys can see my screen. Yes. Yes, able to see that. Okay. So today's topic, as we have discussed, is um, deep learning. Uh, so why we need to de you learn deep learning? Like right? why machine learning was not sufficient for everything? I mean, why doesn't it solve every problem that we have? Why is deep learning essential? The first point is that. The next point is how does deep learning, how is deep learning different from machine learning? I mean, what are its pros or what are its advanced complexities that it that helps deep learning to solve problems which machine learning could not do? Okay, so as you can see, Artificial intelligence is a very big thing, right? So, for example, even an automation, a simple macro, which, you know, makes your life easier, make automate, automates it, I can call that under artificial intelligence, okay? So, artificial intelligence is a very big um, circle, okay? It involves a lot of things. Then we see machine learning. How machine learning has evolved is like how we can have the data use my machine to get learn the past historicals and learn the past patterns and based on that I can predict okay so that is something that uh, you know machine learning enables you to do deep learning is further subset of machine learning okay so many people have this confusion that deep learning is much bigger than artificial intelligence no Deep learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. It is a subset of machine learning. So deep learning helps you to solve more niche problems. Okay. So some things which machine learning cannot do, deep learning does. However, something which machine learning can do, deep learning also can do. Okay. So deep learning is more powerful is more um, let's say uh, uh, it's more ambidextrous compared to machine learning right machine learning can solve a limited set of problems so machine learning does very good on structured data so if your data is as I told in form of an excel sheet machine learning is well suited for that okay so why so Sunil had this question, why you don't want to go into deep learning directly? Why you want, don't want to go to deep learning di directly? One, again, from the beginning, you have to think that you don't know God's function. So God may be using a very simple function to generate the data. So going to deep learning will not help. So you should always start with simpler models and then go to deep learning. One, a single point. Second, deep learning always works on uh, always works good on when you have lots of data if you have just 30 points or 100 points or 1000 points deep learning will not help why it will not help we will try to understand that but so machine learning and deep learning so if i can you know make some distinctions needs moderate amount of data Deep learning needs a lot of data. Works on structured data. 
works on both structured and unstructured data okay so deep learning is more as i said ambidextrous it can operate on both structured data and unstructured data okay uh let's let us see what are the limitations of machine learning let's say uh if you have a lot of dimensions in the data so for example if you have let's see let's say we have seen uh, till now 10 or 12 dimension mean features okay so let's say you have a lot of features thousand features you have right and it is not possible for you to extract features from that okay so machine learning will fail in cases where you have lot of dimensions so machine learning will not be able to understand the patterns in the dimensions another problem is where you don't have features like for example natural language processing you are kind of generating words as numbers but those are not actual features it is something like that that the user is generating right those are not actual features those are something which i have generated from the data right so maybe maybe they, they are good maybe they are not very good maybe they are absolutely bad so features when someone gives you an excel sheet you have those features ready right so income is there age is there uh, your um, let's say occupation is there income is there height is there weight is there so someone has given you all, all the features what if someone has given you just an excel sheet doesn't have the features has not given you features and let's say even okay now let's take an example suppose you want to predict that whether uh, there will be rain tomorrow okay so for example someone has given you whether what is the wind velocity what is the um, uh, um, temperature where you are located what are the uh, possible high tide and low tide uh, timings all of this they have given you okay but they have forgotten to give you humidity so whatever you do you will not be able to extract the feature called humidity from these things right i think uh, did you guys lose my screen yeah yes yeah i think yeah okay so um humid so someone has not given you humidity right so you machine learning will not be able to generate the feature called humidity from all these data deep learning can do that how it can do that we will see the other limitation is for example there is an image okay now image as i told you is a matrix is a three dimensional um matrix where you have the pixels of red blue green okay that's it it, it is a three dimensional matrix matrix which has the pixels density of these three colors has anyone come up to you and said that okay this picture has uh, let's say it's a picture of a car so has anyone told you okay uh, the picture features are four wheels are there they are black they are uh, the color color of the card is red there are two headlights no no one has come and told you what are the features right you have to be intelligent enough your algorithm has to be intelligent enough that the, it can extract the features from the image that machine learning cannot do okay so understand this why machine learning fails in such scenarios because you have not told the machine learning algorithm that these are the specific features as we used to give initially right now what you have given is a set of numbers or a set of words okay and you are asking that algorithm algorithm to predict so you are leaving the uh, feature generation to the algorithm and asking him to devise its own features right that is a challenge for machine learning however deep learning can do so uh, okay now if you have understood this let's see how uh, what are the general deep learning uh, usages 
Now, for example, you have a image of a cat. Okay. This image of a cat, as I told you, is represented in a three-dimensional matrix. Okay. Now, what it is doing is it is extracting features from these matrices and kind of trying to collaborate. Okay. So, what it is doing is kind of collaborating different parts of the image okay so it is taking these parts these parts and you see such kind of a filter this is called a filter so using this filter it is kind of narrowing down to features okay so it is narrowing extracting information from the original matrix and it is narrowing down it will narrow down to let's say the number of categories of the data for example you just had cat and dog in your database and you want to predict whether the image is of a cat and a dog so from the initial image the c1 it is trying to extract information in steps and kind of ending ending up in a two dimensional matrix where it will say whether it is a cat or whether it is a dog how it is doing we will see slowly but understand this thing here you have not told that the image has four legs whether it has feather it whether it has two eyes whether it has tail or not okay you have just given the image to the algorithm the algorithm is smart enough to extract information from the pixels of the data and kind of collaborating the information in steps to find out the final category. Okay. Now, any questions here? No, no, should be from me. Okay. So, Neil? No question. Okay. So, just uh, forget this uh, left side, whatever the architecture is. Just un understand how what is the pro uh, I mean power of deep learning. See, if you can see on the right hand side, given an image, the deep learning can tell you where is the light on the wall, where are people in the background, where is a man sitting on a table, man with black hair, man wearing blue jeans. Everything it can automatically tell from the image. You'd so, for example, in Facebook, right, when you put up a photo, many a times it automatically tells you whether you want to tag this person or not. How does it do it? It, you, it uses the same uh, phenomena of deep learning. What it does is it recognizes your images and it sees that what are the, who are the possible people in your, uh, I mean, in your photos that you have posted in historically. And based on that, it identifies the structure of that person from the image and tells you that uh, a suggestion that this person want to tag this person. And many 99% it is correct, right? It tells you the that do you want to tag this this and this fellow in your photo. So if from an, no one did you tell uh, did you ever tell Facebook that my friend who is like four uh, six feet tall wears black uh, t-shirt. Uh, where's blue jeans, where's uh, these shoes, this guy is my, uh, let's say, this guy is Sharad for me. Did any, ever, did you ever tell Facebook that? No, right? You have never told Facebook the features of Sharad. Sharad is automatically being understood by Facebook through his uh, image, okay? So, Sunil might have posted so many pictures with Sharad on Facebook. <clears throat> now, if he posts a new photo, Facebook will see who are the probable people with whom Sunil uh, posts <coughs> the picture and based on Sharad's contour Facebook will tell uh, do you want to tag Sharad in your photo that's how it does so this is called caption generation right so whenever you see an image you kind of derive captions now all these are supervised learning right someone some or the other day uh, Sunil had tagged Sharad in his photo he, he didn't tell although he didn't he didn't tell how Sharad looks like but he told Facebook 
that this person is Sharad by tagging him. Facebook is very intelligent so that when after he has done, okay, just let me increase the screen. Uh, it automatically stops whenever it crosses two minutes, I think. That's right. Just a second. Okay. Just a second. Okay, so it automatically understands that. Uh, so Sunil might have tagged Sharad in his photos uh, prior uh, some day. Now Facebook is very intelligent that it kind of extracts that data. Okay. Now this is a very interesting application. Suppose you have input some sequence of a story. John moved to the garden. John got the apple, John moved to the kitchen and uh, something, uh, you know, uh, some new sentence come up. Sandra got milk there. John dropped the apple. John moved to office. Now, if you ask a question, where is the apple? It can tell you that it is in the kitchen. So this is called. It is kind of remembering things. OK, so. It is rem it has remembered that John moved to the garden that he got the apple. Then he moved to kitchen. He dropped the apple in kitchen and then he left. There is no mention of apple in the next sentence. So based on that, it can tell you where is the apple. So if, let's say in business scenarios, uh, like for example, time series problems, right? If you want to predict what is the sales for uh, in the next two, three months, right? So sales prediction is something called a memory uh, which is dependent on the uh, past memory, right? So how has the sales been in the last year, this time, how the sales have been in the previous month, how the sales have of the competitor products have been. So um, sales forecasting is something which you can uh, relate this to. Right, so a lot of um, different, different things. So these things machine learning cannot tell you, right? Because you are not inputting features in these. You are just inputting sentences and deep learning is itself learning the algorithms to understand what is the, uh, you know, uh, what is the sequence, what is the image, okay? Okay. Uh, other other uh, phenomena what deep learning can do is, for example, you enter a caption, you the small, for example, the image search in Google, right? You kind of um, type in uh, your query and based on that, it also gives you images, right? It also gives us videos. How does it do that? So images, so it learns the same caption, uh, image generation from caption algorithm where in you type your query and from that your image will be generated and it will give you the possible images. So this is how uh, your deep learning can influence. Okay. So neural networks are not very new. Okay. People have been uh, trying ha on hands on neural networks since very old age. Okay. So neural networks, initially they were used for binary classification. Uh, they had a lot of hype, but then they died out in 1990s. Then uh, back propagation, we will understand what is back, back propagation. Okay, then neural networks uh, take the back seat because they, as we did support vector machines, right? Uh, we learned support vector machines. They were introduced in 1990s and they were far more outperforming uh, than neural networks at that point of time then you see this uh, this difference access to large data sets and more competition allow deep networks to return and have the state of the art results in uh, speech vision natural language processing okay so as i said deep learning can uh, you know it's awesome for unstructured data it's good for structured data also it can beat many machine uh, learning algorithms but machine learning cannot handle unstructured data. Okay, so that you have to keep in mind. Okay, now 
what is the difference between classical machine learning what we have learned and deep learning so for example if some uh, let's say someone gives you an image of a car and then you want to you know tell which car it is what you will do you have an n cross n matrix let's say these these are the pixels of the data 28 cross 28 okay what you want to do is convert this to let's say 10 features and using those 10 features you can fit all the models that we have learned right and then you predict the vehicle now who will tell you these 10 features will you will it be you will it be me will it be some other person no one is going to tell you that is the problem if someone was an expert right so let's say this is in honda car so a person from honda knows what will be the features of its honda car if it is a mercedes brand a person from mercedes will can tell you but are you going to call your people from honda or people from mercedes there may be maybe 20 brands are you going to call experts from each of the brands and ask them what are the features of their car that can be extracted from the photo no right that is not what you do you may as well uh, do it manually right if you can if you need to call so many people so from an image you have to design k features and then apply an algorithm what if i say that i don't need to use any feature selection just give me the image i will tell you which car it is okay that's the power of deep learning so good feature selection is challenging like what we saw in our boston housing data set right so we had uh, done a feature selection algorithm first ingredient boosting it gave us what are the important features then we run an algorithm but we saw that it how uh, your feature importance is being generated so every time so for example if you have 20 features is this okay if you have thousand features and then it says 100 or 200 of them are important how will you manage your algorithm it's very difficult to manage right so that's where your good feature selection will feel right you will not able to understand which are the 200 i should take if my limitations are uh, less how can i incorporate those so that's where the deep learning comes into part you give me the image i will learn the pixels from the image and no need to select features the algorithm will do it on its own okay so feature extraction is automatic that is the biggest advantage of deep learning okay any doubts till now no doubts are you getting the essence uh, or is it like a little difficult to understand no basically up to this what we have covered yeah Forget about the machine learning, the deep learning, the first task is to feature instruction, then feature reduction. Uh -huh. These are the two things. So, how we will do that, I think so. Uh, you will cover after this one. Correct, correct. Okay. So, from all this story, these are the two things we have got that it will automatically extract the features and also it will uh, reduce features correct correct so uh, wasn't any uh, doubts from your side no all good okay until now so uh, to understand deep learning first you have to understand what are frameworks so frameworks are nothing but uh, so for example in machine learning you had packages in deep learning you have frameworks Okay, so just put that analogy. So in machine learning, you had these packages which were doing your calculations and just giving you an output. Deep learning cannot be done through packages, the normal packages that Python has. So it, you have to install some framework. So the most common framework that is used is the TensorFlow. It is from Google. So using Google Tensor, Google's TensorFlow, what you can do is you can represent, so all these images, so like these are three dimensional matrices, right? So all these calculations can be done much faster in TensorFlow. Yeah, 
Sorry? Your voice is breaking. My voice is breaking? Uh, Seems maybe a bit of action. Okay. Uh, Can you hear me? Now it's better. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Uh, just give me two minutes. Uh, I think my iPad has. Okay. Uh, guess just give me um, two minutes. I'll just be back. Yeah, two minutes. Okay, I'm back. So now uh, where we we uh, we were discussing about TensorFlow. So as you uh, just I think the voice is echoing. You guys can hear me properly, right? Yes. Okay. So what we I was discussing is uh, Google's TensorFlow is one of the most famous uh, frameworks where you need to you need to do deep learning, right? So in order to de do deep learning, you have to install a framework. Okay, so Neon is from Intel. TensorFlow is from Google. Uh, PyTorch is from Python, I think. But all these frameworks can be installed in Python, right? So it's not that you have to go do learn a different language. Uh, just the framework needs to be installed in uh, your this thing. So how what is how is deep learning? Uh, you know, uh, used. It is used in video recognition. It is used in clustering. 
it is used in image recognition speech recognition more data more accuracy that's the simple funda of uh, deep learning okay okay now it here comes the difficult part okay now i'll be very slow in making you understand these things because this is a little tough uh, but this is the backbone of deep learning right so what the like the question sunil had uh, how it is helping us to generate features we will understand from here okay just bear with me and let's try to understand this slowly okay so let's say uh, your Im there is an image okay let's start with an image so that image is 28 cross 28 these are 784 pixels okay so those pixels will be fed to the data just understand this so uh, i have not told anything about <coughs> sorry <coughs> so i have not told anything about uh, features right so i have just given you the image the image has pixels so all these 784 pixels of a single image okay so right now we are talking about a single row like your you had your data frame in machine learning uh, your sing first row second row third row like this okay now you have first image this image itself is a 28 cross 28 then you have then you have the second image you have 28 cross 28 third image 28 cross 28 okay so are you understanding this how your data is flowing so you mean uh, every x x i that is equivalent and so equivalent to an image when you feed in this row first row so this is about image 1 we are talking about okay so this this is image 1 and there are 784 pixels of uh, a single image okay so understand like like let's let's understand this so for example your in your conventional just i think it is my ipad is hanging uh, just a sec the other apps okay so uh, for example uh, in your conventional data set what you had you had features here and you had rows here right right yeah yeah yes so now what you have you have rows here which are images and these are your pixels seven eighty four pixels are the features so for example when you feed in the first image how many x will be there a uh, 784 you mean exactly so a single image will have now let us call those pixels as features a single image will have 784 features it means every x is representing an pixels right yeah 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 okay till now it is clear clear yes okay yeah let me just restart uh, my one note app i think it's little hanging
Okay. So we have understood that there are 784 pixels and each of these, these pixels are the features. Okay. So this is clear to us now. Now, pay your attention to how the lines from the input layer to the hidden layer are flowing. So each pixel, so each pixel is flowing to the other, uh, other. Let's say, now let's say your hid, hidden layer has 500 features. Okay, so let's say your A1, A2, A3, A4 to A5 is let's say 5 till 500. Okay. Now, just a sec. So let's say these are till A. Sure, sure. A su a su a su a su will be part two things basically. Why 500? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm explaining. Slowly, wait. Okay, uh, okay. Let me complete, right? Otherwise, how will I explain? Let me complete. So let's say it is 500. So what you're doing is, understand this. You're combining the pixels in such a way that 784 features now can be represented into 500 features. Are you getting it? So what you have done, each of these features, let's say this is our new feature that is being generated. This is a new feature. A1 is a new feature that is being generated. Now this new feature is taking inputs from all the 784 features. The next second feature, this is also a new feature. This is also taking inputs from all the 784 features. So what you are trying to do, you are creating new, new uh, 500 new features, which are the combinations of the 784 features. So right now, let's see, for example, the uh, earlier example that I told you, you are being given wind velocity, you are giving, uh, now let's, let's write it here, okay? So now let's say you had a traditional machine learning problem. Now you had, uh, one is wind velocity, one is uh, temperature, okay? One is, let's say, uh, sun intensity, okay? One is, let's say, uh, tide, high tide or low tide uh, and uh, the other one is let's say uh, what can you say uh, wind velocity temperature sun intensity tide and uh, last rainfall whether it was uh, two days back or three days back so suppose you want to have uh, these are the features now let's say there are how many features one two three four, five, five features. Now you're creating a new data frame. Okay. You're creating a new data frame. Let's say now you want just three features. You don't want five features. You want three features. Now each of these three features is a combination of these three or these five. So your first feature, new feature generated is a combination, let's say wind velocity plus temperature divided by sun intensity plus tide minus rainfall. Okay, so this can be a new feature. Using the earlier five features, you are creating a new feature combination. Hello? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so next. The second new feature is again a combination and let's say wind velocity into temperature plus rainfall minus tide. And the third feature is sun into tide minus rainfall. Okay. So can you see what I have done from the initial five features? I've gone into new three features, which are a combination of the earlier five features. 
so initially you had 784 features if you take the analogy now now you are creating new 500 features out of these 784 which are a combination of the earlier 784 features why are you doing this because you are doing this because this combined feature may have a representation which was not earlier present when it was independently present so for example humidity humidity may be a function of these things and humidity is a very important feature that the data frame never had initially so humidity may be a combination of these features that you have got let's say this thing this may be rainfall for tomorrow this can be a function for that you never know i'm not saying that it, this exactly the feature but you never know it is in your in that hope that you are trying to build a kind of a new features which takes into the consideration the earlier features and combining them into such a way that the new features are more giving you more in information to your problem. Is this clear till now? Uh, Shubhdeep, I have a question that um, how does it generate five features from five features to three features? Means how does it calculate those? Correct. That, I'll come to that. I'll come to that. The how part, just leave it aside. I'll come to that, how it is doing. Uh, okay. Right now, okay. is the what uh, clear? I mean, what we are doing is clear? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. So, Neil, for you also, it is clear what we are trying to do? Yeah, it's clear. Basically, we are reducing the features. Okay. But how, that is the question I am waiting for. Yeah, yeah. You did not necessarily reducing. The main important part is combining the features in certain particular uh, combinations such that it becomes more yeah, or, informative. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. In another way, we are applying some function. Which function is that? Yeah. So based on that, we are getting some new. Okay. So similarly, from 500, you will reduce to 200. Then you will reduce to according to the number of hidden layers. So for example, I keep five hidden layers. So after five of, at the fifth layer, let's say we have reduced to 50 features. From 50 features, finally, you will reduce to the number of features that your, uh, or, or the number of classes you want to predict. For example, you have to predict cat, dog, horse. So what it will do is slowly, slowly and slowly it will, so for example, let's take this example. So now you have three features. Now you want to predict whether uh, there will be rainfall or not tomorrow. Okay. Suppose after you have got these three features, now you have to predict whether there, there will be rainfall or not. So what it will do, it will further combine these three features and get one feature which will predict yes and the other feature which will predict no. Now how it is doing? Now we will see. Okay. Now let's go back to the image. So what it it, it does is. Shush, one question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Basically, in this, uh, we have got y one, y two, or whatever output few predictors we have got. So based on that predictor, we have to decide whether there will be tomorrow rain or not. Correct. So it means again we have some previous data, uh, structured data somewhere from which we will predict this new value. Yeah, yeah. Or, or you have this structured data, right? I'm just giving an analogy between the image and the uh, data set, right? L right now, what we were, are, are working on images, okay? So you have so many. Okay, uh, let me let me first complete the process, then we can answer the questions. Let me first complete this process. So. Okay. So you have got your output here. Now, how you are doing this? So what you are doing is your A1 is something called WX1 plus WX2 plus like this W784 X784 plus bias. So A1 is a linear combination of the X1 to 784 features. 
similarly a2 is a, a different linear combination so let's say w1 or let's say v1 x1 plus v2 x2 plus v3 x3 till like this v74 784 x 784 plus uh, let's say bias this was capital b1 this is capital b2 what it is do now understand this very slowly let's see what it is doing is it is assigning the weights for example in neurons how it does is it is basically assigning weights to these connections and forming a1 as a linear combination of all the 784 pixels similarly a2 is a linear combination of all the x1 to 784 and forming a2 then similarly it will uh, calculate now once you have understood this layer this layer is again the same right again from a1 it is combining a1 to a1 to a500 and it is combining through different weights and it is calculating this okay now how will these weights be calculated these weights are calculated by a phenomena called back propagation now see um, i agree deep learning is a little difficult but let's try to understand now let's let's say we have three features okay x1 x2 x3 let's uh, learn from our simple uh, example so we have income we have age and we have let's say uh, work x okay and we want to predict whether he will buy a high in a high budget house or a low budget house that's how what we want to predict okay now let's let's start this uh, uh, problem let let me draw this properly let's say my uh, there are three people the data contains three people the first one has an income of 2000 age of 23 work x of 5 years budget of the house is low one has 20000 age is 27 work x is 2 years budget is high and other uh, is let's say 50000 age is 50 work x is let's say 20 years and budget is high now you want to predict for someone who is 40000 age is 46 and work x is 12 years that's your objective now you have learned your machine learning okay you have got certain accuracy fine now your boss tells i want you to apply deep learning i want to get a better accuracy you say okay no problem now let's understand how your deep learning will work let's say let's take the first person your first point your age is what uh, sorry your um, uh, income is 20000 age is 23 and work x is 5 so let's say you want to build a deep learning network neural network that contains two features okay so this is some let's say 22000 uh, w1 2000 plus w2 23 plus w3 5 plus b1 this is uh let's say x1 2000 plus x2 23 plus x3 5 plus b2 okay and then you have your output this is your high 
this is your low okay now again this is let's say a1 and a2 again you have some weights which are let's say capital a capital a2 so high is capital a a1 plus capital a2 a2 plus uh, bias is let's say m1 and this one has capital b1 a1 plus capital b2 a2 and it has a bias called m2 so what you have done is now understand this very properly what you have done is instead of using these features to calculate this output you have introduced a hidden layer in between okay this is your hidden layer this is your uh, calculation that the model is doing you are not doing anything so between this earlier your machine learning was using this input and calculating this output right but what you have done you are very smart you have done introduced something called a hidden layer hidden layer what it is doing is it is kind of combining the features in such a way that they are a linear combination of the present features forget this bias first it's a linear combination of w1 2000 plus w2 23 plus w3 5 then again this one is x1 2000 plus x2 23 plus x3 5 forget this by b2 for some time being. okay using these features now it is predicting your high and low what you were doing in machine learning from this layer to this layer you are going directly deep learning introduces a layer in between that which is calculating new features based on the initial features you have now how is this being calculated that would have be your next question right how do you say how you are calculating w1 w2 w3 x1 x2 x3 then again a1 a2 b1 b2 right that should be your question now there's something called a back propagation algorithm now before we go to this let's remember what we did for stochastic gradient do you guys remember stochastic gradient how we were reducing the rmse in linear regression guys you there yes yes do you remember how we were doing stochastic gradient the water and the ball effect do you remember you had this function your water droplet was here you wanted to achieve the minimum point uh, basically that was related when we did um, i think so lasso and reach uh, not lasso reach linear regression at the time when we were linear regression we were doing my y is a plus bx and my this is my predicted and my actual y is uh, y so y minus y hat we were summing up and reducing remember minimizing of summation of y minus y bar this was your cost function in yes. regression remember come on give me a confident yes remember yes or no yes yeah remember right so yes how we got a plus bx you remember we were we were differentiating and getting the value of a and bx a and b okay uh, i think you have forgotten so what essentially we did in linear regression we had a predicted value we had assumed these coefficients now that see that's why the problem is uh, if you don't have the basics of machine learning very strong your deep learning will not be that useful so you have to understand why we spend so much time in machine learning when we remember we had this line uh, we, we were doing and we were reducing these 
distances based on that we were yeah. finding the a and b's of the um, uh, line right yes yeah, yeah. Right? so for that we were using stochastic gradient where uh, your particular uh, at current point you are here you want to achieve the minimum point so you differentiate and get the values of a and b and that will be your uh, best line remember now yes yeah correct need so to the, find out the nearest uh, yeah the best line that passes from through the uh, which is the closest yeah. to all the points right so that was our objective so yeah. what we were doing we were actually mathematically what we were doing we were differentiating a and b and then coming back to our i mean what we were doing we were minimizing this function right this, even in the cost uh, quiz you guys kind of told correctly this was the cost function uh, and we were reducing this cost function right remember this is the rmse minimization yes. of the rmse right yes, yes or no yeah yes yeah okay perfect yes yes please you so same similarly what you are doing here is instead of that direct linear regression where you are forming y is equal to 2000 uh, okay now this is a logistic regression so it doesn't matter but uh, just try to understand let's say high is uh, instead of high we have 50000 and in low we have 20000 okay so we just so that you don't get confused in between why we are predicting continuous variable so let's say in linear regression what you were doing you were trying to find out 50000 as a function of a into 2000 plus b into 23 plus c into 5 plus a constant function constant right d was there right and then you were finding a b c from the data Okay, now let me write it more, uh, which is beta naught plus beta one into two thousand plus beta two into twenty three plus beta three into five. This is the linear regression equation, right or wrong? Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes. Okay, so it means. The, the fact that you are trying to predict fifty thousand directly from these features in linear regression, in deep learning, what you are trying to do, you are trying to find out fifty thousand as a function of a one. Let's say this is the same as b one. In term, in instead of two thousand, now you have a one plus a two. Instead of b two, you have a two. And instead of 23, you have a2. Instead of these three features, you have two features with different coefficients, and these features are also derived from these things. Are you getting the point? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We, basically, we have the same form. We are using the same. You are using formula the same form. Like linear regression. You are using the same form, but, but now you are using different coefficients and different features. Yes. The features are a linear combination of the features that were given to you. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so Neil, any questions now? No, no I got this one. Could you minimize this screen so that I can see the table and the picture which you have drawn? Because I, it seems I am understanding back propagation now. What I want to see correlate these two table versus the picture. Yeah. Okay, you ask me your doubt so that I can clear it and it becomes more e easy for you to understand. What What is your doubt right now? I I'm, I feel that you are not very confident right now. So just let me know what is your doubt first. Just a second. I'll decrease the time. Okay. No, I don't have any doubt. Sure. Because I am not feeling that confident. Yeah, sure. Uh, did you understand? No, no, basically, basically just. 
okay okay i'll ask you one by one uh, sunil tell me what you are doing different in deep learning what you are doing doing trying to do basically we have introduced some hidden layer excellent excellent number of layers whatever and uh, basically on the left hand side whatever the input income we have put there or not income basically first row we have put there uh huh and based on that finally we are calculating whether that is high or low Okay. So for in this whole model, we are trying to find out for high. If we move from left to right, what will be our W or weight from weightage? Excellent, excellent. Which we are seeing bit on bit, and so because we are going from right to left to get this value, it seems due to this figure, it's called back propagation. Amazing, awesome! I would say, claps for you. Excellent. So you have understood this properly. So. We, so on uh, one more, but basically I want to correlate this table versus the image which we have created. So why I we have we, put we to, I? We will go to that. Wait. Okay. Don't, don't jump. Uh, don't jump. Slowly understand each of the things slowly. First, uh, okay. Clear at this point of time. This is clear, right? Vasant, it is clear to you also. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. Good. Now, imagine that I say I don't want just a single hidden layer. I want multiple hidden layers. So, what will be your uh, inference out of it? So, for example, instead of only one hidden layer here, I have multiple. So, let's say you have uh, your you have five features. Now understand this. For example, you have five features. Okay. Now, using these five features, you have gone to a hidden layer. Each of these neurons, these are called neurons, is a combination of these five features. So you have reduced from five, you have gone to three. From three, you have gone to two, and then from two, you have gone to your final output. now let me ask you a question what if from instead of five features i just drop to three features without this combination what will be the difference but you will miss uh, some of the some of the expectation correct some of the information you missed so for example in machine yeah. learning when when we were doing uh, our machine learning and i was saying that instead of five features you have three features these were unimportant so your hidden layer was kind of looking like this we never said that it was a hidden layer at that point of time and using this layer you are trying to find out the output so this is a very typical machine learning uh, diagram if you can see these are the five features and from these five features you are extracting three important 
and from three important you are trying to predict the final class classes so neil is this clear so instead of using just these five i am saying no i don't want to ignore these it can be the fact that this feature which i have left out when it is combined with the first feature it is important maybe this feature when it is combined with this feature this becomes also important right so that's why i am allowing all features to talk to each other so this this thing is allowing all the features to talk to each other similarly this feature is allowing all the features to talk to each other and it is now telling me that this thing when in combination with these five features this is really important similarly this is taking into consideration all the five features and combining these features i am able to predict the classes so neil any problem now wasn't any questions now what you will be really important all these three will be important am i right yeah oh okay i mean okay you got confused by the diagram these three are really important like that no no basically all five we are combining and we are getting one three basically yeah yeah so how again that is going how you have not understood get yeah up now it's clear ni nee, up till now it is clear now i have given you a hint of how we are doing right what we are doing is okay um, how will i explain uh, the uh okay let us see now you have three features okay let 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 us do it properly again suppose you have income age and okay so let's say your first feature is beta income sorry beta 1 income plus beta 2 age plus beta 3 workx do you understand this equation yes sure yeah this is the linear equation we are getting from input and we are getting a combination of okay now let let us try the second neuron let's say the equation is e1 in front plus c2 h plus c3 vertex okay yes okay so this feature okay now now let let us let us uh, uh take out your calculators let's say b1 is 20 b2 is 30 uh, b4 is 10 and c1 is uh, 10 c2 is 60 c3 is 40 okay your income income is let's say 100 age is 25 work x is 2 years can you calculate me this neuron the value of this neuron and value of this neuron i i will wait calculate me this please me by the screen please okay uh, yeah it, it is coming so that you so that we can see yeah yeah it is coming there's a lag uh, small amount uh, yeah now okay 20000 20 2000 seven years 750 or just सात सौ सत्तर और यहाँ पे ट्वेंटी थाउजेंड टू थाउजेंड टू सेवन नाइन जीरो विल बी द फर्स्ट वन फर्स्ट वन इस टू सेवन वेल ये आर टू फिफ्टीन बिकाय द सेकेंड वन विल बी वन थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी फाइव हंड्रेड एक्टी टू फाइव एट जीरो हाउ मच टू फाइव एट जीरो ओके आई एम नॉट सॉरी पच्चीस जैसे आर टू फाइव एट जीरो इट शुड बी 
okay i'm not checking the values so now yeah but whatever we are we are getting some yeah okay now let's say uh your what where is the table for example your table initially 100 25 2 and the uh, house he was buying was of 2000 units so what was your linear regression equation 2000 is equal to some b0 100 plus b1 25 plus b2 2 this was your linear equation right linear regression equation right yes now instead of b not yeah if 2012 is the target yeah correct 2000 is the target now i am saying this is not anymore your equation your new equation is understand or not okay yes sir instead of 100 to 25 and 2 we are getting 2790 and 2580 now your question should be how you got these how you got the values of b1 b2 b3 uh, I mean B1, B2, B4 and C1, C2, C3, right? That should be your question? Yeah. Yes. Now, when you told me about back propagation, you have yourself answered your question. So what we are doing is, first we have devised an algorithm that works from here. So for example, you are combining B1 into 100 plus B2 into H plus B3 into work X. Similarly, you are taking C1 into income plus C2 into age plus C3 into work X. And then you're combining this in D1. So for example, what is D1? D1 is again a linear combination of this neuron and this neuron, right? Your, this, this output is a linear mm -hmm. combination of this, this and this. So it will also have weights. So every, every connection has a weight, right? This connection was B1, this connection was B2, this connection was B3. Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. You, un you are understanding? Yes. Vasan, is it clear to you? Uh, I'm not getting the... See, if you don't ask me questions, uh, I'll not be able to answer are you understanding what we are trying to do here? Yeah, yes, sure, Deep. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, you have weights with all the lines. Now, once you have 2790, or let's say uh, this thing here, and the other one is here, okay, the C1 same, then again you are combining them with some weights. So, these are the weights. Now, when you are back propagating, you are trying to reduce this RMSC with the actual output and trying to find the values of A1, A2 and B1, B2, B3, B3 B3 and C1, C2, C3. So every time you go forward, you are linking every line with the weight and then when you are coming back, you are kind of reducing that RMSC. In linear regression, it was easy, right? You just had uh, only one layer and you had to reduce these, right? But right now you have so many layers. You have A1, A2, you have to reduce. A1 is linked to B1, B2, B3. Again, A2 is linked to C1, C2, C3. So you are trying to reduce all these weights such that the final output is closest to your actual target. Like you were doing in RM, uh, linear regression, you are trying to reduce B1, B0, B1, B2 uh, from that stochastic gradient. Here also you are trying to reduce D1 and D2. Okay. Now, how, if you need to reduce D1 and D2, 
then d1 is coming from where d1 itself is coming from b1 b2 b3 and c1 c2 c3 so everything need to be reduced so that this function i mean d1 and d2 gets optimum so that you come closest to your target 2000 not fear hey, uh, subhadeep yeah uh, subhadeep if i understand on this structured data we are doing this so for the first row we will get b1 b2 b, b3 d1 d2 correct so the same value will be applied the same value which i have got from the first row huh. will be applied to predict for the second row no 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 and the no. third row and finally we'll try to get the rmsc no 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 so we'll come to that first uh, have you understood this part yeah for one row it's clear one row it's clear so you have multiple rows of so did you have one point in linear regression in linear regression also you had so many points right in linear regression how was your line looking you had so many points right so did you find b1 b2 for such only this point no right you found find out b1 b2 for no, but... all the points Similarly, you are yeah, for every, for all also, the here also you will find B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3, D1, D2 for all the points. And then you have one single optimal point. Good. So only difference, only difference is between B0, B1, B2 and D1, D2. Instead of B0, B1, B2, you are having D1, D2, which is again a combination of these features okay so there are layers okay you're not reducing just one layer it is not that you're reducing b not b i mean optim finding the optimum b not b1 b2 you're first finding the optimum d, uh, d1 d2 d1 is a, again a function of b1 b2 b3 and c1 c2 c3 similarly d2 is again a function of b1 b2 b3 and c1 c2 c3 right so you are finding this optima so if you have to find this optima you have to change this right so you have to change these and finally you will get the best d1 and d2 for all the points clear or not yeah it's clear Okay. Yes, okay. Wasn't clear for you? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. So, Asuvadipa, uh, one question. So, in this structured data, it's clear. Okay. But uh, where we started initially from the car, means we don't know that it's car or not. We have an image, 84 cross 84, and we are not sure what is the output. Correct, correct. If there is no output, how will we decide no, no, no. B1, B2, B3, or D1, D2? No, no. So, first thing is... Uh, this is all supervised learning only, right? The output, yeah, you have mistaken. The output yeah. is there. The features are not there. No one has told you these are the features of the car. You know which brand it is. You know it is uh, this car, this, that car. But no one has told you and uh, that this car has, let's say, the Honda uh, design is like this. It, the tires are smaller than Mercedes or, uh, uh, let's say, the height is lower. No one has told you the features. Deep learning is all about features. Output is still there. Output is have a database which already has the supervised learning part, right? The output is already there. What you don't have is the feature. No, no. No, what was our actual problem in that case? There was an image and we have to predict whether that was this is car or not or image was told that this is a car and you have to let us know the brand what is the actual problem okay. in that okay let's, okay okay let's say uh, let's see what we are going to do in our uh, class today so the code what we are running so there's a data set called the mnist data set so you have handwritten digits okay one two nine zero to nine and based on the handwritten digit it has to predict the actual digit so for example if i write two like this it should predict two if i write 
four like this it should predict four so that is the problem okay now there are uh, let's say 70,000 images of these handwritten digits which are already supervised I mean there's an image for let's say zero it already knows that it is zero there's an image for one there's already knows that the output is one there are let's say 25 images of two it already knows this is two okay now when a new user let's say right like i'm writing on my ipad i am writing it three ipad should automatically tell me that this is the digit three okay so this is called the mnist data set so what you're trying to do is you already have the supervised database in your uh, memory so already so see why we introduce deep learning is like you all in machine learning what you had you had features and you had an output right this is what is your machine learning problem in deep learning output is there but you don't have the features no one has told you this these are the features this is the income this is the age this is the height no one has told you it is you are given a certain number of uh, pixels there are 784 pixels for an image and based on these 784 pixels you have to tell whether this is a number one number two or number nine or so but you already have so in some... our example of the yeah so in example of the car image was given what was the output given to us in that case so output already is given the brand is already given now for example a new image comes you have to predict the brand of that uh, car suppose suppose you have collected from google you have collected thousand images of cars with their brands okay so for example you have gone honda and you have collected for, uh, 10 images you have searched mercedes you have found up 13 images like this you have collected a database of 100 images you have trained your model and then someone comes and gives you an image of let's say a, a car then you have to predict whether this car is a honda or a mercedes like that Okay. So sorry, uh, Frank. Yes, I couldn't understand this one. So, take an example that we have got an image. At yeah. the same time, Google has hundred of images okay. with the given brand. Okay. So, coming on the Google side, Google has features for those stored images or not. See. Google will not have features. That's what I'm trying to say. Deep learning doesn't have features. It doesn't have features. It has the image, except yeah. just keep that same analogy. Don't get confused too much. In machine learning, you had features, and then you are, were predicting the output, right? Correct. How you were predicting the output? Based on your past data, you have learned that these features are combination like this and you have you are trying to predict the output. In deep learning, your features are not there. You just have an image, let's say. Can image, is image a feature? It is not a feature, right? It's just a photo. Now you have past historical, same thing, past historical images. With, and output. And output is there, right. Now someone comes, gives you a new image, tells you to tell me which brand it is. Okay, so we are going to check the features. Um, understand now or is still confusion is there? No, no, it's uh, clear now. So just, okay, let me ask you what we are trying to do in our image classification problem. Tell me. No, no, sorry. Uh, basically, in image classification, we have to decide which brand of this car is. Okay. No, we are we are uh, dividing the pixels. No, that is okay. Then, I, I mean, what is the objective? So, for example, in image classification of a car, what is given to you already? What is your trained data? I mean, what is your data that you want to you have to train your model on? What is the data? Image and output. Earlier it has been it is stored in database. Correct. Image and output. Image and output. 
there's a card of Honda and their image is present and it is the output is present as Honda. There's an image for Mercedes, the output is present, present as Mercedes. Like this, you have, let's say, 1000 images. Now, what is your objective? Someone comes up, with a, comes up with a image of a car and tells you, and you have to tell to him. Predict the brand. Exactly. Okay. Wasn't clear on this? Yes, Shubdeep. Okay. And how are you predicting? Yes, that thing I'm telling you is how we are predicting in this case. It's another part. For the new, it will be getting the new like, problem. It will be yeah, getting the width and everything. Then it will compare with the past past data. Correct. So your past data is there. So your past data, all the images will. Have, let's say there were thousand images in your database. Okay. So each image will have 784 pixels. Based on those pixels, considering those pixels as features. The model will understand if these are the pixels present in an image, this car is a Honda. If these are the pixels present in an image, this car is a Mercedes. So based on those pixels, the model will understand whether this car is a Honda or a Mercedes. Okay. Now, when you give the model a new image, based on the pixel, it will try to predict whether this car was a Honda or a Mercedes. This car is a Honda or a Mercedes. Okay. Just, just in your mind, replace that instead of features we have pixels now sunil your question now tell me uh, what what is increasing you yeah it's clear now i don't think I it's already we have very confident. no 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 we already have uh, images in database with so we have the pixels as a feature in database correct and here we have images with pixels and pixels in another way features and based on these features we have to match which brand it will be correct amazing okay so now we have understood what was the problem and how we were solving it now let's get back to our uh, input layer and hidden layer okay now let's see so for example the handwritten digits like I was telling you, right? So, for example, these are the uh, digits like 3, 4, 2, so many digits are present. You have to predict your output should be what is the digit here, 0 to 10, which is the digit, okay? So, for example, your training. Your training on an image, you have selected an image. Uh, just a second, it is, there's a lag. Okay, now you're training. So, uh, Subhadeep, just one second. I'm sorry for asking this foolish question. So, coming on that again, image, we are assuming that Google has image with pixels and bad pixels we are assuming as features. Correct, correct. If once we have assumed this one, this is already a machine learning we have already learned. Means, uh, I mean, where output is given and we have the predictors. How you are so, saying? How you are how, saying? How, no, no. Uh, uh, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Let me uh, rephrase my assessment again. So Google has hundred data, uh, hundred images. For every image, there is pixels, and that pixels we are saying that is a feature or predictor, and we have output for that in the database. So, am I right? See, when we are uh, doing deep learning, what we are doing is we are allowing the features to talk to themselves, individual. Like I just drew you the uh, figure, right? If there are five features and they don't talk to each other, the pixels need to talk to each other, right? Because this is of relative sense. Imagine, a, a, let's say a Honda is there and uh, let's say, uh, how will I say, okay. Okay, now uh, let's say the car is a Honda and the pixels need to talk to each other. The pixel, my pixel should understand the nearing pixels. According to that, I will be able to tell the height of the car. If just understand this, these are all the things are relative in a pixel. If I take just absolute pixels, it will not make any sense. If I just do a machine learning problem on this, 
what you will have you have different pixels independent to each other and you're trying to predict the output that will not give me accuracy you need to tell the algorithm that all the pixels need to talk to each other right the top corner of top do you first of all do you understand what are pixels in an image yes they are rgb or cmyk this this correct correct uh, which we store on other side yeah, i understand so the top corner has to understand let's say the if if the image has a cloud on top of it and then the car is there so the pixel has to understand the relative sen uh, sense of space right so the top is a cloud the bottom is a car then the car's shape has to be understood the shape is relative so if the line is like if the um, roof is flowing like this so everything has to be relatively understand all the pixels need to talk to each other if the pixels do not talk to each other then my output will not be good you are right i can do a machine learning problem if i have a 70 784 pix pixels and i use those pixels as a features you are correct absolutely correct i can do a machine learning problem but in machine learning your features are not talking to each other if you remember right you are taking these features or the important features you are trying to extract but your features are not talking to each other you need your image that's why deep learning allows the pixels to talk to each other the combinations when you are combining 784 pixels and combining them like in linear combinations you are allowing all the pixels to talk to each other that's where the relative sense of pixels and the space will come up does it clear your doubt i can't see okay uh, okay then ask the question what is what is the problem i uh, so basically one height you introduce another feature that uh, by talking this uh means pixels they are calculating the height yeah including the clouds and everything Correct. it means we we are extracting one new feature height it means in the previous database which google has it will have feature height also then only there is a need of calculating the height no 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 so, i mean i mean okay i mean to say which feature for a particular car we are trying to extract many features it is not just light features colors everything you are trying to extract that's how you will build the car right how will the car be built oh, okay. it will have edges it okay. will have oh, okay. go for five, go for five six features as like which is there then no, height you cannot go with five six yeah. that's the that's that's the problem right no one has told you that there are five six features did google did i mean how will i explain did someone tell you that the honda car height is like this width this like this did anyone tell you no right you don't have the no. that is the problem you just have pixels num lot of numbers 784 numbers how to make sense of that yeah. machine learning will not know right you just have so for example if you if you have age income work x okay so you have a combination of these features and you're trying to predict the output but if you have 784 pixels each pixel needs to talk to each other to understand the shape of the line or shape of the car let me draw you an image okay for example this is your image okay this is a box let's say 28 cross 28 pixels are there okay now the car is something like it looks like this okay assuming this is your car rectangle is your car yeah okay now this pixel needs to talk to this pixel that we are forming a curve this pixel needs to talk to this pixel that we are forming a curve this pixel needs to talk to this pixel that i am above you such i mean let's say i am 4 cm above you i mean not literally but what i'm trying to say is each pixel needs to talk uh, to the other pixel that this is, this is the edge we are talking about this is the tire which we are talking about did anyone go to you and tell you that your honda car has uh, tires of 16 inch did anyone tell you that no right you have pixels the pixel no. will itself talk to each other and understand that this is a 16 inch wheel or it is a 3 cm uh, or 3 uh, what do you call 4 uh, 5 meter length of car so each pixel needs to this pixel here needs to talk to this pixel 
and it says that the car is this much of length you are understanding this point our machine learning yes our machine learning will talk if let's say these 784 28 cost 28 pixels were fed into machine learning what will happen this is fed this is fed this is fed this is fed and you have a model and it will give you an output but did this pixel talk to this pixel no right it came to the model this came to the model independently it never understood that this these are clouds and these, this is the road it didn't understand how will it understand it will understand when it talks to each other when it, everything it, this pixel takes inputs from each other from all the pixels it will understand okay i am at the top i am the cloud when this pixel talks to the other pixels it will say okay i am at the ground so each pixel has to talk to other pixels right it cannot be fed Correct. independently uh, to your model does this uh, uh, help you to understand a little bit yeah yes yeah okay okay so see deep learning is difficult i have to say that i mean it's it's little difficult it has to a lot of maths are in, maths is involved but i am trying to explain you the most intuitive way that can be possible so uh if is this clear till now can you uh, if it is okay vasan uh, what about you do you understand uh, did you understand yeah, the question yes yes okay okay perfect yeah. So Sunil, I think this it was a good question that you yeah, no, it, yeah, yeah, it at was least a, a little bit clear, yeah, yeah, good question that you asked why we are taking seven eighty four things. Okay, anyways, okay, now let let us see this. For example, these are the numbers that are present, and based on these images, you are trying to predict whether this number is a zero or a one or a two up till. Okay. Now, for example, take an example of image four. Okay. So, this image has to be classified under what? Four. Four. Exactly. So, for example, uh, your output. Let's see. Let see. Just see your output here. So, this is your actual output. Okay. This is the actual output for zero. It is zero. One, it is zero. Two, it is zero. Three is zero. Four is one. The actual. Five is zero. Six is zero. Seven is zero. Eight is zero. Nine is zero. Okay. This is your actual output. Now, what should be your predicted output? Predicted should also be four. Four. It should be four. I mean, yeah. this cell should be the highest amongst. So these are probabilities. So ideally, it should be one, but uh, uh, it may not be one every time. So this should be the highest, right? So for example, you take the pixels of four, and all the weights and the calculations end up with this matrix. Okay. Now you have seen that my current. Vector is not very good, right? The error is huge. What should be zero is point one. What should be zero should is point three. What should be one is point one. What should be zero is point one. What should be zero is point four. Okay, so you have understood that this is very far away from y. So you go back. You do a back propagation. You recalculate these weights again. So all these connections are again revised. Okay, and then you again come back. Then you again form y hat. And then you see what is the error. Then again, you go back, revise these weights like this. So what you do? Go, go a forward pass, forward pass, calculate the cost. The cost is the error function. So the error is huge, right? Zero. What should be? Ideally, these all should be zero. This should be one, and again, these should be zero, right? But it is not. So what you calculate the error? You again go back, revise these connections, again come back. Again, do a like this. You continuously do this, okay? And finally, you get the updated weights, which give you the final uh, this thing. Are you understanding this? Yeah. 
and no i don't think you have understood uh, ask me the question what did you what it will be on by prediction so Sorry. what is 0.1 0.3 and okay 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 let me not actual y prediction okay you uh, you're saying what, what is uh, zero point okay you remember binary classification problem in our uh, uh, iris did do you remember iris when we used uh, uh, logistic regression or uh, when we are doing a classification problem the classes yes, yes, yeah. the output classes have probabilities right so yes probability yes. Uh, did you see ever one whatever is it was sometimes let's say 0.7 0.3 or 0.8 yes. 0.2 so your outputs were probabilities here also your outputs yes. are probabilities you want the actual okay. probability or you want this probability to be the highest so that that can be denoted as 4 so these all are probabilities what is the probability okay uh, of being 0 it is 0 What is the probability of being one? It is point yeah. one. What is the probability of being two? It is zero. Okay. Okay. So these are the probabilities yeah. of these classes. So just imagine yeah. this. Forget this thing. Just imagine this to be a machine learning problem. What happens? You give give features, and then you get the output, right? So if the output has ten classes, each class will have a probability associated with it, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sunil, now your okay. question. We have actually that's probability that's clear and that is the ten multi classification problem where exactly. we have ten outputs. Correct, correct, correct. So that's not an issue. Only issue still I am trying to figure it out. Uh, feature extraction because only once we will have feature, then only we can predict that. Okay. So what feature we have extracted from this one? That's what. See. Y one, Y two. These are. So uh, sorry, that's the, your feature extraction. The algorithm is doing. So, what do you think this hidden layer is? This is extracting. Uh, these are the features. Yeah, these are the features. Exactly, these are the features, right? So, using these features, it is predicting this. Correct. So, a one one, a two one. So, what do I think? I mean. A two one, A two two, A two three. These are the final features which is getting used in our previous data. Yeah. So, so for example, this is your hidden layer two, and this is your final output. Yeah. So the features in the hidden layer two are being used to calculate your final output. Okay. Got it. Okay, now let's let's see. So for example, oh, okay, I mean, I I mean, just let's see what uh, so what we break this question in two parts. One part that is a prediction. Okay. First part that is to get extracting the feature. Okay. Can we assume like this one? So, till the hidden layers, you are extracting features. After the yeah. hidden layer, you are calculating the output. Okay. Okay. So my question is that. Is that the last hidden layer, which is the right, rightmost hidden layer, that is getting used to get the output? Correct, correct. Oh. Now, so you can have okay, hundred okay. hidden layers, and then you have an output. You can have two hidden layers, and you can have an output. But the last hidden layer will be the final features that are going into the model. Okay, got it. Got it. Yeah. Oh. It means. Yeah. as like our right most hidden layer uh, those will be the features yeah. which we are going to use it means the similar type of features are already in the database so and yeah. we are going to reduce one by one features uh, i mean hidden layer number of neurons in the hidden layers we are decreasing no no the first part of the sentence was correct till you have understood that hidden layer is okay. final input to the feature uh, input to the model again i am again saying the database contains these pixels the database does not contain these this is the algorithm is de deriving from x1 x2 x3 x4 no one has okay. extracted a1 a2 for you you have extracted from your model the database contains x1 to x uh, whatever 784 
these are the pixels original pixels these are the original features or the pixels from these pixels you are allowing them to talk to each other you are allowing them to talk to each other and then you are finally predicting the output okay so if we discuss in this example uh-huh. we have, everything is working fine we are getting some probability in multi class problem okay. so have we applied back propagation in this or not yeah that's what i said no i no. don't think initially weight no yeah, definitely not initially your weights were given what have written here forward pass there is a cost function right but this cost i mean this output is not correct right your output should be one here but it is the output has a lot of error in it you go back you retrain your okay. w not w1 w2 again you come back again you find the y hat then again you find the error between y hat and y then again you go back go back uh, retrain your w1 same thing as linear regression just kind of try to put that analogy same as linear regression linear, linear regression what you were doing you were uh, you were trying to predict b0 plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 you are trying to do a stochastic gradient so in order to achieve this as a minimum right so many times you were going back you were minimizing the error and again deriving b1 b2 same way again you have the cost you are going back to the backward pass so this is the cost function which has to be minimized right so in order to minimize you're going to backward you are retraining these things you are re- re-deriving the connections you are again re-deriving all these connections okay and then again you are giving me an output Correct. this output has an error this error is needs to be minimized then then go back again and go back again again you are deriving these uh, uh, changing these connections these connections and then again you are coming back to the output Correct. okay so yeah, there is one term basically we uh, are convolution i have also heard about uh, back progression so again that convolution is used for only feature extraction or some other thing yeah so convolution is used for feature extraction we will come to that convolution but uh, okay. don't don't confuse yourself first uh, are you clear with this yes 100% 100% clear right no confusion at all no awesome okay now the next concept is called activation function okay uh till now what i have told you you were linearly combining these right right you were linearly combining it means you were multiplying with w not, not x sorry w1 x1 plus w2 x2 these are the linear combinations right yeah we have assumed that yeah that can be as a combination also okay so in order to make these linear combinations non linear you have something called an activation function okay so we'll not go into depth with an activation function because it's a little uh, too mathematical but just remember this now understand this first first you have your image you have 784 pixels why we are using deep learning and not machine learning because you want to make the pixels talk to each other right you want the first pixel to talk with the last pixel you want the first pixel to talk to the second pixel so that's why you are kind of combining all this and finding the neurons okay now initially you were combining this in a linear way now you say why i don't allow them to talk in a non linear way also why let them have a non linear conversation also right so it's always not what we have learned in machine learning is that linear does not solve your problem every time you have to go towards non linearity at some point of time this also you have to allow the first pixel to talk to the other 783 pixels in a non linear way okay so that will be done by the use of activation function okay yes okay 
now let me ask you a question uh, i will ask the same question you asked i want to hear your answer uh, what if i used machine learning in on my original image 784 pixels what will i lose there or what will i not gain there could you repeat your question once again if i use normal traditional machine learning problem or algorithm on the image of 784 pixels what will i lose or what will i not gain from the learning why we cannot use machine learning on 784 pixels what is the no, basically that yeah that was the straight question because we need to calculate how pixels are related to each other exactly okay so that means you have understood this concept so you want the pixels to talk to each other you want the features to talk to each other and get and derive features which are combinations of these original features okay yeah okay vasant are you clear on this yep yes yes okay so uh so there will be different frameworks to apply like trans a tensor flow like that so tensor flow framework if you need to apply you have to install that from so for example right now i will show you how to apply your deep learning on a neon framework okay so neon is an intel okay. framework but at tensor flow you have to install now if you want to go okay. for the deep learning course we will see how we can apply deep learning on the structured data how it improves the accuracy how your features are generated new features are generated from the existing data so that is different uh, from today's uh, session that will be a separate course but right now we are trying to understand okay. the basics so this loss function i'll not uh, go into depth uh, so i'm planning to start with convolutional neural networks a little bit but uh, i think you still need to have a better understanding of the basics uh, okay let me just introduce convolutional networks so um right now i said that your first pixel needs to talk to the 784th pixel so how many combinations you will have first pixel will uh, talk to 783 pixels second pixel also will learn to talk to 783 pixels so if you have 784 pixels each pixel talking to other 783 how many parameters will be there huge right 784 into 783 into 784 correct yes yeah. right so many parameters so and for example if you have 1 lakh such images then your model will crash so many parameters so many images it will get confused so why convolution what is the concept of convolution so initially what we were doing just a second oh, my battery is low just a second okay uh, just let me allow me a 2 minutes break let's get back after 2 minutes huh? and just drink some water okay
ഹലോ ഹലോ ഹ്യൂമംഗസ് <laughs> what convolution says is let pixels talk but let the surrounding pixels talk okay don't allow the first pixel to talk to the last pixel i don't want the cloud pixel to talk to the road pixel because the road pixels itself will understand from the car that the road is below the car why should i take into consideration the pixels of the cloud okay so why i need the pixel of the road to talk to the pixel of the cloud i already know that i am a road because my, uh, the card is above me similarly the clouds will tell why i need to talk to the road i know that uh, the road is below the car so if i talk to the pixels of the car i itself know my position right so convolution is uh, uh is is a method where each pixel is not talking to all the pixels for example let's say this pixel is talking to this pixel this pixel this this pixel is talking to this pixel and this pixel earlier what used to happen earlier this pixel used to talk to this 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 everything right but now a pix this pixel is only talking to selected pixels which is closer to closer to that okay so i don't want this pixel to talk to the first pixel right because i already know my position with respect to the car why should i take my position with respect to the cloud so convolution is a there why sorry then sorry uh, so in one to one the convolution why third is not talking with two no no it's just a representation it's not, it's not uh, oh, oh, okay. yeah it's just a representation okay so okay. Uh, okay. yeah so convolution will allow you to reduce the complexity of uh, your algorithm and disconnect the pixels which are far off from the current pixel we are talking into consideration okay so that's what convolution does so not go into depth of convolution because it's a completely different topic what we will do now is we'll go into the code of uh, deep learning okay so i will connect my laptop yes so we it means in convolution there can be different cases whether we have to skip one pixel or many pixel or i mean there should be some strategy yeah yeah so you are right so there is something called filters filters will take pixels which are together in a in a space okay so let's say first talk five seven pixels are together taken into a filter so those pixels will talk to each other they will not talk to the next filter which is seven pixels away from them so like this the convolution is done so if you see the meaning okay. of uh, convolution in google can you see my laptop screen yes okay uh Okay, it's not giving me the uh, exact definition i wanted to see. anyways that's that's okay okay so now let's see the code for the handwritten digits okay so um, this is the neon framework okay so neon framework is basically uh, 
like the TensorFlow that you have. So this should be pre-installed in your uh, machine. Batch size is 32. What is batch size? Batch size is basically, for example, uh, if you have 100 rows, you don't want to take all 100 rows together. You're taking 30, 32 uh, rows at one time, okay? So you're taking limited batches. You're not taking the whole data together, okay? This is to reduce the complexity. Okay, now you uh, kind of import the data, uh, train set and the validation set, okay? And then initialize weights. So what we have seen here is uh, those weights, the, that W, initially there has to be some value, right? You cannot keep it as zero. There has to be some value Based on that, you will do your forward pass, then you will calculate the cost, and then you will do a back propagation to reduce, to optimize those weights. Remember? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Correct? So, initially, yes. those weights should have some value, any random value, but it should have some value so that you can get the forward pass done, and you can calculate the output. Then you calculate the cost, and then you come back again, and then you go like this. So this circle comes. So weight should be initialized first. So how you initialize a weight? You just take random sample from a, a Gaussian distribution. Gaussian distribution is nothing called, but a, a different name for a normal distribution. Okay. So you take uh, initial weights as with mean zero and standard deviation as 0 0.01. Simple way of initialization. Now. What you do is you create two layers, okay? With these weights, activation is the ReLU rect uh, linear function that we saw in the uh, image, but you don't have to be so, um, I mean, you don't have to understand right now. Just, uh, you know, keep that in mind. So we, uh, that is not dealt to be dealt too seriously right now. And then you connect another layer. So these are the different layers. This is the first is the hidden layer one. Second is the hidden layer two. And then there's an activation function called softmax. You initialize these two hidden layers. Okay, now hidden layers, you have to tell. Hidden layers, the algorithm will not take into consideration. You have to tell how many hidden layers you want. More the hidden layers, the thumb rule is, more the hidden layers, more is the accuracy yeah. of the model. Okay. Yeah. Right. Now you import the model. You uh, you save the model in MLP. Okay. You declare the cost function. Cost function is the cross entropy function for classification problem. Multi classification, the like we are doing ten way classification. You use the cross entropy. Remember, Gini index in decision tree is the, almost the same thing. Okay. So you are doing the cross entropy function as a uh, uh, what do you call uh, uh, the cost function? Then you are doing the optimizer. This is the gradient descent optimizer with the momentum. Don't need to understand that what is momentum, but just understand gradient descent is the optimizer. Then uh, you call the function, and here you see. So epoch one, epoch zero is the first trial. So you train one eight seven seven five batches because each pass size was 32 based on the number of uh, total uh, you know total uh, number of data points so each batch will contain 32 so 1875 into 32 will be the total number of data points this is the cost you are getting and slowly you reduce the cost okay so your optimum cost is actually reached here only in the eighth watch okay now this is this is where you store the results you find the misclassification error so error is 89.3 percent because it's a very shallow uh, deep learn uh, shallow network okay so that's why it has a you just have two hidden layers and then you try to uh, find out the so this is where you input a new image and try to predict so but our prediction is not very good uh, uh, we have input our image as 4, but the digit it is saying it is 6. Okay, so it is not very good because we have not optimized it. 
but uh, that is how your flow should be okay did you understand this flow flow is yes good but code wise it difficult code wise it's difficult yeah it is uh, uh, you didn't don't need to understand the code right now but like what we have learned right first we have initialized you have to initialize the weight why you need to initialize the weight answer come on why you need to initialize the weights we just learned right why i just told you why you need to initialize the weight yeah because it should not be zero whatever we have to give any point anything other than zero excellent so that it can fix itself excellent excellent so you have to keep something other than zero so you randomly assign very good then what will happen you initialize the weight you get your uh, first output okay now you have to do a back propagation so you for that back propagation what you have to do you have to initialize your optimizer you have given stochastic gradient as an optimizer before that you need to declare your cost function for a multi classification problem you give a entropy like the gini index we kept the entropy or gini index anything you can keep for your error then you do a back propagation and like this you train your model and it will and it will give you a result okay so this is the overview of very uh, brief overview of deep learning so uh, there are this it's very powerful uh, it's just a very simple you know imagine if you uh, if you do a simple machine learning problem on this so for example if this is 28 cross 28 784 features and you do a machine learning you will get a error of almost 99% you just have an accuracy of 1% it is very difficult for machine learning things because see it has to see the relative sense this pixel knows that the surrounding pixels to its left and right is black this pixel knows that the top pixel is white the surroundings are black so this is how the line will be learned right so all the pixels will know that my surroundings are black my top and bottom are white okay like this it will learn the relative sense of the number 4 and accordingly it will predict the number okay so sudeep could you could you go on the line where we are using either back propagation or convolution convolution we have not used here we are doing a back propagation not here. yeah back propagation is this one callbacks import callbacks okay and then uh, you use the mlp dot fit so it's um, like you did your random forest dot fit rf dot fit similarly you do do your mlp dot fit so this is your training the optimizer the number of epochs you need to keep the cost and the back propagation okay yes okay so uh will not go further today so now what i'll do is um, you know uh, address any questions uh, you have related to all the lectures we have uh, uh, learned anything you want to ask anything you want to know in general uh, the question the forum is open for questions so only one question related to sorry for that sorry related to what i thought vasan was asking some question okay vasan you have question so no no okay okay so uh, okay so subhadeep uh, related to machine learning only one question then i'll go on deep learning okay so on machine learning there is one instance based another one was model based okay so model based i understood because we have given different models and we have used that uh -huh. but instance based that was not very clear uh i didn't get instant based i mean what you are trying to ask what is instance based you are talking uh it was i was going through one of the book uh, uh machine learning through tensor tensor flow exact name is hands on machine learning with scikit learn and tensor flow okay so it was saying that uh, there was some object based and model based basically okay prediction okay 
So in model based, just we pass the different models and uh, we get the value. Uh -huh. Which models we have already gone through. But instance based means it was written something I could not understand. Okay. So I am not uh, understanding what is uh, object base or instance base. Maybe if you can read that line, uh, that will be helpful. Because uh, I'm not. Okay. Um, okay, no problem. I'll figure it out. Otherwise, I'll write you on the WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah. You ask me the uh, so, on WhatsApp. Because uh, it's then, a generic term uh, that. Yeah, you, uh, okay. If you can uh, let me know the line, I can clarify your doubt there. Okay, time being, there is one more. What is this reinforced? Uh, there, there is one other. I, like yeah. I mean, reinforced. Reinforced. reinforced where it was saying that um, system model will be punished or it will be rewarded. Based on that, it will learn. Yeah. And uh, there was a go go game in which it yeah, yeah. defeated the champion. I understood. So reinforcement learning is a very different field. For example, chess. Like chess is something. Uh, for example, it's not just about predicting your next output. Okay, it is kind of predicting your output and also thinking the probable outcomes of the next uh, next turn of your opponent, and then also predicting the output. And then again, thinking the more probable outcomes of uh, your uh, opposition. So, for example, chess is not an independent uh, thing, right? Like if you do a do, if you conduct a turn right now, this turn may have repercussions after ten turns, right? So, what reinforcement learning does is it kind of evaluates all the scenarios. Based on which, for example, if I move the queen from left to right, what are the repercussions, and what are the probable uh, probable moves that your opposition can do, and see ten steps in future, and understand whether this move for, for of the queen from left to right was good or bad. Okay, so it is rewarding if it was if 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 uh, the turn is good. Then it is rewarding that turn. It means your, uh, let's say your adding your score function or the cost function is being reduced. And if it is uh, making a bad turn, then your cost function is being punished. It means the cost function is increasing. Now you need to find the most optimum parameters to reduce the cost function overall. Okay, not just now, but even ten steps in, steps in future. So all the strategy games like Go is also a strategy game, right? So your current move will be affecting, let's say, 20 moves down the line. So you kind of take all the possible scenarios and try to reward your uh, algorithm to reach that scenario by using uh, the cost function. So if that scenario is favorable to you, you reward that. Uh, I mean, you decrease your cost function. And if you, if your uh, that move is um, uh, like it is disadvantageous to you, then you punish your move. That's how your reinforcement learning is done. So another naive example is teaching a robot to move, right? So for example, if a robot is moving on a line, for example, you have asked the robot to follow a path. Okay. So if the robot goes into another path and crashes, okay, so that is a punishment. Okay. So you come make that robot. Stay there and then again bring it back to your normal track. Again, then it moves along the path and then sometime it goes away from the path and crashes. Okay, so that is again a punishment. You let the robot crash and know that if you go away from this path, that is a not a favorable outcome to you. So you bring that robot back to the path and again let him go on his, his new path. So that is what reinforcement learning tells. Okay, but I like um, machine learning or um, this one NLP. It's not so popular. Or because because uh, no, one actually, no one actually uh, knows uh, what is reinforcement. People are still researching on how to get reinforcement learning into actual um, you know algorithms. How it can be used in businesses still is a research. So NLP, deep learning, reinforcement learning. People are improving day by day. It's not what research has not been completed yet on this. 
so re- reinforcement learning people don't still have not found out good uh, case uh, use cases for that that's why it's not very good okay and in nlp means what are the things which we need means we have not covered so nlp we have not covered we have uh, uh, no, no 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 basically uh, basically what we have learned here that feature extraction that is the first task for which there can be different strategy correct as uh, like um, back propagation convolution and then once we have got we have applied machine learning either internally it will be applied or we have, we can apply externally because you have got the features okay so what are, so it means we need to once we will start deep learning we will learn more and more algorithms to extract the feature no no or um, in, uh, okay. in deep learning so for example you will learn more first of all we have just uh, gone through simple neural networks okay so like uh, you have understood about basic images so in images you know convolution so how to Im- implement convolution neural networks how to change the hidden layers how to improve the accuracy of the model okay that is one part then it will move on to time series forecasting how lo- uh, there's something called long short long short term memory how you can use lstms to predict your sales how how your uh, neural networks can retain the memory so whatever they like we said that example your apple example right uh, that uh, the apple was dropped in the kitchen and where to find that apple so it has to be stored in the memory so how the neural networks can you know store uh, things in the memory so a lot of use cases are there right so then there is something called auto encoders and decoders so if there is a high dimensional data how to reduce into a lower dimension and then again get back to a b- bigger dimension many things are there deep learning is huge is huge i mean and uh, the power of deep learning is amazing i mean uh, you will be surprised to uh, you know see the outcomes in deep learning uh, nlp nlp when combined with deep learning is so for example we found out the word embedding using tfids there are numerous other uh, word embeddings which you know understand the context those co- those um, okay let me show you one example if you have uh, if you are seeing the my uh, laptop so for example what we learned are uh, what, what we learned yesterday what uh, different types of word embeddings frequency based count vectors tfidf we stop here okay then there are word embeddings that are used like scape gram prediction based embedding so like let me show you frequency based and count vector we have seen tfidf we have seen co occurrence we have not seen that's okay uh, see the continuous bag of words model this is using neural networks input layer hidden layer output layer to find the word embeddings right then there is something called uh, skip gram model this is also using neural networks deep learning to find out the word embeddings okay so there are many things uh, which i mean you see how it is powerful it can if uh, if i use a tfidf or count vector my similarity between a woman and a man will be zero but if you use a word embedding it understand the context it understand that man woman come are different uh, types of the gender say come from the same human being okay then um, uh, you see uh, how it can catch the similarity woman king and negative man okay so it says that it means it is queen okay so i uh, i want to have the alternate word of woman and king but it should not be a man okay so it tell tells you that queen is the most probable word so huge use cases it's just an example what we are seeing a lot of things go into analysis of um, news articles and sentiment analysis to you know predict your stock prices so you can use your sentiment analysis and then use a lstm uh, to predict the stock prices so i think uh, l a 
predict the stock prices lstm long short term memory oh okay so okay. sure. uh, again sure if someone is asking you whether are you familiar with deep learning or not okay so what we have covered to remains feature section and applying to three methods so is this enough or are there some other terms which we need to learn no no this cannot be enough right? question is whether uh, okay so again repeat my question someone is asking whether you are familiar with deep learning or not that is the question familiar yes no no okay knowing let's 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 see let's say that you have learned the linear regression from machine learning that's all that's all yeah. so do you know random forest no you don't know random forest you do you know decision trees no you don't know decision trees you've just learned the linear regression part of deep learning okay 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 that's fine i think so i got a lot of things for you and definitely you are very very good <laughs> no to say no problem i think i, I mean Please. i really enjoyed you teaching you guys you had a lot of good questions and uh the best part is that like i really feel satisfied when you guys are saying that uh, okay i i learned something and i because i am it doesn't feel good if you don't understand and i cross that topic so i feel very bad if uh, people have not understand that topic and i move on towards the topic so that's why i keep on asking whether you understood or not it it may take us 15 20 minutes more but i need to make sure that you guys have understand because uh, that's that's what the that, then the, that's only when you will get a good night sleep and i also get a good night sleep right so i think my objective was to make you guys understand whatever we are learning but again machine learning uh, has to be practiced uh, it is not that uh, you have learned and uh, you can you know rejoice the fact that you know everything no it's not that you have to constantly practice you have to apply uh, more specifically come up with any doubts i will always be open to your doubts whether we are in the course or not uh, any doubts you have you can anytime uh, save my number uh, you can anytime ping me that uh, i am facing this problem how can i solve since i am i have uh, uh, done a lot of modeling uh, right now so i know which kind of problems can be solved from with what models so you can always ask me what is your use case how you can apply analytics you can always call me and ask that i have this data can you give me ideas on how to, we can imp- apply analytics okay so i am always open to that conversation so uh, so we have one more question yeah so as uh, still the first question we started data scientist versus uh, machine learner or programmer so mm-hmm. what they actually do means they get the data they remove unnecessary parts they stru- make it structured remove the redundant data outliers uh, these type of things and then they hand over to us or something else so data scientist and machine learning engineer or a machine learning scientist will be almost the same a data engineer okay. okay okay or uh, let's say a database engineer will do some things like that get you the data make sure the data is a proper uh, condition make uh, check the sanity of the data and then give it to the data scientist okay so to apply his uh, analytics so machine yeah, because you can also do that too yeah you can also do that but normally you need to learn databases like sql queries you need to know the sql okay. queries to you know extract data from databases and i mean that is there but yeah i mean you guys are now familiar with data cleaning and all yeah definitely thanks a lot ras sorry at least means everyone has learned a lot and personally me oh, 200% i have learned from you Thank because you. yesterday i was going through one of one of the books yes yeah. i was asking you whether i know anything or not then i found at least 99% things you have already covered and i'm familiar with that okay <laughs> it will take only one or two weeks max to cover that book line by line that's great thank you so, thank you so much so thanks a lot sweet friend okay. hope to see you again very yeah. soon L- let's meet up again thank you, sure. okay thank you so much vasan it was amazing okay. to have you guys okay, okay. bye bye good night thank you yeah. have a good night yeah bye thank you so much